and I looked over and there was a homeless guy and he was holding one of those, you know, we'll work for food signs. And I said, that guy, that's what we need. We need that guy's information. And everybody's like, what's going on? What's going on? And he goes, it doesn't exist. And I, he goes, and I looked at him and I go, it's all an illusion. And he goes, you know, I can't put my finger on it, but I just feel like something's wrong. And I go, huh. I go, well, I'm sure it'll come to you. And I turn around, I just walk right out of the bank. I got Jana chasing chicks off. I got Allison, you know, she's getting a divorce from her husband. I got to move her into an apartment. I mean, I've got, it's just total chaos. I look in the rearview mirror and there's two U.S. Marshals. I hit the gas, boom, take off. We've never lied to the FBI. We may not have told them everything, but we never lied. You're going to meet some of the best people you've ever met in your life in federal prison. She's not going to let you back in. You're never going to see your mother alive again. Hey, this is Matt Cox, and I'm going to kind of go over my story. I've gone over my story uh, before on Concrete and Valuetainment and Vlad TV and, and a bunch of other, a bunch of other uh, YouTube uh, channels. But I've never really gone over my story on my channel. And what I wanted to do was kind of go over the story almost, you know, not, I don't know if necessarily it's chapter by chapter, but I want to go over it in a longer form than the typical 20 minute or hour or two hour, uh, you know, format. I wanted to go through it, kind of take my time and go through the story. And so... Uh, basically, if you don't know anything about me, I basically, I was, I was on the run for three, well, I was a mortgage broker. I started committing mortgage fraud. Uh, I ran a bunch of different real estate related scams and credit card scams. And ultimately I ended up going on the run and I was, uh, kind of, you know, I was, you know, on the secret services, most wanted list. I was on the FBI's most wanted list. And I was, I, I was on the run for three years and eventually I got caught and I went to prison. So that's essentially kind of, you know, this this story and, and how those events unfolded. Uh, so I think I'll start with by saying, you know, that uh, I was raised in Tampa, Florida, and I was raised in, and I was actually raised in Temple Terrace, which is a separate city, but so it's kind of like almost like a, a suburb slash city of Tampa. I never really say Temple Terrace because nobody knows where Temple Terrace is. Essentially, it's Florida. I mean, essentially, it's Tampa. So basically raised in, in, uh, in Temple Terrace and and, uh, you know, my, I was raised by a, a strict Catholic mother. Uh, my dad was, he was never really that religious. Uh, my father had a, a, you know, he had an alcohol problem. And I was, it's funny, like my mother, my, my mother and father, uh, my mother was unable to have children. She was, uh, she was, back then they used to call it being barren. Uh, you know, she just, she wasn't able to get pregnant. And they tried for for years when they first got married, and eventually they 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 adopted. Uh, I have a, a sister named Katie, and they adopted my sister Helen. Then they adopted my brother. Like a year later, they adopted my brother. His name is Mark. Then they adopted uh, Katie, which was my closest sibling. And then you know, about eight ten years went by, and my mother, at the age of I think she was thirty nine or almost forty. She went in for a hysterectomy, and back then, you know, back then you became you were forty years old, and women were, you know, this is back in the '60s. They basically were it was kind of standard. You were, you were in your forties, you went in for a hysterectomy. So she went in for a hysterectomy, and when the doctor opened her up, he noticed that her ovaries were spongy, and he realized, hey, it, did we give this woman a, a pregnancy test? And they were like, well, no, she's not able to get pregnant. So. They gave her a pregnancy test while she was sitting right, laying right there unconscious on the table, came back, said she was pregnant. So they stitched her up. And when she woke up, my, you know, she woke up and my dad was there and he said, uh, my mom said, how'd the surgery go? And, and he said, not as expected. So he said, you know, you're pregnant. And she was like, I came in for a hysterectomy. What are you talking about? And so whatever it was, you know, seven, eight months later, uh, I, w I was born. And so... You know, my brothers and sisters were adopted and I was a, a, you know, whatever you want to call it, natural born child. And my, like I said, my father had kind of a, an alcohol, not kind of an alcoholic. My father was a drunk. He had an alcohol problem. Like I'm beating around the bush. Like he was a drunk. Okay. So he had an alcohol problem. He had a problem with pills. 
Uh, he was narcissistic, extremely arrogant, overbearing, and I was, you know, not, I think, not the son he wanted. Uh, you know, I grew up and I remember, you know, he, he would get drunk and he would call, you know, he'd call me and my brother stupid and say we'd never be anything. And then he would call my, you know, brother, my, my sisters, he'd call them names. And, you know, he was just a, a, a nasty drunk. And then he'd sober up and he'd be great for three or four months or six months. And he would, he would be great. And he worked for a state farm insurance as a manager. He's an amazing manager. He was a great salesperson, a great sale, a great manager, uh, hired, you know, trained uh, agents. And I forget what he had, like 25 agents. He was always winning awards, always doing well, made a, a great deal of money. And I think watching him, he was he did so well that even when State Farm realized that he had a, a major drinking problem, you know, they they would send him to rehabs. Like they didn't fire him. He'd show up at a meeting drunk, and they wouldn't fire him because he he was one of the leading managers and had the was running one of the leading sales teams of agents uh, in the nation. So instead of firing him, they just kept putting him into rehabs and they'd sober him up and he'd be good for a year or two. And then he, or he really, they would think he was good for a year or two. The truth is he would still go on these, uh, these uh, benders. And uh, I, I remember one time they, one time they were going to get a divorce. Uh, my mom was wanted to get a divorce. My dad wouldn't stop drinking. He was just being a dick. And I remember he drove us out to the projects and told us the whole family and told the whole family that he could afford two of these houses, which really honestly looking back wasn't true. Uh, but he was saying he could afford two of these houses and we would all live in the projects if my mom left him. <laughs> what a dick. Uh, you know, and I was a little kid too. I remember he, he was like, and you guys will all have to decide who you want to live with. And I remember th- saying, my mom, mom, I want to live with mom immediately. Uh, really you know one minute i just loved my father to death and the next minute i just despised him and he was just belligerent and he bullied my mother and all of us he was just a dick and so you know i just know i never lived up to what he wanted in a son and although i was smart you know i I tested high on all the IQ tests that I took and all the oral exams that I would take. Uh, You know, I I did great. But as far as reading and writing, I did very poorly. I I had a learning disability. He ended up putting me, they ended up putting me into a couple different schools for kids with learning disabilities. And, you know, I still just didn't do very well. Uh, Eventually, I, I ended up graduating high school and I went to college I, what did I get? I tried to get a business degree. I started with a business degree, but I remember I failed like accounting. No, I didn't fail it. I almost failed accounting too. I got like a C in accounting too. And I almost failed. To be honest, I really did fail it. I really got like a 68 or a 69. And the teacher said, let's round up so I don't have to see you next semester. And I was like, let's do that. And so he rounded up to like 70. And it was like, it was like one of the only C's I ever got. So I switched my, I remember thinking, well, I'll never be able to pass like microeconomics and macroeconomics and all these other courses that you had to take to get a business degree. It was just like, that was just never going to happen. Uh, and what I did was I switched to art and I ended up getting a degree in art because I've always been very artistic. I... I graduated, I remember I graduated, so I graduated high school. Well, I'm sorry, when I graduated college, graduated college in like 95, and I was dating a chick that was working as a stripper. She actually, we actually lived together for several years. So we, we'd been living together a few years. Her name was Chrissy. And so I graduated, I, I first I went and worked for, uh, I went and worked for a company that was, a couple different companies that were uh, insurance companies as an insurance adjuster. So I ultimately, I thought I was going to be an insurance agent, which I wasn't. I never did. Never That never happened. Uh, I kept taking the aptitude test for these companies to be an agent. And they kept, you know, the aptitude test was like, well, look, he's just not a good fit for being a salesperson. So I ended up being a, a, an insurance adjuster. And I did that for like a year or so. And then eventually I got laid off. And then I started working construction. I could barely pay my bills. And, but my girlfriend at the time was working for a company called Eagle Lending. 
and Eagle Lending did subprime loans. You know, you have conventional loans. This is basically when you walk into Bank of America and they give you a regular type loan where the 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 Fed sets the standard. And so those are those are conventional or um, they're basically they're called conventional uh, loans. And so you then you have subprime loans. So subprime loans are where the bank itself comes up with their own underwriting guidelines, and it's not backed by the Fed. And this company did. They did uh, subprime loans, and she was actually doing okay at it. She wasn't doing great, but she had just started with the company. And she had met the owner of the company, which is a guy named Kelly Ahrens. She'd actually met him uh, at the strip club, believe it or not. Because I know, I know what you're thinking, Connor. You're thinking, I know that you meet a stripper at a strip club, and you think, hey, this is the kind of girl that needs to be uh, working as a mortgage broker for my company. Well, believe it or not, that's really probably not true. So, uh, but he met her there and she was getting, she was in college and she was getting her degree in finance. So Kelly ended up hiring Chrissy to work for his company, Eagle Lending. And then when, you know, she came home and, you know, after working there for a while, she came home and she was like, look, you, you got to work. You got to work here. You got to come work at this place. Hey, I hope you're enjoying the video. And if you're interested in buying a painting from me, my contact information is in the description box. Back to the video. So Christy was working for, for Eagle Lending. And so she, she comes home after working there for whatever a few weeks and she says listen you've got to do this you have to quit this job you're working construction you, you have got to come work at eagle you got to be a mortgage broker you'd be great at it you were made for this and i remember thinking like I, I there's no way i was going to be able to keep up with the paperwork and i was like look i can't do the paperwork i don't know the learning disability i barely read and write and she said no no she said the processors the processors do all the paperwork all you have to do is take an application it's not that hard uh, and she said, and you're going to be, you would be great at structuring deals. You're creative, you're smart, you could do this and you're personable. Uh, you're, you know, you can do this. And I, so I went, I met with Kelly and Kelly said, yeah, I'll definitely, I'll, I'll hire you. He talked to me for a little bit and he, they flew me up to, they flew me up to North Carolina for like a week and they put me through a training course and I came back down and within a couple of weeks, I, I was closing, I was going to close my first loan, my first loan. I had, I had run some ads. I had taken, uh, called some real estate agents. I was putting out signs. I got this, this, uh, a girl that wanted to buy a house. I, I had a real estate agent. We found her a house. I got her the loan. I, I put together a loan package. And I remember I went into my manager's office and her name was, uh, her name was Gretchen Zayas. So I walked into Gretchen's office and I gave her the package and she had to look at the package, right? Like you need W-2s, pay stubs, uh, you need cancel checks or you need a verification of rent, you need a verification of deposit. Like you needed all these things in the package before you could send it up to underwriting so they could look at it and determine if they're going to lend her, your customer, the, the, money, the loan. So I get there and I, I give the package to, to Gretchen and she opens it up. This is my manager. And she starts looking through the pages. Looks through one page and another one. And as she was looking, she's like, that's good. That's good. She took one page out and she put it to the side. And then she kept looking and looking. And then she goes, man, it looks perfect. And I was like, I looked at the one. I said, well, what about this? She goes, well, this is a verif your verification of rent. I went, right, right. And she said, you never looked at it, did you? And I went, N well, I mean, no. The processor sent it off. The management company mailed it back. She says she's been, she was at her last place two or three years. She paid her rent. And she's like, she did pay her rent, but she has a 30 day late payment. So my customer had been 30 days late on one of her rent pay payments. And although she had caught it up and it was only, it was six or eight months ago, Gretchen said, because of that, she can't get the loan. And I was like, oh my God. And I remember too, listen, I'd been working there. So I'd, I'd already, I was all, hadn't really worked in three weeks. Like I'd been working, but they're not paying you. You don't get paid unless you, you close something. So I'd gone almost 
three weeks to a month without getting paid for anything. And by the time this loan, if it did close, I was going to be a month. It would have been a month since I'd been paid. So I'm behind on everything. Like I banked everything on doing well at this company. I was behind on my mortgage payment. I was behind on, how old was I? I was like 28. So I was behind on everything. I'm on my mortgage payment. I was behind on my car payment. I'm behind my credit cards. I got credit cards getting canceled. I mean, things are bad because I was thinking I am going to do great at this. I love that. I love the idea of it. And I could tell I was good at it. I knew I was going to excel at it. Well, I looked at the, I looked at the verification rent and I was like, oh man, I remember just thinking this is horrible. Like I'm going to, I'm going to lose everything. And I said, well, what do I do? And Gretchen goes, she pulled out a bottle of white out and she started clicking it like that. And I remember, you know, the old bottles, like that was before they had the tape ones, they had the bottle. And, she was like, and I, I was like, and she, she gave it to me. She goes, if I was you, I would white out the 30 day late, make a copy of it, stick it back in the file, send it to underwriting and the loan's going to close. And I went, whoa, whoa, whoa. I said, that's, that's bank fraud, isn't it? And, and she went, well, yeah, but listen, the worst that's going to happen and I remember saying, I can go to jail. Like I'd never broken the law at that point. I'd never, I'd gotten a couple of tickets. Like I'd never been in trouble before. It, it, breaking the law to me at that point in my life, it was something I, I had never even considered. So uh, I was like, I could go to jail for that. She says, oh, listen, the worst that happens is under if underwriting catches it, then they'll deny the loan. Maybe if they think you're involved and you whited it out or you knew it was in there, they might fire you, but that's the worst that's going to happen. And, and she was like, if I was you, I'd do it. So I, I went and made a copy of the, I whited it out, made a copy of the verification of rent, stuck it, the copy, the altered copy in the, in the file and mailed it to underwriting. Four or five days later, I get a, an approval. You've been approved to close. A couple of days later, we close. So within a week, I'm at closing. I got a check for like 3,500 bucks. And, and I was like, this is amazing. I just got 3,500 bucks. 3,500 bucks 20 years ago was a, a nice, that was like a month's salary. Well, I was working on multiple loans. Within a couple of days, I closed another loan. Within a few days later, somebody else had a problem where they almost qualified for the loan, but they didn't. So the guy made like $42,000 on his, his W-2 said he made 42,000. But if the W-2 had said he made 47,000, I could get the, get him the loan. So I cut and pasted, the, turned the five into a seven, altered all of the corresponding deductions on the W-2, put it in the file, sent it to underwriting. They didn't catch it. Next thing, and you have to think there's 30 pages, the d- different types of documents in these things. They're calling on, on as many as possible. But what are the chances that they're going to call on the W-2 and that they were going to say, what exact, how much did he make exactly last year? Typically what they're doing is they're just looking at the ver- what's called the verification of, of employment for the actual numbers, and they're calling the employer just to say, does he work there? Has he worked there for three years or two years or whatever was on the verification of, of employment? If they say, yes, well, he's worked here for four years. Okay, perfect. Did you fill this, a- this out? Yes, we did. Thank you. And that's it. The, but then they'd look at the W-2s for the actual numbers, and the W-2 had been altered. So... That went right through, loan closed, boom, 3,500 bucks. Next loan, that one closes. I closed four loans my first month. By the next month, I closed six loans. The next month, I closed eight, which was more than the, the manager was closing. By the next month, it was 10. Then it was 12. I think the most I ever closed was 12 loans in a month. Then Kelly ended up making me the manager from the Tampa office. He made me the manager of the Brandon office. You know, I never mentioned this in the in the book that I wrote, but what actually happened was by this point, Kelly was sleeping with the girl that I was dating, the girl that got me that I was living with at the time. So by this point, Kelly was now coming down and sleeping with Chrissy on a regular basis, and I had no idea. He made me the manager of the Brandon office. He made her the manager of the Sarasota office and he bought her a house in Sarasota. So she, but he was basically, the whole thing was like, hey, I'm a, I've got a house, I've got a rental property down there. But in reality, he bought her a house. Bought her a house, put her down there so she and I couldn't live together anymore because it was too, too long of a, 
It was too much of a commute to do every day. It's like an hour and 45 minutes to two hours. So if a two hour drive every day to see each other. So she and I were still seeing each other. We'd meet in the scent in the middle once or twice a week, but eventually I figured out what was going on and we broke up, which was not you know traumatic for her because she liked Kelly. And by that point, I think Kelly's wife figured it out. She had had a private investigator follow him around. And so within a month or so of me breaking up with her, Kelly's wife kicked him out of the house. He had three boys. So he ends up losing the wife, the three kids, moves in with Chrissy, divorces the wife, they get married, they end up having a kid, and they're still married to this day. So it's really a romantic story from her perspective. From my perspective, they're scumbags. But whatever. I mean, you know, it's promiscuous. Let's put that, yeah. All right. Uh, well, what ends up happening is at some point, the Department of Banking Finance and the FBI closed down Eagle Lending. I think it was for fraud, which I don't think had anything to do with me. Uh, it, they end up closing that whole, that, that company down. Like literally, like guys are showing up to, to the office one day and the doors were chained. And what, what had happened with them, the biggest problem was that they had lost a credit line. They had several credit lines and, and from banks and these banks and lenders had closed down the credit lines because of fraud and because loans were, weren't performing. So they closed them down. Department of Banking and Finance came in. They eventually shut them down. By that point, I had moved to another office, another lender, well, actually another mortgage broker. And I very click, quickly, it was only there like a month or two, and then I started my own company. And my company was called Consortium Financial Services. Uh, and I hired about a dozen guys to work there, uh, brokers, you know, like half, it was actually half and half, about half women, half men. And, you know, and listen, and we were committing fraud right away. Right away, we're all committing fraud. It was, and it was, it was so overwhelmingly blatant, the fraud that I was, it wasn't blatant like it was blatantly obvious. It was just so, it was, it wasn't like a W-2 or a pay sub. It weren't, weren't, they weren't slight alterations anymore. By this point, I was doing things like, by this point, like I was, I was like making my own banks. So I was making online banks where you could go online and it looked like a bank. Or and I had multiple cell phones. I remember you would walk in my office and I had like a bank, or, or, or I had like six or seven. I had like a whole row of cell phones. So I've got cell phone. I got like six cell phones with little tags on them on who they were for and what company they were for. I was opening up, up different corporations so that I could verify people's employment. I would list like the corporation in, in the business directory. One of the things we would do, one of the things I would do is I would make, you know, I would make fake bank statements. And so I'd make, obviously I'd make the fake online banks and I'd make fake corresponding bank statements. I would also make bank statements for other, you know, let's say if I had a, a borrower that was with Bank of America, but they didn't have their down payment in the bank for 90 days, which you'd need to have it 60 to 90 days. What I would do is I would, I had blank card stock for Bank of America in color, trim down the whole thing. So I could print, I could take your bank statements and I could retype your bank statements and put down that you did have enough money to close. So let's say a lot of times like you're going to buy a house and maybe the seller was going to give you your down payment because you didn't have your down payment. So the seller is going to give the down payment. And this makes sense if you're buying, let's say, for the sake of argument, a $200,000 house and you need to put down $10,000. You don't have $10,000. If the seller only wants $190,000, he's willing to bring your $10,000 to closing because he, he just wants to get one ninety, dollars and you don't have your down payment. So he'll bring it because he's just going to get the money right back. Well, you're supposed to have that money in the bank. So I would, so if you had a bank account with Bank of America and you had some money in the bank, I'd, we'd have them either deposit the money in the bank or we'd show the money being in the bank for the past three months using fake bank statements and we'd send those bank statements to the underwriter. The underwriter would look at it and they would say, okay, looks like he does have the money in the bank. And then when you go to closing, the seller would then just take $10,000 and deposit and deposit it in the escrow company or the, t the title company in escrow. And then you would, that loan would close. He'd get his money right back and the loan goes through. 
Hey, sorry for interrupting the video, but I want to let you guys know that if you join my Patreon at the top tier, every single month you get a different painting, and the contact information for my Patreon page is in the description. Back to the video. So we would do stuff like that, or we would say it was in your currently in your bank that you don't even have a bank account. I would say it was in the Bank of Ebor, and I'd have bank statements. And if you called the Bank of Ebor, we had someone that would answer the phone as with the bank of Ebor and would verify that you have the funds in the, the account. Uh, you know, so that was some of the stuff I was doing. I had uh, canceled checks. I'll give you an example. If let's say you've been late on your rent a bunch of times, well, you don't have to give a, give them a verification, give, you don't have to give the lender a verification of mortgage, mortgage or rent. You don't have to give the, the lender a, a verification of mortgage or rent if you can prove you've made your payments every single month via canceled check. And canceled check is a check that's gone through your bank and they've got all the routing numbers and all the cancellation and everything on the check. So I actually dummied up canceled checks from like SunTrust Bank, from Wachovia, from, uh, um, from Bank of America, from all kinds of different banks. I would dummy up what look, appeared to be canceled checks that had gone through for $1,200, $900 every single month for 24 months. And all you had to do, all my borrower, my brokers had to do was put their customer's name at the top upper left-hand corner and their address on each check. So they would make a, a little label and they would glue it on there and then they'd fill out the checks and then they'd sign their customer's name or have their customer sign them and then they'd make copies of them and then they would send them to underwriting. Underwriting would think, oh, look, this is 24 months worth of canceled checks that I can see have gone through the bank for $1,200 on you know, January, February, $1,200. Uh, you know, January, February, March, April, May, every, you know, 1200, 1200, and you could see them. They look canceled front and back. Perfect. So that's what we were. I mean, those are the kinds of things we were doing. It was just, it was just blatant. I mean, we're making, you know, every the, 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 um, the appraisals for the properties were all jacked up. I mean, we're, we're altering appraisals where I'm doing all kinds of stuff. Like I'm doing anything to get these loans to go through and the loans are going through. And the reason I would obviously do this is because, if you went, if one of some customer came in, he'd already been to a few different uh, brokers or he'd gone to his bank. They turned him down. He went to a credit union. They turned him down, went to another broker. They turned him down. Then he would eventually get to me and I'd say, yeah, I can do the loan, but the broker fee is $4,500 and your interest rate is whatever, 8%. Because what a lot of people don't realize is let's say your interest rate is going to be five percent i mean i know interest rates are ridiculously low now but back then they were like seven or eight percent so let's say they're going to be your interest rate's going to be five percent what a lot of people don't realize is at that time if you came in and your interest rate should have been five percent but i told you your interest rate was six percent and you said okay i'm cool with that if i told told for every 50 basis points or really it was to be honest it was like 35 basis points so each interest rate is made up of a hundred basis points. So if I told you your interest rate was five, it's supposed to be five percent, but if I had said it was five point three five, that means that I get one point on the back of the loan. So if the loan's a hundred thousand dollars and I tell you your interest rate is five point three five and you say okay no problem, I get a thousand dollars back because your interest because your loan is a hundred thousand dollars. If it's two hundred thousand I would get two thousand back. I get two point or one point. One point on a two hundred thousand loan is two thousand. So you would come in, guys. People would come in. I'd say, yeah, your interest rate six percent. They would say six percent, man. Uh, should be five percent. Everybody else is doing five, but yeah, but everybody else turns you down. I can do it at six percent. So I'm charging you forty five hundred dollars as a broker fee, and I'm charging you three points. So it's five, not not five. If I at five, let's say you're borrowing a hundred thousand, it would be. Uh, if you're borrowing a hundred thousand dollar loan and I tell you your interest is five percent, I get nothing on the back. If I tell you it's five point three five, I get one point. If I tell you it's five point seven, it's two point. If I tell you it's six, you know, six point zero five, which is three points, I get three points on the back of your loan, which means I get an extra three grand. So I'm charging you forty five hundred up front plus three point plus I get three points on the back of the loan. Your interest rate is higher. Uh, but you have nowhere you can go. I'm able to get the loan through because 
because I'm I'm creating canceled checks. I'm saying you have your money in the bank. I'm altering your your W twos and pay stubs. So I'm I'm doing everything I can to get these loans through. And we would get caught all the time. Listen, we got caught one time where I had done owner occupancy fraud for this this person. Uh, there was a woman, uh, a guy I knew, a sheriff's deputy. Actually, he comes up again. So there's a sheriff's deputy. No way. This was a real estate agent. We'd done. So if, if let's say I'm going to buy, let's say I want to buy an investment property. If I want to buy an investment property, say I want to buy a duplex and I want to buy a duplex, the bank wants me to put down 20%. So if it's a hundred thousand dollar duplex, they want me to put down twenty grand. Well, if I say I'm owner occupying that duplex, which means I'm gonna, I'm going to tell the bank I live in the duplex, I'm going to move in there. Then the bank says, okay, well we'll lend you ninety five percent. So you only have to put down five thousand as opposed to twenty. We had a real estate agent one time. She bought, I want to say she bought six or eight owner occupied duplexes. Actually, I want to say it was six. Six owner occupied duplexes where she said, I'm living in each one of these duplexes. So obviously I couldn't send all those to the same lender because the same lender would say, well, there's no way you're occupying six duplexes. What I did instead was, well, I didn't even do this. My, uh, one of the brokers that worked for me, her name is Susan Barker did this. She closed one dupl- or one of the du- owner occupied duplexes with, let's say Bank of America. Another one she closed with, let's say, Household Bank. Another one she closed with, so she closed them with all different banks. And this woman showed up at six different closings like the same day at six different title companies and signed saying she's owner-occupying each one of these duplexes. And she was a real estate broker. So she's a real estate agent and a real estate broker. She had, this is like, so this is like, this is somebody who clearly knew this was fraud. We close, and let's say about two months later, I remember getting, I remember Susan came in my office and she said, listen, I've got a lawyer on the phone from, I want to say it was Washington Mutual or, is it Washington Mutual? No, it was Union Planners. She said, I have a, I have a, a lawyer on the phone from Union Planners. And he said he has two two duplexes that are both owner occupied by the same borrower. And we did both loans. I went, what? So what had happened was one of the, one of the loans we had closed, let's say at Oak street mortgage, Oak street mortgage ended up selling that loan that they had a credit line that was connected to, that was all given to them by union planners. So union planners ended up with that loan. So union planners ended up with two of the same owner occupied properties and so this lawyer is calling up saying, look, you've committed fraud. You guys did two owner-occupied prop- duplexes at that. Two owner-occupied duplexes with the same borrower using the same information at two different title companies. You clearly knew what you were doing. I remember he's telling, Sarah's talking about commit. He's going to call the, the FBI. He's going to have me arrested. He's going to, I ended up convincing that guy to let us refinance both of those properties and pay. He also took a short pay. So he took less money. They took union planners took less money than we even owed them. And they paid us a broker fee. So I convinced him to pay us a broker fee and take less money. They, they, they took a hit of like $30,000 just to get rid of, Oh, sorry, just to get rid of these loans. Uh, you know, cause they don't want, here's the thing. Like he started thinking, I'm going to call the FBI. This and I was like, Whoa, Whoa, you don't want the FBI showing up. The FBI is going to go through your files. For all the FBI knows, you guys did anything, something wrong. For all you know, the broker that did this at my company was working with someone on the inside of your company. You don't have any idea that the can of worms you're about to open up. Like, be reasonable here. And the guy was like, I said, look, how about this? Let me just refinance him. He was like, I was hoping you'd say that. And so he, he I convinced him. I'm like, yeah, the problem is I can't refinance it and pay off the balance. I said, I'd need a short pay. And he goes, well, how much would I have to reduce it? I mean, he immediately, he's ready to start reducing them. He reduced it. And I was like, the problem is there's closing costs. He didn't realize when I started talking about there's three or 4,000 of closing. There's like $4,000 in closing costs on everyone, on both of these loans. He was like, well, that's fine. We'll pay the closing costs. 
The funny thing is, you know, he didn't realize that that those closing costs, a portion of those closing costs included a broker fee. So we got paid a broker fee again. Anyway, uh, that loan, we got caught then. Um, God, I get caught, got caught all the time. Got caught one time. Um, one of my mortgage brokers, I got a phone call from a bank in Chicago called, um, it was called, uh, gosh, what was it called? Uh, Pinnacle, Pinnacle Bank Corp. And I got a phone call uh, from them from the, the owner of the bank. And what had happened was one of my mortgage brokers, a guy named Eddie LaFuente, God, he was a problem. Uh, he was always getting caught, jammed up. Uh, and he wasn't even good for but maybe three or four loans a month anyway. So he, he had basically taken the same canceled checks and submitted those canceled checks with all of his loans. So every one of his borrowers had the same Bank of America checks Twelve hundred dollars, Bank of America. He like he didn't even order the try and try and order verify these people. He's just using all fake documents. Sent it to this company. It just so happened that the same underwriter got two of his files like two days in a row and noticed, hey, these canceled checks look familiar. She then opened up the file he had sent her the day before, and they were identical, except for the signatures and the, the you know it was filled. They were filled out a little bit differently. The names of the borrowers were different, but. The, the numbers, the, the routing numbers, the, the cancellation numbers, everything was identical. I mean, that's, you know, that's uh, obviously that's a problem. And they, they then turned around, they pulled all of La Fuente's files and realized that they had like a million dollars worth of bad loans from this guy. And then they kept pulling files and they had sold another million dollars to household bank. So I get a call from this guy, uh, uh, Gary, who owned the uh, Pinnacle Bank, and he's like, look, we got $2 million in bad loans. We just sold a million dollars in bad loans that you guys had provided us. Now, keep in mind, a bad loan just means that it's got fraud in it. doesn't mean that they're not performing. People are paying. They're just not, they're just, they have fraud involved in them. Uh, you know, fraud, there's some fraudulent documents, and those are just the documents that he could see. I mean, who knows what other documents were in there? And I remember he said, um, Matt, listen, uh, you know, we, we got an issue. You got, you know, one of your brokers did this. And I remember I go, a rogue broker? He goes, because you, and Gary goes, because you wouldn't know anything about this. I said, I have no idea what this guy did. And I said, I'm just finding out about this. And he explained the situation. And I said, look, Gary, I said, if you're thinking at the end of this phone call that I'm going to cut you a check for a million or $2 million, I said, I'm going to tell you right now, I don't have the money. I can't do it. And he said, oh, I, I get that. I get that. He goes, look, I just want you to Give me your word that if any of these loans come back on us, because lenders have what's called a, um, they have what's called a, a clawback clause, which means if fraud is found in, the, in a loan that they provided, then they have to buy that loan back. Well, he said, if we, we get hit with a, a clawback uh, on the clawback clause, you'll agree to help us get rid of the house or refinance it or whatever. Now, the likelihood that that's going to happen is is it's just, it's just it's highly unlikely that once these loans have gone from my brokerage business to the lender and from the lender to another lender like household bank and that 6 months later they're going to get caught and they're going to notice the fraud it's highly unlikely so you know, I, I was like, yeah, absolutely. No problem. I mean, what am I going to say? It's that, or he says, okay, I'm going to call the FBI. Now he didn't, he didn't want to call the FBI anyway, because the FBI is going to come in and, and do an internal investigation. They're going to find at least a couple million in bad fraud and bad loans that have been sold. And then Gary's on the hook to buy all these loans back. And it would have been bad. So he says, look, yeah, I said, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll help you get rid of the loans if they come back on your, the properties or whatever. And he says, absolutely. He said, man, I appreciate that. No problem. He said, I don't worry about it. Uh, I'll take care of it. So he ends up selling the selling another million dollars to households. That's two million he knows of. And then I remember a week later, he came down and took me and several of the guys out to to dinner or lunch, I forget which, I think it was dinner. And he actually got, got a little drunk. And I remember he told me, listen, man, he said, Matt, to be honest, he said, I don't care if, I don't care if all of these, I don't care how much fraud is, is in these loans. As long as I can get rid of them and they don't come back on me, he was, I could care less. And, so I mean that that like that kind of I think that lets people know like that was the environment. That was like fraud was not everybody was committing fraud, but it was it was extremely prevalent and it was forgivable. Uh especially the the more 
fraud I was caught with, if, if the lender caught me and I had a bunch of fraud with them, I had a better chance of getting a, of convincing them to let me fix it. If if they were, and especially if they were, so if they were going to lose a hundred or two hundred thousand dollars, they were definitely willing to bend over backwards to let me fix this problem. And that was the environment that I was working in. You know, so I, I was committing fraud. I owned my own mortgage company at this point. I had about a dozen brokers. Uh, by by this point, this was I would say this is two thousand and well, I, I would say I was thirty. How, what was this? Two thousand two thousand one. I was. 30, 31 years old, something like that, 30, 31. And, uh, you know, committing fraud on a regular basis and making good money. And, and I had, was also flipping properties at this point. At this point, I started buying properties real cheap in, in an area of Tampa, just out, well, an area of Tampa called uh, Ybor City. And I was buying properties for 40,000, 50,000, putting whatever. 20,000 in them and then selling them for 100,000 make you know, make a profit of like 20 grand 30 grand depending on the house well I was also buying properties uh, and renovating them so I would buy them renovate them and some of them I would sell I mean I'm sorry some I would sell some I would keep I was also buying rental properties and I would renovate those by this point I was married to a girl named Kayla and we'd we'd had a, a I'd had a son uh, named Cass, and uh, and and what I'd done was I bought about fifty. We bought about fifty-five rental units over the course of a year. And what Kayla did was she managed those properties. That was her job. She raised our son and she managed the properties. She said she was a stay-at-home mom or property slash property manager. But you have to understand she didn't have a job. So one of the things I would do is you know obviously she would buy a property. We'd renovate it. She'd rent out out the the uh, the units. And one another one of the things I would do sometimes is sometimes I would go in and I would buy a property in my name. And I would sell. I would renovate the property, get an appraisal, and then sell the property to Kayla. Well, you know, Kayla never took my last name, so it wasn't Kayla Cox. It was it was her maiden name, and so. I could sell properties to her because the lender didn't know we were married. Because that's not, if you sell, a husband and wife can't sell properties between one another. It's not an arm's length transaction. So that's an issue for lenders. The other thing is the reason I would buy the properties and sell them to her instead of just buying her buying them and refinancing them was something called seasoning. Seasoning says that like you can buy a property for $50,000, let's say. Then you go and you put whatever, $40,000 in it. And now the property is worth one hundred and fifty thousand. Well, you can't use the value of that property to refinance it. You can only use the sale price of that property for the first year. So after a year, you can say, "Hey, it's worth. I bought it for fifty, renovated it, and after a year, you can get an appraisal for one hundred and fifty and refinance based on the value of that of the appraisal." But for the first year, you have to go based on the cost of the purchase of the property and the renovations. So instead of getting a, an appraisal for one hundred and fifty thousand, I can only go off of the fifty thousand I bought it for plus the thirty thousand. That's not enough to refinance it, get my money back, and pull out any money if I wanted to pull out money. So what I did to get around that was I bought the properties in my name, renovated the properties, sold them to Kayla because Kayla isn't subject to seasoning because she's a new buyer. So I would do that, and then of course, all of her documents were fraudulent. So. Her, um, her W-2s and pay subs were all fraudulent. Everything about the file was fraudulent. She was real. She had perfect credit. But the, the, the entire kind of transaction was fraudulent. Well, I had been, so I'm running my mortgage company. And, and not all of the loans going through were fraud. I mean, we were an FHA approved lender, a VA approved lender. We did conventional and we did subprime loans. But most of the subprime loans, almost all the subprime loans were fraud. And some of the, some of the FHA and some of the conventional. So I would say 60 to 80% of the loans going through that company were fraudulent. Well, one of the things that happened was I had bought some properties and I had sold them to Kayla. I think it was three properties. And at some point, somebody, some of the, a couple of the brokers that used to work for me, one being my ex, uh, my old mortgage, my old uh, manager, remember the manager 
that had I'd first committed fraud, showed me how to commit fraud. Um, she had come to work for me and then she opened up her own mortgage company. Her name was Gretchen. And her her husband was Pete. So it was Peter. So it was, it was Gretchen and Pete Zayas. So they had come to work for me and then they went and started their own company. Well, what I was doing was because I was buying these properties and renovating them, I didn't want to close the loan through my own company because once again, that's also a, not a non-arms length transaction. So I could buy the properties. I could sell them to my my wife at the time in her maiden name, but I couldn't close those loans in my company's name. So I had those loans and I ran those closings through Gretchen Zaya's company. Well, at some point I'd done like three loans through Gretchen, her company. At some point, Gretchen and Pete got in trouble because they were, they were doing what's called a straw man scam. They'd met a bunch of guys that were buying houses and selling them to each other. So they'd find a house for, let's say, $500,000. And then they'd get it appraised at like $700,000, which in that, ain't, in that range isn't that difficult to do. So the new buyer would qualify for a seven. So one guy has it for 500000 He buys it. He sells it for 700000 to some borrower. That borrower qualifies for $700,000 because Gretchen is committing fraud. She's... She's creating a fraudulent, uh, a fraudulent, um, whatever, W-2s, pay subs, whatever she's doing, she's getting this guy to qualify for a $700,000 loan that he's not, really shouldn't qualify for. So when the guy who bought it for $500,000 sells it to the guy who's qualifying for a $700,000 loan, now there's a profit of $700,000. Well, Gretchen was getting a huge broker fee plus a kickback and these guys are splitting whatever. Let's say there's 150,000 left over. They're splitting 150,000. They rent the property out and they're supposed to rent it out and have someone rent it. Well, what ended up happening was the one guy borrowed, he qualified for five or six loans. She did five or six loans for this one guy. He never makes a payment. Those loans go into foreclosure. They're what's called first payment defaults. And as a result of that first payment default, they the FBI comes in and they investigate. They realize it's a fraud. They're all fraudulent transactions. And they realize that Pete and Gretchen Zayas are the ones who did the fraudulent transactions. They come into their office and they raid their office. They get all their files, including my ex-wife's file. That's what they told me anyway. The truth is, so I, I could call up or Gretchen and I get a phone call from Gretchen one day. She, I know she's in trouble. I had just refinanced her personal residence to get her the money to pay her lawyer. And as soon as I got her that money, she gave it to her lawyer. The first thing her lawyer said was, who did this loan? And she said, well, this guy, Matt Cox, is he committing fraud? She said, yes. He said, my advice to you is to wear a wire on him, get him to talk about fraud, get him busted, and then you don't have to go to jail. So rat him out. So the guy that just refinanced your house to get you the money to pay me, I'm telling you to now turn him into the FBI nice right like that's that's uh that's a good criminal lawyer hey sorry for interrupting the video but want to let you guys know that if you join my patreon at the top tier every single month you get a different painting and the contact information for my patreon page is in the description back to the video um and so what she does is she puts on she wears a wire she calls me up and says look can i talk to you can we have lunch i want to talk to you about some you know about something so I go, sure, no problem. So I drive out to this pizzeria and I meet her and Pete and I sit down and I go, hey, what's up? And she says, listen, the FBI is asking about you. And I go, about me? She goes, yeah, well, not so much about you. She said about, really about Kayla, my my wife. And I went, why, what about Kayla? She goes, well, you know those three loans that you did through my company? And I went, yeah. She said, they're asking about those loans. They're saying that they know that Kayla, it, you and Kayla are married and that or they think that you're married or whatever it was, uh, they know the loans are fraudulent. And I went, are you serious? I said, what did you tell them? She said, well, we haven't told them anything. I said, you didn't tell them that the that the W-2s and pay stubs are fake, did you? You haven't told them anything about the, the loan? Like, I immediately start saying things that bury me. You didn't tell them we were married, did you? You didn't tell them, like, I mean, I'm just bury myself. And I remember in the middle of the conversation, <clears throat> I remember saying, look, here's what you do. Tell them you never met Kayla. Say she called you on the phone. She gave you the information on the phone. 
She faxed over all the information. So like, I started coming up with this plausible way for them to deny that they really knew anything about the fraud. And then I would have Kayla just not talk to the FBI. And therefore, the whole, the whole investigation should fall apart. You don't have anybody cooperating. Nobody met in person. Who knows who showed up at the closing? Like, we don't really know. Like, basically, they could blame it. Kayla could blame it on uh, Gretchen and Pete. Pete and Gretchen could blame it on on um, Kayla. Who knows what the processors and underwriters did? Like, there's too many people involved to, to indict someone. So that was my thought process. I was wrong, but that was my thought process. So I started coming up with this plausible story to try and clear everybody or at least put enough confusion into the whole investigation that they don't pursue it. And while I'm explaining this, I remember Gretchen said, Matt, we can't lie to the FBI. And I went, what? What are you talking about? I go, you've been lying to them. I said, you just lied to them when when you just went and signed, refinanced your house because their house loan was all fraudulent. Like W-2s were fraudulent, the pay stubs, everything. I go, you just lied to them. You just borrowed like 70 some odd thousand dollars to pay your lawyer. That whole loan was fraud. You've been lying. And she, and so Pete stands up, like bolts up and he goes, we've never lied to the FBI. We may not have told them everything, but we never lied. And I looked at him and I was like, what the fuck is he doing? Like, what are you, who are you telling that to? Like, I know that's not true. Why would you say all, like, why would you, what are you doing? Like, you're not telling me. You, 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 me, and Gretchen know that's a lie. So I realized, oh God, he's wired. And I was like, oh my God. What's so funny about that is that the FBI agent was actually sitting like right beside us, kind of behind, you know, kind of, and I had at one point when we first sat down, I go, hey, hey, I go, bro, bro. Cause the guy, there was a guy, the guy that was sitting there, the FBI agent had ordered a piece, a slice of pizza and he had folded the pizza up and the napkin was under the pizza, was wrapped around the pizza and he was eating the pizza and the napkin. And so I go, hey, 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 bro, bro, bro. And he looked and he, he, he kind of like tried not to look over. Like he was like looking like that. I go, whoa, hey, hey, hey. So finally he glances at me. I go, bro, you're eating your napkin. And he goes, what? And he looked and he goes, oh, thanks. And he kind of, gl- they all glanced at each other. And I didn't smile, like, <laughs> like a nervous smile. I didn't realize that was the FBI agent. That was, he's sitting there and they're recording it. So anyway, Pete stands up and goes, we've, uh, I, we've never, we haven't lied. We haven't lied. We haven't told them everything, but we never lied. And I was like, oh man. And I looked down, I realized like both their cell phones are on the table. They're both sitting there leaning in. And I was like, oh. They were wired. They're wired. And I looked and I said, wow. I said, I hope you get something for me. I hope you get something for this. And she looked at me and she was, she starts crying. She starts, tears start rolling down her face. And she said, I don't have to go to jail, Matt. She goes, I have a kid. I have a kid. And I, I go, I don't have a kid. Like she babysat my kid. Like we've been on vacation together. Like I go, I don't have a kid. I said, listen, I said, Tell the FBI agent I'll talk to him, but not to come in my office because when the FBI raided her office, everybody quit. I go, so, because they're all committing fraud. So I said, you tell him not to come in my office. Call me on the phone and I'll come down there and talk to him. So I stand up and I leave. Hey, I hope you're enjoying the video. And if you're interested in buying a painting from me, my contact information is in the description box. Back to the video. I mean, but look, I drove back to my office. Within 10 or 15 minutes, my phone, my secretary goes, Matt, there's an agent, Scott Gale, on the phone for you, FBI. And I was like, holy shit. Pick up the phone. I'm like, hey, what's going on? He goes, hey, Mr. Cox, uh, I'm sure you know what this is about. I mean, he didn't even pretend like, he didn't even come up with a story. He knew. Like, it was like, he didn't even pretend like, oh, I just happened to be investigating. No, no, you know, like I called because they told me to call. He goes, look, uh, you, you know, I know you know what this is about. Why don't you, uh, when can you come down? I said, oh, I'll come down on Monday. Uh, yeah, I'll call you, to, give me your phone number and I guess phone number and everything. Well, I immediately go out and I, I I, schedule a bunch of appointments with lawyers. I end up with a lawyer by the name of Gary Trombley, super uh, a high profile lawyer. I give him $75,000 and uh, to basically I go in and I explain to him, I said, listen, man, I said, he was like, well, you know, based on potential loss, you could be looking at three years. 
And I go, potential loss? He's like, yeah, you could have lost. And he starts adding up the numbers and it doesn't even make sense. Like it's, it's all bullshit. Like he's trying to scare me. And he did scare me. But what he was saying was, look, these properties are worth, you know, let's say 150,000. So that's a potential loss of 150,000. And I, he said, because, you know, if they went bad, then they have to, then they'll end up losing 150,000. I said, no, I said, that loss is offset by the property itself. And the property is worth 150,000. She borrowed 150, it's worth 150. We have appraisals on it. And he's like, that's not how it works. And I had read the example of potential loss. And I said, that's exactly how it, how it, it, how it works. And I read off the example. And he's like, Matt, 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 listen, Mr. Cox, that's just not how it works, okay? Yeah, trust me, there's a half a million dollar potential loss. You could do up to three years, blah, blah, blah. He was full of shit. He's just trying to justify his, his fee. Because what happened was a few months later when I come back, he says, well, I got them to drop the potential loss uh, by, by offsetting the potential loss with the value of the home. And see, so the way it works is then he explained the same thing that I had told him I had read. It was like, bro, what are you doing? Like, this is exactly what the conversation we had before. Only now he's making my argument. The point is I pay him 75 grand. He, I plead guilty. I end up pleading guilty to, uh, I think it was wire fraud. So I pled guilty to wire fraud. Now they wanted to charge my my uh, ex wife or my sorry my wife at the time Kayla, and I told them that I would. The conversation was initially the initial conversation was he said you should cooperate. He said you should go in your office. He goes is is there any anybody else committing fraud? I said they're all committing fraud, and he said. He goes, you should go in the office, grab 10 or 20 of the most egregious fraudulent files from your brokers, bring them to the FBI, work with the FBI to get those, those brokers busted, you know, it charged and indicted. And then he said, I might be able to get your charges dropped. You and your wife's charges dropped completely. Like it's called a it's called um, pretrial intervention. So if you work with them, they won't indict you because I hadn't been indicted yet, nor had uh, my, my uh, wife at the time. And I said, nah, bro. I said, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to indict. I'm not going to get these guys messed up. I'm not going to, I'm not going to get these people. I'm not going to, I'm not going to rat out my friends. Like, like I totally still believe that there was like a code, like everybody, like that we were all kind of, kind of like criminals and we were going to look out for each other. And I didn't realize how it worked that really everybody rolls over on everybody. You know, I believed, you know, the Godfather in Omarta and you don't tell on your friends and you don't tell on the other, the other criminals and it just doesn't exist. So, but at the time I was an idiot and instead of look, had it been now and what I know now, I would have walked in there with a doll. I would have walked into our Friday meeting with a dolly and asked the guys to help me load up all of the file cabinets, load up the file cabinets, walk back into the meeting and say, listen, I'm going to bring these to the FBI. And uh, I just suggest you guys all uh, get lawyers and cooperate because you're all going to be fucked up. And I would have left. But I was an idiot and I didn't do that. And I let myself get indicted. And I actually told said, look, I will plead guilty, indict me, plead guilty if you drop the charges on my wife. She didn't know anything was going on. She didn't know. So the lawyer goes back to the, uh, to the U.S. attorney and explains that situation. He says, we believe that the wife knew everything. There's no way she didn't know this. But we think Cox was orchestrated the whole thing, and we get him wanting to plead guilty to take the charge for his wife. There's no reason for them both to get in trouble. So we have no problem with that. And they said, of course, you know, they did say they could, that there could be no indictments if I would cooperate. And of course he said, well, he's unwilling to cooperate. He says that, you know, he's not going to do that. They said, okay, fine. Well, because there was no potential loss and no actual loss, I ended up getting three years. I pled guilty to wire fraud and got three years probation. I had to forfeit um, my license as a mortgage broker while I was also a brokerage business owner. So that meant that I could no longer run my brokerage business. It couldn't be in my name. So I transferred the brokerage business into a one of my brokers. He was a, a CPA. He had, you know, that's not true. He was a, a tax attorney. He had a tax he had a master's degree in tax. He wasn't a CPA. Uh, um he was a he had a master's degree in tax. Uh and so he uh he was an accountant 
anyway, he, so I transferred the, the, the company into his name and he kept me on, he get paid me $8,000 a month because that's what my basic bills were. And at the same time that all of that happened, so when all of that happened, all this is happening, <laughs> my wife and I get a divorce. So we're in the middle of this whole thing, we start uh, the divorce proceedings. And by the time I'm now a felon, I've lost my business, although I still do have an income coming in. She got all the properties. I paid off all of her credit cards, all of her debts, all of her, everything she had, I paid her off. I paid $2,000 a month for child support and she kept all of the properties and collected rent on those properties. So she was making, she was making over a hundred and something odd thousand dollars. Plus you get that she got the, all the depreciation of the properties. So you've got a couple million dollars worth of properties that she's getting the depreciation on. So she's paying almost no taxes and she's got a huge amount of money coming in. And I'm living off of 8,000 a month and my bills are outrageous. Anyway, I end up moving into this property in Ybor City. I had completely renovated property I'd bought for like 80 grand. And, you know, but I'm, I don't look, I know it sounds like $8,000 is a lot of money. All right. But the life I was living at that time, you know, I'm driving a brand new Audi. I think it was an Audi Quattro TT. Those were like 50, 60 grand. Um, and it was a lease. It was like a thousand a month up for the lease. You know, I've got my, my property is I'm renovating a new property. I'm buying rental properties. I'm flipping properties. I mean, I, I was not, I was, I was, I was doing okay, I guess, but I wasn't making the kind of money I'd made when I was, when I owned the mortgage company and everything I'd basically made the mortgage company, I just handed over to my ex-wife. Uh, you know, I was able to see my son every other weekend. I got him like every Wednesday, you know, and that was nice. Uh, you know, I had a girlfriend I was dating. I dated, I was dating a bunch of different chicks. And that's really where this really went off the rails. Because now I, I at this point, I don't own the mortgage company anymore. I'm getting a salary from the mortgage company and I, I'm able to man, help manage it by, uh, by dealing with a lot of the paperwork and helping to train the brokers. But I now don't really have a, a full-time job. I mean, that's maybe 20 hours a week. And so what I decided was, I was like, oh, I'm gonna open a development company with this guy named Rudy. He's a real estate agent. He's actually still a real estate agent here in, in, in Tampa. He didn't talk to me for some reason. I don't know, he's kind of a dickhead. So, especially for a guy who was committing just a ton of fraud. Uh, now he's, he doesn't wanna to talk to me because he's like, that was a horrible part of my turn. That was a horrible, it's funny. He says, that was, a, that was a horrible thing that happened, that whole fraud thing. And then I, I got talked to by the FBI and, and it was just a horrible part of my life. It's like, I'm the one that went to prison. Like you didn't get indicted. You're still a real estate agent. You didn't go to jail for, for 12 and a half years. Like nothing happened to you. You talked to the FBI and you were scared. So what a fucking jerk off that guy is. So what ended up happening was I met Rudy and Rudy and I and my, my other partner, his name was David and another guy named Jonathan. We all decided to open up a development company and build, start building brand new like luxury lofts which are like really nice duplexes in Ybor City, a shithole area of Tampa. But it was going, going through a lot of gentrification. There was a lot of money being dumped into the area. And so we decided to do that, but you know, we don't really have the money to do it. So I figured, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna start flipping properties and committing fraud to raise the money to do this d development company. And in my mind, I was thinking I'll steal the money and invest it in a, in a, in a legitimate company. And that's just a really foolish way to think. Uh, but at the time, because now all the money going into that company is tainted. And as a result of that, that company is completely a fraud, is fraudulent and therefore able to be seized by the government if they could ever link that money to the fraudulent transactions. So what I came up with, I, I sat back and I thought, you know what I'm gonna do? Here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna come up with a fraud that I can commit that's a massive, massive fraud that I can commit that nobody actually knows a fraud has been committed. And that fraud included what's called synthetic identity fraud. And it was bank fraud and mortgage fraud and real estate fraud and credit card fraud all wrapped into one. 
and really a, just a really amazing scheme that I came up with. And I, I hate to say that, and I know it sounds like I'm bragging and everything else, but listen, I got, you know, I, I've got, I've got, I've got professional FBI, Secret Service, um, professional white collar criminals, white collar experts. I got judges, lawyers, everybody. All of them were saying the same thing. It was a brilliant, it was a brilliant scam. I'm now already a criminal, so I might as well start, you know being a criminal, acting more like a criminal. Like, like before I felt like I was doing a little bit, I was doing fraud, but it was it was fraud for customers to get them into property so I could make large commissions. And, you know. What year was it? Uh, oh, so this is 2002. So by now I'm, it's 2000, it's like May, it's like mid 2002. And I was early 2002, mid 20, uh, whatever first part of let's say uh, 2002 and what i did was i decided i was going to open up a development company with a bunch of uh, some of my other some of the other guys that i knew some real estate agents and and some business partners and we were going to open up but we didn't we needed money to do it and nobody had enough a significant amount of money to open up a development company and we wanted to to build these new properties in Ebor City, which is like an area of Tampa that was going through revitalization. And what I decided to do was I, I needed to come up with a scam that was what I consider to be semi foolproof so that I could basically steal from the banks and they wouldn't realize they'd, they'd been defrauded. So what I did was I decided I was gonna start flipping properties to do that. I was gonna buy properties cheap, fix them up, sell them. You know? and, but the problem with that is that, you know, the problem with that is you buy, if you buy properties in a cheap, cheap properties in a cheap area and then you fix them up and you sell them you know the problem is those areas don't appraise very high so i have to fi- had to figure out how to get that properties to appraise high and then the other problem is people that buy houses in crappy areas like that they tend to have credit problems you know job they have employment problems they have rental history problems they have credit problems uh, they have down payment problems. Like they have, they're they're a major they're a major problem. Like they'll quit their job four days before the closing, or they'll go out and spend all the money for their down payment or something. They just do stupid stuff. So they're a problem. And then they have bad credit. That's a problem. So I needed to get away, a, figure out a way around that. And what I came up with was creating my own borrowers. And having those fake borrowers, well, the, uh, by the way, the other problem when you fix up a property, the other problem is you spend a lot of money renovating it. So I didn't want, want to spend, blow money renovating the properties. I wanted, you buy them for 50. I didn't want to put another 30 in it and then sell it for 120. Or even if I could get it appraised high, sell it for whatever that, why would I blow 30 grand? Why wouldn't I put five grand in it? So what, what fixed all these was creating synthetic identities. So what I did was I figured out how to create synthetic identities by using the social security numbers of kids that really hadn't been born yet. So, or, or hadn't been well, fake kids. So, you know, you get social security. I convinced social security to start issuing me social security numbers to children that didn't exist. And this takes place over long. Initially it started where, I just got social security numbers from kids that were like three or four years old. Like I went into my, the file cabinets and found kids, people that had, were claiming their children on their 1040s, which I had copied their 1040s. So they'd be like, hey, I have three kids. Here's their socials. And I'm claiming them as dependents. So I would go in and get those like, oh, this kid's three, this kid's two, he's five. I'd get those numbers just to kind of play around. But ultimately what I ended up doing was going to social security and convincing social security to issue me social security numbers for children that had never been born. So I would say, hey, I've got a 10 month old son and I'd provide a fake birth certificate and a fake shot record. And I would get them to issue me a social security number to a child that doesn't exist. And then I would take that social security number and I would go and I'd apply online to a credit card company. Sorry, to a, uh, whatever, to a bank that issues credit cards, whatever. And I'd apply, and th- of course they would deny them. So I'd go online, they'd deny it. But what it would do is when I plugged in, I would give, so I'd say the kid was like 30 years old. So this 30-year-old kid, here's a social, se- this 30-year-old kid. Here's a 30-year-old man. Here's his social security number. Here's his address. Here's his job. And I would apply for a, for a credit card. 
They would deny it, of course, but what that they denied it because they didn't know who the person was and he had no credit scores. But it would create a credit profile. And that credit profile would say that this person's name, John Doe, this is his date of birth, this is his social, this is his address, this is where he works. So now that's listed in, in the credit bureau. I would then turn around and I would apply for credit cards with companies that also ordered secured credit cards. They would then say you're denied for the Bank of America Platinum Visa, but if you give us $300, we'll give you a secured credit card. So I would do that for this fictitious person, this synthetic identity, and they would send me a credit card. And I started making the payments on those credit cards. After six months of keeping the balances below 30% of the available balance on the card, I, it would the, the credit bureaus would generate credit scores. So after six months, these people would have they would have um, they would have uh, credit scores of like 705, 720, 690, you know, 695. Like they were all right around 700. So my borrowers end up with 700 credit scores. My fake borrowers have 700 credit scores. At that time, you only needed a 620 to get a loan. So to get 95% financing or 80 or 90, whatever you want, you, to get a loan you own, on a, a mortgage, you only needed a, a 620 or higher. My guys have 700. So what I did was I went into Ybor City and I started buying houses. So the way an appraisal works is this. Say I buy a house for, in an area for, let's say I'm, I wanna buy a house for $60,000. And let's say they, if you're gonna buy a house or refinance a house and you wanna borrow money from the bank, the bank sends out an appraiser. And that appraiser goes out and he looks at your property. He then looks at the surrounding properties that have sold recently that are the same square footage, um, that are the same type of house. Like if you have a, if you have a two-story triplex, you can't compare it to a single-story, single-family home. I mean, it has to be a single family. It has to be apples to apples. So what happens is these houses in Ebor are selling for 75000 if they're in good shape. So how do I buy houses for 50,000 that are in bad shape in Ebor, clean them up a little bit and get them to appraise at $200,000? You need comparable sales, right? So the reason Ebor City at the time was all selling for 75,000 is because all the houses are selling. So there's no comparable sales for anything over 75,000. So I went in and I started buying houses for $50,000 in the name of fake borrowers my synthetic identities. I would, and we also call them phantom borrowers. So that's what the, uh, the, the, that's what the, the newspaper started calling them phantom borrowers. So I would go in and I'd buy a house for 50,000 and I would then go downtown and I would record the value of that home for 200,000. So I would say that, that this property that I bought for 50 had actually been bought for 200 or, you know, whatever, on average, 175, 210, 190. So now you've got one house in Ybor City worth 200,000. That's not enough to borrow against because as soon as the appraiser comes out, he's going to say, this house is worth two, you bought it for 200, but all the other comparable sales are worth 75. So what I did was I bought one house for 50 and recorded the value at 190. I bought another house for 50 or 60 and recorded the value at 210. I bought, an, bought another house for 50,000 and recorded the value at 200. Bought another house, so I start buying houses and re recording the value in the name of fake people. And the borrowers were names, they were names like, now there were some other borrower names, like there was a guy named Alan Duncan, there was one named Joel Cologne. So what I very quickly started naming them after characters on Reservoir Dog. So I, the movie Reservoir Dogs by Quentin Tarantino. So what happens is I was naming them like, one of the guy's names was James Red. One was named Lee Black. One's named like Michael White. One is named like uh, David Silver. One was named William Blue. So one was named Brandon Green. So these, these guys, and they all have credit cards. They all have perfect credit profiles. So they all have 700 credit score plus. 
Hey, I hope you're enjoying the video. If you're interested in getting a painting done by me, my contact information is in the description box. Enjoy the video. Once they bought the, I bought the house, recorded the value, I would then clean it up. You know, I'm not putting in new pipes and new, new electrical. We're just painting, doing very basic painting, trimming the trees, cleaning the front yards, painting the outside of the house, and we're doing a horribly shitty cheap job. But the appraiser would come in and he would look at the property and he'd say, well, it's not a great property, but it's, it's okay. And he'd say, it's in a bad area, but man, there's comparable sales all over the place. Like that house down the street sold for 210. That one sold for 190. That one sold for 195. And I'd say, well, and I'd say, yeah, I bought this property for 190. How much can you get it appraised for? He'd say, oh, I can get it appraised for like 195. So this property that I bought for 50,000 and put 10,000 into is now worth $195,000. So James Red can now refinance the property. He can get, let's say, a 90% of 195. So let's say that's 170. I don't know the exact number. So take 60,000 out of that because I need my, my, the money I put up back plus my renovations back. That means that after closing, you're making about $100,000. Well, James Red bought, borrowed about a million dollars in, in, in real estate or in, in, in mortgages. James Red borrowed a million, Brandon Green borrowed a million, David Silver borrowed a million, Lee Black borrowed a million. Well, so over the course of, this starts going, starts happening in early 2002. And we start, and this is literally, the first closing I had was a few, was like a month or so after I was sentenced to three years. So, I mean, I'm, I'm literally sentenced to three years probation. I'm now a felon. And a month later, we did a, we did a house that was $150,000 or $160,000. I borrowed like $110,000 $110, and a guy named, I want to say it was Brandon Green. So we borrowed like, a, like I'm sorry, we borrowed like $210,000. Or no, wait, it was one night. I think it was 196. I think I borrowed 196,000. It's, in, it's actually, it's in my book. I have the exact numbers like in the book. I'm not gonna look, find it. So it's like 190, 195, right around that. Borrowed $195,000 in Brandon Green like a, within a month of me being sentenced. Uh, and then immediately turned around and borrowed money in this in another guy's name and another guy's name. And, started, and, and so now I, I ended up doing like 109 houses in Ybor City. That's what the FBI said I did. It said They said I borrowed in excess of eleven and a half million dollars in in mortgages, and you know, and that once again, listen, got caught all the time. I got caught one time by a bank. What was the name of that bank? South Star Bank. They actually caught me red-handed. Like they called the broker. They called. The account executive, they called the broker. The broker came into my office and said, South Star Bank is calling. They're saying that this is fraud. I then call up the bank and talk to the owner of the bank, like the bank president and the head of their fraud department, which, which said he was, ex, he was ex-FBI. And, I, and they sat there and they're, they're saying, look, you know, this, you don't even exist. Like I'm saying, I, I remember it was Alan Duncan. I said I was Alan Duncan. And they're going, you don't even exist, Mr. Duncan. This is like, this is this whole, this whole loan is fraud. The reason what had happened was that we were supposed to obviously start making a few payments. We never made the first payment on this particular one. I was, I had given it, uh, I'd given money to, to everybody that was involved and Rudy was supposed to make the first payment and he never made the first payment. He was just an idiot. This is one of these guys who like just can barely feed himself. Like he's a real estate agent, but he's just a constantly fucking, he's a fuck up. So the very first payment, he never even made the first payment. So then I call up and that sparked a whole investigation. And so I have to call them up and I explain to them, look, let me just pay the money back. And he's like, they were like, look, we're going to call the FBI and we'll get our money back when we sell the property. And I was like, no, 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 that's not true. And I had to explain to them that they thought they had lent like $150,000 on a piece of property that was worth 200,000. And once I explained to them that they'd lent $150,000 on a piece of property that was worth probably $30,000, maybe 50, that they were gonna about to lose a minimum, a minimum they were gonna lose was 100,000. Once I explained that to them, 
they were like, okay, okay, wait a second, let's talk about this. Can you give us the money back? Let's. So they let me send them the money back. They still didn't call the FBI. We just had an agreement. We just agreed, I'll send you the money back if you promise not to, you know, because you keep in mind, if they call the FBI, I get caught, I got to pay them back anyway. So I was like, let me just put send the money back. And they said, you send the money back, we'll consider this just a mistake. And it was a problem and uh, uh we'll cut we won't we won't contact anybody we just want our money back so i sent them back the hundred fifty thousand dollars. loan was done I, I mean that uh you know it, it was a done deal but i got caught i mean i got caught several times and i always just paid them back and got away with it so what's funny about this whole thing is that what i would do with these the reason that most of the time i got away with it is this let's say i was brandon green brandon green would borrow let's say roughly five or six loans, he'd get five or six mortgages and he would let's say, end up borrowing like a million dollars. We'd walk away with, let's say 600,000. Then we'd, we'd make a few payments and we'd let those loans go into foreclosure. When those loans went into foreclosure, the banks would foreclose on the property. They then put the house back on the market and then they'd sell the house and they'd take the loss. They would assume, hey, we lent 150,000 or 180,000 on this house we put it on, back on the market for two hundred thousand. Three months later, it didn't sell. We'd lower it to one fifty. Three months later, it wouldn't sell. We'd lower it again to hundred thousand. By that point, somebody would make an offer for sixty or seventy thousand, and they'd sell it. And they'd go, "Hey, we just lost almost hundred thousand dollars." But that happens, and they didn't think anything was wrong. The other thing was when the when they would start sending collection letters to the borrowers. I would then write a letter from my fictitious borrower's sister saying that, and I would, I would type up, I'll, I would take a, a, an article from the newspaper, like a, a 30 car pile up on I-75 or something, and somebody was life flighted to Tampa General Hospital, and I would retype the article and I would put my borrower's name in it. I'd print it out on, on newsprint, cardstock news, newsprint. And then I'd cut it out and I'd make a copy of it. And then I'd highlight the name of the borrower that I'd put in the article. And I'd send a letter with that, with that cl newspaper clipping with the letter, with a letter from the borrower's sister saying that her brother had been in a catastrophic you know, accident and was life flighted to Tampa General Hospital. And he was currently in a coma and that the doctors said, look, even if he wakes up from the coma, he'll never work again. And that the lender should just go ahead and foreclose on the property. They would stop sending letters. I gave them a reasonable explanation as to why this person wasn't making the payment anymore. And they accepted it. They'd then put the house, they'd foreclose, put the house back on the market, sell the house, take the loss, move on. I would also run up the credit cards of these guys. So once I'd get loaded them up with debt, I'd then apply for a bunch of credit cards, get up $30,000, 20 or 30,000 in credit cards. I'd then go to the mall, run up the credit cards. So each one of these guys was worth, they, they'd end up with like a million, million, million and change in mortgages. They're worth $600,000, $700,000 uh, profit. And then the banks would, you know, they just cut their losses and move on. And it was, it was a great scam. You know, I mean, I shouldn't say that I probably shouldn't say that, but it was a great scam and it worked really well. Remember Rudy and I would go to the mall and run up the credit cards and he would always be so nervous. Like I'd, we'd go buy like a thousand, two thousand dollars worth of clothes or whatever we were borrowing, computer equipment. I mean, we were uh, whatever borrowing, whatever we were buying. We'd buy a couple thousand dollars buying, we're buying Rolex watches and all kinds of just junk. And we're sort of buying stuff. And we'd get up to the counter and he would always get so scared. And I'd pull out a credit card. He'd be like, huh, huh, huh. What are you doing? What, are you doing? what do you mean, what am I doing? I'm using a credit card. That's what we're here for. Oh, oh, huh. oh. You know, we'd whoop, it'd go, what if they notice? What if they call the police? What, how are they going to call the police? It's my credit card. Like I am Brandon Green. I'm Brandon Green. I ordered the credit card. They sent it to me. I activated it. I've been using it. Why are, who, who's going to call the cops? There's no Brandon Green. And he just was, some people are just not, they're not psychologically prepared to commit fraud and be under that high anxiety. It wasn't even high anxiety. Because there was just no chance that they were even going to, even if they got a phone call. 
by that point, I was making my own IDs. So by that point, I'd figured out how to make my own IDs. By that point, I'm making fake IDs and I'm going into the bank and I'm actually opening up bank accounts. Hey, sorry for interrupting the video, but want to let you guys know that if you join my Patreon at the top tier, every single month you get a different painting and the contact information for my Patreon page is in the description. Back to the video. All right. So there was, just, there was just no chance that, that anybody was going to think that there was fraud that had been committed. Um, what was I going to tell you? Oh, so oh, bank account. Sorry. Sorry. At this point, it's bank account. So the bank, so I would go into, I was making fake IDs and I would go in and I would open up bank accounts. So I'm opening up bank accounts using, like I would give the ID to the person at the bank and they would run my ID. There's a computer or there's a program, I don't know if they still have it, in where they would actually generate what your, what your Florida ID number should be. So I had the Florida ID number on my fake IDs. And I would go in, and because these guys don't exist, they don't have an ID, and I would actually be able to open up a bank account in the name of some fraudulent person. And what's so funny is that the fake IDs were not great. Like they would grab them. Um, it's funny because I actually had like several, I've had people look at them, like the FBI and stuff, they would look and they go, oh, they look, they look really good, but they didn't. I didn't think they looked, they looked good, but to me they weren't like, they didn't look great, I didn't think. They looked good enough to fool people. So I'd give it to the bank. The bank would, sometimes they would actually take it and they would look at it like to see the hologram. Like I would freak out. I was like, be like, start sweating like, oh my God. And they'd sit it down and they'd, they'd type in, they'd start the process of opening the bank account and they would say, have you ever had a bank account before? Cause nothing's coming up. And I'd say, oh no, I haven't had one in like, gosh, uh, you know, it was in my ex-wife's name or, you know, whatever it was. Uh, and they would open up a bank account for me. So I, I mean, I had bank accounts, I had credit cards, I had everything I needed to launder the money, and I had a full foolproof scam. The only time, you know, so there was so one time this happened. This is funny. So what's funny about that is that I would. So I've got the appraisals are working, like the appraisers working for me. I've got um, I've got the whole thing set up where where the appraisals are coming in solid. I've got my borrowers, which are solid, their credit solid, their employment solid, like everything's pretty solid. And the loans are going through and then they're going into foreclosure. Nobody knows. This has been going on forever. Like at this point, I'm probably at 10 or $11 million we brought in. I think by the end, the FBI ended up saying we did like 11 and a half million. My, this scam netted me 11.5 million is what they said. Over a hundred houses. Um, over, the of, what time over the course of 18 months. So it seems like a lot of houses, mm -hmm. but so, well, one time, this is funny, one time, and so many people knew what was going on. One time I, I had a guy named James Red that I was doing, the synthetic identity by the name of James Red. James Red um, had borrowed like five or six, no, like four or five houses at this point. He'd borrowed eight, nine hundred thousand dollars in mortgages. And, but what we were doing is once we put together a full package, we would run it through, through my old mortgage company. And we would close it at title companies where we knew, we knew the people at the title company. So I could show up at the title company and say, hey, listen, my guy isn't going to be able to be here for the closing. Can I drive the package, the closing package out to him at his work and get him to sign? And the title people would let me do that. So I pick it up and I'd go sit in my car and I'd sign all the documents and I'd make a copy of his fake ID and the, the pictures that I was using on the IDs. Now, some of them I could, I would make a fake ID. If I was going to go use his credit cards, I'd put, a, put my picture on it. But typically they were just pictures of people that I knew that had been arrested. So it was kind of a joke. So like, let's say it was some tenant that I knew that had lived in one of our places so if it was, it was some tenant I knew that had been arrested a few times, I'd go on the Hillsborough County arrest website and I'd pull his photo off and I'd use his photo on the ID. Well, one of the guys, so what was funny was, uh, and, and then I, I'd put that on there and then I'd close the loan and I'd keep using his picture. And then when the whole thing was going to go under 
and I was going to run up his credit cards, I'd then switch the ID into my with my picture, and I'd go in and run up his credit cards for twenty or thirty grand. And you know, I do everything. Like my this chick I was dating named Jan. I remember I put like a thousand dollars worth of new new tires on her truck. Or I would, you know, you're paying for anything. Like somebody's like, hey, bro, can, I need new furniture. Can you put like five grand on a credit card? Sure, no problem. I mean, we all have everything we want. So it was a lot of fun. So uh, what ended up happening was at one point, one of the title people figured out that the bar, one of the borrowers that was closing, that I was closing loans with at her title company was fake. Somebody had called her and told her, hey, something's not right. Like, I think this is, I th- something's not right. Like, these people don't exist. I don't know what she knew or who told her. I never figured that out. But what happened was one day I got a, I got a phone call from a, a, a mortgage broker named Kelly Pruitt. And Kelly said, hey, listen, you know, Mary at like Island Title or Paradise, I think it was Paradise Title. At Paradise Title, Mary is saying that, that, next time James Red does a closing with her, he has to show up. And she's like, we have a closing like in a couple of days. She's saying he has to show up. And she's like, "He's she's got to know. And I was like, I mean, okay. And she's like, I mean, Matt, what are we going to do? I said, well, I mean, if he's got to show up, he's got to show up. Normally, Mary would just give me the package and let me have somebody ha- and bring it to James Red. But I was like, look, if she's saying he's got to show up, he's got to show up. And she's like, how? I mean, he's like a fake, he's, he's some paperwork and a fake ID. I said, no, it's okay. I said, I'm, I'm gonna, I'll figure it out. So I actually called this guy named Eric Tamargo. And Eric comes in the office. I said, Eric, can you come in? And Eric used to clean all the yards for us. He would trim the trees, clean out the yards of these dumps that we were buying and make the outside look presentable. He owned like a landscaping company. So he shows up and he walks in. And I know Eric. I've known Eric for a while. I knew his uh, his ex wife uh, his ex wife back then. Her name was Amy. She was an account executive that used to come in for one of the one of the um, one of the lenders. And so I, that's how I knew him. And and they got divorced. And he was you know just kind of a derelict at the time. And and you know he's doing cleaning yards and stuff. Uh, but he was also had a drug problem. And so he comes in. And I'm like, he's like, hey, man, what's going on, bro? Everything cool? I said, yeah, yeah, everything's cool. I said, look, Eric, I got to tell you something. And I said, can you sit down? He goes, sure. So he sits down. I said, look, you know all these houses we've been buying? And he goes, yeah. I said, well, let me tell you what we've been doing. We've been buying them for like 50000 recording the value at this amount. Okay. I said, you know how an appraisal works? And I explained it to him. He's like, oh, okay. I go, then we, we, re, we have somebody buy those properties. The people that are buying the properties and refinancing those properties are fake people. And I explained to him about how I made the fake people. And he was like, holy shit, bro. I said, right. And then we, we make a few payments and we let him go into foreclosure. So we, we load the guy up with a million dollars and then we just let him go into foreclosure. And he was like, oh my God, bro, that is what happens when the banks, fi- banks don't figure it out. Here's why. I explained that. He's like, man, this is brilliant. I said, right. I said, the problem is, Eric, usually I am able to just sign for, for these people. Okay. I said, well, this one title company, Paradise Title, they're having an issue and they want this guy, James Red, to show up. Okay, okay. And I said, so I need somebody to go in there and sign for James Red. And I looked at him and he goes, well, man, who are you going to get to do that? And I went, well, I, I was thinking you, Eric. And he goes, me? I don't know. He goes, well, wait a minute. I can't do that. I go, what do you mean? He goes, you said you're using some scumbag's picture off the Hillsborough County website. You're, you're using some guy, some, some guy's mugshot. They're going to know it's not me. And I go, well, here's the thing, Eric. I said, for James Red, I used the photo of you when you were arrested for domestic violence when you slapped around your ex-wife and got arrested. You know how that, that's online. So I used that picture. So you are James Red. He goes, motherfucker. He st- stood up. He's like, you fucking piece of shit. I ought to beat your ass. And I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I was like, oh, Eric, just calm down, calm down. Listen, I go, the only reason I used your name was because I knew if it came to this point and somebody had to show up and sign for James Red, you were the only person I knew that had the balls to pull it off. And he looked at me. I mean, listen, it was such a bad salesman job on my part. And he looked at me and he goes, started shaking his head. He goes, yeah, yeah, you're right. You're right. And I said, bro, I know you can do this and you know, you can make this work. And he goes, yeah, bro. Uh, 
That's a big favor. I, he goes, oh, I'm not going to do it for nothing. I said, no, of course not, bro. Of course not. I mean, I, obviously, I'm going to pay you. And I remember thinking if he asked for more than like five or 10 grand, I would just get an ID in my name and go to another title company and do it myself. But I didn't want my picture associated with this whole thing. So he sat there and he kind of rocked his head back and forth. I like, go, well, how much, Eric? And he goes, let me think about this. And he kind of thought about it for a little bit. And keep in mind, I've told him the numbers that we're borrowing. I've told him the numbers we're, we're kind of making. And he goes, you guys are making a lot of money, bro. I said, well, wait a minute, Eric. I go, a lot of that money goes back in the property. There's not a ton of profit here. And he goes, all right, right, right. Kind of thinks, and I go, how much, Eric? And he goes, man, I want $500. <laughs> right? $500. And I, w I literally almost started laughing. I had to cut, I was like... <laughs> I put my hand over my face and I was like, are you serious? 500? I mean, it was everything I did not to burst out laughing going, are you joking? And he goes, yeah, bro. It's a big favor, bro. And I said, no, it is, bro. I said, well, you got to sign before I give you that money. He's like, no, I get it. I get it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Listen, I make a fake ID with his, with his picture, right? Like he's got a fake ID, but I had to, I, I, it was all, it was all just cut and paste. I actually had to make a fake ID. A couple days later, we go into the title company. We walk in and he, um, I remember Mary comes out and she sees me sitting there and she goes, Mr. Cox, I don't know why you're here. I, I specifically told Kelly, I'm not closing another one of these loans unless um, James Red shows up. And so Eric stands up and he goes, I'm James Red. And she looks at him and she goes, um, ho hold on a second, Mr. Red. And she goes and goes and grabs one of the last files we closed, which had a picture of his old driver's license. And she pulls the picture out and sure enough, it's a picture of him. So she sits there for a minute and she goes, you could tell in her head, she was thinking like, how did I get this wrong? Like, that's the guy, that's James Red. And she goes, she goes, uh, okay, well, Mr. Red, come on in. So we go in and she, he signs the paperwork and she starts handing out checks. Like here's 30,000 that goes to so-and-so. Here's 45 that goes here. Here's 10 that goes here. Here's five here. Here's 30,000. Like she starts giving us, giving me all these checks. And I'm like, okay, thanks, thanks. Cause I'm supposed to distribute the checks. And I go, okay, thanks, Mary. And we leave, Eric sees the checks. So we get in the car and I start giving him, five, counting out 500 bucks. He's like, yeah, bro, you guys made a lot of money. And I go, whoa, whoa, I said, bro, you said 500. And on top of that, a lot of that money goes back into the scam. Yeah, yeah, you're right. You're right. All right, that's cool. So I give him, give him the money. Like a week later, I call him back. I got another closing. I said, Eric, I need you to do another closing for me. Yo, bro. He's like, I've been thinking about that. You made a lot of money, bro. I'm not doing it for no 500 bucks. Nah, you made a ton of money, man. I, I'm not doing it for 500 bucks this time. I said, no, I totally get it, Eric. How much, let me know what the price is. I get it, uh, 500, if you want more than 500, just let me know. And he goes, yeah, let me think about this. Let me think about this. Yeah, yeah, I said, how much, bro, how much? He goes, yeah, I'm, man, I want $1,000. $1,000? <laughs> oh, I mean, he saw me walk away with like 70 or 80 grand, he wants a thousand dollars. I was like, dang, oh, well, you gotta do it for, no, no, I'll do it first, I'll do it for, sure enough, we meet again, he goes in, he signs for a thousand dollars, he le I mean, sorry, he signs the whole thing, he comes back, gets in my car, I give him a thousand dollars. Listen, like a couple months later, like I'm like a month, month and a half later, I only ever signed for one loan ever. And that was also a James Red loan, I borrowed from um, SunTrust Bank. I borrowed $250,000 from SunTrust Bank. Walked in, fake ID. That's the only time I ever signed, ever showed up anywhere, ever signed anything with South Trust Bank. SunTrust, sorry, SunTrust Bank, $250,000. Other than that, Eric signed for uh, James Red. And nobody signed for anybody else. I signed for everybody. I mean, nobody ever showed up for a closing ever. Oh my God, bro. I remember one time there was a girl named Kim. I went and picked up a package for Kim one time. So I pick up the package. I remember I walked to, to bring it to the my, my borrower to sign. I walked around the building, got in my car, which was parked right next to the building, right next to all these windows. I sat down, I signed for the guy. I listened to the radio. I make a few phone calls. I wait about 45 minutes in my car. 
Finally, I get up and I, I, I put the picture of the guy's ID on the front of the, the file. I walk back in and I, I remember I handed it to her. And she goes, that was Joel Cologne, by the way. The guy's name was Joel Cologne. I hand her the file. She walks in. She goes, she, I remember she picked it up. She looked at it. She flipped through it. She looked at me and she goes, I like the way you put a picture of his ID right on the front. And I went, okay. And I remember thinking, that was weird. That's weird. And I went, okay, well, yeah. And she goes, yeah. She said, have I shown you my office, Matt? And I went, no. And she goes, come back. Come take a look at my office. And so I walk in the back and I walk over and walk in the back of her office. And the window to her office on the other side of the window in the parking lot is my car. And she said, I've sat here for the past 45 minutes watching you sign documents. She goes, you listen to the radio a little bit. You made some calls. She goes, but you did not drive to this guy's office. And James, she goes, and, and uh, Joel Cologne did not sign these documents. And I was like, fuck. And she goes, what's going on? I said, listen, listen. I said, Amy, the guy told me to sign for him. He's busy. I actually have a power of attorney for him, but the company, the, the the lender, sorry, the lender we were going through would not allow a power of attorney. So I have to, I had to sign. Somebody has to sign for him. I can't. He's like, I, I forget what I said. He's two hours away, or he's out of the state, or well, I forget what it was. So I said it's not a big deal. She was, well, I can't let you. I can't give you the checks. I mean, I mean, I can't. I got to notarize this. So I'm supposed to notarize. I said, look, his signature is identical. I said, here's his original statement. Like I start showing her pictures and she's like, okay, I agree. You've got his signature down, but I need to talk to him. And I was like, um, hold on. I'll call him right now. So I call his phone number and it, it rings and it, it rings and rings and rings and goes to voicemail. He doesn't answer, obviously. Um, uh, it, it, you know, it, it goes, <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry. She called him. That's wrong. She called him and it rang and rang and rang and went to voicemail. And I know it went to voicemail, obviously, because his cell phone was sitting in my car on the other side of the window. And she called and left a message and called back and left a message. And I go, look, what was she? And she goes, look, if I don't talk to this guy, I'm not letting you leave. Like, I'm not notarizing these things. And I went, shoot. I go, hold on. And I grab the, her phone. And I go, what's the number? She gives me the number and I punch in my business partner's phone number, mm -hmm. Dave Walker. And I answer the phone. And I go, hey, Joel. This is Matt, and he goes, um, he goes, oh Christ, what am I, Joel here? And I said, yeah, you're. I said, yes, sir. And he goes, okay, all right, what, what's going on? I said, so listen, I'm at the title company. I go, I go, Kim is here, and you know, I she let me sign and everything, and I told her about the power of attorney. But the problem is, she wants to talk to you to make sure it's okay that I sign because she has to notarize it. She wants to make sure that that you okay it. And he goes, oh Christ, he has put her on the phone. So I go, here, here's Joel, and she grabs the phone. And she's like, hey, Mr. Cologne, I just want to let you know, I'm at Kim's Goldsboro, Mr. Cox explained the situation, but you know, you have to understand that I'm notarizing these and I need to make sure that everything's okay. He's like, yeah, you know, it's fine. I told him I actually signed a power of attorney, but he said there's some issue with the bank. And she's like, no problem. Okay, thank you. So I can notarize your signature. No, no problem. Still totally not right, by the way. She still shouldn't have done it, but she hung up the phone, notarized everything, gave me the fucking checks and I left. I... <laughs> Bro, like, I mean, it's it's so ridiculous the amount of the amount. Of, listen, and this is the thing. Like, I could go on. Like, I could go on and on. And how many times I got caught and just got away with it? What I did was I figured out how to get Social Security to. Well, I started with just random um, Social Security numbers, and that didn't work out. Then I figured out that I needed a Social Security number that had never been used and it was hard to figure out well whose social security numbers are active that haven't been used and i actually had a client that had come in this is how i figured this out i had a client that had come in and she had she was making whatever she made like forty thousand dollars a year and i pulled her credit and her credit was perfect but then when she came in to provide all of her w-2s and pay stubs and stuff this is, by the way, this had happened like a year or so earlier where I figured this out. She had come in and she said, she provided me with her W-2s. And her W-2s, I noticed that the social security number on her W-2s were different than what she'd given me. So we asked her to come in and I obviously they were also different than the, um, the credit I'd pulled. 
So I asked her to come in and she sat down in my office. I was like, look, I noticed that the, the W2 has this SOCH, but you gave me this SOCH. And that's what I pulled it under, pulled the credit under and it's perfect credit. But your W2 has a different SOCH. And she, I remember she got a little scared. She looked a little bit worried. And I was like, I said, listen, I promise you, I said, I'm not calling anybody. You're not in trouble. I don't care what you've done. I just want to know how it works because you have perfect credit. So, and I want to make sure, I said, but I have a feeling if I pull this social security number on your W-2, which is probably your true social security number, you probably have bad credit. And she looked at me and she was like, I do have bad credit. And I said, okay, so what happened? What are we doing here? I need to know before I send it to the lender to, so I can figure out if they can figure out what you've done because I can't send these W-2s. I have to change the W-2s. I have to figure out what's happening here. So she goes, okay, here's what happened. She said, I was married and I had been using my husband, my husband and I had the, you know, she was using his, his uh, surname and she said they got divorced. He stopped paying credit cards. Uh, they got evicted. She said, so when I got, got evicted with him, it showed up on my credit. All of my credit cards were horrible. So she had a friend that told her, why don't you use your sons or daughters? I forget which it was, but her child who was like five years old, why don't you use his social security number? with your name and she went okay she said I'll uh well I don't know I'll, I'll try so she went and applied for for an apartment using her maiden name which she hadn't used in 10 years and her son's social security number but everything else was normal oh and the new and another address because she'd been evicted so she's staying with a friend or something so because she had used a different date of a different address, a different name, and a different soch. Even though the date of birth was the same, and part of her name was the same, like her first name was still like you know Karen or something. It, it because of that, it created a the credit bureaus created an entirely new profile for her. It didn't attach any of those things to her old bad credit profile. But yet she could still use her driver's license because she had a driver's license in her maiden name. So she said, I pulled, she said, when they pulled it, they said I had no credit. She said, so I put down like double the security deposit and I moved right into the apartment. She said, then I turned around and she said, because we had her husband or she or whoever hadn't paid their rent, their electric, their electric bill was, was bad and it was in collections. So she went to the electric company, got the electric turned on using the different SOCH. So she got everything turned on using this new SOCH and this new credit profile. She, she said, so she then went, whatever, like a month or so later, she said she turned around and she went and she got a car loan or something. Or did she get, no, she started getting credit card offers, pre, uh, pre-approved credit card offers in the mail because she'd moved into a new, apartment complex and they had and she had gone to she'd gotten electric and all these other things turned on her name so she suddenly got a few credit cards so she said i applied for the credit card she said and they gave her like a secured credit card from like it was some of the first premier first premier used to give you a credit card like everybody if you had no credit you just had to pay a fee so she said i got a first premier credit card she said a couple months later i ended up getting a, a car loan using that so she said Eventually, she said, I realized that I had perfect credit under that new SOCH and her, her maiden name. So I was like, okay, so I just need to change the W-2 so that underwriting doesn't notice that the W-2s and your credit are in different, are in different uh, social security numbers. And when they pull it, they should have the same, same uh, get the same thing I got. So that's what I did and her loan closed. But then, I, But by going through that process, I realized... I can basically make synthetic people. Like I can make people that don't really exist. So what I did was I figured out, I mean, eventually I grabbed a couple of just social security numbers. Like I went, I went in the, in the um, I went in the file cabinets and just grabbed some social security numbers from, uh, uh, from like two, three, four year old kids that I knew weren't using the socials. And I started pulling credit under v different names, but, just to see if it would work. And then eventually I was like, okay, so I, I, I figured out, guess what? If I use a fake name, fake date of birth, a real social security number, 
and an address, it'll create a fake profile. Of course, it has no credit. It's just a profile, but at least it exists. Then what I realized I could do was I could then get a secured credit card. So I'd put up 300 bucks and I'd go get a credit card from like Bank of America. I'd get one from whatever, First Premier Bank, from, you know, Capital One. So I'd get like three credit cards because the minimum that you had to have was three trade lines. So it's very easy to create, to get three credit cards using security. So I give them 500 bucks, 200 bucks, 300 bucks, whatever. And I get three different credit cards. And I start making the payments. And I, what I realized was, well, and, and then I started making the fake names. So the fake names were typically, not always, because I had a guy named Joel Cologne. I had a guy named Alan Duncan. I had a guy named... I had a bunch of different ones, but I, I ended up making a bunch using the the names from uh, Reservoir Dogs, which was like, you know, Mr. Black was basically like Lee Black, um, Michael White, uh, David Silver, that sort of thing. Like, like I just color coded names, Brandon Green, James Red. And, and, and what I would do is I get the credit cards and after you, if you made the payments for like six months and you kept the balances below 30%, of the available balance, so if it's a thousand dollar credit card, you don't ever go above two or three hundred dollars. Then, after about six months, all of these guys started getting credit scores at, at like seven hundred credit scores. And I had already figured out how to make like a fake ID. I figured out how to make a fake ID by taking my real ID and I just took sandpaper and I sanded off my basic information, like my name and date of birth and and. Uh, address and then I would print the name of whatever name I wanted in reverse on a piece of really th ultra thin transparency paper. I then take clear glue a glue stick and I'd glue it over my license in reverse. So it's so the name was in reverse, but it was ups upside. But it was it was uh, inverted. So when you looked at it through the plastic, it looked per it looked normal, and it was. And you couldn't scratch it off because it was in between the filament, right? The, the transparency paper and the actual plastic and it was glued on. So then I just trim off the excess and sand it down slightly on the edges and it was perfect. I had a perfect ID. You could see the hologram and everything. I mean, it wasn't perfect, I guess, if you really looked at it. Although I, you know, listen, I, I had cops look at it and stuff. They were like, looks good. I thought, you know, it was, it was okay. But everybody thought that was great. And listen, I opened dozens of banks using those those different those different uh, um, IDs, driver's licenses. My picture with the name, you know, James Red on it. Um, gosh, the first time I opened, I, I remember the first time I went and opened up a bank account with that was terrifying. Like I walked in, I have to walk in. Who was it? Oh, it was Joel Cologne. I, I had to open up. I had bought a house renovated it and what in the name Joel Cologne and was refinancing it to pull out a bunch of money. And I had to have a bank account because I had to have reserves in the bank. This was before I was actually making bank accounts or during that same period of time, or they were going to call the bank. I think either way I had to, you know, plus I have to launder the money. Like these, I'm getting checks in the names of Joel Cologne or, or Lee Black. And you have to be able to deposit that. You know, you can only put so many in your, and I can only deposit so many in my bank account before it looks odd. So you start needing bank accounts and different guys' names. So I remember walking into a bank one time and giving them the ID and telling them my name was Joel Cologne. And the chick, she looked at it and she, she typed the information in and she went, huh, that's weird. And I was like, what's that? And she goes, have you ever had a bank account? And I went, no. I said, no, no, I haven't. And you know, I'm a 32, 33 year, I'm like a 32 year old man, 30, 33 years old at this time. I'm 33 years old, never had a bank account. I said, I told him, oh, my ex-wife had one. You know, I always used hers. Uh, yeah, I haven't had one. Uh, yeah, I haven't had one in my own, my own name in like 10 years. Like, I have no idea. But I did know that they run, everybody that goes through the banks, they ran them through either check systems or AccuCheck. And so I didn't know what came up. But obviously it said I, I, there was no record of me ever having been pulled, no inquiry. So the woman gets up, takes the, the card, the ID and goes to the manager and she gives it to her and she takes it and she looks at it. And I remember she held it up to the light and twisted it back and forth. Like, 
and looked at each other and then they looked over at me and then she did it again and she handed her the license and walked back over, sat down and started typing. And I go, everything okay? And I said, everything okay? And she was like, uh, she goes, yeah, yeah. She said, it's fine. I just needed approval because you've never had a bank account. So. And she just did, 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 just opened up the bank account. I gave her whatever, $1,000, 500 bucks, opened up a bank account, walked out with some uh, some temporary checks and a, a little deposit thing and I have a bank account now. So when I refinanced that house and I got a check for whatever it was, 60, 70,000, I went and I deposited the check and it went right in the bank account. Completely fake person. Um, okay, so you know, what I did was I started making more and more of these guys. And these guys had everything. Like I had, they would have a, uh, they had a job. I would go on SunBiz. I remember I'd go on SunBiz, which is the Secretary of State website in Florida. So if you have a register, if you have a, if you open a company, you're registered on SunBiz. So you can go there and you can just type in different names. And so I remember I started going with the name I was using was Express Tax Services because there was a bunch of Express Tax Services. Like if you put an Express Tax Services, there were several that had this very similar names. And I took one and I just used the tax ID number and it was in Miami. So I went and I registered a DBA for Express Tax Services because this was like Express Tax Services of South Florida or something. I, I went and I just registered a DBA as Express Tax Services, and, that, and then I registered the phone number. So if you went and looked for the phone number, it would give you a phone number that would dial a phone w- that would send you to a phone that I had that was sitting on my credenza in my office. I had a bank of multiple, probably half a dozen cell phones. So one of those was Express Tax Services. It would ring. I pick up the phone and I'd Express Tax Services. How may I help you? Oh, you're looking for. Joel Cologne, oh sure, hold on one second. Or you know, put him on hold or say, I'm sorry, he's not in the office right now. I could have him call you right back. Regardless, I, I like had a whole system set up. And I was creating these fake borrowers and borrowing money. And that system was going pretty well. Hey, I hope you're enjoying the video. And if you're interested in buying a painting from me, my contact information is in the description box. Back to the video. I don't know if I explained this or not. I would, I would, obviously, I would buy these houses for like $40,000 and I'm recording the value. I already went over that. But once these guys would get like a million dollars in mortgages in their names, the, you know, you get to that point where you just, they're, they're just, they're overloaded with debt and their credit scores start going down. What I would do is I would, we'd stop paying. We stop paying on, on, you know, at some point you can't keep paying these mortgages. Once you've, if you borrow a million dollars and you've pulled out, let's say six or $700,000 and we've got six or 700,000, what we would do is you can't just keep using that money to make the payments. At some point I had to let these things go into foreclosure. So we just stopped paying. And when we'd stop paying, eventually the banks would start sending collection notices to all these guys' houses. And I would take the collection notices and I would write a letter from the borrower's phantom borrower's sister and i would take i would go into like say the saint petersburg times or some newspaper article and i would rewrite the article to include my borrower's name so if someone let's say there was a 12 car pile up on i-75 or i-4 and someone was life flighted to tampa bay general hospital i would put my guy's name in for tampa Bay for the person who was life flighted to the hospital. Then I would write a letter from his supposed sister saying that, listen, I know he hasn't been making the mortgage payment. I know you guys are about to foreclose. You might as well go ahead and foreclose because the doctors told us that he's, he, well, he's currently in a, in a coma, but the doctors told us even if he wakes up from the coma, he'll never work again. So he's not gonna be able to make these payments. And I would send that letter along with a copy of the article with his name in it. So they would get the article and they'd look at it and they'd say, oh, wow, I see his name here. It's highlighted and he was obviously in a car accident. And yeah, that's what happened. They would then foreclose on the property, put it on the market and resell it. Now, they've obviously, they've lent, they think it's worth 200000 They lent 180000 They put it on the market. They might eventually some, at some point sell it for 90000 and they lost 90000 you know, they maybe they sell it for 80000 they lost $100,000. Since the value of the, pro- the area was going up, they would end up selling it for more than it was really worth, but not more than what they owed. And 
as a result of that, uh, they would stop looking. Like they wouldn't keep sending the letters. They would they they were given an explanation for why this person stopped making the mortgage payments, and that's all they cared about. Like they just need an explanation, and that made made sense because those things happen. Well, I was doing this all the time. Like I was buying houses, buy four or five houses, six houses in one guy's name, pull out, you know, borrow a million, million and change in mortgages on the guy. And then I'd, I'd get the money, deposit in the bank, pull the money out of the bank. It was, it was just going, it was just on and on and on. And, and we were taking that money, we were reinvesting the money, we were buying more and more real estate, like, and we're building new houses. I mean, I'd started a development company. I ended up, Gosh, I remember I bought at this point I was at this point I was divorced from my ex-wife. My current well, wife at the time, I guess no, she would be an ex-wife then too. So got a divorce. After we got divorced, I bought a house for like eighty thousand dollars and I renovated the house. Well, I got an apartment. I remember I got an apartment, I started dating. I remember I dated this stripper that was living upstairs. She was insane. I mean, just crazy. It was Danielle. Most strippers are crazy. So what ended up happening was I I bought this one house and I was living in an apartment complex and I was renovating the house and, and, and I was renovating it. And I remember I needed to borrow more money on the house. Like I'm dumping a ton of money in this house. It had a, it was a four, had a four car garage. It had two apartments. It had a one bedroom that was a one bedroom apartment that was 2,200 square feet. Like that's a huge, that's a huge one bedroom. Hardwood floors. I mean, I was just decking this thing out. And I, at one point I needed more money and I had been, I started dating this other chick named uh, Connie Wick and she was a manager of a lawyer's title on in Tampa. And I went to her and I was like, Connie, I have a question for you. And she was like, yeah, what's up? Oh, I remember when I went on, I went on a date with her too, bro. I took her to see Les Miserables, which is a, a, a musical. She loved it. I mean, listen, Toll, like if you, if you want to, you have a chick that you want to date and you bring them to a musical, like it's over. I mean, you might as well just drive straight back to your fucking house. I mean, it's, it's a panty dropper. Like you can't believe because most guys won't do that. Like women want to go see like a musical. They want to do those things, but guys won't bring them. Like, that's like, you know, that's like for most guys, that's weird. That's gay. I don't want to be sitting through some bunch of people singing or whatever. But I'm telling you, if you go to see one, they're awesome. And if you're with a chick, it's over. Like, you just, you get to do whatever you want. So I brought her to uh, Les Mis and then we went, I think we ate it like Ruth, Ruth Chris, went back to her place. I mean, just like pulled up to her place and she goes, do you want to come in? I mean, she was just like, just come in. Like you, you and I both know what this has been an amazing night just come in so go in there you know uh give her the best four minutes she's ever had in her life um and uh we're laying in bed and i was like listen i remember she told me we're laying in bed and she she said she started laughing and i was like what because she knew i'd been indicted and i was already on federal probation and she said um god she remembered she's like i remember when we got subpoenas for your stuff before you got in trouble, like the FBI came in, subpoenaed your stuff. And like, we were all like freaking out, like, oh my gosh. And all the girls at her work started calling me Darth Vader. And when they would, she was like, they were free. They were like, you're going out with Darth Vader tonight. And, and she was like, oh, he's not that bad. She, they were like, I'm telling you, he'll pull you over to the dark side. Like this guy's doing all kinds of fraud. Um, and we were laying in bed and she was laughing about it. And I said, you know, it's funny that you say that. I said, I have a question for you. And she goes, what's that? I said, I bought this piece of property for about 80 grand. I've dumped a hundred and something thousand in it. I need to borrow some more money on the property. How can I borrow more money on that property when I think it's only going to appraise for a couple hundred thousand? And she looked at me and she was like, well, I don't know. Um, what do you owe on it? I was like, well, you know, I, I owed a couple hundred thousand. I said, but I need to borrow more money. How can I? I said, how does the lender know that there's a mortgage on the property? And she was like, well, I mean, they pull, they pull the title work. They have, she goes, they have us pull the title work. And when we go downtown, if the mortgage shows up, I go, yeah, but when the mortgage, how do I get rid of a mortgage so they don't see it? And she went, 
Well, I mean, when a mortgage is paid off, it's satisfied. And I went, well, how do they know it's satisfied? She goes, well, because the bank, when the bank gets paid, they send a, this one page document that says it's a satisfaction of mortgage. Like it says that the mortgage that was taken out by this person on this date for this amount and record and recorded in the official record book on this page with this instrument number is hereby satisfied. Like the person paid us. She goes, and then it's notarized and the the president of the bank or somebody signs it. And I go, what happens to that document? And she goes, well, it's typically mailed back to the, um, you know, to the bank to show it was recorded. And I'm like, okay, how do they know where to mail it though? And she goes, well, cause they say in the upper left-hand corner, like, Hey, it was prepared by bank of America. And when it's after it's recorded, mail it back to bank of America to this address. And I goes, it one address. And she goes, well, no, there's bank of America's everywhere. I mean, who knows? It could be any number of addresses. And I went, okay, so let me get this straight. You're telling me that if I fill out a one page document with the correct information on it, I can get public records to record it in public records to show that that a mortgage that's currently recorded in public records was satisfied. I can then have it mailed back to an address that isn't necessarily even the bank's address. And when you go to search it, You're going to see the original mortgage and a satisfaction and you're going to list on the title, you're going to list that there is no mortgage on the property. She goes, right, because there's a satisfaction saying Bank of America paid it off. I go, even though they didn't. She goes, right. And I said, okay, so Bank of, she goes, as long as you keep making your mortgage payment, Bank of America doesn't realize that that they no longer have a lien on the property. They think it's still there. They didn't get a, sat- a satisfaction. Of course, if they got the satisfaction, they'd realize right away, we didn't satisfy this. But that doesn't happen. So, okay. So I was like, okay, cool. And so I went downtown and I pulled I pulled the mortgage on my property. And I went down and I saw her and I gave it to her and I said, can you prepare a satisfaction of mortgage for this? And she was like, holy shit, you're seriously going to do this? I go, absolutely. And she said, I mean, I can show you, I can fill one out, but I'm not going to notarize it. And I went, that's fine. I said, I can, I can get a notary. I had already called like Office Depot. Um, uh, uh, what was the other one? Staples. I'd already called several, comp- several places and I'd ordered notary stamps in different names. And so I pay for the stamp. I go in, I, I didn't call. I went in, I, I filled out the paperwork. This is my, here's my name. Here's my notary number. Here's this, here's that. Here's when it expires. And I said, I need a stamp. And then they would order it. And then I would just, they'd call you a couple days later or I'd just go in a couple days later and I'd say, hey, is my stamp here? And they'd go, sure. And they'd give it to me. They wouldn't ask for ID or anything. I had one place, I had like four or five places I ordered stamps from. One place asked me, the guy goes, do you have your, you have your ID? And I was like, nah, bro. I mean, I came in here a couple days ago. He goes, yeah, well, I need your ID. I said, oh, I don't have it on me. He goes, yeah, man. Uh, I said, well, I'll go get it and I'll come back. He goes, okay. So I left, I've got his name. I left and I called down there and said, hey, when is this guy you know, is this guy there? And they said, uh, yeah, he's there. I called a little bit later and they said, oh no, he's off. He already left for the day. Okay, great. So then I went back in to the next person that was there and I said, hey, I need my notary stamp. And they didn't ask for an ID and they gave me the notary stamp. So I end up with multiple notary stamps. And I, I just, once Connie filled out the, showed me how to do the satisfaction and she filled it out, I notarized it. I signed, signed it, went downtown and recorded it. I had it mailed to an abandoned house instead of mailed back to the, the, the mortgage company who had lent me the money. I just had it mailed to an abandoned house. So a couple days later I drive by there. Boom. I got the, I've got it. So now when I went to go borrow more money and the title company pulled the title on the house that I was using as collateral to borrow the money, there's no mortgage showing up. So I borrow another hundred and seventy five thousand dollars or something like that on that house it was worth maybe two hundred thousand at the time i was still being renovated but of course the appraiser that i was using didn't say it was being renovated he said it was in perfect condition because we're ordering whatever you know this guy's doing how fuck 10 20 appraisals a month for the company that i used to own but i'm still basically running in in a way i mean he's gonna obviously he's going to do what we ask him to do or what I asked him to do because otherwise I could yank 20 if you're being paid four hundred dollars three to four or five hundred dollars for an appraisal and you're getting 20 of them and you're so you're making five to ten thousand dollars a month off of this one lender or this one mortgage company you're gonna pretty much 
do what I ask you to do. So, and he was a cool guy. And so he said that the house wasn't being renovated, took a bunch of good pictures, said it was in perfect shape. And he said it was worth, I don't know what he said it was worth, two, 250. So I borrowed another 175. I then satisfied that loan and I borrowed two mortgages at the same time on the property. I borrowed a million dollars on this one piece of property and renovated that property. It was in great shape, built a concrete block wall around the whole thing, restuccoed the building, new. It was, it was, it was a hard, put hardwood floors, the whole thing, great kitchens, the four car garage. It was great, it was great. Uh, Hey, sorry for interrupting the video, but want to let you guys know that if you join my Patreon at the top tier every single month, you get a different painting and the contact information for my Patreon page is in the description. Back to the video. At that point, I really had that scam down and I really knew the paperwork. I, I remember by the second or third time I walked in to see Connie to ask her to fill out the paperwork, she was like, I'm not doing this. She says, I'm not doing this again. I'm not filling this out. But by that point, I already understood public records fairly well. I'd been down there several times. She and I had had a bunch of conversations and I dated her on and off for a couple of months. And I was sorry. Then I stopped dating her. I started dating a chick named Jana. Jana was a, owned a, she owned a gym, like a little fitness gym in a strip mall. She it was a nice little private gym, and she was a she was a personal trainer. She was in amazing shape, like blonde hair, blue eyes, a tiny little waist, abs. In um, like, I never should have been dating this chick. She was that good looking. She was that over the top good looking, and she had been dating a chick. When I say the chick she was dating was, she'd been dating some other chick. So she was a lesbian. She'd been with this other girl. They'd been dating for, I forget, like four or five years. They'd broken up. And my house, by the time, that's right, when I finished my house, so when my house got finished, there was something called a tour of homes. My house was was um, one of, there was like six houses on the tour of homes. And what happens is they sell tickets and people get to walk through your house. So they had all these nice houses in the Tampa Heights area, which was an area that I had moved into, which was booming. It was just, it was right next to Ybor City, which is where I was doing my scam. So it's convenient for me to be next to my scam area, the area I'm what they call farming. So I'm jacking up the prices of this area. I live right next to that area. I ended up buying my house and about four, three or four other houses that were on that street. Like on my one little block, there's maybe eight houses and I own five of them. Well, I ended up dating this chick, Jana, who had walked, she was walking through the tour of homes. She went on the tour of homes and as she was walking through my house, she, she actually stopped me and she's like, oh, you, you own, this is your house? You own this house? I was like, yeah. I remember I painted a bunch of murals on the walls. She was asking about the murals and she said, I would love to buy a house in this area. Do you know who owns the house across the street? And I said, yeah, I actually own the house across the street. And it was being, we were in the middle of renovating it. And I wasn't using it like as a part of a scam or anything. I was just renovating the house. Like I was, all, I'm always, I was always renovating something. I was always doing something. Like I'm always doing like five things, right? So, so at least something every, if you're doing five or six projects, at least every one month or so, something hits and you make a nice little chunk of change. And so I was renovating this property. And I said, yeah, I'm renovating it. She's, oh my gosh, I would love to talk to you about, about possibly buying it. And so we started talking and, uh, I got her phone number and I said, yeah, that's cool. I said, well, give me a call. And she got my phone number. I said, give me a call. We'll, we'll have to talk about it. Cause there were so many people, there were like a thousand people or so coming through the house. So I'm, I'm talking to other people and she leaves. She called me later and asked me if I wanted to have dinner. So I said, yeah, absolutely. And I was just thinking at first I thought she was interested in me. And then I, I talked to a buddy who told me she was a lesbian. And so we end up going to, uh, I think it's called Samurai Blue in Ybor City. But when we got there, I realized she was flirting with me and I, I told her I could get her the house. That's probably why she dated me, just because I could get her the house. But it worked out for me because I started, you know, started hitting it and it was amazing. Never should have been dating th th this chick. She was so smoking hot. And uh, you know the worst thing about her? She just had like no sense of humor. Like I'm big on sense of humor. Like a big part of my personality is that, you know, I'm funny. I'm entertaining and funny. She didn't find me entertaining me entertaining at all she didn't find me funny at all not even remotely um uh, impressed by my by 
me at all. But she did want to get in the house. And what a great trade-off. I mean, it was, a, it was a good deal for me. And we started dating. So I obviously wasn't dating Connie any, anymore. I was dating Jana. How old were you? Oh, gosh, 33 by this point. Mm-hmm. By this point, I'm on federal probation. Did I tell you that? Did I ever say I was on federal probation? Like I'd been arrested. And yeah, I was on federal probation. And I was dating Jana. And then Jana and I broke up. I got her into three properties, by the way. She made money on every single property. One of those properties she bought, renovated, sold it, and made like $80,000 on the property. I mean, she's never seen that much money in her life. Oh, and all fraud, by the way. Every loan was fraud. I had to make fake, fake, um, fake 1040s, everything. Her credit was crap. I mean, I had to do, I had to fix everything. I had to get her a new credit profile. I mean, it was just, it was just completely, I had to wipe her credit, get a new credit profile, get her secure. I basically had to create a synthetic identity that matched her identity to get her into these properties. But it worked. She made a bunch of money, you know, so. God, I was buy her, buying her stuff all the time. Yeah. You know, and I genuinely thought that like, like at the time I would have told you this chick really likes me, but really I'm just paying for everything. So, uh, it was a trade off. Anyway, then I started dating and then I started dating, uh, I started dating this chick, Allison. Listen, do you have any idea how many properties I owned at that point? I owned a fucking shitload. We owned a ton of properties. And you know what? It, when I say we, I mean me, Dave Walker, a guy named Jonathan Krieg, who was an investor, and a guy named Rudy. Rudy, I had met through an investor named Kelly. Kelly was in Tampa, was in Ybor City, and she and her husband, her name was Hal, were buying properties and renovating them. And I remember Kelly had come to me and she said, I'd already got her into a bunch of properties. And she was like, she's like, Matt, listen, she said, I need to buy that. I want to buy this, uh, this property. And all of her loans are fake or all fraud. So I was like, okay, well, what's, what's the problem? She goes, well, it's a five unit building. And if you know anything about uh, real estate, if you've up, you can buy residential real estate or resi- you can get a residential loan from one to four units. But if you get five units, it becomes commercial. Well, that's a completely different animal altogether. I didn't do commercial loans. And she was never going to qualify for a commercial loan. And I didn't know enough about commercial loans. And, and basically, there was no comparable sales for the, for the property. So the property can't even qualify for a commercial loan. So she calls me and says, look, I want to buy this bar. I'm going to get this property. The problem, and I need to pull out money so I can do the renovations. I was like, how much do you need to pull out? And she was like, 80000 to do the renovations or whatever it was. And I was like, man, but by this point, I'd recorded the value so many, I'd recorded the value of so many properties, like all the properties in the area were now starting to really record, like like really come in high. So there, the whole area ballooned up. I mean, people are buying properties left and right, left and right. And, and guys are starting to pay ridiculous prices. Like I was started off on buying properties for $40,000 and got people, let's say there was some guy trying to sell a property for 50. I'd be, I would go to him and say, Hey, I'll buy it for 40. And they'd go 40. Oh, I want 50. And you'd go 50. You're crazy. Like I'm not paying you $50,000. I'm buying the same size properties for $40,000 and they're in better shape. I don't know. This actually happened. Well, all the properties, even the shithole started selling for higher and higher because we'd done, we'd recorded so many that the, the value in the area was shooting up. And I remember I went to this one old man and I asked him and he wanted 50 and I said, I'll give you 40. He said, no. So a couple, about four or five months later, I go back to him. I said, look, I'll give you, I'll give you the 50 grand you want. Because there was the, 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 the availability of properties were, were drying up. And so I said, I'll give you the 50 grand. And he goes, now nah, I want 60 grand. I went 60, I'm not giving you 60 grand. Three months ago, you wanted, you know, three or four months ago, you wanted 50. Nah, nah. So I said, nah, man, forget that. Forget it. So I leave. Couple months later, there's so few properties. Like we're now really starting to pay ridiculous prices for these for these just shit holes. And I go back to the old guy. I said, "Man, I'll give you sixty grand." He goes, "Man, I want 80. 80? How do you figure eighty? Less than a year. You're telling me your property doubled. And he goes, "He looked at me. He said, have you seen what properties in this area are selling for?'" 
that house over there sold for two hundred thousand dollars. Like, no, it didn't. Like, I bought that house for fifty and recorded it at two ten or two o five or two hundred, whatever it was. It was just like you know. But what happened was I was I was working against myself. I was creating these ridiculous comparables that now people that had houses that you couldn't even live in thought they were worth ninety or eighty thousand. So we're we're still buying properties, pulling out properties. Uh, I had met Rudy because Rudy was the was the guy selling this piece of property that Kelly wanted to buy. So Kelly wants to buy this property, and I said, "Well, what's the problem, Kelly? Why can't you qualify for it?" What, what's it? She goes, "Well, it's a five unit." So I said, "Okay." She said, um, you need to call the real estate agent. He was selling the property. I said, okay. So I said, I'll call him. And she goes, listen, he's a real jerk. And I went, I said, what's his name? He is Rudy. So I call him up and I said, hey, listen, I'm the, so Kelly he says, look, can you call this guy and arrange it so that I can walk away with money? I mean, which by the way, it's just completely illegal. Like you're buying a piece of crap property that this guy was selling for like, like a hundred grand or something. And I'm getting going to get it. I'm going to get the value recorded. I'm going to get the sale. It's going to go through at like $240,000 so that she can one, bring a down payment, which she's going to get back and two, pull out like 80,000 so she can renovate the property. So I call the guy up and I say, listen, I need you to do this and do this. I need you to get me uh, an appraisal for this. And the guy says, listen, man, he said, um, I've already had like three or four contracts in the last few months fall apart because you understand this thing is a commercial building, right? And I was like, yeah, I understand. I said, it's a, it's a five unit. And he goes, right, but it's, it's five units. So it's commercial and it's, it's, and I was like, okay, so it's, it's not, wasn't zone commercial, but he said, it's a five unit. So you can't get a residential loan on it. I said, I understand that. And he said, well, how are you going to get this chick alone? She said, you got her a bunch of them, but those are all houses or duplexes. I said, yeah, I'll be able to get her. I'm going to get her a loan on this. He goes, how? You have to get a commercial loan and there's no other commercial properties in the area that you can compare it to. I said, because I'm going to get her a residential loan. And he goes, you can't get a residential loan on a five unit building. It has to be four units or lo- less. I said, right. I'm going to have the appraiser say that it's four units. And he goes, you have an appraisal that'll do that? I said, I mean, I had two or three appraisals that would do that. Appraisers that would do that. And he went, okay, are you, and you're sure about that? I said, absolutely. I said, so you need to write up. So I explained to him, write up the contract for $240,000. I needed him, then I had him go back on MLS and say, the pro- take it down, relist it at two hundred and like fifty thousand, and say that the property had recently been completely renovated and gone from a five unit to a four unit. I then met the appraiser out there and got him to say it was a four unit building and that the fifth unit which was a little tiny efficiency was actually um, a utility room where all of the electrical and junction boxes and everything were, and it was also storage. It was a storage unit where all the, they also had all the electrical and there was a fifth, fifth uh, meter. And I had them say that that meter was the house meter, which ran the sprinkler system and all the lights. There was no sprinkler system. There was no exterior light system either, by the way. And the security cameras. Why not? So we, he does all of that. I get an appraisal for 250000 We have a sales price for two two forty. She gets a loan for like 80% or 80 or 90%. She gets the down, her down payment back plus the money back. She ends up walking away with like $80,000. She then renovates the property and actually renovates the property and, and does a decent job. It was such a shithole. Um, even when she was done, it was still pretty bad. So... But that's how I met Rudy. So I, I, so I now I know Rudy. Rudy has an investor named Jonathan Creek who lends money to flip properties. We start having our not, or oh, I'm sorry, we start having this guy Creek lend money to our fake people to buy even more houses. So that's how it's like. It's, it just keeps ballooning up and ballooning up and ballooning up, and these houses are just going left and right, left and right. Um, they're they're. We get some guy, he buys five houses, renovates it, gets a million dollars, pulls out six or $700,000, makes a few payments, lets them all go into foreclosure. So I'm going to wrap this up and I'm going to tell you about a time when I actually got caught. Actually, well, we got caught because Rudy screwed up and never mailed in the first payment. And, and the first time they caught a fake, like a fake phantom borrower or a, a synthetic identity was we would bought a property for like $30,000. I mean, what? It was just a dump. And we bought this property and we got it appraised for 
like 180 or 190,000. I don't remember the exact number. I actually have all those numbers in, in, in my book. Like I have the actually the time, the, everything. But we bought the property in the name Alan Duncan and we brought, bought like six properties. I think five or six properties in this guy's name already. Well, you know, I would get money out. So let's say, let's say we bought the property for 30,000, cleaned it up a little bit, got some a decent appraisal. And then, you know, we go to the closing, we rent it, we, we refinance the property in the name of Alan Duncan. He gets a, a check, you know, he gets a check and, uh, and we would cut it up into different entities. Like some people like Rudy might get some money, Dave might, we might have a couple corporations get money. We might have we, all kinds of, just the money would never go to one person. It was always being divvied up into multiple different people or, and identities. Uh, what well, identities? Uh, well, yeah, sometimes, sometimes it was being divvied up into, uh, um, into uh, uh, people that didn't even exist. Like sometimes I'm cutting checks to, to to other phantom borrowers and depositing the money into their bank accounts, which is probably one of the reasons I got hit with money laundering. So, uh, at one point we had closed a loan. We borrowed like 140 or 150 thousand on a property we bought for like 30. So it wasn't even a big loan. We made maybe 90, 80 to 90 thousand uh, that we'd walked away with. And one of the checks, the one of the biggest checks went to Rudy, one of my one of my you know business partners. Gave him the check, and I said, "Listen, bro. I said you're getting the check, but you got to make the payments on this thing for the next two, three months until we let them all go. It's like we're gonna make like three payments to let them go. We'd already had a bunch of other properties we'd been making payments on, so you know it's time to start letting these things go." And so he was like, "Okay, no problem, no problem." And a month or so went by. So the first payments basically due. Well, what ended up happening was I get a phone call from the uh, from the mortgage broker that had done the loan for Alan Duncan. She knows he's fake. Her, her name is Kelly Pruitt. She knew the loan was fake. She called me up and she said, listen, Matt, I got an issue. And I was like, what? She said, I just got a phone call from the from the bank's rep, their, their account rep. She said, she tipped me off that, and said that they were looking into the loan. And I went, why? And she goes, I don't know. Apparently, she said, you guys never made the first mortgage payment, which means it's a fir- what's called the first payment default. Any type of first payment default means they automatically review the, the loan for fraud. So I remember I was in my apartment. I remember I ran downstairs and open, yanked open the, uh, Rudy's door because Rudy rented one of my apartments in my building. I yanked open his door and he was like, oh, what's going on, bro? And I said, did you make the fucking payment for Alan Duncan's property on, I think it was 15th Street. On 15th Street? And he went, Oh, uh, is that due? And I was like, Jesus Christ. I was like, yeah, it's due. And he's like, oh, I'll put it in the mail right now. Well, I said, well, it's too late now. They're now they're they're looking into it. Like they know something's up. So I drove back. I drove, we we all drove to the office, and we open up the file and review the file. And I remember just looking at it, thinking of all the files that they could have been suspicious of. Like this is like the worst one. I'm like, like there was very little um, subterfuge, let's say. I, like I, took, I just took no real precautions. At this point, I was so cocky. Everything had been working so flawlessly that I, I didn't even, I wouldn't even really, like money was going directly into everybody's account. So Rudy's got a check. I've got a check. Dave's got a check. Like every single player has a check. And it was just like, this is just the worst you know, you know exactly who's making the money. And so I was like, this is, this is messed up. So I called, I got the phone number for the, to the bank and I called the bank and I put them on speaker and uh, the secretary or whoever, somebody answered and you know, you went through the prompts, but I ended up getting a secretary and I said, look, I need to talk to, and I forget who the, the guy's name was, like the head of the bank or something or the head of the fraud department. I forget who I asked for. And cause he was the person who had been, who had been one of the people who'd been calling and I said, uh, hey, and they said, who is this? And I said, this is Alan Duncan. And they said, well, he, they're in a meeting right now. And I said, look, I assure you, you want to interrupt them. They want to talk to me. So she, I said, interrupt the meeting. She goes, are you sure? I said, absolutely. I'm 100% positive. So she comes back 
And next thing, or she didn't even come back. I just immediately was in the meeting. Like they transferred me to there and they picked it up. They put me on speakerphone. They were like, hey, Mr. Duncan. And it was, a, I remember, it's a small bank. It was called, um, I want to say South Star Bank in like Georgia or something. I forget exactly where it was, like South Star Bank. And they said, they put me on speaker and it was like the, like the, one of the head, one of the he- owner of the bank, um, the head of security, which what he, he ended up saying he was ex FBI and like some lawyer. And they were like, we were just having a, we were just having a discussion about you. And, they, and I said, oh, okay. And they said, especially since, you know, based on everything we can determine, you don't even exist. And I was like, oh, okay. Well, listen, um, I said, I understand you've got some issues. And they said, we don't have some issues. Like your social security number. We're wa- they were waiting for social security to call them back. They said, we don't, we don't think, your social security number has just only been around six or eight months, you know, nine months, something like that. They said, so you've only, you're, you're less than a year old on your credit profile. Your, your driver's license number has never been issued. Your, we contacted like one of the banks. That bank has never issued a bank. You don't have a bank account there. Like they start dismantling, telling me all these things. And they said, as far as we can tell, you don't even exist. And I was like, okay, well, what are we getting at here? Like, look, I, I can, obviously there's an issue. They go, oh, we're going to call the FBI. I said, okay, listen then. They said, because you're not Alan Duncan. There is no Alan Duncan. I said, yeah, all right, so listen, what's the bottom line? You just want to get your money back, right? Let me give you the money back. Because I told you I'd been caught before when I owned the mortgage company. I'd been caught with fraud. They'd always let me pay them back. And I said, let me just pay you back. You know, what do I owe you, $140,000? I can cut you a check. And they were like, oh, no, no, we'll get the money back when we foreclose on the property. They said, what you need to be concerned about is you going to prison. And I was like thinking, oh, this is bad. Like they, they, they weren't even the least bit concerned about getting the money back. But as they were talking, they were basically mocking me. Like, oh, you're going to prison. You need to be worried about going, spending the rest of your life in like an eight by eight concrete box I remember they kept saying that and at one point I realized that that they thought they were going to be able to get they their, get their money back when they sold the property well the property is worth 30 grand and they thought it was worth like 190 or 180 and that they had a loan on it for 140 but it was worth 180 or 190 they figured when we sell it we'll recoup our 140 and so I said okay fellas I think I understand what the issue is here I said, you think that your $140,000 loan is attached to a property that's worth $190,000? They said, yeah. And I said, they said, yeah, we know it is. I said, no, 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 no. I said, you're about to lose $100,000. I said, let me explain why. And I said, do you have the appraisal there? And they said, yeah, we do. They opened the appraisal. And they said, look, we even had the appraisal reviewed, which was a common thing. You, let's say I send the bank a, my own appraiser. They would do what's called a desktop review or even a drive-by review where they send their own appraiser out there to look at the property, but he never goes in. That's why I would clean up the outside. So if you drove by, you never got out of your car, it looks fine from the street. Well, they said, uh, we, I said, well, you, that property's worth about 30 or 40 grand. Like, what are you talking about? They said, we had, our, we had it reviewed. And I said, let me explain why. I said, open up the appraisal. Look at comp number one. Comp number one, I explained to him as a is owned by a guy named James Red. Comp number two is owned by a guy named uh, Lee Black. Comp number three is owned by a guy named, you know, um, like like uh, David Silver. This is gonna, if you wanna, well, it's not gonna catch it. You know, th- this is owned by a guy named David Silver. And I said, and I explained to him that I bought the property for 30 grand and I recorded the value at 190 and then the, one of the other comparables I recorded at 210, another one I recorded at 195. So I explained what I did and why their appraiser, when the, he did a review, didn't catch it because the comparables are true. They're real, they really appear to be legit. So they now were like, they were just like, holy shit. And I said, so when you foreclose on that property and you go to resell it, you're gonna realize that the inside of that property is gutted you can't live there. It's ra- raining inside the house in the back room. It's a complete shithole. You're gonna fucking end up. You're gonna. You guys are about to lose a hundred thousand dollars. So even if you sell it and make sell it for thirty or forty, you're still you still oh, you, you still have a hundred thousand dollars left on that loan. And then they were like, I remember the owner said, "Well, we'll uh, uh, we'll recoup that money when the FBI catches you." 
And I was like, no, that's not true at all. I said, let me explain why. I said, first of all, you already know my name's not Alan Duncan. The bank accounts where the money went are all forged, are all fake bank accounts in different fake people's names. None of those names lead to me. They're all synthetic identities. So I explained that they're all how I made the synthetic identities, how I have the fake driver's license, how this. I said, you've got a grainy black and white photograph and a, and a surveillance footage of me from 30 feet away. I said, I promise you, even if the FBI tracks all that money back to those accounts, the, money's a, the money has been drained. There's no money left. The accounts were open in fake people's names. The bottom line is I said, you're about to lose 100 grand. I said, and you're going to have nothing to even try and track me down. I said, I go around the country doing this. This is my job. This is what I do for a living. I said, if you want to get your money back, I said, we need to d- agree that you're not going to contact the FBI and I will give you your money back. Which is, you know, they could have gotten the money back and still contact the FBI. But the truth is, nobody wants to contact the FBI. Like no bank, especially no subprime bank, wants the FBI looking into their files. So I remember they put me on hold and they came back and they said, so you still have the 140000 I said, I can get you the one forty. They said, you get us the one forty. we will not contact the FBI. We'll just consider this, uh, you know, a, a, a bad error. On, on your part and no harm, no foul. And so they told me exactly what I owed them because I owed them a per diem for the amount of money that I owed for the uh, payment that was never made. Plus I owed a yield spread for when they, uh, w- what they would have made. Like I pay them exactly what they're owed. They're owed like 143,000 and change. I go get a bank, a, a cashier's check and I send them the cashier's check. And that was it. So I pay them off. They never contacted the FBI. And I remember, I remember with Rudy, we were, we had just mailed the check and we were, we were walking and I took all the IDs and everything and I threw them in a garbage can. He's like, what, bro, what are you doing? And I was like, bro, it's, it's, it's no good. No, wait, we first went to the, the mall and ran up all the credit cards. We first went to the mall, ran up the credit cards. And then when we were leaving, I threw them all out. And he was like, what are you doing? I said, bro, I said, they're no good now. First of all, the guy's already got a 30, a 30 day late on his payment. So that's probably going to be reported. And the guy already had four or five mortgages and we borrowed a million dollars and he was just shot. You know, plus I'm not, I can't borrow any more money in this guy's name. These people are out there and they know what's going on and I, I just can't show up anywhere. So we shut that whole guy down. But that was totally Rudy's fault for never making the payment. Uh, what else? What else? So that, yeah, that was the one time, man, let me tell you about being scared. My heart was racing and they were so like, they, they really had me. I just totally bluffed them because if the FBI had shown up and actually traced any of the money, all that money went to our bank accounts. Like I'm acting like they went to synthetic identities accounts and there's no trail and but it was a complete trail back to Rudy, me, hey, Jonathan got a check. Everybody got a check. Dave got a check. Yeah, it was, uh, it, that would have been a bad, that would have been a bad situation. Hey, I hope you're enjoying the video. And if you're interested in buying a painting from me, my contact information is in the description box. Back to the video. I don't even know if I want to get into the, the, at that same time, I had bribed a politician. I wanted him, we owned a bunch of vacant lots in the area. We wanted him to renovate the whole, we wanted him to, sorry, renovate, rezone. these. We bought a bunch of single, a bunch of vacant lots in Ewer City and Tampa Heights where they were single family homes, but we wanted to build like triplexes and quadplexes on them. Which, so if I buy a property for, let's say I buy a, a, sing, a, a vacant lot for let's say seven or 8,000. But if I could get it rezoned, it was zoned single family. If I can get it rezoned multifamily and I can build a three unit, well, that 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 lot now, instead of being worth, let's say 7,000, it's now worth like 25 grand or 20 grand or whatever. So it's worth a lot more money. So we were gonna have him rezone 100 vacant lots that we owned in Ybor City. And he, this guy was running for, he ended up running for, uh, he ran for city council and we were, oh man, I'm leaving out a bunch of shit, bro. Dive into the so, well, what we did was 
he came to me one day. He was out, this guy was out passing out signs, like putting signs in people's yards. And he saw, and I saw him and I, I was like, hey, what's up? And he was like, hey, you know, look, I'm, I'm, I'm running for city, was it? Yeah, city council, I'm running for city council in district five, which was the Ebor City District. And he said, um, you know, I'm looking for support and donations. And I was like, well, you know, he was running as a Republican too. And I was like, okay. And he said, yeah, I'm trying to, I think he was. He said, what do you do? So what do you do? He said, I, he said you own this plot property? And I said, I own this property, I own that property, I own that one over there, I own those two down there, and I own this one here. I said, I own about six over here on this street. Sorry, I said, I own about 100 properties in this area. And, and you know, that keep in mind, it was over 100 properties that we were doing a scam with, but I also own a bunch of other just properties, rooming, houses, stuff like that. And so I was like, yeah, I own property on Jefferson Street, on Columbus, on so I name off on Amelia. I start naming them all off. He's like, okay. He's like, he's man, I'm I'm very very pro developer, especially in my area. I said, okay, well, I said, all right, well, what's it going to cost take for you to you to win? He said, you know, these campaigns aren't run off very much. He said, ten fifteen grand. He said, uh, I'm raising money right now. I've got a few thousand dollars. And I went, okay. And I said, so how much is it to win? And he said, well, I mean, I think I'll probably win if I come up with the, enough money to run ads and do this and that. I end up sitting down with him like the next day with uh, Dave, my uh, partner, and I think Rudy was there. And we basically say, look, what if we help fund your campaign? Here's what we, and I said, here's what we want. And I said, I explained about the vacant lots. And he said, oh yeah, I can do that. I can get all those rezoned. He said, well, how much are you planning on, on giving us on giving me for the camp for my campaign, I said you've got a couple grand, right? Right? What do you got? A couple grand? You said you can run it off of what? Fifteen grand? What, what is it? He said, "Well, twenty grand would be perfect." He said, "I've already got a few thousand. I said, "Okay, well, I'll get you another fifteen grand." And he's like, "Really?" And I said, "Yeah." I remember the next day I tried to give him like cash, and he wouldn't take it. He said, "No, I need this in checks of like 500 bucks for corporations, $250 for individuals. And then I spent the day driving around going to all of Dave's, my former Dave's current employers, getting them to write checks for $250. My family wrote checks for $250. Uh, corporations, like I'm going to buddies that own corporations. I was giving them 500 bucks, tell them to cut me a check for $500. There, so I get this guy like, I get him 15 grand. Um, Pro, it, what happens is ultimately uh, he ru- he has a ru- there's a runoff like he doesn't win it's a tie so he needs to then there's going to be another ru- a runoff so he and the, just he and the one other person that tied with they're going to run off and he's got to try and get it so then I give him seven thousand in cash because he needed like ten he's like I still got a couple grand but I need like seven thousand I said here's seven thousand I give it to him. named Michael White one of my guys was named Michael White. Michael White, that identity, I'd set, my friend Travis, I have a buddy named Travis, he had set up a scam with my help in Orlando. And he was buying houses in the name of Michael White. And he was refinancing those houses and pulling out money and depositing it in the bank. So that whole scam is going right there. It's a couple hundred thousand dollars so far that we've been pulling out. So I was dating this chick, Jana, and we ended up getting into an argument. Um, she started, actually, it wasn't even an argument. She started sleeping with this girl, this other chick. So she's cheating on me. So my lesbian girlfriend is cheating on me with a chick. Fucking humiliating. I know it. I know it's humiliating. Anyway, so she's banging this, this chick. I was banging the proper term for a, a two lesbians having sex. Banging. I can't imagine there's any banging going on. She's subtly, um, I'm not sure. I, I'll ask, uh, I'll find a former uh, lesbian and ask what the proper term, terminology is. So they're sleeping together. And, um, and so, oh, it's it horrible. Bro, I go into it in here. It's hilarious. It's hilarious. I can't even get into it, but I go into it in my book. It's, it's so bad. Um, I even remember one time that Jana showed up and I was dating this chick, Allison. And Jana bangs on the door one morning and Allison comes up out wearing just a t-shirt one of my t-shirts and they get into this fucking screaming match with each other i'm just like what is happening i got two i got the lesbian chick and i got this chick oh one time i was banging that's not true i wasn't banging 
because I never slept with the chick. Okay, so one time I started seeing this chick who was a um, a buck a, a, a Buccaneers cheerleader, a black chick that was a black Buccaneers cheerleader. I mean, like you can't imagine how good this chick looked. And so we go out, we go to sushi, we go back to my place, we're about to have sex. And Jan and I had broken up, but she still had a key to my house. She comes in, I remember I'm about to have sex with this chick. And I hear this, dee dee, and it was the alarm system. And I'm like, <gasps> and like, we're just, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm, she's spreading, I'm on top, I'm, 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 I'm about to, and I'm like, oh, oh, and she looks at me, it's just like, she's like, oh my God, is that the girlfriend? Like, cause I, I, you know, she knew we were broken up, but she's like, oh my God. And I was like, um, hold on. Cause I thought maybe it's Rudy. Cause Rudy had a key. So I jump up and I run into the kitchen and I'm Jana already had this chick's purse dumped out. She was dumping out all of her stuff and opened up her wallet and saw that it was a, it was, it was a black chick. And she goes, a black girl, a black. She, I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I was like, hey, 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 now calm down. I said, listen, you, you can't even, you can't be coming in here. Like you can't. Um, and I, I mean, and I was listening, this chick's standing in the middle of the kitchen with a bunch of knives around her. And I, I mean, I just remember thinking she'd kill me. She'd kill me and this chick. Anyway, the black girl grabs, she's, she gets completely clothed, says, just give me my purse. I want to leave. I gave her the purse and she, she took off. It's a little bit more complicated than that, but that's the simple version. And I remember she took off. Jana goes, did you sleep with her? Did you fuck her? Did you fuck her? Because Jana's still there. She's not leaving. And I went, yeah. I said, I, I said, no. I said, okay. I said, about that much. And she goes, what does that mean? I said, I mean, I was, that's what was happening. I was this far in when, you, when the alarm system went off. And she goes, did you sleep with her? I went, well, no, you ruined it for me. And I mean, she just was furious, bro. It was so bad. Um, and uh, yeah, she ends up spending the night. So, but then she catches me. Then another, she didn't even catch me because we weren't even dating. She just kept chasing these chicks off. So then it was this, then this chick, Alice. Allison knew what was going on because Allison was helping me run a scam in uh, Palm Harbor, which is basically like, let's say St. Pete. So isn't Palm Harbor in St. Pete area, basically, roughly? Kind of Clearwater. Like, yeah. yeah. So let's just say whatever, Palm Harbor, Clearwater area. I had renovated a house, I, I mean, sorry, renovated a house. I, we, she and I rented a house, satisfied the mortgage on the house, and we were refinancing the house. We transferred the warranty deed into the name Rosita Perez. Allison had the name, had, uh, had a, a, an ID in the name Rosita Perez. So she's renovating the property, or sorry, refinancing the property multiple times. She goes to a couple closings, she signs. She ends up signing, uh, she ends up signing several mortgage for several mortgages and gets the gets the payment, but one of them, the place wouldn't give her the money. They said, something's wrong. You don't look like your ID. But it was actually her and the ID. What she had done was she got the picture of the ID with black curly hair. She'd gone out and dyed her hair and had it curled. So she gets the picture of the ID, black curly hair. But then when she a week, two weeks later, when we go to the closings, she changed her hair back. So now it's brown and brown with blonde highlights and it's straight. So she doesn't look anything like the picture anymore. It's still her, but it just, the, just doesn't look like her. So they said, yeah, just, we, we think there's an issue. So we're going to make some phone calls. So Allison comes out without the check. She's like, yeah, listen, these people are freaking out. Like they, they didn't want to give me the check. They, they said they were going to make some calls. They end up calling around. They find out that they, they figure out pretty quickly that it's not, it's not her. So that's an issue, right? So they're calling around and, and they eventually figure it out and uh, it's complicated to understand how they figure it out, but they figure it out. But we did have a check. We had one check. So Allison and Travis decide they're gonna deposit the check into a bank account that Travis has. So he deposits it. Um, and we have to wait for the money to, to clear, which was gonna take, you know, back then it's not like now where it's like the next day it's cleared or half of it's cleared right away and then the next day it's cleared. Like th this take this used to take like 10 days. Well, and you know, look, you, you've got to understand how many properties, you know, how many we were refinancing and pulling out money and letting go. And it was a juggling act. Well, 
like 10 days later, Travis go, drives to Orlando to pull out some of the money because we deposited a check for like 100 grand or something. Well, that check had been red flagged because the title company had tracked down um, the, had tracked back to uh, the other title company. The two title companies figured out what, something was wrong. They got together and figured it out. They put a, then they tracked where the lender, the money was for the lender, it would lent the money. They put a, a red, a red, a notice, they red flagged the, the check. So when the check went through, they didn't give her the check. They just called Travis, the, the bank called Travis and said, hey, hi, um, Michael White, we would like to, for you to come in. We need you to sign the back of the check again. We need to witness the signature, which was weird. So I remember calling Travis and said, hey man, what's going on? Are you going, you're going to the bank? He's like, yeah. I said, what's up? He said, yeah, I'm going there, but they, they, they said that they need to witness me signing the back of the check because it's such a large check. Well, look, I've, I've, I've signed backs of checks for $200,000 and deposited them. Nobody ever said you had to witness a check. Like it was just totally weird. And I went, nah, bro, something's wrong. Don't go to the bank. That whole thing, we got to scratch that whole thing. Well, Allison was there going, no, it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. Well, she's desperate for the money. And I'm like, no, it's not fine. Something's definitely wrong. Travis says, yeah, bro, I'm going to go in. I'm, I'm good with the guy. Like the owner, like, I mean, the, the bank manager, like I'm cool with him. Like he's, he's like cool with him. Like what? You say hi to him? Like he's not going to tell you that you're committing fraud. Like he's not going to, he's going to let, let it go. Which is the dumbest thing ever. Anyway, Travis walks in the bank. And so he walks in and he's like, hey, I'm going in right now. And I remember I was yelling at him not to go in. He hangs up on me. He's like, yeah, it's fine, bro. Calm down. He, he walks in. And then I never heard from him again. I called and called and called and called. And later that night, I called his cell number from like a pay phone. No, I called his real number. Not I was, was calling, um, I was calling his cell from my phone, wasn't going through. Then I call the Michael White's cell phone from a pay phone and an officer answers. And I'm like, hi, is Michael White there? And they're like, who's this? And I was like, this is, you know, you know, whatever, Brandon, you know, Brandon Green or whatever I said. And he said, uh, this is officer, you know, this is officer done with the, you know, whatever, ultimate, you know, police department or whatever, whoever it was. And I was like, oh, shit. And he said, how do you know, Mr. Uh, how do you know, Mr. White? And, he, and I just hung up the phone. I was like, he's been arrested. This is horrible. So. Travis was in jail. I had to get him out of fucking jail. I had to hire a, I remember, had to pay like $15,000 to get a lawyer. Had to get him, one, get him out of jail. Two, pay 15 grand to get him a lawyer. Then he starts coming around saying, hey, Matt, I need money. I mean, obviously we're not doing the scam. I need money. Like, um, they're going to shut off my electric. And, and uh, uh, you know, can you give me some, sure. How much do you need? Oh, $1,000 for this? No problem. A couple Weeks later, hey, bro, I need like two grand for that. No problem. I'm cutting him a check for two grand. I mean, he starts just milking me for money. I gave him 25 grand to start a lawn, I mean, not a lawn care, I, uh, a tree trimming business. So he buys all this equipment. I ended up getting him a, I bought him a, a, a Dodge Ram. I bought him the tree trimming thing. I bought him the, I mean, listen, I bought him so much stuff. <laughs> so desperate for him to not cooperate against me. But the truth is he was already cooperating with a task force. He got himself out of, like he got out like the next day on bond because he told them, this is what's happening. This is the guy I'm working with. And it wasn't hard to convince them that there was a scam. He said, look, go to Hillsborough County property appraiser record and look, look up the name James Red. Bam, five houses in the name James Red, all of them in foreclosure, you know, or Brandon Green, all of them in foreclosure, you know. Um, uh, Lee Black, all of them in foreclosure, you know. Uh, David Silver, foreclosure. Um, it's funny because like that whole thing was unraveling and I knew it was unraveling. Like every time I saw him, I could just feel that it, I knew it was coming down. I just knew it. Uh, God, I was, yeah, it was definitely coming down. That is... It's funny because of all the loans, I only went in, I only went in and signed one time. 
I signed for a $250,000 credit line for James Red. Now, remember, Eric Tamargo had gone in a bunch of times and signed for Red. I didn't want to keep calling him because he, he was figuring it out pretty quickly that he wanted more and more money. So I just went in one day to Sun Trust and I signed for like a $250,000 credit line on a piece of property that I bought. And at, at this point, you have to think the houses, we weren't recording the value of the houses at 200000 anymore. We're, sell, we're recording the values of the houses now at like 300000 350. So we're buying bigger and bigger. We, we had switched to quadplexes. So quadplexes and duplexes and triplexes, and they're massive. And so we're, we're recording the value at two, 300,000. This is 20 years ago almost. No, wait. No, this is almost 20 years ago. Almost 20 years ago. So you have to think if these houses are worth 300,000 then, that, that'd be like a $600,000 house now. And so the kind of money, you know, if you say, oh, you have a million dollars back then, it was like, like, like two million dollars now, so I so that was like a half a million dollar credit line. So we get I get this two hundred fifty thousand dollar credit line, and now I've I'm definitely involved. Like you could definitely see where I went in. Where before I was very remote. Yeah, some money went into my bank account here. Like you know, it, it, it would not that they couldn't have. They would have. They would have buried me anyway. I mean, it was done. I was done anyway. But and I knew. When things were coming down, I knew it was bad because I knew that the, the judge, you know, I knew, I knew I was doomed. Like if that judge saw me again, he was going to hammer me. I knew you, you go in front of a judge again, twice, it ain't good. They're not happy with you, especially since he didn't give me any prison time the first time. Uh, yeah, that's when one day, yeah, one day, uh, I realized that that Travis is definitely cooperating and that things are coming down. They're definitely coming down on me. Hey, I hope you're enjoying the video. Wanted to let you guys know one of the ways I pay for all of this is through Patreon subscriptions. So if you join my Patreon at the top tier, you get a different painting every single month. The contact information for Patreon is in the description box. Back to the video. So. Yeah, at the same time, so at the same time, I had met a chick. I, I was dating, like, oh, listen, I'm dating a bunch of different women. And I met a chick by the name of Rebecca. Well, Rebecca was, um, she was a train wreck, bro. Like, she had a kid. Uh, she had just moved to the area. She worked at the dog track um, from Vegas. She'd been, lived in Vegas, moved to the dog, do, moved to St. Pete lived at the dog track. I met her on match.com. We've been out a couple of times. Like we, like she's driving across the bridge to Tampa. You know, we'd slept together. I don't know, a dozen times, like over the month or two. Like we're not even serious. It's not like it's just even like a serious relationship. Like I know like a month, month, and maybe two months, not even two months, but it was like a, like a month and a half. I barely even know this chick. And, uh, I remember she like, you know, she knew that I was, she knew I was on federal probation. She knew that I had done some stuff. She knew, like, we'd gone to a couple of movies. We we went to, um, God, did we see, like, Matchstick Men? And we had talked about scams. And she kind of knew that I was uh, quest a questionable character. Well, so we're dating. And it's okay. It's going okay. Well, what happens is, in the midst of this whole, this chaotic situation, which is super high stress, bro. Like, I mean, I'm, I'm taking like Xanax. I'm, I mean, I'm having panic attacks. Like I'm at this point, I'm, I'm taking Paxil, which is a anti, uh, you know, for anti-anxiety. Like I'm, I'm, I'm like desperately trying to keep my anxiety in check. I got, I got Jana chasing chicks off. I got Allison, you know, she's getting a divorce from her husband. I got to move her into an apartment. I mean, I've got, it's just total chaos. And um, at this point, I'm going into banks, pulling out money, They're going to actually go into closings. I mean, I just had gotten so cocky and sloppy. And then one day I'm at, I'm at work. I'm sitting at work at the development company. And one day this sheriff deputy walks in. His name's Steve Sutton. I had done about a million, maybe $2 million worth of loans for him. And they were all fraudulent. And so he comes walking in full in his full outfit. This is at like four o'clock. 
And he comes walking in. I, 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 he goes, hey, Matt, can I talk to you? And I went, yeah, what's up? He goes, can I talk to you outside? I went, sure. So I walk outside. I'm like, yeah, what's up? And he says, um, oh, you know what it was? I already, one of the reasons I knew for sure that things were going bad was that there was, an, there was a, a reporter by the name of uh, Jeff from the St. Petersburg Times had started calling around asking questions. So title company people were calling me saying, look, I just got a phone call from some guy at the St. Petersburg Times asking about this guy, James Red, or asking about Lee Black, or asking about whatever, Michael White. You know, like they're, they're like naming off phantom people. And I'm like, oh shit. Then the um, there was a, a subpoena that was served to one of the title companies and they called me and said, look, we got a subpoena. We're not supposed to tell you that we got the subpoena, but I'm letting you know, Matt, we're friends. I wanted to let you know, we just got a subpoena. I'm just like, oh man, this is bad. So, and that was from the, the uh, task force. And, and so, oh my God, sorry. I need more coffee. So what, what happens is Steve Sutton walks in. So I already know things are bad. Steve Sutton walks in and he says, listen, man, can I talk to you outside? And I go, sure. So we walk outside. And I said, what's going on, Steve? And he says, look, I used to date this chick. I used to date this chick that works for the Tampa PD. I said, okay. And he was a sheriff's deputy. And I went, all right. And he goes, she came to my house this morning, like six, seven o'clock in the morning. And she said she had been working on a task force. I said, all right. He said, the task force was investigating the arrest of a guy named Travis Hayes in Orlando. And I went, okay. He said, he's cooperating. He's been cooperating with the task force and they've completely put this whole thing together. And they know that you're running a, a massive, massive fraud. And they're gonna come, they're gonna arrest you. And I was like, well, when? And he said, well, not now, but like yesterday they handed the task force over to the FBI. The FBI is going to come arrest you in the next couple of days. This is like a Thursday. And I was like, okay. He said, she told me because my name came up about it and she knows that we're friends. And she told me to stay away from you because not to talk to you on the phone, just to stay away from you. I said, all right. He said, um, what are you going to do? I said, I mean, I'm leaving. And he goes, what should I do? I said, just tell him that Tell him that I arranged all the loans for you. And you don't know anything. Like I, I wanted to buy this house. He arranged some loans and that was it. He arranged the loan for me. I, I showed up at the closing. I signed paperwork. I mean, how am I supposed to know what he was doing? I don't know. I said, you should be fine. I said, I'm not going to be here to tell him any different because I'm going to leave. And he said, all right, man, good luck. So we shake hands. He leaves. I walked inside. I remember I went to Allison. I said, Allison, I wrote a check right then. I need you to go get $8,000 out of the bank right now. I started writing people checks left and right, left and right to go, go cash checks at different accounts with it. By the next day I had gotten out $80,000. That was all I could get out. You know, I mean, it seems like a lot of money, like, but if you've got millions of dollars in the bank, millions of dollars in real estate, you've got like, basically I had like a, I had like a couple, like I had like 20 or 30 minutes left in the banking day. And I had the next day. And all I could get out was that. And I remember I had this one account. So I had, got, I had student loans, like $30,000 in student loans, which I'd never paid off because they're at like 1% interest, right? So you, you just make, you don't pay off a 1% interest loan. It's free. So uh, it's like free money. And I, I was so tired of making these little $120 payments. I had just paid off those, like, like literally the night before the loan, the check had gone through. I paid off like 30,000 and I was like, oh my God. <laughs> It was 30 grand I could have gotten out. Anyway, so I, uh, out of my personal account, right? So I got out as much money as I could, as quickly as I could. And that night, I didn't want, I remember thinking I don't want to stay at my house. So I started packing my bags. So I'm stuffing a bunch of duffel bags full of clothes and computers, everything I could think of. And I remember I was supposed to go out with Rebecca, Becky, the chick I'd been dating, supposed to go out with her that night, totally had blown off her phone calls, everything. She drove across the bridge, came to my house, walks in. And I remember when it, she came in, like, dee -dee, like just walked it. Like I thought, I thought that was the FBI. I thought they, I like, oh my God, I did, they're, 
they're here. She walked in and she was like, what are you doing? Like she sees me, I'm panicked, I'm stuffing. She's clearly, I'm going somewhere. I said, hey, uh, I'm, uh, I'm leaving. She goes, where are you going? I said, I'm leaving. I said, look, I'm be honest with you. I said, look, I was running kind of a, a scam and I just tell her what happened. Bam, 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 they're coming to arrest me. Like any time now. And I, she said, you're just gonna leave? And I was like, yeah. And she goes, well, I wanna go with you. And I went, what are you talking about? We don't even know each other. Like, what are you, what are you talking about? Like, you've got a kid. You've got, like, you got a kid here. You got family. You've got, you don't want to go with me. We don't even know each other. And she goes, we're in love. And I was like, yeah, I, listen, I don't know about that. I like you. I don't know about being in love. I said, look, you know, and she goes, no, she, she's, I said, look, you've got, you're a stable person. You're a normal person. She goes, I'm not a normal person. She said, listen, she said, let me explain something. She goes, I've, I, j- I've just claimed bankruptcy. I've been married. F- She'd been married twice. She, I've been married twice. She said, my son is, is he's failing school. He's been caught outside uh, for curfew. He's been picked up for curf- you know, breaking curfew several times. She goes, he's smoking pot. I can't control him. She said, I'm sending him back to live with his father. She said, I'll be here. I'll be all alone. He's going, he was going back in like a month anyway. She goes, I'll send him back and I'll come with you. And I go, are you, are you insane? Like, That's crazy. You don't up and leave somebody for someone you just met a couple of months ago. And she was like, I don't care. I'm in love with you. I want, I said, look, this is never going to become love for me. And she went, listen, she said, can you get the money? And I, and I went, yeah. Cause I told her I was going to, she goes, what are you going to do? I said, I got like 80 grand. I'm going to go commit some more fraud and I'm just going to start pulling money out of houses. And I'm just going to, you know, get a bunch of money and try, maybe leave the United States. And she went, can you get the money? And I went, yeah. She goes, how much money are you planning on getting? I go, I don't know, a few million dollars invested in real estate and just kind of kick back the rest of my life. And that's the best I've best hope I've got. And she said, if you can get the money, I don't care if this ever turns into love. I don't care if it's love. I want to come with you. I'll help you. And I was like, what are you doing? And she goes, she goes you don't even know. I said, that you're, you're going to break the law. She goes, listen. She said, do you know why I'm in St. Pete? And I went, why? She said, because... I was embezzling money from the law firm that I used to work for. She said I was embezzling money to pay my my um my gambling debts and she said my boss, the lawyer I worked for found out about it and he didn't call the police because I was sleeping with him and he didn't want his wife to find out. So instead he called his client, one of his clients which is a huge company that owns a bunch of casinos and a dog track in Tampa. And it was the furthest place he could send her to get her out of Vegas. So one, he said, you don't owe me the money you stole. I'm giving you some money. We're going to move you to Las Vegas and I'm done with you. And she, he moved her to Las Vegas. She started working for the dog track and he quashed the money that he owed her or that she owed, sorry, quashed the money that she owed him. And I remember thinking to myself, you're a lying, cheating, thieving, degenerate gambler. I mean, she really was like the perfect partner in crime. I mean, all of those were attributes for as far as I was concerned. Like this is a, this is a, a you know, this is a, um, <laughs> this is a, a, an, an insane chick that will do anything and she's desperate to come with me. And I was like, you know, look, I was nervous and I was scared and I was afraid and I, 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 I was desperate and I didn't know what the future held, but, but I didn't have to be alone. And that was a huge burden to take off on my own and just do it by myself. So I'm supposed to steal millions of dollars, just me, nobody's help. That's a tall order. I'd had lots of help before. So I wasn't sure I could do it by myself. I, I was pretty sure, but you know, it's easier if you have somebody else to answer, help answer the phones and help do things. And she wanted to come. So I was like, all right, let's go get your stuff. So we went and we got her stuff. Over the course of the weekend, we ran up all of my credit cards, all of the synthetic identities credit cards, bought a new vehicle, bought like a $100,000 Audi, traded in my Audi, Got a hundred thousand dollar Audi. Got a temp tag. Um, I remember telling the guy, "I want a brand new tag, and I want, the, or I, I want a, another tag, and I want the tag in the dealership's name, and I want you to keep it the dealership name as long as possible." 
Because that way, if they see the dealership, they run it. They just not, it goes to the dealership, not me. So they don't know who's in the car. And so I got this Audi, and uh, God, it was an A. Was it an A8 or something? Man, it was fucking this thing had like 400 and something, 480 horsepower or something. It was outrageous. It was a four door. So, so I forget the exact Audi it was, but it was a great Audi. So we packed it. I mean, this thing was packed full of stuff. Like we bought as much stuff as we could. I had 80 grand, but I don't want to spend the 80 grand when I can run up my credit cards. I ran up. I remember I'm, I, I left. I must have owed American Express 30 or 40 grand. So ran up the credit cards. We got like probably close to 70, 80,000, maybe $100,000 worth of just stuff. We're, it got so bad by Sunday night where she's buying like purses for $2,000, shoes for 1500 bucks. I mean, it's just ridiculous. We're buying watches. We got like multiple Rolex watches, diamonds. I mean, it's just random everything up. And uh, yeah, we get in the car and we leave Tampa. When we left Tampa, I wrote a letter to my parents and my ex-wife. Because you have to think, well, oh, we put her son, she put her son, I didn't put her, she put her son on a, on a plane going to Vegas, and I wrote a, a letter to my ex-wife because I was leaving my son because I kind of figured, look, I end up in, if I was going to go to prison no matter what, my son was going to, he was never going to see me. My ex-wife wasn't going to drag him to a prison to see me. So I just got in my car and we left. And we, uh, yeah, we took off. We got into a huge fight. Huge argument, not a fight, a huge argument on the way to out of town too. Um, like she, I realized during that argument, she was just insane. And uh, I should have turned around right then, but I didn't. I said, okay, you know, we argued. I tried to turn around. I started to turn around and she begged me not to turn around. And uh, we ended up going, we ended up going to Atlanta. We wrote a letter. I, I wrote a letter to my ex-wife uh, regarding, you know, just basically uh, um, to my ex-wife and to my son. I wrote a letter to my mother and father. And this becomes important later because I addressed the letter to George and Margaret Cox, which is my mother and father. And I'd signed it, you know, Matt. So, and I just, just basically the letter, I don't know if I want to, did I mention that the letter I just basically just said, explain to them what happened and what was going on and that I was not sticking around to go to federal prison. And that was just wasn't something I was interested in doing. Um, you know, I intended to run. I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm just, I'm too cute to go to federal prison. And the only, the only, the only things I knew about federal prison was I'd watched a movie called, you know, Shawshank Redemption. And I'd watched uh, a movie called uh, The Animal Factory. And all, all the movies I'd seen on federal, on, on, if, sorry, on just prison, prisons in general, not a good situation. I'm not a big guy. I'm five foot six. I weigh 160, 170 pounds. I'm, I'm just, I'm just, I'm too cute to go to prison. It's just not going to, it's not going to end up well for me. And I know that. So we're on our way to uh, Atlanta and we get there and, you know, we had no, no credentials. Like, like I had a, a, I had a, I had some fake, some IDs, I had some, some IDs, but they were fake IDs that I basically had created myself. So very quickly, we rented we rent an apartment and we moved out of that apartment and moved into well first we rented first we stayed in hotels for whatever a week then we rented an apartment using a fake id and you know i had no credit but i was able to show that i had obviously i was able to show that i had four or five years worth of uh, rental history and um well, of employment, and I had several years of rental history, and even though I had no real credit, I did have an ID, and so I simply had to put down double the security deposit, and we rented a place in a midtown in Atlanta, so it was right on Peachtree, uh, and so we rented this uh, this apartment, and immediately we went, to, within days, this was, this was in, I don't know if I mentioned this, this was in December, early December 2003, so we immediately go to I didn't want to get a driver's license in Georgia because in Georgia they take your fingerprints. And although I, I knew they didn't run them, they keep them on file. I just didn't want it. I just didn't want to give them my fingerprints. So we went to Alabama and I had stolen the information of a guy by the name of Scott. So I'd taken this guy Scott's information, who I'd done a loan for. He was he was actually an account executive 
that I'd worked for and I had kind of tricked him into telling me what his mother's maiden name was and where he was born and I'd ordered his birth certificate and I had a copy of his social security card and so I went to Alabama and I made a fake lease for an apartment in Alabama, which was actually a UPS box. So I went into the DMV in Atlanta and I got them to issue me a driver's license in his name. So it's got, it's, it's Scott, but it's my picture and it's a valid driver's license. I then came, went back to Atlanta and then we rented a house, you know, cause the whole purpose of going to Atlanta was to try and get some money. I mean, I had like 80 grand in cash and we had a bunch of stuff, but we didn't have jobs and we couldn't live the way we were living. We, we wouldn't last very long in Atlanta on 80 grand. Hey, I hope you're enjoying the video. If you're interested in getting a painting done by me, my contact information is in the description box. Enjoy the video. So I ended up I rented a house from a guy by the name of Michael in Alpharetta, Georgia, which is just, just outside of Atlanta. It's just like a, kind of like a suburb. So I, I rent this house. The house is worth about 190, 200,000. And this is like almost 20 years ago. And, you know, I don't know what that house would be worth now. Probably whatever, three, 400,000 at least. So we rent this house. And I go downtown to Fulton County, which is the county that holds public records for, for Alpharetta. I go downtown and I check the, I end up checking the uh, uh, real estate public records and I see that Michael owns the property. Well, Mike had two mortgages from Bank of America on that property. And w so what I did was I prepared a satisfaction of lien or mortgage, it's the same thing, satisfaction of mortgage for his first mortgage that he had on his house and his, his uh, second mortgage because he had a first and a second mortgage. So I prepared the lien, a lien on, or a satisfaction of lien or mortgage on those and I, I typed it out and printed it out and signed it. I ordered a notary stamp, went and picked up a notary stamp so I, I had a notary stamp. I signed the witnesses and signed from whoever was, you know, supposedly from Bank of America that had satisfied, you know, I just made up some name. And then I recorded it. The reason I didn't transfer the property into somebody else's name is because public records was so far behind in Fulton County, it was actually like 10, like 10 to 12 weeks behind. So once I recorded that document, it was gonna take almost three months before it showed up in the system. So I would have first had to have recorded that, then I would have had to transfer the title into somebody else's name. I mean, it, it would have just been a real issue. It was easier for me to simply make a fake ID that I, I used a child's social security number and I created kind of like what's called a, it's like a synthetic identity. It's kind of like a shadow um, how do I explain this? It's a, it's like a, it's like a separate credit profile for a real person. So I used some of his information, but I did, I used his part of his name. I changed it slightly, and then I didn't use his date of birth, and I didn't use a lot of, I didn't use a lot of his pertinent information. So I, cr it created a completely different synthetic identity, but I was still able to use the driver's license or the fake ID that I'd made. And and then basically. I opened up a few bank accounts in his name. I opened up a few corporate accounts. Uh, well, you know, we, we opened up a corporation. We opened up some corporate accounts. We then opened up some accounts in the name of Scott. Becky, I ended up getting Becky another, uh, another a fake driver's or fake uh, identity. She opened up a few bank accounts in her name. And we basically just, we just had to sit back and wait. We had to wait about three months for all of this to take, for, the, for that whole scam to mature and for the new satisfaction of mortgages to get recorded in public record. You know, the thing is, but the thing is, is like it, sitting around waiting was a problem because then we ended up burning even more money. You know, now we, we ended up 
you know, Becky, by this point, I realized Becky's got some, some mental problems. I didn't really know her when we took off on the run. And I realized right away she's, she's got a, she's bipolar. She has a bipolar condition. She didn't really know it. Like she knew something was wrong. Uh, and, and, you know, at, at this point she told me we were, we had been talking and she'd explained to me that she'd been divorced several times and that several guys that she had dated had, had just left her. Like in the middle, like she would come home. She said, I, I like on a couple occasions, she'd been living with someone came home and when she came home, the guy was gone. Like she, the guy had cleaned out the apartment and just left. And, you know, she was like, I was like, wow, you sounds like you've dated some, some real jerks. And she's like, I know, right? But the truth is, is like she's been divorced three times. She's had multiple guys just leave her. And all the divorces, the guys just like left. Like they just, they just took off. And it was like, that's weird that they would just ever, that this, that's your, the, that's the cycle with you is that you date some guy and then he just takes off on you. And that's strange. But, you know, after looking at it, it, it really wasn't that strange. Like after dating her, I started realizing she put me in a, in a, 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 a fight or flight mode constantly during these fights. Like she would get so erratic and, and these arguments would get so, you know, hyped up where she was just screaming and hollering and and like she'd get the you know to the point where you think the cops are going to get called or you think she's going to physically attack you and all I wanted to do was leave like I don't want to hurt her I don't want to get into a physical confrontation with her I just want to leave and she was blaming me for everything I mean everything was my fault Uh, I'd ruined her life and I'm like you begged to come with me you wanted to come with me I told you what was happening you knew what was happening like you you asked to come with me didn't matter it was my fault uh, I hate you and then 10 minutes later it was I love you so much I I never want to be without you you're the most amazing person I've ever met I'm so lucky to be with you I mean it was really insane and and you know just mentally she was just so fucked up you know not that I'm the 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 picture of mental health uh but Compared to her, I was. Uh, so we're waiting around. We're, we're, we're doing stuff like we're going on vacations. We're going like we're, we're, we're flying all over the place. And we're going to like, like, where's it, Bermuda? Or they, um, wait, well, we went to Jamaica. We go to Jamaica. Oh, yeah, that, that's the thing. By this point, I had gone online to steal identities. I had placed ads in like the flyer newspapers, which would be like, what would the equivalent would be, um, what is it now? You put go online. You put uh, these, like the free publications that you can put stuff for sale. Um, wow. Yellow pages or something. Oh, gee, like now, you're telling me if you want to sell your house, where would you put? If you want to sell something, you would put, or if you want to buy something, you would put it at. Fuck, I, it's it's Craigslist. Jesus. So you, it would be like, like you put a, like a job out. I put like an opera. I put something out on Craigslist, let's say, but it was called the flyer. They don't think they have the flyer anymore. It, you'd, I would run an ad in the flyer and I pay a couple hundred bucks and it would run a little ad that would say good credit, bad credit, no problem. So good credit, bad credit, no problem. Free loan applications call now. And it had my phone number. So then I'd run this ad and I'd get like 50, 60 calls a day. So I'm answering the phone and I was, what was it? It was, uh, I was calling it um, like United Capital Mortgage or something. I forget. United Capital Mortgage, help me help you. And they'd say, hey, I'm calling on your ad. Uh, I was, I'm thinking about buying a house. And I go, okay, uh, well, um, do you want to fill an application out now or do you want to fill one out? Um, do you want to do it online? You can do it online. Of course, you can't do it online. I didn't have a website or anything. And they go, uh, they all always said, no, nah, man, I'll fill it out now. I'll fill it out now. And, and I'd say, okay, sure. So we take an application. They would say, yeah, bro, uh, problem is, dude, like I got like a, you know, I got bad credit. Like I got some credit, a repo, and I got some bad student loans. And I would, I would, I'd say, that's pro- bro, don't even worry about it. We got a program for that. We to- I can totally get you in a house. Let's go ahead and take an application. Let's get you sorted out. And let's get you into a, pro- get you in a house as soon as possible. I definitely can get you a loan. You know, it didn't matter what they said. I was going to tell them, we have a program for that. 
oh, I just had a foreclosure. I'm in for, they could say I'm in foreclosure. I'd say, bro, don't worry. We got a government program for that. We can totally get that taken care of. Not going to be a problem. I can get you in a house. I'm just trying to get them to give me their information. So they would fill out the application, you know, they'd give me their name, date of birth, everything. And I just ask a couple ex- extra questions, with, which would be like, where were you born? What county were you born in? They'd say, you know, Hillsborough County. What's your mother's maiden name? They'd say, oh, her name is, you know, Jennifer Smith. Okay. And, and now I have enough to steal their identity. Like just by telling me their full name, what county they were born in and their mother's maiden name, I can now, and their date of birth, I can steal your identity. So they would give me their information. I'd say, okay, great. Look, I'm going to go ahead and pull your credit and I'm going to give you a call back. It'll probably be later today or tomorrow. Then I would, after, by the end of the day, I would pick out the ones that I liked. Like I like this guy. He's about my age. This woman's about, about Becky's age. We'd have four or five different names. And then I'd take all of the paperwork and I'd call a local mortgage company and I would say, hey, I have... 50, you know, some odd applications. Do you guys want to, you know, I'm with a mortgage company. We're, we are we only take so many per month. We're at our quota. I'd like to go ahead and give these to you. Just take the applications, pull these people's credit and call them back. So I'd, I, I'd send over the applications. I'd actually fax them. I don't think people use faxes anymore, but so I would actually, you know, it's like a scan document, whatever. So I'd fax over the, all the applications to them. They would then call pull these people's credit and call them back. So the people get their credit pulled and they don't ever think anything's wrong. Like they get a call back from a mortgage company that says, yeah, that the guy that initially you called on and took it, the application, that's a more, a guy that generates leads for, you know, for us or whatever. And they call them back and it totally makes sense to them. If they question it at all, I talked to a guy named, they'd say, I talked to a guy named John on the phone. He took my application. Who are you? Oh, my name's Nancy. And I'm calling you back We, I, with this mortgage company. We pulled your credit and we can get you a loan. Or we can't get you a loan. We pulled your credit and you're horrible. Now it's Nancy's problem to tell them that they they can't get a loan. Either way, I have the information that I wanted. So out of like 30, 40, 50 applications, I would, have, I would cherry pick five or six people that were close to my age. And I would then order their documents. So I'd go online and I would order their birth certificates and their social security cards. And sometimes I'd register to vote in their name. And then I'd order their high school transcripts. And now I have enough information to steal your identity. I could go down to, I would go to whatever. I'd go to South Carolina, North Carolina, Alabama. There's plenty of state, Florida. Go into the DMV. I just have to show proof of residency. So I would register to vote in that state and I'd get a, re- a voter's registration card within a couple of days and I'd get the voter's registration card or I would get a lease agreement. I'd make a fake lease agreement, fill out the lease agreement for some local UPS store, go open up a box at the UPS store in case something gets mailed there for these guys and I'd get mail there. So on the, on the, the lease looks like it's an apartment but it's actually a UPS store, so you can mail stuff there. I would then go into the local DMV, say, hey, my name is, for instance, one of the first ident- identities I did was uh, Michael Shannon, no, a guy named uh, Michael Eckert. So I went and I would go in and get a driver's license in the name of, let's say, Michael Eckert's name. And I would give them, like I did this actually, I think in, North Carolina, because I relocated at some point later in North to North Carolina, and would go went into North Carolina, gave them Michael Eckert's birth certificate, social security card. Now that's my proof of that's those are my two primaries. Then you need a secondary, which is really your social security card also works as your secondary. Um, and then I would give them a voter's registration card. Or I would give them a lease agreement proving residency. And they would say, okay, go ahead and uh, wait over here and stand in line. And 30 minutes later or 20 minutes later, they'd call you up and they'd type all the information in. And they have you stand in front of the, you know, stand in front of the little background. They take my picture and boom, they give me a driver's license or an ID or whatever. And multiple times I had to take driver's license tests. You know, they make you take the written test. So, which isn't written, it's obviously on a computer, but the point is, is that I would get that ID. So in Michael Eckert's name, 
I got Michael Eckert's name. I think I got a passport in his name. So Becky and I had a passport, had our passports in two fake names, and we went to a few different places. One of the places was I remember Jamaica. I remember Jamaica because going through a. Uh, because when we came back from Jamaica, I was so flipped out because I was thinking that Becky, because she'd been smoking pot, the whole, she smoked dope the whole time we were there. There, because she's a big pot fan, so the whole time she was stoned that we when we were in Jamaica, and I remember on the way back thinking, telling her, if you put anything in your fucking luggage, like you're trying to bring anything back, like that's going to be a problem. No, no, and she kept joking with me that if they if they asked to look in her luggage just to run. And I was like, it's not even funny. So, so I remember going through, I remember we got into an argument waiting in line in, uh, um, in cus- at customs. And I went to the bathroom, came back, and she'd already gone through the line. So by the time I got there, they were like, okay, are you traveling, traveling alone? I said, no, I'm traveling with another, with um, this, and I gave her her name. I forget it was it was something else. I, anyway, uh, Grace Hudson or something. So I gave her, her her name that she was using, and they were like, where is she? I said, I don't know. I don't, she was in line. I went to the bathroom. Now she's gone. They were like, so you didn't stay in line with her? I go, well, no, I didn't stay. I went into the bathroom, came back. Like, it was a big issue standing there at customs with this fucking dude. And anyway, he let me through because she had gone all, all, she'd already gone through. Just, just, she was just such a jerk off. All right. So, you know, we're, we're basically doing anything to burn time. We're going mountain climbing. We're going hiking. We're going indoor mountain climbing. We're doing all kinds of stuff. Skydiving. Like, we're just, we're just doing anything we can to burn all the time. We went to Disney World for a week. And we drove to Orlando and went to Disney World for a week. I mean, we're just doing anything. We went to, oh, we went to New Orleans. No, wait. We didn't go to New Orleans then. You know what we did? We ran another scam. And we went to Tallahassee because public records in Tallahassee was only like a week behind. So I remember we rented a house in Tallahassee from this guy. And it was in his ex-wife's name and he was helping her out. So we rented the house and we got two loans on the house for like $50,000 a piece. So we're going to get like $100,000. And we got, and so Becky goes... And I had originally wanted to do the loan. Do the, do, I was going to transfer the deed out of this woman's name into my name. And Becky was saying, no, no, it's better off if I just pretend to be her. We'll, get, we'll make a fake ID in her name and I'll be her. Just satisfy the loan because that way she's loaned it for like 10 years. It looks more, it looks more reasonable that you're refinancing a house that's been, you've owned for 10 years than one that you bought a week or, a week or two ago. And that does, but it had never been an issue. But she wanted in on the whole thing. She wanted to like do her part. So I said, okay, no problem. And I was going to do like three or four loans. But we didn't. We only needed a little bit of money at the time because we were running low. What we ended up doing was I, I went and I satisfied the mortgage on this woman's house. This woman had a mortgage and she had like two judgments on her. So I satisfied both the judgments and the mortgage because it's the same basic document. So I satisfy all of these this stuff on her house and now Becky owns a house. The name woman's name was Teresa Knight. So she owned the house in the name Teresa Knight. We then I then applied for like three two or three different mortgage to, with hard money lenders and they were going to lend her money. So she's going to get like she like I think it was two. I think it got down to like she was going to borrow two different mortgages for like fifty five fifty six thousand dollars each mortgage. So she goes to the one closing. We go to the closing. She gets the 50 some odd thousand dollars. And the next day we were gonna do the second closing. And on the way home, we got into an argument. I remember in, in, like in my book, I go over what the argument's about. Um, it's, it, it's literally, this was the argument. I'm, I'm gonna explain, this, this is how fucking insane this chick was. The argument was this, that as we're driving, she was, oh my God, we just made like $56,000. And we, I think the check was for, it was like we borrowed like 60 and she walked away with like, let's say 56, I think. So she's like, oh my God, we just made $56,000. That took like less than a month. She says, that's $56,000. And I went, well, yeah, I mean, less expenses. And we're driving and she goes, what? I go, well, less expenses. I mean, gas, 
car payments, driving down here, you know, spending, you know, this, you know, a couple of hotel nights, like we stayed in the hotel, that's, you know, food that we could have been eating at home. Like there's, there's expenses, but yeah, it's roughly 56,000. I said roughly, but less expenses. And she goes, you're fucking sucking all the fun out of this for me. And I went, well, what? And she goes, I mean, what? It, it, less expenses? And I went, no, I'm not saying we didn't make money. I'm saying, yeah, we made money. I'm saying, but it's not $56,000. It's $56,000 less, about four or $500 in expenses. So it's, but yeah, you're right. It's about 56000 $56, And she goes, she says, you know what? I want to go home. Let's just go. Let's just go back to, let's just go back to Atlanta. And I went, well, no, no, we, we have to close the other, the other lo- loan is tomorrow. It's, it was for like 60 grand. I go, it's like 60 grand tomorrow. And she goes, I said, we got to close tomorrow. And she goes, no, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to do it. I said, I go, Becky, I go, it's $60,000. What do you mean? It's 60 grand. And she goes, less expenses. And I go, what the, what the fuck does that mean? What, what the fuck are you saying? I go, it's it's 50, it's 50, 60 grand. And she goes, I'm not doing it. It's too risky. I go, it, whoa, 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 whoa. So it's not too risky. It's already gone through underwriting. It's already, we've already talked to the guys. It's ready to go. We're ready to close. Like they, they've already sent the money. We just have to go pick it up. And she goes, well, I'm not doing it. I said, well, you know, if I'd known you were going to go tits up on me at the last minute, I said, I'd have just done it myself, which was my original plan. She goes, forget it. Let's just go. We get into this huge argument and, but she wasn't, she wouldn't budge. And so we end up driving back to Atlanta and never closed on the second loan. And that's just what a psycho this chick was. Then, oh, and then, so now we've got like 50, $5,000 $5,000 extra, you know, we've spent probably 30,000 in the last few, last mo- couple months. And she says, I remember she goes, she wanted a boob job. So she's like, well, I, I, I want to get a boob job. I'm like, well, why don't we get a boob job with the $60,000 that you left in, in, in Tallahassee? Like the money you didn't get, why are we getting a boob? Why are we paying for plastic surgery for you with the, with the money that, that you did get, which you left the rest of the money. I mean, why are we still splitting the money? You left your money. And so, you know, we get into this huge argument. She, she ends up getting a boob job. She got, she got a boob job, liposuction. She got a tummy tuck. She looked amazing. She looked amazing afterwards. It, it, around the same time, I ended up getting, I ended up getting a nose job. So I got a nose job. I got hair, uh, uh, two hair transplants so like they take the hair from the back of your head, they take the follicles and they re-implant them in the front of your head. So you know what you could do? You could put up like a picture of my old mug, my mug. I'll show you the mug shot where I'm like balding in the front and then you could take a picture of me now. Well, they know what I look like now. You see the the wanted poster? Like if the, so yeah, they, they redo that. Uh, then I got what's called a mini facelift. They go in behind your ears and they suck out all the junk in your neck. And so I did all this stuff. Uh, Got rid of my, my love handles. Got what's called gynecomastia surgery because I used to work out all the time. I had um I had what they call bitch tits, which is a uh, gynecomastia. It's like you get a growth in your. You've seen older guys that have this growth in their chest, right? Like a lump. So they went in and they cut that out. Um, I got some work done, uh, and so now we're still in Atlanta waiting for for the satisfaction of mortgages to to take place. What did we do in Atlanta? Oh, I know what it was. We, sorry. So while this whole time, while we're still screwing around waiting, once we get the 50 some odd thousand, so now we got like maybe, we're still only have probably 80 or 90, probably we're still back at like 90,000, maybe, maybe 90,000, maybe a hundred. And I remember we went to New Orleans. So when we go to New Orleans, oh, oh yeah, this is the other thing. Before we even went to Atlanta, I'm sorry, before we even went to Tallahassee to borrow the 50, the 60,000, whatever it was, before we even went there, the St. Petersburg Times came out with an art article called Dubious Deals. And this is a, a newspaper in Tampa. It's now called the Tampa Tribune. 
or is it Tampa Times? Tampa Bay, Tampa Bay Times, I think. So they'd come up with an article called Dubious Deals where this guy, Jeff Testerman, had he'd pieced together all of the, all of the different um, synthetic identities, the reservoir dogs, th- synthetic identities that I had been using. He pieced all of those together and came, out with, came up with this article which explains that there's this guy, Matt Cox, who's currently on federal probation. He drove up the prices on all the in, in this area. He borrowed a bunch of money. Like he's he's quoting law enforcement. He explained he like blows the whole thing wide open. So every couple of days a new article's coming out. Cause now people are talking, law enforcement's talking, they're looking for me. I'm wanted. I'm now on the run. Like there's all these articles that start coming out. And then we just went to Tallahassee and just stole some more money. And now we're in Atlanta. Well, while we're in Atlanta, these articles are coming out. There's an article. There was a whole series around the same time when the first six months to a year that we're gone. Whole, a whole series of articles that come, came out in the uh, Chicago Tribune called The Fugitives. Um, well, we ended up going to New Orleans. And while we were in New Orleans, we just, just for like a week or two, I remember we were in New Orleans. We went on a bunch of ghost tours. We hung out. We, this was before Katrina. We hung out, went on some ghost tours, uh, you know, rode the trolleys, went to some bars, you know, did the whole New Orleans thing, went to a bunch of museums. Turns out that there's an artist by the name of Matthew Cox. Hey, I hope you're enjoying the video. Wanted to let you guys know one of the ways I pay for all of this is through Patreon subscriptions. So if you join my Patreon at the top tier, you get a different painting every single month. The contact information for Patreon is in the description box. Back to the video. The U.S. Marshals had gotten a tip that there was an artist named Matthew Cox that was having an exhibit in New Orleans not on, we stayed on Royal Street, right? Because there's Bourbon Street, Royal Street. There's like one street over. Like literally about two to three blocks from where we stayed was a, um, a gallery, an art gallery that was having an exhibit, like a two or three week long exhibit for a guy named, an artist named Matthew Cox. While we're in New Orleans, the U.S. Marshals sent two U.S. Marshals to the gallery to show the gallery owner a photograph of me, my wanted poster, and he said, no, that's not Matthew Cox. That's not the Matthew Cox that I own. I mean, just completely by coincidence, this is what happened. I found this out five or six, year, five or six years later when I ordered the Freedom of Information Act. I found, got the U.S. Marshal report that explains that they flew out there, went there, the, the whole Matthew Cox thing. So I thought that was hilarious or interesting because, I mean, for all I know, we passed right by these guys. They were a couple blocks away. We were all over that area going to museums and bars and just hanging out. So what, what ended up happening was we then we go, back to, um, we go back to Atlanta. By this point, we now have the, the satisfaction of loans that I had created were now, had now shown up in public record. So now I own that house in Atlanta in the name Michael Shanahan. I own his house free and clear and I have a driver's license in his name I have multiple bank accounts in his name I actually by this point I have credit cards in his name I have a social security number in his name not with his social on it but the social of a a, you know a a kid Um, so I have a social security number in his name so I have everything I need in that I need to close on his house I then get three hard money. I call three hard money lenders in the area. Just go online and I look them up and find three guys. One comes out at, let's say, 10 o'clock in the morning, looks at the house and says, oh, Michael, uh, yeah, this is a a nice house. This is worth about 190, 200,000. I'll lend you 150,000 on it. I go, okay, great. We schedule a closing at his title company. Around two o'clock, another guy shows up, walks around the house, says, yeah, Nice house. This is a nice house. It's worth about $190,000, $200,000. I'll lend you one fifty on it. I say, great. We schedule a closing to close on his at his title company. Fourth guy, uh, third guy comes, comes out, whatever, around 4 or 5 o'clock that day, looks at the house. Everything's great. He's going to lend me $150,000 on it. Schedule another closing. So within a week, now they, they all go to, so they all send an abstractor down to public records. They look at the title. And the title is in the name. The deed is in the name, Mike. 
I have an idea. It's Michael. I'm in the house. He sees me living in the house. I don't live in the house. I, I tell him I don't live in the house. I mean, I tell him it's a rental. I'm going to do repairs, put hardwood floors in, put a pool in, put a new roof on. I'm going to do an addition. You know, I tell him I'm going to do all this stuff. I tell him it's a rental property because I can't say I live in the house because if you go in the house, there's nothing in the house except for some bedroom furniture where we're what we're using. I'm like, I didn't furnish the entire house because it doesn't look right. I, I mean, because I'm not, first of all, I'm not going to blow $30,000 on new furniture for a place that I'm going to abandon in a month. So all of these guys are ready to lend me money on this house. And I'd say a week later, by this point, they've called my employer, which is a telephone number that goes to Becky. So Becky's answering. They might have asked for W-2s and pay stubs. I doubt it. They were hard money lenders. They typically don't. They'd pulled my credit. I have a couple credit cards that showed up, but there's no real credit. It's brand new credit. And if they asked hey, what's with this credit? Like you only have a couple credit cards that have only been uh, open for a month or two. I'd tell them, well, I mean, I had a bankruptcy like 10 years ago and I haven't really reestablished credit and I'm just now trying to reestablish credit. And they go, oh, okay, that makes sense. And it does make sense. So we schedule the closings and I go to the, I go to the title companies and I close, let's say I close one on, you know, one on a Monday, one on a Tuesday, and then another one on a, on a whatever, Wednesday or Thursday. Not that I couldn't close them all the same day. I just saying that within the same day or a few days, I close them all about the same time. I get the checks issued to me. I then turn around and I go deposit all the checks into, into different bank accounts. Well, what I usually did was instead of having them give me a check for 150,000, what I would typically do is I would say, I go to the title company. I'd say, Hey, listen, I own some, I owe some general contract, some contractors and I, I owe different people some money. Can you take my $150,000 check? Can you break it apart and give me one check for 29,000 to this guy? One check for 7,000 to this guy. One check for 14,000 to this guy. So I would ask them to break up the checks. And um you know, that's what I typically did. So usually they would do that. They wouldn't have a problem with that. I remember this one title company, they had an issue with that. They were like, oh, we don't know. That's against policy. So they just gave me the check. So I went to their bank and I asked their bank, can you break up this check into different cashier's checks? And I remember the woman gave me a hard time. Like this is something like I didn't put in the book, but I remember she was like, I'm sorry, that's against policy. We don't do that. I went, okay, well, I remember going, well, the check is good, right? She goes, yeah, it's good, but we don't break up checks into cashier's checks. Like you don't have a bank account here. And I was like, okay, well, but the check is good, right? I said, so if I came in here with cash and asked you to give, if I asked you to buy a cashier's check or a cashier's check with cash and I didn't have a bank account, would you then give it to me? She was like, if you came in with like $2,000 and wanted a cashier's check, I said, yeah. She goes, yeah, we would do that. I said, so what's the difference? This is a check to your bank that you're saying is good. And she was like, I'm sorry, it's just not policy. We just don't do that. I went, but if I wanted to cash this check, you would have to cash it. And she looked at me and she went, well, I mean, it's $150,000. And I was like, right, but you still have to cash it. She was, well, we couldn't cash it at this, at this branch. You'd have to go to a cash transaction branch. And I said, great, can you set that up? And she went, well, why don't you just deposit? I said, I don't want to deposit, I want cash or I want the cashier's checks. I want one or the other. She says, well, we can't do that here. We have to schedule it. I said, well, then schedule it. And she goes, well, I would have to call down there. I said, so call. And she went, are you serious? I said, yes, ma'am, I'm serious. And she goes, okay, well, I'll schedule it. I'll, I, when do you want? I said, tomorrow. She goes, I'll schedule it for tomorrow. You can go get cash tomorrow. I said, great, tell them I'm gonna want it in nickels, dimes, and quarters. And she looked at me and she goes, you must be joking. I said, no, ma'am. I said, and when they ask, why are we counting $150,000 in nickels, dimes, and quarters? You can tell them about your strict adherence to policy for not cashing, putting, for not cutting this up into cashier's checks. And she just looked at me. I said, or you can just give me the cashier's checks. Cause I said, well, I'm getting one or the other. And she looked at me and she went, what were the names you want the cashier's checks in? And I said, okay. So I gave her like the name Scott Cugno. I want to check for Scott Cugno in the name and for $29,000. I want another check cut to this guy, to this girl, to this guy. And these were all names of people I had IDs in. So um, she cuts up these checks and we, so Becky and I spend the next week going around cashing these checks and depositing them. So we deposit some of the checks, we cash some of the checks. So 
I'm at this point, I'm, I'm acting as Michael. Well, I end up, I have a check in the name Scott and I have a real ID in Scott's name for 29,000. So I, I, instead of depositing it in his bank account, I remember Becky and I, we went to the bank and I walk in the bank and I said, Hey, look, I need to cash this. And the guy goes, the, the cashier looked at it and she goes, well, it's $29,000. And I went, right. And she said, um, I mean, why don't you just deposit it? And I said, I, I don't have a bank account here. I have a bank account in Florida in a small local bank in Florida. I don't feel like back then they would hold your checks for like 10 days in out of state banks. And I was like, I don't feel like having it held. I just want the cash. And she goes, well, you're going to have to talk to the manager. So I go, okay. So I walk over and I sit in the manager's office and it's a little glass cubicle. You could see the whole bank. I said, okay, no problem. So I go and I sit there and he comes over and he says, okay, why don't you just deposit in your bank? And I explained to him why. And then he goes, okay, um, well, we have to look into this. And I said, that's fine. And he goes, can I have your driver's license and uh, two forms of ID? Sure, I give him my driver's license and I give him a, um, a credit card in the name for Scott Cugno. Well, it was a debit card. So I give him a debit card and that, so it says Visa and I give it to him. He comes, so he walks in the back to check it out. And I remember my phone rang. So my phone rings, right? And I look at my phone and it's a phone number that I don't recognize. No, 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 wait, wait. The first phone number I looked at. So I look at my phone and it's Becky. She's, she's sitting in the car. And I look at the phone and I go, huh. So I pick it up and I go, yeah, what's up? And she said, what's taking so long? I go, I don't know, the guy's being an asshole. He won't give me the money. He's, he's running a check right now on, on the whole thing. And she goes, oh my God, get out of the bank, get out of the bank. And I go, no, I'm not gonna get out of the bank. I'm just, I just have to wait. I have to run a, she said, run a check. Like the, it, like the check is good. The check is good. My ID is good. Everything's real. So I just have to wait. She goes, oh my God, I'm so nervous. I go, calm down. I, and I said, look, if the cops show up, call me and I'll run out of the bank and you can meet me at the, behind the Publix, like in, in the same shopping plaza. She's like, all right, hang up the phone. A couple of minutes later, the guy comes back and he goes, um, why do you, I have a question for you. So why do you want cash? And I went, why do I want cash? I said, I want cash because I work for a construction company and we cash guys payroll checks. And so I'd like to have the cash on hand to cash their payroll checks. And he went, okay, okay, that makes sense. And he walks off. Phone rings again, it's Becky. She's screaming and hollering. A couple minutes later, the guy comes back and he goes, I have a question. He said, who gave you this check? And I go, the guy's name is Michael. And he goes, why did he give you the check? And I, you know, none of this is his business, by the way. So I was like, I look, but it, well, they weren't hard questions and a normal person would just answer the questions. They wouldn't get pissy with them. I, you know, I just be, you know, they would just be like, oh, well this. So he goes, why did he give you the check? And I went, my construction company that I work for, we're doing an addition for him and he owes us this money on a draw. And he says, okay, okay. And you own the construction company? I said, I own part of the construction construction company. He goes, okay, okay. He goes, yeah, that makes sense. And he gets up and he walks away. So then my phone rings again, Becky's screaming and hollering, get out of the bank, get out of the bank. I said, there's a cops here or something? She's like, no, no, just, I just, I'm feeling nervous. You gotta leave. I said, I can't leave. Like, I can't leave the bank. If I leave the bank, I'm leave, walking away with a, he's got a check for $29,000, my ID, and my, my visa, my debit visa. Like, I can't leave. They'll call the cops for sure. I have to play it out. So I hang up on her. A couple minutes later, he comes back. He asks another question. He leaves. And the fo- my phone rang again. Only this time, my phone rings. And I don't recognize the number. So I go, huh. So I pick up the phone. No big deal. I pick up the phone. I go, hello? And this woman says, hi, uh, is this Michael? And I, and I go, yes, because I'd use the same phone number for most of these guys. So although I'm in the bank as Scott, the phone number is for, is, it could be Scott's phone, it could be Michael. So I go, yes, who? I go, who's this? She goes, this is Kimberly from um, SunTrust, SunTrust Bank, South Trust. I don't know. She says, this is Kimberly from SunTrust Bank. We have, uh, we have someone in the bank uh, by the name of Michael, no, by the name of Scott, no, trying to cash a check. We're just calling to verify that the funds that you had initially issued the check and that it was okay to cash the check. And I went, 
Um, yeah. She goes, can you verify the amount? I said, yeah, I believe it was for $29,000 even. And she goes, oh, okay. That's all we need to verify. Thank you. I, so it's, it's good. I said, yes, it's good. Scott, I issued it to Scott Cugno. It's fine. She goes, oh, okay. That's fine. Thank you. So go to hang up the phone. I said, how did you get this phone number? And she says, oh, I got the phone number because we called the title company where the check was originally issued from. And they gave us your phone number. If they had called information or anybody, they could have gotten the real Scott, the, uh, the real Mike, but they didn't. They happened to call the title company who gave, them, who gave them my number. So I just got lucky. So I hang up the phone. I wait. And a couple minutes later, still took this guy five minutes. The, the bank manager comes over with this woman and says, um, Mr. Cugno, uh, we're going to go ahead and uh, cash the check. And they count out $29,000. He counts it out twice. And then when I'm done, I when he's done, I scoop up the money, put it in an envelope, put it in my pocket, stand up. And just as I was leaving, he says, um, Mr. Cugno, I'd like to mention something. I said, sure, what's that? He goes, I feel very apprehensive about this transaction. And I go, really? I go, what is it exactly? And he goes, you know, I can't put my finger on it, but I just feel like something's wrong. And I go, huh. I go, well, I'm sure it'll come to you. And I turn around, I just walk right out of the bank. Listen, that dude, about a week later, I know the Secret Service showed up and said, did you cash a check for $29,000 from this fucking guy right here? Like completely not the guy. So I remember I got back into the car and I closed the door and I was like, oh my God, and I'm laughing. I go, they just cashed a check for 29,000. They this. And I told her about the phone call. I told her the whole thing. She's like, you got so lucky. Well, there used to be a program called Masterminds. So it was like a true crime program about guys that they would say were like master criminals. And I closed the door and I, and I'm sorry. And so I'm like, oh my God, you can't believe this. Boom, boom. And she's like, what? Oh my gosh. She was, you got so lucky. I said, listen, I said, when they do the, when they do the, the episode of masterminds on me, I said, that's going to be in the episode. And she goes, oh my God. She just started laughing. We backed out and drove off. And that was the only check I ever cashed for more than basically $10,000 because that was what you know, there's something called a cash transaction report they have to fill out or a suspicious activity report. That trans is the only time I ever got a CC, uh, a CC, uh, CTR filed on me and I got a suspicious activity filed on me out of all the millions of dollars that I, of checks that I cashed. That's the only time I ever got a cash transaction report and a suspicious activity report filed on me is because of that one thing. But I drove off, we spent, we cashed, three three hundred and fifty four hundred thousand dollars worth of checks in the um over the next week or so just depositing them cashing them depositing them cash them sometimes they would go sometimes the bank would get like like i would be cashing what i would we would deposit a check into one of the ids for um for that becky had and i would go in and cash a check for like eight grand and then they would call her like they go oh, hold on a second they'd walk in the back and call her and be like listen some guy's here trying to cash a check for nine thousand dollars and she has a new account it's only been open three or four months so they and they would say you know he's trying to cash a check for nine thousand dollars here's his name did you write this check and she was she'd go yeah i wrote the check that's fine that's so and so i wrote him the check they go oh okay she'd be sitting in the car verifying the that She'd written the check. They'd cash the check, and I'd leave. That was happening every single day for a week or two. Um, at the so at the end of that scam, we pulled out four hundred and four hundred fifty thousand dollars. I'd say about four hundred fifty thousand. And at that point, we we kind of we had built up some additional identities and started a new. A new we'd we'd set up uh, set up like a safe house in Charlotte, North Carolina at this point, and so we had a whole life kind of set up like a, we had an apartment rented. We we were um, we had furniture bought like we had this furnished apartment completely in this God right downtown Charlotte, like on the I forget what floor it was, whatever tenth eleventh floor or something I forget, but I mean it was a real nice condo downtown. It was an apartment building at the time. And it was, but it was, they turned it into condos, but super nice, um, right downtown, um, beautiful fucking beautiful place. 
God, it had, that thing had to be 14, 1500 square feet, two bedroom, two bath, concrete floors, um, stainless steel appliances. I mean, just a place, high ceilings it was great. So we had set this whole thing up and we're still in, in Alpharetta, Georgia, basically Atlanta, Georgia, cashing checks. And we, we have a, lot, a little over 400,000, four or five, no, about probably close to 500,000 at this point, four, 450, 500,000 in cash in a duffel bag. And it's sitting in, I remember it was sitting in the back of the vehicle. We bought a new, oh, by the way, we bought another vehicle. We took the Audi and we dropped the Audi that we had been driving just before we took off. It had been housed in the garage. So just before we took off, we went and we put the Audi in a police station parking lot. So I parked it in a police station parking lot and I left, we went to, went and got like, like, um, some lira and we printed out a brochure for uh for like a a hotel in spain right like some spanish hotel and we left the brochure in the uh in wedged between the car seats and we left a couple of lira laying in the back and then we got a um, spanish for dummies book and stuck it in the trunk with with some other just random junk that you would leave in in a car you're abandoning right so we just left some random bullshit in the car and and then left it in the police station parking lot where you know they're going to find it. They're already looking for this car. Then we we had our another car we bought in the name of, what was the name of the guy? Was, that was Michael Eckert. I was Michael Eckert in uh, Charlotte. So we've got a car in the name of Michael Eckert. We had a, um, we got like four or 500,000 in cash and a duffel bag sitting in the back. And we had all the money out and uh yeah that was it that was it we uh and we abandoned everything so we abandoned everything and i'd say about a week or so after we left atlanta to go to charlotte north carolina to do another scam at that point the secret service and the fbi showed up at the atlanta at the alpharetta house and went and contacted the real Mike told him that, hey, there's been this scam committed and this, these guys just bought, borrowed almost half a million dollars on your house. And uh, and we took off and that was it. So that scam was like over. Uh, Becky and I had just left um, Atlanta, Georgia. Now we were in Charlotte, North Carolina and Becky was using the name Michelle Joseph and I was using the name Michael Eckert. And we, I remember we got there and we had to, we had to start buying, like we, we had a bunch of cash. I think like whatever, 400, over $400,000 in cash. So we started buying, uh, we started buying furniture. Uh, we live in a really nice, like a, uh, an apartment building in downtown Charlotte. And we started buying, uh, furniture. Remember we would go in and I would pull out cash. And I remember the like I would pull out cash and the guy would say, look, if you give me more than $10,000 in cash, like you have, they, they're like, do you have a credit card? Do you have a check? Do you have this? No, because we had just opened, like we were just opening up bank accounts and things. And they were like, yeah, man, uh, if you don't have that stuff, then, you know, and you give me more than $10,000, I have to turn it in. So we were like, look, here's what we're going to do. We're going to buy these two pieces of furniture for $8,000 and I'll come back tomorrow. And the guy was like, cool come back the next day i'd buy the couch for seven or eight thousand come back the next day we did this over the course of like a week we got like whatever thirty forty thousand dollars worth of furniture um i ended up getting a car i bought an infinity uh becky bought a did she have an infinity also i got a nissan uh the, the what is it the 350z or something like that and then we i we also got an infinity we got the infinity, whatever it was, the, the, the SUV, uh, listen, we had, we got, we bought like three cars, got a nice apartment and kind of started hanging out, set it, waiting to set up the next scam. So we, I think we ended up going to, we ended up going to, uh, Jamaica. I remember we went to Jamaica and uh, I had to get a passport, which wasn't difficult to do because once I had Michael Eckert's driver's license, like I had a state issue in, the, in North Carolina, I went into the state 
DMV and I got a state issued driver's license. So I have a good driver's license in this guy's name. I had ordered all of his documents, you know, I had gotten all of his information uh, because I'd, I'd run an ad, like a buy, uh, not buy here, it was a good credit, bad credit, no problem, uh, free app, free mortgage applications, call now. And so people would call up and I'd, I'd take all their information and then I'd order their documents. So I had all this guy's documents and I would, had already gotten a driver's license. So then I just walked in and I got a, a passport. Like they don't ask, if you're a U.S. citizen, they don't ask for your 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 fingerprints or anything. To this day, they don't. I always have people say, oh, well, they don't do that anymore. Well, then you must be an idiot because, you know, like people say, oh, well, uh, uh, they, they, they ask for fingerprints now. Really? Because I just got a, a passport and I'm a, a, I'm a, a felon and I just went and got a passport and they didn't ask me for any fingerprints. So if you're a U.S. citizen, they didn't ask for them now, then they don't ask for them now. I had a per, my birth certificate and a driver's license. Got myself a passport. Same thing. Um, Michelle Michelle um, Joseph got hers. Michael Eckert got his. We went to um, went to Jamaica. Remember the first thing that Becky did was we went to Jamaica. Was she went out on the beach and got a bunch of pot? Uh, what else? You know, we went on, we did all the thing. We, we drove four wheelers. We took out wave runners. We stayed for like 10 days. We hung out. It got boring after a while. She was driving me nuts. So uh, then we came back. I mean, you know, we're, I'm walking through passport control. or I'm, I'm walking through passport, uh, you know, the, the uh, passport center with a, a fake, pa- with a, oh, it's a real passport. I was issued by the state department. But, you know, I walk up and you put the passport down and you say, you know, they say, hey, you know, did you, you're, you know, welcome back to America. Did you, you know, was it business or pleasure? And you say, oh, I was, I was a, they ask you going out and, or well, coming back in, they ask you, you say, oh, I was a pleasure. We just got back from Jamaica. They go, okay, you walk on in. So, you know, it's, look, I mean, I'd love to, to lie and say that, oh, the stress was killing me and I couldn't sleep at night. But the truth is, you know, it was pretty cool. It's pretty cool walking around fake pass, well, passports, you've got false passports, you've got false driver's licenses. I'm driving a car in the name of the guy. I'm driving a sports car. At that time, it's a fifty, sixty thousand dollars sports car. Probably now they're probably eighty thousand dollars or a hundred thousand. So you know we're driving sports cars and SUVs. We're living in downtown Charlotte. We're we're living a pretty decent life, but we're blowing through the money pretty quick. At one point, we were driving, and I remember Becky said, "Look, you know we're stealing identities." And, you know, we're like, at some point we're going to have to get, she, she was like, she, she was like, you know, like we're stealing these guys' identities and stuff. Like, you know, are you worried it's ever going to catch up with you? And, oh, I know what it was. What I remember what, what keyed that in. I was driving one day and I was speeding because listen, if you don't give a crap about that, you're keeping your driver's license. Cause you're only going to have it for six months or a year. You drive like a maniac. I'm driving like a maniac. And so I was speeding and this cop pulled me over, like a, a a state trooper. He pulled me over and I remember Becky was flipping out. Oh my God, I'm so, are you worried? Oh my God, oh my God. I'm like, calm down, I've got a driver's license. So I give the guy the driver's license and he asked me, you know, how fast were you going? I was like, ah, I have no idea. How fast were you, ch- how long were you behind me? I got, at one point I was like doing like 90, 95 miles an hour. And he just was like shocked. But I mean, what do I care? Write, write me the ticket. What is it? A three hundred dollar ticket? Four hundred dollar ticket? I don't care. I've got four hundred thousand in cash, or three hundred thousand probably by this point. We've blown through so so much money. So the guy writes me the ticket and he leaves. And Becky says, "You know, are you concerned about you? Know, you're not concerned about these cops? Like, are you concerned about you know, like what happened? Like getting we don't we need permanent? Um, don't we need like a permanent?" Uh, uh, identities. And I, I remember I said, you know, we, we need permanent identities for sure. We're going to have to, f- I'm trying to figure that out now. Like I was just in my head, always kind of thinking about how to do this, how to do that. And I said, my problem is that what, what concerns me is not that the cop's going to figure out that I'm using a fake ID, um, or, uh, a false ID. What I'm concerned about is that the guy whose driver's license I now possess in my in his name 
when I had interviewed him on the phone, he told me that he'd had a DUI like three or four years earlier and he'd lost his license, but he had it again. Because when I asked him about it, I, one of the things I asked these guys was, "Do you, have you ever had a felony? And he said, no, um, I actually had my driver's license taken away for a DUI like whatever, three, four years ago, but it was for like a year, but I got it back. Like, I don't think that was a felony. And I was like, okay, my fear was, what if I'm driving around on this guy's driver's license and he's lost his license? Like, what if he got a felon? What, what if he got pulled over and got another DUI and his license was suspended and I'm driving around in another state with his driver's license? Like the hub system that they use would probably tell the other states that this guy has a DUI. So I could be driving around on a suspended license and not know it. And I said, that's my fear. And I said, and she was like, well, what do you want to do about that? I said, well, we need to be able to get people's get IDs and identification in people's names that are real people that aren't using those. And I remember she was like, like what? Like, uh, uh, like who, who do you want to get? Like, and I go, I don't know. She was like, like mental patients or something. And I was like, well, how are we going to get their information? And she goes, I don't know. What about, um, what about like prisoners or inmates or something? I thought, I don't know. What if my fear with that, I thought about that. My fear about getting like inmates information or prisoners information, let's say some like guy with a life sentence, like he's got a real social security card, date of birth or, or birth certificate, social security card. He's got all that stuff is out there and he's not ever going to use it again. He'd be perfect. But my fear with that was I didn't know that if I got pulled over and was using his license or even I could even go into the DMV, maybe for all I know, there's some kind of a a check in there where they check your, you know, your, your criminal record or something. I didn't know. And what if I get arrested? Is this guy like there? Oh my God, this guy's supposed to be in prison and bam, they grab me. And then they put them, they fingerprint me and then they figure out that I'm wanted. So I was like, I don't know. What if they run a check? I'm not sure. So we were happened to be driving down. We were going to get like a, um, a lunch and we were going to like a subway, you know, a uh, subway, sandwich place we were driving down off the interstate and i remember i was parked at or stopped at the interstate for the light and i was about to turn and try and go go to the sandwich place and i looked over and there was a homeless guy and he was holding one of those you know will work for food signs and i looked over and i said that guy that's what we need we need that guy's information and becky was like are you serious that guy She's the homeless guy. And I was like, yeah. I was like, think about it. He's not using his information. And she's like, yeah, but what if he cleans himself up and this and that? And I was like, I don't know. I said, I don't think these guys clean themselves up. Like, I think a lot of it's mental illness. And she was like, well, he probably lost his license. And I said, well, let's go find out. Hey, I hope you're enjoying the video. And if you're interested in buying a painting from me, my contact information is in the description box. Back to the video. So I drove across the street, let her go in and get a sandwich. I walked across the street to the guy and I said, hey, bro, can I, can I talk to you for a second? I'll give you 20 bucks real quick. And he goes, oh, yeah, what's up, man? So I gave him 20 bucks. I said, listen, dude. I said, I got some quick questions, man. I said, um, uh, and, and he goes, he goes well, what are you doing? You taking a survey or something? And I went, a, a survey? And I go, no. I remember I said, no, why? Like, you get a lot of surveyors out here? And he goes, well, I mean, we get homeless, we get a lot of, uh, you know, we get like social workers and stuff. And I thought, oh, okay, good to know. So he's used to people coming up to him asking him questions like social workers. So I said, well, first of all, I said, uh, when was the last time you were employed? And he said, man, it's been, I forget what he said, you know, it's been five, 10 years or something, six years, seven years. I said, well, what happened? He said, I ah, lost my job and, you know, I'm a drunk. I said, he said, I, I drink and that's what I want to do. And I said, do you think there's any chance you're ever going to get it, get, be gainfully employed again? Like get a job working 40 hours a week. And he, I remember he looked around and he goes, nah, this is it for me. And I was like, okay. I go, do you have a driver's license? And he said, no. And I went, oh, I said, did you, is it suspended? Or he said, well, I, one, I, I don't have it. And two, he said, no, I just think it's probably um, expired or something. I said, would you get a DUI? He's like, how would I get a DUI? He goes, I don't drive. I don't have a car. I don't drive. And I was like, okay, do you have an address? And he looked around. He goes, no, man. I, he basically lived in the woods. And then I said, are you ever been in trouble before? He said, yeah, I've been arrested a few times for like vagrancy and, and loitering and 
being drunk in public and stuff. He said, but those are all misdemeanors. He goes, and they keep us, at, he has someone like me, they, they keep me in jail for 30 days and then they let me go. I go, are you, do you, you don't get probation? He's like, well, look around, bro. How, how can I do probation? I don't have a house. He said, so that, you know, I don't have anywhere to, I can't pay. So I can't pay my pro- state, like that would be a state probation thing. I can't pay state probation. I can't go to my probation officer. I can't, I don't have a, a, a gainful, I don't have a, an address that you can go to. I'm not gainfully employed. Like you can't put me on probation. I don't meet any of the requirements. So he said, no, they, the judge will basically keep me in jail for 30 to 60 days and then they just release me. And I thought, okay. So he's, he's got the ability to get a driver's license. He, he's probably never going to go out and get a DUI because he's never going to drive again. He's not planning on going out and cleaning his life up and, and getting a job. I mean, this guy wants to be an alcoholic and just drink and beg you know, for people to give him money, enough money to, to eat and, and drink. And so I thought, this guy's perfect. He's perfect because he does have a social, social security number and he does have a birth certificate somewhere. So I was like, okay, cool, man. I, I, I appreciate it. So I gave him 20 more bucks and I left. So I went home that night and I wrote up what I called a statistical survey um, statistical, statistical survey sheet or analysis sheet or something. I forget exactly what I, you know, form, statistical analysis form, whatever. You know, and I remember I put like the, the social security symbol. I copied it, you know, cut and paste it and I put it in the middle and I put like statistical survey form over and over and over again all the way across. And that was like a cover sheet and then you flipped it and on the second one it was like form number 2207 and then it said you know uh that it was printed in the government office and i I basically copied most of what's on a on an application a basic uh um like a mortgage application so it looked very the bottom you have a bunch of numbers and where it was printed and uh the form number and a bunch of just junk so i printed up all that and then i wrote out 17 questions the questions were like name date of birth, uh, where you were, you know, uh, where you were born, uh, the, the, the state county, uh, what states have you had drivers, uh, identification in? Have you ever had a, held a U.S. passport? Have you been in the U.S. military? Uh, what is your social security number? Um, what is your mother's maiden name? Uh, have you ever been arrested? Do you have a, a, uh, uh, any felonies? Have you ever been? In, have you ever been in prison? You know, do you have any felonies? Like I, I had a whole list. You ever been in the military, the U.S. military? You know, whatever. I had a whole list of questions. Have you, are you currently on food stamps? Have you ever been on food stamps or you know government assistance of any kind? Blah blah blah. Are you on Medicare, Medicaid? You know, I went through everything. Do you receive housing from the government? You know, all kinds of stuff. I went over. Wrote up all the questions. Printed out a bunch of the forms. Went and bought a clipboard. Went and got a little plastic badge and put my face on the badge and I made what I thought maybe a um, Salvation Army little badge would look like. So I made it, it said statistical surveyor and it said, you know, Salvation Army and it had some made up name. Actually, I think it said Michael Eckert and then it had my picture. I actually used the picture that was on uh, my wanted poster. So I put that picture on. So I, I put it, I put it on my belt and I took my little my little, um, you know, clipboard with my sheets. And I went out and I drove around until I found a bunch of homeless guys. And I just walked up to him and I said, Hey man, I'm, I'm doing a survey for the Salvation Army. We're trying to figure out where we, where we're going to place our next indigent facility. And they were like indigent. And I was like, well, homeless facility. And they were like, Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, nah, man, I'm not interested. Uh, I said, would you mind taking a survey? And they were like, well, I'm not interested. And I said, Hey bro. I said, it pays, it pays 20 bucks cash right now. Cash right now? You're gonna give me 20 bucks cash right now? I said, right now, cash. And they were like, yeah, bro, well, what do you need? So you have to think, I, you gotta drive around a long time to find a, a guy, a, a white guy and a white woman in their early 30s. That's a lot of driving around. So I ended up surveying multiple people within the day, maybe three or four or five people a day you know, it doesn't, you know, it's a few hours. It takes a couple hours here. Mostly you're just driving around looking. And, you know, of course, the first thing I say is one of the, one of those questions right away was, you know, just, you know, are you, do you have an address where you receive mail? Are you homeless? You know, that sort of thing. 
And if they were homeless, bam, it was on. So I start asking them the questions, boom, 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 get their information and go to the next one, go to the next one. Uh, so once I got their information, I would then order their documents. I would order their social security cards. I'd order their birth certificates. I'd get all the information. I, I'd register to vote in their name. I would order their high school transcripts. That was one of the things I asked was where they, if they had graduated high school, if so, where? Did you gradu- do you have a college degree? Degree, If so, where? So I get their high school transcripts. I would get, so I would order every document that I could think of. Once I got those documents in, of course, then I would, I would go into the local DMV. I, I of course, I, I obviously had to make sure I couldn't go into a, a local, a DMV in a state they'd had a driver's license in which is why I always asked what states have you had a, a license in or, or an ID in. So if I talked, if I drove into South Carolina and talked to people in South Carolina, I would get an ID in North Carolina or wherever, you know, Tennessee or Alabama or Texas or, you know, whatever, uh, Florida. So I ended up surveying a bunch of guys in North Carolina and then I got IDs in South Carolina and Alabama. I, so, let me think what, oh yeah. So I'm trying to think of, because we got a bunch of IDs and we were opening up bank accounts. Here's what it, what happened was, I was trying to think of where I got this one guy. So I then ended up driving, Becky wanted to go see her son and her parents. So we drove to, we ended up driving to, uh, gosh, where did we drive? I'm trying to think if I went to New Orleans before this. Yeah, I think we'd already gone to New Orleans. Uh, anyway, yeah, we'd already gone to New Orleans by this point. So we drove to, we drove to Las Vegas. When we go to Las Vegas, and I'm walking around Las Vegas. Did I ever tell this story? No, I couldn't have because we were in North Carolina when this happened. So we drive to Las Vegas and we go to Las Vegas and Becky goes and she sees her 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 uh, her mom and her and her stepfather and she sees her son and we went and we bought them a bunch of uh, bought her son a, like like a thousand two thousand dollars worth of presents. And I remember we gave her, I'm trying to think of how much money we found. We went and got her ex-husband who was raising her son and we gave him maybe 20 grand, 10 or 20 grand. I forget exactly how much, but we gave him a, a chunk of money. I went up to him. He was a valet at like a, at a hotel and I just walked up to him and I, and he, I said his name and he turned around and he looked at me. I forget his name now. And I said, you know, whatever his name was, you know. Tim or whatever. I was like, Hey Tim. And he's like, yeah, what can I do for you? I go, my name's Matt Cox. I said, do you know who I am? And he was like, Holt. and he was like, uh, yeah, what's going on? And he said, he goes, how's Becky? He goes, how's, how's Becky? And I go, Becky's fine. I said, she's standing over there. And I said, she wants to give you some money to t- for her son. And so we gave him like 20 or 30 grand. I forget what it was, 10, 20, whatever, let's say 20. So it was 20 grand in cash or 30 grand in cash. And he took the money and we, uh, Becky went and hung out for the day with her son and talked to her parents. And, and then we went around while we were there, like, you know, we were there for days and she blew a ton of money gambling. Like she's not a good gambler. Of course, you know, she was a gambling junkie. So, you know, Hey, I hope you're enjoying the video. Wanted to let you guys know one of the ways I pay for all of this is through Patreon subscriptions. So if you join my Patreon at the top tier, you get a different painting every single month. The contact information for Patreon is in the description box. Back to the video. I played blackjack twice. The first hand I won, the second one I lost, I said, I'm done. Like, I don't like to lose. So, um, and, and so uh, we drove around looking for homeless people in, in Las Vegas. So we get out and I remember we had gone to a couple places, but man, there were so many homeless people and I was afraid to get out and go into a crowd of homeless people and start pulling out twenties. There were that many of them. So I was like, wow. I was like, there's a fucking ton of them. Like I'd rather find some guys by themselves. And so she goes, I know exactly where we need to go. So we drove down a few streets 
and there was there was a white uh there was a two three white guys sitting on like a park bench. And I was like, oh, they're perfect. So I jump out of the car, and I walk over, and one of the guys comes walking over, and he's like, hey, what can I do for you? He goes, what do you need? And I said, um, I'm taking a survey for the Salvation Army, and I was wondering if I could ask you some quick questions. And he goes, nah, I'm not interested. I said, well, hey man, it pays twenty bucks right now. He goes, you're gonna give me twenty bucks cash right now. I said, absolutely. And I showed him the money, you know, like I pull out the money, I got it right now. And he go, I put it in my pocket. He's like, okay. And he said, uh, what, what do you need to know? And I said, well, what's your name? And he's like, uh, you know, Gary. I mean, you know, so it was Gary Sullivan. I write down Gary Sullivan. And, you know, where were you born? Uh, you know, like uh, how old are you? Uh, where were you born? What's your mother's name? Uh, name, uh, Maiden name. And so I go down the list. And when I get to the question of... um. I said, have you ever been arrested? And he said, yeah, I've been arrested. I go, okay. I said, is it a, do you have any felonies? And he went, he said, no, no, I've been arrested for, I've been arrested for prostitution several times. He said, but it's not, he said, but it's not a felony here in, in, you know, in Nevada. And I went, prost, you mean solicitation? Because to me, you know, prostitution is women get charged with prostitution. Men get charged with soliciting them. And, and, it, you know, so that was my first, I go, you mean solicitation? And he goes, no, no, he's a prostitution. He said, I, I offered to blow a, a, an undercover cop for 20 bucks. And I went, oh, you're a, you're a male prostitute. And he goes, yeah. He said, well, I mean, a girl's got to do what a girl's got to do. And he like suddenly just kind of went, woo, like he was like turned, went straight, very flamboyant. And I was like, oh, wow. I was like, I did, totally didn't see that. And I was like, okay. So I write down the information. I, I write down all the information. Give him his 20 bucks and he leaves. And anyway, I remember turning around and looking at, at Becky and she was laughing her ass off. So I go and I get in the car and I was like, did you know? And she, she goes, what'd your boyfriend say? And I said, did you know that this, is, what is this? She goes, this is an area. I'd asked him actually, I'd asked him. I said, oh, is that what you're, that's, goes, that's what I'm doing out here. I said, I said, does everybody know that this is an, is this like an area for like, like sex workers? And he, and he goes, yeah, everybody knows that. I was like, oh, okay. So when I got in the car, Becky was like, um, oh, what'd your boyfriend say? And I said, I said, man, you motherfucker. I, and she started laughing and she was like, she's like, oh, I knew it when we got here. I knew those were, uh, those guys were prostitutes. So we drove off. We went back to, we drove all the way back to Charlotte, to North Carolina. And I ordered, I, I'd gotten several, you know, several people's information. So I ordered all of their information and, I ended up getting Gary Sullivan stuff in and I went to South Carolina to Columbia, South Carolina. I set up a, a UPS box and I went to, where did I go? I set up the UPS box and then I went and I got, I apply, I'd already applied for a bunch of stuff and I, I ended up making up a lease. I think I had a lease there. So I made a lease and I went into the local DMV and I got a, I got an ID. So I walk in with, with Gary Sullivan's birth certificate, his social security card, and a copy of his lease agreement for the UPS box. So they thought it was an apartment. So, you know, I, instead of putting, like they always tell you, you can't do this. You put down um, where you where the box number instead of putting you know box number you put you know apartment number and they always say oh you can't do that well yeah you can you you know what you can't do this is the only times I ever had a problem with that at like the DMV or opening up a opening up a, like a, a um like a, a bank account was if the UPS store or mailboxes etc store had been around for four or five or six years. But if you went to a new one, it wasn't in the system. So if it had just opened six months or a year ago, you could do that and they wouldn't, the system wouldn't catch it. So I went to this place where it had been open recently, probably within like the last year or so. And I called, I had called around, like I would call around like, hey, how long have you been open? Oh, we opened about eight months ago. Or, oh, we opened about 16 months ago. Or So I went to one, got the information, went, into the DMV, got an idea, wrote up a, a lease agreement for an apartment lease, but put that address on it. Went in, gave it to them. I have the birth certificate. I have the social security card. I have my 
proof of residency, which is my lease agreement. Tell them I lost my driver's license in the move here. I've been here about two weeks and I need an ID. I'll come back and get a driver's license. And they said, no problem. Stand over there. Stood over there. They took my picture. I get the ID. I leave. So now I have an ID in the name Gary Sullivan. So at this point, I'm in South Carolina. I'm in Columbia, South Carolina. And I have assumed, I started up, I started a scam with uh, using the name Gary Lee Sullivan, or Gary Sullivan, which was a, a transient that I had met in a homeless, um, he was also a, a, a male prostitute that I'd met in Nevada, uh, in Las Vegas. And I already, I'd gotten an, a, an ID in his name in South Carolina and was starting a scam uh, in his name. So uh, let's see. So here's, so I wrote a book called Shark in the Housing Pool. Here's what I want to mention is every once in a while, I'll see one of these quotes that I put in the book. And the quote is, Cox and Hauk disappeared from Georgia last summer, then resurfaced in South Carolina and Columbia, South Carolina for more of the same using false IDs and forged documents and setting up a phony loan company to snare more than a million dollars in fraudulent loans, the Chicago Tribune. Bro, what the hell, you know? Like, it's, it's, it's ridiculous. And then this is one from Fortune Magazine wrote, Cox has the ability to dramatically alter his appearance. He frequents tanning salons and has had numerous co uh, cosmetic surgeries, which is true. At this point, I have had a nose job. So I had a nose, because uh, look, my, my, my picture was, you know, I was on the Secret Service's most wanted list. The FBI's looking for me. The US Marshals are looking for me. I got, you know, there's posters of me. Like I know they're looking for me. There's all these articles that are coming out. And I, I you know, I know they're, they're, it's bad. So I ended up getting a nose job. I had a, I had a couple different liposuction surgeries and you know I had lost weight. I had two hair transplants or two um they call them hair grafts whatever. They're not plugs. So uh, two hair grafts where they actually cut the hair out of the back of your head like the little seeds that make your hair grow and they implant them in your your hair because I when I left Tampa I was you know was thinning and my hairline was receding so I had that done I had what was called what's called a, a mini facelift so by this point I look drastically different you know I mean it's still me but I definitely it, it's questionable I've lost weight I'm tanning I'm wearing my hair different and I have an ID in the name Gary Lee Sullivan I go to South Carolina and we're, we're now keep in mind that Becky Hauk and I are living in Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, I haven't done these in a while. I mentioned Becky, right? Yeah, yeah, she was, okay. Okay, so, yeah, of course I mentioned her. Anyway, so we are living in Charlotte, North Carolina, but I'm gonna run a scam in Columbia, no, in Columbia, South Carolina. So I'm in Columbia, and the first thing I do is I, after I get the ID, I go to a corporate lawyer, and I set up a... A couple of um, shell companies. You know, I, I tell him that I'm a, a lender and I need to open a couple corporations. So we open a few corporations, and then I go around. After I've got the corporations opened, I go to several different banks and I open up corporate bank accounts. And then I go to several other banks and I open up a personal accounts for Gary Lee Sullivan. Uh, the other thing I did was, you know, there's a lot of things that, like in the book, I don't mention. Uh, one of the things is that what I did was uh, I, 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 when I pulled Sullivan's credit, he had a bunch of medical collections. So I had to contact those, his medical collection people, and I paid off probably about $20,000 worth of medical collections. I also, of course, got a few secured credit cards in his name. So he had some semblance of somebody who's kind of rebuilding his life. You know, you've got the medical collections that were paid off. You've got a few new credit cards. And then I turned around and I, of course, I got a, a business card made. I set up a website for uh, Labor on Demand, which was supposedly his uh, the company he worked for. 
I set up a what's called a they call them HQs, which are like a virtual offices. You can actually rent real offices. They typically have them almost everywhere. They have them in in Atlanta, downtown Atlanta, Charlotte, uh, Columbia. They have them in most major cities. Um, you know, Orlando, Miami, whatever. I'm not sure Columbia is a would be considered a major city, but anyway, they had one. So you could call and they'll give you a phone number. So you could put that on your business card. So if somebody called the business, it would go, it would be answered by a real person and they would either take a message and then email you or they would reroute the phone call to you. So you have to understand. So I've got all of this stuff set up in the name of Gary Sullivan and I have corporations set up. I have bank accounts. I have everything. So then I turn around and I contact a, a realtor. I remember, I want to say his name was Griffin. Anyway, I contact uh, this realtor and I tell him, hey, I want to buy a house. I want to buy a an piece of property owner occupied. I'm sorry. God, what am I saying? I want to buy a, a, a house, you know, to buy, but it, it has to be, um, you know, I want to buy the house to live in it, but I want to buy a house uh, and I need the owner to owner finance it. Like I'll put down 10% but I need them to owner finance it. And so we, he and I drive around, we look at like probably five or six houses the first day. And I come back and I say, I find, a, actually we put like five contracts down on probably out of the six houses, I think we put five contracts down on, on these houses where I put like a thousand dollars down. And I said, look, write up a contract, asking them, telling them I'll put down 10% and they have to hold a 90% mortgage and it's called what's called a wraparound. Like even if you, they have a first mortgage, you, they can still hold a mortgage on the house and they just wrap their mortgage around the first mortgage. So they're still in technically in first mortgage position kind of, and that I would make my payments to them and then they could pay their current mortgage, their current mortgage uh, company. And you know, look, not all real estate agents even know how to do this. Uh, so, but I explained it to Griffin. He kind of explained it. He ended up, uh, what was his name, bro? What's the guy's name? Griffin. Um, shoot. Anyway, whatever. So, uh, w we end up getting two, two of the homeowners come back and they say, okay, fine. No problem. We'll, uh, we'll do the, uh, we'll do the owner financing. And one of those cup, uh, one of those guys was a guy that sold, he sold, what did he sell? Uh, he sold uh, chemicals. He was like a chemical, uh, salesperson that sold some kind of chemicals for, to pesticides and stuff like that. So the, and, and he was selling his house and he was actually behind on his mortgage. So part of my down payment went to catch up his mortgage with his mortgage company. Second guy was a doctor and I ended up going, uh, he, he agreed to owner finance that property. So I met with both of them, you know, obviously they want to know the story. They're like, well, why can't you go to a bank? And of course I would say, you know, I can't go to a bank because, you know, I was in a car accident or something, you know, several years ago, or I, I forget exactly what the story was. I told them, but I it was some bullshit and they never asked me anyway. I told the I had ended up telling the the real estate agent that I had, and he would tell them. So it was something along the lines of, I'd been in an accident or something, and I had, you know, several years ago, and I had a bunch of medical collections, which fit with Gary Sullivan, and then I was rebuilding my my credit. And I, I couldn't get a loan from a bank. You know, I, I worked for the same company for five years, and I gave my business card, and, and so he then convey that information to the homeowners. Homeowners agreed to go ahead and owner finance the properties. I went to two different closings, bought the one property from the one guy. It was cheap. It was like $110,000. It was, it wasn't a big deal. The other property was w worth about $230,000. The one that the doctor owned and the doctor, they were trying to, they were moving to Atlanta, Georgia. So I go to the closing and I close on the property and that's great. It's great. It works out great. Uh, I've got I've got the properties, or I, I now am in possession of both the properties. And here's the thing, like if you borrow money on a house, the bank will lend you more money if 
you live in the house. So I went, so Becky and I drove around and we ended up getting a bunch of boxes. Uh, and we, 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 uh, you know, like we got boxes and we just opened all the boxes and just piled them up. Right. So it looked like we, I just moved in. I went and I got furniture and uh, real cheap furniture and had it delivered plastics on it. Didn't even take the plastic off, bought a bunch of cheap, cheap frames. Um, I mean, just ton, like really filled this house up with a lot of cheap furniture, but it's wrapped up in plastic and it, it, who knows? You don't even know that it's cheap. Like if you're an appraiser, you come to the house and you walk in, it looks like I live there. Bought a, uh, bought a be- couple of beds, put the beds in, just lean them up against the wall. Like, I mean, it looks like I'm, I live here. Like I just moved in. Uh, and boxes, like we wrote like kitchen and put all a bunch of boxes in the kitchen that said kitchen, put, you know, just a bunch of junk. I mean, we spent like all day just doing this. And so the one house definitely looks like, like I live in the one house. Uh, the other house, uh, we did the same thing in the other house. Um, so I then turned around and I went, downtown i waited about a week or so and i went downtown and i found i i went to public records downtown for real estate and i found the recorded deed i'm sorry and i found all of i found all the the recorded the deed to both houses and i found the mortgages on both houses so i satisfy the loans that these people had on their on their homes i satisfy the loans for both the buy i create a satis, what's called a satisfaction of mortgage I fill it out. I get it notarized. I, I didn't get it notarized. I notarized it myself because I had a notary stamp. So I notarized the document. I go back downtown and I file it in public records. And that basically satisfies the mortgages that are currently on the house in the other people's names. Now, keep in mind, these guys also put first mortgages on the properties also in their name. It's called a wraparound. I then went back, got a copy of those documents, made satisfaction of mortgages for those documents went back downtown and satisfied those loans on both the houses. So now I own these two houses. It's basically 200 and almost 250, 200, I'm sorry, $350,000 worth of real estate. I own free and clear. I don't technically, technically I have mortgages on them. I mean, it looks, appears I have mortgages, but well, I have mortgages, but it appears I don't. And keep in mind too, because I had owner financed these properties, they don't show up on Gary Sullivan's credit. So I then turn around and I go to, I don't want to say six or seven different banks. And I apply for loans on those properties. I get, I want to say like eight or nine loan mortgages on these properties. I closed one on one ha- on the on the smaller of the two houses, the one that's going for like 110. I closed like four or five loans on that one and I get like ha- cuz these these guys are only lending me like 96,000 or 90,000 or 100,000 dollars on the property. And I closed four or five, like like half a million dollars on that property. But I'm going to focus more on the on the larger property which was the one owned by the doctor. So I, I then turn around, I, I close on like five loans on that property. And those loans are like, Hey, I hope you're enjoying the video. And if you're interested in buying a painting from me, my contact information is in the description box. Back to the video. Keep in mind, I have a mortgage on, on the properties too. So the money's not going directly to me. Some of the money's going to me. Some of the money's going to the corporations. So I can deposit those checks into the corporate accounts because, you know, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac guidelines at the time, I don't know what they are now, probably the same. They, they have an issue with just cutting you a check for a, more than $100,000. So what I did was I would have like $190,000 going to a corporation that appeared to be a mortgage company and maybe five or $10,000 would go to me personally. And so, but either way, I'm getting the money because I'm in control of both of those two entities. So I would then take the money out of those entities and deposit, kind of spread it out amongst all of my bank accounts. And then I'd start removing that money in, in cash. And that's what I was in the middle of doing. I was slowly removing that money in, in cash. Listen, this, this whole time, you have to understand this whole time, Becky and I are going everywhere. We're going to... 
um, Bermuda, we're going to Mexico, we're going to Jamaica, we're, we're flying all over the place. And I remember one time we had gone to, we'd actually gone to uh, New Orleans, and there was a, a, there was a, I think I did tell say this, where there was a, um, we went to New Orleans and stayed um, on like Royale Street, which is right next to Bourbon Street. And when we were there, uh, you know, we hung out there for like a week or 10 days or something. Then we went home. And I later found out when I ordered documents on myself, I found out that the U.S. Marshals had actually been there the same time we were there. There was a there's a famous artist by the name of Matthew Cox. Now, I'm also an artist. And what ended up happening was because I'm an artist, the U.S. Marshals had found out that there was a guy named Matt Cox who was having a, a gallery, like a showing and so they sent two U.S. Marshals to the gallery to ask them if the Matt Cox, who was doing the um, having a, a art exhibit or showing or whatever you want to call it, they showed him my picture and said, is this the Matt Cox that's the artist here? And the guy, the owner, looked at it and said, listen, I've known Matt Cox for whatever, whatever he said, five years or something. That's not him. But they happened to be, and by the way, that gallery was only like two streets away from where we were staying. Just so happens that they... Two marshals were there at the same time I was there. And I may have told that story earlier, but I always thought that was amazing. Like when I got the documents from Freedom of Information Act, I was like, oh my God, that's amazing. Back to um, Columbia, South Carolina. So I've got these, these two loans and I'm pulling money out of the properties. And I'm, but I'm staying in Charlotte. So one morning, I'm... And keep in mind, when I did these closings, I would close like within a day or two. So what happens is you close these loans on the, let's say I close four loans on a property or five loans on a property. The title company would then, you'd, you'd sign, you go to five different title companies or four different ones or six different ones. So no one title company knows about the other loans. And what happened is, is I would sign the documents and the title company gets it. Then they put together a package. Then they mail that, those documents to public records. Then they just get recorded. Like the person in public records doesn't know, doesn't realize that there shouldn't be six loans on this one house. They have no idea. They're just, all their job is to get the loan document, scan a copy of it into public records, and then that's it. So it's not a big deal. I'm steadily pulling cash out, $8,000, $9,000, $4,000, you know, slowly pulling cash out of all these different bank accounts. And what ends up happening is, one day I'm sitting at home in Charlotte, in my apartment in Charlotte, and I get a phone call. And the phone, or I don't, Gary Sullivan gets a phone call because I'm actually living in Charlotte as a guy named Michael Eckert. And I get a phone call from a lawyer with, I want to say it was Washington Mutual Bank. I'm going to say Washington Mutual. Anyway, from Washington Mutual Bank, the guy calls me up and he's like, listen, hey, is this Gary Sullivan? I mean, is this, is this Gary Sullivan? I'm like, yeah, this is Gary Sullivan. And he says, hi, this is whatever his name was from uh, Washington Mutual Bank. I'm a lawyer. And he says, uh, we have a problem. And I go, what's that? He said, the problem is that um, we got a phone call from one of the title companies that says that you that we're, we have a first lien position on this property, but somebody else is in front of us. So he's saying we're supposed to be in first position on the title and we're not. There, apparently there's another loan in front of ours. We don't know how this happened, but it's, it's, it appears to be some kind of a scam or something. And you know we're thinking about calling the FBI and we're not really sure what's happening. So we were hoping you could kind of explain it. And I said, whoa, 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 listen, bro. I said, let's not call the FBI. Hey, you haven't called anybody, have you? And he was like, no, I haven't called anybody. And he said, but apparently he said, I, I feel like this is maybe a, there's some kind of a scam happening here. I don't know what you're, what you're up to. I said, well, listen, let me do me a favor. I said, give me about an hour or so. Let me go to talk to my corporate lawyer and I'm going to have, give you a call back. Is that cool? And he goes, yeah, I go, don't call anybody till you hear from me. He said, no problem. I'll give you a couple hours. So I then jump in my car and I drive to Columbia, South Carolina. On my way there, I call the corporate lawyer who set up all these corporations for me. I call him and I explain to him what happened. And he goes, wow, you know, Gary, this sounds like it could be a criminal action. My partner, 
handles all of the law firm's criminal work. I'm going to have him here when you get here. So I show up and I say, listen, here's what's going on. I explain the situation. He says, and I tell him that I've actually borrowed like five mortgages on this property. And he says, you know, wow. So the, both the lawyers are, are you serious? I don't know if it was four or five. Anyway, so let's say five. And I said, hey, I've got five mortgages. And he goes, they go, oh my God. They go, what, what were you thinking? And I said, look, I just needed the money. And I, I, you know, I think I told him, them, look, I, I went to a couple of different loan officers of the banks and they said that they could, they could fix the, fix this whole thing. And they were like, look, and I said, look, man, I, I, I need to, I need to pay off this Washington mutual. So I need you to call to so the criminal lawyers. Like, well, what do you want to do? I said, I want you to call him and get him to sign something saying that he agrees that they're not going to contact law enforcement. And I remember he said, well, I don't know why he would contact law enforcement. He said, this is just a, of a, a, a um, creative financing error. This isn't criminal. He's like, we're not going to admit that this is this is not criminal. What you did was just a creating creative creative financing error. And so I started. I was like, okay, which I was pretty sure that I was not a creative financing error, since obviously my name's not Gary Sullivan, and the FBI and Secret Service weren't chasing me around the country because of creative financing. It was clearly fraud. But that's what he wanted to go with. So that's fine. And so he calls up Washington Mutual's lawyer, and Washington Mutual's lawyer says, okay, look, I can, you know, if this guy can give us the money back, and really it wasn't that much money. It was one of the, it was on the smaller house, which was like $100,000. So he said, does he have the $100,000? And I was like, yeah, I got that. And he goes, do you still have it? And I said, of course I have. Yeah, I have it. And he says, okay. He goes, he said, if he can just give us the 100000 back, we'll, we won't contact anybody. And I was like, okay, cool. So at first they said he wanted me to go get a cashier's check and bring it to Washington Mutual ba- uh, Bank and deposit and have the manager call me. And I was like, listen, bro, I'm not going into a bank. Like my buddy Travis had been arrested going back to a bank when we knew there was a problem. Like I'm not stupid. I'm not going into a bank when I know there's a problem. So I was like, no, nah, I'm not going to do that. I'll bring the cashier's check here to you, to the lawyer. And the lawyer explained that to their lawyer and my lawyer explained it to their lawyer and their lawyer was like, okay, that's fine. So that's what happened. I, I got up and I went and I, um, I remember I got up and I, just as I was about to get up, the, the two lawyers were like, Gary, wait, we have to talk to you about something. I said, what's that? And they said, listen, they said, okay, we have an, this is just one bank. You've got like four more mortgages on this property. What are we going to do about those? I said, well, my, my immediate problem is just paying off these people. And they said, yeah, but listen, there's four more mortgages. Like, what are you going to do? Like, what, what are you going to do if they find out about the other mortgages? And I went, well, that's when I leave town. And so they both laughed. They were like, oh, Gary, Gary, listen. They said, don't you understand? You can't just leave town. Like, they have your name, your social security number, your date of birth. Like, they'll find you. I mean, they, you know, this is, this could be a real problem. And I looked at, I remember I looked at both of them and I said, you're assuming my name's Gary Sullivan. And they both like were like, whoa. And I remember thinking to myself, they don't meet a lot of guys like me. And I said, they said, well, uh, I remember that the corporate lawyer goes, I mean, sorry, the um, criminal lawyer goes, uh, well, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. I said, right. I said, my immediate problem is paying these guys off. I said, I'll be back with a cashier's check. I go, I jump in my car. I go get a cashier's check. I come back. Um, when I come back, I give it to them and he calls them and says, look, we have the cashier's check. He reads off the, the whole thing. He faxes them a copy. He says, we'll have the money wired to you in the next day or two. And so that's, that's done. I'm, I'm good with that. And I remember the, the lawyer looked at me and said, well, we need to discuss our, our fee. And I went, okay. Um, you know, which was funny because like, you'd think you'd want to discuss their fee before they did all this work. And he go and I said, okay, well, what do you think's fair? And he said, well, you know, and I said, you got a couple hours in this at this point. And he goes, yeah, I know, but you know, it's a, a lot of phone calls and it's a it's a dicey situation. And he said, um, he goes, I'm thinking fifteen hundred bucks. And I went, okay. And I pulled out, pulled out, you know, some money out of my 
pocket and I start counting out fifteen hundred dollars in cash. And he goes, No, no, no. He said, Well, Gary, we don't we don't typically take cash. We we typically take a check. And I looked at him and I go, After what you just heard I've done, you'd take a check from me. And he goes, um, Yeah, you know what? Go ahead and give me cash. So I counted out the cash, gave him the cashier's check, of course, and I left his office. Went straight to a bank and removed more money. Went to another bank, removed more money, remo- went to another bank. So, I mean, it was going to take, I had about 1.3, at this point, I still had like 1.3 million, 1.2 million maybe. No, I had 1.3 million after I gave him the 100,000 back. So I was pulling out cash. I knew it was going to take about a month or so for me to get all the cash because I was removing it slowly. I was also getting cashier's checks and having and depositing the cashier's checks in other bank accounts. That way, the balances just didn't, you didn't have like 300,000 in one account is just drained. I was doing it so that the banks, the, the balances would go up and down, up and down. So I was taking, I would go in and I'd deposit a cashier's check for $30,000 and I'd ask for $8,000 back. And they would, they, they would, uh, you know, and they would cut me the check. It's funny that whole time I only got a, a I only got a two or three suspicious activity reports filed on me. Uh, never got a CC uh, a CTR filed on me. I mean, I found all this out later when I got eventually get caught. So I'm removing money, no big deal. Uh, I remember. Wow, I remember at this point, Becky and I were just at each other's throats. I mean, she was miserable. She was she was stoned all the time. She was it, it was it was just horrible. Like living with her, like bringing her with me was just the biggest mistake ever. You know, and we have different identities. We have fake identities. You know, she's got a bunch of friends, but she doesn't have a job. Like I remember telling her, maybe you should get a job because she was someone that like if she didn't have something to do, she was like a child. Like she would just get into trouble. And she was stoned all the time or drunk. And, you know, I don't really go out. Like, I'm not a, a, a guy that goes out. I'm not a flashy person. I, we, we did have, we had nice vehicles. You know, obviously, we were both driving sports cars. And I think, and she had a, a she had like an Infinity, the S, Infinity SUV. And we have, we had nice vehicles. You know, we're going on vacation. We're, I'm trying to keep her occupied. Uh, we're, we're doing rock climbing and, and going on these, you know, going out uh, as much as I was willing to go out. And she had a bunch of friends. But, you know, periodically she, she, was, she was bipolar. So she, was, have, she would have these mood swings. And, and, and I remember one night and she started screaming. This actually happened about, I only talk about, I think, two different occasions in the book. But this happened like three times where she just, was was screaming and hollering about how you ruined my life and I can't believe you did this to me. And I was like, like I don't even know you. You begged to come with me. And I kept telling her, you really haven't done anything wrong yet. Well, you can go home. Like, I'll get $100,000. We'll, I'll put you, get $100,000, $200,000 and we'll put it aside for you and you can get a lawyer. And you're like, I'm trying to get rid of her. And I remember one time she screamed so much that I knew it was in the middle of the night and she just lost it. I remember thinking the, the cops are coming. So I, I just left. I grabbed a bag, threw a bunch of stuff in a duffel bag and left. And I got in the car and started driving. And she calls me up. She called, must have called me like 50 times. And by the time she, I finally answered the phone, I remember the cops had just gotten there. And the cops told her, listen, if this guy, like one of the neighbors had called because she was screaming so loud. They, and the cops said, listen, had this guy been here, one of the two of you would have had to have gone to prison or go, gone to jail. So, I mean, this, this chick's going to get me caught. It, she's just, she's a lunatic. Um, what else had I done uh, at this point? God, I remember this point. I was living as Michael Eckert, and I got his, I had his name changed to Michael Johnson, just to see if I could do it, you know, see what the process was. Because I was trying to figure out how to kind of create a whole synthetic identity by kind of altering a, a, a person so much that they became their own person. Like I was already able to get passports and and I, I had, God, I had like at this point probably half a dozen, no, more than that, probably a dozen passports at this point. When I get caught, eventually I got caught, I had like two dozen passports. By this point, I, pr- I probably have like maybe a dozen passports and we're traveling all the time. So 
Becky's a lunatic. She's spending money like you can't believe. She got a bunch of plastic surgery. She got a boob job. She got liposuction. She had two tummy, two tummy tucks. Listen, she looked amazing. She did. She looked amazing by the time she had all the surgery. Um, all right. At this point, I, um, at this point, things are going good. I think I have six or seven hundred thousand dollars I've pulled out of the bank. Plus, we still have some money left over. But the way Becky's spending money, it's outrageous. I came home one day and she had bought a new a new SUV. Like it was just ridiculous. And I was like, well, what you know, what 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 are you what are you fucking doing? Like I started going, what are you doing? You're blowing all the money. You just you're you're pissing away all the money on on stuff that we really, you know, I wasn't sure exactly how we were gonna get the money back. You bought a brand new SUV. And when you've already got a sports car, and she was like, Oh, the sports car wasn't big enough for all of her friends to go out. And you know, and listen, she's she's going she's going on little vacations with her friends. So she screamed. I remember the one time she got the cops called. I wouldn't come back until she agreed to get her own apartment. So we, I had her go and get an apartment at a building right down the street, like from her. And I remember from her balcony, she could see my apartment into my apartment. She was crazy. So here's what happens. I one day I go to Columbia and I'm removing money. What I didn't know was this: was that one of the loans that I had applied for, the woman that I applied for the loan with had gone on vacation and had never put the title work in. So when she got back from vacation, she called me and said, look, we can probably close next week. And I said, and by that point, I'd already closed like five loans on the property. So I didn't want to, I didn't want to close her loan because I knew there were other loans were going to, were already showing up in public records. So I didn't want her to continue her loan process because I knew when when the title company that she used searched public records, they were going to see those those other recorded mortgages. So when she called me, I said, cancel the loan. I've already refinanced with my bank. She said, oh gosh, um, I'm sorry, Gary. I didn't realize you were in a hurry. And I said, yeah, well, it's not a big deal. I said, but do me a favor. I said, make sure to cancel the, the title work being done. I don't want anybody to go down to public records and spend all that time searching the title, you know. And she goes, oh, it's not a big deal. I understand. I'll cancel it. She didn't cancel it. What ended up happening was somebody went to public records, an abstractor went to public records, an abstractor is a person that goes and does all the uh, title work for the title companies. An abstractor went to public records. They saw that there were three mortgages on the property. There were actually four or five, including the two that I'd satisfied. However, they only saw three for some reason. So they immediately contacted the bank. They said, oh, this is fraud. There's three mortgages on this thing. Like something's up. And this guy's trying to borrow another mortgage. Like something's wrong. So they made a few phone calls and immediately there was an investigation launched. The the company that was in charge of that investigation was Wachovia's fraud department. So I go into the bank one day to pull out like $8,000 in cash. Like I'm doing every other day. Sometimes it's 4,000, sometimes it's nine, whatever. So I walk in one day, you know, with my Gary Sullivan ID and um, I go in and I said, and, and this is interesting. So by the way, when I would, whenever I would withdraw money, I, Becky, I would tell Becky, hey, I'm going into the bank. She'd go, okay, no problem. And I remember this happened many, many times. Becky would say, hey, what if you get arrested? And I would say, if I get arrested, I'm going to need, uh, all you have to do is call a lawyer, a local lawyer, and have him get me out on bond. Because if I get arrested, it won't be as Matthew Cox, it will be as whatever ID I'm using. Because I'm not typically the kind of guy that walks around. I don't have multiple IDs. I would walk in with a couple credit cards and an ID, pocket lint, everything as a person I'm, I am, who I am. So they would typically just arrest me and, and I would have a valid ID or driver's license or passport. So they, my identity wouldn't be in question. So they wouldn't run me right away. And 
And I, I, I said, so you get me an, a lawyer and they'll be able to get me out before I'm ID'd because typically they don't try and ID you if you have identification, especially if it's identification issued by that state. So no problem. I go into the bank. I walk into the bank, which was a Wachovia bank. I walked into Wachovia bank and I put my ID down and I said, hey, I'd like to remove, I forget what it was, eight grand or something, seven grand. And the woman goes, okay, hold on. And she walks in the back, which wasn't a big deal because I, I had, you know, every time I went in there, they would go in the back and they'd make a few phone calls because, you know, I'm withdrawing cash and it's, a, it's an account that's, that was open less than 90 days ago. So I'm waiting and waiting. It's not a big deal. And all of a sudden, somebody reaches over my arm and grabs me by the hand and pulls my hand back. I go to turn and somebody grabs me from the other side, pulls the other arm behind my back, and boom, I feel the handcuffs on me. You know that noise they make? And and I go, I turn around and there are two massive, massive sheriff's deputies from, I want to say it's Richland County. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, well, it's, it says Columbus, but it's actually Richland County. So I think they're Richland County sheriff's deputies. So they turn around, they look at me, and they said, Mr. Sullivan, sorry, you're being detained. And they walk me into an, into the manager's office and sit me down. And I mean, I listen, let me tell you something. I mean, I'm just like numb. I'm just going, holy shit. Like, this is it. They've got me. Hey, sorry for interrupting the video, but I want to let you guys know that if you join my Patreon at the top tier every single month, you get a different painting, and the contact information for my Patreon page is in the description. Back to the video. Uh, and I'm waiting, I'm waiting, they, and I said, what's going on? What's happening? The guy, the guy goes, well, we don't really know. We were just told to, to, to keep you here and detain you until the detective gets here. And I kept thinking to myself, because he said detective, I remember thinking, like, I don't know the difference between an officer, a deputy, an agent, a detective. Like, I don't know these things at the time. And I was like, oh, okay. So I thought the FBI was showing up or the Secret Service. So I'm waiting and waiting. And all of a sudden, this guy walks in, probably in his late, probably early 30s, mid 30s, let's say. I don't remember exactly. And he walks in. He's got his nice gray suit. And he walks in. He says, hey, uh, Mr. Sullivan, uh, my name is Detective whatever his name was. And he says, my name is Detective whatever. And um, we've got a phone call. We have a complaint filed by Wachovia is the head of Wachovia security department. And, you know, they're a fraud department. And they're saying that you're running some kind of a scam. And I went, Really? And he goes, yeah, apparently he said you have three mortgages on your on your piece of property. Now, that was the the Willow, I think it was Willow property. Anyway, that was the one that was like 230000 So there's like half a million dollars in mortgages that they've just discovered. Now, they only discovered three because there was multiple, several more. And so I went, and he, he said, yeah, there, apparently you have three mortgages on this property. And I went, is that illegal? And the guy goes... The detective went, you know, I don't know. And I remember thinking, oh, I'm walking out of here. I'm walking out of here. What do you mean you don't know? So I was like, oh, okay. He said, let me let me call uh, Wachovia. So he gets on the phone and he calls Wachovia, the, their, the head of their fraud department. So he gets the guy on the phone and the guy, and he's like, hey, I have Gary Sullivan here. And so he's kind of explaining and he goes, oh, what is the problem? He's like, I'm not even sure what to arrest this guy for. Like he, he came in, he borrowed a mortgage. Like, what's the problem? And the guy said, He's running a shotgunning scam, which is exactly the type of scam that I was running. Like the Wachovia knows exactly what I'm doing. <clears throat> and I'm like, uh, and, and so I could hear him on the phone. And he said, he's pulling money out in cash. He's, and he looks at me, he looks at me and he says, he says you're not, you have three mortgages. I go, right. I said, I have three mortgages. And he goes, yeah, he says that's funny. He goes, yeah, there are three first mortgages. And I went, no. I said, one was a first mortgage, one is a second mortgage, and one is a, a, a HELOC, a home equity line of, of uh, credit, which isn't true, by the way. They were all first mortgages. But nowhere on the document does a first mortgage say it's a first mortgage. It just says it's a mortgage. It's just a lien placed on your property. Right. So I know that it could easily that there's no way that he knows that I know that. 
And so I explain it's a first mortgage, second mortgage, and it's a HELOC. And so the guy from Wachovia goes, they're all first mortgages. And I say, listen, man, I read those documents. None of them even said they were first mortgages. Like I, I, I and he goes, and so he says, okay, he's, he goes, why, why is he, why would he go to three different companies? And he goes, why would you go to three different companies, Gary? And I went, okay, look, I said, I came into Wachovia because Wachovia obviously knows they're a first, they have a first mortgage. I go, I came into Wachovia, I applied for a first mortgage to re, uh, refinance my property. I refinanced it. I told them that I needed some, I told the loan officer here, hey, I really need to borrow a, about three or $400,000. And the loan officer said, look, we can't give you that much money, but I have a friend that can probably get you a second mortgage and another friend that can probably get you a HELOC. And so, and keep in mind, I don't even know what mortgages they know about. And I remember the detective goes, he flips open and he goes, oh, so that would be Fieldstone Mortgage and SunTrust Bank. And I went, right. Like literally he just told me who, what the mortgage is. I don't even know. And I was like, exactly. I got a second mortgage from Fieldstone and a, th- and a HELOC from SunTrust. SunTrust at the time was big on HELOCs. They did a lot of HELOCs. Guy from Wachovia screaming, that's not true. And he says, he's, and he, listen, he even had to tell, the detective even had to tell Wachovia's fraud guy to keep his mouth, to, to lower his voice, like calm down. He's telling him, he's telling him, arrest him. And so then he says, why is he removing all the money in cash? And he looks at me and he says, why are you removing all the money in cash? And I said, look, I said, I work for a labor company, okay? Now, by the, by the way, by this point, the, the detective had told me, you're not under arrest. And I showed him my cuffs and I said, I feel like I'm under arrest. And he, he told me, he told the, the deputy, take the handcuffs off him. So, they took, so I don't even have handcuffs on at this point. So I said, bro, I said, honestly, I work for a labor company. So I pull out, I pull out my business card and I hand him my business card and it says labor on demand. And I said, I work for a labor company, all right? I said, we provide a lot of labor for um, commercial projects. I said, and a lot of our laborers are undocumented. They don't have, they, they don't actually have bank accounts and they typically will have to go to some kind of a, a person that cashes their check and they'll take like 10%. I said, I know the checks are good. So typically what I do is I pull out cash and I give them, I cash their checks for them for free because I feel bad for them. And he looked at me and he goes, no, that, that's, that's, I go, is that illegal? I, mean, I don't think that's illegal. And he goes, no, no, that's not illegal. That's actually very nice of you. And it, it makes sense. And then he said, then that's, that's a good thing. I don't, he said, yeah. And he explains it to the guy from Wachovia. He's losing it, losing it. So then he says, it, this guy is running a scam. He goes, he's running a scam. His name isn't even Gary Sullivan. He's using a fake ID. So the funny thing about that is, as he's yelling at that, and which is absolutely true, but my ID had been issued by South Carolina DMV. So he starts yelling. This guy, by the way, the guy from Wachovia is in California. He starts saying, look at the ID. It starts with zero, zero, zero. And the detective says, no, our IDs start with zero, zero, zero. Trust me, this guy's Gary Sullivan. I even ran an NCIC report, which is that he ran me through the national credit or national credit, national criminal uh, um, a database. So he said, trust me, his name's, this is Gary Sullivan. So I remember I looked at the detective and I go, are you serious, bro? I go, now I'm not even Gary Sullivan. I go, come on, man, what are we doing here? And he goes, I know, Gary, I know, I know. So listen, I've totally won over the detective at this point. The detective tells the guy from Wachovia, he says, listen, he says, I don't even know what this guy's done wrong. You know, he said, I don't even know what to charge him with. He goes, I'm going to have him follow me downtown and I'm going to have him fill out a report. And then honestly, he said, I'm going to, I'm going to wait until I talk to the district attorney to see if he's even committed a crime. Listen, the guy from Wachovia is losing it. So he ends up hanging up the phone uh, from the, the guy from the uh, Wachovia fraud guy. And I stand up and he says to me, Gary, he said, do you have your, do you have a, a driver's license? And I went, well, yeah, I do, but it's, it's in Nevada. And he goes, oh, that's right. You're from Nevada. And he glances at the two sheriff's deputies and they all grin at each other. And I immediately realized that he ran me through NCIC, which means he knows that the transient that I had was using his 
information. I'd stolen his ID. He had been arrested twice for prostitution. So these guys think that I've been arrested twice for prostitution. And they all kind of grin at each other. And I'm like, oh, fuck. So, you know, like a little embarrassed, but I have bigger problems. So anyway, he says, would you have your ID with you? And I said, um, actually, I said, the I said, the deputy's got my ID. So he pulls the ID out and he goes, yeah, yeah, I got his ID. And he says, is your, do you have, he says, do you have a valid driver's license? I said, well, I mean, I think so. I think it's valid. And the deputy says, well, I'll check. So he walks out to his police car to check and see if Gary Sullivan has a valid ID. I have no idea if Gary Sullivan has a valid ID. I, he was a homeless guy that I'd met in, in Nevada. Who fucking knows? He didn't even have a house. He didn't even have a place to stay. So what, what ends up happening is the detective said, uh, so the deputy comes back in and he hands me the ID and he goes, yeah, he's got a, he's got a valid ID. And he goes, oh, okay, cool. He said, he said, it, 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 he said, it, it, um, he said, it's valid. He goes, yeah, it's valid. He goes, well, it says he's five foot 10. And they all look at me and I'm like five foot six. And they all look at me and I go, well, fellas, I go with a good pair of shoes. And they all start laughing. Ha ha ha, Gary, follow me. And he lets me walk out, get into my car, which by the way, my car was registered in the name Michael um, Eckert, which was registered to the address I was living at in Charlotte, North Carolina. So I get in the car and I follow him back to the police station. I go inside, I fill out a police report, and then when I'm done with the police report, he asked me, "Can you go go can you stand in the hallway? I can't he couldn't leave me in his cubicle for some reason while he went and got his lieutenant to sign off on it." So I stand in the um in the hallway and while I'm in the hallway, there's a bunch of of uh wanted posters. And there must have been 50 or 80 of them, right? And there was only one that was in full color, and it was my Secret Service's most wanted poster. So, uh, I I ended up before I, by the way, before I walked in there, on my way back to the police, on my way to the police station, Becky had called me. And she she must have called me fifty times. Like I had like fifty missed messages. So I get the phone. And I'm like, oh my god. So she it was ringing as soon as I got in the car, and I go, hey, what's up? She goes, oh my god, where have you been? I was like, um, I said, listen, man, I got I got. I got issues. I said, I just got questioned by the police. I'm on my way back to the police station. Back to, I'm on my way to the police station right now. And um, she's, oh my God, oh my God. She goes, I just checked the internet. You're number one on the Secret Service's most wanted list. And I was like, oh man. I said, look, I got bigger problems. I said, I got to go in the police station and fill out a police report. She goes, don't go in the police station. Get on the interstate and, and get out of there. And I went, I can't. There's a cop car behind me and there's there's a sheriff there's a cruiser was like in front of me and like the cop car was behind me i said I, i'm boxed in i can't i have to play this out and i said look worst case scenario is this if i get arrested i'll be arrested as gary sullivan you can get me a lawyer and before i could say anything she goes i'm not getting you a lawyer i'm not getting you out on bond you, i'm not going to risk everything i've got for you she probably had 6 or 700,000 dollars in cash so I was like, well, I guess I better not get arrested. And I hang up the phone. I go into the police station. I fill out the police report. While I'm waiting in the hallway, I see my Secret Service's most wanted poster. The deputy walks up behind me while I'm looking, while I'm glancing at it. He walks up and says, hey, Gary, you ready to go? And I was like, absolutely terrified me. Like I jumped and and totally flipped out. So I was like, oh my God. And he says, uh, hey, you ready to go? And I said, yeah, everything everything fine? He said, yeah, yeah. Well, you said my lieutenant signed off on it. No big deal. We're going to look into it. I'm not sure you've done anything wrong. We'll have to check into it. We get in the elevator and as I'm walking out, he goes, do me a favor though. He goes, don't, don't go anywhere. Like don't, don't leave the, the area because we do have some questions and I might want to talk to you again. I said, yeah, no problem, bro. I go, I own a couple houses in this area. So I'm not going anywhere. I work in this area. He goes, okay, cool. So I leave. I go straight to two more banks and get out more cash. And then when I walk into the third bank, somebody in the bank, like literally they, they see me and two women almost bump into each other trying to get to the telephone. And I knew right then something else, something was up. Like I didn't know if there was just like a, a red notice or something, some kind of a, a warning or something to, if they saw me to call 
called the police or something. So I saw them. I was like, oh, shit. So I, I realized what was happening. I turned around, got back in my car, drove off, got on the interstate, and drove um, drove back to uh, Charlotte, North Carolina. And I remember Becky had called me, and she was like, oh, my God, thank God you're okay. Are you okay? Are you okay? I was like, you bitch. You were going to leave me here. And she's like, no, I was packing a bag. I was going to come get you. I was going to come get you. But she was never going to come get me. So I ended up leaving. Um, yeah, I ended up leaving and driving back to uh, back to Charlotte. When I got to Charlotte, <clears throat> keep in mind, when I got to Charlotte, Becky and I had, we already knew that we were leaving the area. So I was just pulling out a bunch of money out of that scam. I was going to get the $1.3 million, and then we were leaving anyway. So Becky wasn't in Charlotte anymore. She had moved to Houston, Texas. She'd gotten an ID. She'd gotten an apartment. She was living in a condo in downtown Houston. So, of course, when I got back to Charlotte, I immediately packed up all, of, all my stuff Put it. In, or I had two guys. She actually had two guys meet me the next day. They packed up a U-Haul van, and I got in the U-Haul van and I left my car in the parking lot in our my apartment uh, in downtown Charlotte. And then I I left and I drove all the way to Houston, Texas. When I got to Houston, it was you know an issue. Uh, as soon as I got there, we unloaded the vehicle. Well, we had a couple of, uh, she had a couple of Mexican laborers meet she and I at a U storage and we unloaded the U-Haul. And then we took the U-Haul and I like parked it on like the outside of her, her apartment building. She had a great apartment. Uh, and so I was going to stay there with her until I got my own place, basically. So we went down, we had, I remember we had something to eat and we were driving around and as she was like showing me the area, she's like, oh my gosh, it's a great area. There's a sushi place here and there's this and there's that. And she's pointing out the whole place. I remember I, I, I said, hey, I had seen a, like a, a for sale sign in the front of this townhouse and it was, you know, it was in one of those for sale signs. It had one, there was one of those, uh, those plastic clear plastic uh um flyer things so i i go hey stop the car stop the car and i jumped out and i grabbed the i pulled a flyer out of it and i got back in the car and i was reading about the townhouse i remember becky said oh my god you know what uh what are you doing and i went well keep in mind she's bipolar and she's not taking her medication. Like I had sent her to a psychiatrist. She had been prescribed Zoloft. She would take the Zoloft for a month or so, and then she'd just stop taking it. And she would always say that, well, I, I felt better. I thought it was, it was okay. I didn't think I needed it. I don't like the way it makes me feel. You know, it, it was a mood stabilizer, and it, it would keep her from getting too manic, but it also, you know, it kept her from getting too low and depressed, but it also kept her from getting too manic. So she didn't like it, and so she'd stop taking it. So anyway, as soon as I got back in the car, she immediately said, you know, what are you doing? Like, well, why why did you get that flyer? She goes, you're not going to run a scam here, are you? I don't want to run a scam here. She goes, I, I like it here. I want to stay here. And I went, I'm not going to run a scam here. I said, but I need to find a place to live. I can't stay with you. She just went nuts. She immediately started screaming, what, I'm so disgusting that you can't stay around me. You don't care about me. I mean, just went just nuts. And so I remember saying to her, did you, are you still taking your medication? That sent her off again. I'm not taking my medication. Fuck you. I don't want to take that shit. I don't, there is nothing wrong with me. It's you. And I was like, oh, wow. So we go back to her place, get into the elevator go up in the elevator. I remember, this is funny because I remember there was this really hot chick that got into the elevator. And I remember being in the elevator staring at the ground because I remember thinking, don't even look at this chick. Don't even glance at her because Becky's staring at me and I'm trying not to stare at this chick. As soon as we get up to Becky's floor and the door opens, I bolt off the elevator immediately. And I remember as we were walking off, Becky said, I bet you'd love to fuck that little skank. And 
immediately as the elevator doors were closing, I heard the girl go, hey, <laughs> this cracked me up. So I get to her apartment, we go inside, and all I can think about is like, this chick is going to get me arrested. Like I, I'd known it before, and I wanted to keep her, you know, I, I wanted to do the right thing by Becky. I didn't want to leave her, but it's just at this point, you know, she just, one, I knew I couldn't rely on her because she had, she had told me she was not going to come pick me up at, at the police station when I was, I was in the, at the video before this one, I explained that I'd gotten caught and I'd gone to the police station and Becky had told me like, if you get arrested, I'm not going to, I'm not going to get you out on bond. I'm not going to help you. So I was, you know, I, I just realized like th- th- there's just no reason for me to stick it out with this chick anymore at all. She was planning on taking the money and just keeping the money and leaving me in prison. Like this is this is not a girl that's worth staying for. So I I but when I had gotten there, I she had taken the money that I showed up with. She had taken like I had all the money in like a it was it was in a you know, a, a duffel bag. And she had taken it and put it somewhere in the apartment. And I didn't know where it was. This was a, a big apartment. She had a lot of stuff. It was a nice place. And I thought, how am I going to figure out where the money is? So I still had like, I don't know what it was, ten or $15,000 in cash. So I pulled the money out and I, and I handed her the money. I said, hey, by the way, I said, this is what I got out of the bank. Here you go. And I gave her the money. She took the money and she goes, she, you know, she's ready to fight. And she just kind of like looked at me and just shrugged and walked off, leaving me like in the kitchen. So I remember, so I, as she walked into her bedroom, I immediately ran up to the door and looked where she was going. And she walked in the closet, stuck the money in a, in a, like a shoe box, a Prada shoe box. I remember she stuck it in the Prada shoe box. And turned around and I bolted back to the kitchen. She walked out and I said, listen, I said, we need to talk about just splitting up the money and going our separate ways. And she was like, um, why, you know, well, you know, you can leave and, but I'm not leaving and you're not getting any money. And so we started getting into this huge argument about the money. And at one point she said, you know, you're not getting any of the money. And I said, listen, let me explain something. I said, we're splitting the money up. And I said, because when I asked her what, she thought I deserved. She said, nothing. She says, you don't deserve anything. I want to keep all, I'll, I'll keep the money. She said, I can't go do what you're doing. So I need all the money. You can go run another scam. I go, yeah, but I don't have anything. You're telling me nothing. I don't deserve anything. She says, no, you don't deserve anything. I mean, she was just a fucking bitch. And I was like, I, I said, listen, I said, let me explain something. I said, we're splitting up the money. I'm getting something. I said, or I'll take all of it. And she said, with what? She says, you don't even know where it is. I said, it's in the, sh- it's in the Prada shoe box. It's sitting in your closet. And she was like, she immediately was like, oh, oh, okay. You can see it in her face. And I said, I said, so either I take all the money or we come up with something reasonable. And she goes, even, she, she said, take all the money and do what? She said, you're going to what? She said, drive off in that U-Haul van. She was in the ID that, that the police are going to be looking for. And the funny thing is, is that like, she was right like I didn't have ID we'd put all my IDs in the storage unit like I didn't have anything and I didn't have anything that she didn't know about so I couldn't use any of those IDs because she made it perfectly clear like she's going to call the police tell them hey there's this guy he's in a U-Haul van here's who he is like what am I going to do hey I hope you're enjoying the video if you're interested in getting a painting done by me my contact information is in the description box Enjoy the video. So we argue and we end up arguing and I accept, I said, look, give me $100,000 in cash. You keep the rest of the money. So she gave me 100000 in cash and I left. And I remember when I left, I left my cell phone on the kitchen counter because the times that I had left her before, she'd always called me and called me and called me until I eventually answered the phone. And then she would talk me back into coming back. Like she'd cry and beg and plead. And I'd end up turning around and coming back. So I took the phone. I put the phone down. I grabbed my duffel bag. I grabbed the 100000 I walked out, got into the van, and just started driving. And 
never, uh, you know, never went back. So I was somewhere around um, going through Louisiana, through Baton Rouge. I forget the interstate that cuts through there, but I was going through there and I had stopped to get a track phone. So I got this track phone. It's like a burner phone. So, you know, I got the phone just so I could call home. I called my mom. I called my ex-wife. I ended up calling a friend of mine named Susan, who was also one of my former mortgage brokers. And I called Susan and she had said, look, like every, like the FBI is looking for you. Like they've, they've been, they're knocking on doors. They're banging on everybody's, uh, um, everybody's door. They're, they're staking out people's houses. They've interviewed almost everybody. Like they, it's done. Like it, you're done. Everybody's cooperating, which included Susan. And she said, you need to turn yourself in. She said, the FBI's, uh, the agent's name is Candace Calderon. She's the lead agent. And she wants, she said that if I ever talk to you to have you call her, I have her phone number. And I didn't want to do it, but I was like, you know, give me, I was like, eh, I don't know. So she was just call her and hear her out. So I got her phone number and I called the, I called the agent. And, um, I talked to her on the phone and I was like, Hey, my name's Matt Cox. I said, you know, she answered the phone and I, I, this, you know, agent called her on and she said, yeah. And I said, this is Matt Cox. And she was like, Oh wow, Mr. Cox, how'd you get my phone number? I told her, Susan gave it to me. She told you me, you wanted to talk to me. And she goes, yeah. I said, well, what can I do for you? And she said, well, I want you to turn yourself in. I said, yeah, that's not going to happen. And, and she said, well, let's not be too hasty. Uh, she said, maybe we can work something out. And I said, okay, well, what are we working out? I said, how much time am I looking at? She goes, that's not how it works. You have to turn yourself in and we'll take that into consideration. I was like, yeah, I'm not doing that. So she and I went back and forth and we started arguing back and forth. And, and she was like, look, you're going to get caught. And, I, and she said, we're going to catch you eventually. You're, we're, we're definitely going to catch you. You'll never get away with this. And I, by this point, it had been like a year and a half. And I was like, well, what do you mean you're going to catch me? I said, I mean, what's taking you so long? Like, if you know, you know where I'm at, come get me. And she said, remember she said, we're, we're 90% as sure of where you are. And I said, well, only a hundred percent counts. And so, you know, we had done stuff like we had left when we, we, we abandoned a car one time, this Audi that I had, we abandoned it when we left Atlanta, we left that car in Atlanta in a police substation. And in the car, we left Lyra and the book Spanish for Dummies. So, and a brochure for like a, span, a, a, a hotel in Spain. So, you know, they then you would read the newspaper and like CNN would say, and the CNN website would say that they're believed to be in Spain, you know, so, you know, or they're believed to be in Cuba or, you know, that kind of thing. So we, we were leaving like these, these blind alleys, like they had no idea where, where we were. And so I'm, I'm talking to her and I said, look, you're, you're never gonna, you're not gonna catch me. And she was like, well, you're cocky, you know, aren't you? And I said, listen, I said, I'm, I'm, so that I'm, I'm I, I am cocky, but I'm not stupid enough to just turn myself in and hope for the best. So I remember she said, at some point, you're going to go back to, you're going to go back to Tampa or somebody's going to recognize you and they're going to turn you in. And, and I said, listen, I said, there's nobody in Tampa that I'm, I'm, I want to go back to see. I said, I'm not, she, oh, and she said, or you're going to get pulled over and the police are going to uh, arrest you. I said, I said, there's nobody I'm planning on going back to seeing it in Tampa, I said. And as far as someone recognized me, I said, nobody's going to recognize me. I've had tons of plastic surgery. I don't even look like the same person. I said, and on top of that, I said, I just, I said, I've already gotten like five different tickets from police. I went to traffic school as another guy one time because I was going to, I'd gotten so many tickets in his name and his driver's license. He was going to lose his, he was going to lose his license. So I said, you're not, I said, and as far as some cop, I said, so he recognized me. I said, man, I've got passports. I said, I, I just got back from a trip. I've, I've been in and out of the country. Like you're never going to talk to me in person ever unless we work out a deal. So she said, give me some time. Let me call the U.S. attorney. I'll find out what, what I can get you. And I said, okay. And she said, what's your phone number? I'll call you back. Which was funny because, you know, obviously she had my phone number. I was just like, I said, yeah, listen. I said, I'm, I'm, I'm not. I'm just going to shut off the phone. I go, you're probably like triangulating this call right now. And I remember she said, she goes, get over yourself. You're not that important. And I remember thinking, 
yeah, bro, like, like this isn't CSI. Like, they're not tracking your phone call. Like, what, what, what are you even thinking? Like, that's just silliness. You're not, you're nobody. But something in me told me, you know what, just shut the phone off. And I went, you know, I said, I'll call you back in, a, in like an hour. She goes, okay. And I shut the phone off and turned it off. Now, I later found out she immediately called the U.S. Marshals. They immediately tracked the phone. They called the local U.S. Marshal's office. They found out that the phone had just been, that it was shut off, but it had just been sold at a, um, at a gas station. And in the gas station, there was a subway station, you know, subway subs, you know, and I was actually sitting in the subway sandwich station, uh, subway stand, uh, subway sandwich shop, eating a subway sandwich, playing on my laptop while I was talking to her. So they immediately had two agent, two, uh, two U.S. Marshals jump in a car and head that way. I waited there another, I'd say 30, 45 minutes. I finally got him, I finally thought, you know what, I'm gonna call her, but I'll call her from the road. So I got in my, in the U-Haul and I started driving and I was driving down the road and they, those two U.S. Marshals showed up and I had just left. I was on the interstate headed towards North Carolina. And the reason I was going to North Carolina was like, I'm driving a U-Haul truck. I needed to get a vehicle and I had a vehicle in my apartment complex. So I was just going to get that vehicle. Even though I knew that the police in South Carolina knew what kind of vehicle I was driving. And by this point, I knew they had, they had figured out where that vehicle was registered to and they probably knew the address, but the vehicle was in the parking garage. So I thought I could get to it. I wasn't going to the apartment. So I'm still driving the car and I call back the, call the FBI agent back. Because by this point, she should have talked to the U.S. attorney. So I call her up and she says, she actually hadn't talked to the U.S. attorney. I, I actually had to call her back. But regardless, when I eventually talked to her, I talked to her and I said, hey, what's going on? She said, okay, I talked to Robert Mazakowski. That was the name of the uh, U.S. attorney in Tampa. And he said he can get you seven years if you cooperate. And I was like, seven years? And I was like, listen, that was seven years for what I had done in Tampa. And I said, does that include Atlanta and some other stuff? I was thinking South Carolina, which she didn't even know about. I said that some other stuff I've done, like you know, in Atlanta, is that including Atlanta and some other stuff? She was, look, you show up and, and, and we'll, we'll work it out. I said, okay, well, she said, seven years. I go, seven years for everything? She said, look, she said, if you, when you come, she goes, I can meet you at your parents' house and I can arrange for you to see your, your, your parents and your son. And then I went, okay, well, I, I appreciate that. She goes, I'll let you hang out there for like a couple hours so you guys can all spend some time together before we put you in custody. I said, okay, um, I don't know. She said, look, she said, you know, everybody's already cooperated against you. And I said, yeah, I said, and this is going to include everything. She said, look, what's important is that, you know, you have to turn yourself in before this gets out of control. Somebody might try and apprehend you. You could get hurt. And I was like, oh, I'm not worried about that. And I said, look, why don't I go to Atlanta? I said, I'm closer to Atlanta than I am Florida. I said, and we need to work on the seven years. You got to call this guy back. I can't do seven years. And she said, look, you have to turn yourself in in Tampa. And I went, okay, but Atlanta's closer. Like I would hate to be on my way back to Tampa and get pulled over and get arrested. And she said, no, she said, you, you can't go to Atlanta. And I went, well, what, the, what, what am I? I said, you know what? I, it dawned on me. I said, you know, I've asked you like three different times if this deal includes everything. You said it did. No, I, I said, I, I said, but you haven't, you haven't said it, it includes everything. I said, I'm asking, does this deal include Atlanta and some stuff, a few million dollars in fraud that you don't even know about yet? Does it all include all of it? I said, I keep asking you this and you haven't said yes. And she went, listen, we're going to catch you eventually. And I went, oh, fuck. I said, well, what does the deal include? She goes, it just includes Tampa. But I can call the other districts. I can call the, the uh, I can call the, the, call it the Atlanta U.S. attorney. And I realized they wanted seven years for the 11 and a half million I'd stolen in Tampa. Didn't include the money, the half a million dollars that I'd stolen in 
um, in uh, in Atlanta. It certainly didn't include the you know 1.3 million I just you know defrauded uh, the banks out of in in Columbia, South Carolina. So I mean that's almost two million dollars more money. Like I've got some it's, there's some issues. Like I'm going to do way more than seven years at this point. You know, and I'd been on the run for a year and a half. And God knows how much more money they'd figured out now that they'd been investigating everybody. Like the 11, one of my scams was 11 million, but that didn't include all the money that was, all the money, all the fraud that we had done at the mortgage company, which ended up being about 40 or $50 million more money that I was luckily never charged with. So I was, I just, I remember thinking, this is nuts. Like they're gonna give me 10 or 15 years. And I went, are you fucking serious? And she goes, look, she said, I can call the Atlanta prosecutor. I can work this out. I said, you know what, lady? I said, I wouldn't believe you if you told me water was wet. And I threw the phone out the window. Hey, I hope you're enjoying the video. Wanted to let you guys know one of the ways I pay for all of this is through Patreon subscriptions. So if you join my Patreon at the top tier, you get a different painting every single month. The contact information for Patreon is in the description box. Back to the video. So I drove all the way to Charlotte. I got to Charlotte. I, I remember I dropped off the, uh, dropped off the um, U-Haul and got a taxi back to the apartment. They didn't have Uber back then. So I got a taxi back to my apartment in uh, downtown Charlotte. And I remember thinking to myself, I was gonna retrieve my vehicle. I had an Infiniti. I was gonna, I was gonna re retrieve the Infiniti. And I, I remember thinking that by now they've gotta know where I am. Like the FBI has to know where I am. So I end up, going into the apartment building and I go up to the, I go up to the garage and I'm staring at my car I'm like looking at all the other cars because I really felt like they was gonna they were watching the car but I kind of walked around a little bit and looked and nobody was there I got in the car backed it out and drove down the parking garage and drove right out on the street and I was like yes I'm good I'm clear there's nobody here so I pull up and I park right in front of a Starbucks that was kind of catty corner to the apartment complex it was kind of right around the corner and I was like, I gotta, things are good. Things are looking up. I've got a, I've got a parking space right in front of Starbucks. Let me get some Starbucks and then I'm gonna head, I'm gonna head out of, uh, of Charlotte. So I go in the Starbucks and I, I ring up, or I go in Starbucks and I, I order a, a I order a, a, a coffee and, or whatever, like a latte or whatever you wanna call it, grande or venti vanilla latte or something. Anyway, so I order a cup of coffee. They ring it up and I pay. And as I'm waiting, I notice that there's two people from the apartment complex staring right at me. And they're looking at me and they're, they're like chattering away. They look very nervous. And I remember, this is like the fourth or the fifth of the month. And I hadn't paid my rent because I, I was abandoning the apartment. So I'm not paying a thousand or $2,000 worth of rent someplace for a one bedroom or two bedroom, whatever it was, it was like a two bedroom. Uh, I wasn't gonna pay that. Uh, when I'm abandoning it, but they're freaking out. So I'm like, oh, they, they recognize me. And all of a sudden the girl, the woman bolts out the back of the Starbucks. So what I didn't know was that the US Marshals were actually interviewing people at the apartment complex and they just interviewed those two people. And then they left and came to get coffee. So the Marshals were still at the apartment complex. She runs back to the apartment complex and, tell, and and the marshals are there and says, he's across the street at the Starbucks. And she tells them where the Starbucks is. And they, they run out of there and they, they start running towards the Starbucks. I get my coffee. The guy from the apartment complex gets his coffee. He follows me outside. I get in my car and he's standing on the sidewalk staring at me. He's like holding like a bunch of, a tray full of a bunch of coffees. And he's just staring at me. I remember I put my seatbelt on like, I don't know what's going on. I put my seatbelt on, put my coffee up. I checked the, you know, checked the, 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 remember CDs? There were CDs. So I checked the CDs. I get a CD going. I, you know, I'm checking my lights. I look down, make sure there's no cars coming. I'm about to pull out. And all of a sudden the guy on the, on the sidewalk starts screaming. He's right here. He's right here. He's right here. He actually drops the cup of coffee while he's pointing. 
drops the co- all the coffees. They hit the fucking ground. I look in the rearview mirror, and there's two U.S. Marshals, and they actually weren't even dressed. They were dressed in like suits. Like whenever you see them in TV, on TV, like they always have like a a windbreaker or something on. These guys were actually in suits, and they're running down the street towards the back of my car. And just so happened, I just checked the street. Nobody was coming, and I I realized like I don't know who they are. I thought they were FBI or Secret Service or something. I hit the gas, boom, take off and shoot in, shoot into, uh, down the road and into traffic and boom, I'm gone. I didn't know who those people were until later when I ordered the Freedom of Information Act and I actually got the U.S. Marshal report that says that they were there and that they'd almost apprehended me. And they immediately called in a bolo on my vehicle and I like it has the vehicle tag and everything. Like they're looking for the vehicle. I ended up driving straight down the street, about two miles down the street, and there was a homeless place. I, as I'm driving by the homeless place, I see these three white guys in their 30s. That's hard to come by. So I swing around, I park, jump out with my clipboard, which I had in the back of the car, and I walk over and I immediately survey those three homeless guys, and I end up getting their information. And one of those guys' name was, um, God, his name was. Joseph Carter, Mar- no, Joseph Marion Carter Jr. And I got his information. I got all three of their information, but as as Joseph Marion Carter Jr., I went to to I went to Nashville, Tennessee, and I got there, and I immediately went and got business. I immediately went and got a cell phone, got business cards made for. As a, like, as a, I forget what I said I was. I was like a acquisition acquisition specialist and then I worked for a company called Manufactured Funding Group. And I got an HQ account, an address, a cell phone. I got business cards made. I drove through this really nice neighborhood and I saw an old guy. I remember I saw an old guy who was putting a sign in his front yard that said apartment for rent. And this was a nice, this is an area called um, Green Hills in uh, Nashville. It's where like all the uh, celebrities live. Just happened to be renting out an apartment uh, in a duplex that was beside his house. And I pulled in in my car and I got out and I said, hey, I'm, I'm interested in uh, possibly renting the duplex or the, the, the apartment, two bedroom, two and a half bath little townhouse, side-by-side town, like a townhouse style duplex. There was two units. Walked in, looked at it, came back, and I said, hey, looks great. And uh, I'll definitely, I'll take it. And I said, "Uh, do you need to pull my credit or what do you need to do? And he looked at me, he looked me up and down, he looked at my vehicle and he said, nah, I'll take first month and last month deposit. He goes, you look like a nice young man. You look trustworthy. And I said, okay. And I remember thinking, I'm gonna like Nashville. They're very trusting here. So I just rented the duplex from the old man in Green Hills. And I was still driving, I was still driving my Infinity. That's right. So I I remember I ordered Marion Carter. I remember Carter's, I got Carter's birth certificate, and I got his um, I went and got, I went and got a new social security number in his name and I ordered some secured credit cards, but I didn't have a driver's license. So, but, but I did, I registered to vote in his name and I had a lease in his name. So I have a lease. I've got a lease. I've got his birth certificate. I have a social security card. I've registered to vote in his name. I have his transcripts for his driving record. And I took all of that and I went to the local DMV and I got a driver's license. I remember I had to take the driving test. I had to take the driving test in the Infinity. Did I say Lexus? It was Infinity. It was an Infinity. So in the Infinity that was the that the police were currently looking for. I even took the driving test and I almost failed the driving test. I remember I was clicking through because, you know, every I've taken driving tests in a bunch of different states, but every every state's different. And they asked several questions on for like uh, 
driving while intoxicated. And I remember I missed several questions. I also missed the question where it shows a picture of a sign and it has people walking. And I thought, oh, that's pedestrian. It's a pedestrian zone. But it wasn't because of some, one of the guys had a briefcase and it was a business zone. Missed that. So I missed like three or four questions. I was like, oh my God, I almost failed. I remember when I went up to get my license, I go, I, I told the woman, I said, I almost failed. And she goes, I know. She goes, you were one, point, one question away. So I got my driver's license. I then jumped into the Infinity and I drove the Infinity all the way back to. Th- now keep in mind, the police are looking for the Infinity now. There's a bolo out for the Infinity. I drove all the way back to Nashville and I left it in long term parking because I didn't want it to be found. Nashville. All the way back to Charlotte, North Carolina. I didn't want it to be found in Nashville. I wanted the car to be found in Charlotte in long-term parking. So I, I parked it. I then waited a little bit and I, I bought a ticket and flew back to Nashville. Uh, and then I went to, I don't, I think it was, it was like CarMax or Nations or something. They, they have these, diff, they, had, they had, it was like CarMax. Anyway, I went to this dealership and I walked in. Keep in mind, this guy, I, I've got three secured credit cards in his name. I've ordered them, but I, I hadn't even gotten the cards yet. Like we're talking about within days, I just ordered the cards. So he's got a credit profile, but there's no credit at all. But it's not bad credit. I went to like, whatever it was, like Nations Cars or Car, Car Max or something. I walk in there and I said, listen, man, I need to get an SUV. And I need some kind of first-time buyer's program. They go, well, we have one. You have to put down 20% and you cannot buy a vehicle for more than $20,000. I said, let's go find one. So we went and found one and it was a Nissan Pathfinder or something. So I got like a $20,000 Nissan Pathfinder. I put down $4,000. I gave them a W, I gave them a W2 and a pay stub. They called to verify my employment. I answered the cell phone, verified my own employment and they gave me a, uh, I got the car right then. So I drove the car home. So I drove the car home. I'm now, I've now got a new vehicle. I've got an apartment. I've got a driver's license. I applied for a passport. I got my passport. I've got, but I'm, I'm burning through the money quick. I remember I got some furniture and I realized, of course, you know, at this rate, um, I'm burn, already burning through money. I don't have a job. So I don't have a lot to do. I don't know anybody in Nashville. Uh, I'm working out, you know, once or twice a day. I'm, you know, I, I don't have much. To, I, I don't have anything to do. I'm, you know, I'm going to Starbucks. I go work out. I walk around the mall. I come back. I, I mean, there's just nothing to do, right? So I start driving around and looking at real estate because I figure I'm going to run another scam. I'm going to get a few million dollars and just. I was just going to leave. Like I was just going to leave the United States and just, it, 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 at this point, things are bad. Like if you punched in Matthew Cox into, into Google, it, everything that came up was, you know, fraud, fraud, fraud. And, and by this point, there were several articles about me having been caught in South Carolina by the police and that they, they let me go. That wasn't good. There was more and more articles about that. It was becoming more and more sensational. The Chicago Tribune started running a series called The Fugitive. Uh, it, it, was, it was just not good. It's not a good situation. So I, I, I ended up dating, though. I was bored, so I ended up going on a couple of dating websites, and I started dating a bunch of different women. I dated a chick named uh, Brittany Sutherland. I dated a bunch of different girls. Like I go over it in the book. I think I I have like a whole chapter on just the insane women I started dating. This went on for like four or five months. Well, while that was happening, I also went and I started, I found an area of Nashville that I liked where the houses were going for, I mean, they were just dirt cheap. They're going for they're going for forty thousand. If they were renovated, if a house was renovated, you could get it for sixty-five or seventy thousand dollars. It was just that. That was how bad this area was. So I go in the area. I end up talking one owner into owner financing me the property. Her house was so bad it was going for like 
she wanted like 19 grand or 15 grand, 15, 16 grand, 19 grand. I forget. It was cheap. I have the, the exact numbers in, in my book. But I ended up getting her to own her finance. I gave her like four or five, like three or four thousand dollars down and have her finance like something like 10 or 15 thousand dollars. So then I find another guy who buys and sells houses, he flips houses. I buy, convince him to owner finance three houses. You have to understand, I convince them to owner finance the house by saying, look, I'll give you 5% down or 10% down or 20% down. But I tell them like, I don't want to buy your house. Like this one guy, his houses were renovated. They were all selling for about 65,000. One was going for 75,000. So I think it was like two were 65,000, one was 75,000, regardless. I say, look, I'll, I need you to owner finance the, the houses. For him, I said, I need to close on all three houses on one, on one HUD statement. That way, all of the houses end up getting recorded for like $210,000 or something outrageous. Was that the one I did that with? No, that was another transaction. Anyway, for him, I, I, for the woman that I got to do it, I told her I wanted to record the sale of the home at like $150,000, even though I was buying it for like 20. So for, let's say, $150,000, and I wanted to, um, I wanted a construction credit on the house for like 130000 and I would pay the doc stamps. So it gets recorded for $150,000. I paid the extra doc stamp. So in sa- the sale ends up showing up in public records as being a sale for $150,000. And I think it was like one fifty two dollars or one fifty four. dollars It was roughly around there. The other three properties, I get this guy. I end up, I didn't do them all in one closing statement. I had each one, I added like a hundred and some odd thousand dollars to each sale. So one got, one was, came in at like 190,000. One came in at like 175 and the other ones came in at like 175. Well, I did, all of these houses were within about three or four blocks of each other. So what, obviously, if you've been watching, what that ended up doing was I could now use that one property, you know, each house, I could use the other houses as comparable sales. I immediately refinance those houses and pull out like 100,000 on this house, 120 on this one, 90,000 on this house. So I, I refinance those houses. Now I'm flush with cash again. I have like 30, I mean, I'm sorry, 30. I have like 300, $350,000. So now I'm, I'm, I'm doing okay. So I start buying more houses in the area because, you know, I don't have anything else to do and it's just what I do. So, I, and I need to get a few million. So I need to buy 20 or 30 properties. I figure I can refinance all those properties in multiple names. At this point, I'm starting to build additional credit profiles for additional synthetic identities. But I'm also dating. I end up meeting this girl named Amanda Gardner. So I, I meet Amanda and Amanda and I start dating and she she thinks I'm like this just super successful real estate guy. So I ended up buying a house in that same neighborhood where I was buying all the other houses. I buy this one, this one house and I renovate it. I renovate it. It's super nice. I've got hardwood floors. It's really, really nice. And but I'm, I'm buying other houses too. I'm continuing to drive the value of this area up through the roof while I'm building other identities. I end up meeting Amanda. Amanda and I hit it off right away. I mean, what's not to hit out? What's not to like? I mean, she's she sees me. I've, I'm a decent looking guy. I've got a ton of money. She had just gotten out of the military. She had a son named Cameron. Uh, he was a cute little kid. Um, he... You know, he liked me. Amanda loved me. She moved in with me right away. I mean, right away, within weeks or months, she was living in my house. And keep in mind, too, she's she's broke. So I, I look like a savior to her. And I'm buying her whatever she wants. Uh, I got her and bought her a new car. She's got new clothes. Granted, we live in a shit in a shithole area, but we also I I also own at this point eight to ten houses in the area. I'm buying vacant lots. Within six months, I'm, I'm building brand new houses. And, and she, she quit her job. She's helping me now. So I, I remember one of the houses, like the, really to be honest, this is funny. The, one of the first houses I refinanced, one of the first houses I, I, I refinanced. So going back a little bit, I, I remember I had bought these houses 
just the first four houses I bought before I refinanced anything. Bought the houses, recorded the value high. And what was so funny about that was um, I ended up um, I ended up putting these signs on the houses. I put these I made these banners that said Nashville Restoration Project. So I made these banners and I stuck them on every one of the houses. I renovated the houses so they looked really good on the outside. Like they didn't look great inside. They look like crap. But I put these banners and the banners said, you know, Nashville Restoration Project, Nashville Restoration Project over and over again. And then along the side of it, it would have like Nashville Restoration Project.com. And then I designed a website. I got a ton of before and after photos from properties. I took pictures of the entire neighborhood. I really dressed up the website. I mean, it looked great. I even used the same exact color scheme as as uh, the city's future comp plan. So every city has a future comprehensive plan for what they want their city to look like in the future. And typically they work in conjunction with different developers. So I basically said I was one of those developers. The other thing I said on the website was that this area in Nashville was called J.C. Napier. That was the na- subdivision. That was the name of the area. And it was right next to the J.C. Napier projects. So the problem with that is that um, there was the, there was obviously that this is right next to the project. So you can imagine the kind of area this is. So on my website, I specifically said that the projects were scheduled to come down within the next two years. They were currently vacating the the projects. So if you went, if you looked up Nashville Restoration Project or you went to the website, you got all this information that said this entire area was being, was going through gentrification or being revitalized. The city was dumping a ton of money into it. Developers were coming in there. It was work. We were working in conjunction with the with the future comp plan with the city and that the projects were coming down within the next year or two, 18 months to two years. So, uh, and, and there's a ton of photos of all these houses being renovated. Anyway, uh, what I ended up doing was I refinance one of the houses and I con- and when the appraiser comes out, I go to meet him at one of the houses. So I go out there and I said, so, uh, w- you know, we, we, he measures the whole house. I said, well, what do you think? And he looks at the house and he was a grumpy old guy and he kind of looked at the house and he goes, ah, you know, it's, it's, it's not bad. It's not too bad. And I said, what do you think it's going to come in? What do you think it's worth? And he goes, what did you pay for it? And I said, I paid like a hundred and I think I paid like $180,000 for it. And he looked at the house and he goes, you know, a year ago, I'd have said this thing was worth fifty or sixty thousand. I went, really? He said, yeah, but you know, since the he has since the uh, the Nashville Restoration Project has come in this area, he has this whole area is going up through the roof. There's comparable sales popping up all over the place. There's um, he has there's he has, there's comparable sales popping up all over the place. Uh, it's he said the whole he said the, the the whole area is going up through the roof. He goes, I I'd say this this thing's worth at least 180, 185,000, whatever he ended up saying. And I just remember thinking, fuck, that's awesome. It was great because he bought it. He'd he'd obviously go, and I knew he went to the website because he told me he goes, you know the projects are coming down. And I was like, really? And he goes, Yeah, he said the projects are coming down. And then I remember, I'll never forget, he said this. He said, you know. I said, Jace, I said, Nashville Restoration Project. I said, really? I said, and what is that anyway? And he goes, yeah, it's, it's one of these big developers. They work with the city. They come in and they revitalize an entire area. He said, you know, they did the same thing in Germantown about 10 years ago. I go, really? He goes, oh yeah, Nashville Restoration Project went in there. They revitalized the entire area. You can't buy anything in Germantown now that's not worth less a million dollars. He goes, you hold on to this place. You're going to easily double your money in the next year or two. I was like, wow, thanks. Like he totally added that whole thing like that wasn't anything i said i didn't know about germantown i didn't know anything even about the area he threw that in there so that house that's one of the first houses i refinanced which i always thought was hilarious because what i did was i went into that area bought up all those houses and put signs on every single house that said Nashville Restoration Project. And then of course i kept recording the value of these houses higher and higher. So within a couple of within a year 
These things are everywhere. There's 20 properties that are worth over $200,000. I can refinance these things anytime and get two or $3 million easily. Hey, I hope you're enjoying the video. And if you're interested in buying a painting from me, my contact information is in the description box. Back to the video. So I'm dating Amanda. Everything's going good. Um, I've built up several synthetic identities and we'd been dating about a year and the relationship was going great. Uh, we start seeing, so this is what's comical. One of the chicks that I had gone on a date with was a chick named uh, Trina. I went on a date with Trina and we went out one time and I just wasn't interested. She had, like, typically I like a southern accent, but she had this really, really bad, almost like a Kentucky southern accent, which is way different than a Florida or Georgia southern accent, which to me I find sexy. Trina's was not sexy. And so we went out, we went to, uh, I remember when we went to go see the movie The Dukes of Hazards, which she wanted to go see. So we went to go see it, and afterwards... Like, I didn't even try and kiss her or anything. I just wanted to get out of there. I wasn't interested. I got my car and left. Well, Amanda and I were dating. And at one point, Amanda says to me, you know, you know, at, you know how it is. You, you're sleeping with a chick and you've been sleeping with her for a while and uh, six months or something. And, and she, Amanda ended up saying, have you ever thought about being with another woman? You know, me and another woman. And I was like, yeah, I, I mean, I guess I, I would be willing to do that, you know, out of love for you. Um, so she says, well, I would be interested. And so Amanda, you know, Amanda starts looking. Amanda starts looking on the website. Um, shit, it's called uh, Match.com. She starts looking for other women. So she comes across Tr uh, Trina. And I remember looking at Trina's profile and being like, holy shit, I went out with that girl. And she says, no, you didn't. I said, I swear to God, I went out with her. I said, flip through her pictures. There's a picture of her leaning against a Corvette and another one where she's running a marathon. Sure enough, that was her. And I was like, I went out with her. She goes, what happened? I told her, I kind of blew her off. She sent me a couple of emails at, or a couple of text messages afterward. And I just never responded. So Amanda hits her up, asks her if she wants to meet. They go to a lesbian bar because it turns out that Trina was was gay. They go to a lesbian bar. Amanda and her end up making out in, a car, in the car. She mentions me, asks if she would be interested in all of us getting together. Trina says yes. We all end up going to dinner. Trina comes back home. You can imagine what happens. So what ends up happening is we all, we all start to hang out together, right? Like we're going to festivals. We're going to movies. Trina's coming over every once in a while. Like things are good. Life is good. Uh, I've got tons of money. We're building new houses. We're re renovating houses. And everything is going good. Well, then one day, Amanda ends up going online. Well, I'm, okay, that's not how it happened. So here's what happened is at one point, Amanda ends up finding... I had a corporate lawyer that had incorporated all of these several uh, corporations because obviously I can't just dump all this money in my account. You have to kind of launder it through different accounts. So, and, I, and those accounts actually were in Amanda's name. So what ends up happening is I, the corporate lawyer contacted me one day and asked me to send her something. I sent it to her, never heard, or, you know, she never got it for some reason. So she called back and she called Amanda and said, hey, I never got this document. So I told Amanda, go on my computer and look in Word, here's the name of the document. Well, when Amanda did that, she ended up seeing a, finding a letter that I, the letter that I had written to my parents the day I left Tampa, two years earlier, two and a half years earlier. She finds that letter, she reads the letter, she looks up who Matt Cox is, she sees a tons of, ton of articles, she spends the whole day reading articles. By the time I get home that night, I walk in, I'm like, hey, what's going on? And She's like, oh, everything's fine. Everything's fine. She says nothing. I end up going on my computer. And when I go to do, to close out all of the programs, I see that Word is open. When I go to click on Word to close it, I see the last thing that had been open was the letter to my parents. And obviously, I hadn't opened it in a year and a half, two, in like two years. So 
I was, I realized, holy shit, she read it. So then I go and I look at my history and boom, there's nothing but all these articles on Matt Cox, Matt Cox, Matt Cox, Matt Cox, wanted, wanted, wanted. So I, I go in and I said, Jesus, God almighty. I said, did you, what did you do? And she was like, and she, she immediately realizes that I know she breaks down. She starts crying. She says, I'm sorry. I had no idea. I, I didn't mean to. I said, well, I have to leave. So I can't stay here if you know who I am. If anybody knows who I am, like it's dangerous for me. She begs and pleads and cries and says, please don't leave. Please don't leave. I'll never, I'll never tell anybody. I'll never tell anybody. And the truth is I was like totally in love with this chick. I thought she was amazing. She was great. So I stayed. So she knows my name, true name is Matt Cox, not Carter, not Joseph Carter, which is bad for me. Um, we end up seeing Trina. Everything's going good. One day, Amanda goes online. She was checking on Google. Just randomly, she would check my name. So she checks my name, and she sees something on Dateline. Turns out that Dateline was, was about to do an article on me. I'm sorry, an article. Dateline was about to do a news program on me. At this point, I've already been in Bloomberg Magazine has already done two articles, one about just about me and two. The second article was when they caught Becky because they had caught Becky at this point. Then I had been in Fortune Magazine had done an article on me, like a 6,000 word article. Horrible. Uh, then... So, so then she went online and she found this article about, not to mention all the St. Pete Times articles, all the Chicago Tribune, all the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. There was just one article after another. So she finds this thing about Dateline, and there's a blog about Dateline, how they're interviewing people that, have, that knew me or that know me. And they're going to do a one-hour episode on me. So I now know I'm going to be on Dateline. That's not good. Like... Local newspapers aren't a big deal. Even a national magazine or two, like the kind of people that I hang... First of all, I don't have a big circle of friends. The kind of people that know me or that I associate with aren't reading Fortune magazine. These are con contractors. Like, I'm not concerned about them stumbling across my photo in Fortune or Bloomberg. But this is Dateline. It's a tabloid. And your average blue-collar worker watches Dateline. Dateline, I don't even know if it's still out, but so I realize I'm going to be in, in living rooms everywhere and somebody's going to recognize me. I'm somebody working at Starbucks or working at Home Depot is going to say, holy shit, that guy comes in here all the time. They're going to catch me like it's a problem. So Amanda tells me about it and I go, Jesus, oh my God, this is, this is really bad. I can't stay in the United States anymore. So she and I decide we've got a month or two about two months couple months before it comes out we decide we're going to refinance all the houses pull out a few million dollars and leave the united states and at this point we started researching where to go we figure we're going to go to uh to australia and it, the nice thing about australia was australia would allow you to go to australia if you had a Okay, you, if you showed up in, in Australia with like $200,000 and a business plan to open a business in Australia, you could go there and you could be a permanent resident alien. They would give you a driver's license. They'd allow you to buy property. They would allow you to stay in their country and open a business. You could not go to Australia and get a job, but you could go there and open a, a business and hire Aussies. So I can't go there and become a citizen because if you were to go and become a citizen, they wanted you to do a background check. But I could go there and become a, with U.S. documents, if I showed up with my U.S. passport, I could become a permanent resident alien. And keep in mind, I'm, I'm living as a homeless person. I can easily become a permanent resident alien in Australia and he'll never be notified. And then if he dies someday, they're not going to turn around and notify Australia that I died. So we decide we're going to Australia. A man has researched the whole thing. I start refinancing properties. I start pulling out cash. 
as we're pulling out cash, we start asking people like my general contractor, his name was Tracy. I ask him, hey, can would you do me a favor and could you cash some checks for me? And I, he's like, yeah, sure. So I have him cash a check for like 8,000, then another check for 6,000, another check for 9,000. Then I have another guy that we worked with cash a check for 4,000, 3,000, 9,000. And then I have, so Amanda ends up giving Trina a check uh, of several checks and asks her to asks her to to cash those checks i remember amanda and i had gone we had a couple of friends uh, one was Brittany, another chick that i had dated and her new boyfriend which they just gotten married his name uh his name was brian so brian and Brittany, we went with them on their honeymoon to to venice to italy we went there for like 10 days. We did a 10-day trip. So we were gone for two, three weeks. We left and we went to Croatia. We went to Greece. Like we hung out. We went on this cruise, European cruise. And I remember we'd come back. And as soon as we came back, we hadn't been home more than a few weeks when we started asking everybody to cash checks to start pulling out money. So we're pulling out money. And we had pulled out a few hundred thousand dollars. One day I'm at home and suddenly I hear this BAM! Somebody had kicked in the front door. And it was like, oh my God. And I had I had cameras all over my house. I had cameras in the living room, dining room, outside the house. But I would go to walk out to see what happened because I remember it was so loud. I remember thinking maybe the TV had fallen. Like the flat, we had a big flat screen TV, and I thought maybe Cameron had pulled the, knocked the TV over some. I don't know. But as soon as I walked, started walking out of the the bedroom, this fucking guy, these two black guys, had kicked in the front door, comes running in, and he sticks a gun in my face, and he goes, "Get on the ground, get on the ground." So I go, "Oh Jesus!" So I get on the ground. They lead Amanda in the room. She gets on the ground. Cameron gets on the ground. They throw a blanket over us. They rob the whole house. They grab some. I, I, I mean, literally, I'm like, bro, what do you want? You know, they're, they're, they're like, shut up, shut up. I'm like, what do you want? And they said, you know, where's the money? Where's the money? I said, bro, there's money here. Like I told them where there's some money here. There's some money here. We had some money in the refrigerator or in the freezer. I didn't say that. I told them to get the money out of that. They, we had a, a, a gun safe, which was Amanda's gun. And they grabbed the gun safe. They grabbed our Rolexes. They grabbed a couple of... Uh, Cartier watches and stuff and some jewelry and then they grabbed oh they grabbed the keys to I think Amanda's truck and they jumped in her truck and took off hey sorry for interrupting the video but want to let you guys know that if you join my patreon at the top tier every single month you get a different painting and the contact information for my patreon page is in the description back to the video no do they take my truck I don't know, they stole one of our vehicles. So we immediately sit up and uh, as soon as they're gone, we call the police. Police show up and the guy, the cop's like, I'm like, hey, I got a video of it. But they had ski masks on. Um, so the cop comes and he's, I remember he told me, look, you need to find another place to live. You you can't, you, you, you guys can't stay here. Like you can't stay in this neighborhood. You know, I said, I, I told him I own like 20 houses in the neighborhood. I own another five or six lots. We're building new houses. He said, I don't care. He says, what these guys didn't steal this time, they'll just come back and steal. So I said, okay. So we ended up going to a hotel. Well, I didn't, they had taken my, my wallet. So I didn't have my driver's license or my, they took my, a bunch of stuff. I didn't have anything in my name. So they took all my stuff. All I had was, a passport in the name Walter Holcomb. So they took my Joseph Carter stuff. So I got a passport as Walter Holcomb and a driver's license in Walter Holcomb's name. So when we go and we check in to a hotel, we were there maybe a day or two. We didn't go back to the house. We were, gonna, we were just going to buy a new house and stay in the hotel. It was a really nice hotel. So we stay in the hotel. And while that's happening, Trina is calling because they took our cell phones. So we get our new cell phones back. And I remember Trina, as soon as I got it back and mine was back on, like we got a phone call. I, I got a phone call from Trina. 
And she was like, oh my God, what have you, where have you guys been? What are you doing? What's going on? Where's Amanda? What's happening? I said, Trina, calm down. I said, look, we had a home invasion and we're staying in a hotel. And, and I said, uh, she goes, what hotel? And I went, I remember thinking, what? Like, she didn't say like, are you okay? How's it? Oh my God, that's horrible. She goes, what hotel are you at? And I was like, I'm, I'm at the... Whatever hotel it was, I just told her the name of the hotel. I forget, like the, fuck, I don't remember what it was, uh, the Westing or something. So I tell her, yeah, it was this hotel. And she goes, okay, well, tell Amanda to call me because Amanda was in the shower. I go, okay, no problem. So I hang up the phone. Uh, what had happened was a couple days earlier, Trina had called the Secret Service and turned us in. And the Secret Service had gone to my old ha my house where we weren't staying and had staked out the house for the, like the day at, the day we left that night, the next day they showed up and started staking out the house. So they've been staking it out for two days and we weren't there. So she was calling to try and find out where we were. So she called the secret service back. She said, this is where they are. They sent secret service sent a team sent themselves and the marshals went to the hotel where we were. And they asked, is Joseph Carter staying here? And they said, no, because I wasn't. I was staying there as Walter Holcomb. So then Trina calls back and says, I called the hotel. You're not, there. You're not there. And I was like, it was weird. I was like, what? And at that point, I wasn't at the hotel. I, I was at, the, at our office. We had rented like a, a 10,000 square foot warehouse. And I said, look, I'm not there. I'm, she goes, are you there now? I said, no, I'm at the warehouse. Amanda was dropping off her son. And she goes, well, okay, so you're there now. Is Amanda with you? And I went, no, Amanda's dropping off Cameron. And she goes, okay, uh, I got to go. And she hangs up the phone. Like a couple minutes later, Amanda calls me. And I go, hey, what's up? She goes, Trina just called me. She goes, and I go, okay, well, what's going on? She goes, I don't know, Matt, I'm worried. I said, uh, not Matt, she said, uh, uh, Carter. She goes, I don't know, Carter, I'm worried. And I said, why? And she goes, I'm worried because she is... It, she, she said some stuff like she told me how much she loves me and cares about me and she goes it was just weird and I go she goes I'm, I'm concerned I go what are you concerned about I go if she doesn't know anything what are you worried about and she goes oh god Matt I'm so sorry and by this point I'm, I'm concerned because by this point I got a phone call from the local police and the local police asked me if I could meet them if I could meet them at the house so I'm, dri I'm now driving to the house because they wanted me to meet them at the house because they said they wanted the video of the home invasion. So I'm driving to the house. And it, when Amanda called and she's, and I'm getting in the car, I'm driving, and I'm like, yeah, well, what are you worried about? And she goes, oh my God, man, I'm so sorry. I'm worried, I'm worried. I go, what, what are you worried about? So at that point, I had just pulled up to the house because our, our place was only a couple blocks away, our office. So I pull up to the house and I'm like, well, if you're not worried... I mean, if, if you're worried, you must be worried about something. What are you worried about? If she doesn't know anything, there's no reason to be worried. And she's like, I, you know, she didn't want to tell me what had happened. But she goes, I think I might have fucked up. And I go, how did you fuck up? What are you, what are you trying to say? Like, what is going on? And by this point, I'm getting out of my car, walking to the front to my house. And a black SUV pulls up. Another SUV pulls up. Another car pulls up. Another one pulls up. And they all lock up their brakes. And I'm standing there in the middle of the street holding my cell phone when the Secret Service jumps out of their vehicles screaming, get on the ground, get on the ground, get on the ground. And obviously at that point I realized what the issue is. Amanda, I, I later found out, Amanda had told Trina who I was and Trina had called the Secret Service and turned me in. And when a, Trina called Amanda, she was basically just making sure that she wasn't with me, that she wanted her to know how much she loved her and cared about her and was trying to kind of distance herself from the situation. And I, uh, I ended up getting arrested. So Secret Service runs up to me and I remember, you know, I remember at first I thought I was getting robbed again until I saw the secret. They have these white, they're, they're all in black, but they have these white things that say Secret Service on them. So there was Secret Service was there and uh, they throw me on the ground. They're like, get on the ground, get on the ground. And I was just like numbed. I get on the ground, they 
handcuffed me, pulled me off, pulled me up, dusted me off. And I remember they're holding me and I'm just standing there. They're like, Matt Cox, are you Matt Cox? Mr. Cox. And I'm just staring at him and I'm not saying anything. And the guy looks at, he has a clipboard with my wanted poster on it and he holds it up and he's looking and another officer comes up and I remember he looked at me and he goes, is that him? Is it him? He goes, no, I don't think it. He's, oh shit, I don't think it's him, bro. And he looks at me and he goes, no, it's him, it's him. He goes, look at his eyes, it's him. And he looks at me and he goes, hey, Mr. Cox, he goes, we've been looking for you. And, I, and he goes, you are Mr. Cox. You are Matthew Cox, right? And I went, yeah, yeah, I'm Matt Cox. I mean, at that point, I, you know, I'm done, right? That officer told me, that agent told me when they had arrested, when they arrested Becky, Rebecca Halk, when they arrested her in Houston six months earlier, they said she didn't admit who she was until they put her hand on the scanner. They said she complained the whole 30-minute drive back to, they arrested her, by the way. They arrested her at school. They arrested her, and they brought her all the way back to the Secret Service's office, and she, the whole time she was there, being driven there, she goes, you guys fucked up. You're going to lose your job. I'm going to sue. You've embarrassed me. She said, they said, he goes, she didn't break until we put her hand on the scanner. And she goes, okay, I'm, I'm Rebecca Halk. So I broke immediately. Yeah, you got me. Yes, I know I'm done. So they bring me back. They handcuff me to a table. I wait. They fly the Secret Service agent from Atlanta and she flies in. I'm there for hours. And uh, they come in and they read me, you know, they, of course they read you your rights, they tell you what you're charged with and they say, we're gonna bring you back to uh, Atlanta. And uh, they brought me back to Atlanta and I went all the way back to Atlanta and that was an ordeal. And what's funny is when they called Amanda, this was weird. Like Amanda, when she found out that they had caught me, she immediately drove to the bank, went to our safety deposit box. First of all, there was cash in the box. So she doesn't pull out, she pulls out the cash, but she pulls out the passports. She keeps all the cash in the ice box and she keeps the cash in the, in the um, safety deposit box. She grabs all the fake passports that I had and driver's licenses and she brings those to the Secret Service's office and she gives them to them immediately and says, I just found these. I don't know anything. I was completely duped and don't have a clue about what who this person is. I thought his name was Joseph Carter. And she gives them all my driver's licenses and IDs and everything. She later tells them that she did know who I was but she didn't think it was a big deal. Like she, like she waits till she gets a lawyer. When she gets a lawyer, she goes in and she cooperates and she tells them who I was and what I was doing, but she had nothing to do with it. She didn't really know what was going on and it was all me and, you know, which is fine because it was pretty much all me. Um, anyway, yeah, I go back to, uh, I go back to Atlanta and I get a lawyer and I fly on Con Air, which is nothing like Con Air in the movie. And uh, it takes about a month, month and a half to get me all the way back to Atlanta because they bring you from one prison. They bring you one county jail where, or U.S. Marshals holdover where they hold you for two weeks and they hold you here for a week. Then they hold you here for two weeks and they hold you here for five days. And then, so you keep getting bussed from one place to another till you're eventually flown back to Atlanta. And I was flown back to Atlanta and I was held in the, uh, I was held in uh, Atlanta in two different jails. And uh, I get my attorney and I remember when I got, my attorney, she told me I was looking at a, a bunch of time. She didn't really know how much time, but she said, you're looking at like 15, 20 years. She didn't really know. She said that I was responsible for like 25 or $26 million in loss. The Secret Service was saying something like $40 million, 40 or $50 million in, in uh, fraud at my mortgage company. And the numbers were all over the place. And uh, yeah. So I end up taking a, a plea. I end up pleading to 26 years. And I end up getting sentenced to 
26 years in prison. And yeah, that uh, I get a, a PSI for 26. Well, actually, my, my pre-sentence report said I was 34 years or 30. Yeah, 30, 32 years. 32 years of life is what my pre-sentence report said when it eventually came out. I was interviewed by the Secret Service and the FBI. Uh, I mean, I was trying to help myself. I cooperated fully, told them everything I could think of. That by this point, they'd already indicted me in in Atlanta, in Tampa, and in uh, in Nashville. When I was interviewed by the Secret Service. That was actually comical because when I was interviewed by the Secret Service, when I first sat down, my lawyer and I sat down with the Secret Service, there were two agents there. One was Agent, agent Peacock, who's a female agent, Andrea Peacock, and the other guy was Dan Brunzowski, I think his name was, Dan Brunzowski. Brunzowski, I don't know, it's, it's in my book, it's long, it's a long one. I remember they sat down and we hadn't been there maybe five or 10 minutes when we finally, they had their stuff all arranged and they started qu questioning me. And one of the first things that Dan said was, listen, he said, I, I, we, first thing we need to go over is we need to know where all the money is. And I said, you've got all the money. What are you talking about? And he said, no, no, we know you've hidden money. And I went, hidden money? what are you talking about? Like, I haven't hidden any money. And he said, you know, we know for a fact that you have money hidden in an account. Now you're about to get an obstruction of justice charge unless you come clean with us right now. So I remember my lawyer was like, her name is Millie. Millie, she leaned and she goes, do we need to talk about this? I said, no, I said, I've gave them all the money. I gave them money in, you know, there was money in, in, in a bunch of different bank accounts that I had already given them. And I said, what are you talking about? And he pulled out several bank statements and put them in front of me, boom. And he said, you have, I think it was 200,000, roughly 200, you have $200,000 in Southern Exchange Bank of Clarksville. And I looked down and he had these, these bank statements. And the funny thing about the bank statements is, Southern Exchange Bank of Clarksville was one of the banks that I had created. So this is a bank and bank statements that don't even even exist. It's, it's, it's complete forgery. He goes, we know you've got $200,000 in that bank in the name of Walter Holcomb. And I looked at him and I went, did you call the bank? And he said, yeah, I called the bank. He goes, I've, I've left several messages. He goes, we've already subpoenaed the records. And I go, did you go to the website? And he went, yeah, I went to the website. And I go, what'd you think? He goes, what do you mean? I go, what'd you think of the website? And he goes, it's a bank website. I go, yeah, but it was, it's professional. Like, I mean, it's, you know, convincing. And he looked at me and he goes, oh, Jesus Christ. He goes, I, are you serious? He goes, are, and, and so at that point, the U.S. attorney and the other agents, my lawyer, they go, what are you talking about? And he looked at me and he goes, he goes, it's bullshit. It's all bullshit. And I go, it's all an illusion. I said, the bank doesn't exist. And he said, he goes, I can't believe, it. are you serious? I go, who did you call? He goes, I, I, I said, did any, nobody answer? He goes, no, I left messages. And I was like, I haven't paid the voicemail in months. Like I've been arrested. By this point, I've been arrested for several months. So I was like, who, how did you even leave a voicemail? And he's like, I, I left several. And I, who did you subpoena? He goes, I looked it up. It's a real bank. Now it was, there was a Southern Exchange Bank of Clarksville. I actually had opened an account there at one time in one of my fake identities names. So I had a check that had the routing number for Southern Exchange Bank. And I had used that on all the fake checks that I'd made and I'd used that on everything. So that was the number he looked up and he saw that there really was a Southern Exchange Bank. But it wasn't Southern Exchange Bank of Clarksville. And so my, the website I had created was Southern Exchange Bank of Clarksville.com. So he thought that Southern Exchange Bank and Southern Exchange Bank of Clarksville were the same thing. And he thought it was a real bank. And he actually subpoenaed Southern Exchange Bank's main office, which didn't even exist anymore because the bank had been sold to 
Sun Trust Bank or something. So, you know, he was waiting for these bank statements. So I just looked at him. And I just was like, bro, what, what's going on? And I remember he go, he said, oh, I can't believe that. And I looked at him and I remember I said, bro, you're the secret service. And I was like, I can't believe you believe this. I mean, and that was the first time I was actually embarrassed that they'd caught me. So at that point, we ended up talking. He was like, hey, who was involved? Who helped you here? Who helped you there? At, with the Secret Service, I, I wasn't able to really tell them anything, to be honest. There was very little I could tell them because they didn't enter the picture until I was on the run. So once I was on the run, it was really just me and Rebecca Houck, and she'd already told them everything. Now, there were people in Nashville that knew what I was doing, a little here, a little there, but not a ton. And, you know, I, and I did say, look, this person and this person and this person, but they had been interviewing these people, and most of these people had either already cooperated or, or they'd said they didn't know anything, and that wasn't true. But nobody in, in Nashville, I think, ended up getting indicted. So that actually was Secret Service. That went on for several days. I was interviewed with them by them for several days. So then weeks later, I was interviewed by the FBI. And that's when I met Aunt, uh, Agent Candace Calderon with the FBI. And she was the woman that I called when I was driving back from um, Texas. She was the one that I talked to on the phone. She despised me. And so she came in, and I'll never forget when I, I had the handcuffs on, right? I'd been shackled and chained and walked up to the, to the um, U.S. Attorney's Office, and I was in a, uh, in a room where they, you know, debrief you. And I remember she un, they, un, they took the chains off me, and I was rubbing my wrists, and, I, and she goes, your wrists hurt? And I was like, yeah. And she goes, get used to it. I mean, it's like she was constantly making these little snide comments. And uh, so I interviewed her. And I remember one of the first things they wanted to know was that I had actually, when I was in Tampa, I'd actually bribed a politician named uh, Michael White. And I'd also used the name. Well, this guy's name was Kevin White. I'd used the name Michael Kevin White. Because I'd seen this guy, I'd met this guy, and I'd seen his uh, signs all over the place. And so I thought it was funny because I was using all these color-coded names like red, blue, silver. And I saw white. I saw Kevin White. So I used the name Michael Kevin White. And then I ended up meeting that guy. And I ended up bribing that guy and got him elected to city council. Now, I got him elected to city council. That's a long story in and of itself. But... The point is, is I got him elected and he was going to rezone all of my vacant lots in Ybor City. But I took off on the run before any of that could happen. So they immediately were like, look, we've got tons of checks from you and these color coded names and their accounts going to his campaign contribution. And they had already talked to one of my business partners, which is a guy named David Walker. And Dave Walker had told the FBI that I had bribed this guy and helped get him elected to city council. Well, to, to the county commission. No, not county commission, city council, city council, to city council. So, um, so they asked me about that and I was like, yeah, I mean, they've got the checks. Yeah, this is what happened. I bribed the guy. I mean, I got him elected and explained all that. And she was like, did he know this? Did he know that? Yeah, he knew all that. So we talked about that. We talked about uh, the various people that were involved in the scam. Most of those people had already been indicted uh, my actual conspir my actual indictment in Tampa has a bunch of names with initials. So it's like my name and then a, it's a bunch of initials. They're unnamed co-conspirators because these are people that were cooperating. And so they indict indicted me, but they don't want to show that to anybody. So they use them. So technically they'd been indicted. Um, but all these people were also cooperating against me. So, you know, they already knew a ton of stuff. I explained exactly what happened, told them everything that happened. And that interview went on for like three days, two or three days, or maybe four days. Like, I think I was interviewed by the FBI for like three or four days. Hey, I hope you're enjoying the video. And if you're interested in buying a painting from me, my contact information is in the description box. Back to the video. So then I go back to, you know, I go back to my cell. Uh, after the three or four days, I go back and um, the... 
eventually I get my PSI. My PSI says 36, there says 32 years to life is what it says. Now, I'd also been interviewed by Dateline. At this point, Dateline had come out. The one-hour special came out, and it was horrible. It was called The Thief of Hearts. And it was the person they mainly interviewed was uh, Rebecca Halk. Rebecca basically said, look, Matt Cox is a, is a con man. He convinced me to commit crimes. I'm innocent. I didn't really know what I was doing. He's a Don Juan. He... He forced me to fall in love with him. Uh, you know, it just it was just it was just complete bullshit. But the one thing that was true that she said was, "I'm charismatic," which is true. I'm very charismatic, charming. She said, "Charming, charming" came up a lot. Anyway, uh, so what what happened with that was that Dateline had come out, but Dateline also, I'd been caught, so they wanted to interview me. So they came, they got the U.S. attorney to. Um, uh, they got the U.S. attorney to be interviewed, the Secret Service agent, and they came into the prison and they interviewed me. The U.S. attorney's office asked me to be interviewed by Dateline, which I was inv- inter- I was interviewed by them. I didn't want to be interviewed, but they told me if you're interviewed, we'll consider it substantial assistance. Substantial assistance means you've cooperated with the government and they can reduce your sentence as a result of it. They said if you're interviewed, we'll consider it substantial assistance. So I was interviewed by them. I was also interviewed by the FBI and the Secret Service, which also was supposed to be considered substantial assistance. They said, we'll consider that substantial assistance. Fine. So the night before I'm about to be sentenced, I call my lawyer and I said, hey, what's going on? How much time am I going to get? Because I have a pre-sentence report that says 32 years to life. Now, we had negotiated after I got that 32 years to life. I was like, well, I'm not going to plead guilty. I want to take my plea back because I might as well go to trial. That's the maximum sentence you can give me is 30 years is bank fraud. Maximum you can get on bank fraud is 30 years. Max, and then I got an extra two years for aggravated identity theft. So it's 32 years to life. I'm like, the maximum sentence you can give me 32 years. So why would I plead guilty? I might as well go to trial. I, if, if I lose, I can only get 32 years to life. So they said, look, what do you think doesn't apply to you? So they actually sent the Secret Service agent down to the prison with my lawyer. And we argued for about 30 minutes to get it from 32 years down to 26 years and four months. But my lawyer kept telling me, don't worry. When we get in front of the judge, I'm going to argue these enhancements and I'm going to get them taken off. And you're going to end up with 13 years, 12, 12 to 13 years. Okay, so the night before my sentencing, we've already agreed to 26 years and four months, but I'm supposed to get, I'm also supposed to get a sentence reduction and my lawyer is going to argue to reduce my enhancements. So I call her up and I said, hey, what did the U.S. attorney say? And she says, oh, Matt, I'm so sorry. They're not going to recommend a reduction in your sentence, they're going to recommend you get 26 years and four months. But don't worry, I'm going to argue the enhancements and you're probably going to end up with 12 or 13 years. I was like, why wouldn't, why aren't they going to recommend that I get a reduction? I was interviewed by the FBI, by the Secret Service, and I was interviewed by Dateline. And she said, I know, but Matt, nobody's been arrested. And that's really what a reduction is, where you cooperate and someone's been, someone's been arrested. And nobody's been arrested on your case by in, based on anything that you said. But don't worry, they're going to investigate and those people will be arrested. And at that time, they'll reduce your sentence. So tomorrow, you're probably going to get into 12 or 13 years. And then later, when you get to prison, your sentence will probably be cut down again, maybe even by half. And I thought... Oh my God. I mean, first of all, it doesn't really matter what I thought. That's what was happening. Like you can't say, oh, forget it. I don't want to be sentenced. No, you're going to sentencing tomorrow. So you just deal with it. So the next day I go to sentencing. I'm led into the courtroom. The U.S. attorney goes on and on and on about all of these. Mr. Cox did this. Mr. Cox did that. She provides like a 40 page timeline of all these things that I had done once I went on the run it's 42 pages of fraud not including a small summary of three or four pages from when I was in Tampa and that's the bulk of my crime was in Tampa 
So plus I got my PSI. My PSI is like 52 pages, which is massive. Most PSIs are five pages, 10. Um, anyway, I get in front of the judge. U.S. attorney says that I'm a complete scoundrel, scumbag, uh, con man, can't be trusted, have to be taken out of society to protect society. My attorney gets up and says that he's really just, he's just a misunderstood guy. Uh, and, uh, you know, the judge read some letters from my friends and family. I remember my uncle wrote a letter. And he's a lawyer. And I remember he said to the judge that Mr. Cox is an extremely disturbed person. <laughs> and, then, and I remember thinking, like when my lawyer read it, she was like, Mr. Cox has always had problems. He's always had um, issues with, like, he, he, like this is a guy that I saw once a year, maybe. And he starts explaining that I've had, I've always had uh, emotional problems. I've always had learning disabilities. I've struggled growing up, struggled in school. And that I, I'm an extremely, uh, and, and that I, from what he can tell, I'm a disturbed person. But out of love for his sister, my mother, he's writing this letter and asking for a lenient sentence. And I mean, it was like, it was like, it was the worst letter this is a defense attorney it was the worst letter you could have possibly written from an officer of the court saying this guy has problems <laughs> that's my uncle he's a douchebag and just a complete scoundrel and scumbag and always has been really to be honest did you know this is a guy by the way this is a guy that graduated first in his class in law school Ended up being a bottom of the barrel attorney, really. Like doing wills. He does wills. He does real estate. He does some some criminal law. He does some like it's like you were the top of your class and you were doing bottom of the barrel law work. And he wrote this fucking letter that just was horrible. Like my attorney was like, you know, I don't even think I want to send this to the judge. She's like, I talked to him on the phone, like I don't understand. I tried to, she tried to call, talk to him and be like, well, what did you write? Like she called, she was so bad. My public, my, my, my um, public defender called him to be like, what did you do? This is your letter? Anyway, and she gave it to the, to the judge though. She did give it to the judge. I mean, look, it didn't matter. It didn't matter what he said because I was done. So the judge has read all these letters and the judge, I remember the judge said, that Mr. Cox, what Mr. Cox did was borderline sociopathic in nature. Oh, I mean, he, listen, I wish I had the transcript. It was scathing what he said to me. And honestly, probably pretty accurate. But that's not the point. Point, it was harsh. It was harsh. It was, you know, you see that guy on TikTok, there's emotional damage. That guy that, you know, emotion. that's how I felt. Like, oh my God, this is a federal judge. Like he really, whew, it was bad. Anyway, I ended up not getting the reduction and I ended up getting, um, I got 26 years and four months. I typically don't say 20, the four months. I typically say I got 26 years because if you say 26 years and four months, it, it sounds like I'm whining. You know, it's saying like, oh, 20, like four months, like that was overkill. But really the 26 years in general was overkill. So I got 26 years and four months. And um, yeah, I tried to, uh, you know, I've, obviously I stood up and I gave him my little, hey, oh God, did I, I didn't even tell you about my aunt. My aunt stood up and spoke for me. My aunt said it was a, she was a taxpayer and it was a waste of taxpayer money to put me in jail for, for that long. I and mean, that's not really an argument that I'm a taxpayer, Your Honor, and it's a waste of taxpayer of my tax dollars to put him in jail. <laughs> what? What? I look. She's also has a lot of money. She does. She and my my uncle uh, is extremely wealthy, and she very much feels like anyone that works for the government is like. Um, a servant, yes, thank you, perfect, yeah, is is subservient or they are someone who works for her. Like, she, these are not people that, 
you know, people of means feel like you, they, <laughs> the people who work for the government are subservient. So she's basically lecture, almost kind of came off like a lecture to the judge. Like, Your Honor, it's a waste of my money. Like, you, you need to listen up. I'm, <laughs> anyway, yeah, it was bad. Uh, so that didn't help. Uh, really, I had nobody that really helped me. Nothing, anyway, it wouldn't have mattered. It, it, the per, anybody could have stood up. They could have been perfectly eloquent. It didn't matter. My PSI said 26 years. Uh, you get 26 years. So he gave me 26 years and four months. Um, I tried to talk. I cried like a fucking small child. Uh, then on my way, after I got the 26 years and I was leaving, I don't think I, I stopped crying. Until I got to the U to down to the to the um, probably the the U.S. Marshals like the holding cell, and when I walked in, I remember there was this there's a bunch of you know there's a bunch of tough guys, but there was this one guy that was like uh, a, just this flamboyant gay guy, and when I walked in, I had just got control of myself, and I walked in, and one of the guys goes, "How much you get?" Like, they, like you go to a holding cell where you're waiting to be put on the bus to be driven back to the U.S. Marshal, to the Marshal holder. And he looks at me and goes, what'd they, what'd they give you? And I go, Tw over 26 years. And the gay guy goes, oh my God. They, <laughs> oh my God. They didn't, the, the judge didn't throw the book at you. He jumped over the, uh, he jumped over the bench and bludgeoned you to death with it. Oh my God. And I just was thinking, I mean, even even in the gay guy's voice, it sounded brutal. I mean, he did he he did the whole oh my you know, the whole way it was fucking it's just, it's just, it's just a bad day. It was a bad day. Hey, I hope you're enjoying the video. Wanted to let you guys know one of the ways I pay for all of this is through Patreon subscriptions. So if you join my Patreon at the top tier, you get a different painting every single month. The contact information for Patreon is in the description box. Back to the video. Yeah, I got 26 years, and uh, so then I go back to the, it's so funny too, because when I went back to the to the Marshall's holdover, and they dropped me off and everything, th this is funny, because I remember I got, I was, we were all let in, in, and there's like 10 of us, and we're sitting there chained up, and I remember they were calling four o'clock count, and they go, you know, Johnson, you know, Thomas, and when they got to me, they go, you know, Cox, and there was an officer Cox. Now keep in mind the staff in Atlanta, all the officers were black. So when they got to me and, and he goes, he goes, Cox. And I went here and he goes, Cox, he goes, you're not related to officer Cox, are you? And all the officers start laughing. And I go, well, my dad did get around a lot when he was younger. We may be related like that. And the officers all stopped laughing and all the inmates started laughing. Um, so yeah, they they called me out. They they called out a roll call. They brought us upstairs. I walked into the unit once again. I was in control of myself again. And when I walked in, there's about a hundred guys in that unit. And as soon as I walked in, everybody looks over at me because I'd just been on TV where they'd said I got 26 years and four months on television. Like they they my roommate told me, bro, they they it just went off television, like the six o'clock news or the five o'clock news. It just said it. And as soon as it was done, they popped the door and we all walk in and they uh, like, what time? Like a hundred guys looked at me at once, boom, and looked at me and they were just like shaking their head. Boom. I immediately start crying again. Immediately hit me again. So I go to my cell. I walk in. I have like maybe 10 guys come in going, bro, it's going to be okay. It's okay. You're, you're going to be okay. You can appeal it. You can this, you can that. All of that's not true. Um, but, you know, there's the things that people tell you to try and, you know, get you through it and make themselves feel better, I guess. Uh, so, yeah, that was a bad day. About 10 days later, I was placed on a bus and I was driven to the medium security prison at Coleman in Coleman, Florida. Coleman, Florida, the complex. There's a Coleman, Florida. It's a complex. And it's the largest prison complex in the United States. It's got two penitentiaries, which, you know, two pens. And it's got a medium security prison, a low security prison, and a camp, which at that time was a, was for females. So it was all male except for the camp, which was females. It's now male. Uh, I was placed in the medium. This is funny. When I got there, I remember, you know, they, interv they interview you. And they were interviewing me. 
And I remember the guy from SIS, which is internal security for them. They kind of, they're like the internal FBI for them. The guy was interviewing me and he goes, yeah, bro. He's like, you shouldn't even be here. Like you're at a medium security prison. Like this is for violent inmates and stuff and guys that have life sentences. And he was like, yeah, you really shouldn't even be here, Cox, but you have so much time. You have to go to a medium. You have to. Do you have to be below 20 years to go to a low? And even with good time, my out date was 2030. Like I still had 24 years to go. With no good time, my out date was like 2035 or something, or no, sorry, like 2032 or something like that. So my out date was 2030. And this was in 2006, no, 2007, because it took a year. So two, that late 2007 was when I was sentenced. Um, I was arrested um, in 2000, late 2006. So this is late 2007, I'm at the medium. And I remember the guy said, I said, hey, can I call somebody? And I called my mother. This is what a gangster my mom is, bro. So this is my mom, when I called her, she said, I said, hi, mom. And she was like, oh, Matthew, how are, are you okay? I was like, I'm fine. I said, she goes, where are you? I said, I'm, I'm at Coleman Prison. And she goes, are you at the medium or are you at the low? the fuck like i didn't even know i didn't know anything about coleman and she goes are you at the medium of the low? and i went i'm 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 at the medium and she goes she goes okay i need you to look up your your cousin reese his name is reese townsend he's jack's cousin and i went jack has a cousin in prison she goes yes she said i said well he's not my cousin and she goes well it, for, it, for all intensive purposes in this situation in prison, he's your cousin. So he works in, she goes, he works in, um, he works on the, on the, uh, he works in maintenance. She goes, he works in the maintenance crew. Uh, he's in one of the units. Ask, ask around. You'll find him. He's going to take care of you. And I was like, uh, okay. She goes, okay, I'll be up to see you in about, a, in about a, a few weeks. I have to get placed on your visitation list. Like my mom knows how prison works better than I do. Within a couple of days, I find, I tra uh, Reese tracks me down and uh, my mom shows up a couple of weeks later. I remember the first day, I'll tell you the first day story and then that, that's, then I gotta, I gotta end this. The first day I'm there, I go to pill line, right? Because I'm, I'm at this point, I'm so stressed out and anxiety and, and just, I'm just dying. Like I'm taking Paxil. It's a, like an anxiety drug. So I go to pill line and I go there and I get my Paxil. You have to take a pill. They won't give you a bottle because, you know, we're your children. So I take the Paxil and I'm walking back and I go to walk in the unit and there's a Sally Ports, right? So you have to stop. You go in one door and then they have to open the other door to let you in. So I'm standing there with this black guy and I... And this is how absurd the situation is. And this is how foreign it is to me, even though I've already been locked up a year. But this is how foreign the environment is and how unprepared I am. I, as I walk up, I go to grab the door and it's locked. And I, I pat my pants and I go, man, I don't have the key, my key. You got your key? To the black guy. And he goes, man, I ain't no snitch. Motherfucker, I ain't no snitch. Boy, he said, I'll show my paperwork. I ain't no snitch, motherfucker. And I went, whoa, 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 whoa. I go, bro, what, what, what are you talking about? And he's sitting there and he's looking at me and he goes, man, he, what are you trying to say? I said, I, bro, well, I don't know what the deal is, man. And he looks at me and he goes, man, you just get here? And I went, yeah, bro, I just got here today. And he looked at me and he goes, man, he said, I go, what did I say? And he goes, man, you asked me if I got the keys. And I went, yeah, because the door's locked. And he goes, Nah, man, that's like you calling me a snitch. Only the police got the, got the keys. Only Popo got the keys. I ain't got no keys. Only snitches got the keys. And I went, oh, wow, bro, listen, man, I got no, I had no idea. That's what, I didn't know how you were going to take that. I was just playing around. Because, man, you got to watch yourself, man. You're going to get hurt. You're going to get hurt. Listen, bro, it, it was that bad. Like, I mean, I walked in and I had a celly. They assigned me a celly. And we're talking about very quickly when I got there, very quickly they start they start screaming over the loudspeaker, recall, recall, and guys start running around the unit, grabbing stuff, doing this, microwaving stuff, screaming. The cops are screaming, get in your cell, get in your cell. And they walk to the first cell and lock it, second cell and lock it. 
guys are running and scattering. I'm standing there looking around while they're screaming recall. Well, my celly was a Mexican. He comes running up to me and goes, he goes, hey man, you got to get in the cell, Cox. We got to go in the, we got to go. He goes, bunky, bunky. We got to go to the cell. We got to go to the cell. And I'm like, what's going on? What's going on? He goes, somebody got stabbed in the yard, man. I go, oh my God, someone got killed in the yard. He goes, nah, man, they didn't get killed. They just got stabbed up a little bit. Let's go. And I thought, this is a place where he said, got stabbed up a little. They just stabbed him up a little bit. Like that's where you're at. You can get stabbed up over a gambling debt. Like somebody owes somebody $20 and won't pay him. He gets stabbed up a little bit in the yard. Like there's no little bit of stabbing in my opinion. So, or you say the wrong thing and some guy's ready to fight you because I was joking around saying, hey, do you have your keys? I mean, it was, it was such a foreign environment. I've been arrested. I get arrested uh, November 16th, uh, 2006. Uh, I am shipped to, I, I'm basically, I'm held. I'm brought to, brought to, uh, immediately they bring me to the, the Secret Service uh, field office in uh, Nashville. That's where, uh, you know, that's where, um, that's where I'm, I'm, after they arrest me, they bring me there. They handcuff me to a desk. The Secret Service agent comes in uh, from Atlanta. Um, so I'm there for hours waiting for her to fly in on like an emergency flight or, or she might have driven. I don't know. She comes in. She tries to have a conversation with me. And I say, look, I really would prefer to talk to an attorney first. And she says, OK, that's your right. I understand that. And keep in mind, everybody's being real nice, like they're ready to get me you know, McDonald's, you know, what do you want? We can, we can go to Subway and get you a sandwich. We can go to McDonald's. What do you, you want me to go, go get you some co coffee at Starbucks? Like everybody's very nice at this point. So I, I, I don't say anything and they, they then transport me The the U S marshals comes in and they transport me to, uh, someplace in, God, I don't even remember what state it was. Anyway, they they drive me for like an hour away to put me in a marshal's holdover. So I go to the marshal's holdover, and I remember when I walked in the room. I know I'm. I mean, at this point, they grabbed me. I know I'm done. Immediately, Amanda, the chick that I was grabbed with, the girl that I was living with, she immediately went straight to our. Um, we had a, a safety deposit box. She went immediately to the safety deposit box, grabbed a bunch of paperwork that, and went straight to the secret service agent's office and gave them the paperwork and a bunch of uh, passports and things that were there. I think there was three or four or maybe five or six. I don't know how many were, were that she had. Uh, she gives them the, them those passports. They show me the passports. They've let me, they let me know immediately like, Hey, she's already given up stuff. So, pretty much know that she's already going to, um, you know, she's already going to cooperate against me, you know, which is fine. She's got a, a she's got a son and, and I totally get that. So I, the marshals show up, they transport me to the U S marshals holdover. The media's all over the, all over my arrest. Cause I was number one on the secret services, most wanted list. And so it was a big deal in Nashville. So all the local news stations are, are, are out in force. Uh, there's articles being written. And what happens is I go and I, as soon as I walk in, they, they dress me out. You have to understand, like, I've never been dressed out. Like, I've never been stripped down. They, they strip you down. They, they spray you down with all kinds of chemicals. They take your fingerprints. I mean, they photograph you. Like, it's, it's, it's an ordeal. It's especially an ordeal if you've never been through it. Like, seeing it happen is one thing, but really being treated like cattle and pushed around and told to do this and told to do this and talk to just like you're a dog. Like most people have never really had someone speak to them that way. So I was just like in shock. And by the time I actually get dressed in my jumpsuit and everything, and they give you your blanket and your, your stuff, like no pillow or anything, you get like a blanket and a bunch of, you know, your, some other, you know, whatever soap and crap that they give you and they walk you into an actual unit when i walked into the unit there were 10 or 15 guys there there's one tv and i remember i walk into the unit 
And I look up as soon as they like they un, you have to go put your hands through and they unshackle you and they take your stuff off. And now, you know, it all gets yanked through the door. And so now you're standing there and you turn around and there's 15 guys staring at you. And I remember they're all staring right at me. And I remember thinking, <laughs> I was like, this is when they rape you. But <laughs> and I was like, oh, my God, these guys look tough. I mean, they've got tattoos. One guy had tattoos on his face. He had horns on his head. He had all kinds of tattoos on his face. It, his whole body's tattooed. But I just remember thinking, holy shit, like everybody's staring at me. And one of the guys points at the TV and he goes, yo, man, you were just on TV. And another guy goes, yeah, man, you like that, bro. Like you took, you got millions and millions. You took these motherfuckers. Yeah. Bro. And they all kind of like, yeah, bro. Yeah. And I remember thinking, I was like, like I was glad that it wasn't a bad situation as far as these guys looking at me, you know, wanting to kill me. But it was also just, I knew just how much trouble I was in because the news, I'd just been on the news. So I, I walk in, I lay down and I just go to sleep. Like I laid there for as long as time and I eventually just go to sleep. They bring dinner. I don't get dinner. I don't get up. Just take my, take my food. I, I go to sleep. I go into this huge, like this, this super depression. And I slept for about, about a couple of days. And really by the next morning, I woke up and I had this splitting headache, splitting headache. So I think like the next day I woke up and I tried to call, I tried to call my, my parents. And I remember the, the guy with the tattoos, he was my bunkie. So he, I go and I'm trying, I remember this, I was trying to use the phone. I'm trying to punch in the phone and it wouldn't do anything. So this, this black guy comes up to me first and he goes, and he said, he goes, yo, man, you uh, need uh, try to call your peeps. And I went, what? Try to call your peeps. I said, what? Your peeps, man, your peeps. And I thought, what the fuck? So I started looking around like I don't have any idea what this guy's saying. And I'm looking around like is somebody that, like I, he sp I know he's speaking English. But I can't understand what he's saying. And so the white guy comes with the tattoos on his face, comes over and he goes, your people. And I went, people? He is your family. He's trying to say, are you trying to call your family? And I went, oh, yeah, yeah. And so he goes, I got this. And the black guy goes, all right, and walks off. I mean, you have to understand, I like, at that point, this is 2006. Like, there's not a lot of social media. There's not a lot of YouTube. There, really, YouTube had just kind of come out. Facebook had just come out. Like, we'd been out a few months. Um, there's no smartphone. So, as far as my interaction with other cultures was extremely limited. You know, the like, the only people I knew that weren't really, like, middle class or upper class white people were people that basically did construction work on my house, I, houses or did were, you know, um, roofers or, and, and they were always very polite and they always spoke very good English. And now I'm in a situation where, I mean, literally I can't understand what people are saying. I mean, I do now that was actually a really fucked up situation because within about a year or so, I remember being behind a couple guys in prison. These two black guys are, were about, or I was standing behind him in prison and I remember they said, the one guy goes, yo man, what, you know, uh, uh, how you fall? How you fall? And I was just standing in, in the chow, I was in the chow, long, chow line standing behind him and one guy goes, how you fall, man? How you fall? He goes, shit. He goes, over a dove and two stacks. And, and he goes, no, I'm saying, and he goes, yeah, man, I, yeah, I get you. I got you. I got you. And, I, and so when he said, I, do you know what I'm saying? I thought, I do know what he's saying. That over two grand and a dove, which is a key of Coke, saw a, another black guy snitched on him. And I knew as soon as he said it, I was like, oh, wow, he got snitched on by some guy he knows uh, over, a, you know, over, a, you know, over a, a, a key of Coke and, and a couple thousand. And I thought, and the fact that I knew what he was saying was like, wow. Like, I can't believe that I know what, it, what that means. Because two year, couple years earlier, I would have had no clue what that guy was saying. And I knew exactly. I remember thinking, I got to get out of here. I got to get out of here. It was bad. So, is that bad to say? Am I? No? It's bad. It's fucked up though, right? 
It's, <laughs> but at that time, I couldn't even communicate with someone to help me use the phone. So the white guy goes, yeah, listen, man, he goes, you got to punch in your pin number. I go, where's my pin number? He goes, here, it's right here on your bracelet because they had given me like a bracelet. So I punched in my pin number and he explains how the phone, like there's no instructions. They, the, the staff just expects that the un, other inmates will help one another. So there was no inmate handbook. There's nothing like that. So this guy helps me call my family. I call my, try and call my parents. My parents were not around. I then turn around and I call my sister. My sister gets on the phone and she's like, look, I, I know you were arrested. Like she, by that point, it's been on television. People have already called her. She said, uh, where are you? I tell her where I, where I am. She says, uh, um, was I in Kentucky or something? Like they drove me out of, out of the state of Tennessee. I knew that. So uh, I told, I tell her, um, and, you know, she says, look, you know, uh, I'll tell mom, I'm going to wait. We're going to wait and tell mom and dad because they they were hadn't come back from they were on like a, a some kind of cruise or something. Anyway, so let's say I spent about a week or two in that in that holding facility after a couple of weeks. Like I have a lawyer that comes and he sees me and tells me, you know, you're done. You, you've got a ton. You're, you're in a lot of trouble. Like you, you, you're, you're looking at I forget what he said, like 20 years or something. It was outrageous. And he said, you know, I'm going to, he said, I'm going to waive the bond hearing because they're extraditing you to, to Tennessee. So I said, okay. So two weeks later, I get put on a bus. I get driven to some other facility, which was in, uh, I want to say it was in, I want to say it was in Mississippi. So they drove me to like Mississippi and well, I was in Mississippi for a couple of weeks and it was at a G I want to say it was a geo facility, which is a private facility and they housed inmates from all over the country. So I was there for a couple of weeks and I remember too, I remember meeting a guy there that had been busted for, he'd been in the prison before. I remember his girlfriend kept writing him and he kept reading the envelope. He would read the, he would read the letters. He was my celly. Cause if basically if you're a white guy, you typically end up be getting celled with a white guy. So I end up getting, uh, I'm in a, I got in a cell that time and, and the guy got, kept getting letters from his girlfriend and he would read the letter and he would look at the pictures she'd send and then he'd tear everything up and throw it away. And I was like, you know, I said, why do you keep doing that? And he said, well, you know, I, I, I broke up with her. This is my, my ex-girlfriend. I broke up with her. I said, well, she keeps writing you like every day. He, this guy's getting one or two letters a day. And he goes, yeah, yeah, I know. And I said, yeah, she keeps writing you. Why is she writing you? And he goes, well, I mean, we were, you know, we've been dating a couple of years. He said, and I got caught. He got caught. I don't know. He said, like, obviously he said he didn't do anything. He said he was basically driving a guy around that was delivering drugs or whatever. So the point is, is I think he got like five years or something. And he said, he said, yeah, I, I broke up with her. And I was like, why'd you break up with her? And he goes, I broke up with her because he said, I've been in prison before and it's it's hard to maintain a relationship. She she wants us to have a relationship. He said, but the problem is, is that she'll be there for six months. But in six months from now, she's going to start seeing somebody else and she'll try and hide it for six months. And then eventually he said, but I'll know it and I'll feel it. He's and I don't want to be one of those guys on the telephone Saturday morning screaming into the phone. Where the fuck were you at last night? Why didn't you answer the phone? Because he is when I know she was on a date with her boyfriend. He said, you know, and I, I don't want to be that guy. And it's, it's, it makes my, it would make my time a lot harder. So I broke up with her. I told her we're breaking up. And, um, if I, you're available when I get out, we'll start seeing each other again. And I was like, wow, bro. Like that's, that's, you know, like that's where I'm at. Like these guys, like this guy knows. He said, he said, look, you know, and, and he told me something that was very, very true. I remember he told me that, um, he said, he said, the only kinds, the only women that stick with you when you're incarcerated are women that have been married to a guy for several years. Maybe they have a couple of year, a couple of kids, maybe it's five or 10 years, but the guy's a multimillionaire. Like if you still have millions and millions of dollars left over and businesses and you're you know, you can still support your wife while you're incarcerated, then your wife will visit you for four or five years. And he said, other than that, you're the, they're going to leave. 
he was like, or unless you're maybe he said, maybe she'll stay if she's from South America or something. Like you're married to a South American. They're very family oriented. Like this guy had really laid it out. And the thing is, I remember thinking to himself, that's not true. But the truth is, is over the course of the next 12 years, he was absolutely right. The only people I know where their wives stayed with them the entire time were guys that were millionaires, had millions of dollars and still had money when they went to prison. They went to prison for three years or four years or five years. I know a couple guys that have. Yeah. Red Bull. Red Bull's wife only stayed. So I we knew a guy named uh, Andrew Levinson, uh, who was a con man, um, a great con man, actually. And yeah, <laughs> he um, so Levinson's wife stayed, but Levinson's wife was from Peru. So she stayed. She had a daughter with him. She was with him in the, uh, when things were up and she's going to stay with him and she wasn't going to leave him. Yeah, he found her at a bus stop. Yeah, he actually met. Yeah, he actually met her at a bus stop. She was just, yeah, pulled in it up in his Bentley. She was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. Uh, so, anyway, so I end up eventually. I, I, this guy, you know, another thing that you, this is this is really funny. So I, anyway, I end up going, getting shipped to, oh, sh- uh, get flown to Oklahoma. So they put me on Con Air. Con Air is nothing like you think it is. It's not like the movie Con Air. It's a regular commercial air, uh, airplane. You pull up in a van with whatever, eight other guys. I remember I was with a, I was with a former, I want to say he, he was a police officer. He was a, 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 an, a, like a, not a DEA agent, but I think he was a, just a, a task force agent. And he was a crooked and he was in the, in the truck with me. So, and we were talking, we talked a few times. He was in my unit. We talked a few times and, and I was one of the few people that knew he was a cop. So we get, we get all the way to the airport and they unload several buses and several vans filled with inmates. Some of the buses are buses. Like they've got like 30 inmates on them. So they unload us. So the marshals are all standing around this massive plane. They've all got shotguns. They're all yelling at you to get in line, do this, do that. They're calling out names. Then they slowly call your name. They, they pat you down a couple times. They walk you into the plane. Like when you get in the plane, you've basically got a paper outfit on. So you get in the plane. And you, you get, a, you know, you you sit down and I mean, it's surreal. It's just like, it's almost like Nazi, um, uh, efficiency, you know, like it, it's, it's, they're just that good and brutal at, at being able to corral you and get you into a spot. And these guys are holding shotguns and no doubt in my mind, they love to shoot you. Like you can, you can see it in their face. They're desperate for you to do something. And so even the tough guys don't do anything like they, they don't mouth off because they know it's a losing situation. So you get on the plane and then the plane takes off. The plane is horrendous. The It, it stinks. People have pissed in their seats. It's disgusting. And but you get up there and the plane takes off and it's got 150 guys in it or 200 or whatever that plane takes. And they they fly it up and then. Whatever, 45 minutes or an hour later, you land in Oklahoma City. And Oklahoma City is a, a holdover that's run by the, uh, I, I want to say it's the U.S. Marshals or possibly Bureau of Prisons. I think it's the U.S. Marshals, though. The plane literally lands at the airport. So it lands and you get directly off of the plane and go straight into the holdover, which is, I want to say it's maybe a four-story building. I could probably look it up. I might be wrong, but I think it's four, four or five stories or something. Listen, it was freezing cold outside. I mean, freezing, uh, freezing everywhere you went. It was, it was snowing out. I got there sometime in, I want to say early January by this point. Uh, so it was early January, got there, stayed there 10 days. Um, remember met a mobster that had gone to prison. He'd beaten several murder charges and then lost on racketeering and gotten like 30 years or something. and was still fighting. And, and he was just telling me how dirty the feds are. And he was just, it, it was funny because he was like right out. This was before I'd met any guys like this. Like now I know exactly what they are and who they are and what they're about. And, but it was like the first time it was like meeting someone from the Sopranos. Like it, he, he was that it was, he was straight out of central casting. Like, Hey, send me a guy that's a mobster. That was this guy. He was perfect. And he, he, 
so he he was going on about how dirty the feds are the feds these dirty bastards they fucking and i was just like jesus like this guy's really laying it on thick with the mob thing but he was he was a mobster and that's they all sound like that so uh, i was there for about 10 days and at eventually they call my name they shackled me up. You know, when they shackle you, every time you go anywhere, they shackle your legs, your ankles. They, they put the chains on you. At that point, I had a metal box. They have a box that holds you like this. They put a, a waist chain around you so you're tied. You're, you can't really move your, your hands. And it's, it's your chain from here. The chain wraps around your waist. Then it goes down to your the, the shackles, which are around your ankles. And then that chain goes to a, the guy in front of you. I mean, you really are like just interconnected, like a like a big like. If one guy fell down the stairs, he's gonna probably yank everybody else down. Like you're all gonna. Um. So anyway, we end up. I'm end up in uh, Oklahoma City, the holdover for. I, I get a. I'm in a cell again for whatever it was, two weeks. You know, and and by this point now it's it's. It's been a well. I think I was there for ten days, so whatever, roughly two two weeks. So I was in there too with another guy who'd done like thirty years. And I mean, you you start to talk to these guys who are getting thirty years, twenty years, fifteen years. Like this guy's a bank robber. He was robbing, you know, banks and this. I mean, you know, you start to hear these stories, and they're just amazing. And uh. It, Anyway, I, I end up, so I end up going, getting back on the plane. I get flown to Jacksonville. From Jacksonville, they put me in a facility for like the night. Then they put me on a bus and they drive me all the way to, I think I went to um, Tallahassee. Stayed the holdover in Tallahassee for a couple of days. Then I think I went, then I went to uh, Union City. So I was in Union City. And so it literally took me, I think, a total of six weeks before I got to my final destination, which was Union City. I actually moved from Union City. At some point, I ended up going to Atlanta City Detention Center. They call it ACDC. But I was in Union City. And at that point, the the U.S. Marshals had a hold over there. Uh, They closed it eventually because there's so many violations. Like it was it was just disgusting. So I went in there and. I remember there was a guy I met there. Man, this guy was interesting. He had used identity theft to steal a dealer's license so he could buy weapons. And then he was selling those weapons in like New York or something. So he'd buy tons of weapons down here using a dealer's license and drive up to New York and sell them in New York and then drive back. And he'd been done it for a while. Eventually they caught him and he actually got into a shootout with the cops. This is a guy that was, I remember he and the cops were shooting at each other. And one cop, he was actually chasing the cop around the car, shooting at him. And he said he finally got right on top of him and he pulled the gun and and pulled the trigger and it went click, click, click. And he was like, damn, almost had him. And I thought, Jesus, fuck, almost had him. Like it's, it's, that's just. Yeah. Anyway, interesting guy. And I remember him telling me, like, these are all like, like, to me, these are all like this, this whole process of getting to the point where I get to Atlanta was like a process of a learning experience. It lowered my expectation. It raised my awareness of how much, how dangerous the situation was. And how, you know, and, and, and how serious the situation was. Um, but I, 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 the one guy, the guy who had chased the, the cop around the car, I was just sitting there. I remember sitting there thinking, I can't do this. And, and I remember he, he was, what's up, bro? And I said, man, man, I said, I just, I, I don't think I can do this. And I remember he's the guy, he looked at me and he said, well, that's the great thing about this. You don't have to do it. And I go, well, what do you mean? He goes, you don't have to do it. I said, what? Prison? And he goes, yeah. He said, you don't, he said, he said, you don't have to do the, the, this. He said, they're going to make you do it. He goes, it's effortless on your part. You don't have to try and ma- 
try and do the time. He said, you just, he said, just do what you're told and keep yourself entertained. He said, that's it. He said, so you don't have to try. He said, so, you know, you don't have to worry about it. And I was just like, like, I didn't, I was like, what? I was like, I remember thinking that was a horrible thing to say, (laughs) but, but the truth is he was absolutely right. Most of my time in prison was just trying to keep myself entertained. If they said, it's chow, you go to chow. If they said, do this, you do this. You don't have to think about anything. It really is one of those few times in your life where, like you're, you're an adult, but you're taken care of. You know, you're taken care of by really shitty people and you're not taken care of well, but they're not going to let you die. So I remember the second thing he told me was, because I was like, bro, how? Because that, that guy had actually done like 10 years in the state. Or had he done 10 years in the Fed and he was going to the state and he was doing, go, he had a few more years left. And he told me, um, he had told me that he said, I know you, you think this is like the worst because you're at the beginning. He's like, I'm at the end. So it's good. He goes, I'm over the hump. Once you're over the hump, he said, things get a lot easier. He said, uh, he said, but you don't b- believe this right now. He said, I'm going to tell you something. You ain't, you're not going to believe it. And it's funny because those, these guys that look like, you know, they got tattoos on their face. They're missing. They've been shot three times. They, they talk like they were raised. They were all raised in like the projects or, you know, trailer parks. And, and, and they, they just like, they, they, they didn't graduate high school and they, you know, they're just, and a lot of them are just brutal thugs and, and they're, you know, they, they have no manners. They don't say please. They don't say thank you. Like they're just, they're just brutes. They have wisdom. They, and in this situation, they excelled. And so every once in a while, one of these guys would say something to me and I would just go, wow. Like, even if it didn't make sense right there, right at that moment, that's one of the things this guy said to me was, he said, you don't believe this right now, Cox. He said, but you're going to meet some of the best people you've ever met in your life in federal prison. He was in prison. You're going to make better, have better relationships in prison. He said, and you're going to meet a group of guys and surround yourself by a group of guys that are amazing. He said, there will be a time when you will be laughing your ass off and having a blast. And you will think there is nowhere I'd rather be right now. And I remember I looked at him and I go, you're fucking crazy. That's never going to happen. And he goes, well, we'll see. I wish to God I had that guy's name so I could just write him a letter and tell him he was right. He was right about five years later. It took five years where I was playing risk with a bunch of guys at the low security prison, bunch of guys that I just thought were great. And there was like four or five of us and we're, we're playing the game, the board game risk. We'd been playing for like four hours and we used to play like every, uh, every weekend. And we're sitting there, there are guys at the prison that sells sodas, they sell coffee, they sell hot dogs, they sell food on the rec yard. So we're on the rec yard playing risk, sitting around the table. There's guys running around, bringing us hot dogs. There's guys bringing us soda. Keep in mind, there's a thousand people on the rec yard. It's like a carnival. Guys are screaming in the background. Guys are playing music. They're bringing us cold sodas and we're drinking sodas and we're playing and we're eating popcorn and we're, we're playing, we're, we're eating hot dogs and we're playing risk and we're screaming at each other. Like this guy's invading this guy's country and we're screaming like you, that's bullshit. We had an agreement. We have a pact. Like we're yelling at each other and we're rolling dice and we're la- one time. And at one point I remember laughing so hard. I couldn't breathe. These guys were so funny and they were so cool and they were so great. And I had such great relationships with them. And I remember thinking, this is great. This is amazing. This I'm having a black. This is, is a great time. These are great guys. And for just a second, I thought there's nowhere I'd want else. I'd want to be. And I remember thinking about that guy at Union City that told me that and thinking, motherfucker, that guy's right. He's right. Some of the best relationships I've ever had, I started in federal prison. And it's because typically after a while, as you meet somebody, you get to know them, you realize what they're about. And that you're all on equal footing and that they don't want anything from you. You know, you, you just end up being friends. So 
you remove all those exterior factors that cause some friendships for the wrong reasons or put you together for the wrong reasons or the right reasons. You remove those and you're just guys hanging out and you very quickly get to figure out who you like and who you don't. And I had a group of guys that I hung out with that were great. So back to Union City, I'm in Union City. My lawyer comes to see me one day. So my lawyer finally comes to see me. Her name is Millie. Um, she was a public defender. And a lot of people will tell you like public defenders suck. So here's the thing with public defenders. In the state, most state public offenders are pretty bad, right? Like they're new. They don't really know what they're doing. They just want you to take a plea. They don't want to go to trial. In the federal system, it's actually the public defender's offices are actually private, uh, private agencies that are funded by the federal government. And so they're given, you know, they like, they get so much money for a case. If a case is a complicated case, they get so much more money. If a case goes to trial, they get more money. If a case, like, so they get, they get certain amounts for different types of cases and the com- complexity of that case. So they're actually paid well. So the public defender's office gets paid a certain fund. Most public defenders make between 80 to a hundred thousand dollars a year, sometimes more, uh, depending on how long they've been there. Well, so th- they're not bad attorneys. All right. A hundred thousand dollars a year in Georgia is a good chunk of money. That's a lot of money. You can live very well in the South for a hundred thousand a year. So this was, I'm sure it's much higher now. This was 50, about what, 15, 16 years ago. So my lawyer shows up, Millie, she shows up and she says, and she, she says, hi, my name's your lawyer. We meet, I get taken out of the unit. You, you go to a little lawyer's room. You meet with that person. I meet with her. She's very nice. And I remember she said, so you've got some problems. She said, they said you've stolen $26 million. I was like, that's a lie. So first she reads off my charges and they're outrageous. Like I had never heard my charges. By this point, I've been indicted in multiple jurisdictions. Like now they've, like they've had time to rally the troops, like the Secret Service and FBI. And they, they've all, you know, they, they've all figured out what we're going to do. How are we going to hammer this guy? What are we going to do? They've consolidated the cases. I've got a U.S. attorney. I mean, it's, it's rough. So they come out of the gate and I'm just, it's like money laundering, conspiracy to launder mo- uh, money, um, conspiracy for bank fraud, bank fraud, uh, aggravated identity theft. Uh, conspiracy to uh, commit financial institution fraud, financial institution fraud, social security fraud, social security document fraud, U.S. document fraud, um, passport fraud, use of a fraudulent passport. Um, I mean, l- listen, wire fraud. Uh, what else? Mail fraud, conspiracy to commit wire fraud. I mean, l- there's four or five other charges in there. Like it, it's it's rough. And then the charges aren't even the real problem. Like you can get charged for like let's say half a million dollars in bank fraud and not even have to go to prison. Well, just if that was your only charge, the problem is the enhancements. They start adding on enhancements, more than 50 victims, more than a million dollars from one financial institution, uh, obstruction of justice, uh, changing jurisdictions to evade detection, sophisticated means, using a, uh, using a specialty device in furtherance of your crime, uh, you know, on, you know, on and on and on. And as she's adding it up, it's becoming insane. Her initial numbers were, you're looking at 15, 15, 15 to 16 years or something like that. I forget. And I was like, that's, that's insane. Like I didn't kill anybody. I didn't harm anybody. I didn't even hurt anybody's feelings. Like I never used harsh language. Like, oh, what do you, this is, this is nuts. And I didn't steal $26 million. I don't have $26 million. And so she goes, she, she takes, listens to everything I say. She leaves. She calls the U.S. attorney. She comes back and she says that, you know, the FBI is saying it's whatever, $11.5 million for this. U.S. Attorney, or Secret Service is saying it's another three and a half million dollars or four and a half million dollars for, for that. They're saying it's $40 million for this. It's like they start, I'm like 40 million. They're like, yeah, it's like 40 million for your finance, your mortgage company. They're, they want to hit you with money laundering for that. Like it, it gets, it just becomes insane. The amount of money. Of, of, and then they, they, I argue about the 26 year, uh, 26 million. Like by this point, they, the second time she came back, she came back and she said they dropped it down to like, I want to say 20 million or 22 million. Then she came back and they dropped it down to 15 million. 
Um, I, I could get into the, the 40 million in that my mortgage company did, uh, but they pretty much dropped that almost immediately. That actually happens later. I don't want to get too technical, but they're too, you know, I don't want too chronological, but the point is, is they dropped the 40 million. So I'm down to $15 million. This takes months, by the way. So it's months. Millie's advice was, you are 100% guilty. Like there's no doubt about that. Uh, I remember, it was funny. It's funny because I remember <laughs> I, I had gone to, I'd gone to court at one point after I'd been in Union City for a week, about a week or so. I'd been to court for a bond hearing, which is comical because when I walk, when I go in and I meet with Millie, I'm like, what, what is this? What's going on? She says, this is your bond hearing. And I go, I, I, am I going to get bond? And she goes, no, you're not going to get bond. She says, but they have to have the hearing. And you have to think the U.S. Attorney's Office and the Secret Service, they, they actually have these huge bill, like these huge boards of my pictures of my face before I had plastic surgery and after I had plastic surgery. They have other pictures of my wanted posters. They have pictures of me going in and out of the bank. They have multiple posters of all my different IDs. Like there's, they've got to have 20 IDs and I'm looking at it and it, not, not to mention the passports. So I've had like two dozen passports. So I looked at her and I said, well, and by the way, the, the courtroom is full of reporters. And I remember I looked at her and I went, okay, well, I'm not going to get bond. Why am I, why are we here? She goes, well, we can waive it if you want. And I went, well, if I can't get bond and she goes, if they gave you bond, what would you do? I go, I'd leave. I'd run. And she goes, she started laughing. I said, I'm not going to lie. I said, I said, you let me out of this place. You're never seeing me again. And she just started laughing. She goes, okay. She said, well, look, she goes, they're not giving you bond anyway. She goes, let's just waive it. So she, you know, they call the court. They do this. Uh, the U.S. attorney goes on and on so that the reporters can see how, how doomed I am. She stands up and says, your honor, we just want to waive this. We're just going to waive it. So they waive it. <sighs> anyway, they, they end up, all right. So they end up waving, they end up waving, oh shit, sorry. They end up waving the, uh, the bond hearing. We wave the bond hearing. I leave. I go back. Uh, Millie keeps coming back and forth. We negotiate with the U.S. Attorney's Office. And her, basically what she said was, you're just doomed. Like, it, you know, you, you, you cannot go to trial because you're 100% guilty. Like, there's nothing you can do. You're guilty. Okay, I get it. So you basically have no choice but to cooperate. And I was like, okay. She said, I said, I, I understand. I said, but you know, what, who am I cooperating against? And she explains to me that basically she said, apparently she is, there's a ton of people in Tampa, Florida on your, not this, you know, there's multiple cases. She's not the Georgia case, but the Tampa case. And you have to understand there's a Tampa case. There's an Orlando case. There's a case in Clearwater. There is a case in South Carolina. There's a case in Nashville, there's a case in Georgia. So she's like, you know, she says, so the one in Tampa, she goes, there's multiple people that are willing to uh, cooperate against you. She said, they've investigated, they've talked to like, tw they got like 12 people that are all ready to, to, to cooperate. She said, you can't go to trial because you're guilty and you'll get, you know, you'll get a hundred, you know, you'll get 30 years, easily get 30 years. She said, and they can always st what they call stack. They can stack your charges and you can, I think I could get up to, I think if they stacked all the charges, the press was saying it was 154 years or something. But she said, I remember when she said this, she goes, she goes, I said, they're saying 154 years. She said, I know, but that's ridiculous. She said something. So that's not really how it works. She goes, even if they stack the charges, they can't stack the multiple charges. She goes, so the most you can get is 54 years. <laughs> For what? Um, so. She says, but look, it doesn't matter. She said, the truth is, she said, most likely most of those would have been run, run concurrently. So at the same time, or sorry, concurrent, consecutive, right? So they'd be, they'd be run at the same time. And as a result of that, she said, the most you can get is 30 years, 32 because of the aggravated identity theft. She's the most you can get is 32 years if you lost at trial, most likely. And I was just like, Okay, she said, the only thing you can do is cooperate. That's your only chance is to cooperate against people that, she said, a lot of these people in Tampa are saying, like they're saying, 
you did this, you did this, but they, a lot of them are saying they did nothing. She goes, so those people who have already told on you she, or cooperate against you, she said, they, if you cooperate against them and, um, and uh, implicate them, she said, then I can, I can get you a, what's called a, a 5K1. So you get sentenced and you get a 5K1 and you get a reduction in your sentence. And I was like, okay, well, how much can I get? She says, well, that's not really how it works. The way it works is this. You cooperate, then when you go to, then they give you your PSI, your pre-sentence report, which states, hey, this guy's looking at 15 years. Then you get in front of the judge and the judge says, okay, he's going to get 15 years. And the U.S. attorney says, yes, your honor, we are suggest, we're, we're recommending he gets 15 years, which is what the PSI says he should get. A PSI is just, it's a calculation of what you should get. So, of what your time, you know, based on the sentencing guidelines, you know, where you fall. So he should get 15 years. I'm using this as a hypothetical. He should get 15 years, but he cooperated. And as a result of his cooperation, we want you to reduce his sentence. And then they make a suggestion, 40%, 50%. They typically don't do it by percentage. They typically do it by levels. Like we want you to knock off four levels or six levels. And then as a result of that, your time obviously comes down. So if I were to have gotten 15 years and they recommended a 5K1, I probably would have ended up with eight or nine years. Um, so that's what Millie says. That's what you need to do. You need to cooperate. And I was like, um, okay. I mean, I, I don't know. Like everybody's already rolled over on me. You know, not that that matters. Like, I don't want to say, oh, I only told on them because they told on me. Like, I'm ready to cut every single person's throat to get out of this situation. I'm ready to snitch, rat, cooperate, whatever you want to call it on every single individual I can think of to get out of this situation. And it is an absolute cowardly thing to do and the brightest thing you can do in the situation. Like I'll deal with people giving me some shit to get a chunk of time knocked off. So with that said, I say, absolutely. Let's, let's do it. What, what do they want to know? And she said, well, here's what we're going to do. We're going to, we'll tell them you're willing to cooperate and then we'll, we'll, they'll probably want to talk with you. Okay. So she goes back to the U.S. attorney, explains the situation, and then it turns out that the FBI wants to come in and sit with me for four or five days. Well, I think we wanted three or four days. Three or four days with me. The Secret Service wants to sit with me for two or three days. Uh, so I've got like a week that I need to meet with these people. Um, th so I, I agree at that point in the hope that I get my sentence cut. And they schedule... They schedule a meeting with the Secret Service and I go to meet the Secret Service and explain exactly what happened. By that point, by the way, by this point, I've been moved from a, um, Union City Detention Center, uh, which is for the U.S. Marshals. And the U.S. Marshals have moved me to Atlanta City Detention Center because... The U.S. attorney also wanted me to be interviewed by uh, Dateline NBC. So it's funny because when I got to the detention center, as soon as I got there, it, um, Dateline NBC ran a story on me called The Thief of Hearts. And the story was an interview... And, and it was an interview and reenactments with uh, Rebecca Halk, because by this point, Becca, you know, Rebecca, the, one of my co-defendants had been caught and she cooperated with uh, the authorities and with Dateline. And they did an interview and it just paints me as this guy that is like this. I'm like a Don Juan. I go in, I swoop women off their feet. I convince them to fall in love with me. Oh, yeah, yeah I forgot. Single mothers. They're, they have this thing about single mothers. At that time in the press, single mothers was a big deal. Like it was trending. So they were like, he's taking advantage of, he's, he targets single mothers. He convinces them to fall in love with him. He convinces them to commit fraud for them. And then he takes all the money and he leaves them to go to prison. That was the whole take. It was called the Thief of Hearts. And I come off like a real scoundrel. I mean, as if I don't come off like a scoundrel already, this put the na final nail in the coffin. So 
Yeah, so I've got the U.S. Attorney, I got the FBI, U.S. Attorney, Secret Service, and Dateline. They all want to interview me at this point, and they, my lawyer Millie, starts scheduling, you know, closing or, or closings, scheduling meetings. And it's so funny because I'll never forget when I was like, "Well, what what's my strategy?" Before I decided like to cooperate, I go, "What's my strategy?" And she goes, "Your strategy, your only strategy, is tell them everything they want to know and hope for the best." She goes, that's your only strategy. Like she was very clear. But, you know, in her defense, like she didn't mount like a defense for me because in her defense, I was defenseless. Like I completely buried myself. There was nothing I could do but cooperate or take what she was saying was 15 years. Ultimately, it was 32 years. Like she thought, oh, you're looking at around 15 because she doesn't know what they're asking for. But the truth is, they asked for 32 years, and I'll explain that in the next video. So basically, I'm now supposed to go to meet with the, I think it was the Secret Service first. The U.S. Marshals had finally moved me to, uh, they'd finally moved me to, I think I was in a Atlanta City a Detention Center, and my lawyer, I had agreed to cooperate and meet with the Secret Service and the FBI and do an interview with Dateline, uh, NBC News. So I think pretty, I'm not sure exactly chronologically what where it was, but I'm gonna go ahead and do the Secret Service first. So the Secret Service, I was moved to the U.S. Marshals, I was moved to the U.S. Attorney's Office to be interviewed by the Secret Service. And there was the main Secret Service agent that had been investigating me. Her name was Andrea Peacock. And she was out of Atlanta. The other guy that had actually, so Peacock had been, a, in, had been, she'd been investigating me, but the guy that the US, the US Secret Service agent that arrested me, his name was Dan Bronskouts, Bronsowski, Bronskowski. It was a ridiculous name, Dan. So it was Andrea Peacock and Dan. They were there and the U.S. attorney was there. Her name was Gail McKenzie. So Gail McKenzie was, she despised me. To, to be honest, they, 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 um, Andrea Peacock, it's actually Andrea Peacock was extremely nice and polite. Uh, but Gail McKenzie was just horrible. She was just, she was really, really just a rude person. And she took white collar crime very seriously. I, I want to say that after I had met with her the first time, I remember my lawyer, I asked her, like, what's wrong with this woman? And I, she had told me, if I got the story right, that 15 or 20 years earlier, that Gail McKenzie had been investigating um, mortgage fraud or some kind of a fraud and there were Russians involved and they actually poisoned her during the investigation and she ended up in the hospital and almost died. So in her, to her, she was like white collar crime was violent. Like to her, it was like, it was, a, it was a horrible crime committed by horrible people that would that would do horrible things and and would turn to violence. Like I'm not a violent person. <clears throat> I'm not going to poison anybody, but because some guy 15 years ago poisoned this woman, now I, now she wanted to slam every single person out of the gate that committed any type of white collar crime. So I end up going to the U.S. Attorney's Office where I met with the Secret Service and my lawyer and Gail McKenzie, and I sit down, and I remember when I got there, I sat down. And in my mind, I was actually thinking, like, what do they know? You know, like, I wonder how much they know. And Gail McKenzie walked in and sat down. We all introduced one another. And her assistant came in with Starbucks coffee, and she handed me a venti vanilla latte with eight raw sugars in it. And... And I and she goes I, she and she handed it to me and said that's a venti vanilla latte with eight raw sugars and she looked at me and I thought and I go wow I said how you know like how'd you know that and she went well we we've interviewed Becky 
Rebecca Houck extensively. She goes, we know everything. And I just was like, I mean, this chick knew the kind of drink that I drink. And I thought, oh man, this is, this is so bad. Like they know everything. One of the things my lawyer had told me was, no matter what happens during these meetings, don't lie. Don't lie to the FBI or the Secret Service or the U.S. Attorney's Office because they'll use that lie to not give you any type of a reduction. So you, you could you can cooperate with the with the authorities, and let's say they got they arrested ten people, and those people all got five or ten years apiece. Well, if you lied in any significant way then the U.S. attorney would immediately say, yeah, Your Honor, he did all this, but guess what? He lied about this one thing. We don't think he deserves anything. And then they give you nothing, even though they got the benefit of your cooperation. So she told me, don't lie about anything. I was like, all right, I totally got it. So I sat down and they started asking questions. You know, when did you leave? Uh, you know, when did you leave Florida? How did you know the FBI was coming to arrest you? You know, where did you go first? Why did you go there? How did you get this ID? How did you get this? How did you get that? So I explained to them all the various ways I had gotten identities. I explained to them where I had gone. I explained to them the bank account. They knew everything because Becky had already told them everything. So um, they'd also talked to Amanda by this point. Amanda had cooperated, which was one of the girls, the girl that I had been dating when I got caught. So she knew who I was. So she had cooperated. Uh, they'd interviewed several other people that knew me, that knew I was doing fraudulent things to a degree, but may or may not have known who I was. <coughs> you know, they may have known me as Joseph Carter. So I remember as when I, so I remember when I first got into the meeting and sat down, the first thing, one of the first things that the, that Dan Bronskowski or whatever his name is said to me was, we need to, talk about the money that you know that you took and I was like okay I said well you guys have already got the money like they'd already subpoenaed all my bank accounts they'd already taken all the money they'd already they'd already done everything they already gotten a ton of money and I said you already have the money and they went no no we know you have money hidden and I went I don't have any money hidden. I don't know what you're talking about. What are you talking about? And I remember my lawyer leaned in and she, Millie goes, she goes, do we need to talk about this? And I went, no, there's nothing to talk about. I gave them all the money. You have the money from Bank of America. You have the money from SunTrust. You have the money from here. You have the money from, you know, Bank of Tennessee, from Bank of uh, Nashville, from, you know, all these, all these different banks. You've got them all. And he said, look, we know you have money. He goes, you understand that you're going to get hit with an obstruction charge. And I remember thinking they think I'm lying about this, but I'm not. So he pulls out several uh, bank statements and he puts them on the table. Boom. He goes, we know you've got money hidden in the, uh, in the name of Walter Holcomb in the name of Southern Exchange Bank of Clarksville. Southern Exchange Bank of Clarksville was a, a fictitious bank that I'd made up. It was completely fictitious. So I looked at it and I was like, I could not believe, like I had a website, I had a, a phone service, I had, I had everything to cover the bank. And so he looked at the bank and he was like, we know you've got this bank. Uh, we know you've got money in this name. And I just, I looked at it and he was so irritated and upset and serious. He goes, you're going to get hit with an obstruction charge. And I said, wow. I said, have you called the bank? And he goes, yeah, we've called. I left several messages. He goes, we just subpoenaed them. And I was like, really? And he goes, yeah, we just subpoenaed them. Uh, we're going to get the money anyway. You might as well just be honest. And I went, did you go to the website? And he was like, yeah, we went to the website. And I go, what did you think of it? And he goes, what do you mean? It was a website. I go, yeah, but it was, it was, it's professional. And he goes, it's a bank website. I go, yeah, but it's professional. I go, it's convincing. And he looked at me and he goes, oh, fuck. He goes, oh, man. And everybody's like, what's going on? What's going on? And he goes, it doesn't exist. And I, he goes, and I looked at him and I go, it's all an illusion. And, I, and he said, uh, he goes, are you serious? I said, bro, I made this bank. Like, I made these bank statements. Like, all of this is fake. 
bank statements are fake. And, you know, he had canceled checks and he was like, yeah, he was, but it's registered with the bank registry. I said, right. There was a Southern Exchange Bank, but it had been bought by someone like South Trust or somebody. And so I actually had a bank there. So I re kind of branded it as Southern Exchange Bank of Clarksville. And I made a website called Southern Exchange Bank of Clarksville. And I made, you know, colored uh, bank statements like they were in full color and I, you could print them out and everything. And he thought I had like, I don't know, $100,000 or $200,000 in this bank in the name of Walter Holcomb. So anyway, the U.S. attorney was like, well, what do you even have that for? And I said, banks are great for everything. They're great for verifying down payments. They're great for verifying reserves. They're great for verifying uh, canceled checks. They're great for verifying employment. Like you know, there's lots of things you would do with the bank. And so she just kind of like, you know, shook her head and shrugged it off. She goes, okay, fine, fine. And he goes, they, well, we, we think that you're still money out there. I go, well, there's no money out there. So, you know, and you, if this is the best you've got, you know, like, you know, I'm not, I'm not too concerned about it. And I was like, you really believe this was a bank? I said, did you, who did you subpoena? And he said, we subpoenaed the, the bank. It's, there's actually a, an address in, in Florida. So we subpoenaed the address. And I said, I don't know who have you left messages with? Like, I haven't paid the phone service in like months and months because I've been locked up. And he goes, he goes, oh, I, I left a, a voicemail, uh, like a, a few weeks ago. So we pick up the phone and he actually called the phone number and it went doo, 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 and it had been shut off. As I told you, and he was like, wow. He, and I went, you really believe this was a real bank? And he goes, yeah. And I went, wow. I said, I, you're the secret service, bro. And I, it was like the first time, like I was embarrassed that they had caught me. It was just, I was like, I can't believe that you guys caught me. So like they'd had this information for four or five months and they still thought it was a real bank. Anyway, I talked to them. I tell them the things that I'd done. But uh, and essentially what I told them was that, of course, it was, you know, it was just Becky and I. Becky and I had run these scams. Amanda kind of knew what I was doing at some point. She figured it out. But she never really helped me with the scam. She never really did anything. She hadn't done anything. And she'd already cooperated uh, against me and told them everything she had done. So there was just nobody that that I really could could give up or help myself with. There was a, a company that I had had been getting mortgages through and the loan officer there knew that I was multiple people. I don't, I don't ever go out into this, uh, but so that loan officer, they had actually, they were running a scam where they had set up a, a fake down payment assistance program. Still, you know, I explained about that and the U.S. attorney didn't seem, they didn't seem all that interested, even though to me it was a massive scam. Uh, all they did with that was they contacted them and told them to shut it down. Stop doing, stop doing that. Like you're committing fraud. Stop doing that. And they were like, oh, okay. And they closed the whole thing down. They stopped running their fraud. They never indicted them. Like I didn't really do much other than just bury myself based on what they already knew in that, in that particular, in that particular, uh, debriefing. Hey, if you guys didn't know, I also do, I do paintings. And uh, if you're interested in a painting, I'm going to leave my contact information in the description beneath the video. Back to the video. So that went on for a couple days. I think I was debriefed by them for like maybe, maybe two days or three days. So I go back to you. Um, I go back to uh, uh, ACDC, the, the, the marshal's holdover where I was being held. And maybe a month later, I go to the FBI. So I go get interviewed by the FBI. I'm interviewed by the FBI. They, of course, come out. They've got boxes and boxes uh, that they bring. And they only bring a few boxes. Like they literally said they had a small room filled up with documents from my mortgage company and documents that they had collected from just all the various loans I'd done over the years. And they were saying it was like 11 and a half. At that point, they were saying it was a 15 million or 11 and a half million or something. I forget. So, okay. So I, they, they sit down and the first thing they wanted to know was about a politician that I had actually uh, bribed. It was a guy named Kevin White. He was, he was a city council member. He was running for city council and I had bribed him. Uh, we had met and 
he had solicited like campaign contributions, which I'd given him. And then at some point, he, I, he came back for more contributions. And I said, look, how much would it cost to actually win the election? And he said, man, the whole thing, maybe 20 grand, maybe 15, maybe 20 grand. I think he had told me, and I already have like five grand in my election account. I said, so if I give you 15 grand and you win this, I said, I want you to rezone all the vacant lots that I have that are single family. I want you to rezone them multifamily. No problem. He said, that's a, that's a done deal. So I go and I get him a bunch of cash at first and he says he can't take all the cash. So then I turn around and I go and I get all of my friends, family, my employees, everybody to write him checks for like 500 bucks. And so I give him a bunch of checks for 500 bucks and he deposits it. Some of those accounts went to people that didn't exist, like James Red, Brandon Green, Lee Black. Like they have a bank accounts, but they don't actually have, they're not actual people. So the during the course of their investigation, the FBI realized that I had a bunch of my fake people's checks had gone to this political candidate who it ended up winning. I gave him a total of twenty two thousand dollars. I think seven thousand was in cash, fifteen thousand was uh or is in checks. So they wanted to know what happened here. Like we've investigated several people, like they had talked to with this one guy that what my business partner was named Dave Walker. They said, we talked to Dave Walker. Dave Walker said that you had bribed this politician. And they talked to several other people that had all agreed, yeah, Matt bribed him, Matt got him elected to city council. Well, I said, yeah, that's what happened. I mean, they already have the, they have, they have everything. They've got all the evidence. They've got people saying, and I was like, yeah, absolutely. That's what happened. I remember when they asked me about that, I was shocked because I hadn't even thought about that guy. Like there was so much fraud going on that there are things that have happened that people will mention to me now that I'm out of prison that I've never thought. I'm like, oh my God, I totally forgot about, like I never talk about it. I completely forget about it, forgot about it. That was one of them. Till the FBI mentioned it, I'd completely forgotten that I'd gotten this guy elected to city council. He ended up parlaying that city council seat and becoming a city, a county commissioner. What's funny about that is he ultimately gets indicted for bribery. Now, there were all these articles that, anyway, I'll, I'll get into it later, but there was, there was a bunch of articles that had said, hey, this guy Cox just implicated Kevin White. Kevin White comes out like, he's just a jailhouse snitch. He's lying. Like, he gave some money to my campaign. I haven't done anything wrong. Of course, a couple of years later, he got, he gets indicted for bribery, goes to trial and loses. So he goes to trial and loses for bribery. Anyway, not that I'm not, you know, a jailhouse snitch. I'm just saying in general, he, he was also a liar. So, Here's what happens. I go to the FBI. They start questioning me. I remember Candace Calderon. I met Candace Calderon, and this was one of the FBI agents. This is the FBI agent that I called several times when I was on the run. Tried to turn myself in, got into kind of an argument with her. And I remember when I when she first saw me, she walked up to me. So this woman's like 5'11", maybe 5'10", or 6' foot tall. She's in that range, and she wears heels. She's got fake tits, dark tan, and just towers over me. And she remembers she got close to me and looked down at me and she goes, I told you we were going to meet someday. I told you they were going to catch you. And I was just like, oh my God. She was just like a, a law enforcement zealot, like just hated my guts. So anyway, we sit down for our debriefing. First thing she wants to talk about is Kevin White. I tell her about Kevin White. Then she wants to talk about like uh, basically my mortgage company. She says it's something like $40 million in fraudulent mortgages that she estimates have gone through there. She had been working with a bunch of my, uh, of the, my co-conspirators. Something like 12 people had been indicted on that case. And but none of them had ever been actually arrested. So they were indicted as what's called an unknown co-conspirator. So it's like this person is, is like they would say um, DW. Well, that's Dave Walker, but they don't name the person. They're an unnamed co-conspirator. They call him DW. So they know we've indicted them, but we're not releasing the name. Anyway, a bunch of people have been indicted. Uh, they hadn't been arrested yet. 
So I sit down, they pull out documents. I say, yes, this is fraudulent. Yes, this is fraudulent. Yes, that's fraud. They're like, how did you figure out this? I did this, I did this. Well, where did the money go here? There was this much money. I was like, no, no, look, this money, I brought $40,000, but I got back $56,000. It went to this construction company. If you go to that construction company, I had a bank account there. That money went into the bank account. That bank account then turned around and wrote a check back to me, or I got it out in cash, or I got whatever. So I break it all down. We're in, I'm interviewed by them for at least three or four days. And, you know, and Candace was just snide the entire time. Uh, it, it was ridiculous. Uh, they pulled out all kinds of documents. I was able to verify stuff for them and, and, you know, and explain. It's so funny because there were some people that had completely buried me. There was like half those people, more than half the people had buried me but all said they didn't know anything. It's like, it's clear that you did this loan. It's clear that you got the money for this loan. It's clear that you were involved. Everybody's saying, and, and what's so funny is like, one person goes in and says, I, uh, Matt did this, and so-and-so did this, and so-and-so did this, and so-and-so did this, but I didn't do anything. I didn't know what was happening. But then the next person comes in and says, so-and-so did this, so-and-so did this, Matt did this, and then points at the other person and says, he did this, but I didn't do anything. Somebody else comes in and says, so-and-so did this, so-and-so did this, and this person and this person were involved, but I didn't do anything. So they, by the time it's done, you've got every one of these people has five or six or eight people pointing at them saying, they were involved and if you follow the money you realize very quickly they were all involved we even had an investor i even had an investor out of uh atlanta that had invested like i don't know two three hundred thousand dollars at a time where he was funding loans and then getting money back I and mean, we were flipping properties for him and he was acting as a hard what's called the hard money lender so we even had this investor that knew the whole thing was a scam. And when, and, and he's also was indicted. He's indicted on my indictment. He's one of my co-conspirators. He actually went to the U.S. Attorney's Office and said, when you add up Cox's restitution, add like $20,000 for my legal fees. Because he was saying he didn't do anything. He didn't realize he was indicted already. And the U.S. Attorney Act, actually added that 20 grand or 30 grand, whatever he paid. They added his legal fees to my restitution because he had been named as an unnamed co-conspirator, not actually named, and was saying he didn't know anything about it. He was innocent. He had made a few hundred thousand dollars of fraudulent money during a conspiracy that he knew about and actively participated in, he made a couple hundred thousand and then hit me for 40 or 30 grand, 20 or 30 grand for his legal fees. But I mean, that's just how the Fed works. Like it's completely fucked up. Um, I give you, so, you know, like that's literally like one of the people that would say like, I'm a victim. You're not a victim. You're a criminal. I don't owe you any money. Anyway, um, so during the course of this whole thing, I'm interviewed by the FBI and eventually, you know, they add, they're, they're, they're coming up with all kinds of numbers. And I'm, I'm saying that this is a loan. This isn't fraudulent. This is fraudulent. That's a legitimate loan. Like anything my name was attached to, they wanted to say was fraud. Um, eventually that ends up, that whole thing ends up uh, wrapping up. I go back to, you know, ACDC to the detention center and maybe a few weeks later, it may have actually been during the process, during the time that I was being uh, interviewed or during these two interviews, I'm the U.S. attorney comes to my lawyer and says, we want him, to, Mr. Cox, to be interviewed by Dateline. The reason I think she wanted me to be interviewed by Dateline was because if they interviewed me, they would interview her. So... She, uh, Gail McKenzie, like, was like a, a, a media whore. Like, she loved the media. And so, I, my lawyer said, so Gail actually told my lawyer, Millie, she said, listen, let Mr. Cox know that if he does this interview with Dateline, we'll consider it substantial assistance and we'll reduce his sentence, you know, for it. 
So I was like, absolutely, I'll be in, I'll be interviewed. So I go to be interviewed. Dateline, they show up. I forget the name of that guy of the guy. He's got white hair. He's got like a long face. Um, he does Dateline. Oh gosh, everybody knows him. You would know his voice immediately. So I do and I do this. Uh, I, I do the interview. He comes in and he interviews me and and he was like what did you did you see the old the other episode cuz they had already had one episode he goes did you see that episode i said yes i did and he said what did you think of it and i went i thought it was horrible i think you guys misrepresented what happened i think you painted me out to be like these women were all victims when in fact i had we were just dating like they wanted to be involved in it so i he goes well that's that's why we're interviewing you so you can set it straight so then he starts interviewing me and you can, you can tell from the beginning, like he's just trying to just make me look as bad as possible. He's asking all kinds of fucked up questions. I remember one of the questions was, he said, um, what did he say? One of the questions that he said was, uh, um, you've hurt a lot of people. And I went, well, I don't think I've hurt anybody. I mean, I've, I've financially inconvenienced a lot of people, but... You know, nobody claimed bankruptcy. Nobody lost a ton of money. Like, I mean, and he goes, you've hurt a lot of people. I said, well, once again, I said, I think I've inconvenienced some people. I've caused some people to lose money, but I've never physically harmed anybody. You've hurt a lot of people. And I, I, I'm looking around and I went, you seem to be stuck on hurt. And I went, so, uh, yeah, okay. So I said, I, I mean, if you want me to say I hurt people, I said, yeah, I hurt people. I mean, what, what, what are you getting at? What, why are you, you know, he goes, and then they, he just kept going. So when they go back, they take the film and he says, you've hurt a lot of people. And they edit it so that he says, you've hurt a lot of people. And I say, what are you getting at? Yeah, okay. So I've hurt some people. I mean, wh what are you getting at? I mean, it, it sounds so callous and everything about it, like he would say something and then they would cut it so that I would like smile or kind of laugh when I never actually laughed. And I mean, it just, it was just so, such a blatant hatchet job. Not that what I did wasn't bad enough. It's like, like if you, if you, you know, if you slam somebody for something that they honestly did and you just portray it accurately like i get that that's you know the guy's a scumbag but if you go out of your way to also say like he targeted single women uh single mothers he forced them to get boob jobs leave their children commit fraud and sent them to jail like said whoa 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 none of that happened but that's the kind of you know slash and burn tactics that a tabloid um news program like dateline does and they really just gutted me what's so funny about that is that when they played that episode, I was still at ACDC and I was, and I knew it was coming on. And I remember saying, look, I want to watch this because I didn't know how editing worked. So I go, Hey, you guys, I want to watch this TV show. I'm going to be on Dateline. They're doing like a one hour special. And so everybody was like, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cox will watch it. There's like 150 guys around three different TVs in this pod with their seats up. Uh, pulled up to the TV and they play this episode. And of course, from a criminal perspective, me taking advantage of single mothers and me robbing people or, or, or ripping people off and me like all these things that didn't happen. These guys are dying laughing. They're like, yo, bro, like, dang, Cox. And they're laughing. And I'm like, that's not what happened. That's not what happened. That's not what, and, and they're just like loving it. Like I was like a, a celebrity after that. They just thought it was the coolest thing ever. And it was in the horror, if you watch, if you, if I've never watched it since, but it, it, it was, it, I just remember watching it at the time and thinking it was horrible. So anyway, looking back, I guess it's actually comical because it, in my opinion now, it's like saying, you murdered 14 people and I'm going, oh, I only murdered 10. What does it matter? You're still murdered 10 people. Like you're still a piece of shit, you know? So like, I'm still a piece of garbage. So the, the program doesn't really matter, but it is funny because it was the first time I really understood the, the power of the media and how much they twisted things. Like there were definitely things that I absolutely didn't do that they were saying I did. And it was like, wow, like, 
that makes it sound, the way they made it sound, 100% credible. And that's why I just don't believe the media anymore. So everything they say, I think, eh, maybe. So what happens is at some point, my lawyer comes to me and she says, we got what's called your pre-sentence report. And I go, okay. And she goes, here's your pre-sentence report. And she gives it to me. And my pre-sentence report, uh, the calculation says that uh, my sentence is going to be 32 years to life. I actually have a pre-sentence report. I actually still have it. it. It literally says 32 years of life. And it says that I owe in restitution after they sold everything. I owe $9.5 million. 9.5. Nine $9.5 million. 32 years of life. Like they're saying the judge can give him life. I mean, if you listen to the other series of videos that I did, you should realize I've done nothing to get a life sentence. Really, I didn't give anything to get 30 years. So I freak out. And what's so funny is my lawyer's like, that's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. She's like, you can't even get a life sentence. The most you can get is 32 years. And I'm like, that's hardly what I want to hear. I'm like, you said, like she had, at that point, she had been telling me something like 13 to 15, like 15 years on the high side, 12 to 13 years. You're probably looking at 10, but 12, 12 to 13 years. Plus you're going to get your sentence reduced. You're right. I met with the FBI. I met with the Secret Service. I did Dateline. You're right. I'm probably, I, I, I'm supposed to get my sentence reduced. So she said, so, and then we go over the sentencing, the, uh, we go over the uh, PSI, um, and she starts saying, look, they've got a bunch of enhancements that just don't apply to you. This, did you ever do this? I'm like, no, that doesn't imply. She goes, right, exactly. What about this? So we start, I'm like, they give me enhancements that just didn't apply. I felt they didn't apply. She felt they didn't apply. So I felt pretty good. So we, she says, don't worry, we're going to get in front of the judge. We're going to argue. You know, we're going to get them down. In the meantime, I'm telling her, I just want to remove my plea. I'd rather go to trial because if I can get... At least at trial, I can lay out the truth of what I did. And you, you also retain a lot of rights, of the right to appeal, uh, that sort of thing. When you sign a plea agreement, you remove all your, right, your rights to appeal. And so I said I wanted to remove my plea. So she calls the U.S. attorney and says, this is what's going on. He's freaking out. So they send the Secret Service agent comes down there and meets with me and meets with my attorney. And we basically argue about how much these enhancements don't apply. And I get it down to 26 years and four months. My lawyer says, don't worry, Matt, we're going to win these other enhancements, which I know we can win. We're going to get you down to around 14 years. If we had won those enhancements, it would have been 14 years. So then we go to trial. I'll be sorry. Then we go to sentencing. I get in front of the judge. My judge's name is uh, Judge Batten. And uh, his name is uh, yeah Timothy Batten, uh, in Atlanta, and and he was newly appointed. He'd been on the bench maybe a few months, maybe, I don't know, five or six, maybe six months or something. Not not that long. So I get in front of the judge. The U.S. attorney ar makes her argument. We make our argument about each enhancement. And as my lawyer mentions every enhancement, like your honor, this enhancement says that Mr. Cox used a government body to further his crime or a, he used, you know, he used the government, the government or a charitable institution to further his crime by, you know, by, by pretending to be them. And the example says that that's like they, the example they give is like, if you say that you're with the federal government or you're with the cancer society and you go knocking door to door, collecting money for the cancer society. Well, I didn't do that. I did say, Salvation Army, I had a little badge, and I, but I was giving people money. And they have multiple examples, and every example is saying you're whatever, you know, the Cancer Society and collecting money, collecting money, collecting money. I'm actually just getting money from people, or I'm actually giving money for surveys. So I'm not actually costing them anything. So she's saying that doesn't apply. Well, the judge hears the argument and goes, 
yeah, but I think he soiled their reputation. I'm going to let that stand. Bam. Two point enhancement. I lost it. You know, I lose it, lose that argument. The next one, same thing. Whatever it was, eh, I disagree. I'm going to let that stand. Listen, overruled every single objection we had. Right down the line, bop, 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 bop. Then, my, of course, the U.S. attorneys yelling and screaming, saying I deserve 26 years and four months. And the judge says, I agree. And uh, he gives me 26 years and four months. You know what's a funny thing about that is that they have one person, one victim that shows. No, they have two two victims that show up. One is Michael Shanahan. He shows up and says that I cost him $4,000 because he had to pay a lawyer $4,000. The lawyer had to talk to these two hard money lenders or three hard money lenders. So to correspond with the hard money lenders, it cost him $4,000. So I owe him $4,000. That's one of my victims. Everything else is banks. Second person I owe is someone named uh, Dr. Smith. I'm sorry, Dr. Smith, Dr. Brown. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Uh, Dr. Brown, I owe him, I want to say it was like ten or $15,000, something like that. Now, the thing about that was that I had bought their house, gave them twenty five grand down. Then they got their house back because they paid a lawyer $15,000. Then they resold the house and made another twenty five grand. So they technically made $10,000 on my fraud. The U.S. attorney refused to refused to take that into consideration and said that I owed the Dr. Brown $15,000. That's fine. My lawyer said, don't argue. Okay, fine. So I don't, I don't feel like I really owe him $15,000, but that's fine. So then the other lender that got up, or the other person that got up there was a victim. He got up and said, Mr. Cox, I'm a hard money lender. Mr. Cox borrowed $150,000 from me. And the U.S. attorney was like, you're not a big faceless law, uh, bank, uh, Mr. Cox. That was your money, your personal money. And he was like, yeah, it's, yeah, it was, it was, well, it's, he said, yes, yes. It's, 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 it's based on credit lines and things of that nature. But yes, it's basically I'm responsible for the money. Okay. So she says, so she goes back and forth and, and you lost all that money. You haven't received any of that money back. Have you, you've lost all that. Mr. Co Mr. Cox robbed you for 150 or stole $150,000 from you. And he went, sat there for a minute and he goes, well, actually, actually, no, I, um, I actually got paid back. And she goes, well, what? And this is a conversation they're having right there in front of the judge and the courtroom and the reporters. She goes, what do you mean? And he says, yeah, I actually got the title company paid me back. She goes, you got all the money back? Yeah. And she goes, what about the payments? And he goes, no, I got all the payments too. They paid me the payments and the late payment, everything. I got all my money back. She goes, what? You didn't lose anything? He goes, no. She goes, did you, well, did you have to hire a lawyer at all? Some, anything? And he goes, oh, no, no. He goes, I did. I did hire a lawyer and that was about $1,500. She goes, well, that's $1,500. That's a lot of money. Mr. Cox owes you $1,500. And he goes, right. No, no. And, and she goes, and you couldn't afford to lose $1,500, could you? And he goes, no, no, uh, no, no, no. I, I, it, that was, I couldn't afford to lose $1,500. That was a lot of money. That was, it was like so, it was just so stupid. It was like, <laughs> it was just like, what are you doing? Like, okay, it's $1,500. Like, I get it. You know, if, if, if it had been $30, she would have said, well, that's a lot of money. Mr. Cox should have to go to jail for 20 years for that. That's all you, you couldn't afford to lose that. Could you? Like, I mean, she was just so, it was just ridiculous. Anyway, not that I don't know the money, not that I'm not a scumbag. I'm just saying, whatever you know it's, it's just it was just ridiculous it was such a dog and pony show hey i wanted to let you guys know that i have a patreon account if you're interested in joining the patreon account it's got three tiers the top tier you actually get a different con man painting every single month if you're already joined and you're already supporting me i really appreciate that if you haven't joined yet and you're interested in joining i'm going to leave the contact information for patreon in the description thank you very much for for watching the video back to the video so they get up there they talk the judge is glaring at me i remember he kind of calls me uh says uh that what i did was a uh, sociopathic in nature and it was a complete disregard for uh my victims and keep in mind they're saying i have over 50 victims 
but there's only four individuals that I owe money to. They, so the total, if you add up all the money that I owe them, it's not more than 30 grand. It doesn't even come to 30 grand. Not that that's not a lot of money. Not that I don't owe it. Um, anyway, so what ends up happening is, uh, as far as that's concerned, is the judge, you know, the judge basically says I'm a piece of garbage and that I need to go to jail for 26 years. And the U.S. attorney tells him, you know, she tells him, you know, before he sentences me, he's like, she says, listen, Mr. Cox has cooperated, but there's ongoing investigations and he will be coming back here. Most likely, or he'll be, he should be coming back to get time knocked off of his sentence. Now, the other thing is we asked to be, have time knocked off for Dateline because she said, I will consider it substantial assistance and, and reduce your sentence. Um, when my lawyer said, what about Dateline? The U.S. attorney, Gail McKenzie, said, well, I said I'd consider it substantial assistance. I've considered it. It's not. So substantial assistance means cooperation. So she said, I've considered it. Eh, no, it's not cooperation. And she didn't give me anything. Met with the FBI, met with the Secret Service, gave them information. Not good enough. They haven't actually arrested anybody. So I don't get anything. There's ongoing investigations is what they said. Fine. So I'm thinking my lawyer's like, don't worry. They're going to, when they arrest people, uh, uh, they'll, they'll, well, after they go out and they get these arrests, they'll reduce your sentence. Okay. That's fine. So go to prison. You'll be fine. That's fine. So I, I, I got 26 years and four months. My mom's in the fucking courtroom crying her eyes out. My dad's in the courtroom shaking his head like I'm just a piece of fucking garbage that I am. Um, I'm, I don't know what to say. Like I'm, I'm completely crushed. I remember when I walked, was walked back to the marshals, U.S. marshals holdover. Um, it was this long hallway, and the U.S. marshal was walking me back, and he was just a chatty old guy. Like he's like, "Wow, so um." Jesus, 26 years. That's, that's hard. Like, I don't, you don't, you don't usually see that, like, especially white collar. I never see, never seen 26 years. That may be one of the harshest, that may be the harshest sentence I think I've ever seen and heard of it being imposed. Cause at that time, there was no Bernie Madoff. There was those guys, that was later. Like the white collar crime, you're just not getting that kind of time. But you have to think, we were, it was by this point, it's 2000, it's late 2007, and the entire housing market is starting to kind of implode. And they needed somebody to blame. And so, you know, they're kind of talking about how I'm the, I'm the mortgage industry's worst nightmare and this and that. And the truth is, like, I, it, was, it was not a billion dollar fraud. This was, this was a six million dollar loss. Because that's one of the other things I had done with the U.S. or with the, when we had argued with the Secret Service is I got them from nine and a half million down to six million. They agreed I only lost owed six million dollars so for six million dollars if you look on the guidelines without all these ridiculous uh without all of these ridiculous enhancements i should have gotten like like six or seven years even if you added this added together so maybe 10 at the worst 10 26 years and four months so i remember walking listening to this this u.s marshal i get all the way back to the marshal's the holdover and still inside the federal building, the federal court building. And I, I walk back and I remember this one guy, there was a guy that was there that was like a gay guy. And, and when people would come back, everybody was, is sitting around. There's like 10 guys in a cell and they were all go, what'd you get? And guys would be like, Oh, I got three years. Oh, I got seven years. Oh, I got, I got 37 months or, you know, whatever. And I went, I got over 26 years. And I remember the gay guy goes, Oh my God. Like the judge didn't, he didn't throw the book at you. He jumped over the bench and bludgeons you with it. Oh my God. I like put his hand to his chest and started walking around. I go, oh my God. Oh my God. I can't believe you got that much time. Oh my God. Like, I was just like, like wasn't making things better. I then end up going back to when they move us back to ACDC. 
and I walk into the court or into the, the unit, I had just been on TV. My sentence had just been read on TV. So when they walk me in in my shackles and 150 guys are, they, of course, everybody's just eaten. They finished eating. They've just watched TV and they know I got this much time and I walk in the door. So you got 150 guys staring at me. Guys are walking out of the second tier um, cells to walk and look down at me. And I mean, just the all 150 guys staring at me at once. And it just like hit me. And I mean, I just burst into fucking t- like tears just rolled down my face. And I walked straight in my fucking cell. Like I just got a hold of myself. And I walked straight in my cell and lay down. And I fucking slept for like two or three days. It was just horrible like i had guys coming in the room saying cox man i'm so sorry bro you don't deserve that i'm sorry i know you can do something you're a smart guy you're gonna figure this out you're gonna get out of this you know but the truth is is i i i I just i overwhelmingly thought i was just was just doomed like i was never gonna survive that with game time with game time my out date was 2030 that's with good time off means that if I serve that sentence and I was good, never lost a day of good time, I was going to get out in 2030. If I lost gain time, which most inmates do, let's say I lost all my gain time, I would have been getting out when I was, it would be like, it would have been like, I think it would have been like 2035 or late 2034. I would have been 60. So, at that point, a few days later, a guy, or a few days later, they shipped me to Coleman. Well, it, actually, a few days later, they, they shipped me to the Atlanta City pris- um, uh, U.S. Penn, which is where they have a, a holdover. And from there, they shipped me to Coleman, to the medium security prison. Keep in mind, I'm a white collar criminal with no history of violence. And they sent me to a medium security prison, which is essentially, it's a real prison. Like these are prisons, there's riots, there's stabbings, there's violent guys, guys are there with life sentences. It's a fucking hellhole. And so that's where I went. And I went to that prison, they marched me in and I went into art, went through, you go through what's called, you know, R&D, receiving and departure. And, uh, and I went in there and, you know, they fingerprint you. And so... Uh, my first day in federal prison after, you know, after I went through processing and, you know, they fingerprint you and take your photo and you answer some questions. Then they send you, well, they, then they sent me to, uh, it was basically like a, a, a hub unit where you, you kind of get categorized. And I, uh, I went to this unit. I want to say it was A2. So, in the federal prison I went to, I went to obviously the complex and I've, I think I've already explained that in a different video, but I was in the medium and there's three large buildings in the medium and they're, gosh, they're like four stories high. And so the first place I was play, so you would have like A building, B building, C building. Well, in A building, there's, you know, unit, you know, A1, A2, A3, and A4. So I think I went to A2. So I go to A2, and as soon as I go in there, you they give you a card, like a bed card or a cell card, and you go in there and you give the officer your card. So I walk in, I give him my card, and I say, hey, I, I need to be assigned a, I just got here, need to be assigned a um, cell. And he, he assigns me a cell. I go straight in, and I there was a Mexican guy that was in there. Uh, and he, you know, real nice guy introduced myself, introduced himself and was like, okay, Hey, you know, you get the, you get, cause he had been there longer. So he had the bottom bunk. It was a two man cell. He said, you know, you're in the, you're in the, uh, top, uh, you're on the top bunk. So I go on the top bunk. I put my bed roll, you know, you have to go there. You have like a, a bed roll and, and it's, it's a pillow which is horrible. You get like a pillow, a couple of sheets. Uh, a, I think I think you get two blankets and like two sheets and, and then a, a pillow case and, and a really crappy pillow. Or they don't give you a pillow at all because they just don't have any. So you get a crappy pillow. So I go in there. Uh, I, I walk in. I get introduced to this guy. 
really nice guy. He was from Texas. Um, I think they called him a Texicana or something like that. They've got like a name for him. And he's, uh, you know, he's part of like uh, the, I think they're called Cervenos, uh, which is a, a gang. It's kind of like a loose affiliated gang of different types of, of Mexicans. And they also, all the Mexicans kind of click up. And all, so in prison, most prisons, you know, all the blacks will kind of click up and they'll have what they call different cars. But they all basically kind of click up together. The blacks click up, the whites click up, the Hispanics clip up, uh, click up, click up. And, and then they have what's, what's called different cars. And so you may be a black guy and you'll, but you'll be in, let's say the Georgia car. Why? Cause you're from Georgia. So, you know, you want to be around your homeboys. And so you have something in common. So I go in the cell, the, the, uh, the Mexican guy is really cool. Um, you know, he's clicked up with the, uh, with, uh, kind of that, that prison game, the Cervenos and, he asked me like, Hey, are, you know, do you know, do you have anybody here? I said, I don't know. I got a, I got a cousin that's in prison here somewhere. And he goes, okay, okay. What's his name? And I told him his name. He said, okay, well, I'll try and help you find him. He goes, there's not a lot of white guys here. He said, it should be easy to find him. I said, okay. And he said, you need to, um, you know, he said, uh, uh, go check the call out sheet, see if he's on the call out sheet. Cause there's a sheet every day of, of people that come out on the call out sheet and they have to go to different you have different things scheduled. So one day I may be on the call out sheet to go see my counselor at two o'clock, or I may be on the call out sheet to see, um, you know, medical or whatever. So I checked the call out sheet and he explained to me that every day you have to check the call out sheet to see if you have any appointments. So I go and I check the call out sheet and I don't have any appointments, but I know within the next few days, I will have appointments with like my counselor, with medical, with, um, education will want to see you. There's a whole bunch of things you're going to have to do. Hey, I wanted to let you guys know that I have a Patreon account. If you're interested in joining the Patreon account, it's got three tiers. The top tier, you actually get a different con man painting every single month. If you're already joined and you're already supporting me, I really appreciate that. If you haven't joined yet and you're interested in joining, I'm going to leave the contact information for Patreon in the description. Thank you very much for watching the video. Back to the video. While I was looking at the call out sheet, I remember suddenly like they start, there's like a, a you know, the PA system suddenly they start screaming out, lockdown, lockdown, lockdown. And everybody just immediately starts moving. Like there's like a hundred, 150 guys in this one unit, maybe one between, I think probably one between 120 and 150. So guys are, are rushing all over the place and they're, you know, they're running uh, back and forth. And what they're running around to do is to get things like heat up a soup. So that they know that they might be locked down for the next couple of hours. And so they want to be able to put a soup in the microwave. And each unit had two or three microwaves. Uh, or maybe they're just going to get hot water because maybe you didn't get hot water in the, in the sinks and in, in the actual room. Whatever the thing they did was they would run around to other guys, other cells and ask for, for stuff or they would go to right away. They'd go to, let's say the, the store man because in every unit, there's at least one or two guys that run what's called a store. So some guy will have, he keeps like 20 or 30 soups. He'll keep 20 or 30 soups. He'll have like seven or eight different candy bars. Uh, he'll have, you know, like five Snickers, five, um, you know, Kit Kats, five, whatever. He'll have bags of potato chips. He'll have extra sodas. And he keeps all that stuff in his locker. And so you can go to that guy and say, Hey man, can I get a, a soda? And he'll sell you a soda for, let's say two stamps. Well, soda costs him, you know, 50 cents. He'll sell it to you for two or three stamps. Well, a stamp's worth about at that point, about 50 cents. So you give him two stamps or you give him three stamps and he would give you a soda. Or he would write it, he would write down a list of things that you owed him. And then he would add it up for how much money you owed him. And then when it's your turn to go to commissary, and I can, you know, I think everybody knows what commissary is basically the where you buy stuff on the compound and you go there once a week. So he would give you a list of things to buy him that's equivalent to what you owed him. And that's how he kept his store restocked and he basically had about a 50 percent markup on anything that he bought so it's a good little 
gig for him, for the store man. Um, of course, sometimes people run up in debt, they don't pay or they get shipped or moved. But either way, if you're making a 50% markup or sometimes double, some of these guys are charging like double. Uh, it depends on you know what the item is. So guys are running the store man, they're screaming, lockdown, lockdown. I don't really know what lockdown is. In the in the Marshall's holdover, when they call, told us to go to our rooms, they would just announce, go to your rooms. So I, everybody's screaming, everybody's running around, the PA system is going off, the CO's yelling at guys to hurry up and get in their room. The CO, basically, as soon as they scream lockdown, he walks to the very first cell and locks the door. And if you're not in your cell, you get what's called a disciplinary shot. You, they call it, they write you a shot and you get a disciplinary, you know, um, uh, whatever um, shot on your record or whatever you want to call it. I don't know. Uh, I don't know what, what it stands for. But the point is, is that he, he immediately walks to the first cell. So if you're in the first cell, you basically never have any time at all. Now, great, granted, you get out before everybody else, but you never have any time to do anything. So he walks to the first cell and guys are screaming, wait, wait. And they're running to get in their cells. And, and so, but if you're the guy in the last cell, you've got 15 minutes to heat stuff up. So guys are running around getting stuff. And I, and all of a sudden I'm just sitting there. I don't know what's happening. I just noticed this, the guards were running around locking doors. They're screaming. I'm starting to think, Hey, I think I'm supposed to go to my cell. My old, my new cell, he comes walking over to me and he says, he says, Hey man, Cox, Cox, he says, you got to go in the cell, man. You got to go in the cell. Come on. We got to go in the cell. And I went, okay, bro. And I turned around and I said, Oh, why? What's going on? What's going on? He said, he said, yeah, man, uh, uh, not a big, it's not a big deal, man. We're just getting locked down. He said, somebody got stabbed in the yard. And I went, and I remember thinking, oh my God, someone just got killed. Like they just, somebody just got murdered in the yard. Cause to me, getting stabbed meant they killed you. It's like to me, if they say, yeah, man, they shot him. I think you died. I didn't realize that apparently people get shot and stabbed all the time. They just don't die. So. He said, uh, he goes, nah, man, they just stabbed this guy up in the yard. And I went, bro, I said, oh my God, goes, somebody just got killed in the yard. He goes, nah, bro, they just stabbed him up a little bit. And he kind of did his hand like this, like, like, cha -cha 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 -cha, like, you, like a bunch of little stabs. Goes, nah, they just stabbed him up a little bit. He goes, he, goes, he ain't going to die or nothing. He said, they just stabbed him up, you know, teach him a lesson. And I thought, man, that's where you're at, bro. You're at a place where to teach you a lesson, the inmates stab each other. Now I went in and I just remember thinking, Oh my God, like that's rough. Like you're in a fucking rough spot. So I go, I end up going into the cell and I remember thinking they just stabbed somebody. We're going to be locked in for a long time, days, maybe literally by the, that was whatever time it was. I don't know. One or two o'clock by Four o'clock, they unlock the doors and they serve chow. Everybody stands by the door. The units get called in in a different order because they have an inspection every week to determine which units get called first. If you have the best, cleanest unit, then that unit gets called first. And so there's first, second, third, fourth, fifth, you know, all the way. They have 12 units total. Three buildings, 12 units. So the guy says... uh you know, um, they announce chow, they open the doors, we walk out, we stand by the front door. And then a few minutes later, they open the door and we go straight to the chow hall. Like, I don't know anything. I'm just following people at this point. Like, nobody's told me anything. So I, I walk straight to, you know, my celly barely speaks English. So I walk straight to the chow hall. I stand in line. I go in. They give me, uh, they give us food. The food was really not bad. Now, here's the thing. They have, at this point, every facility cook their own food. They had a list of what they were going to serve week to week, but they didn't, um, they didn't have what they ultimately moved to what's called a national menu where every place is served the same meal throughout the country. So at this point, each each prison was in charge of making their own meals. So they gave them a budget. They spend that money. Coleman had good food. They had, when I went in the chow hall, I remember being shocked because they had 
uh, they had Coca-Cola products. Like you could literally go get a fountain drink. You could walk up and get a Sprite or a Coca-Cola or a Diet Coke or whatever. Like they had all these fountain drinks. The food was good. It was like fried chicken or something. I was like, oh my God, like I, I'm a, this is all right. Like this is not bad at all. I'd been living in, I'd been, uh, in Atlanta city detention center, which was the U.S. Marshals holdover and it, the food was horrible. So, you know, I got there and I was like, wow, this is like, they're feeding us way better than we deserve. Um, and so I got some food, sat down, you know, I ate, I remember I walked up to a, a table. And there was a, there were a couple black guys that were there. And I go, do you guys mind if I sit? And the guy was, they looked up and they went, nah, man, they ain't no, there's no assigned seating here, seating here. You can sit wherever you want, bro. I sat down. I ate. I came back. Uh, I came back to the unit. Um, I've heard from my celly later that the guy that got sat, uh, got stabbed, it was over something ridiculous, like a small debt that he owed or people get stabbed would get stabbed over all kinds of things. They would get stabbed over. Listen, I've, I saw a guy get hit with a lock with a like stabbing. It's funny because stabbings are not nearly as bad as well, as bloody as being hit with like a lock. I saw a guy probably within a few weeks of that. I actually saw a guy get hit with a lock and that somebody uh, it was there were two like Mexicans and one uh, Mexican guy had a lock on a belt and he had it tied around his his hand and then they they leave it just about that much right so about four or five inches to the lock and what happens is he I was standing in line in the direct center waiting the rec yard whatever you call it and I was about to waiting for the gate to open I'm just standing they have two different gates so I was at the second gate or the first gate. So I'm at the first gate and I'm waiting to go into this, the bull, this bullpen area to go to the second, uh, have the second gate open, which actually lets you out of the, out of the yard. So I'm waiting there for them to call the, what they call a move. I'll explain that in a second. And this guy runs up and I'm literally standing right beside this Mexican guy. He's right here. His head is right here. And I'm just standing because you're all kind of crowded. So I'm standing there waiting and another Mexican guy runs up behind him with a lock and goes thump and just hits him in the head. Thump, thump. This was just as the door had opened. So the guy kind of stumbles forward through the door, through the gate, and he, and he stumbles, hits the ground, goes to stand up, holding his hand, his head. Thump. The guy hits him again. Thump. Hits him again. He falls down, waits a minute. Guy goes to get up again. Thump. He must have hit him six times. All in the head. This guy was bleeding like I've never seen blood like this. I mean, this was, this was like just gushing blood. I didn't realize it, but uh, at, till, at, you know, later when I talked to some people about it, they were like, oh, yeah, you're, they always tend to hit each other in the head because your head bleeds a lot. And this guy bled so much that he had a white shirt on that when he was done looked like a dark, like burgundy, just just completely drenched, like tie dyed. But I mean, there was 80 percent of it was covered down his back, his front. I mean, he's holding his head. He's been over. That guy, as bad as he was bleeding, actually tried to get out of the rec yard to go back to the unit. Didn't want to tell anybody. Didn't want to go to medical because he knew if he went to medical, they're going to stitch him up. They're going to put him in the shoe and they're going to ship him. Even if he told on the other guy that hit him, he knew that he was still going to end up getting shipped. And then the other guy gets shipped and then he goes somewhere else and he's a, and they would be tell, saying, oh, he's a snitch because I because he told on the guy that hit him with a lock. Well, I found out later that that guy actually got hit with the lock specifically because the one Mexican, the one in front of me was messing with the other Mexicans punk. A punk in prison is like your boyfriend. So you have like a male dominated, uh, a male and female kind of a you know, homosexual relationship and the female, the one person that plays the punk or the woman is called a punk. So he, the one guy was messing with the other guy's punk. He told him several times, don't fuck with my punk anymore. He didn't, he wouldn't heed the other guy's warning. And so eventually he got a, a, a lock and a belt and ran up behind him and thump, 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 thump. I don't know whatever happened. Yeah, I know. Yeah. 
It was like a rough high school. You're playing, you're, don't mess with my, my girlfriend and, oh, fuck you. I'll do what I want to do. And the guy keeps messing with him. The girlfriend keeps saying he's messing with me. He's bothering me. And then what happened? They get into a fist fight. Only they didn't get into a fist fight. They took a lock and smash the other dude. Hey, if you guys didn't know, I also do, I do paintings. And uh, if you're interested in a painting, I'm going to leave my contact information in the description beneath the video. Back to the video. So the, the thing about being in that prison, one of the things, other than when my cousin showed up and I met my cousin, which is hilarious. This guy was nuts. So that, you know, the prison was what it, in all in most prisons except for except for camps you have what's called controlled movements and so what happens is at the at the beginning of each hour so let's say at, at let's say at a quarter till or more like 10 till 1 they call a move they unlock all the doors in the prison and they say you know a uh, uh, one o'clock move one o'clock move and so you have from 1250 to, to one o'clock to leave the unit or leave wherever you are located and get to another place in the prison. So if you're on the rec yard and they call the one o'clock move, which is about 10 till one, they open the, they open the compound for 10 minutes and you have to race across the compound because the buildings are really spread up, spread out. You have to kind of, kind of walk fast, like a, like a, like an old soccer, like a soccer mom or something, you know, you do like the fast walking across the compound to try and get to, let's say the library, because you might have an appointment at the library, or maybe you have to get to medical because you have a medical appointment or you have to meet your counselor or you have to go to school. Maybe you're trying to get your GED. I don't know. Or you go to Votech with a, a vocational, um, it's a vocational school that they have there. And, or maybe you have to go to work. You know, they have a, a unicorn there. With unicorn is where you, it's a, it's a factory in the prison that hires the prisoners to work there and make things. I want to say they made, um, they made the partition walls for like cubicles in offices. So unicorn made those walls. Um, uh, what else? Uh, yeah, so you might, you gotta get to work and they call one o'clock move, two o'clock move, three o'clock move, and then a four o'clock move. You'd have to go back to the unit and then they count you like they, they would count all of us at, I want to say they count you throughout the night, but they count you at like 10 o'clock in the morning after you wake up at like, they call it count you at like six. They count you at like 10. They count at again at 12 and then at four o'clock and then again at 10 o'clock. So anyway, uh, I would say by the second or third day, I'd had a couple of white guys approach me and they wanted to see my paperwork. And I actually had my pre-sentence report. I actually had the report that was done on me by, uh, by the, uh, the probation officer in my case uh, which works for the U.S. Attorney's Office. So the U.S. Attorney and the probation officer actually prepared a document. I think I talked about a PSI too. It's like a recommend, it's a recommendation. It basically goes over all your charges and where you fall in the federal sentencing guideline. So what happens is in that document, if you cooperated, it typically says you cooperated and you got a sentence reduction, but I didn't get a sentence reduction. So, but I did cooperate but I didn't get any benefit from it. So guys are saying, white guys are coming up to me going, yo, bro, you know, like, you know, you're going to have in the next week or two, you're going to have to figure out how to show your PSI or your pre, P some people call it a PSI. Some people call it a PSR, your pre-sentence report. It's pre-sentence investigation report. So we need to see your PSI. And I was like, yeah, okay. Okay. And I, within probably a few days, my lawyer actually mailed it in. And I remember I got it. And this one white guy in the unit said, um, we were talking and he said, yeah, bro. He said, you know, these guys are asking about your PS, PSI. And I was like, okay. I said, well, I've got it. I said, I got it in. And he goes, oh, can I see it? I said, sure. So I open it up and he looks through it. And as he's looking through it, he goes, yeah, bro. It looks like you, uh, damn, man, they really busted you in the head, didn't they? They, they got 26 years, man. That's crazy. I said, I know. And he looked it over and he said, yeah, bro, it says you're good. I said, well, what do you understand what you're looking for? And he goes, oh, to see if you cooperated. He said, you know, like, like, uh, if you fucking snitched on anybody. And I go, why would it say in my PSI? He goes, well, usually because it'll tell you got a reduction. And I said, 
No, I didn't get a reduction. Said, yeah, I know. He said, a few people asked me, did you, hey, man, what's up? Did you get a sentence reduction? I was like, no, because I didn't. And I remember the guy was like, yeah, bro, it looks good. It looks good. And I said, you want to know if I cooperated? And he goes, yeah. And I said, yeah, bro. I said, I fucking cooperated on everybody. I said, it just didn't do, it just didn't, it just didn't get anything for it. And he looked at me and he was like, yo, man, I, I wouldn't tell anybody. <laughs> I wouldn't tell anybody that. And I went, why? And he said, yeah, man, these guys are going to have a problem with that. I said, okay. I said, and, and what? He said, well, you know, you're going to need people to back you up. And I was like, back me up for what? You know, like, you know, if you get into any shit, I go, what kind of shit would I get into? Like, what, what's going to happen to me? What am I going to do? Like, I'm not, it, I, I wasn't aware. Uh, I had been in a, in a U.S. Marshals holdover, which was tame. And it sucked because it was boring, but it was tame because there was no real gang politics. So I didn't really know what I was getting into. Anyway, he, the guy, so the guy that I talked to basically immediately went around telling everybody that I cooperated. For guys that, for guys that go to prison and want to only be around guys that mind their own business and don't talk shit and don't cooperate with the authorities and don't run their mouth and are respectful. These guys talk like a bunch of old women. They're always talking about each other. That's why they get in trouble. They talk shit about each other. They say stuff behind each other's back and then they get in trouble and they get beat up and they get hit with, hit with locks or stabbed up. Um, so anyway, yeah, that's, uh, uh, so right away, the white guys at Coleman Medium immediately don't like me. Like immediately they dislike me. I had already kind of gotten myself, I guess, in a, a jam, although I didn't think about it, uh, because I had basically told a guy that I cooperated. Even though my my priest, my PSI, um, which is my pre-sentence report, uh, investigation report, uh, was actually clean and actually looks like I didn't cooperate at all. But I told the guy, oh, yeah, I cooperated. But, you know, nothing ever happened with it. So the guy ended up going around the compound telling uh, all the uh, all the the stand up white guys. So what happened was uh, within a couple of days. I met my my cousin. I was actually in my in my cell and my cousin came up to me. Or I'm sorry, my cousin walked in my cell and he is my brother-in-law's cousin. He, so he's not my cousin. He's my cousin by marriage. But in prison, that's basically blood. So I'm sitting there drawing. I think I was just drawing something. And he comes in and uh, walks in. His name is Reese Townsend. And he goes, Matt, Matt Cox. And I looked up and I went, uh, yeah, what's going on? And I could tell right away, like, this guy's a maniac. This guy is super, he's skinny, he's tall, he's got, um, like, at that point, I don't think he had any dentures or anything. He's got, like, almost no teeth, or very few teeth, and just everything about him looked like drug addicts. You know, he's got, he's got, he's bald, he's got receding hairline, and he's got his, all his hair pulled back in a ponytail, and he had a hat on, like an old military style hat, like the one of the green hats. So he took his hat off and he, he held it like this. He goes, Matt Cox. He goes, and I said, uh, yeah. And he goes, Reese Townsend. And he puts his hand out. He goes, I'm your cousin. And I remember I shook his hand and I looked at him and I went, not by marriage. He goes, nope, you got lucky there. And I, and he said, uh, no, I said, oh my God, that's not what I said. Sorry. I said, I go, I said, cousin by marriage i go i go not by blood and he goes he goes that's right you got lucky there and i start, and he, he said how you doing i went i'm uh i'm okay bro i said what's up with you like you could just tell this guy's a maniac so he said well i'm just here to help you out uh i know that my uh you know my cousin told me that you were going to be here and uh we're cousins and uh so i'm here to take care of you what do you need i said geez man um I don't know, bro. I said, I, I mean, I don't know what I need. So, well, I'm going to get together a, a care package. So he goes and he gets me, um, I already had shower slides. So he gets me shower slides. He gets me some soups. He gets me some coffee. He gets me, he just got me a bunch of like odds and ends. And within probably a week or so, um, I think my mother had sent me money. And so I was able to buy, 
uh, some commissary, like might get my own shower slides and get, you know, some other, some uh, just regular stuff that you need that you don't even realize you need. Um, like you can't, you can barely really live off of like, they call it the state, you know, state supplies, like the things that the prison will give you if you're indigent. So, you know, they'll give you toothpaste and little things, but you, they'll give you a little toothbrush this big, like you can barely brush your teeth with it. So you have to get things like toothpaste and, and a toothbrush and, and, you know, people can't mail you in anything. So you need money. And if you were to get a job, the jobs pay like eight bucks a month. Maybe if you worked at Unicor uh, for the first month, if you worked at Unicor 30, 40 hours a week, if you were first to be able to get a job working in the factory, your first paycheck might be maybe 40 or 50 bucks. You know, you have to slowly, like there are some guys making 300 and $400 a month, but they've been there years because they pay these guys like 80 cents or no, they'll pay them like 15 cents an hour initially. And then they get bumped up to like 45 cents an hour. They get bumped up to like, if you make like a dollar and uh, a dollar uh, an hour or something it, or do- I'm sorry, like a, a dollar 15 an hour, you're doing really good, you know? So they eventually might make $2 an hour or something. Like it's outrageous what they pay these, these guys. So um, Reese gets me a bunch of stuff. And I ended up, I remember that night, the first night we met, he goes, he goes, why don't you come to my place tonight or come to my house tonight? And I went, and I, and you know, like he lived there, like in my mind, I still didn't live in Coleman. And there's a lot of guys who you'd, I'd say, well, hey, well, where do you live? Where do you stay? And they'd go, well, I live in Tampa. And it'd be like, yeah, man, you got 15 fucking years. You live in B3. You know, you're in cell, you're in cell number 40 in B3. That's where you live. You've been here 10 years. You got another five years to go or whatever it is. It's like guys are still like, well, I don't live here. Yeah, you do live here, bro. Like, you know, you, I understand they're trying to mentally say that they're above this or something or this isn't their where they live or something, but you're staying someplace two, three, four, five years, you live there. So, and that's where I lived. So Reese's head, I found out, I went to his place that night and he was in, he was in, I think B, B3. No, he was in B4 and I was in B3, I think. Anyway, he was in really, so I ended up going there and he had made, uh, pickled eggs. Somebody, he, he had bought like pickles and he would save the juice and somebody had snuck eggs out of the kitchen and he bought, he would buy the eggs. So that's contraband. And then he had a stinger, which is a, a device that you can plug into a wall socket and put into water and it will instantly boil the water. So he boiled water and made hard boiled eggs in pickle juice. And it was straight, I like literally boiled them in a trash can. Um, I've never had boiled eggs that good in my entire life. Not before prison, not after prison. They were amazing. Like Reese could cook. Like it was, it was amazing. It was amazing. Everything about Reese let you know, like made you feel like you weren't in prison. I've never seen a guy better adapted at prison life. He had every square inch of his locker space completely filled. He was so overly organized, it border it was borderline OCD. He had, you know, he had stuff stored in other people's lockers. All the COs loved him. So I go there that night and I remember I met a guy named Jason Weeks. Jason Weeks' story was that Jason Weeks was like a child prodigy and he had opened, uh, he had like at 18 or 19, he started trading stocks and he started investing people's money by the time he's 21, 22 years old. And he actually had a radio program where he and his mother got retirees to give them money that they would invest. Somehow or another, he ended up losing a bunch of money or had done something illegal. And the federal government was trying that the U.S. attorney's office, when Jason Weeks got arrested, U.S. attorney's office was trying to give him um, like 
I think they wanted him to do a couple years in jail and then be on probation. He'd be a felon. He would no longer be able to trade or invest people's money. Jason insisted he hadn't done anything wrong and those losses or what for whatever reason they had indicted him uh, weren't his fault. And he was going to go to trial. Now, here's the problem with Jason is that Jason Weeks it, it was and is extremely arrogant. Arrogant in such a way that it's detrimental to himself and anybody that's a part of his life. Uh, and this is a guy also, by the way, that counted every day he was in prison and was absolutely absolutely felt he shouldn't be in prison and um, was was disgusted by the fact that he was so the people he was surrounded which with he was disgusted by um, you know just just somebody who felt extremely entitled to a way of life that he didn't really deserve and that he hadn't committed a crime that he actually had committed Jason weeks went to trial and he lost and he got I'm going to say he got 30 years. Hey, if you guys didn't know, I also do, I do paintings. And uh, if you're interested in a painting, I'm going to leave my contact information in the description beneath the video. Back to the video. So before Jason Weeks went to trial, I always love this story. Before Jason Weeks went to trial, <laughs> the U.S. government, they came to him and they said, you get three years. We'll give you three years. But you have to cooperate against your two co-defendants, where he had three co-defendants, your three co-defendants. And Jason Weeks said no, he was going to trial. So he and his mother went to trial, and they lost. So, okay, you lost. You get 30 years. So he got 30 years. The government, the U.S. Attorney's Office came back to Jason Weeks after he got sentenced to 30 years. They said, guess what? One of your co-defendants is going to trial. So... We're willing to give you 10 years. We'll reduce your 30-year sentence down to about 10 years, roughly. But you have to testify. Again, in the trial of your other co-defendant, he said, absolutely not. I don't need to testify. I'm going to beat you on appeal. I'm appealing my conviction. They said, okay. While he was appealing his conviction... His other um, co-defendant went to trial and lost. The government then came back to Jason Weeks. So Jason Weeks then lost his appeal. So his co-defendant lost their trial and Jason lost his appeal. He's now still got 30 years. Well, that's you can basically appeal to like the Supreme Court. No, no, I'm sorry, 22. He did his 2255. So, so he lost. He then turned around and the, the government came to him and they said, Jason, listen, you got 30 years. Your next co-defendant, your last co-defendant is going to trial. If you agree to testify against him, we'll give you, we'll bring your 30-year sentence down to 15 years. Jason said, fuck you. I'm going to file a, a it's called a, a 2255 which means you're filing because you're saying your, your lawyer was ineffective. He said, I'm going to file a 2255 and I'm going to win. Fuck you. I'm not going to testify against my co-defendant. His co-defendant goes to trial. Jason files his 2255. Jason's co-defendant loses at trial. And Jason loses his 2255. He also then appeals the 2255. He loses that too. Um, Jason then turned around, contacted the U.S. Attorney's Office. I actually contacted the DEA. Or, or sorry, his his Jason's sister then came to see him and said, "Jesus, Jason, you're stuck in here. You got 30 years. You blew your two, your only three chance. You had three chances to do very to get very little time." And you blew all of them because he's an arrogant prick. Uh, she said, but I can get you out. His sister's very attractive. And she knew a drug dealer, a big time drug dealer that actually liked her, really liked her. 
but she had kind of been dating him a little here, a little there. And she said, look, I can date this guy. I can get in good with him. I can work with the DEA and I can get him busted. And then they'll give you the cooperation and you'll get out of prison. By this point, Jason's been locked up like four or five years. So he goes, okay. He contacts the DEA agent. DEA agent says, absolutely. Um, we'll get you something for it. We're, we're, I'll, I'll try and get you something. I can't promise you, but I'll try and get you something. And he says, okay. So they contact the U.S. attorney. The U.S. attorney says, okay, if you got, if Jason's sister works with you guys and gets these this guy busted, um, we'll consider it substantial assistance. Which is which? Substantial assistance means that if you if you provide substantial assistance to the government in a case that results in arrests, they'll reduce your sentence for it. So they said, we'll consider it substantial assistance if there's a bust. Okay, no problem. So Jason's sister starts banging this D E or banging this fucking uh, drug dealer and gets in good with him and actually finds out when a literal boatload of cocaine is coming in from Colombia. She works with the DEA. She gets the drug dealer on wires. They get somebody to, um, uh, they, they do a whole sting operation. They wait till the, the drugs come in. They bust the boat. The boat has, you know, hundreds and hundreds of kilos on the boat. They grab the drug dealer. They grab all of his guys. He pleads guilty. He cooperates. He, all these guys are getting busted. They all get hundreds and hundreds of years worth of, uh, uh, of sentencing. Jason turns around, contacts the U.S. attorney and says, hey, all these guys got busted. My, my, my sister worked with DEA. You guys said you'd reduce my sentence. You said you'd consider it substantial assistance. And they said, you know what, Jason? We did consider it substantial assistance. And it's not. So we considered it and we decided it's not. Like they never promised him anything. So he goes nuts. He actually fi he files a motion. He ends up filing a motion called a, uh, um, it's a motion to compel or a motion for specific per performance, which means that I performed one thing. We had a contract, we had an agreement. I performed this, you were supposed to do this. So it's a motion to compel the government to reduce his sentence. He files it and the government in their response, I remember they said, and this was before Osama bin Laden had been caught. They said, if Jason Weeks told us where Osama bin Laden was staying and helped us get Osama bin Laden, he doesn't get one day off his sentence. Like they were adamant they weren't gonna give him a thing. So Jason Weeks fought his case the entire time he did 25 years. I think he did 25 years total. He did every day of his sentence. He got 30 years. He got gained good time. Time knocked off his sentence. He did every single day of it. Arrogant as you can, you can be. And also, by the way, smart. Like you can't believe how smart. This is a guy who taught himself French, Spanish, um, uh, and Portuguese while he was in prison. It, the guy was brilliant, but he's also an arrogant prick. The kind of guy you like, like so arrogant, you wouldn't even want to have dinner with him. Like I, I wouldn't even want, and I'd have dinner with, with, with Adolf Hitler and Stalin. Like I met, I feel like I could have dinner with, with, um, you know, with, uh, uh, with pretty much with serial killers. Like I've had dinner with serial killers. I'd rather be around them than Jason Weeks. That's just what an arrogant prick he is. Anyway, my cousin, so we're sitting there and I meet Jason Weeks and I just remember thinking, what an arrogant prick this guy is. But regardless, um, we're eating devil eggs. Delicious. My cousin made uh, deep fried wraps uh, where you wrap it in like a tortilla thing and you wrap like chicken and then you deep fry it because they would actually take, they would actually be able to take a deep fry stuff in the garbage cans. Delicious. Doesn't sound delicious, but it was. Uh, what else? We... Um, so we talked all night and my cousin, you know, my cousin's arrest, unfortunately, his story is not as comical or interesting or depressing or whatever you want to call it. It's not as worthy as Jason Weeks because basically my cousin, uh, Reese has basically been a drug addict his whole life. Like he's been 
he's been on meth. He's had, he had a good run. He had like a business that he got destroyed. Um, he got, had, then he'd get out. He'd do well. He'd fuck that up because of meth. He, uh, then he started cooking meth. He'd fuck that up and get busted. And then he'd get out and cook meth again. And basically my cousin just had been in and out of jail his entire life. And it's sad because this guy was brilliant. I mean, uh, Reese Townsend is, is really a very smart guy. He was huge and knew everything about World War II. Like he could be a college professor teaching history of the history of World War II. He knew every battle, how many people got killed, from what direction they came in, the, how many tanks were involved, uh, what the strategy was. Like, you know, it, it's just everything, the dates, everything. He was amazing. But uh, a deeply, deeply disturbed person that has uh, is hopelessly addicted to uh, to meth. And uh, since then, he's gotten out and I've tried to get him on the podcast a bunch of times and he just can't seem to, you know, hold it together long enough to even make a plan and actually show up to an actual podcast. Like we can't get to that point. Hey, I wanted to let you guys know that I have a Patreon account. If you're interested in joining the Patreon account, it's got three tiers. The top tier, you actually get a different con man painting every single month. If you're already joined and you're already supporting me, I really appreciate that. If you haven't joined yet and you're interested in joining, I'm going to leave the contact information for Patreon in the description. Thank you very much for watching the video. Back to the video. Anyway, um, so I met them and by this point, within a few days of that, and I'm going to get better more in this story, but within a few days of that, I remember it got around that I had cooperated and my cousin, so all the stand up white guys are talking about trying to check me in. And so my cousin comes to me and he's basically like, yeah, these guys, apparently, did you tell somebody that you cooperate? I was like, yeah. And I remember he said, listen, believe it or not, he said, Mo almost all these guys did but there's one or two that didn't. He said, and the other guys are all lying about it. So everybody's either, cause you know, you have to think most, most people, like if you've got, if 95% of federal inmates cooperate and you have, let's say 40 guys in a click, like let's say 40 white guys, well then do the, do the math. The math alone tells you that only out of those 40, like two guys didn't cooperate. Like everybody else cooperated. Like what's happening? So, you know, like you're lying, like you guys have all got to be lying. You're, you all cooperated, but they're all lying, saying they're stand up guys and nobody's doing the math. But the point is, uh, I was like, yeah, I don't get whatever. And, they, and he was like, yeah, they're going to try and get you to check in or something. I was like, oh, I'm not going to check in. So um, basically, Reese just went around and said, look, this is my cousin. He's not going to check in. Like, just don't hang out with him. Leave him alone. Stay away from him. And that was what happened. Like, it, they weren't going to do anything anyway. And what's so funny is that I would see these guys and I'd sit with guys and, guys, you know, eventually everybody's just cool with you. You know, I'm walking the rec yard. I'm, I'm perfectly fine. Nobody's bothering me. Um, it, was, it, it wasn't until about a year or so later when I was approached by American Greed. American Greed came to me. And they sent me a letter and I responded and I called my lawyer. My lawyer called the U.S. attorney. The U.S. attorney called my attorney and said, look, we want this. We want Mr. Cox to be in, in, interviewed for America, for an episode of American Greed. And American Greed, it was they used to do a one hour kind of a slash and burn tabloid news thing um, where they would take a, a famous criminal and then they would just do a one hour. Just they just bash the ever living crap out of the guy. And so anyway, the U.S. attorney wanted me to do it. And so I did it. And the U.S. attorney told my attorney, look, we'll consider it substantial assistance. Now, keep in mind, they'd already done this to me once where they asked me to be interviewed by Dateline. But the truth is, is like, what choice do you have? They won't put it in writing. They're like, do it and we'll consider it substantial assistance. It's like what they're saying is we'll consider it for substantial assistance, but we want you to do it before we even think about it. OK, fine. I don't have a choice. I got 26 years. So what I do is I go ahead and. And I do the program, right? Like they bring me to the warden's office and I talk on the phone several, to several times. Um, and I do the American Greed episode. Uh, the next thing that happened was by this point, the FBI was coming to see me. So the FBI is showing up and what they do is like they don't want to tell you. They don't want to 
call you out. Like they can't say, hey, come to the, you know, come to, you know, the FBI is here for you. So they can't tell you that. So what they do is they call you to like medical. And they say, hey, come to medical. So then you go to medical and then at medical they say, hey, go down here and go into, you know, visitation or, you know, they go to R&D and then they have a, a, a walkway that goes into another room in visitation where you actually, the FBI is waiting for you. And that's what would happen is I'd get a phone call and the FBI, and or not a phone call, I would get announced, hey, Cox, go to medical. I'd go to medical and they'd say, hey, go to visitation. I'd go to visitation. I'd walk in and people can still see you going into visitation. Like they can see you walking around the compound and, and people, if they're paying attention to you, they'll start asking questions. You can lie about it, you know, and it doesn't really matter. Like, like you can lie about it and they don't really know. So I would go and I'm talking to the FBI. FBI came in and the FBI was asking me questions about, um, about a guy named Michael White. Uh, oh no, Kevin White, who Kevin White was a dirty politician. He was a dirty politician that when I was in in Florida, I had bribed and I'd actually gotten him elected I'd gotten him elected to the city commissioner as city commissioner. No, I'm sorry, councilman. After he became councilman, he became city a county commissioner. But I I actually paid him out of his whole budget was like thirty thousand dollars and I gave him like twenty two thousand dollars to run for um for city uh, city council. Yeah, he became a city, a councilman. So he became a councilman and I had paid that because I was going to have him rezone all of my lots. Um, because that was, that fell within his, his, uh, purview and he could have gotten that done. I ended up taking off and it never ended up happening, but I did bribe him. There was tons of checks with me paying him. Got other people were saying, yeah, Cox fucking got this guy elected. Uh, so that he could have all of his properties rezoned from single families to multifamily, which would have made him, the half a million dollars worth of lots that I had worth at least a million or $2 million. Anyway, that never happened, but I did bribe him. So, and I'd had a bunch of uh, interviews. And so I remember the FBI came to see me a bunch of times. And when they came to see me, eventually what happened was there was a newspaper article about me cooperating with the FBI in a case against Kevin White. And that hit the news, hit St. Petersburg Times ran that article. And so I immediately get called to the lieutenant's office. I didn't even know that an article had been, had that they had, it was on the front page and been released. I knew that, I knew that they were doing an article on it, but I didn't think it was a big deal. Well, I got thrown in the shoe for 45 days because for my own protection. And by the time I got out, you know, I still didn't give a shit. Like, I don't give a fuck. Like, I don't care if you're calling me a fucking a rat or saying, hey, this guy's cooperating. I don't go fuck. Fuck you. You know? So I, this is the way I, I figured it. I realized right away my mouth was going to get me into trouble in prison. And I could either shut my mouth for the next 20 some odd years until I was 60 years old and talk to nobody. Or I could run my mouth and I would get the shit kicked out of me every once in a while. And I can tell you right now, I'm going to get over an ass kicking a lot faster than I'm going to get over not being able to run my mouth. So I figure I'll just run my mouth and I'll get smacked every once in a while. So anyway, what happens is I remember this guy like two days, a couple days after I got out of the shoe and went back to my unit. And everybody's kind of looking at me, right? Because now everybody knows because it was in the newspaper. And it's gone. Everybody's read it. So I remember this guy comes up to me that was one of the stand-up white guys. And I'm walking the compound. I'm like walking around. And he comes walking up to me. And he goes, hey, Cox. And I'm, I've never even talked to this fucking guy. Like he's got a goatee that comes down here. And it's got a skull, like a, a carved out skull on the goatee. I mean, he's straight, straight Aryan looking douchebag um and so he stops me he goes cox and i'm like oh yeah what's up he goes yo so by the way the the main guy the shot caller for the the white guys his name was bubba and you know bubba sounds like a big big guy bubba was probably my height uh but he did work out all the time had a ton of tattoos he was there for math so this guy stops me and he goes cox and i go yeah what's up and he goes yo man he said listen bro uh want to let you know you can't walk the yard no more 
And I went, what? Yeah. Uh, he was Bubba wanted me to tell you, uh, we, we read that fucking article about you snitching on that fucking dude. You, know, you can't be, you can't, uh, you can't walk the fucking yard no more. And I looked at him and I went, okay. I said, well, can you do me a favor? I said, let me, I said, let Bubba know I'm going to be out there tonight. I'm going to go to chow and then I'm going to go out and I'm going to walk laps. I said, if you guys fucking jump me or do whatever you're going to fucking do, I said, that's fine. I'll be on the fucking yard. I'm going to walk fucking laps. So whatever it is, it is. I said, but I'm not going to spend the rest of my fucking time being chased around by you motherfuckers. And he sat there and he just looked at me. And by the way, keep in mind, I'm pretty brave because we're standing right in front of the guard shack. Like the guards are inside. They're staring right at us from 20 to 30 feet away. So I don't think he's going to attack me. So he looks at me and he goes, Yo, man, I don't give a fuck. He said, Bubba told me to tell you. That's what I'm telling you. I don't give a shit if you walk on the fucking yard. I don't care what the fuck you did. He said, he goes, all right. And he just walks off. So I tell my cousin Reese. Um, I tell Jason uh, Weeks. Uh, I tell my other buddy, which is a guy named Zach. And there, we had a couple other guys, a guy named John Gordon, uh, a couple other guys. Well, Zach was my buddy. He's a black guy. Um, big black guy there for fraud fucking funny anyway so reese talks to a couple other white guys that he knows and after we eat dinner we all go in a little group of like five guys and we walk the track for about an hour and bubba's out there and bubba sees us and bubba's got five or six guys with him and they see him and i later found out that basically when bubba's like yeah let's go talk to them guys those the other guys were like but bro, bro i ain't I don't want to fucking do that. I don't want to fucking go do nothing. I don't give a fuck. Nobody gives a shit. They just, we just want to do our fucking time. And I don't give a fuck about that dude. I don't give a fuck. We're just going to just, I'm just not going to talk to him. And so Bubba was upset about it. But the, in the end, Bubba never did shit. The only thing Bubba ever do, did was one time I was talking to this guy named DJ, Michael, Mike DiGeronimo. Um, and he was a paint. He used to paint. Great painter. And DJ Geronimo, we were standing in line talking and Bubba saw him talking to me and Bubba walked over to him and goes, come here, let me talk to you. And I, he walked over, he goes, yeah, what's up? And he said something to him. He actually told him, he said, look, I just want to let you know that dude you're fucking with is a cooperating witness. And if you're fucking talking to him, I'll tell you right now, he said, if you ever need our fucking help, he said, we ain't going to fucking help you. So if I see you talking to that dude or eating with that dude, he said, I'm sorry, bro. He said, you, we can't be fucking, we can't be fucking with you. And he goes, all right. So Mike actually stood up and, or Mike actually walked about 10 people behind me and stood in line. I didn't really know what had happened because I couldn't hear what they were saying. So I go and I eat. And then later in the unit, Mike and I were in the same unit. Mike came up to me and he goes, bro, listen, let me tell you what happened. And he told me what happened. And he said, I'm sorry, man. I mean, I don't mind hanging out with you, but what if I need those guys? Like, you know, I gamble, I like to get fucked up. You know, he did like heroin and shit in prison in there. He's like, you know, what if I get myself fucked up? What if something happens? What like, I need these guys to kind of help protect me. You know, I, I just, I just can't be a part of this whole thing. I said, Mike, I don't give a fuck. I said, I didn't come here to make any friends. I don't care if we're friends. I don't care if we hang out. I don't care if I ever fucking talk to you again. I said, I'll damn, I said, I'll never talk. I would, I doubt I'd ever talk to you on the fucking street. I said, if this is the, the life that you're living and this is a part of the, what's happening with you and you're good with that. And I said, I don't care. It's fine. I said, I'm not upset with you. I mean, it is what it is. I mean, whatever. So anyway, Mike, it's so funny too, because within a week or two, Mike was sitting at the table with me. Mike was standing in line with me. You know, he just, I, I don't know what happened. I don't know what, if Bubba was like, it's okay. Or Mike just realized after a couple of weeks, you know, fuck this. I'm not, I'm just not going to be in, I just don't want to be involved in this. Now, in most prisons, you may not be able to do that. But at the medium security prison in Coleman, you could. But this is still a place where people are getting stabbed. But within probably a few months of me getting there, during this whole thing, I started teaching the real estate class. So... I'm now teaching the real estate class and I've got a ton of people that think they're going to get out and become not real estate agents, but they think they're going to buy and sell properties. They think they're going to get out and fix up property like every drug dealer that was in the place desperately wanted to kind of figure out like, hey, I can get out, get some money and start buying and selling properties. How do I do that? 
And so I started teaching a real estate class and that class was packed every single class. But I wanted to backtrack real quick and explain one of the things that, you know, unfortunately I find comical. And that is that when I first got to prison and I met with my counselor, I walked into, you know, I was placed on what's called the call out and I explained that. So, and it said, hey, yeah, I have to meet my, uh, my prisoner. I mean, my prisoner. <laughs> I have to meet, had to meet my counselor. So I met my counselor and I went in there and I remember her name's, her name was Miss Bates. She smoked like a, a chimney. I mean, smoked all the time. Wasn't in great shape. She wasn't like overweight or anything, but she was older. She was probably in her late 40s, early 50s and just smoked nonstop. Even though Coleman was a tobacco free, um, whatever you want to call it, a uh, uh, um, building or, or institution, she still smoked all the time. She would go in, she'd constantly walk outside and smoke a cigarette. So she she calls me in, she says, okay, hey, Mr. Cox, you have to fill out this piece of paper and this piece of paper. And, and I've already explained that she kind of basically said, I don't even know why you're here. Um, you know, I'm not sure why you're even here. And then she looked and she goes, oh, wow, you've got 26 years. Okay, never mind. Because she said, your my security level was like a, a two or a three as opposed to, you know, being much higher. If you're over, a, if you're under 10, a, a level security level of like under like, let's say five or something like that, you're supposed to be at a camp unless you have over 10 years to serve on your sentence. I obviously still... By the time I got to Coleman, I still had like 22, 23, 23 years to go. So she was like, hey, I don't even know why you're here. She said, oh, I see you have such a long sentence. That's why you're here. She said, okay, well, you know, I'll probably be sending you in the next three years or so. We'll send you to a, uh, to the low, assuming you don't get your sentence cut or win an appeal or, you know, if I can get it cut or whatever. I said, okay. I said, I understand. And she said, um, also, she said, I see that you owe six million dollars and i went okay and she said so you know you owe six million she said you have to start paying restitution you have to start paying it's called the um frp it, um right so it's a financial um financial restitution program or something like that where you or federal restitution pro program. Anyway, you have to pay. So I'm like, okay, well, I don't have a job and I don't have any money. So I'm not sure how I'm going to pay. And she goes, well, you have to pay. And I went, well, I don't, I'm not supposed to pay anyway. And she goes, why not? And I said, because my lawyer argued in prison. I'm sorry, my, I'm going to have a real hard time here. My lawyer argued at sentencing, at my sentencing, that I didn't have, I shouldn't have to make restitution payments while I was incarcerated. And I said, she argued in front of the judge and she won that argument. And the judge said, while he's incarcerated, Mr. Cox doesn't have to um, pay restitution. His restitution will start upon release. Also, I said, I'm, I don't have to pay interest on the restitution, which was, you know, another thing that she won. I said, she only won a couple arguments. Those were them. He once got plastic surgery because he didn't like the photo on his wanted poster. His legend precedes him. The way indictments precede arrests. He is the most interesting man in the world. I don't typically commit crime, but when I do, it's bank fraud. Stay greedy, my friends. Support the channel. Join Matthew Cox's Patreon. So my counselor is kind of like, she looked through the file, kind of like he was sitting there and she was like, okay, well, I'll check it out and I'll, I'll let you know. I'll, I'll look and see. And if that's what it says, then you don't have to pay. But, and she said, but in, in the meantime, you have to sign this document, this document and whatever. So I signed a bunch of documents and she said, I'll let you know as far as the FRP is concerned. That's what they call it. So I said, okay, no problem. And I left. By the way, that's completely untrue. Like none of that, like I, 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 was subject to pay my restitution while I was incarcerated. So I end up, um, I end up leaving. And then a couple months later, like I don't hear anything for a few months. And then suddenly one day, uh, 
I heard that uh, Mrs. Bates, Counselor Bates, my my counselor, um, had died in the middle of the night. Uh, woke up and her husband tried to wake her up and she was dead. Now she had some heart problems and she had she'd smoked like nonstop, so she just ended up dying. Uh, so another few months went by, and you're supposed to meet with your counselor like I think it's once every six months or once a year or something. So like six months went by and I, I ended up with another counselor and he just randomly called me in and he asked me about my FRP. Now, I, I should preface this by saying that this was actually what they call a team. So you get teamed like once a year you get teamed. And for I guess I'd been there six months or a year by the time this happened. Now that I think about it because I remember it was a team. So I go in for what's called team and team is like, they basically have your counselors there, your the unit manager and your, your case manager. Like there are three people that are kind of like over the whole building or unit, whatever. And so I go in and I sit down and they, they typically have these meetings because they're, they kind of, they're, they're supposedly, they're acting like they're trying to rehabilitate you. And they say, Hey, have you been to programming? Have you got your GED? Did you try and get your high school diploma? Or, I'm sorry, your, your, your GED. Did you try and get your, your, um, your, your classes? Have you got your certificate for whatever class you're trying to take? If you're trying to take one, like, have you thought about becoming a, um, you know, a chef or uh, uh, becoming a farmer, whatever classes they're teaching for vocational uh, tech, votech, they call it. So, you know, you go in there and I walked in, I sat down and I said, Hey, so uh, what's up? And they went, hi, uh, Mr. Cox, you know, we were, this is team. And they explain it. And I knew that. And they were like, okay. So they start flipping through and keep in mind, I've got like 23, 22, 23 years left. So I really don't care about team. Like I have bigger problems. I'm going to move this forward. So I have bigger problems. So I say, okay, what's up? And they kind of go through, oh, okay, well, yeah, you get a lot of time, Cox. Yeah, this and that. And And as they're looking through the papers, one of them says, hey, I see here that you're not paying FRP, but you're you're not on FRP refusal. So what happens is sometimes... You know, guys are responsible or, or have to pay like whatever, 50 bucks a month or 20 bucks a month. Keep in mind, you've got a job. You have a job at the prison that pays you $18 or something or 12 bucks. Or maybe if you work for Unicor, you might make a hundred bucks or maybe $200 at most. And they'll literally charge you 50 or a hundred bucks. So you'll be making $18 a month and they're charging you $50 a month. And if you can't pay the 50, they put you on FRP refusal. And then they don't, they only let you go to commissary to buy stuff like soap and shampoo. I mean, like it's like you can't buy anything. You can't buy coffee. You can't buy anything. And then, of course, the other thing that they do, which is comical, is like if you can't pay FRP refuse, if you're placed on FRP refusal, they knock you down from what you can pay, what you can be paid. So if you're being paid 25 or let's say you're being paid 85 cents an hour, they'll knock you down to like 12 cents an hour. You know, these are all punishments. So you're going to make me now I'm making I can't pay the $50 a month. So now you're going to charge me. You're now going to let me only make $12 an hour. It's I'll never be able to pay the $50 now. So anyway, I go in and they go, well, it's funny. You're supposed to be it looks like you're supposed to be paying FRP, but you're not on FRP refusal. What's going on? And I said, no, no, I'm not supposed to pay FRP. I said, I, I not while I'm incarcerated. And the my counselor looks at me and he goes, well, you, ha- you, you, you owe $6 million. I said, yeah, I know. but And I explain about my me, my lawyer arguing at sentencing I shouldn't have to pay and um, that she'd won the argument. And then the, the case manager looks at me and I'm, you know, I'm so convincing when I tell them that when I say this, that, and I say, and I look at them, they look at me and they go, really? I've never heard that. I said, bro, I said, Miss Bates looked into it. That's why she never put me into the system to make the payments like because the payments automatically come out. And I said, that's why I was never put in the system. But I wasn't actually put in the system because Miss Bates said she was going to look into it. And I guess she never did. And then she died. So it just never got entered into the system. She was probably thinking when I when he comes up for his six months review, I'll talk to him about it. and I'll have to have it done by that point. But she died. So I sat there and I looked at him. I said, yeah, I said, that's why she never put me in the system. She didn't really know what to do. She said, well, I, okay, well, 
yo, six million, but you're right, but you're right. She looked at looked into it and she said, yeah, you're right. There's not an order for you to pay. And as a result, I said, she didn't put me in the system. And so he looked at me and you could tell they were very skeptical of what I was saying. So they kind of looked at me and they went, well, we'll look into it. I said, okay, cool. And I, I, and I, I remember that they had my file there. My file was thick. And I said, my, I go, it's in my file. They all kind of glanced at the file and they said, we'll check it out. We'll let you know. I said, okay, no problem. And I got up and I left. Listen, most inmate files, inmates files are not that big, but I had a ton of paperwork attached to me. I had a ton of fraud and there's all kinds of stuff in my file. And these people are lazy. So I get up and I leave and I really kind of thought, okay, well, he'll catch it in a month or so or a week or two days. He's going to call me back. So months go by and months go by and months go by. Six months later, I've got a new counselor. He calls me in just, just to call me in. His name is like his name's like Mr. Lopez or Gonzalez or something. I remember he's Spanish. So I walk and I said, yeah, what's up? And he says, hey, it's your six-month review. So he looks through my stuff and says, how you doing? What are you doing? I said, oh, I'm doing this. I'm doing that. He said, okay. How's everything going? He said, I'm not going to ask you about taking classes or this or that because he said, you got so much time, Cox. He said, if you start taking classes now, you'd be done with them all in a couple of years. He said, I, I'm not going to bug you. I said, no problem. He said, I do have a question about FRPs. I noticed that you have FRP. You owe FRP, but you're not on refusal. What's up with that? And I said, okay, what happened was, and I explained about Miss Bates not putting me on FRP because I didn't have technically have to pay it. And he goes, okay, okay. He goes, well, you can pay it if you want to. I said, I don't, man, I owe $6 million. I said, I got enough problems. I said, I can't. What am I going to do? I said, how am I going to pay that off? 50 bucks a month? 100 bucks a month? Come on, man. I don't even make 100 bucks a month. At that point, I was teaching GED. I'd actually been hired by the, uh, I'd been hired by the library or the education department to be a GED tutor. So I'm like, I'm like, how am I? Come on, man. I, I don't even make that. And I can't make that much. I don't make that much money. And, you know, and he was like, okay, okay. That, I, I get it. He said, um, yeah, that's odd. I've never seen that. I said, man, it's in my file. You can check. He goes, I will. I'll check it out. I'll let you know what, what I come up with. He said, it sounds weird though. He said, it sounds odd. He goes, you sure? And I go, come on, bro. I said, I just had team. I said that we had the same conversation at team and my last counselor checked. He said it was fine. He said he agreed. And he goes, okay, well, I'll check it out. I said, okay, no problem. I get up and I leave. I'm waiting for the call, right? I'm waiting, I'm waiting. Nothing ever happens. Six more months go by. I get another team. They all come in. And as I'm sitting there talking and the counts, the, the case manager now says, hey, Cox, I noticed you're not paying FRP. What's up with that? And I look at the other counselor and I said, he looked into it. I said, I don't have to pay. This keeps coming up, but I don't have to pay. And my counselor said, yeah, it's a weird. He doesn't have to pay. It's, it's odd. But yeah, it turns out that, uh, the judge in his case said he didn't have to pay while he was incarcerated. Now keep in mind, that's absolutely untrue. Yet the guy said, okay, no problem. And then that was it. So. I never, like every team, it would kind of come up, but then it, then it just didn't come up anymore. Like I stopped hearing about it. While this is happening, like this, you know, I'm at this point, I'm now teaching the real estate class. There was a guy there by the name of Barrington. His real name was something like Michael Sneed. And he changed his name because he'd gone to prison, got out, changed his, legally changed his name. He was a con man and started running some kind of a real estate scam. He then got in trouble again, but he had changed his name by this time to like Michael or John, oh, I think it was John Barrington. So he changed it from like Michael Sneed to like John Barrington. And I mean, just this guy was like a real con man. So he'd run a huge scam, got in trouble again. Uh, I think he went to trial or I'm not sure I should look that up. But anyway, he got a bunch of time, was in prison and he was teaching the real estate class. So he was, he didn't want to teach real estate anymore because he was now doing legal work for other inmates and charging, which you're not allowed to do, but that's fine. He was, that's what he was doing. So he was charging them and he didn't want to do real estate anymore. So he came to me and he said, Hey Cox, would you mind doing the real estate class? He said, somebody needs to take it over. I said, sure, no problem. So I start teaching the real estate class. Well, as soon as I start teaching the real, first of all, the real estate class was, it was pretty packed. I mean, it was packed like, there was probably 30 people the first class. Well, after the first or second class, guys are coming up to me saying, listen, Cox, like, I don't really want to take this class. 
And I'd say, okay. And they'd say, but I need the certificate because my counselor wants me to t- get take classes like this. So I get a certificate. So it lowers their custody level. So they can go from, let's say, the medium down to a low. And they're trying to get to like a camp. All these guys are trying to get to a camp for some reason. I mean, I know what the reason is, but the reason is that they can get cell phones very easily. They can get drugs very easily. And they can see their girlfriends or sneak off, sneak away from the camps and go see their girlfriends or whatever the case may be. So I say, okay, I get it. Uh, you don't want to take the class. I said, there's a test. There's this, there's that. And I said, how about this? How about you give me two coffees and two creamers and I'll fill out all the paperwork and I'll mark you as being here the whole time. And uh, yeah. So that empties out the class pretty quickly. It gets down to maybe, I don't know, maybe there's maybe 10 or 15 guys within a few, within a month. Well, the thing is, I really took the, the real estate class seriously. The guys that were there genuinely thought they were all going to get out and become, you know, some kind of a real estate, um, not guru, but a, a real estate, uh, a re- what they call rehabbers, um, which is somebody who renovates houses, you know, flippers, pick up, buy a house cheap, fix it up, sell it. So they all felt like they were going to do that, you know. Um, which is so funny too, because like drug dealers in general are such hustle, such natural hustlers that if any of them really applied themselves to flipping property and did it right, correctly, like they would probably be really good at it because they genuinely are hustlers. So it was like, and, and I used to pitch that, that look, this is something that you guys are, are really designed for. You'll, you're willing to go into these bad neighborhoods. You're willing to buy these properties. You're willing to risk your money. You're willing to hustle to get guys to fix them up and sell them. And so I would, I taught a really serious class and I took it from the very beginning of what makes real estate real estate. Why is it able to be bought and sold? How is it titled? How are you able to borrow money on it? Um, what you need to look for as far as in public records, what you need to look for in uh, zoning, like the whole thing. I went all the way through to actually building houses. It's a great class. Within this, by the next semester, there's like 40 people showing up. Maybe five or 10 of them don't really want to take the class. Um, and keep in mind, I'm, I'm not like a really sweet person. Like I don't have a, a I, I don't have a super bullshit personality. Like I'm pretty, I pretty much just tell people how it is. And so I, I very much spoke to these guys. Like I, I, it wasn't, I didn't sugarcoat anything. And I, I just, you know, and I went through the process and I broke it down very simply so that they could understand it. So they love the real estate class. So the real estate class got to a point where guys were literally sitting in the class over and over. There was actually a, probably a few quarters where there were so many people there were standing up and I had to actually ask guys go around the room and say, how many people are actually on the raw, on the roster? Like I had to make people get out of their seats and stand, switch with people that were actually on the class roster because guys were just coming and just standing there. And eventually as the classes go on, you know, people drop out. So if you start with 40, you know, a month into it, a month and a half into it, it drops down to maybe 30. And really there was only 30 chairs in the in the room. There are still guys standing up. Guys are bringing in chairs from other rooms. It got so bad at one point I started teaching two classes. I taught a, a Tuesday and a Thursday class. So this goes on and on and on. Uh, and, and, and keep in mind, I, I'm not, I'm no longer, I, I don't have to buy coffee and creamer anymore. And not just that, it was funny because after the second, probably second or third semester, it got to the point where guys were getting up, walking out of the class and stopping me and shaking my hand. Like that was bizarre. Guys are literally like walking out, as they're walking out, they're like, hey Cox, um, good class, bro. Like, I, uh, man, it was a good class. And they shake my hand. And I would be like, uh, hey, okay. Like I got to the point where four or five guys, every single class are shaking my hand, man, it was a good class, bro. Good class. Like it was just a thing. It was, it was, you know, it was, com- it's comical in a way, but in a way, it was the first time I think any of these guys really genuinely got educated in a way that they understood and they truly believed they could pull off being a real estate rehabber. So, 
Uh, and, and I think that anybody genuinely really was trying to teach them that wasn't, let's say, a, a paid person by the prison, w- trying to get them to do something that they really didn't even want to do. A- anyway, there was a waiting list on that that class. There ended up being a months and uh, really, sorry, semesters or quarters. They caught it in quarters. So quarters worth of, of people lined up, two, three quarters long. Guys would get upset because they they were going to be transferred or go home before they could take my class. It was, it's just ridiculous. I use ridiculous, but for some, for some reason they just loved it. And I actually had guys who were like getting transferred and they would come to me and they would say, look, can you meet me like on Saturday for two hours and I'll pay you to meet me. And so I would privately meet guys in the library and teach them. And one time I even had like three guys who I would met them for like a month straight and just taught them like a, a class and I gave them the syllabus and I, they took notes and everything. Um, Okay, so there's that, and about the same time, I was contacted by a, I ended up getting contacted by the producers of a TV show called American Greed. I Did I go over this? I don't think I went over this, so I'm going to go over this. So I get contacted by... Uh, by American group, peop, uh, whatever, I, the producers of American Greed, they contact me, we contact, I contact my lawyer, my lawyer says she was contacted by the U.S. attorney, U.S. attorney says, hey, I want Cox to be interviewed by American Greed, that's fine. So I end up getting interviewed by American Greed, and I'm, they bring me down to the warden's office, and I'm interviewed in the warden's office, or the assistant's warden office, whatever. Somewhere down there. And they actually sit down with me and I get interviewed for like two days straight for like a couple hours at a time. And then they end up doing that. It's funny too, because when you listen to, if you watch American Greed, they did like a one hour special. I probably am not on American Greed for more than five minutes of me talking. Maybe, maybe five minutes. So, um, but I was interviewed for like an hour or two at least. Yeah, maybe an hour, maybe an hour and a half one day, an hour the next day. I don't know, a while. It was a while. So, uh, and and I did that because the U.S. attorney told my attorney she would consider that substantial assistance and she would reduce my sentence for doing it. So, I end up calling my attorney after American Greed airs. It aired months later. Uh, in 2009, it aired. So, in late 2009, or mid-2009, whatever, it airs. I'm excited. I call my attorney. I said, hey, I heard that you uh, American Greed aired. And I knew it aired because when I was walking around the compound, like what I would, I would go walking somewhere, the COs would see me and they would say, hey, Cox, where's that money, Cox? Where'd you put that money? And I'd go, what? Like this happened for like three days straight. So finally, one of the, co- one of the cops looked at me and he goes, hey, Cox, he said, seen you last night. He said something like, hey, I seen you last night. And I went, on what? What do you, what? And he goes, on American Greed. Yeah, he said, uh, we all saw it. it. It aired a couple days ago. I was like, holy shit. So I knew it had aired. I called my attorney. It aired. Oh my gosh. I, I'm going to get my sentence cut. Uh, did you call the U.S. attorney? So she called, she said, I'll call the U.S. attorney. Uh, she calls the U.S. attorney and I call her back a couple days later, call her a couple days later. She keeps, so eventually I get her back on the phone again and she says, yeah, um, she's not returning my call. This goes on for like a month or so. So finally, after, oh my God. Excuse me. After a month or so, she finally gets her on the phone and she says, or no, she didn't get on the phone. She finally actually tracked her down. Remember, she said she went into an elevator she was in and said, you're not returning my calls. What's going on with Mr. Cox's sentence? He did the program. He did Dateline. I was interviewed by Dateline, which they didn't give me anything for. And he was just interviewed by American Greed. We need, uh, uh, you said you'd reduce his sentence. She goes, I know. She said, but honestly, Millie, she goes, it's just not enough. My lawyer's name was Millie. She goes, it's just not enough. She goes, I just can't justify reducing his sentence because he was interviewed by someone. Like, you told me to be interviewed. You said you'd reduce my sentence. She knew up front she wasn't going to do it. Just like she knew up front being interviewed by Dateline, wasn't they weren't going to do anything. Okay, fine. So, you know, and you're not going to get anything in writing from these people. So, I'm, you know, I talked to my lawyer. And she's on the phone and she says, Matt, I'm so sorry. I don't know what to say. 
I really thought she would do it. And I'm like, well, we have to file something. She says, there's just nothing you can do. So I get off the phone with her and it turns out that roughly at the same time, now I've now been locked up at the institution in Coleman, the medium security prison. I've been locked up coming up on three years. My mother would come see me every two weeks. You know, um, I'm teaching the real estate class. I'm teaching GED. Uh, I, I had a buddy of mine. His name is Zach. Uh, I've had him on the program a bunch of times. Um, you know, I've got some buddies uh, at that point, my cousin, like I hang out with a few guys, but three years is coming up and I end up going into my counselor's office because my counselor called me one day and I go and I go in there and my counselor says, I got good news. And I said, what's that? He said, you're below 20 years. At this point, you have 20 years remaining on your sentence. And I went, okay. He said, and we have to move you to the low. So for three years, as I finally got like a good routine, you know, like I'm finally in a good place where I'm, I got some friends, you know, and my expectations of life at this point have been lowered so low that just being able to find a good book and meet people that I can talk to and walk through the rec yard and kind of have a routine down where you weren't miserable all the time was a, a huge comfort for me. So when this guy tells me he wants to move me to the low, I'm like, I don't want to go. I absolutely don't want to go to the low. But, you know, and I actually ran around and I tried to get people, I tried to talk to some some of the, like my counselor, I tried to talk to the unit manager, I tried to talk to my case manager, I tried to talk to um, the, the guy that I worked for, his name was Harmon, uh, at the edu- in education. And like, basically, like, they were all like, I'll call, I'll see what I can do. But all of them came back was like, Cox, hey, can you come here? I'm like, yeah, what's up? They look, I called so and so. And like, the, you, you have to go like, one, you're under 20 years. And two, you're, you're, um, your security levels, like nothing, like you came in with like two points, you know, two or three points, like they, you should be at a camp, like they can't keep you here. If you got hurt here, that would be an issue. Like you can't be here any longer. He once conned Bank of America out of $250,000 using nothing but a fake ID and his charm. He is the most interesting man in the world. I don't typically commit crime, but when I do, it's bank fraud. Stay greedy, my friends. Support the channel. Join Matthew Cox's Patreon. So I end up getting transferred to the low security prison. And the nice thing about the medium was you're actually in a cell with like one other guy. Some of the, some of the, some of the cells had three men in them. They have like a three man bunk bed and you, I went to the, you know, but I had a two man bunk. I had a two man room because I'd been there so long. Very quickly, I ended up getting moved to a two man cell. I had a cellie that wasn't a bad guy. He was, um, he was a Mexican gang member, uh, nice guy, you know, uh, and, uh, but yeah, he, uh, his name was Victor and Victor had done, Victor shot a guy. Victor was one, he was in the United States illegally. Two, he shot a guy in the head and he got, I think he got 13 years in like Arizona or something. I think he did seven years on it. He then got grabbed by the feds when he got out of prison and the feds gave him like 10 years for reentry. And he was going to end up doing a few more months on the federal reentry sentence than he did on the Arizona attempted murder where he shot the guy in the head. Like it was attempted murder, not because he didn't, because he, but not because he didn't shoot the guy. The guy just didn't die. Like if the guy died, it would have been murder. Instead, he got attempted murder. Like it, so anyway, he was a nice guy. Uh, I mean, we had some issues when we first, he first, uh, we, he first uh, moved into my cell. We butted heads a little bit, but it wasn't a big deal. Um, like he thought he was going to bully me or something like that. But the truth is we were both about the same height and, and I, he actually got into several fights while he was there. And I was like, listen, bro, you're like, you've gotten your shit kicked out of you twice. I'm not worried. 
And so I think he thought he was going to move in my cell and force me out of the cell so he could move some another gang member in. And he probably tried for about a month or two. And then eventually he just he just realized he wasn't going to be able to do it. So we, we started getting along. Um, what else? Yeah, that's it. So then I, I got moved to the low. Yeah, I got moved to the low. And the low wasn't bad. Like it sucked because when I got to the low, there's something called, a, um, they, they have what's, what are called, uh, it's an open bay. They're just a dorm, one big room with a bunch of concrete block dividers between the cells. And you have two and three man cells and there's just the walls only go up about five feet. There's no doors. That's it. There's three beds, sometimes two beds, in a little cubicle, concrete block cubicle, with a, and everybody's got a locker. And it, it absolutely sucks. I mean, there's never, it's never quiet. That's the nice thing about, at least in the medium, you had, a, a, you had your own cell, and you could close the door, and it was quiet. It was never quiet in the low. There was just screaming and hollering all the time. Um... Yeah, I think I think maybe I'm going to end the video now and I'll do the the next video will be about uh, when I got to the low. So basically, I went to the low. I got to the low in this video. I guess I said, well, in another video, I said I was going to the low. So basically, yeah, I went to the low. Oh, I know what I wanted to say. This is funny. This is what it was. So I went to the low. Like literally, they pack up your bag. I pack up all my bags. You have to think, it's the Coleman Complex has five prisons. There was a, there was a female camp. There were, there was a low security prison, a medium security prison, and two penitentiaries. So they literally, you pack up all your bags and then you get placed in a van and you get driven across the parking lot and then unloaded and processed at the low. My boxes full of my bags and my legal work and all my stuff, all my documents, all my clothes, everything that I had, it took a month for it to get across the street. That's how efficient the Bureau of Prisons is. So I get to the low and my, I get called into my counselor's office and his name was Counselor Smith. He was a fat redneck. And the, so at the low, at the medium, the, the guards are kind of respectful, you know, semi-respectful. Like you would think that at the at a camp guards would be really respectful to you, and at a low they'd be a little bit more and like or sorry a little bit less. Like the higher you go up in custody level, the meaner the guards would be, and it's actually the opposite. At the pen, guards are really respectful to the inmates because these guys have life sentences and they're violent and they'll attack you or, or they'll attack a guard. At the medium, it's kind of the same thing, but they can get a little mouthy with a guy at the medium. At the low, they know the low, like you're nonviolent typically, and they'll mouth off to you and they'll be sarcastic. And then at the camp, they'll talk to you like you're a dog because they know you're so happy to be at a camp. You wouldn't dare do anything violent or say anything back to a guard to get written up because you don't want to be moved from the camp to the low or to the, whatever. So my point is I get there, I realize right away that the fucking COs are all assholes. My counselor's an asshole, Counselor Smith. And I remember when I sat down, he looked at my, he looked at my, uh, they call it your jacket, your file. So he looked at my jacket and he goes, he looked in my, in my jacket and he, he goes, Jesus Christ, you got 26 years for fraud. And I went, yeah. And he goes, Man, your nuts are going to be hanging down by your fucking knees by the time you get out of here. And I just was like, oh, I, I couldn't, I mean, it was like just such a, it was just like, Jesus, I couldn't believe he said that. So I was like, wow. Cause like none of the other guards would say something like that. They typically they'd be like, wow, man, that's a lot of time. This guy, he goes, he goes, man, he goes, you're not, he said, you're not going to have a piece of pussy. He said, by the time you get a piece of ass, he said, I don't think you'll even be able to get it up. And I mean, I'm just sitting there like, are, are you fucking serious? Like this guy's a fucking dick and he's laughing about it. And I'm like, Jesus. And I go, well, well, I mean, hopefully that's not what happens. He goes, doesn't look like anything's happening. Looks like you're going to do all that time. And I went, okay, well, yeah, thanks. Uh, okay. So anyway, what's up, bro? I said, all right, so what am I here for? He goes, okay, well, listen, man. He said, um, you know, he gave me a, assigned me a, a 
they call them cells, but a cubicle. He assigned me a bed and I'm like, all right. And then he says, uh, okay, what's up with your FRP, man? You're supposed to be paying FRP. And I'm like, no, I'm not. And he goes, what do you mean? I said, yeah. I said, look in my jacket, bro. I said, uh, I went through this with Counselor Bates. I went through this with Rodriguez. I went through this with Lopez. I went through this with my counselor, uh, Johnson. I went through this with, you know, Thompson. Like, I've been through this with everybody. And he goes, what do you mean? I said, the problem is I said that I, I, I don't have to pay while I'm incarcerated. My, my lawyer argued in front of the judge, and the judge agreed that while I was incarcerated, he, I didn't have to pay. So I don't have to pay. I said, I also don't have to pay the interest on it. And I said, you can, t I said, I said, trust me, it's been three years. You think I haven't paid in three years and nobody's caught it? I said, I'm not on FRP refusal. And he looked, he goes, yeah, I noticed that. He goes, all right, well, I'll check it out. I'll let you know. I said, all right. So that's it. Um, the next day I go to my case manager's office. Her name is Miss Jenkins. And everybody says Miss Jenkins is the devil. Miss Jenkins was a six foot tall black woman who hated all inmates. I had heard that she was in the Atlanta prison when it was, when it was, there was a riot one time and that Miss Jenkins had been raped by inmates. Now, I don't know if that's true. That's what all the inmates said about her and that they said that's why she hated inmates. They also, I also had heard that her sister wa had worked for the BOP as a, uh, as a CO, which is where Miss Jenkins started, and that her sister had fallen in love with an inmate. The inmate had left prison. She quit her job to be with the inmate because th they can't, they can't have contact with inmates after prison. So she quit her job hooked up with this guy. They ended up getting married or lived together. And then the guy cheated on her, left her. And then she was no longer allowed to be hired by the BOP. And now she worked at like some horrible, shitty job somewhere. So Miss Jenkins hated inmates. According to what the other, other inmates said, I have no idea whether that, any of that's true. Regardless, she definitely hated inmates. So I got in there and I remember getting in her office and she was the same way as Smith. Like she told me, you know, after looking at your file and seeing what you, what you've done and all the crimes you've committed, she said, I, I, I think they should have strung you up by the flagpole. And I went, well, thank God they don't do that anymore. And she said, well, you're pretty cocky. She said, listen, uh, I just, I, I don't know what you think you've got coming. I said, I don't think I have anything coming. I said, I think that you told me to come in here. Like I could tell, like she was just combative. And she looked at me and she was, and she just kind of sneered at me. And she said, uh, she, she goes, God, just, she was just you sitting here makes me want to hide my credit cards. And I went, your credit cards. I said, I'm, I'm not going to steal your credit cards. I said, I'll take your whole house. And she, and she was like, she, I remember she just kind of reared back and she said, <laughs> Whatever. She said, listen, Cox, she said, you know, you got so much time. She said, I'm not going to bug you right now about taking any classes or anything. I said, all right. She's, I see you taught the real estate class next door. She said, so just if you, if there's a real estate class check, she goes, maybe you can teach it here. I don't know. She said, that's up to you. She says, but why aren't you paying your FRP? That's what I want to know. You're not on an FRP refusal, but you owe FRP. What's going on? Just then counselor Smith walked in. So he walks in. And I go, ask him. And I said, he asked me the same question. I said, I, I, I said, I already explained this. I don't have to pay FRP. And he says, yeah, I looked in his file. It's weird. Uh, apparently, he said he, the judge said he doesn't have to pay it. Um, he won some motion that he had argued or something, which he got it completely wrong. Like, I didn't win a motion. I told, I told him that I, I won the the argument at sentencing. He was, ah, they filed, he and his lawyer, they filed some motion. He won, his lawyer won some motion or something. He doesn't have to pay FRP while he's incarcerated. He said, which sounds to me like he'll never have to pay it because he's got 20 years to go. He said, so yeah, it's weird. And she goes, she goes, you checked it out? And, and he goes, yeah, yeah, I checked it. He didn't check anything because that's absolutely untrue. So I remember thinking, yes. And I go, can you make a notation? Because it said, this keeps coming up. I said, my fear is one of you guys is going to put me on FRP. 
and I'm going to get my, my, my account's going to be frozen and I'm not going to be able to go, go, go to commissary or something. I said, I mean, honestly, can you? She goes, I'll make a notation, Cox. And she goes and she notes my file. Well, she said she noted my file that I didn't have to pay FRP. Now, that's what she said she did. A reason, there's one reason that I think she did do that, and there's another reason why I think maybe she didn't, but regardless, I'll get to that later. The point is, is that he verifies that I don't have to pay FRP, and I was thrilled, thrilled, because at this point, the only money I've got coming in is money I made, was making at my GED class, and that was it. My mother at this point, I think, had sent me $50, like... I didn't ask her for money, had never asked her for any money, even though she was constantly saying, do you need money? Do you want me to send you money? Do you want me to? And I was like, no, 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 because I had a job. Um, and I was also, I had a job and I was teaching real estate and I was hustling at my real estate. So I was making money there, getting commissary. You don't actually get, you know, actual like money. It's commissary. So, but now I'm in the low. I have no job and I don't know what to do. I'm not teaching the real estate class. So now my mother has to send me money. So the last thing I want to do is have my mother send me money and then take that money to pay FRP, which they'll do. At this point, I just went from the medium security prison to the low security prison. I've been locked up. I was locked up three years in the medium security prison. I was locked up one year in the marshal's holdover or multiple marshal's holdover. But so far, I've been in prison like four years. Listen, it's been four years and I really like there's an issue like I, I'm, I'm at the point now where I realize that I'm not, you know, I'm not going to get my sentence reduced. Like that's really where where I'm, I'm, I'm at. Like it's, it's at that point. So I. Um, you know, I, I'm I'm at the prison and did i tell you that did i mention ever mention that this is when the fbi starts showing up like they showed up at the medium one time i think i they showed up one time like at the medium anyway so i'm now at the the low security prison and i'm at the low and i basically go to i go to the education department I actually know some guys from the medium that have gone to the low now at this point. So I see some of those guys. One of those guys was this guy, Kevin Weeks. I mentioned him in another video. And I remember he started shaving. He was super smart, really sharp guy. He had started shaving his head completely bald because he was going bald and his hair was thinning. And he start, he shaved his head for like a six months or something. And he looked like, um, shoot, what is the guy? What is Superman's? Nemesis. Lex Luthor. Kevin Weeks looked like what Lex Luthor. And I remember everybody started calling him Lex Luthor. As a matter of fact, in my phone, I have a picture of Lex Luthor. So, on him for his phone number. My point is, is that I'm in the low and I go to education and I meet the guy who's teaching the real estate class. And when I, I meet him, we talk and he's teaching the class. And I think after a couple months went by, he came to me and he said, look, I don't want to teach the class anymore because you can't like I can't go in and you can't teach two classes. And the second thing is, you know, I didn't want to take like, what am I? How am I? There's no way for me to take over his class like he has to give it up. So he says, comes to me and he says, listen, man, I don't want to teach the class anymore. I'm focusing on my on my uh, case. And he had a case where he had uh, he was in real estate, too. It's amazing how many real estate guys. And there's really very few real estate guys, but it just so happens that they click up right away. So I meet him and I start taking over the real estate class and it immediately people start coming and it becomes the same thing all over again. The difference was at the, at the medium, you could teach a class where I could teach some kind of gray stuff like gray areas. And in the low, you can't teach any gray areas because in the low, it's really just packed with guys that are desperate to get out of prison. They're all non, not all nonviolent, but most of them are nonviolent. And they just, they don't want to be there. Like they don't want to be in prison. And, uh, you know, and they're, they're telling on each other left and right. Not that they aren't at the medium, but the me medium, it could go bad for you. Like you could get stabbed. And at the low, like there's, it's funny because I hate to say this because there were stabbings at the low. There were guys cutting each other with razors and there were attacks and there were, there's all kinds of stuff happening at the low. But 
uh, it just wasn't as tense of an environment. And it was what's called a, uh, it was, there were, there were control moves, but it was, it was also an open compound. So during the day, they had controlled moves where you had to, at the beginning of the each hour, towards the beginning of each hour, you had like 10 minutes to get to where you were going. But after chow, like after you ate, lunch or dinner at like five or six o'clock it was an open compound until they closed the compound at nine o'clock which means that the, all the doors were open and you could walk around the compound they closed the rec yard but everything else was open so i'm at the low and i i end up teaching the real estate class again and i decide at that point and i already said like i'd been on american greed i'd been on dateline um I had a reporter contact me and he wrote an article on me and I, I would get reporters every once in a while. And I was contacted by some of these TV shows. Um, I was contacted by like, uh, who was I contacted by? There was a TV show called I Almost Got Away With It. Um, I was contacted by another TV show that had been started uh, by the same people who did Dateline. You know, but, but the thing is, they, you know, they couldn't interview me. Uh, they could inter interview me on the, on the phone, but they couldn't come and see me. So, so that never happened. Oh, I was inter, uh, I was contacted by, uh, the show, um, shoot, what was it called? Um, uh, locked up abroad. Still, they couldn't get cameras in. So they, they just said, they were like, yeah, okay, we, we're, we thought we could get cameras in to do, do your, um, to, to interview you on film. But if we can't, we're not interested in doing a, a piece on you. But by this point, I realized like there's a lot of interest in my case. And so I decide, you know, what I'm going to do is I, I've been reading nonstop. Like I've been reading two, two books a week, at least two books a week. Well, one or two books a week um, for three years now. So I decided, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to start writing my story. So I start writing my story and I wrote a version, you know, I wrote my story and it was about 300 pages. You know, it was actually more than that typed on a Swintech typewriter and, you know, handwritten and everything. But in the end, it was roughly about at that point, it was roughly 300 pages. So which 300 pages, is roughly 90,000 words, maybe a little bit more. Um, and I started le letting guys read it. And, you know, they were like, oh, you know, this could be better. This, you know, they'll, they'll tell you different things. And then I actually wanted to start sending it off. And I, I, I got a book sent in called um, How to Write Query Letters. And it was the, it was all, and I also got a, a letter in called the uh, Literary Agent's Guide. So you, you really can't go directly to like someone like Simon and Schuster. If someone like Simon and Schuster, or Penguin Books or whoever, if they would come to you or like, so there's like the big, you know, there's Double Day and those kinds of big companies. They, they would, if they came to you and said, we want you to write your book or we want you as a writer or we want to hire someone to write your book, that's really how it, it works. But if you say, hey, I've written a book and I want to contact these people, you really can't go directly to like Simon & Schuster because they're so big, they don't really deal with authors individually they deal with literary agents so i needed to contact a literary agent so first thing i did was i wrote my book i then learned how to re or write what's called a query letter so i wrote a query letter and the query letter was and if i don't say so you know, myself i hate to say this but it was great like i wrote a really great query letter and i sent off gosh a hundred of them and got maybe a couple people that were interested and I mailed them the manuscript and one woman, I worked with her back and forth for maybe a few months, a month or two, but it, I came to the conclusion that I just wasn't going to be able to polish up the, the actual manuscript good enough for her to be happy. Uh, and the other person, like it was, I, it just didn't go anywhere. So I contacted my sister and I said, cause my sister had told me that she had a friend that worked in entertainment as an entertainment agent. And he had represented a bunch of comedians and uh, I forget the name of the comedian that was in the movie um, Deuce Bigelow. There was a black guy that plays the gigolo. He represented him. He represented a bunch of guys and he represented a bunch of, of um, sports stars 
uh, you know, baseball, football players. And he also represented um, um, some radio personalities show guys called uh, Ron and Ron. So he represented – this guy's name was uh, – um, his name was Ross Reback. So Ross Reback was like an, like an entertainment agent. And if you know, if you know anything about the entertainment a, uh, industry, what constitutes a, an entertainment agent, an entertainment agent is absolutely nothing. Like there's no license or anything. You can just say, Hey, I'm an entertainment agent. So Ross was an entertainment agent and he actually worked on a bunch of stuff and he'd actually sold several ideas for, uh, TV shows. He had also sold um, or optioned the rights to, uh, like, I think one or two books. One of the books was um, Mob Lawyer. It was a book called Mob Lawyer, which he had uh, he'd optioned it the rights to pitch the story, uh, the the film rights for the book from to from the um, the family, the lawyer's family, because the lawyer had actually died. He'd written the book. When he retired and then he died. So Ross was trying to get that turned into a movie. So I contact my sister and say, Hey, I understand that you got you and my brother in law, which my sister is more married to a lawyer and his name's Jack. So I said, I understand that you and Jack, um, no, you said you knew uh, an entertainment lawyer that wanted to talk to me. He'd actually told Ross had actually told my brother in law. He wanted to meet me and talk to me about my story, but I, I hadn't really pursued it. So once I wrote the, the book and I wasn't getting anywhere, I said, hey, look, you know, I need a literary agent to my sister. And I called her and I said, I need a literary agent. And you said you knew somebody who was in, in entertainment. And she goes, well, you know what? It's funny. I can call him. I can have my, Jack call him. I, I know he wanted to talk to you. So I end up sending Ross Reback my manuscript he looks at the manuscript he reads it he then schedules a time to come visit me he and my brother-in-law come to coleman to visit me so they come to the low and i meet them at the low and ross comes in and i said hey ross what's going on you know did you read the book he said yeah and he said uh i said okay he said well, why do you think he said why do you think i'm here i said well i'm assuming you're here because you want to represent me and he said you know, I think you have an amazing story. And I read your story. He said, and your story is absolutely amazing. He said, but at the end of the story, like, you're just a psychopath that got 26 years in prison and I don't care about you. And I went like, wow, that was like, he drove like an hour and a half to get here to tell me that. So I said, wow. I said, that's not what I expected at all. He said, you have a great story, but you didn't tell it great. He goes, you don't talk about your childhood or anything like that or the things that helped make you the person you are that ended up doing all of these crimes. And I went, ah, I know, but nobody wants to hear me cry and bitch and moan. And nobody wants to hear that stuff because you're wrong about that. I want to hear about that. People want to hear about that. People want to know who you really are. You don't touch on that at all. It's really just a, he said, it reads almost like a newspaper article. It's like, it's one Criminal event after another after another. You're just documenting it. He goes, I don't need to document it. He goes, if you want, if I want to read the documentation, he goes, I can just read the articles about you. He said, you have to rewrite that book. And I went, bro, it took me like six months to a year to write that book. And he said, you're going to have to rewrite it. And he said, I'm going to send you some books. So he sent me some books. Uh, one was like, um, you know, like true crime for dummies. One was. Uh, how to write nonfiction for dummies. And then I, I actually, actually somebody had seen me reading these books and the, the four dummies series and the, oh no, the idiot's guide to true crime writing or something like that. Like those sound horrible, like, but they're actually all great books written by, by, uh, really accomplished writers. Hey, if you guys didn't know, I also do, I do paintings. And uh, if you're interested in a painting, I'm going to leave my contact information in the description but beneath the video. Back to the video. So I end up getting that and I end up, somebody in another unit knew I was writing and came to me and gave me a book. I remember it was probably 90 pages, maybe a hundred, less than a hundred, probably less than a hundred pages. It was a little tiny book. And I remember it was called, oh, fuck, I forget what it was called. I never can remember what it was called. But it was written by a woman who'd written three memoirs about her life. Three memoirs about her life. And I read it. 
in like a day. And it was the best book. Out of all the books I read on how to write, it was the best one. So I then have to rewrite my entire book. And I end up going back and including stuff about my childhood, stuff about my dad, stuff about um, just things that f- helped form my personality, form my, my belief system, things that helped create the person that actually committed the crimes that I committed and gave reasons for why, whether these are the actual reasons or not, it's what I believed helped formulate the person that I am. You know, and I hated putting those things in that book because specifically, um, you know, I had met guys that really had traumatic, by this point in life or in my prison sentence, I'd met guys that truly had had horrific um, upbringings, guys that had been, you know, burned by their parents, um, beaten by their parents, tied up, abandoned, starved to death, locked in closets. The guys that had had truly, truly horrible, um, uh, you know, childhoods. And so for me to bitch because my dad, you know, didn't really, you know, want me. Um, I wasn't really the, the, the son that he wanted or because I never really felt like he, I lived up to his ex, uh, expectations or because I was a disappointment to him or, you know, to bitch about those things made me feel, you know, like a, uh, just like a, like a fake, like, you know, unappreciative for the fact that I grew up middle class and that so what, if you had a bad childhood, you still had a, a car when you were 16 and you still were able to go to private schools for, because I had a learning disability and, you know, you still had a mother that loved you and, you know, that sort of thing. So, but I put those things in there. Um, I realized that I shouldn't diminish those things simply because I felt other people had it worse because certainly other people had it better. So I put those things in there and I rewrote the book and it, man, it took me like three months to rewrite that book. And I sent it to Ross and he scheduled a time to come out with me again. And he came out and he said, this book is amazing. He said, this is a book that can get published. This is a book that could be a movie. This is phenomenal. Your story is amazing. My story hadn't changed. The only thing that changed was me putting in like, how did I feel when I walked in the bank? How did I feel when I walked out of the bank with a check? How did I, you know, and about things about my childhood and about my 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 relationship with my parents, my siblings, my girlfriends. Like I didn't really have anything before about my girlfriends, the, you know, events that were had occurred. So he said, yeah, it needed to be more personal stuff. So I, I had included that. And so he loved the book and he wanted to represent me on the book. And what I, what I decided was, you know, I absolutely wanted to go with Ross and I thought Ross was a great guy. And so I, Ross said he was going to, you know, he wanted to represent me on that, on the, on my memoir, which my book's called, you know, shark in the housing pool. So while that process was going on. I was wrapping up final edits for Ross and he had sent me final edits. Um, and he had decided he was going to start contacting literary agents or I'm sorry, he was going to start contacting publishers. You know, I, um, I ended up, I kind of decided I was going to start writing other inmate stories because I really liked writing. Like it was a, it it gave me a real feeling of accomplishment. Like I enjoyed it. And so at the same time as I was wrapping that up, I had gotten, there was a newspaper, there was an article in Rolling Stone magazine um, about, it it was, it was, it was called a um, dudes and no arms and dudes. It was called arms and dudes. And so I was like, okay, arms and dudes. And I read it and it was about these two stoner kids that these two Jewish kids that were stoners in Miami that had kind of stumbled their way into getting a contract to supply mu- ammunition to the Afghan security forces for, it was, they always say a $300 million contract, but it was actually $298 million. The point is, so roughly a $300 million contract to supply munitions for the Afghan security forces, but the U.S. government was the one that was paying them. And, and collecting. So even though the money was going to, or the ammunition was going to end up in the Afghanis security forces hands, it was actually the U S government that had put out the contract 
they bid on it, they got the contract, and they were getting paid by the government. So um, the main kid, there were two guys. One was uh, David Packowls, and one was guy's name was Ephraim Deveroli. Well, Ephraim Deveroli had ended up, um, he, he, Ephraim Deveroli had ended up in Coleman Low. He's got like six years, three years, no, four years, three, four. I don't know. What I know is, I think he got four years. Yeah, I think he got four years. Maybe, whatever. That's, that's irrelevant. If you're interested, look it up. So he got some time. He got like roughly, whatever, four or five years. So he came to the low. And while I was standing in line, I was standing in line one time with this guy. And I read the article maybe a week ago by the same guy that gave me the article. And all of a sudden, the guy I'm standing with in line waiting for chow, waiting for a, a lunch or dinner, he hits me. and He goes, hey, bro. He says, see that guy over there? And I go, yeah. He was the guy with the curly hair. And I went, yeah. He goes, that's that from Deveroli. And I went, who? He goes, remember the article I gave you in Rolling Stone magazine? I went, yeah. He goes, that's the guy. I go, the gun runner? And he goes, that's the gun runner. I was like, holy shit. He got so fat. Like he was real fat. Um, and I was like, oh my God. I said, that's him. And he goes, yeah, bro. He said, he got here a couple days ago. And I was like, oh wow. I said, what a great story. Um, and so we're walking and the guy, the guy's name was Chris. Chris goes, bro, you need to talk to him. And I went, about what? And he goes, about writing a story. And I went, yeah, you know, you're right. And I kind of decided I liked that. And I thought about doing it. And I went, yeah, I should talk to him. Maybe I should. So I went a couple days later, I found Deveroli on the rec yard. And I went up to him. I said, hey, what's your, your name? Uh, you're Deveroli, right? And he goes, yeah. And I said, listen, man. Uh, I said, my name's Cox. And uh, I read your, that article in Rolling Stone. It was a great article. And he goes, yeah, he was that cocksucker, the, the guy that wrote it. He was, said I was a greedy bastard. He was, if you think that's great. And I went, well, I didn't see it that way. I thought it was great just that you guys were able to get the contract and just the way the whole thing unraveled. I thought it was an amazing story. And he goes, yeah, well, yeah, it was, it was pretty good, but they really did a hatchet job on me. Like, you know, this was guy's a com fucking complainer. So I said, I said, well, he goes, well, what's up, bro? I said, well, I was wondering if you were, had considered writing a book. And he goes, nah, he's, man, I'm, I'm, you know, he's, I got ADHD. He said, I'm bipolar. He said, I'm up and down. I got mood swings. He says, there's just no way I could focus long enough to write a story. I said, well, I just, I'm finishing up my book right now. If you want, I could help you write an outline and you could send that to a ghostwriter on the street. And he went, well, yeah, I guess he goes, I said, I mean, if you're thinking you can't do it, maybe you could just hire someone. I said, it sounds to me like you probably still have money and ghostwriters don't cost, but between 15,000 and maybe $45,000, you probably get a ghostwriter to do it for 20 or 30. At this point, I said, you have so much publicity. And when you get out, you're going to have a ton of publicity. I said, and if you wrote a book, there would probably be tons of publicity on the book. I said, it really shouldn't be that hard. I said, I'm in the process right now of trying to get my stuff done. If you, and I just wrote my book and I'd be or finishing it up. I, I was doing some final edits. And I said, if you're willing, I'd be willing to help you. And he goes, he kind of looked at me weary and he was like, eh, I don't know. I'll think about it, bro. I'll think about it. Like he was like, he didn't trust me or something. He was just, and he's a very untrustful person in general. So he goes, I'll think about it. I'll think about it. I said, okay, well, let me know. So I leave. Um, Anyway, like a couple of days later, I see him on the compound. We're walking by and I said, hey, what's up? He goes, I'm still thinking about it, bro. And he keeps walking. A week, another week goes by. Another week goes by. And and by this point, you know, it's been months. You know, months go by. And then one day I see him and I I... I said, hey, I said, uh, you know, hey, what's up? He goes, hey, bro, wait a minute. I've been looking for you. Stop. And I go, what's up? He goes, he said, did you hear that they sold the article in Rolling Stone? They optioned the rights to it. They're going to make a movie. And I looked at him and I went, but the article wasn't written from Dever Ephraim Deveroli's perspective. It was written from David Pacow's perspective. And David Packowls had made Deveroli sound, I don't think he made him sound that bad, to be honest. But 
the article was written in such a way that they basically both sounded like stoners who were kind of baffoons. And I went and, and he told, he's, when we talked in the rec yard, he had told me that he didn't like that. He didn't like that. It made them him sound like a fucking stoner. Like he was an idiot of some kind. Like he was like, Oh dude, like, like they, 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 like they, they bumbled their way into the contract because after talking with Dev Rowley, he was, he wasn't that guy. He was a very driven person. Um, and he, granted, he was all over the place, but he was extremely aggressive. So I had stopped him and I went, really? I said, well, who bought it? And he goes, yeah, he said, um, oh, God, I forget. It was like, I forget who bought it, The exact, but it, it basically, I forget the name of it. It was essentially, though, it was the guys, it, it was uh, Todd, um, Todd Phillips, which is the guy who made the Hangover movies. So Todd Phillips and um, Bradley Cooper had purchased the the film rights and the life rights to, or sorry, the film rights and the life rights for the story and from David Packhaus. And so I looked at him and I went, so the guys that made the Hangover movies are going to make a movie about your life. And he goes, yeah, bro, yeah, pretty cool, right? And I went, and you're not going to make a dime on it. And there, I said, do you understand, have you seen the Hangover movies? And he goes, uh, you can tell now he's starting to get worried. He's like, oh, uh, yeah, I've seen them. I go, do you understand what they make? Do you understand what those movies are? I go, they're going to make a movie called Dude, Where's My Hand Grenade? And they're going to make you look like an idiot. You're going to look like David Spicoli from Fast Times at Ridgemont High, which I'm sure nobody, people that are watching this are probably in their 20s and 30s and don't know what Fast Times at Ridgemont High is. Do you? No. Fast Times at Ridgemont High is a, it's a coming of age story um, that takes place with several kids that are graduating like high school. And one guy is a complete stoner. Like he gets a pizza delivered to the class while he's in class. He, he's stoned all the time. He's like, Oh, dude, bro. Like, what's up, man? Like, Oh, that's crazy. Yo. I mean, just a, a complete stoner, like the quintessential stoner straight out of central casting is uh, David Spicoli. So, and I looked at him and I go, you're going to be David Spicoli from Fast Time at Fast Times at Ridgemont High, they're going to make you look like an idiot. And I said, you have to, you're going to get out of prison in a couple of years and you're probably going to want to go back into business, right? And he went, yeah. And I said, you're going to, people, you're going to say, you're going to introduce yourself to people as Ephraim Deveroli and they're going to snicker. That would be like me introducing myself as David Spicoli. If I did that to a fi another 50-year-old, my age, my generation, they would laugh. They'd go, are you serious, bro? Like they would immediately laugh. And I said, and, but Deveroli knew who David Spicoli was. He was not that much. He's, he's younger than me, but you know, not that much younger. And he went, the look on his face was like, holy shit. He hadn't even considered that if he didn't like the article, what was he going to like when Todd Phillips got done with him? What was he going to look like? When Todd Phillips got got done making him look like a fool. And so and I looked at him and I said, bro, you're gonna look like an idiot. And he goes, yo, man, he said, um, and I and I he goes, man, I went all and you're gonna look like an idiot because you can't meet me once or twice a week so that we can write an outline of your story, so you can write a short book, so you can get a movie made. I said, that movie should be being made from your perspective. Because I said, it's really your story. But they're not going to tell your version of the story. They're going to tell David Packhouse's version. And you have to understand there's nothing he could do about it because it was public record. He'd been convicted of a crime and those records are public. He'd been in the newspaper. His name had been in the newspaper. So they can now use his name and his likeness as long as they stay close to the truth. And nothing he can do. Now, he can sue and he can, but he has to have a grounds to sue. 
and simply saying, hey, you used my name and you weren't accurate in your depiction of me isn't really enough. Like it is, but it isn't. Like you could sue, but you probably wouldn't get very far. Hey, I wanted to let you guys know that I have a Patreon account. If you're interested in joining the Patreon account, it's got three tiers. The top tier, you actually get a different con man painting every single month. If you're already joined and you're already supporting me, I really appreciate that. If you haven't joined yet and you're interested in joining, I'm going to leave the contact information for Patreon in the description. Thank you very much for watching the video. Back to the video. So what he does is he looks at me and he says, man, what, how quickly can we meet? How quickly can we meet? And I went, I mean, we can meet tonight. He goes, bro, let's meet tonight and we'll work out a deal and, and, and you start writing. How quickly can you write? I said, I don't know. How much of your stuff do you have? You mean, I, I got everything. I got a great memory. I can tell you all the dates, times, everything you need. Because, you know, what I'd been doing, like for my own case, I figured out how to order something called the Freedom of Information Act. And that basically allows you to go in. So there's a federal Freedom of Information Act, which allows you to go to any federal agency and order any document that they have on you. So I was able to do that. And you can also go to all of the states have a Freedom of Public Records Act, which allows you any person to order documents on any individual that's been, let's say, arrested or investigated. And they have to provide those documents for you. So I'd been ordering documents on myself. And I, I told him, I said, well, I might have to order the documents on you. And that might take some time. And he goes, no, no, bro. I have a great memory. I know when all the dates are. I know all of the amounts. I know my case inside and out. And he goes, plus, I have all the files in my case, in my legal locker, and in boxes underneath my bed. So um, he had everything. So I said, bro, if that's the case, I could probably write your whole outline in a month or so. He goes, all right, let's meet tonight. So we start meeting. We meet every other night for mo for probably two or three weeks. In the meantime, and, and I write a, an extensive um, outline on, uh, on him and his entire story. And it's a great story. It's a story that's so much better than that movie is or probably could have ever been. It was just a great story. It really should be an entire series. It's so phenomenal. And what's really amazing is that this guy, David, the David Packowls, who the movie ultimately kind of gets written from his perspective, he comes in at the very kind of the very end. Like the movie and the article make it sound like they started the company together and they were together the whole time. But the truth is Devaroli had been doing had been fulfilling contracts for years prior to Pacquiao's coming in. So Pacquiao's doesn't really know the whole story. He knows his story, but he doesn't know Devaroli's story. Devaroli's story is phenomenal. And I realized this right away as I'm writing the story. He's also a much more vicious character than was portrayed by um, Jonah Hill. Jan Jonah Hill plays him in the movies, in the movie. And he's a much more vicious person and much more aggressive person than the article or the movie portray him as. I mean, he's truly a, a, a cutthroat person. I mean, just ruthless. Um, so while I'm writing that story or writing his outline, as I get to the end of the outline, Devaroli says, Matt, can you, I got a question for you. I said, well, he said, did you finish your book? And I said, yeah, yeah, I basically just finished it. Just got it sent in. I'm still kind of reading over it, maybe doing some touch up typos, whatever. Um, and I was waiting for Ross Reback to come see me again, which was a few weeks away. And I said, uh, he, he sat there and he goes, okay. He said, um, can I read it? And I went, uh, yeah, you can read it. And he goes, okay, yeah, give it to me, bro. I, I, I'll read it. I said, okay. So I go and I give him the book and I give him my manuscript. Manuscript was like, God, the manuscript was big too. Like the, the book ultimately ended up being like 330 pages, I think. The manuscript was like 400 and some odd pages, but it's just because the formatting was fucked up. Was it was the lettering was too big and there were spaces so that I could write notes. And so I give it to him, and maybe a, a week, less than a week goes by, maybe. And I remember he, I kept asking him, like, hey, did you start the book? No, not yet, bro. Next day, hey, man, did you start the book? No, not yet. And I'd walk by him in the compound, see, or I'd see him in the chow hall or something. I go, man, did you, read, did you start the book? And he goes, nah, I'm going to do it tonight. I'm going to do it tonight. 
And so it's like three or four days went by. He hadn't started it. And then one day I stopped asking him like two, two, three days later, he shows up and walks up with it with the book. Boom, puts it down. And he said, we're supposed to meet to go over some of the stuff on his outline. He goes, how much? And I went, what? He was, how much? What would you charge me to write my book? He said, what you wrote is amazing. He goes, that's the best thing I've ever read in my entire life. And I go, are you serious? He goes, I want you to write my book. I'm, he's, I'm telling you, man, like, that's what I want. That is what I want. He's like, like, you say, you say it exactly how it is. You describe yourself exactly how you are. He goes, and on top of that, he said, you said some bad stuff about yourself. Like you admitted that you're a flawed individual. However, in overall, he said, I rooted for you. I wanted you to succeed. I was, he said, I was devastated when you got caught, even though I knew it was coming. He said, you were a flawed person, but overall, an amazing individual. He goes, and that's what I want people to know about me. And I went, I was just like, wow. I said, uh. I don't know. Like I, I probably like want a percentage of the book. Like I want, I just want a percentage of whatever sales or whatever you get, um, you know, film rights, like the whole thing. And he's like, okay, okay. He said, we can do that. And he said, okay. Um, uh, uh, he said, yeah, man. He said, uh, and he said, I don't really know how it works. Like how, how exactly was it going to work? And I said, okay, well, I, I said, you could get a literary agent, but I said, you could go with my literary agent. I said, I have a literary agent that come, is coming to see me in a couple of weeks. And so we work out a deal and I, I told him he, he had to pay me because I had to type the whole thing up in what's called core links, which is our, our, it's like a, a, an email system, sort of like an email system. Like I said, I have to type everything up and I have to, I was already typing his outline. So I said, you have to like basically send me money. And so I can type everything up and he said, yeah, yeah, I'm going to put you in contact with my sister and uh, I'm going to give you all the documents. And he said, but we got to do this right away because he's like, I'm going to be moving in a few months. You have to write this whole thing in a few months. I was like, oh, wow, I don't know if I can do it in a few months. So he and I start working everything out and he ends up saying, look, I'm going to I got to get a, uh, an entertainment attorney to write up a contract. Uh, can we start now? I can put money on your books for you to start typing. And I was like, here's the great thing was the great thing was I had just kind of finished up or was roughly finishing up within a week or so his outline. And I'd written this exhaustive, like 80 page outline. Like I only have to really expand this outline that I'd written over the last month or two. So it wasn't going to be that hard. Like, I don't really even need him anymore. I just need the documents. I'd heard the stories. Um, I mean, 80 pages, if you turn 80 pages into, let's say, 300 pages, it's not that hard to expand. Uh, anyway, um, I had it. So I had it. And I was thrilled. And I was like, oh, my God, this is great. Because I knew this was going to be a good book. And not just that, there was a chance that this book could be turned into a movie or a series because although they had sold the film rights to the article, which had been written in Rolling Stone magazine by a guy named Guy Lawson, although they had sold the film rights, they hadn't actually done anything yet. Like there was no, there was no script or anything yet. So nothing had been done. Like it was still a chance that we could kind of get ahead of 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 the the film that was supposedly pot in motion like you they haven't even got a script so if you move a little faster maybe you get your stuff made i didn't really know how it worked but i knew that at the very least he could get a probably a, get a book deal and the reason i say that also is that the, there was a book so Guy lawson who'd wrote written the rolling stone article was expanding his article into a full-length book that wasn't even scheduled to be come out to come out for like a year. So I had time. So I end up getting putting Devaroli in touch with my literary agent, and we schedule a time for all of us to meet in the visitation. Now keep in mind that he couldn't just meet with with Reback without me. 
Okay. Because you have to say you have an, when you fill out paperwork, you have to be able to, you have to say you have an existing relationship with the person. And Reback had lied on his, well, Reback had come in the first time with my brother-in-law and that got him approved to come see me. So he's already approved, but he can't get approved to come see Devaroli. So we schedule it so that Devaroli is going to have his mother and sister and his brother come to see him the same day that Reback's going to come see me. So we'll all be in the visitation area at the same time. And so we can all sit together and have a conversation so that they can meet in person. And basically so that Reback can kind of pitch himself on who he is and why he, what he thinks he can do for Devaroli. At this point, I am meeting with Ross Reback, my literary agent, and Ephraim Devaroli. We met in visitation, and Devaroli ended up, we ended up arranging our meeting so that I would be meeting with Ross Reback, who was approved to come visit me because he'd come to visit me earlier at another time with my brother-in-law, who's a lawyer. So my brother-in-law got him approved as kind of like, I don't know, an associate or legal counsel or something. I forget. But so Ross came in to see me and um, Dev Rowley's, I think his, I want to say it was his mother, his sister, and might have been both of his brothers. I think maybe it was just one of his brothers. I don't know. But they came to see to see me or they, they came to see him. So what happened is I go and I see I see Ross and Devaroli shows up and he's there with his family and they're all talking. And, and the, you got to think the visitation room is a big room. It's probably, gosh, I don't know. It's, it's, it's big. It's like, it's got to be a hundred. Nah, I don't know if it's a hundred feet, but it's, it's probably 60 feet by 40 feet. It's filled with these plastic chairs uh, and little tiny like tables. Like it's super uncomfortable. Um, there are windows on the, you know, there's windows around it in a few places, but you have to think this is like double blocked um, construction. So there's two blocks with poured with concrete. There are windows, but they have these thick, thick bars on the windows. Um, and, and then there's an outside too. You could actually go outside, but the outside was like, same thing. It was just this, this massive, these massive walls that probably go up. 20 probably probably nah, i don't know about 20 maybe 10 or 15 feet and then it's covered with like a, a a a screening like you would have like let's say for your um for your pool so it's got this huge covering for your for like a like a pool screening screen it's screened in and you could go out there and sit in these these poured concrete benches and poured concrete picnic tables and, you know, people go out there and sit down. So we ended up, you know, Devaroli was out there and I think his sister ended up coming to us and saying, hey, you can come sit with us. What happened was in the middle of Devaroli's, in the middle, Devaroli's mother and brother and sister, like they have no idea this is what's happening. They just drove four and a half hours from Miami to be there before anybody to, to wait and see him. And so they get there, they come in, they talk for maybe, maybe 30 minutes in the middle of the conversation. He looks at his watch and he says, listen, I scheduled a business, a business meeting. Uh, so I've got these guys that are here and they're like, what? He's like, yeah, yeah. I've got these guys that are here. They're going to come and they're going to, uh, this is a guy who's writing, uh, he's, I want him to write my book and his literary agent. So I scheduled this business meeting here even though his family drove four and a half hours to spend the day with him. And when they, I say spend the day, they might be able to spend three or four hours with him. And he just decided 30 minutes into it, got a business meeting. And keep in mind too, they have to sit there with us. If they can't get up and go sit somewhere else or the guards will come over and say, what's going on? Like, why is this inmate sitting with you? Why are you guys talking? Because you're not really supposed to mix 
like people, what we were doing, you're not supposed to do, but they get so crowded sometimes they'll actually tell you, hey, go sit with those people. Or you guys got to, you have to sit at the same bench. You have to share. So they can't really stop you because it's so crowded. They want you to sit together. Anyway, um, we, I, I, his sister comes over. So his mom's furious, by the way. Mother's furious. Uh, the sister's furious. The brother could care less. Like he, his brother, I'm pretty sure, knows his, his brother's a jerk. So... The sister comes over, I, I'm pretty sure it's sister. She comes over and she says, hey, come outside. So we go outside and we sit down and I'm like, hi. And Reback kind of introduces himself to everybody. And his mother, I can tell, is furious. And so Reback pitches himself to, to Devaroli. Like he basically explains who he is. And while and, and he's like, look, here's who I am. Here's what I do. Here's what I've done. He used to represent Ron and Ron in the morning, which was a huge syndicated show. Uh, I've done this. I bought this. Uh, the life where I've optioned life rights here. I've done this. I've sold a bunch of um, whatever. He goes through a whole thing. He pitches himself. He does a great job. And Devaroli's like, OK, OK, well, you know, so you think you could what do you think you can do? And he's like, I think we can do this. I think we can do that. And so he goes through this whole thing of when of how he believes he can get this um, accomplished, uh, get him, get a book done and option the film rights and possibly even get, really he's thinking he can get a movie or a series done on Devaroli. But he, his big thing was, I need to get, we need to get a book done as quickly as possible. I remember his mother is furious and I'm just sitting there. Like I, I only got, went and did this to arrange the whole thing so that they could meet so while they're sitting there pitching, um, I remember Devaroli's sister said, Ross made some comment about how he believed that he could get it done. And he said, and, and she's like, well, how do we know you can get this done? And he says, well, I mean, I've gotten a lot, I've accomplished a lot. And I, I accomplished this. I've done this. I've done this. I've done this. I've done all, been successful in all of these things. And she goes, well, maybe you just get lucky a lot. I mean, she was like super hard on him. And I remember she said, she goes, well, maybe you just got, maybe you just got lucky a lot. And I said, well, I'd rather be lucky than I'm, than good. And then Ross says, I say that all the time. I'd rather be lucky than good. And I said, you'd be so sh shocked at how often luck plays a part in just any given, you know, scenario. Like, I mean, you look at, look at American Idol, like the top 20 people that are on that show or top 10 people are, you know, like they're all amazing, but only one ends up getting chosen. And you almost never hear from any of these other people. Doesn't mean that they're not all amazingly talented. They're just, they just weren't lucky. You know, that sometimes, sometimes your cousin knows a guy who knows a guy who he met, you know, at a party. And the next thing you know, you have a movie made about you. You don't even deserve the movie. But other people have amazing stories and the movies just never, it just never happens. So we end up having this huge conversation. And in the middle of the conversation, Ross starts, kind of tries to include, he tries to endear himself to Devaroli's mom. And his mother, he says, uh, says something. And she says, Devaroli's sister is like, well, why are you writing the book? And I went, well, I've written, uh, I wrote, I just finished a book and it's something I'm going to probably start doing. And I, I think I could probably write it. And I said, probably do a pretty good job. And so um, the sister ends up saying, Oh, this, she's like, well, what qualifies you? I'm like, well, nothing qualifies me to write a book. I said, I mean, I've read several books and I started to start kind of explaining what I've done. And, and I, and she goes, well, why did you write a book about yourself? And, and so Ross ends up saying something to the mother and the mother goes, I have no idea who any of you people are. She goes, I don't know who he is. I don't know why, why he would write a book or anybody would want to read a book about him. She goes, I don't know who you are. And Ross says, well, Matt, is actually had a big case and starts going on about my case. And then all of a sudden she turns to me and she goes, Oh my God, she goes, 
you were on American Greed? And I was like, um, yeah, I was on American Greed. She's, I've watched every one of those shows. What did you do? And so I started explaining what I did. And she goes, I watched your show. I remember your show. And completely her whole demeanor changes. And the sister's demeanor changes. And the brother's demeanor changes. And he's immediately like, what's going on? What did you do? Oh, my gosh. I remember that episode. So they go on and on. So we have this conversation, but keep in mind, we can only t- sit there for about an hour. And then because it, it's like we're intruding on their visitation. So we end up leaving and we schedule another meeting. The next meeting we have is, I don't know how long it, it, it is later. Uh, I want to say it's its a few weeks later, a few weeks later. But this time it's just Devaroli and his sister and it's me and Ross. So we all end up at another table inside and we have the same conversation and Ross basically, they end up hammering out an agreement. During the course of, while they're hammering out the agreement, I remember they ended up, Ross kept saying, we have to get the book done as quickly as possible. And I was like, yeah, I get it, Ross, but it takes time to write a book. He's like, Matt, we need to get it done as fast as possible. The reason they wanted it done as, as quickly as possible was because Warner Brothers was in the process of making or, or, or writing a screenplay about Deveroli and Pat, about their about their case, Deveroli's case. But it was based on um, David Packhouse's version of the case, not Deveroli. So it's like you and your buddy both ended up, I don't know, you know, going to school together and playing on a soccer team and winning the cha- championship. But he writes a book about it and you're in his book. He talks about you, but he ends up writing the book and selling the book. You don't get anything. Even though he talked about you, even though he talked about you and who, who about stuff in the locker room and conversations you, you had, he's allowed to do that. On top of that, in Devaroli's case in particular, there was, lo- there were lots of documents and there were lots of articles. So any expectation of privacy he had, he lost. So there, plus there had been an article written. So, and, and that article had been optioned. So what happens is there, right currently, Warner Brothers, um, was, was having, a, a screenplay written based on the article that had been written in Rolling Stone magazine. And Jonah Hill wanted to play Devaroli. So I don't know if you know who, I'm sure you know who Jonah Hill is. Uh, Jonah Hill was in, um, do you know who Jonah Hill is? Right? Everybody knows who Jonah is. Right? I don't have to explain that, right? Okay. Everybody knows who Jonah Hill is. So I need a coffee. So what ends up happening is they end up, writing this screenplay and Ross knew that they were writing a screenplay. There was lots of stuff on, on uh, there was lots of stuff on the internet about it. So Ross is like, you got to hurry up and write the book as fast as possible. So, well, I remember at one point when Devaroli and his sister kind of broke off, like they had, they kind of worked out an agreement and they, well, it wasn't quite, quite like that. But when, when I had a conversation with, with Ross, I had explained to Ross that it was going to be difficult to write a book while he was, still in the prison because he had already been, he'd already been put in to be transferred to Miami. So he could be in, he was from Miami, his family's from Miami. So they were going to transfer him to a camp in Miami. So the idea that within the next month to two months, I was going to be able to write a book, a full 300 page book on this guy was very difficult. It's difficult to write in prison. You have time to write, but it's difficult. You don't have research materials, whatever. Well, Devaroli did have all of his stuff and that was, that was a huge help. The great, the great thing about Devaroli was his memory was phenomenal. He had an amazing memory. But I didn't know that I could do it, but I didn't really need him to do, to do it. Really, I'd heard most of the stories uh, and I had a great outline. So anyway, I end up telling Ross, look, I can I can do what I can do. And he basically, Ross was like, look, if you have to fictionalize the fucking thing, fictionalize it. He said, we'll, we'll put down, we'll basically write it up as, um, and I said, well, I don't want to fictionalize it. And he goes, he said, no, no. He said, we can write it as kind of like based on the, uh, you know, based on true events or based on the the story of Devaroli. He's like, we'll figure something out. He said, we can put down some kind of a, a disclaimer, whatever. We'll figure it out. Just get it done as quickly as possible. And I remember telling him, 
it is virtually, the more I sat with Dev Rowley, that it was virtually impossible to make him into a sympathetic character. He was genuinely an extra, of, of just a vicious person. I mean, his business dealings were vicious. He was constantly laughing about how he would, he would basically screw people over. I mean, he was, he was, he was vicious. And so I was like, it's going to be difficult. Like, I mean, I practically would have to fictionalize the, you know, the fucking portions, huge portions of this book and, and his character in general. And he's like, I don't care what you have to do, but make him as likable as possible. Get it done as quickly as possible. Um, so with that said, so one of the things about this, I should preface this by saying one of the interesting things about this is that I had written a book called Stranger Danger, which was about a um, it was about a guy who opens up um, like a, a trailer park for um, for sex offenders. So they live in the trailer park and he uses them kind of like as as slave labor. So the book was, it was a, it was a, you know, a, not a political satire. It was a satire. It was just a satire. Um, so I had kind of, you know, made this guy basically like he was taking these people that nobody wanted and he was exploiting them. And it, it was, the whole thing was just kind of a satire on just sex offenders in general. And it was, and I remember saying to Ross, I said, bro, I said, the guy, the guy in the book I wrote called Stranger Danger, and it was just a manuscript. It's never been, it was just something kind of, I had been working on kind of just something to do. I said, the guy that I wrote in that book is more sympathetic than, than Deveroli. And he said, I don't give a shit. He said, I need you to, to do this as quickly as possible. So I said, no problem. So our little meeting is taking place in the visitation room. And Dever and Ross ends up saying, listen, um, I think I can get an option. I can option this. And I think I might be able to get a movie. And Dev Rowley says, listen, he goes, okay, what if you can't get, what if you can't do this as quickly as possible? Like, what if, what if Warner Brothers gets their script finished first? And what if Warner Brothers makes the movie before us and beats you to the punch? And Reback says, well, we'll, we'll, we'll sue them. He's, but we have to have a book to sue them. Like we have to have that. Available, we have to have that creation of that intellectual property to be have been created, and there needs to be intellectual property out there in order for us to sue them. And De Deveroli goes, "What are you going to sue them over?" And I, I went, "What are you suing them over if they haven't like? How can you sue them over? Like it doesn't make sense. You're allowed to have multiple versions of the same story. Packhouse and has a version, you know." Um, was Guy Lawson wrote up Packhouse's version and Deveroli can have a version. I mean, how many versions of John Gotti's, you know, life or, you know, are there or, or, you know, Obama and they're all taken from different perspectives. So Reback, so Deveroli says, I don't understand. And I said, Hey, how are you going to sue them over intellectual property? I haven't even written yet. Like, I mean, it doesn't even make sense. And he says, we're going to sue him for theft of intellectual property. And I went, how? They haven't stolen anything. He says, it's not that hard to allege theft of intellectual property when there's multiple versions that are accessible. He said, so don't worry about it. I'm going to take care of it no matter what. No matter what, we're going to monetize this. And I remember thinking... These guys are a couple of con men. Like I'm, I'm, I'm in prison for being a con man, but these guys are a couple of con men and I'm surrounded. Like I'm in prison and these two guys are setting up a con, a scam. So I was like, I was just like, um, yeah, I said, I, well, it doesn't really matter because I, I want to write the book and it's going to be a great book and I'm not worried about it and I'm not worried about anybody suing anybody because I'm going to write a great book. So I'm not concerned. Um, I don't think it's going to come to that. And Ross was like, you know, so Ross was already like, don't worry about it. It's not going to come to that in any way. We're, I'm going to get this done. So that's fine. We end up leaving. I end up leaving visitation and I go back and I start expanding the, the outline that I'd written on Deveroli. Well, while this whole thing is happening, it turns out that 
Um, it turns out that uh, Jonah Hill signs up to he signs on board to become Devaroli to play Devaroli, but. Jonah Hill doesn't like the script. Now I'm getting this, by the way, this information I'm getting, I got this from, from Ross. I talked to Ross and Ross said, turns out that they, they've written a script. Jonah Hill wrote the script and he is insisting that they rewrite the script. So there's more about Devaroli in the script because you have to understand that because it's from David Packhouse's version, there was too much about David Packhouse and they wanted there to be, you know, you know, Jonah Hill's a big time actor and he wanted it to be more about the character he's playing. So he's like, yeah, yeah. He said, he said, you know, he wants it to be more about Devaroli. So they re, they re, they start rewriting the script. And so, De so Ross is like, you got to hurry up and finish this. You got to finish this. And I was like, okay, okay. So I start working. Well, Devaroli ends up getting transferred and I'd written a little bit more than I'd say half the book. Uh, let's say I'd written half, maybe two thirds of the book. By the time he was done. And the great thing was he had all of his documents. Plus, he was he was amazing with the, the, his recollection. He so I, he ends up getting transferred and I, I end up finishing the book. And I remember I finished the book and I I sent the book to Rebeck to Ross Rebeck. When I sent the book to Ross. I remember thinking because when Ross had read my book, he was really fairly critical not of the writing, but just of who I, how I'd portray, I, I had, how I'd portrayed myself. And I, and I hadn't accurately discussed my childhood or talked about my influences or, or given the reader any reason to kind of root for me. Like I had left all that stuff out. Well, with Devaroli, I had included those things. Now it, I had to cherry pick the hell out of it because he had so many horrible, horrible uh, things that, it, that had occurred that he'd done. So I really cherry picked through it to kind of create a person that, um, a, a character that had, you know, basically that it was very obvious that he was driven by money and the reasons he was driven by money. And so I, I, you know, I, um, embellished as much as I, I, I really felt like I embellished and Ross was really pushing me to embellish. So, and he, but he was insisting that it was going to be based on the life of, uh, of Ephraim Devaroli. So I sent it to him and I remember he got the book. He read the book and I called him like two, two days after I think he, he had gotten it. And I called him on the phone. I said, Hey, I said, did you read it? I'm expecting tons of notes, tons of uh, rewrites, all kinds of stuff. And he went, this is, this, this is amazing. He said, you, you absolutely knock this thing out of the park like it is it is an amazing story and i was like really and he was like absolutely he said it was great he said the only thing i have an issue with is the very ending and i was like why and he said you make the low security prison that he's in you make it sound like like it's disney world like you make it sound like it's a joke, like it's really kind of a tough high school that you're in and it's not dangerous. He goes, but you told me people get stabbed there. You told me people get in fights. You told me that people get, you know, that it, it can be brutal. I'm like, well, yeah, but if you've got to bring that on yourself and, you know, I didn't thought, I mean, you know, I, it's, it's not that bad. He goes, ah, it's not that bad for you. He goes, but for a guy like Devaroli, it's bad. Like he, you know, he felt like Deborah Roy truly felt like it had ruined his life, like it was a horrible experience and it was the worst thing that could have ever happened to him. And it was a, and I have a vastly different attitude. Anyway, he said, I need you to change that to really make the prison sound like just, you know, a, a horrible place. And I was like, oh my God. So I was like, all right, fine. So I rewrote like the last couple of pages and I took out a few paragraphs. And made it sound like a much, much more harsh place than it actually was. And I, I really focused on anything that was unfair about the prison or kind of draconian. I, I, I focused on that. Now, listen, to be honest, though, like I, I, I could go into Devaroli's story and the actual book, and, and he really did get railroaded. I mean, this is a guy that I, I personally may have issues with him and don't really like him and don't think he's a, a likable, nice person. But 
overall his book, you know, he really got railroaded. I mean, it's, it's a, he got, he got a bad deal. Um, all right. So, so now I'm writing the book. That's pretty cool. Right? Like I wrote, I wrote the name of the book was, uh, once a gun runner. It was, although portions of it were, were embellished and fictionalized, for the the mo- but it was the bulk of it. It was it was a good. It was an amazing story, and the bulk of it was based on on his story. And so, and, and look, a lot of it was was way more accurate than maybe Lawson's book or or whatever. I mean, according to according to Deveroli, obviously, um, Deveroli was thrilled by the book. I remember his sister read the book. His sister came back and was like, "This is this is an amazing this is an amazing uh, telling of his story. It's phenomenal." Of course, it did. It made his her brother sound like a great guy. Uh, and of course, I'm sure she, she saw him as a great guy. So I, did, Ross has the book. And um, yeah, Ross has got the book and Ross starts pitching the book. So it turns out that Devaroli had a cousin that worked in Hollywood. And his cousin, Devaroli, I remember when he told Ross about and I about his cousin. He's, yeah, my cousin could probably help us out. He goes, my cousin, like he's, he, he goes, well, he thinks he's into the industry. He goes, I mean, he goes, the, the, the movie industry, he goes, he's basically a schmuck. He said, but he's, he thinks he's in the industry. He goes, he may know some people. And Ross is like, yeah, well, I know some people. So it, it'll be, it, we'll work it out. Well, what ends up happening is Devaroli at some point contacts his cousin. And I'm pretty sure his cousin ends up getting in touch with a guy and, a, a, pro, a producer friend of his and tells him my cousin is Ephraim Deveroli and he's written a book. Well, that particular cousin, his friend that he talked to, knew, had a business partner. His business partner was the son of the vice president of Warner Brothers. So he contacts him and he says, look, Devaroli writ, has written a book and you guys are in the process. So they basically, they were in the process of rewriting the screenplay for War Dogs. And so what they end up saying is, he ends up saying, well, do you want to see, do you want to read the book? Do you want to see the book? Like he's got a whole manuscript. So the son, the, the son of the Warner Brothers, his name is Shimmy. Shimmy? Yeah. So Shimmy ends up uh, it ends up saying he is interested. So Devaroli's cousin's buddy, they end up contacting Shimmy ends up contacting and Devaroli and, and the, the buddy that the, the producers, these two producers end up contacting Ross Reback. Ross Reback um, knows who both of these guys are. And I remember I called Ross on the phone and I said, Hey Ross, what's going on? He goes, good news. And I said, what's that? He said, it turns out that this, there's a guy named Shimmy and he wants to see Devaroli's book. He is a producer. He and another guy are producers and, and that, that Devaroli's cousin has put up, put us all in contact. Oh, okay. And he said, so they're interested. Oh, okay. And I said, I said, well, that's good. I said, so what are they going to do? They're going to make like a documentary. If they're, they're documentary producers, he's like, yeah, they want to contact us to get a hold of the book. I'm having them both sign a non disclosure agreement, which is weird. The non disclosure agreement essentially says, I'm going to give you the book, but you're not allowed to show it to anybody. Not a lot of people have you sign these. Very few people have you sign something like this. Uh, so, Shimmy signs it. The other guy signs it. I forget his name right now. Um, they both sign it. And while I'm, while we're talking, I said, well, what, what have these guys done? And it turns out that it, Ross tells me, well, the good news is that the one guy, Shimmy's father is the vice president of Warner Brothers. And I said, what he is a vice president of Warner Brothers. They have several. He goes, he's a vice president of Warner Brothers. And I went, oh, okay. So, so what you're going to try and get him to talk to his dad about the book? Like, like, what are you going to like about the book? Like, what are you talking about? Like, they've already bought Lawson's, they've already options, optioned Lawson's, Lawson's. God, I can't talk today. They have already optioned Loss, Guy Lawson's version of the story. Coming in with another, another version of the story. 
doesn't really make sense. Granted, Jonah Hill was not happy with with the the script. They were in the middle of rewriting it, but I didn't I didn't put it together. So he says, no, no. He said, nothing like that. It, it, but it may open up some possibilities for us. And I went, oh, okay. You know, look, this isn't my department. I'm not, I'm in prison. I got my own fucking problems. I got a, I got a counselor who's going around uh, searching lockers who, if you have, you're supposed to have, you're allowed to have two shelves in your locker. And some guys had three shelves in their lockers because they bought, shelves from other guys and so i've got a counselor who's going around opening up your locker and yanking out one of your shelves i mean these are the kinds of things that occupy my time is trying to hide my shelf in my pit my extra shelf in my pillow so my counselor doesn't steal it i mean you, you can see like i have other issues like my what's important to me is not important to other people um so i'm like yeah okay okay so i hang up the phone And so now this, I'm telling you all of this because now the groundwork is kind of, you should kind of understand, like it's set. And what essentially happens is, according to Deveroli's lawsuit, the son of Warner Brothers president, Shimmy, ends up getting the manuscript and giving it to his father. Now, Warner Brothers never denies this, which is odd because, in my opinion, Deveroli and, and Ross and everybody kind of set up this kid to get a hold of the manuscript. Like, they kind of do an end run around to say, hey, to talk to this guy to talk, and talks to this guy. Now, was that on purpose? I feel like it was kind of on purpose, but I don't know that. What I know is that that Deveroli's cousin talked to this guy and this guy talked to this guy and this guy asked for the manuscript and they gave him the manuscript and he also was the son of Warner Brothers president, which Ross was super excited about. And Ross and Deveroli seemed like they were ready to fucking sue Warner Brothers anyway. So what ends up happening, what ends up happening is as a result of that whole thing, um, the screenplay gets rewritten at the same time. So at the same time that they that the that the manuscript ends up in this guy's hands, the screenplay gets completed. So Ross is is furious, like not furious at this moment, but what ends up happening is he later finds out that he he later talks to Shimmy and finds out that shimmy and the the other producer and finds out that shimmy's father is a vice president with warner brothers and so he immediately acts offended like he's like what i didn't know that i never would have given you the manuscript if i'd known that and hangs up the phone on him but the truth is he knew the kid was the son of a warner brothers vice president prior to ever giving him the manuscript. So what he was doing was he was setting the whole thing up in order to sue Warner Brothers. That was the whole that was the whole purpose of that. Um, well, at this point, basically Ross isn't trying to pitch, even trying to pitch Deveroli's story. He's not really trying to get a deal anymore. He's basically now just trying to get an attorney to sue Warner Brothers. Because he knows that he knows that the movie's coming out. Uh, because they, they're now they are now going to they're now using their own script. Um, they end up making the movie. Um, you know, Todd Phillips makes the movie. Uh, God, what is his name? Bradley Cooper's in it. Uh, Jonah Hill is in it. Uh, is it Miles? Is it Miles Davis? David Davis? Miles? Teller, Miles Teller, Miles Teller is in it. He plays uh, David Pacow. So all these guys are in it. They end up making the movie. Well, before the movie even comes out, Deveroli basically, he doesn't talk to me at all. Ross stops talking to me completely. I end up writing, well, I, I, I end up writing, um, writing Deveroli a letter in which I say, I don't know what you guys are doing. You need to get your shit together. You guys should be trying to get a book deal. I don't know why you're focusing on suing Warner Brothers. They haven't done anything wrong. You know, what are you doing? Uh, same thing. I, I basically end up saying a similar thing to, to Reback. 
and essentially, if you understand that I'm in prison, like I was banking on this thing to make some make me some money, and it's made me no money. And not just that, like they're not even trying to get a book deal. They they at one point had a had a book deal that was they were according to Ross were about to sign a book deal with Simon and Schuster. You know they they had they had a several people offering them book deals. What ends up happening? The problem is they can't get the book out very qu- you know quick enough. So Ross ends up getting self publishing the book. But I don't know this because they're not really talking to me. So Ross is hardly ever picking up the phone, not really responding to emails. And what I decide is, um, you know, I just kind of, I'm, I'm so frustrated by the whole thing. But at one point, I find out that Deveroli has actually published the book. I find that out when a guy comes up to me one day and I'm sitting in an area called Stonehenge and this guy comes up to me and he says, hey, Matt, he says, and I'm like, yeah, what's up? And he says, bro, he said, uh, are you making any money on that book? And I go, what book? He says, that Deveroli book. Uh, you wrote his memoir, right? And I went, yeah, but I said, I'm not making any money on it. They haven't sold any books. Like they, they haven't, I mean, they haven't published the book. They, they might have a deal with Simon and Schuster. I don't know. I haven't talked to them in God, weeks, maybe months. I'm not sure. And the guy goes, what are you talking about? And he opens up, there's a magazine called Ocean's Drive Magazine. It's a, a big glossy magazine from, from Miami. He opens up Ocean's Drive Magazine and he shows me a picture of Deveroli on one of the pages of the magazine and Deveroli is holding a copy of the book that I wrote, his memoir, Once a Gun Runner. It's got a picture of him on it and he's holding the book and it, and he's got probably several hundred books piled up behind him and he's at a book signing. He, he's at a, at a, a book fair where he's signing books. My name's on the front of the book with his and he's signing books and I had no I, I had no idea that the book had been published and that they were signing books I had gotten no money people aren't answering my calls and so I freak out I'm furious um, I end up calling Ross several times I eventually end up talking to Ross and when I talk to Ross I'm like hey man I just saw this and this and he's like oh yeah yeah we self published it and he he I like, blows it up like like oh it's no big deal and we just figured to go this route we want to get it out you know before the uh we want to get it out before the movie comes out and and he said and I said well what are you doing cuz he's not telling me really anything so I I he said what are you doing he's oh we're waiting for the we're, we're about to file our lawsuit set um because it turns out that Shimmy is the son of the vice president of Warner Brothers, and we believe that they used the book in order to rewrite the entire screenplay to put more of you know Ephraim Deveroli's character in the screenplay or in the movie for for Jonah Hill, and so we're suing them. It's like you. He, he was, I remember he was saying it to me, like, can you believe that Warner Brothers sent one of the, one of the kit sent his, the Warner Brothers vice president sent, he sent his son to try to get a copy of the manuscript so they could steal it from us. That was his pitch to me over the phone. Like, he was like, can you believe that? And I'm like, but I knew, like, I guess Ross had forgotten that he told me. He forgot, I must have, he must have forgotten that he told me that he knew before he ever gave him the fucking thing that he was a, he, his father was, uh, worked for Warner Brothers. So I was like, oh, okay. He said, yeah, so we're suing him. We're suing this other guy. We're suing, uh, they were suing everybody. Yeah, you know, Warner Brothers, we're suing New Line Cinema. We're suing, you know, like, like all kinds of people. I don't know who else. I don't know if it's New Line Cinema. They were suing a bunch of people. And, He's like, right now they just came out with all the trailers for Warner Brothers, and we're cut. We've got guys going through the trailers, cutting up the trailers to try and figure out which scenes they stole from the manuscript. Keep in mind, the manuscript is partially fabricated. So, what does it matter? Anyway, I, I'm just, I'm, and I'm still in prison with no money. 
with now there's obviously not going to be a movie about this guy. And, you know, these, these guys, this, the whole, the, just the whole thing was just horrible. It was just a horrible situation. And I felt like I'd just been robbed. I'd worked really hard on this thing. I really was excited about it only because I thought it would get my name out there. And it just the whole thing had just fallen. But this whole thing, I'm con- condensing this into one little, you know, part because I, I otherwise, because dra- this dragged out over years. Now, keep in mind, Ross and Deborah Rowley felt like they could do anything they wanted to me because at this point, my sentence has my out date. I'm being released from prison in 2030. I've got a 26 year sentence. I'm, I've got a whole bunch of time left. And so they can basically do whatever they want to because let's face it. I don't really matter and I'm not a factor. There's, they don't, they kind of figure there's nothing I can do from prison. So, um, yeah, so that's the situation that was currently happening was these guys were about to sue Warner Brothers for, you know, God, for, mil- you know, I don't know what they were asking for, 60 million or 30. I forget how many millions and millions they wanted from Warner Brothers. And they were uh, they were fi- and they'd file. They end up filing their uh, lawsuit. They end up filing a lawsuit against them. So. Uh, I, I think the last video I had mentioned that I'd written Ephraim Devaroli's book, which was a book called um, Once a Gun Runner. It had been published. And the problem with that finishing that story is that story drags out over the course of like s- several, a couple of years, all the way up to me leaving. So what I want to do now is I want to kind of jump back and explain that at this point in time, I'm at the low security prison. I've been there for, I want to say, a few years, a few years, maybe two years, going on three years. And there was a guy that showed up at Coleman named Frank Amadeo. Now, this is important. The, The way he worked, he kind of is weaved into my story. It's, it's hard to tell all of these stories chronologically because the it's such a long period of time that by the time you get to part eight or nine or 10 or 11, you know, you're going to say, wait a second, who is he talking about now? Well, that's somebody that I talked about in part three. So I'm trying to kind of do a, an anecdotal type story where I kind of wrap up as much as possible in one sitting. So a guy by the name of Frank Amadeo showed up at the prison. Frank Amadeo was uh, a he was a um he's a lawyer well he's a he has a law degree and he's a disbarred lawyer now he came into the prison system and he started doing legal work for other inmates so i'm at the low and i remember i was i was in the lunch room or not lunch room they call it the 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 chow hall whatever the cafeteria so it was in the chow hall and i remember somebody had pointed to him and he was still kind of drugged up at the because when he first got there for like a year or so he was on he was on a lot of medication Um, because frank amadeo is a rapid cycling bipolar with features of schizophrenia so he when he's in the a manic mode right like when he's manic what Amade- what happens with Amadeo is because obviously bipolars they have extreme lows and extreme highs. So when he becomes manic, Amadeo is becomes semi you know schizophrenic, delusional uh, in an extreme way. Not that he's not always a little a little bit off, but in an extreme way. And during some course of this rapid cycling that he goes through, he believes that he's hearing the voice of God tell him that he's preordained to be emperor of the world. So you could imagine how strange that is. Uh, And, and I mean, I've was locked up, you know, I was locked up uh, basically almost 13, 13 years. I would say just rounded up to 13. So roughly 13 years. And the thing about being locked up that long is I've seen a lot of different types of criminals and I have never met a guy that was committing crimes specifically because he wanted to take over the world. Like that's, that's James Bond shit. Like that, that's, that's Spectre. That's, um, you know, that's a, a James Bond villain. Well, anyway, he was in the, 
in the chow hall and I remember I was sitting, you know, standing in line and one of, we, we were, some of the guys are talking and one of the guys was like, you see that dude over there? That, that guy's a fucking lawyer. I was like, really? He's like, yeah, he was in the newspaper. He got like 22 years. And I was like, really? And they said, yeah, bro, he thinks that he's like, he's going to be like, he's going to take over the world or something. Like he, he's got an amazing case. And I was like, oh, okay. I was like, that's he like, what? And he's like, yeah, he thinks he's going to take over the world. Like, not like, yeah, I'm going to take over the world, but like he, truly believes that it's his destiny that god is telling him he's going to be the emperor of the world which in and of itself is an odd thing to even say emperor who the fuck says emperor so anyway you would say ruler right like the ruler of the world like is that even possible i i don't know i doubt it so Anyway, so I see Amadeo, no big deal. Over the course of several months, maybe a year or so, he ends up getting off of the medication and he starts fighting his case. But he starts fighting other inmates' cases. Now, in my own case, I was supposed to get a sentence reduction. I had pled guilty with the, the I'm going to say use the word promise, you know, with the promise, they don't really promise you. They say, this is what we're going to do. And they, and they'll say, you know, they'll actually say, we can't promise you, but if you do this, we're going to do this. And you're like, okay, but you can't, well, we can't put anything writing, but that's how it's going to work. And so then you do what the government tells you to do. And then they suddenly say, yeah, that's just not enough. We're just not going to do anything for you. And that's, that's really where I was in my case. I had been interviewed by Dateline. To do an episode, I'd been interviewed by American Greed. I did an episode, and I had I had um, actually written I had written a, a, a course. I'm not sure if I got into the course, but did I ever tell you? Did I did I mention the course that I wrote, the Ethics and Fraud course? Oh, okay. So what happened is th- this is about the same t- period of time that I you know I'd done all these things for the government and they hadn't done anything for me. So I was about to file what's called, um, actually I did end up filing one. I ended up filing a, uh, it's called a, um, a motion to compel. It's a, a motion to compel the government to do something that they said they do. Like in this case, it would be a motion to compel you to, um, you know, a motion to compel the government to reduce my sentence based on the fact that I had been interviewed by two different agencies or t- sorry, two different, um, by two different, uh, whatever, uh, TV shows. And they said they'd cut my sentence. I'd also been interviewed by the FBI and the Secret Service. The problem is nobody had ever been arrested as a result of my cooperation. So the government was saying, well, nobody was ever, co- nobody was ever arrested. And, my lawyer, of course, was saying, yeah, but he was interviewed. It's not his fault. You guys didn't, you didn't, those, those interviews didn't end up panning out and you guys were able to arrest anybody. That's not Mr. Cox's fault. It's all, you know, and you also asked him to do, be interviewed by two, Navy, uh, two news tabloid news programs, which you were, inter- I was interviewed by. You said you'd give them something for that too. And they were just like, yeah, well, it just didn't work out. It's just not going to happen. So there wasn't much I could do. Well, what I did was at the same time I filed the motion to compel, I ended up getting a letter from a guy named Jim Montram. I didn't mention Jim Montram and, and that I wrote a course, an ethics and fraud course. So Jim Montram ends up, it ends up that Jim Montram is a guy that I had gone to, I, he actually teaches the course which mortgage brokers have to take in order to get licensed in Florida. It's called the Jim Montram a Jim Montram National Mortgage Brokers Origination Course or something. It's pretty long. Um, I, I end up, so I had gone there and that's how I, I studied under Jim Montram and I took my test and I, I ended up getting a becoming a mortgage broker. Well, Jim Montram writes me a, a letter and says, listen, based on the new Dodd, Dodd-Frank Act, all the mortgage brokers in the in the country have to be they have to take continuing education courses. So all mortgage brokers have to take like nine hours of continuing education in the state of Florida. Three hours of that is on ethics and fraud. He said, I want to write a course on ethics and fraud with you to be taught to the nation's mortgage brokers to help them with ethics and fraud to fulfill their continuing education portion of their, um, of their licensing. 
So I end up writing Jim and saying, look, I'm, I'm interested in doing this, but can you do me a favor and contact my lawyer? So Jim Montrum and my lawyer, Jim Montrum flies up to Atlanta. He and my lawyer go to the U.S. attorney, sit down with her and explain what he wants to do. She tells him, if Mr. Cox agrees to do this, she tells my lawyer, if Mr. Cox agrees to do this, and you use the course, I will reduce his sentence. I will consider that substantial assistance and I'll reduce his sentence. And she's told me this many times. But once again, what choice do I have? So I end up writing the course with Jim Montrum. It's 9,500 words. I end up writing the uh, entire course. He ends up using the course. He writes a glowing letter to uh, the judge, to my U.S. attorney, uh, I'm sorry, to the, to the U.S. attorney explaining that I'd written the course and it's being used and how amazing it is and goes to the U.S. attorney and my attorney goes to the U.S. attorney and she ends up saying, what's going on? When are we going to reduce Mr. Cox's course, uh, Mr. Cox's sentence? And she says, I'm sorry, Millie. Millie's the name of my lawyer. She says, I'm sorry, Millie. It's just not enough. Now, at this point, I'm doomed. Sorry, you had to hear that. So at this point, I'm completely screwed. I've contacted lawyers on the street. One, I couldn't pay them, but I contact them like I could pay them. And I contact them. Well, one thing I thought maybe I would get some money for the thing I had done with Deborah Rowley. I figured he would sell the book and I'd get a chunk of money or maybe they'd get a movie made. I didn't know, but I figured I'd get some money and I could use that money to help get myself out of prison, get a lawyer, a real lawyer on the street. So I contacted several lawyers and it's funny because I ended up contacting a, a, a T.I.'s lawyer. Do you know who T.I. is? Uh, he was a famous rapper and he had cooperated and got his sentence knocked way down. So I actually contacted his lawyer, talked to him on the phone and uh, he said, yeah, you're basically he said, there's nothing you can do. Like you're screwed. I ended up talking to, I ended up talking to like two or three, I think it was three lawyers and all three of them said, there's just nothing you can do to force the government to, to reduce your sentence. So I'm in a bad spot. I filed a motion to compel and, but Jim Montrum had written me that letter and I'd ended up removing the motion to compel. So I withdrew the motion to compel from the court did the course, wrote the course, and as after writing the course, was told they 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 weren't going to do anything for me. And all the lawyers said, "You're not going to, we're not going to be able to do anything for you." I'm sorry, you just fucked. And it's like the government lied to me. The government fucked me over. I'm screwed. And everybody said, "Yes, you're screwed." And that's just the way it is. So I end up a friend of mine named uh, we called him Turk because he's Turkish. Uh, it, uh, Turk ends up saying, you need to talk to Frank. And I said, Frank who? And they go, he goes, Frank Amadeo. And I go, the emperor? Because everybody started calling Frank the emperor. And I was like, the emperor? And he's like, yeah, the emperor. I said, that's nuts. Forget that. I'm not going to talk to that guy. He's crazy. Like, I don't want him do touching my legal work. I'm in enough trouble. And he says, nah, bro, I'm telling you, you need to talk to him. He said he's actually getting a lot of people's sentence sentences reduced and he's getting people's um, sentences, their cases overturned. He's getting people time knocked off. He's getting people released. And I'm like, and I had heard that he was getting better and better. Keep in mind, this is something that went, happened six or this was now a year or so from when Amadeo had gotten there. So he was starting to, to do people's cases and he was having remarkable success. So I, and he was actually, it's funny too. Um, so I go, okay. So I go and I, I, I start looking into him. I talked to a couple guys he'd worked with, talked to um, Turk. And it turns out that Excuse me. So it turns out that Frank actually started teaching a course which was called the um, the legal research course. And so he ended up he'd have like 20 or 30 people in this course. So as an inmate, you can teach 
they ask you to teach courses and if you volunteer, you supposedly you get programming points or something, but I've never seen that. I don't think that's, I think that's bullshit. The point is, is that he basically had like 20 or 30 people that would go to his course and he would teach them on how to research, how to use the legal computers in the, uh, in the prison to research your, your case, which is much more difficult than you think. But he also taught guys how to write motions. Through the process of this, he ends up making a lot of people, a lot of friends with people, and he gives out a lot of good advice. And because he's manic, he almost never sleeps and he works all the time. And he's also extremely intelligent and he reads all the time. And so what ends up happening is he he starts putting together what is essentially a law firm within the prison. Like he would have someone, if you had a problem with, you wanted to get a divorce, he had somebody that just did divorces. If you had child custody issues with your your ex-wife and she wouldn't bring your kids to come see you, he had somebody that dealt with uh, family law and they would file paperwork to make your ex-wife or your baby's mom or whatever, bring your kid to see you. I mean, he was doing, you know, and of course, just your regular legal the regular legal stuff, he's fighting guys' cases, getting them overturned, getting their sentences cut. So I go to Frank, and he's got like a, a moderate size. He has, he probably has four four people that typed for him full time. He had at least six people that did legal research for him. And he had three or four guys that he called his associates, which were guys that they're like, they're like prison lawyers. You know, you've heard the term. He's a, oh, he's a prison lawyer, which is basically just an inmate that teaches himself the law and does legal work for other inmates. But he doesn't actually have a degree. And he's not a real, he's never passed the bar. He just learned how to do it in prison. So he's a prison lawyer. So he had a bunch of associates that he, that were, he didn't call them prison lawyers, but they were all associates. And, you know, we, we knew what they were. They were guys that had been doing it, but were now under Frank's umbrella. And Frank was now using them uh, as, as like legal, you know, counsel for the inmates. He, it, listen, to be honest with you, it's it, that, that alone, that aspect of Amade, Frank Amadeo's story is amazing. But here's, so here's, here's where I'm at. I go to Amadeo with with Turk and I say, look, my name's Matt Cox. And I say, here's what's happened. Well, here, do you have some a few minutes? He goes, yeah, yeah. He said, I blocked off an hour. I said, okay. So, I mean, and legally, but I'm sorry, legally. Uh, and interestingly enough, by the way, he he would schedule appointments like a lawyer. He would, it, it was amazing. Guys would line up. He had, what did he have? Um, was it Spanish Tuesday? He had like Spanish Tuesday <laughs> where he the Spanish guys would come see him. And he had two interpreters that would sit with him while Spanish speaking inmates would explain their case to him. And he would then, you know, get the information with the Spanish uh, speaking legal guys and he would communicate with them and then he would tell them what they needed to do or he would take on their case because he didn't take on everybody's case. You had to, had to actually have a case. And a lot of guys, he'd hear the whole case, he'd research it, he'd look over the whole thing, and he'd say, you don't have a case. Like, listen, you, you know, you were caught with 40 kilos of heroin, you pled guilty to 20 years, and that's, you're going to get 20, that's what you got. Like, that's it. You don't have a case. So, you're going to have to do your time. Like, join a softball team, you know, uh, Go to take some classes, you know, um, you know, go to, you know, sign up for horticulture and put in for a, a, a two man cube like or two man cell because you're going to be here a while. Anyway, I go to Frank. We go to his office. He had his own office. The, the staff actually gave him a, an office. So we go to Frank's office. And uh, I sit down and I explain the whole thing. Like I thoroughly just, and he's like, just go through it. Tell me what happened. So I, I tell him everything that happened in my case. And when I'm done, I'm expecting to get the same, the same spiel that the lawyers on the street gave me. And he said, Frank said, no, no, I'm not going to let this happen. I refuse to allow them to do this. I'm going to fix this. 
I'm going to fix this. We're going to make them give you that sent introduction. This is unfair. I won't stand for it. He goes through a little manic moment. <laughs> and it was nuts. And he just gets all, all kind of like a little bit crazy. And he starts going on this little manic, has this manic moment. And in the middle of it, he says, this is, he, he said, this is what's wrong with the legal system. He goes, and when my, he goes, when, my, what do you say? My uh, minions. He goes, no, nah, he didn't say minions. He said troops or something like that. But he goes, when my troops march on Washington, he said, and the president kneels at my feet. He said, I'm, he said, I burn the, he said, I'm going to burn the constitution and I'm going to rewrite this entire system. He said, and this is the reason why things like this. And I remember looking over at, at Turk thinking, what the fuck have you got me into? This dude's nuts he's off his rocker so and then frank kind of came back down and he went okay here's what we're gonna do we're gonna have to follow what's called the 2255 he's i'm sure you would know what that is that's a habeas motion uh, uh to uh, uh vacate your sentence uh, based on the fact that your lawyer uh, was ineffective however he said your lawyer really wasn't ineffective as much as your lawyer just didn't understand the law and so what what i need is i need a copy of your transcripts i'm gonna need a copy of your and he starts listing off all the things that he needs and, you know, I say, OK, OK, Frank, I'll get to work on all that. I'll order all those, that stuff. And he said, all right, let me know. And when you get that stuff, he said, bring it to me and I'll start working on the case. I said, OK, no problem. And I leave. So I leave with Turk and Turk is, OK, well, bro, yeah, you got to get the Turk's like writing all this stuff down because he's working with Frank. He's like writing. And, and then he says, um, uh, OK, get this, get this. I'm not giving that guy my stuff. He's insane, bro. Did you hear the little rant? He's, I know he does that sometimes. And by the way, I've heard that same speech of his. I don't know. 40 times. Uh, anyway, uh, so he's Turk tells me, look, get the stuff. What, you know, like, you know, what do you have to lose? Like, you're doomed, bro. You're fucked. And I was just like, I, I was fucked. Like, I was screwed. Like, everybody, when you've got lawyers on, the famous lawyers, accomplished lawyers on the street telling you, do your time, bro. You're not getting out of this. You, you, you've got a problem, man. I had a major problem. Uh, so I get all my stuff together. I give it to Frank. A few weeks go by. Frank comes back and he says, okay, I, and I explained to him, you know, I'm time, I'm what's called time barred. Like you only have one year. You've got one year to file a 2255, which is to say I was basically my lawyer was ineffective. I wasn't represented by a competent attorney. And you have one year. So I was way past that one, one year from your sentencing. And I was way past the one year. That one year mark had come and gone. And there's no appeal. When you sign your plea agreement, you waive your right to appeal. You only get to appeal things when you go to sentencing. I'm sorry. You only get to appeal uh, your, your conviction when you go to trial. When you take a plea, you waive that right. So my only real option was to file a 2255 or a motion to compel, neither which are, are really worth much. So... Frank says, we're going to file a 2255. And I said, yeah, but I'm time barred, bro. Like I only had one year and I'm way past the one year. And he said, no, no. He said, there's equitable tolling is involved. And so what equ equitable tolling means that every time a certain action happens, your time is told. So it's continually told over and over again. So let's say you have one year to do something. But then the government comes back and they say, oh, wait a minute, we, we haven't, we need to do this and we're going to, we're going to give you this. Okay. So every time the, or we need you to do this, or the, the court says, wait a second, you have to do this. Every time there's another action involved, it gives you another year. It's one year from the moment that your sentence is finalized. 
So if you're sentenced and then let's say six months later something occurs and they have to re-sentence you, well, then you have another year. Or let's say six months later the government says we want you to do this for us and you do that, you then get an additional year because your your sentence is never quite set. It's never completed um, in stone. Now, Frank took that to the extreme. And what Frank said was, Every time the government asked you to do something and you did it, that means that your sentence was not finalized and therefore you get equitable tolling. And therefore the the clock starts over again. I'll tell you right now, that's not how it works. But that was his in. That gets around the time bar. Now, Pretty much the government should just have swiped that, not that it's government, but the judge should have been like, yeah, that's not, that's not how it works. Um, the other thing is, and then of course, then even if you can get around equitable, even if you can get around the one year time bar, you still have to prove to the court that your attorney is ineffective or basically incompetent. And, and I, I honestly, you know, although I'm not, I don't think that my lawyer did everything correctly. I think that I didn't give her much to work with and she did the best she could with as bad of a position as I'd put herself and myself in. So in my opinion, you know, my lawyer did the best she really could. But Frank said that my lawyer didn't understand the law and had she understood that I could not get my sentence reduced simply for writing a course and being interviewed by the go- or by some tabloid TV shows, then I would have most likely not pled guilty and gone to trial. And that may or may not be true. We don't know. But what we do know is that I was given bad advice, and she didn't. And she gave that advice because she was being misled by the government, and so she didn't understand the law. She didn't understand she was being misled, and as a result of that, he believed I could get my sentence um, overturned. Or, or forcibly recent, be, allow me to be resentenced. In which case, we could now bring in all of the things I had done, and we could mention those things in front of the judge. Now, I'm sorry that this is so complicated, and that's why I hate telling this story because I know that most people would would have been like, "Bro, this is insane. I'm just forget it. I'm not even listening." But it's going to get more streamlined here soon. So what ends up happening is Frank puts together this motion. And he sends it to the court. And it, and so he sends it to the court. And my, um, I'm basically, I file something with the court that says my lawyer's ineffective. And so I call my lawyer. I'm basically saying you're incompetent. And I call my lawyer a couple, like, it had been filed and like a week had gone by. And I was like, I don't even know if it was filed because, you know, I'm in prison. Like, I just put it in the mail and we mail it off. You don't know. Like, did they, did they get it? Did they file it? What's happening? So I'm freaking out. So I'm like, fuck, you know what? And I told Frank, I said, Frank, I'm going to call my lawyer. And he goes, she's not going to talk to you. He's just, she's been motioned. By now, she's been notified. She's not going to talk to you. And I went, ugh. I said, well, I'm going to call her anyway. I think she will. She always answers my phone. And by the way, that's very rare. Like most public defenders, once you're sentenced, you never hear from these people again. They don't talk to you. Millie always answered my phone calls. Very professional, very polite, just the nicest person. Like you you really couldn't pick a better advocate, just a great lawyer in general. Because most people, if you talk to any of my buddies, you'll they'll they'll tell you, yeah, yeah, I never hear you never hear from your fucking lawyer after a public defender after your sentence. So I end up I end up uh, calling her and she answers the phone and she's like, "Hey Matt, what's going on?" I said, "Hey, how are you doing?" She goes, "Pretty good, pretty good. How are you?" I said, "No, I'm good." I said, uh, "Everything's good." I said, "I just want to check on you, see how you're doing." And she is, "Oh, I thought maybe you were calling because you filed a a, a 2255 where you said I was uh, I was ineffective." I go, "You know, Millie, it was a tough case. Um, you know, I, I'm not saying I, <laughs> I mean it was you know it was a lot going on." It was a tough situation. She goes, you, you said I didn't know what I was doing. I said, I, you know, I think that what's important is that, you know, um, you know, it was, it was a tough situation. I think, you know, you were in a bad spot. And she's like, okay, well, listen, they filed the motion. 
The government has, the court gave them 60 days to respond. It's fine. It'll, I, I hope, I wish you the best. Don't, and I went, okay. Well, I appreciate it. She goes, okay. All right, bye. Hang up the phone. So the government comes back and uh, the government says, well, the, the court, the judge said, tells the government they have 60 days. Then a few, close to the 60 days, they ask for another 30 day extension and the judge gives them 30 more days. And then they come back and they say, your honor, there's no equitable tolling here. Yes, Mr. Cox was asked to do certain things, but that doesn't qualify him for equitable tolling. Uh, you know, this circuit court said this and this circuit court. And then there's all these they, all these things that they mentioned, like this has been argued in this court and this one. So then, uh, you know, and, and even if he isn't, if equitable tolling applied, he still, you know, he still was never promised anything in writing and he this and he that. And it's all, you know, so they go back and forth. Then Amadeo comes in and he argues with them. And then they argue back and then he comes in with what's called a, a, a retort. So it's, it's like their reply, then he replies, then he retorts to their reply. I mean, it's, it's, it goes on. This goes on for six months. So finally, just be like, I, I'm sitting there like, like, it's this bad. This is bad. Like, and, and they, this is the thing they, they know no matter what I'm going to, you can appeal that decision. Like I will appeal when, if the judge, I'm just waiting for the judge to say, yeah, equitable tolling doesn't apply. Like, I don't know what you're doing. Um, and what ends up happening is just before I'm assuming I'm going to get that, I get a letter in the mail and the government has filed a motion with the court saying, your honor, we would like to stay all of the, um, we'd like to stay all the proceedings. So we'd like to stop everything. And we'd like the court to appoint an attorney for Mr. Cox to discuss with Mr. Cox whether he wants to continue forward with his bullshit motion um, or if he wants to accept a sentence reduction in order to essentially drop everything. So, you know, I, that that was, you know, I, I mean, I... I can't convey what a huge victory that was, which meant they were willing to reduce my sentence. So they've already said they're willing to, to do that, but it's how, by how much. So I go to Frank with the letter and Frank's like, yeah, 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 yeah. You gotta, you'd have to see Frank. Frank's a little guy. He's like five, three, five, four. He's chunky. Um, he's got kind of a squat body. Um, very, very Napoleon looking. And, and he's, he's like, and the, the, the eerie thing about him is that on every step of the way, every step of this process, Frank told me what was going to happen. Well, I, I was like, so they have 60 days. He's like, well, they'll ask for an extension. They asked for an extension. You know, well, they're going to come back and say this and this. And then I'm going to say this and this, and then they're going to say this and this. And then at that point, they will most likely offer you something or we will probably get turned down by the by the judge and uh, we'll appeal that. And then at that appeal, at that point, they will probably offer you something or like he had it all laid out, like what was going to happen. Keep in mind, I've seen people file motions and get just turned down, turned down, turned down. And so what ended up happening was I ended up getting this letter. And he had told me one of the things he said, most likely you'll get a letter from them. They will, they will they'll offer you something. Sure enough, I get a letter. We want to, we want the court to give him, Mr. Cox, a lawyer to discuss a sentence reduction. So they pay for an attorney. Her name was, um, oh man, it doesn't really matter, but it's Esther Panich. Ooh. Can't believe I remember it. Esther. Esther. It's funny, too, because if you look up Esther, like she'd been on CNN, Fox News. She'd been on all these programs. Like she was she was a like a big time lawyer. You know, she was like a talking head wherever they have to whatever Fox News needs some somebody to come in and and talk about something or CNN needs somebody to talk about some trial. They have her on at that point. So she comes in. 
and she j- gets on a plane and she flies down to uh, to Coleman, and I go in the the room with her. The 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 attorney attorney client attorney whatever attorney client visitation room. It's a visitation. So I go in there and I sit down and and I say, hey, what's up? And she sits down. And she goes, okay, hey. So she said they appointed me to try and get a reduction. She goes, so listen kudos to you. She's like, this never happens. Like, this very seldomly happens. I was like, oh, I know, I know. And she says, um, as far as your 2255 and you going forward with it, continuing to fight it in the court, she said, honestly, I, I don't see it. I don't see it going anywhere. She said, it's well written. She said, but your legal argument, I don't think is going to get you. I don't think ultimately you're going to win at the district level. And I don't think at the appellate level, you'll win either. And she said, so you really just don't have a case here. And I went, well, and yet you're here. And she was like, well, what do you mean? I went, well, I mean, if, if you're saying that I have no case, she's like, no, I don't. She's like, they're, gonna, they're going to win. I said, then why not just win? Like, why wouldn't they just crush me? Like, I'm having to force them to give me something. You're saying I can't force them, and yet you're here. And she goes, okay, well, I see your point, but they probably feel they owe you something. And I went, but they don't. They've told my former lawyer, Millie, over and over again that I haven't, des- I don't deserve anything. She says, well, I mean, you've painted them into a corner. I'm like, yeah, but it's a corner that they can, they can win. Like it's, it's a fight they can win, you're saying. So why not win? And she went, yeah, I see your point. I said, so as far as me, rolling over because what they were offering me was the the government was offering me a one level reduction now one level what well, at that point was 40 months off my sentence so you have to think i i was sentenced to 360 months 60 no that's not right 16 i was sentenced to 316 months and they were offering 40 months off 40 that's it's not even three and a half years. No. So it's like you gave me, they gave me over 26 years and they're offering me three years off. So she, she, she was saying, but you don't have a choice. You have no choice. And she said, she said, but you know, you did a good job writing the, the brief or the, the 2255, you had a good job, uh, did a great job writing. I said, well, I didn't write it. And she goes, who wrote it? And I went, uh, Frank Amadeo. And she goes, Frank Amadeo? And she goes, who's Frank Amadeo? And I went, Frank Amadeo is a guy who's in here. He's a former lawyer. Uh, he's disbarred. And I said, he's, he's, he's crazy. And she goes, she goes, he's crazy? What do you mean? I go, no, I mean, he's like certifiably crazy. Like, like he has a guardian. Like he, he's, he's actually got, um, He's like, they've mentally like incompetent as far as the law is concerned. Like he's, he's lost all of his rights. Um, he has an actual guardian. Like he's, he's crazy. And she goes, that's who's doing your legal work? A crazy, I, she, and I, I went, yeah, he says he's bipolar. He's got schizophrenia. And she was like, you have got a bipolar schizophrenic doing your legal work. And I went, yeah, well, it doesn't seem to affect his legal work. <clears throat> he does think he's going to take over the world. Um, he, he hears God talking to him. Um, and he got himself 22 years because he stole like $180 million from the government. So I'll get into that in a minute or maybe another video. I could probably do it. How, how much time? Another video? Oh, bro. Okay. Damn. I really wanted to get to it in this video too, because it's such a, is gnarly still a word? Gnarly story. It's such an amazing story. But what ends up happening is she's like, you're letting and then a, a, a guy who, who's crazy, do your legal work. I said, yes. And she went, that's the most bizarre thing I've, I, I think I've ever heard. And I said, yeah, he's crazy. I said, he's also cutting people loose left and right. And I said, and you're here. You're here. I said, every legal, every legally sane lawyer on the street told me this couldn't be done. And yet he got the government to offer to reduce my sentence. So I'm gonna spin, I'm gonna spin this up a little bit. What ends up happening, because this, this is in the process of a lot of other things happening. So I'm gonna go ahead and wrap this up, kind of do an anecdotal kind of thing on this video. Uh, what are we at? We're almost at 40 minutes. Okay, I'm gonna wrap it up. So um, here's what happens. 
she goes, she basically says, here's what the government's saying. They'll give you a one level reduction, but that's just to get you back to court. Once you're in front of the judge, you can argue that all of these other things come into play and you want, you believe you deserve more. She says, and I think we'll be able to get Judge Batten, which is my judge. Well, I think we'll be able to get Judge Batten to give, give you more time off of your sentence. And I went, um, okay. I said, you know, I said, well, let, let me, uh, you know, let me talk to Frank and I'll let you know. And she was like, okay, you want to talk to Frank? She's like, I'm your lawyer. I'm like, yeah, I know. But, you know, I said, Frank, like, like Frank's like amazing. And God's talking to him. So if God, if, if, if you have God's ear, ear if you have God's ear, I got, I got to talk to that dude before I talk to you. Like, you're just some chick that jump on a plane. This, this, Frank's like homies with God. So I got to see what Frank says. So, she says, okay, let me know. So anyway, I go back. I explain to Frank, here's what's going on. Because we thought the government was going to come and say three levels off or two levels. And you have to understand that every level gets progressively larger and larger. So if you have, if you were sentenced and you, you calculated, let's say, 10 levels, well, that might be, let's say, five years. And every level at that point is maybe roughly... You know, one level might be six months. Well, the next level, the next level would be worth seven months. And the next one might be worth nine months. And the next one might be 11 and the next level up. So the more levels you get, it's not like every level is worth like seven months. By the time I had so many levels in my case, by the time I got to my sentence, each the last level was worth 40 months. They start off at like three months. So it was that many levels in my case. I got that many enhancements. Um, and it, what ended up happening was I said, I'll take the 40, 40, but I want to go back in front of the court, in front of the judge. She said, of course, of course. So I talked to Frank and Frank says, yeah, um, I think she should argue for six levels. I think six or seven level. I think that's, that's reasonable. Um, he said, that's what I'm hoping for. I'm hoping to get 10, 10 to 15 years knocked off your sentence. I think that's, that's something that's doable. So I think you need to arg have her argue that. And I said, okay. He said, but take it so that you can get back in front of the judge because they said, your judge based on the, on the motions, like to him in the motions, the judge was talking to us. Now, I don't know. I didn't hear the judge in there and I don't understand, but. Frank was able to kind of read these things. And as a lawyer, if you talk to a lawyer, he'll kind of say, yeah, that is kind of like you get a read for judges as they kind of go along, how quickly they, they, they file something, how long their briefs are, things that they say in the briefs, uh, things they say in court, like you can get a read on them. Frank felt he got a read and he was saying that, look, your judge, your judge, he, he knows he gave you too much time. Like he gave you that time expecting you were going to get, he was going to be able to bring you back and knock time off your sentence. He knows he, that's what should have happened. It didn't happen. Trust me. You need to get in front of him. Give him an opportunity. So I go back a, a few. So I tell, I tell uh, Esther that and I go back to court. I go back to court. I go in front of the judge. We argue. Oh, this is what's interesting is that when I go back, Jim Montrum comes and he he is gets on the witness stand and he's, you know, not deposed, but he's where he's a witness for me. So he's a witness for me. And the U.S. attorney talks to him and um, my lawyer talks to him. Millie, my former lawyer, the one that I'm saying was ineffective. She gets on the stand. She testifies for me. The FBI agent. Because I had also worked with an FBI agent that had come to see me. I don't think I've gotten into that yet. I may not get into that. Like it was like I had an FBI agent that was they were coming to see me after I got to Coleman. They would come to see me and talk to me about cases. Um, and but the thing is, I would talk to them about cases and we would go over the cases and the files and I'd explain this is fraud and this looks wrong and this isn't right. And that and, and all, on mine, my my stuff, too. And but nothing ever happened. But she came and she testified for me. So I have all these people testifying for me. And 
then the judge gets up and, you know, I, I testified for myself. I couldn't even hold it together. And Connor, Connor knows I, I cry like a baby, like a small child over for pretty much anything. Um, and so I get on the stand and I'm, I'm, I'm crying like a, like, like a, like probably like a four or five year old little girl who you've like taken away like a puppy. Like maybe you gave her a puppy for three days and then one day you just take her puppy and she's just inconsolably crying, like snot rolling down my nose. Like t I'm, it was, it was a, <laughs> like I couldn't even hold it together. Bro. It was <laughs> so bad. It was such a, 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 a non Wes Watson moment, let's say, like not a tough guy inmate. Yeah, not, not what was going on at that time. So, um, you know, I tell the judge that I feel like I had fundamentally changed, that the, the Senate changed me, that I, I realized what I did was wrong and that, you know, hey, listen, no danger here. <laughs> I'm all good. I hear you. I he was like, listen, I hear you. I see what, when you gave me the 26 years, I hear what you were going for. I got you. I'm all good. We don't need to complete this sentence. Message received, buddy. Anyway, so I sit down and I'm sitting there and I, the judge, listen, when I was talking to him at one point when I was, you know, um, testifying or whatever you want to say, just being interviewed by my lawyer and talking. I remember at one point I looked over at him and he looked over at me and the look on his face was wrap it up. I want, I don't want to get caught in traffic. Like, I mean, it was just like, wrap it up, bro. Like, fuck you. I mean, he just, he just looked at me like, like he was so like, give me a fucking break. And the thing is, I was genuinely sincere with everything I was saying, but he could have cared less. Like, I was like, oh, wow. And I remember immediately thinking, he's already made up his mind. Nothing we're saying here is going to change his mind. So I wrapped it up, went and sat down, and the judge went, and I was absolutely right. Because he rambled off what he was going to say so quickly that it, it was, I barely caught it. Like, I remember he, he sat, he sat there and said, okay, well, I've heard, you know, I've heard from the prosecution. I've heard from the defense. And I believe that what Mr. Cox has done is he's, he's done. Now, whether or not he's, what he's never, the things that he's done, he said, um, to get a sentence reduction, he said, I have no idea if he did those things because he genuinely has changed or whether or not he, only did those things because he wanted a sentence reduction. He is regardless, it, he is, it's irrelevant. I, it's not within my scope uh, or my ability to look into his soul and see those things. He said, so he said, here's the thing. He said, the government is asking for a one level reduction. He goes, that's not nearly enough of a reduction for what this man has done. He said, uh, he has helped you. He's been interviewed. He's done all these things. He wrote an ethics and fraud course. He's met with FBI agents. He's met with secret service agents. He's done everything within his power. He said, and I believe that one level is not, isn't nearly enough for what he's done. He has Mr. Cox. He said, your lawyer's asking for a nine level reduction, which would be a, it was like a 15 year reduction. He has, he, he, she's asking for a nine level reduction, which would be 15 years. He said, that was never going to happen. And I was just like, oh, my God. And he goes, that was never going to happen. He said, so I have thought about it. He said, and uh, based on the uh, sentencing guidelines and what's fair in the law and blah, 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 blah. He just rambled it off. He said, he said, I'm going to go ahead and reduce Mr. Cox's sentence by three levels. He said, and that is it's it's basically seven years. So it's actually like a month under seven years. Uh, or something like that. So he, he said, which is a, blah, 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 you know, this many, he said, essentially, he said, basically seven years off your sentence. He said, and he said, for, for someone who's, he said, for someone whose cooperation didn't lead to the arrest or indictment of anyone, he said, as a result of that, he said, I think it's, he said, I think it's fair. And he said, that's the ruling of the court. And he said, you know, that's it. And boom, got up, bam, hit his gavel and bolted. He was gone. And I was like, holy shit, like seven years? Like I, I got 26 years, like seven years. Like initially I felt like I'd been shafted. But, you know, like they handcuffed me and then they took me out, 
you know, I had to wait in that little holding cell for a little bit. And then they walked me outside. It's funny because this, the court hit the courtroom was being redone. And so they had me at like an auxiliary or an annexed courtroom in another small town, not in downtown Atlanta. And so I really didn't, there was no Sally port or anything. Like I literally got walked out of the courthouse in front of traffic traffic and in front of people walking down the sidewalk, like literally the marshals like stop people and you know, they've got shotguns and shit and I'm walking, you know, with my, in my little orange jumpsuit and I've got my handcuffs and chains and people are like, Oh, it's Hannibal Lecter. So I, I wa- I'm walking and as I'm walking to the van to be brought back to the U S marshals holdover, as I'm walking, I look across the street and I can see Millie, um, you know, my original lawyer. And I can see her in her car and she looks up at me. And I just remember she looked so sad, like, like I'm, it's so sad that, you know, he only got seven years. And I remember looking at her and I went, eh. like that. And she just went and just kind of grinned. I said, eh. so I got in the fucking van. By the time I got back to the Marshall's holdover, I had had a good long talk with myself. Sometimes I have to have talks with myself uh, to, to get my head right because I was extremely disappointed. And then I kind of thought about it and I thought, you know, you just got seven years knocked off your sentence. Like if you do the drug program, which is RDAP, I could get another year knocked off. Plus with game time, Plus, if you get a year halfway house, like you, you really only have about seven years to go, which wasn't true, by the way. I had eight or nine. It was, it was, it was basically eight or nine, about nine more years to go. But I was like, you know, you can get this knocked off and this and this. And you basically are going to have to do about seven more years. Best case scenario, you're out of here in seven years. And I, and I just done seven years. Like I, at this point in my, in my, my tenure, my, my, my sentence, I'd done 10 years or I mean, I'd done seven years. So I was like, you just did seven years that you didn't think you could do. And you just did them. You can do another seven years. And at this point I had started to write all of these guys stories. And I thought you're going to, you know, what's great is you have an opportunity here to write these guys true crime stories and get out with a wealth of of intellectual property. And that's what you're going to do. You're going to collect true crime stories for the next seven years. That's what you're going to do. This is a good thing. You're okay. It could have been worse. He could have given you 40 months. It could have been even worse you could have never met, um, been lucky enough to be in a prison with Amadeo, and you could have just been getting out in 2030, which is when you're supposed to get out. So, you know, I thought, you know what? Be thankful. Nobody had to do shit for you. Be thankful. And I, so literally by the time I got off the van, got out of the van, I was in a great mood. Like I just got seven years knocked off my sentence. And, um, yeah, so that was it. I got back and I remember I went to France. First thing I did, like, I mean, I, I got there just before four o'clock count, four o'clock count happened. They let us out for chow. I immediately went to see Frank Amadeo. So he's the first person I went to go see other than the guys in my unit, walk in to see, to see Frank or walk. I, I met him. At, he was actually out by uh, Stonehenge. So I go straight to Stonehenge. I walk up to him and I said, Frank. And he goes, Hey, he said, I heard you got back. He said, I heard you guys. He is. I heard you got um, seven years knocked off. And I said, I did. I did. I said, I wanted to thank you for that. And he goes, you're welcome. And he sat there and he looked at me and I said, you know, I, I don't want to seem thank, uh, seem like, I don't want to seem unappreciative. I said, but I was just hoping for more. And he, uh, and I said, I'm sorry. I said, I'm sorry that I, I feel this way. And he said, you know, I was hoping for more too. He said, but the thing is, he said, it, I think that we're just going to have to eat this elephant one spoonful at a time. Something else will come out. I think you'll get some more time knocked off. Something else will come up. Something will happen. And he just looked at me and I went, okay, okay. And he said, you know, 
you did good. And I was like, no, thank you. Thank you. He said, no problem. And yeah, I was, I was really, you know, I was, it was a mixture of disappointment and, and real, and just really also being thankful at the same time. It was hard. It was like, okay, you got seven or seven, you got about eight or nine more years to go, really, to be honest. You really had, I really had nine more years to go. Um, technically I, but if I was lucky, I could get off some time, get a little bit halfway house because I might be able to get out in seven. But at that moment, you know, I, um, it was, it was like, you know, like it was really the term bittersweet. Uh, but yeah, he said, uh, we're going to have to eat this elephant one spoonful at a time. And I remember I went to chow and, you know, I went to chow. That was it. So. I am so sorry that I did not explain Frank's story. I will do that in the next video. And uh, I really wanted to do it in this one, um, but we're, we're coming up on, you know, we're over 40 minutes. So, uh, but the next video, I'm gonna explain how Frank Amadeo ended up in prison. Super interesting story. Uh, and of course, I'm also going to, uh, I don't know if it's that one, but I'm also going to explain how I got my sentence reduced again. Yeah, yeah, again. Because <laughs> if I hadn't, I'd still be, I wouldn't be talking to you right now. I'd still be in prison. So, um, yeah, okay. I, because actually my, my outdate at that point was now like 20, it was like 2020, because with good time, because you, you lose good, it would have been 2024. So I would still be in prison. I would still be in prison. <laughs> oh my God. After I got back, after I got my sentence reduced and I got back from getting my sentence reduced from, it was basically it's 26 years and four months down to like 19 years and, and change. So it's basically 26 years to 19 years. So I still have with good time off my sentence, I still have nine, no, I still have nine more years to do. Now you can do things like take the drug program, that sort of thing. Um, and you can get a year off and maybe you get a year halfway house. I thought I was going to get a year halfway house. I never did. I didn't. I got less than that, but I always thought I was going to get a year halfway house because I'd done so much time and I was nonviolent. But, you know, anyway, we'll get into that later. So Frank Amadeo is the guy that I went to and he helped me get, you know, get my, my time reduced. Well, when I got back, a lot of guys were constantly reading the stories that I'd, I'd written and I'd written my story. I'd written, um, Another story by a guy uh, about a guy named Ephraim Devaroli, uh, which I'll also talk about. Um, and I, I wrote a story um, about a guy named Doug Dodd and Lance Barabbas and Lance Barabbas's brothers. He has a uh, he has two brothers. And I, I I wrote there was another guy named Richard in the story. It was basically a group of wrestlers that were doing doctor shopping for oxycodone, and I. And they were shipping them up to colleges, you know, throughout the country. Well, I wrote a story about those guys and I ended up getting them in Rolling Stone magazine. So all of this was going on. I, I also wrote a guy about, uh, I wrote a story about a guy named um, Marcus Shrinker. I, I've written, listen, I've written like 20, almost like over 20 stories. They were synopses. Some of those stories turned into books later, like I expanded them. There was so much information. It was such a good story and so compelling that instead of writing, let's say, a 20 or 30 page synopsis, I ended up writing in a, a two or 300 page book. One of those stories that I wrote was on Frank Amadeo. Now, I haven't actually gone into all the stories, and I'm not going to go into all the stories, like, or, or this would be a hundred hours of, of video, of video, of tape, tape. There's no tape, whatever footage. What it's not, there's not even footage. So there would be a lot. It would be a lot of whatever this is. Um, so I'm, I'm only going to go into the ones that are really kind of key to my, to the, the, the crux of my story while I was in prison. And Frank Amadeo is definitely one of those guys. So I had multiple guys who had been reading my stories. Guys would come to me and say, hey, Matt, can I, 
can I get one of your stories? You got any new stories? You got anything about drug dealers? And I'd be like, yeah, yeah. And I'd give them something on a drug dealer. Or somebody would come to me and they'd go, Cox, bro, man, I heard you wrote a story about what's his name? That guy in B3, you know, can you, uh, can I see it? And I go, yeah, I'd give it to them and they'd read it and come, they'd bring it back and give it to me or, or they'd say, Hey, can I keep it for another week? My cellie wants to read it or whatever. Um, and, and of course I, I also have guys coming to me constantly saying, Hey man, you got to, you got to talk to my celly or you got to talk to my, this guy that just got here. He's got an amazing story. You definitely need to talk to him. And I would talk to the guy and maybe I was interested in the story. Maybe I wasn't, you know, and I basically had a list of guys at this point, but one of the things that I wanted to do was write Frank Amadeo's story. Everybody told me I had to write it. I knew a little bit about the story and, and how he ended up in federal prison I did not know the entire story until I obviously sat down with Frank and started writing it. So after I got back from going to, you know, from going to to um, uh, get my sentence reduced and I came back, I said, Frank, you know, we really ought to start talking about your story. And he was like, yeah, you, uh, you know, yeah, I, 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 we do need to do that. We need to do that. And I said, look, let me just write a synopsis on it. Because nobody had ever written anything on Frank other than the newspapers. And I liked Frank. I respected Frank. Uh, and, and even though, even despite what I'm going to, the things I'm going to say about him, you know, and his story in general, I have a, a deep found respect for Frank. You know, I, I, I owe him a huge, uh, a, a, a huge debt um, for helping me. So we sat down and, um, we, I started writing his story. Now, I sat down. I wrote an outline at first. Now, the issue with F Frank is, is that he, since he's been very young, he has, he has heard or felt the presence of or he says hears the voice of God and that God has told him since he was a young boy that he is this is how he says it, preordained to be emperor of the world. Now, it's hard to say that without smiling. Because obviously there's a there's a sickness there, right? So he he's been diagnosed with bipolar disorder, but he's what you call a rapid cycling bipolar. So he's a rapid cycling bipolar with features of schizophrenia. So in his manic state, now he says he basically feels the presence of God all of the time, but in his manic states, he really, it becomes clear what his destiny is. So he's hearing the God tell him what his destiny is during his manic states. And that is that he is ultimately going to conquer either economically or through force, the planet, and he is going to bring a one world order to the planet and all of the governments will dissolve and he will be emperor of the world. Yeah. Now, when I sit down and I'm writing this, I'm, I'm writing, I remember just taking the outline, I'm outlining and I'm like, okay, so when does this happen? And at what point? And what do they call it again? And I'm writing everything down. And, and he says, and I said, okay, well, Frank, you were diagnosed with bipolar disorder. And he was like, right, right. I said, so, I mean, obviously the, the, the voice of God or this, this delusion is connected with your, your schizophrenia and your, your bipolar disorder. And he said, well, see, that's the problem. That's the problem that the psychiatrists have is that they, they equate the, you know, they equate my belief that I will be emperor of the world with the with the the features of schizophrenia and I said right and I, I, and I said as opposed to what and he goes what it is and I go what is it and he goes the voice of god and you know it's like how do you argue with that this is a guy that is literally doing people's paperwork and getting them cut loose from prison you've got the united states government with an inexhaustible budget who are convicting people they're coming to frank amadeo who basically is working with drug dealers and sex offenders to help him do paperwork and fill out 
fill out 2255s and fill out, you know, um, motions and everything else that he's doing filings and, and typing up his motions and dictating to, he's dictating to them. And they're, they're, they're doing all of this legal work for him with, with him. He has no budget and he's working with criminals, the worst of the worst. And he is getting guys sentences cut. Sometimes they're being cut loose and they walk right out of prison. Sometimes, and this is what typically happens. See, a lot of people think, oh, he like he gets your, your sentence overturned and you're released. Typically, that's not what happens, right? Typically, what happens is you get 20 years and Frank gets it cut down to six years or 11 years. He gets time shaved off because there's just, just nobody beats the government. What he can do or what he's done, 90% of these guys that he helps um, have had their sentences reduced in some way. Sometimes he gets the conviction thrown out altogether. The guy walks out the door. That's not the, the norm, though. So what ends up happening is, so it's hard to not take him seriously. You know, well, even though what he's saying seems bizarre, it, it's, you know, who am I to judge? I don't know. And. So as I talked to Frank, Frank explained to me that since he was a young boy, he has had this delusion, which he does not believe is a delusion. He's had this delusion since he was a young boy. And he has several things that happened to him while he was young that he equates to God um, protecting him. Uh, one time he was walking on train tracks and he heard the voice of God tell him to step off the tracks. And he stepped off the tracks just as a train came right up behind him and, and went right by him. Like, I mean, I don't know if he's wearing headphones. I don't know exactly what I forget what happened in the book, but the, he could have been killed. Another time he was supposed to go with like his favorite aunt. He was supposed to go shopping with her. And he, for some reason, stayed home and he loved his aunt. Like he wanted to go, he just didn't go for some reason. And he didn't go. She ended up disappearing and her body was found in a dumpster a few days later. She was murdered. Had he been with her, he probably would have been murdered also. And later came out, this is when he was a young boy, later came out that it was uh, her fiance's boyfriend that ended up murdering her. So um, another time he wandered away when he was whatever, three, four, five years old, he wandered away from daycare and where they couldn't find him and uh, some stranger found him wandering around the neighborhood and picked him up and drove him back to uh, the daycare. Like he, then his thing, he, he wandered out into traffic. He's wandering around the streets. He could have been killed. He wasn't. He was saved. And he, he says that, hey, these are things that tell him that he, God was protecting him. So ended up in high school. He was, um, he was a member of the, um, the young Republicans, he often debated uh, people on uh, on on the radio. He was he was extremely bright, and he he also constantly told everybody in school that he was going to be emperor of the world. And they laughed it off. You know, they joked about it and ha ha ha. And you know, they kind of shrugged it off. And his teachers thought it was funny. And it was kind of a running kind of joke. You know, he was like, "Oh well, when I'm emperor, you'll see." And yeah, ha, ha. and he would laugh about it, but. He also believed it. He knew how it sounded. So he's not delusional in such a way that he's an asshole. Like he's not, you know, saying, you know, fuck you. That's, you, you know, that's what's going to happen. You think I'm crazy. Like he's not. He knows it sounds crazy. And he's like, look, I, you know, I know how it sounds, but I know the truth of what's happening. And so graduates high school, goes on to college in, I forget where. I wrote a whole book on it, by the way. So it's called It's Insanity. He went to college, and by the way, several people have picked up uh, on the story. Uh, there's a guy named what's that guy Count Count Dankula, guy named Count Dankula. You didn't know that? No, Dankula, guy named Count Dankula. It's got like a, almost a million views. Like he did like an hour. The guy did like an hour on Amadeo. He basically went to my website and r almost read my synopsis, which is on my website of Amadeo, not the whole book. Or it would have probably been about five or six hours. Anyway, Frank goes to college. He ends up going to, is it, oh uh, God, Matt, come on, think about this for a second here. He ends up going to college and um, 
yeah, he goes to law school in 1986. He goes to college, he graduates, then he goes to law school, and the CIA approaches him. And this is actually very common, I found out, after Frank had told me that he was, the CIA had come to, to I think it was Emory, had come to Emory in Georgia. I want to, I believe it's in Georgia. I, you know, honestly, I can't remember. But the point is, is that he had taken a test and the CIA had asked him to come in and they wanted to hire him in special operations or something. They wanted to hire him. And that would be somebody that would be like a field agent and which is, which was odd or somebody who would run field agents, which is odd because if you saw Frank, Frank's probably five, five, um, chunky. He probably wasn't chunky at this time, but he was in college, but he obviously was, was even look at no time. Do I ever see him being in good shape? So he's not a, 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 an athlete. Uh, uh, he doesn't scream CIA, but uh, whatever. I actually interviewed a CIA agent about the book and about the story. And his, a lot of what he said in his interview is in the book. And he says that it was a common thing for the CIA to go and interview lawyers to try and get them to come and become CIA agents. Well, Frank was actually planning on when he graduated, he was going to go to work for the CIA, but he didn't. He he ended up his father got sick and he couldn't he couldn't leave. So what he did was he started a business and he ended up getting a getting his law degree and helping his parents out and he went to work for a company that's a lot like H&R Block. It was actually started by the same guy that started H&R Block and it was it was for bankruptcies. And so he went and he got a job as a bankruptcy attorney. And very quickly, he became very good at it. He's extremely analytical, um, very smart. Frank ended up leaving that, that a firm and starting his own firm with a couple of other guys. Frank starts this other firm. And he ends up being one of the premier bankruptcy attorneys in, I want to say, Atlanta. So he does very well for himself. Starts making a bunch of money. He ends up getting married. Um, he marries a woman by the name of Claire. So he's he's doing great. Um, as he's uh, he ends up getting in trouble and going to a federal camp. And this is what's funny about this. This is good. He he gets in trouble because he's overwhelmed with work, and he his his two partners really are just worthless. These two guys are kind of worthless. Frank's the one doing all the work. Frank's bringing in all the money. And Frank has a massive panic attack, right? He goes into a deep depression. He ends up being hospitalized. But at the time, they didn't, nobody set thought that it was depression. They thought he was sick. They thought he might have pneumonia. They didn't know what he would, what he had because this is back, this is back in the eighties and nineties. And back then, <coughs> back then, you know, you weren't really, depression wasn't like a, a a way to be ill. It was a mental condition and you couldn't end up in the hospital as a result of depression, but he, he did. Uh, he still hadn't even been diagnosed with bipolar disorder at this time. So he's depressed. He gets out. By the time he gets out of the hospital and can go back to work, there have been multiple bankruptcy filings that have been missed. His two uh, law partners had kind of pilfered the, the bank account and some money that had been given to the firm had been used. So there was commingling of funds, and that's a, that's an issue. He ends up getting indicted by the by first it, the uh, the local local um, uh, attorney, local district attorney, was going to indict him, but they actually had a grand jury and they couldn't indict him. So she handed it over to the feds, and the feds indicted him. And he, they came back and they said they were going to give him, I think, two or three years probation, and he had to pay back the money, which he did. Um, when they spoke with his wife at the time, Claire, they actually went to Claire and they were preparing his sentencing memorandum, which you give to the law to, it's called your pre-sentencing report and they give it to the judge. His wife said, you can't give him probation. He has to go to jail. He's not going to learn his lesson. And if you knew it, that sounds harsh, but if you knew Frank, you would understand he takes on too much. He was doing so much legal work. The guy barely ever slept and honestly barely sleeps anyway. But 
he he takes on too many too much responsibility and he promises too much you know so he, he gets overwhelmed so she was saying he needs to be controlled he needs to learn his lesson he he was overwhelmed himself so she says he's got to go to he has to go to jail he'll never learn his lesson so they actually sent him to jail i think he did less than a little bit less than a year maybe a year he goes to a camp you know you, you it's a boot camp they had him at the time for the feds you go to a boot camp, you jog, you run, they yell at you, you play soccer, you ate pretty good back then, and then they released him. When he was, by the time he was being released, this would have been in the 90s, and the Soviet Union had fallen, Berlin Wall came down, Russia broke apart, and Claire, his wife, who was also a lawyer, ended up going to, I forget what was it, it was some of the stands, like, Tajikistan, you know, um, whatever. Um, he, she goes over there to some of the Soviet bloc, former Soviet bloc countries, and helps kind of reorganize their their new governments. So she goes over there. He's left with like nothing. So Frank ends up when he, he gets out, he ends up calling an old friend, and that old friend is. I can't believe I can't remember this guy's name. I talked to him. I interviewed him for hours and hours. He was a super interesting guy. I got to get his name. I'm so sorry. Yaniv Amar. So Yaniv contacts Frank. I think, you know, or Frank, whatever. They got into contact. And Yaniv and Frank had actually gone into a small business partnership together. And so Yaniv meets Frank at like a Denny's and gives him, I think, like $30,000 and says that his... Their little business venture, they had bought some stuff on consignment from a bank from some place that was I'm not consignment. They bought some stuff from a bankrupt a company that had gone bankrupt and Yaniv resold it and he gave Frank like 30 grand. So Frank was like, Great, I have some money because he had nothing after spending a year in prison. And um so he Frank ends up taking the 30 grand and he kind of restarts his life. And what he does is it gives him the opportunity to kind of start looking into doing some different things. One of the things he does is he ends up he ends up working taking over a company that Yaniv was running which was doing um it was like uh, kind of like a it, it was they were offering a, a universal credit card. So Frank takes over the company and he kind of there were some some issues with the company. He sorts those issues out. Well, while he's sorting out those issues, he starts taking on clients from other companies that are in financial straits, right? Like companies that are on the verge of bankruptcy. Now, he can't be a bankruptcy attorney because Frank's been disbarred. All right. He was disbarred when he got his felony and went to prison. You can't be a, fe you can't be a felon and be a lawyer. You actually, in some states, you can, but the first thing they do when you get a felony in pretty much any state is they disbar you. He was disbarred. Fourth cup of coffee today. Okay. So, Frank goes out, and trust me, this is going somewhere. Frank goes out, and he starts taking on clients for uh, of companies, uh, starts taking on companies as clients to help re reorganize their companies. Or he places them in bankruptcy and reorganizes them through the bankruptcy laws. So a lot of times what Frank would do is, give you an example, you know, you go to all your creditors, you're a company, and you go to all your creditors and you say, look, here's, we're going to do this one of two ways. You're going to either work with me on repaying this debt or you're going to reduce the debt and let me repay you or we will go into bankruptcy court and I'll bankrupt the company and there's a chance you get almost nothing because that's pretty much what's going to happen if you go to bankruptcy court unless you're some massive company and even then you get pennies on the dollar. So do you want to take 80 cents on the dollar or you want to end up taking 15 cents on the dollar in five years from now? Or I can start paying you back the 80 cents on the dollar now. And that's what he would do. He would go into these companies. Well, this this business venture starts to grow very quickly as anything does with Frank because he's a workaholic. He works probably 90 hours a week. Um, and it grows very quickly. Well, let's not forget, Frank has not forgotten. He didn't get better when he went to prison. 
Okay. He didn't start getting medicated. Uh, he didn't stop hearing the voice of God. And, and he told me, I asked him about Claire. I said, did Claire know about this? And he said, oh yeah, Claire and I used to talk about it all the time. Like he, he said, Claire would kind of joke about it. They go to dinner and they joke about this and they joke about this. Like everybody kind of joked with him about it. But the guys that I interviewed for my book on him, they would go, they, they would tell you, they go, we would kind of laugh about it, laugh about it. I go, so you guys just thought it was a joke. And they go, no, no, we, we knew it was real. Like we knew that's what he really believed. Like we would all joke about it, but there were times during these conversations when Frank would get very, very serious. Not that he would get angry or upset that you were joking about it, but you could tell that this is something that he very clearly had, had thought out. He had a plan. That plan was to build a company called Mirabilis. And that's what he did. Frank ended up starting a company called Mirabilis. Mirabilis is, it was based on the theory that Frank came up with when he wrote his thesis, which he never finished, uh, in school. So he'd written a school. He was going to get his master's degree. He was going to, he had to write a thesis. I don't think he ever got his master's degree, but he was going to write a thesis. I'm sorry. He was going to get a master's degree. He ended up writing a thesis. That thesis was called Capital Genesis. Capital Genesis is based on a design where a company could buy up other companies and then use those companies' resources, right? For instance, you're a large manufacturer. And one of the things you have to do is, is, you have to make copies of paperwork. You have to print brochures. So you use a printing company that's also owned by Mirabilis. So let's say that printing company. So now what happens is that all brochures or anything that's printed by any other companies, all of those contracts go to one of the companies that is within the Mirabilis umbrella. So if suddenly, let's say you own a security company and you needed cars for all of your security guards, you would buy them through a dealership that was owned by Mirabilis. So all of these companies have, they're all, it's like an alliance plan, right? So they're alliance or they're, they're all affiliates or associates of one another, but they're all owned by Mirabilis. Now, what Frank realized while he was in the middle of bankruptcy and he was, he had started Mirabilis was that while he was he wasn't in the middle of bankruptcy. While Frank was in the middle of doing his bankruptcy business, really his 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 um consulting business. So he was consulting with companies and helping reorganize them. He started making money doing this. He started getting stock, um, and he started getting millions of dollars being given to him for reorganizing companies and renegotiating the terms of their agreements um, from their creditors, getting them to hold off for six months or getting it, the, it, the, the amount of money reduced or whatever his negotiation, his plans were, he would get these things done. And he, one of the things he did was he would say he wanted to own a portion of the company. So he'd get stock and he'd place that stock in Mirabilis. Mirabilis would now own that stock. So they now own a portion of that company. So if the, you go into a company that's going bankrupt, they don't have, they don't have the money to give you $5 million for your fee. So a lot of times he would take that money in the form of stock. Well, one of the things that Frank realized while he was doing all of this was even when these large companies couldn't pay their, their, you know, their debt, their debt, like they couldn't pay, um, their suppliers and they couldn't pay certain things. The one thing that they always paid was they always paid their payroll taxes. I'm sorry. They always paid their payroll. So obviously a company would collapse immediately if you didn't pay your employees. So instead of not paying your employees, they might not pay for steel that they needed to build cars or computers or microchips like, or, you know, silicon or, or maybe it would be roofing shingles. Maybe you have three suppliers of roofing shingles and it's a, it's a general, it's a contractor and that puts on roofs. And so he just doesn't pay one of the con or one of those suppliers and he pays the other two and then he pays his employees because he's behind. So Frank would, 
Frank noticed that they always paid their employees. So what Frank did was he went in and as soon as he would go into a business, he would say, one of the first things we're going to do is we're going to use a payroll um, a payroll company to do all of your payroll. So that's a way to reduce money for them, he would tell them, of course. So instead of you having your own HR person, right, your own human resources person, you have you have 800 employees. We're going to use this payroll company and they're going to do all your payroll and they're going to lease all of your employees back to you. That way, the pay, so all your employees basically end up working for this payroll company. And so what happens is that payroll company, as they get more and more employees that they lease out, they are then in a position to negotiate things like workman's comp, um, um, 401k programs. Uh, they're, they're in a position to negotiate uh, health insurance, uh, things of that nature. They're, they're in a position to negotiate with those big companies like, hey, we have 10,000 employees. Now, technically, it's a leasing company. They lease out all the employees, but it doesn't matter. So here's the thing. As Frank, as his, these, these, I don't want to say temp companies, these, these leasing, these employee leasing companies or in, employee payroll companies are, are growing. And, and you have to understand that. Let me clarify this just to kind of jump through it. This these companies he ends up with forty thousand employees, all right. So very quickly, Mirabilis and the companies that it owns end up with forty thousand employees, bringing in like half a like a billion dollars. Is it a billion a year? Half a billion? Half a trillion? I forget how much money they were bringing in every single year. It was it was outrageous. Oh, it was nearly a billion dollars in annual revenue. 40,000 employees and nearly a billion dollars in annual revenue or what these com- his company was bringing in. So by this point, Frank is a multi, multi-millionaire and growing. He still has an issue, right? And that issue is this. He believes he's preordained to be emperor of the world. And now he has a whole bunch of money. So here's what Frank does. You would think like, hey, being filthy rich, like that's cool. Like I'm good with that. But that's not that's not God's plan. God's plan is world domination through Frank Amadeo. Here's what Frank does. Frank starts negotiating with. He he starts negotiating with like a, a. A company that builds airplanes in Russia to become partners. But what they used to build was ICBMs. They now build airplanes. He then, he also starts negotiating to buy a fleet. I say fleet. It's a squadron, small squadron, about 24 um, F-15s and F-16s, used F-15s and F-16s. He also negotiates with the Cypriots to keep the the planes on Cyprus because you can buy an F-15 or an F-14 or an F-16, but when you buy them, they strip all of the guts out. Like they strip the, uh, they call it, it's declawing them. They take all the parts out of the plane that make it lethal. So it doesn't have guns. It doesn't have missiles. But if you take the planes and you bring them to Cyprus, you can have all that stuff put back in. So he's building a small air force. Really, honestly, if you had 24 of the uh, F-15s, you got a bigger Air Force than most most countries. So he's negotiating with those. And believe it or not, you, apparently you can get them for a couple million apiece. He's got, I think it was, ends up being like, uh, it ends up being something like he's, he was negotiating like $60 million to try and buy these uh, these planes. The other thing he does is he buys several companies and there's like three of them, but I'm just going to call them one. And it was, it was called, it's a tactical, it's, ta- it's called tactical um uh, private security so he had there were like three of them but i'm just gonna instead of saying this company this they were all basically ta- under the umbrella of tactical so he, it's a private military so these are guys that protect executives they they do things like for instance let's say the dea and this is something that was hilarious so frank tells me that the dea let's say they have a drug dealer 
let's say there's a, a drug dealer from Colombia. They know he lives in Argentina. Well, they have no jurisdiction to get him in Argentina, but they know he's there. The Argentinians won't come get him. So what Frank does is tactical. The DEA says, look, if this, they put a contract out to private security f- firms like tactical. And they say, look, if this guy shows up in the United States, we'll cut you a check for $250,000. No questions asked. So Frank's guys go out there. They find the, they find the Colombian living in Argentina and they watch him for a week. Find out his routine. And then one day they pull up, a van pulls up, a guy jumps out, walks up behind him, hits him with a taser, throws a black bag over his head, zip ties him, throws him inside the, the van. They drive straight to an Air Force. They jump on one of, one of uh, Frank's private planes and they fly him back to the United States. They get to the United States. They call the DEA while they're still on the tarmac and they say, hey, by the way, we have whoever. You know, we have Juan Carlos Sanchez and uh, we've got him right here and he's wanted and bring us our check. And so what do they do? They show up with a, with a check. I don't know if they show up with a check. They might mail it later. I'm just saying it's good for dramatic effect. Whatever. They show up with a check. They throw old Juan in the back of the Suburban and they hand t- the guys at Tactical a check for $250,000. Not a bad business. Assuming you don't get caught in Argentina and executed for kidnapping people. But Frank's guys are doing this all over the place. Now, his, by the way, I, I'd also like to mention that Tactical is run by a guy named Kevin Billings and a guy named Joe Robinson. There's also another guy. He's really irrelevant. So, Anyway, these two guys, basically Billings runs the whole operation. Um, Joe is, also works for Tactical. But there's, there's a couple dozen, several dozen guys that, that work for this company. And according to Frank, you know, th- they also had, you know, I say according to Frank, but I also saw an art, the article on it where, where they basically, they were delivering, there was something called the Sea of Hope, uh, Se- Seeds of Hope program where they were delivering seeds to Afghanistan. So Frank had contracts with the Afghan security forces to provide security in Afghanistan. So his guys would basically, they would um, protect convoys of seeds and food and things of that nature. So he had private, the private, you know, one of those many, many private security groups in Afghanistan and Iraq. Well, those are guys that work for tactical. Some of them. I mean, there's lots of little groups that do it. So, um, Frank's guys do lots of different things. All right. Billings does lots of things. Well, at some point, Frank is approached by a guy. Uh, uh, it actually happens that he actually happens to be um, a doctor. Doctor, is it Kush, Kushad or? Um, I'm so sorry. Oh, I, okay. So um, in December of 2005, Frank is approached by Doctor Oscar Kashala. All right. So Dr. Oscar Kashala was born in the Congo. All right. The Republic of uh, Democratic Republic of the Congo, the DRC. So he was born there, but he was raised in the United States and he was educated in the United States. Well, in the Congo, you have to have been born there. You have to be a citizen and have been born there to run for president. Well, the current president had been president for I don't know how long. Eight, 10 years. His father had been president for eight or 10 years prior to that. And it was actually rumored that the current president had murdered his father and took his position. Now, keep in mind that you're supposed to have democratic um, elections, the whole thing. Well, Oscar Kashala comes to Frank and says, listen, I need you to first. He says he wants them to provide security. Frank's like and he says, why? Would my guys provide security? And then they expl- he explains, look, I need them to provide security in the Congo because I want to run for president. So Frank ends up coming up w- with an agreement with Kashala where he says, 
I will provide security for you, but I also want to run your campaign. And I will funnel money in to back your campaign. However, if I get you elected, I want you to run your entire country based on the capital genesis, um, th- the theories of capital genesis. And I want a portion of the mineral rights of the Congo. Now, the Congo has the largest supply of minerals anywhere on the planet. Now, it's hard to get to those minerals because they've been constantly at civil in civil wars for about 40 or 50 years. But Frank's not stupid. He figures he can go in there with his private security and he can quail any types of, of um, upheaval, especially if he has the presidency, because essentially he's now a part of the presidency. He's a part of the government and he can basically get to the minerals. I'm not saying Frank's going to take everybody out and execute them that, that puts up a fight, but I'm not not saying it either. So he's got his private security. Oh, the other thing is, this is a great thing that Frank wanted to go into the Congo and actually hire the Congolese and train and build his own private military. Now, all this seems far-fetched because Frank's a multi-multi-millionaire at this point, but this is, this is a lot of money. Let me give you a, an idea of the scope of what an operation like this costs and where Frank came up with the money. Frank came up with the money by holding back on the payroll taxes that he was supposed to be sending to the IRS. And this is where the scam comes in. So far, everything Frank has done is legal. But Frank wants, you know, he's got to take over, right? Like God's not gift, God's not putting money in his bank account. You can't pass the collection jar around and, and, and save up enough money to buy F-15s and F-16s. Those puppies are expensive. So he needs his planes. He's got some security. He's got a lot of stuff, but it's not enough. But what Frank does notice, obviously, and I'm sure this is all part of the plan, is that the 40,000 employees that he's paying every single week and the money that's flowing into the, to the, the coffers of Mirabilis, that part of that money that comes in from all these various companies, which by the way, one of the things Frank specializes in is military-based companies. So he has a company that he he bought, which built private, they, they built satellites, portable satellites for the army. All right. He bought, he's bought companies that have, that make distillery machine, uh, water distillery systems. He bought, com- like a lot of these companies that he's bought have military, uh, m- military, they're specific to the military, right? They have military, what's the word I'm looking for? Military, uh, um, not at military, uh, damn. Somebody leave me a comment. Um, so they, they have, they have, there's ways that you can use these companies um, to help support the military or get contracts with the military. And he has contracts with the military as an asbestos company that removes asbestos from uh, military types of, uh, of, of naval vessels. He has, he has all of these different, these various companies that some of them have, um, um, a lot of them have to do with military operations. So one of the things he does is he stops he, st- he gets all the money coming in from the 40,000 employees and he stops. Let me explain how it works. So if you make $1,000 a week, Frank's company withholds 150 bucks, 200 bucks, because some money has to be sent to the, secret, uh, to the Social Security Administration. Some money has to be sent to... Um, has to be sent to the federal government to pay your, your, your um, federal income taxes, right? Money goes to Medicare. Money, money goes in different places. Well, the payroll company takes that money and then they, they pile it up and then they, they shoot it to the, the correct places, right? To the federal government, to the IRS, to whoever. So what Frank did was he started holding back on sending that money to the government. And he, and then, you know, we did this in the process of, of renegotiating these, 
these companies' debts. When he would take on a new company, he would renegotiate and he would withhold the payroll taxes. And then he would go to the IRS and he would tell the IRS, we can't pay you. And then he would negotiate with them for less money. So if his company owed, this this company just took on owed $4 million, he would negotiate with the IRS to pay them $1.5 million over the next three years until they got caught up. And they would accept that deal. But keep in mind, he had the $4 million. He would keep $2.5 million. And he would take that money, he would refunnel that money to fund things like Oscar Kashala's presidential run for, to be president of the Congo. So, as a result of this, Frank's guys go in, they hire a bunch of, they hire some, look, I'll be honest, they hire some mercenaries. They hire some guys from, um, from Nigeria. They hire some guys from uh, South Africa. South Africa and Nigeria, by the way, are notorious for uh, mer- hiring mercen- or mercenaries um, with private soldiers. So Frank's guys go in, they hire a bunch of this pri- these private, you know, not mercenaries, they call them private security. So they hire a bunch of private security to protect Kashala. Some of the guys that are there are Kevin Billings and... Um, uh, Joe Robinson. Joe Robinson was actually on the SWAT team. He, he. Joe Robinson also helped run uh, uh, Buddy uh, Mayor Buddy Dyer, who was the um, he was the uh, uh, mayor of Orlando. And, and you have to understand too. By this point, Frank has relocated to Orlando, and he occupies the first three floors of the Sun Trust building. So he's running his entire operation. He's running Mirabilis out of the SunTrust building in downtown Orlando. They funnel so much money into Nigeria for this guy, Oscar Kashala. Oscar Kashala, when he first went in, he was, he was 32nd. Out of all the people running for president, he was 32nd. Within six months, he goes from like 32nd all the way down to he's tied for second place. The problem is that the guy tied for second place, the second guy tied for it. So the current president is has the best position. He's in the best position. He's looks like he's probably may win. Oscar Kashala and this other guy are tied for second. Second and third. They're kind of bouncing. Um the other person is a general. Now in Nigeria, you can be a general and you can run for president. The other d- thing is, is that the military is very um, secularized there. So you can be a general there. And it's not like here in the United States where if the president calls a general and says, hey, I need you to do this and this. They, yes, sir. They do it. It's more negotiations there. You know, they, they give them money to protect, but it's not like they're just at your beck and call. So you have to be in pretty good terms. You have to think these are African countries are often overthrown by military coups within the ranks of their own military. Well, so you got to think now you've got a general that's actually running for president. The problem is Oscar Kashala is one of the only candidates running for president who's never murdered anybody. So he's looking pretty good to the Nigerians. They're like, this guy's U.S. educated. He speaks well. He's smart. He's not a murderer. He hasn't committed genocide. Like we might, it might be a good deal to get this guy in. African politics is a violent, violent industry, right? So it's not something, it's not like the United States. So Kashala is doing so well that at one point, the general who's also running sends his troops in to a compound, not where Kashala is, because Kashala is actually in a hotel in uh, in downtown. Um, I forget the name of the the city he was in, but basically in the capital, he's down. He's in down, a building downtown with about two dozen of Frank's guys, but there's thirty like 31 or 32 other guys that are in this compound, an offsite compound 
where there's a bunch of, of private security that Frank's hired, including Kevin Billings and Joe Robinson. Well, the military comes in in the middle of the night and they arrest all of these guys and they held them captive. And Frank finds out about this. I mean, this is a big deal. It's, it's in the newspaper there. There's, it, it's on the radio. It's on, uh, it's on all of the, you know, CNN picks it up. It's on the, um, in Orlando, they were running, they were talking about it. And so Frank's in there and Frank, basically Frank and the state department and the secret service negotiate for nine days to get these guys back. Now, there's actually a video on my channel. It's called Nine Days in the Congo. We can, if Connor remembers, we'll put the, the link in the description. And it's called Nine Days in the Congo. And it's about what, it's a documentary. And you'll get to see Frank Amadeo. So um, Frank Amadeo is in the documentary. So is Kevin Billings, um, Joe Robinson, like, like several guys. They show the whole thing. And these guys are held. And keep in mind, these guys, this is in good conditions, horrible conditions. They're dragging these guys out of the barracks or the, the cells every few days and doing like mock execution where they call the news and they, they put guns to these guys' heads and they threaten to kill them. And anyway, by the time they finally negotiate, and it's long and drawn out, um, but, you know, after nine days, they finally negotiate with the general with the military and they get them to release these guys. Kashala ends up taking third or fourth place in the election. He does not win. Frank gets all of his guys back. And you have to think Frank's hired former secret service agents, former FBI agents, former special forces. <coughs> He's got a, a, a serious, serious security force. Now, this brings Frank to like national attention. Okay. Cause now oh, there's all these newspaper articles and everything about him and about this guy and about his group. Like who the hell is this guy? Like suddenly they find out about Mirabilis and this, they're all over him. So Frank ends up, he his he's look by this point, I think he's got 80 million. No, I'm sorry. Not 80 million, 80 million. <laughs> That's nothing. $180 million. I think he's got about $180 million at this point. He, he is, he ends up negotiating with the new president. What's well, not the, 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 the guy that won the, the current president of the Congo negotiates with him to try and um, come in there and get min, uh, get the purchase, the mineral rights. The other thing that he does is Oh, oh, I forgot to tell you, by the way, the whole thing, the reason they arrested all these guys in the Congo, they said they were trying, they were going to mount an armed coup. Like they were armed that basically they were trying to say that Frank was backing an armed coup. Now, Frank says he wasn't, but the, the newspaper articles that I read all said that the Frank says his guys didn't have any guns. The newspaper articles say that they did have guns and it was it was an armed coup that they were trying to pull off. Frank says we were just they, we were just there providing security and um, and they were managing the campaign. So the point is is that Frank turns around and he ends up he ends up he he backs NATO he backs the uh, a NATO summit in uh, Latvia it was in Riga in Latvia and. At this point, Frank was approached by a conglomerate of people, a, a conglomerate that worked for like the oligarchies or an, a specific group of oligarchies who are trying to build natural pipe gas pipelines throughout um, throughout Europe. And part of the where they want to go through is they want to go through Tajikistan. So they approach Frank after seeing the Congo affair. And once again, I go all into it in the book. Like I can't get into it right now, but it's good stuff. The point is, is that they approach him and they ask him, they basically tell him that they want him to, they want him to take over Tajikistan. Now you have to understand that Frank already has 
Frank already has um, security forces along the border or close to the border of Tajikistan in Afghanistan. And what these oligarchies are saying is that, look, they've already got an arrangement with the military where the military will allow Frank's guys to drive right into the capital, go into the presidential palace and take it over. So these guys just have to drive in there and enter. It's basically like driving in. It's like it's like the Secret Service saying, look, we're not going to say anything if you guys come into the White House and arrest the president. Like, we're not going to do nothing. We're going to back up. We'll let you guys just come on in. So he's got whatever. He's got 50 or 100, 150 guys that are ready to go in. So Frank's about to do all this. And Frank ends up, while this is being put together, this whole thing is being put together. And once again, you have to understand this is all about, it's about natural pipeline, gas pipelines. It's about um, mineral rights. It's, it's all the same stuff. And Frank is also still negotiating with the Congolese president. So while this entire thing is happening, <coughs> he ends up going to Riga, to Latvia, to Riga for the, um, for the NATO summit. And Frank actually is one of the backers of the NATO summit. Like they're the ones who they put up like whatever, five, $10 million to organize this whole thing. And it's like $300 million to, to, to put one of these organ these things together. It's like a week long thing and fly out all of these different um, political uh, parties and, and political uh, guys. And they put it all together and Frank's there and Frank's speaking. And there's a lot of stuff that goes on. So he's there while he's there. He's actually approached by the CIA and told that they know what's happening. And they tell him basically to, to, to back off. So while that whole thing's happening, Frank ends up at a party of NATO, um, you know, NATO members. He's at like a like a cocktail party. While he's at the cocktail party, he's talking to several people and they're mentioning that they saw, you know, this thing's been everywhere. The, the Congo thing is everywhere. So some of the people say, what did you want with the Congo? Like what happened in the Congo? And he explains, well, I mean, I was had an, an I had an agreement. We were hoping to get our our guy in as president, but obviously that didn't work. But I'm currently working with the current president. And as he starts talking, they said, yeah, but what happens once you go in the Congo? Like the region is it's it's unstable. Frank says, well, we're going to go in and we're going to get all the minerals and we're going to get all the mining rights and we're going to mine all of the natural resources in the Congo. And I'm going to build the largest private military in on the planet. He said, and then he said, we won't need NATO anymore. And he kind of has this manic moment, this manic episode where he says, I'm going to build this massive military and I'll be able to police the entire plan and I won't, we won't need NATO anymore. That kind of takes people back. He doesn't really realize what he said. And what happens is he goes and he gets on the plane. He's flying back to the United States. And in between flying on his private jet back to the United States from Latvia, phone calls are made. People burn their midnight oil. And within a day or two of him getting back, he's been indicted for tax fraud. So actually, he wasn't actually indicted right then. Target letters were sent out. So a few days later, he's given him several target letters. People start getting target letters, subpoenas. They start investigating. They actually investigated him for months. I'm sorry, I, I, I was wrong about that. He got the target letters first. Months and months and months later, he ends up getting indicted for tax fraud. Charged with tax fraud or indicted with tax fraud? I'm not sure exactly what, but he gets indicted. So he ends up getting arrested for for tax fraud, for withholding the tax funds, even though he had negotiated with the IRS, he'd negotiated with the IRS to pay them less money on a payment plan and he'd been making the payments. Technically, that's not illegal. What the illegal part is when you have the funds and you're rerouting the funds, 
Now, Frank, according to Frank, that's not illegal either. Regardless, he ends up pleading guilty. Um, now, here's what happens. He he goes off of his. Oh, I didn't even mention that. I have pictures of him with George Bush. Did I, tell, I didn't even tell you this. Like during this whole thing, he ends up going to Washington. He goes to Washington, meets with George Bush, right? Junior, not senior. So George W. Bush, he meets with him. Listen, this this is so insane. All the politics and all the people like Trump. There's stuff with Trump in here where he had, I, I found a newspaper article and talked to Frank about how he outbid Trump to take over Trump Towers in Tampa. They were building Trump Towers and Frank came, Frank came in and outbid Trump. He, um, it's, it's just insane. He actually met with, with President, uh, President Bush. Uh, I have pictures of him in the White House and these aren't like photo op pictures where he's standing next to him at a $10,000 a plate dinner. You know, these are where he's, he's in like the Roosevelt room with, with members of NATO and, and security. And they were actually, he was actually being debriefed for, uh, on a, he said for a, something to do with security and uh tactical and the security it was providing in Afghanistan. Um so I mean I'm saying there's all kinds of of political connections here. So Frank ends up getting he kind of gets like a, he gets indicted. They they investigate him. They can't really they don't really have anything on him, but after like 6 months or so, he ends up for some reason I think they I think they indicted him. Finally, they might have indicted him or charged him. I forget, but he ends up agreeing to plead guilty. And the way that happens is he basically, at this point, he's he's kind of self-medicated using, this is going to sound insane, but he's, he's hyper, he is hyper, um, uh, he, he's like he's affected really badly. I can't. I don't know why I can't think. Um, he's hypersensitive to caffeine. So what he does to keep himself up all the time is just drink Pepsi's and co or Coca Cola. You know, just I think it's Pepsi's. He drinks them all the time to keep him up. And when he doesn't have Pepsi or caffeine in him, he drops. So what happens is he ends up getting. So he goes in, he's going to plead guilty, but he thinks he can plead guilty saying that I didn't realize that this was a crime or that I didn't think this was a crime. And he thinks he's going to end up with some kind of probation or something. And so he decides he's going to plead guilty. And what happens in the process of this whole thing, he's been diagnosed with bipolar disorder. And so they end up asking him to go to McLean, which is a, it's like, it's a Harvard Harvard uh, owned hospital. So they end up sending him to there for an evaluation to see if like if he's is he sane or not. He goes there for I think it's like a week or two and while he's there they put him on a ton of medication. They put him on so much medication that when he goes back to court he's literally drooling out of his the side of his face while he's while he he's there. He is convinced by his lawyer to take a plea. Now, here is what happens. His lawyer is telling him, look, Frank, you're going to take a plea. You get in front of the judge. They're going to recommend that they give you a few years. And all you have to do is get in front of the judge and explain to him about the bipolar disorder. And if you explain that to him, I'm sure he's going to end up giving you probation. So the guy convinces him of that. Now, here's the reason that Frank believes he he convinced him to take a plea and didn't want to go to trial was because the U.S. attorney had gone to Frank's lawyer and said, look, he gave you a million dollar retainer. We're going to claw that retainer back. We're going to take that retainer from you because that's money that was supposed to go to the IRS. So we're going to take that money from you. And you're going to end up defending this guy for nothing. You're going to lose a million dollars. Or if you if you convince him to take a plea, you can keep the retainer. So he ends up convincing Frank to take a plea. But if he takes the plea and he pleads guilty, he can go in front of the judge, explain the situation, and he believes he can get him some kind of probation or maybe a year or two. 
So Frank goes in and he, he takes a plea. He pleads guilty. He then explains the whole situation to the judge. He is drooling. He, the amount of medication that he was on, like when you, if you were to read the, it's outrageous how much medication he's on. Well, he gets on the stand. He tells the judge the whole thing. He sits down. It's time for sentencing. The judge gives Frank 22 years. 22 years. Frank gets to, he gets to the low, right? Like he's, now you have to understand during this process, during this process, Frank has been, he's had his rights stripped. The government strips him of his rights and he becomes a ward of the state and he's given a, uh, um, like they, they give you someone that looks after you, right? So he actually has someone that, that, wa- that watches over him. He can't sign checks. He can't sign a contract. He can't do anything. And the government knows this. And they had him sign a plea agreement without passing it by um, the, the person that's been assigned to him. It's like a, an ex-lawyer. Um, it's like a guardian. Without passing it by his guardian, they have Frank sign paperwork saying he pleads guilty, get sentenced and go to Coleman. The guy at Frank is at Coleman when he finally calls his guardian and the guardian, when he talks to him, he's like, Hey Frank, I, and the guardian thinks he's in the County jail. Hey Frank, let me know uh, when you're going to go to trial. He goes, go to trial. What are you talking about? I've already been sentenced. I got 22 years. I'm in federal prison. And the guardian's like, how could you have been sentenced? How can you even plead guilty? You're not even allowed to sign a contract. You can't write a check. You're not allowed to make any decisions. Government knew it, did it anyway. Put him on a bunch of medication. He could barely even understand what was happening. He's babbling. Anyway, they gave him 22 years. He goes to federal prison. They keep him medicated for over a year. Let me tell you why that's important. When you're sentenced in the federal system, you have one year to file what's called a 2255. So if you do not file the 2255 within one year, so basically you have a 2255 is basically you're saying, hey, my lawyer was ineffective or there was a mistake with my sentencing. We need to correct this. It's basically like an appeal. You have one year you're allowed to file it. If you do not file it within one year of your sentencing, then your sentence becomes final and you cannot file a 2255, which means basically you have almost no way to correct your sentence. Now, Frank is a master at getting around these things. And that that's, by the way, that's called being time barred. So what ends up happening is, is, They keep him heavily medicated for over a year. Now, after a year, he finally convinces them to take him off the medication. And as they take him off the medication, and he starts to file his paperwork, he is now past the deadline to file a 2255. So Frank's 22-year sentence becomes final. And he's stuck with 22 years. So, you know, Frank being Frank, he immediately starts educating himself with the law and filing paperwork and, and studying and basically puts himself through like a master's course in law. And um, he ends up learning everything he can. He, he, he gets all these guys. He starts training all these inmates on, on the law. He starts teaching what they call a legal research class, which is it's, it's a, It's called an ACE course. It's an adult continuing education course. And it's, it's on how to research case law using the legal computers, how to write motions. He starts teaching these guys how to file motions, how to do everything. And he starts working to actively help other inmates while he's also filing his own paperwork in his own case, which is just constantly denied because he's time barred. And there are ways around it, but it's difficult. So that is Frank Amadeo. 
And if you're interested in reading the book, you should. I mean, there are situations that are the 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 ins and outs of the CIA coming in and out of his life. The I remember one time I heard this is funny. One time I had heard that Frank used to wear a Darth Vader helmet around the office. One time he actually came into a meeting, a board of directors meeting with the Darth Vader helmet on and conducted the entire meeting in the Darth Vader helmet. I mean, the guy is nuts. It's it's hilarious. I mean, that that to me, and I didn't believe that. I thought that's just bullshit. I don't think that's true. Listen, I got the transcripts from his sentencing and one of the board of directors, a woman who was a lawyer, um, Edie, her name was Edie something. She talks about how she was at a meeting when Frank came in wearing the, wearing the Darth Vader helmet. This is when they're talking to her about him being mentally incompetent. And, and she's like, well, he did conduct a meeting in a Darth Vader helmet one time. That was a little weird. So, um, the the whole book is just it's it's amazing it's an amazing book it's an amazing story i had originally been sentenced to 26 years and 4 months i got it reduced to 19 years and changed like a few months like um 19 years 6 months maybe. basically i got like 6 7 years off i got 7 years off my sentence and but i'm still back i went i ended up back at coleman and i ended up back at coleman and you know i talked to frank uh, who I just, in the last video, I just told his story, how Frank ended up in prison, Frank Amadeo. And I said, Frank, man, listen, you know, I appreciate you, you know, I appreciate you, um, you know, helping me and everything, but, you know, still got a lot of time. So he was like, yeah, something will happen, you know, we're, we're, you know, something will happen. It will, I remember he said, um, he said, the uh, we're going to have to eat this elephant one spoonful at a time, like, We'll get you another reduction, kind of like we'll we'll keep working on it. So okay, so you know I'm kind of hanging out. This is in 2000, so in early 2000, maybe maybe late 2014, probably late 2014. I ended up I'm walking around the uh, the compound in Coleman Low, the low security prison. I'm walking around the compound with a guy named Ron. Wilson, Ronnie Wilson. You can look him up. Uh, he was a Ponzi schemer, uh, and he um, he had run a Ponzi scheme for f I want to say fifty seven million dollars. Uh, I think it brought in a hundred million, paid back out like forty some odd million dollars, and he personally netted himself spent 40 or 57 million dollars like it lost 57 million dollars he just stole money and if you don't know what a ponzi scheme is a ponzi scheme is when new investors invest with someone like let's say they give you a thousand dollars and you tell them i'm going to make you 50 percent on that thousand dollars in one year so or in whatever time frame so then as you show up six months later or a year later and you say, hey, I am I gave you $1,000. I now should have 1000 or $1,500. I want my $1,500. Now, you didn't really invest that money. So how do you pay them the $1,500? Because you're continually telling people, you're, give me your money and I will earn you money. I'll do something with it. And so when the old investors show up and want their dividends, or their royalties, or their interest payment, or their profits, you've been taking in money from other new investors, and you can use that new investor money to pay the old investors. That's actually, it's a great scheme, and it, you can run it for a long period of time, but at some point, it obviously collapses. You know, it's a pyramid-style an upside down pyramid where eventually it's just there's so much weight it just collapses on itself because you can't you just can't take in enough money to continually continually pay it out you know so bernie madoff couldn't do it charles ponzi couldn't do it um sam sam israel couldn't do it you know there, there's so many ponzi schemes are always running people are and then they're illegal so this guy ron wilson ran a ponzi scheme and ron wilson 
his Ponzi scheme collapsed and there was a $57 million lost. So I'm walking around the compound with him, right? Like he's in my, my housing unit at, at Coleman. And I remember, it's funny because I remember meeting Ron and I remember he was standing there. He'd gotten there that day. He'd been given a cell and we were all standing in front of the, the front door in the unit. There's about 180 guys in the unit. We're all standing there and he's a white guy, older white guy. And some of the white guys come up to me and they go, Cox, Cox. And I go, yeah, what's up? And they go, go talk to that guy. And they're looking at him and I went, Why? And they go, they want, I want to know if he's a chomo. So they wanted to know if he was a sex offender, a, a child molester. And I remember looking at Ron and going, no, nah, no, nah, he's, he's here for fraud. And they went, man, why you say that? I said, no, nah, he's here for fraud. I can tell the way he held himself. I knew he was there for fraud. And it's funny because the guy I was talking to was just Kenny King. Kenny King goes, yeah, man, he said he ran a, um, uh, shoot, um, like a, a scheme, some kind of, I go, Ponzi scheme? And he goes, a Ponzi scheme, said he was running a Ponzi scheme. And I said, oh, okay. So I go over and I talk to him. I said, hey, I hear you're here for fraud. And he goes, yeah, he goes, uh, I'm here for, and he tells me I'm here, I'm here for running a Ponzi scheme. And what, what Wilson's Ponzi scheme was this. Wilson had legitimately owned, um, a, uh, it's like a golden bullion, right? Like a golden or no, precious metals, and a bullion dealership where basically it's a precious metals um, dealership or dealership, a precious metals um, company where you would come in and you could buy precious metals from him, right? Like you could buy whatever, gold, silver, um, platinum, whatever, whatever you want to buy, he would sell it to you. So, and they charge like, one and a half percent. So you buy a hundred thousand dollars. He makes 1500 bucks, whatever. But he also traded precious metals. So he would buy and sell it as it goes up and down. <clears throat> and he had done that for years successfully, you know, made okay money at it. Well, one day he said he just, after doing it for like 10 years, he decided he had a bunch of stuff he wanted to do and he thought I could do everything I want to do right now if I just stopped buying the silver. Like people come to me, they give me $200,000 and I buy silver with it and I we wait till it goes up and we sell it. If I just, he has, these people never ask to see the silver. Like most of the silver is kept in a depository, a precious metal depository. So he never gets the silver. It's just kept in like a bank. And so he thought, if these guys are giving me money, and I, I could just stop buying the silver. So he thought about that and he thought, that's what I'm going to do. And I, why he did this, I don't know. He was doing okay. He said he wasn't making, you know, tons and tons of money, but he was doing okay. He lived in South Carolina. I don't know what doing okay in South Carolina means. Does that mean you're making 100,000 a year? Does that mean you're making 50 or 60? I don't know if it's making 400. He was, let's say he's making 100, 200,000 a year, whatever. So he's doing okay. He just suddenly stops. He starts, keeps taking in money and he just stops buying the silver. So you give him $100,000 and he just spends it. If you want your $100,000 back, he just takes $100,000 from somebody else and gives it to you. Because there's no way that everybody asked for their money back at once. I mean, that's what he assumed. So eventually, Ron Wilson's entire, he did this for 15 years, by the way. 15 years. He took in over $100 million. I think it's like 108 or $109 million, I forget exactly. And he basically, so he's also paying out money. So he brings in, let's say, $105 million. He paid out like 50 or 45, 46 million dollars. He paid out to people that had given him money and wanted their money back plus whatever they had made. So they give, he gives somebody, gives them 500,000. And two years later, they're like, hey, I'm supposed to have a million dollars by now. I want my million dollars. He gives them a million dollars, but it's not, it's somebody else's money. So, Eventually, what happened was Wilson had, Wilson did this for 15 years. 
he the last few years he now he'd been married he was married to a woman cassie or somebody um i forget her name his wife uh he had a big farm he had solar panels on the farm he had a, a farm like a uh he had a a, a a massive. It was a working farm. It was a real farm. He had a he had a big store where they sold all the farm goods. He had a what was called the heritage the heritage museum. So he had a museum that was set up um, that had all kinds of you know um, antiques in it. It was a big big huge uh, museum, something like twenty or thirty thousand uh, feet uh, or square feet. It was massive, you know, as museums are. So. What he did was Ron would go out and he would give seminars about buying precious metals. And he focused primarily on silver. So he would go out and he would do these um, these seminars. Well, what eventually he starts having an affair with this one woman. And I could tell you that whole story. Like I, I probably know a good portion of his story. I probably would be about 80, 85 percent accurate. Like some of some of stuff. I'm not sure. But. He ends up meeting this woman and he starts seeing this woman and she's a, um, a financial planner. So she's bringing him people. Eventually, a woman contacts Wilson. Her father had given him like $100,000. She contacts him and says, hey, my father gave you $100,000. I want the mo- that 100000 back. And this had been weeks earlier. And he was like, well... He gave me a hundred thousand dollars, like to invest in in silver. I'll give you the money back, but I have to sell the silver. And, and he's like, and on top of that, I need your father to sign something saying he wants the money back. Like I can't even really talk to you about it. And she's like, my father's seventy some odd years old. He doesn't know what he's doing. And he's like, well, I talked to him. He's pretty competent. He's invested with me before. I, I'm. You know, but if he signs a form, I'll get you your money back in 30 days or whatever. So now, of course, he hasn't got the money, but she throws such a fit about wanting the money back immediately. She ends up calling like the police and it it just it it ends up somehow or another. She raises such a stink. It ends up it ends up starting some kind of an investigation. Like somehow or another, and Wilson was like, and I never really understood, like the investigation gets going. And so they start to look into like, where is this silver, right? And Wilson puts up a little bit of a of a, a kind of a fight. Like he doesn't give in right away. And so that makes them even more suspicious. And as a result, uh, the Secret Service comes in and they start investigating and the whole thing starts to unravel. His girlfriend is nervous. His wife finds out that he's having an affair. So Wilson comes in one day with his lawyer and goes to the Secret Service. And he he goes in there and he meets with them. And he says, look, I've been running a Ponzi scheme. And now they arrest him. They let him out on bond right away. He meets with them. He goes and he digs up like, I want to say he digs up like $6 million in silver. Silver and cash. And gives that money over to the Secret Service. He ends up getting sentenced to 19 and a half years. Comes to Coleman, meets me. He and I are walking around the compound one day. I had just gotten back from getting my sentence reduced by seven years. So I'd just gotten back. <clears throat> Months earlier. He and I are, he knows why. He knows that I got my sentence reduced. He knows that I am more than willing to cooperate. I can't tell you how many times guys would come up to me and would say, hey, Cox, how much time you got? And I'd say, man, I got 26 years. I'd go, but, and I, I'd say, but somebody might fuck up and tell me where they, they buried a body and I'll be leaving next week. And they'd go, damn, bro, it's like that. And I'd go, it's like that. I didn't come here to make friends. I want out of here. So I would joke about it all the time. And Wilson would, would say, God, you don't seem to have a problem at all. You know, t- t- telling people that. And I was like, no, I don't. No, I didn't advertise it. I didn't walk around telling everybody. But people knew and, and I would joke about it. Well, Wilson, after he got indicted, he cooperated against several financial planners that he knew. 
So he knew several financial planners that had raised money for him um, and had were doing their own little kind of scheme. And so he was he was cooperating with the Secret Service or the U.S. Attorney's Office and the Secret Service to you know, against these guys. So we're walking around the compound. And I remember Wilson said to me, he I, I was like, well, hey, what, have you heard anything about that? How's that going? He goes, yeah, I've heard they they're doing this, they're doing that. They're going to they're going to ask me to come back and testify against these guys. And I said, oh, "Okay, that's good. You trust me. You want to testify. You want to testify. Like the, you become so important to them so that when they go to re- if, if the US attorney then turns around and says, "Hey, your honor, we want to reduce this guy's sentence because he helped us in a conviction of these two guys." That's great. Your honor, this inmate or this defendant told us about a crime and he he was interviewed we then arrested these guys and they pled guilty and went to prison that's great that's cooperation what's even better is if those guys then go to trial because then when they get in front of the judge they say your honor he cooperated we got an indictment we arrested the guys the guys then went to trial and this defendant testified against them in open court that puts you in a lot of danger not that you're not in danger for cooperating anyway because you are but if i got up in open court and i testified against this person and that person gets found guilty that is a that is an extreme amount of cooperation that is is definitely um considered uh of substantial assistance you really substantially assisted now you not that you don't always you're not substantially assisting but that there's just no way around that it's almost impossible for the u.s attorney to to try and kind of fuck you out of giving you a reduction if you actually testified and someone was found guilty like that's over the top um so wilson's like yeah he's, he's gonna have to testify and i was like that's great so time goes on we walk. We we walk around every night or two. We would walk around the compound, or we would go out to the rec yard and walk the track. We're walking the track one day, and he said, and I said, you know, I wonder how much, you know, how much time you'll get off. And he says, eh, he said, I don't think they're going to give me any time off. And I was like, what do you mean? He goes, yeah, I don't think they're going to give me any time off. He goes, they really hate my guts. And and even if I cooperate and they get a conviction, they're going to try and find a way to fuck me out of it. And I was like, I don't see how that's possible. And, and he goes, he said, yeah, well, you know, the problem, I said, they, they would need a specific reason. He goes, well, they have a reason. They think I've hidden Ponzi scheme money. They think I have money hidden that I didn't give them. And I go, I thought you gave them all the money. You dug up a bunch of money. Literally, when I say dug up, I mean, he took a shovel and dug like next to his house and dug a hole and dug up money that he had hidden there in these big aluminum um a- ammunition they uh, a- ammo comes in these big aluminum kind of uh like they look like a big sardine can type of things and these big he had actually had these huge ammo cans that he had wrapped up money and gold and stuck in the cans and buried these aluminum things in the ground I mean, really, so he really dug it up. So I try, I try just the, the image of that is just, it's so hilarious. So, um, and I said, well, the, you dug up the money, you gave him the money. And he goes, yeah, I know, but they, they don't think I gave him all of it. And I go, well, you did. And even if you didn't, I said, they would have to prove that. They would have to find the money or prove that you still had the money. So don't worry about it. And he was like, yeah, Th- listen, this, this went on and on. Months went by. So now we're into 2015, let's say. 2005, early 2015, Wilson says, as we're walking one day, he goes, they're going to fuck me out of this. And I looked at him and I went, why do you keep saying that, bro? I said, if they do, we'll get Frank to file a 2255 and we'll, get, we'll make him force them to give you a, a, a sentence reduction. And he goes, not if they find money. And I went, give it. You don't have any money. I said, you, they, you keep saying this money thing. I said, do you have money? Did you hide money? Are they going to find the money? And he looked at me and he goes, can I trust you? And I, I'm telling you right now, I looked at him and I go, probably not. 
And he just started laughing. He goes, <laughs> and he goes, I'm going to tell you something. He said, I, I, I did hide some money. I put some money away. I gave some money to my, my wife and some money to my brother to hold for me in case I, I get out of here. Now, Wilson is 64, 65 years old. He's like 65, 66 years old at this point. He's got a 19 and a half year sentence. There's probably a pretty good chance he's going to die in prison. No matter what, he's dying in prison. Not in great shape. Chunky, overweight, or fat. He was tubby, whatever you want to call it. Um, and I was just like, well, I said, I thought they'd talk to your wife. He goes, they did. I said, and she denied that she had any money. He goes, right. I said, well, then what are you worried about, bro? He goes, well, he said, they're in, my lawyer said that they are, and my daughter said that they are re-interviewing people. They call, they ask questions. Eventually, they're going to get to my wife. And I said, well, what are you worried about? She's already denied it. And he said, my, what I'm worried about is this. She now knows that I was having an affair. She's divorcing me. He said, I'm afraid that she'll tell them about the money just to fuck me out of getting a sentence reduction. And I thought, that's pretty possible, right? But I, I was like, she, they, she's already told them she doesn't have anything. Like she didn't turn in the money. Like she would be admitting to a federal crime. Who would do that? He goes, oh, she'd do it just to fuck me. I said, well, then you're screwed anyway. And he was like, eh, I, don't know, I don't know. So I remember I went back to bed, to the unit that night and I was laying in bed and I thought, is that enough to get a reduction? Like what this guy, this old Ponzi schemer. And by the way, listen, I'm, I'm a, I'll tell you right now, like this is a guy who stole from churches, pension funds, retirees. He stole from individuals. This is not a nice guy. Like I'm not betraying a nice guy. But with that said, I'd also like to say, had he been a 19 year old looking at a life sentence, I'd have cut his throat too. So I don't want you to think, oh, Matt's not a bad guy. He's cooperating against a guy that cooperated, a, a bad guy that stole money. I don't give a shit about that. I want out of fucking prison. This is his problem. So I'm laying in bed and I thought, who, like, is that enough? And, and they didn't want to give me a sentence reduction the first time, right? So they didn't want to give me a sentence reduction when I, I genuinely deserved one. They didn't want to. They fought me tooth and nail. If it weren't for Amadeo, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be here right now. So I sat there and I went, that's not enough. It's not enough. It's not even worth making a phone call. Like, what am I, what are they going to recover? I thought for sure they won't, they're not going to charge his wife and his brother. They're not going to charge them. And two, he told me the amount of money he had stolen was like, a, he gave it, he said his wife had 150,000 in cash and some precious, some precious metal. And his brother had $30,000. He said, so it's not even two, it's not even a couple grand. And I remember thinking, that's not enough. Like, like that's not enough to convince the, the U.S. attorney or the judge that I deserve my sentence reduced because I helped uncover this hidden money. And I know for that amount of money, they're not going to charge his ex-wife and his brother. So I'm thinking, it's not enough. It's not worth doing anything about. So I don't do anything. I don't say anything. Weeks go by. Maybe a month so let's say a month later, I happened to call my attorney because I had asked my attorney to order the transcripts from when I had gone up to Atlanta to get my sentence reduced. She'd never sent them. She said she had to wait till they were transcribed, right? You can't, you can't get them right away. So, but I'd never gotten them. So I called her up and said, hey, I never got my transcripts. Like I wanted to add some of the stuff that was said. I wrote a book, you know, I wrote, I have a book and I, I wanted to add that, that me going back up to, to Atlanta and getting my sentence reduced. I wanted to add some of the things that were said during that hearing, right? So it's only a couple of pages, maybe two or three pages about me going back up there and what was said, but I want to pull from the transcripts, right? 
directly. I want it because, you know, I don't remember verbatim what these people said. And if I have a, a copy of the transcripts, well, then you could get to, you get to do the whole quotes and the whole thing. And it's, it's just better. So I call her up and I ask her for the transcripts. And she says, look, man, I'll, I'll order them right now. And she said, I'll make a note and everything. And she says to me, so what's going on? And I go, what, what do you mean? And she said, anything going on in there? And what was so funny about this woman was she never wanted to talk to me. Like, this is a public defender. She's not interested in having a conversation with me. So, you know, she 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 didn't want to do much of anything, any you know, when she was being paid. Now she's not even being paid. And she said, anything going on in there? I was like, um, no, nothing, nothing. And she was, okay, well, I'll get those started. She, she said, let me know if there's anything you want to talk about or anything happening that you need me to look into. Or, And I remember thinking, this is weird. Maybe she was just having a slow day, but I remember I stopped and I go, you know what? I said, something happened a few weeks ago. I, and she goes, what's that? And I went, well, there's a guy here named Ron Wilson. And she goes, hold on, let me look him up. She looks him up. She goes, oh yeah, this is a bad guy. Why, what happened? And I went, he told me that he's actually hidden Ponzi scheme money. And she went, really? I said, yeah. And the, the Secret Service is investigating him still to this day, even though they got a conviction, they're still investigating. They're still looking for money. They're trying to re recover money. I mean, look, if this guy ripped your grandmother off or your mother for $300,000, then they're trying to get you, get the Secret Service is trying to get grandma's money back. So she goes, oh, this is a bad guy, Matt. This guy ripped off a lot of people. I said, yeah, I know. And she went, you know what? She said, you know where the money is. I said, I know who has the money. And she goes, how much money were we talking about? I said, not a lot. Like, like maybe, like not even 200,000. And she goes, let me make a phone call. She says, let me, do you know the name of his, his secret service agent? And I happen to name it. His secret service agent was, um, it was uh, Griffin. I want to say, I forget. The last name was definitely, it was Agent Griffin. I forget what his first name was. Anyway, she tells me, yeah, you know what? She said, let me make a phone call. I said, okay, well, um, send me an email or something. She goes, okay. And I hang up the phone. So I don't hear anything from her. I, like a week later, a, a, this a CEO came, comes up to me and he goes, hey, Cox. And I go, what's up? He goes, you need to go to SIS. SIS is where you go. Like they're like special invest, the special investigative um, services. They investigate the other, the BOP, the, the other police or the other correctional officers and they investigate like drug pro, you know, things within the prison, but they're not COs. Like they're like the FBI for inside of the BOP. And if you get called there, there's a reason. I actually got called there a lot because I was writing guys' stories. And so when I was writing someone's story, I would get, I would order the Freedom of Information Act and paperwork would get mailed in. But it's, so they're getting mail in that looks like legal work or people's arrest reports and their other inmates. Well, I'm not allowed to have other inmates' materials especially not legal work. And so I've got somebody's FBI report coming in or somebody's arrest report coming in. So they would end up, sometimes they would intercept it and they would call me and tell me to come get my, I go there and they go, what are you doing? You're getting this guy, John Boziak's fucking police report in. It's got a mugshot. Like, who is this? And I tell them, oh, this is, I'm writing a story. And I'd explain it to them. And because I'd been writing stories and I'd gotten guys in magazines and I had a book published at this point, they would go, Oh, okay. All right. Well, cool. Here. And they give it to me. So I get told to go to SIS. So I, I kind of think it's for like, what is it? Well, maybe it's for mail. I didn't know. So I go there. I go to um, SIS. I knock on the door. The lieutenant, the SIS lieutenant comes in, this big fat guy. He was a dickhead. He goes, come here. He goes, Cox. Yeah, come here. And I go, what's up? He goes, sit down. So I sit down. Now I think, fuck, I'm in trouble. Like now I'm worried. Now I might end up in the shoe or the special uh, special housing unit. So it's a hole. So I was like, fuck, what did I do? And he goes, sit down. And I sit down. And this guy's such a dick. So he picks up the phone. And he starts dialing a number. And he goes, yeah, yeah, this is this is Lieutenant so-and-so. Yeah, I got Cox right here. Hold on. He goes, here. And he hands me the phone. He goes, and I go, what's going on? He goes, talk. He goes, talk. I'm like, Jesus. So I go, yeah, who's this? And the guy goes, 
hey, this is uh, Agent Griffin with the uh, South Carolina Secret Service. He goes, I understand that you know where Ron Wilson buried or um, hid some money, hid Ponzi scheme money. And I went, oh, whoa. Like now I know what's happening. And I went, um, um, apparently my lawyer had called this guy and he was super excited and he immediately scheduled a time to get me separated from the other units in a place where he could talk to me. So I go, um, wait a second. I said, you know what, bro? Uh, I said, let me think about this. He goes, what do you know? I said, no, no, I know. But the last time I helped you guys out without anything in writing, I got fucked over. So I need you to write me a letter. And I need you to write me a letter that says that you will reduce my sentence if I can help recover Ponzi scheme money. I said, this isn't a lot of money, bro. Like, I'm not telling you, this isn't millions. This isn't even half a million. Okay, this is maybe a couple hundred thousand. And he goes, well, a couple hundred thousand would help. He said, so I, I will, I promise you, I will, you will get a reduction. And I went, no, that's the problem, bro. You as an FBI agent cannot promise me anything. Like, you don't, you don't have the ability to promise me anything. The only person that can promise this is the U.S. attorney. And I need the U.S. attorney to know that I'm working with you and I'm helping you to get my sentence reduced. So I need that letter. He goes, okay, all right, Cox, give me your email address. And I go, right. so I explain to him how the email system works and he gives me his email address and I have to get him approved, whatever. So then I leave. I go back to the unit and I get him approved and I send him an email. He sends me one back and he says he's working on it. And it takes about a week or two, about two weeks. And I don't do dick. Like I don't tell him nothing. So for two weeks, I wait. And then suddenly I get this email that says from the U.S. attorney that says if Cox and it says that they've spoken with the U.S. attorney in Atlanta. And it says that if Cox, if Matthew Cox helps recover a significant amount of money or gives us information that helps us recover money or get an in indictment on individuals, we will consider that substantial assistance and reduce this sentence. Now, that's the best you're going to get. That's not a promise. It's we'll consider it, which means we'll think about it. And then that's the way they get out of it. I had already had this happen multiple times where I say, hey, I did this, I did this. Well, you said you, you'd consider substantial assistance. And they said, well, we did consider it. And it's not. So I, I didn't, I knew that was the, but I, they're also not going to put it in a, they're not going to promise me anything. So I thought, yeah, that's the best I got. And I do have something in paper that says that they know and that they did kind of make this agreement. So in my opinion, it's an agreement. Um, so I then talked to the agent and I explained that Wilson told me his wife is holding money and his brother's holding money. The agent turns around and subpoenas multiple people. Okay. So he subpoenas multiple people. But the other thing that the agent does is he and another agent start emailing me on a regular basis, maybe two, three times. Sometimes it's three times a day. Sometimes it's once or twice a week, but asking me to ask Wilson questions. Like, can you find out what Wilson knows about this person? And so when I walk the track with Wilson, I would try and bring up a subject that would relate back to what they had asked me. Now, sometimes they ask me these super blatant questions that were like, there's no fucking way I can ask this. Like, what are you doing? I don't even know who this person is. There's no way for me to introduce this person into a conversation without sounding like I'm, I'm, I'm a fucking, um, I'm a fucking CI. I'm, 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 you know, I'm, I'm wired up. And it's so funny, too, because I'd ask them multiple times, why don't you just fucking send me a, a wire me up and have me talk to this guy? He openly talks about how he's working with all of these different people and this person helped and that person helped and where the money is and this and that. Why don't you? But they can't do that. They can't wire you up in prison. So and listen, that's like that. If I had done that, like that's like you get stabbed. Like I could have seriously gotten myself fucking hurt. Asking some vague questions that could be construed as being overly inquisitive is one thing. Wearing a wire on another inmate will get you fucking hurt. Well, but I was willing to do it because I thought maybe, you know, I could help myself here. So 
Wilson and I are walking around and I'd ask, I'd ask some basically some kinds of questions and we'd come back and then I'd send them an email and say, this is what he said. So that goes on for a few months. Well, eventually they interview his wife and his brother. You know what was so funny about that is there were, there were times when I was like, no, no, this is what happened. This is what he told me happened. They would come back and they'd say, he's lying to you. I remember one time he had told me about this, this, the chick that he was having an affair with. And he was super in love with this chick. So he was telling me about when he had met her, this, and she found out about the Ponzi scheme and he had done this and he had done that. And he met her here. And, and I was like, well, what sparked that conversation that she figured it out? Like, how did that happen? And he was like, well, and then he told me how it happened, that she wanted to invest money with me. And then I eventually had to tell her that the Ponzi scheme wasn't true. I'm sorry, that the, my investments aren't investments, that there is no trading. I'm not trading the silver. I'm not even buying the silver. I'm just spending the money. It's a Ponzi scheme. So she, he at some point tells her this. And so when I, and I tell them when it was and where it was, and they come back and they go, that's not true. I know, we know that's not true because you're saying that she got money from when her, they sold her mother's condo. And you're saying that her mother had a large amount of money also. And we know that's not true because there was no money. We would have seen the money. We would have seen the sale and we would have seen this. And so, but I knew the time frame. So I went back and I explained, look, it was one of the last times he was, because Wilson was also a city, uh, a, a council member, city council member. He said it was at this time, so it had to be on this day, and that was two days after that. Like I break it down on when it is, like it's at the end of September. So in the last part of September, they, she got money, her mother got money from a workman's comp claim, and they wanted to invest that money in um, in the Ponzi scheme, not knowing it was a Ponzi scheme. And I know because they met at the mother's condo and a, two weeks later they sold the condo and wanted to invest that money too. And so she was talking to him about the money. And the, so I had the exact time frame within two weeks. And so they go back and they check and they come back and they go, wow, we had no idea. Like we found out when the condo was sold. We found out when he had been. The, so it would have been in this time frame. In addition to this time frame, we also found that she, her mother did get a large workman's comp, like half a million dollars, large workman's comp payout. You know, like they were like, wow, you know, your information is spot on. So they asked me a bunch of stuff and I tried to help what I could. But, you know, some of the stuff was just ridiculous. Like I was like, you're gonna get me fucking killed asking me this shit. So I can't ask that. There's just no way. So there's some stuff that's just impossible. Well, eventually they get to the point where they've milked me and I've milked him for as much information as possible. And they call his, they call Wilson's wife in. Now, Wilson's wife hates his guts. She's in the middle of divorcing him. She's more disgusted by him, but for having an affair than having ripped off all of their friends and family and their church for 50 60 million dollars she's more upset because he's banging this fucking broad on the side than he's then he's a fucking ponzi schemer so she comes in and she says and they ask her a bunch of questions and she says i don't know what you're talking about i don't have any money and she leaves well she went home that night and she thought about it and she realized just how fucking much trouble she was in she got all the funds that she had together that he'd given her and she went back in and she gave them about 350 to $400,000 way more than he told me she had 150,000 in a combination of cash and precious metals. She had like 300,000 in cash plus gold bullion and all kinds of fucking shit. So she fucking throws down 350 to 400,000. And says, here, I didn't return this, give this to you yesterday. I was scared. I didn't know what to say. But here's the money. I do have money. This is everything I have. That was it. The next day or a couple of days later, his brother comes in with his lawyer, walks in to meet with the US, or with the Secret Service, walks in, sits down and says, before we get started, I'd like to hand, I'd like to give you something that 
my brother gave me and hands them 150,000 in cash, not 30, 150,000 in cash. So it's over half a million dollars that they've recovered because because I, I sp- because I spoke with them, because I happened to mention to my lawyer. So they re-indict Wilson. He gets put on a bus. And you have to think, I, I know he's been indicted. Like literally, I know he's been indicted days before he's been indicted. They tell me he's been indicted. He's going to find out in the next couple of days. You know, let us know what he says. And so, you know, he one day comes up to me, he goes, well, they, they indicted me. I'm like what? He's like, they indicted me. I go, for what? My fucking wife turned in a bunch of money. My brother turned in a bunch of money. And I went, the money you gave him? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So half about half a million dollars. I went, half of, I thought you said you gave her like a hundred thousand or a hundred. What'd you say you gave her? Like a hundred grand. He goes, no, I told, I, I think I told you 150,000 or something. He said, I didn't know. I didn't think I could trust you. I didn't know what to say. I didn't want to tell you the exact amount, but yeah, yeah. She turned in all this money. And it, I was like, holy shit. And I go, he goes, what do you think is going to happen? I go, you're fucked, bro. Like you're fucked. And so I was like, Jesus. And he goes, I said, um, he goes, what do you think I should do? And I went, I think you should go to trial. <laughs> If you go to trial, I get to testify at the fucking trial. <laughs> like, you got to go to trial, bro. I said, you need to go to trial. You need to go to trial. I, if I was, I said, you need to go to trial and say, you don't know what your fucking wife took. You don't know what your brother took. Like, sounds like they were fucking stealing from you. Like, I would go to trial. I got to make these fuckers work for it. There's a good chance you get off altogether. And <laughs> I'm thinking, and I'm thinking, huh? Huh? I said, what do you have to lose? Fuck these guys. Because he was big on fuck the government. He hated the government, right? Like, he hates them. He hates them because they caught him. And he's like, oh, these motherfucking bastards. These. And I'm like, you gotta go to trial, bro. So, <laughs> anyway, he gets on the bus a couple days later. He goes uh, back to South Carolina. He gets there. It turns out he, he just takes a plea. He pleads guilty. Fucking pussy jerk off he should have gone to trial so he goes to or he 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 pleads guilty he gets six more months can you believe that he pled guilty to lying to an fbi agent i think it was lying to an fbi agent and obstruction of justice his wife and his um his wife and his his wife and his um brother end up getting um they both get obstruction of justice his wife gets a year, a year probation, and she has to do like 50 hours community service. His brother, because he never lied to anybody, he had never been asked. He walked in and just gave him the money. So they're like, eh, 50 hours community service, no probation. Like he didn't have anything. I don't think either one of these people even got a felony. Neither one of them did over a year. Um, of uh of of paper so i think that it was like a slap on the wrist or maybe they got a felony i don't know either way they didn't they didn't do any jail time wilson got six months added on he has 19 and a half years and he got six more months so it bumped it up to 20 years so my first thought is you know wow like that's that's not good like they gave this guy six more months. They recovered half a million dollars, but they only gave him six months. Like, I don't think they're going to give me anything. And sure enough, a month goes by, two months go by, three months go by. I mail a letter to the U.S. attorney. Hey, where's my sentence reduction? What's going on? I send him copies of like, you know, the email or not the copies of the email. I just sent him, uh, like I, I sent him, I basically, cause I didn't send him a, I don't know. No, I did. I sent him a copy of the email. Hey, you guys said this. I need my sentence reduced. What's going on? Just nothing. Then I end up calling the secret service agent and he tells me, look, I don't know what's happening. I put in, he says, I put in a request for you to have a reduction, but I can't file it. The U.S. attorney has to file it and there's just nothing I can do. And I go, I want a copy of that reduction or that request. Can you send it to me? And he said, Matt, I'm sorry, I can't. Keep in mind, 
prior to this, when I had spoken with him, he'd promised me he was going to, one, get me a reduction. Two, he promised he would send me a copy of his request for a reduction. Now he said he can't. He was told he wasn't allowed to release it to me. So now I know. And I said, who said that? He said, I really would prefer not to say. So now I know that the U.S. attorney is trying to not reduce my sentence. So I go to Frank and I explain it to Frank. Here's what's happening. Talk to Frank about it. Frank goes, okay. He says, how many emails do you have? I had like 110 emails back and forth, back and forth over the course of six months, eight months. So I go through them and I show them to him, to him and he's like, well, okay, yeah, this is definitely cooperation. And then I show him the one letter that where they promised or they, they agreed that they would re- do it. And he goes, oh, wow. So he files a 2255 on my behalf in late 2015. <clears throat> the U.S. A- attorney responds to, so the the judge gets it, and the judge in my case says, tells the U.S. attorney, you need to respond to this. Like, this is what this guy's saying. Is this true? They come back and say, your honor, we don't know what he's talking about. We ha- don't know that we're, we're not working with Mr. Cox. We don't know of any, uh, we don't know of any agreement. So I then respond to that by sending a copy of the letter. The judge comes back and says, wow, like you guys need to respond to this. So they respond and they say that they're looking into it. But regardless, Mr. Cox is time barred. It has been more than a year since his since his initial sentence. So he cannot file a motion. He cannot he cannot ask for a reduction. He cannot ask to remove his plea. He cannot, like, like he can't file any of this. You need to dismiss this. So the judge says, listen, it has been more than a year. Now, I argue what's called equitable tolling. I argue that every time that they've asked me to do something, it extends my year. And that's a loose argument. It's it's a very weak argument. And in some in some. Some districts, they, they, they actually will allow this, but not in the district. The middle district of Georgia, I'm sorry, the northern district of Georgia, which is where I was, is a notoriously closed-minded system, and they, they refuse to acknowledge that. So the judge says, look, I don't believe that I have the right to, to rule on this, so I'm going to allow you to appeal it. And there's something called a certificate of eligibility or certificate of eligibility to appeal. You have to basically prove that you have a case to win a certificate of eligibility the, in order to appeal his decision. So, but the judge says, I am waiving the certificate of eligibility. Also, I have to pay $500. He says that I'm waiving the fee. And I am, ask, and I am allowing Mr. Cox to, to, um, to appeal this to the appellate court. So that's basically telling the appellate court like in legal jargon, like they have these little things that they do to kind of give messages to each other. That's basically telling the, that is basically telling the appellate court that if it's possible, he wants to rule on it, but he needs their permission. And so we file a motion. And as soon as we file the mo- a motion, the appeal, immediately the, the U.S. attorney comes in my U.S. attorney comes in and he files a Rule 35, a, a, a request for a sentence reduction. So he requests that I get my sentence reduced by one level, which would have been at that point, at the levels I was, at the as low as I was, would have been like 21 months. Because every time, every level that comes off, it's less. So if he had asked for two levels, one level would have been 21. The next one would have been probably 19 months. So 21 months off, next one would be like 19 months off. Next one might be 17 months off. Like they continually get lower. So at the remaining levels that I had, that I was serving, that was like 21 months. So he says, hey, give him 21 months off. And I'm like, the fuck you? Like, what the hell? So I go to Frank and me, as soon as I get this letter in the mail, it's like a Monday or no. Yeah, no, no. It was a, it was like a, a Tuesday or a Wednesday. It had been mailed out Monday and I got it Wednesday. So I get it, 
go to Frank, show it to him. And Frank go, and I go, Frank, what if the judge rules on this? If the f- judge rules on this, you're fucked. But ju- Frank didn't say fuck because he didn't cuss. He goes, oh, no, you're, you're screwed. You're screwed. No, we, we can't let the judge rule on this. I go, well, he, he they filed it. He's, they filed it. He's going to sign it. And he said, no, I think your judge will wait. But regardless, we're going to get something in the motion into the mail right now. So he immediately filed, types out a motion for me and we get it in the mail the next day. So they get it by Friday. So it was in the mail that night, but I think it goes out the next day. So they got it by Friday or Monday. By Tuesday, what Frank has asked for is he says he wants to stay on the motion. He wants to be able, he's asking for me to get an evidentiary hearing so that I can present evidence to the court for the amount of cooperation that I've given, which exceeds a one level reduction. Now, the judge rules on it immediately. The judge says, boom, I'm staying all proceedings. I'm ordering an evidentiary hearing and I am requesting and I am I am giving Mr. Cox an attorney. So they give me an attorney. The attorney flies down. She comes in. She meets me at the attorney client um, conference room, which is in the visitation area. I go down there. This takes place over the course of months. So she, by the time she flies down, she flies down. I walk in. I meet her. Her name is Leanne. I want to say her name's Leanne. She comes down. Leanne something. I don't remember. Anyway, she comes in and Leanne sits down and she, and she says, you know, we introduce each other and she says, listen, I've read your motion and it's well written and everything, but you don't have a, a prayer. Like You don't have a chance of winning this. You, you're going to lose this at the appellate level. And I went, well, if I don't have a prayer of winning, then why did, why are you here? Because she came to negotiate with me between me and the U.S. attorney to try and get more time off. U.S. attorney said one month, I said one level, and we wanted more. And so she says, I said, I mean, think about it. If they could crush me so easy, why are you here? Why don't? They don't, why don't they, why are they offering? Cause they were now offering like two levels and she goes, well, I mean, I, I said, why wouldn't they just say, fuck you Cox and let it go forward and, and beat me at the pillow level. I said, you're here because they think I might win. And she went, well, I don't think you could have a chance of winning. I said, well, if that's the case, then why are you here? Why wouldn't they say, don't even fly down and see him. We're not going to give him nothing. She thought about that and she said, I don't, I don't know. She said, what do you, what do you want to do? I said, well, Frank told me to tell you that I won't accept to, that we want to ask for five levels off. If I don't get five levels off, that I'm going to appe- continue with the appeal. And she says five levels. I said, yeah, ask for five levels. I'm hope we're hope. I said, no, I said four. I said, ask, we're asking for four levels. I won't take less than four levels. That's it. And she goes, okay. I said, also, I need you to put in a motion to start getting evidence. So I want to have an evidentiary hearing in front of the judge. And what I want to do is I want to have an evidentiary hearing with all, with the secret service agents. I want them to be um, subpoenaed. I want the FBI agents that initially investigated my crime in Florida. And I want the secret service that investigated me in Atlanta. So I want everybody there. And I want to see all of my documents in my personal case and all the documents in, in Wilson's case. And she is, Matt, that's got to be 10, 20, 30,000 pages. I went, yeah, I know. She said, that'll take months. I said, it'll take months and thousands and thousands of dollars and manpower too. Thousands of dollars of manpower. She says, what do you want to do? She says, you want to subpoena all these people? She says, what do you want to do? Turn this into a circus? I go, that's exactly what I want to do. I want to make this as fucking painful as possible. And I said, I'm just trying to bluff them into giving me more time. And if they think that I'm going to have six federal agents show up, plus the U.S. attorney for the Southern District, plus I want 30,000 documents, they're going to bend. And I said, and, and I said, that's what, and she goes, I said, that's what Frank said to do. She goes, who's Frank? And I explained, Frank is a bipolar disbarred attorney that believes he's going to be emperor of the world and he's doing all my legal work. And she says, you have an incompetent attorney. I said, he's not incompetent. 
I said he just thinks that God wants him to be emperor of the world. Doesn't seem to affect his legal work. And Frank is what got me here. And if Frank's so nut, and she goes, that's insane. I go, if he's so insane, I said, what are you doing here? I said, she goes, why would you hire this guy? I said, I didn't hire him. He did it for free. And I said, and I let him work on my legal work because all the sane attorneys that I contacted on the street told me I could never get the, a sentence reduction, that it was un, impossible to force the government to reduce your sentence. I said, and yet I've already done it once and I'm doing it again. And she went, Wow. She said, that's crazy. I said, yeah, it's crazy. And she goes, okay, I'll go back to the government, but I don't think they're going to do that. And I said, well, we'll see. She goes back. Months later, we go back and forth, back and forth. Months later, they come back and they say, two level. They'll give you two levels. That's it. I said, send them the motion telling them, draft the motion, send it to them, telling them all the things you want and tell them that you're going to file it with the court. You don't have to file it. Just send it to them. Draft it. Call them up and you don't even have to draft it. Call them up and ask them like, hey, by the way, what's the name of the Secret Service agent here and there? Oh, by the way, since that time, we I ordered a Freedom of Information Act and I, got, I, I ordered a Freedom of Information Act and I got a copy of the paperwork that the Secret Service agent had sent to the U.S. attorney requesting I get a sentence reduction. So we now can include that, telling the judge the Secret Service thinks I need a reduction. And they said it was substantial. And like, we, because the, the U.S. attorney had actually said in one of their motions that Cox didn't cooperate. He, he cooperated, but his cooperation did not yield much of a result. So when I send them the thing with a Secret Service agent, it's like three or four pages talking about how much I cooperated, how I, there was no investigation. They had nothing until I came on. I was their sole witness. I was, I mean, it was just overwhelming. And they were covered half a million dollars and that he deserves this. I mean, so it's like they're saying, oh, the Secret Service said he barely helped at all. Secret Service documents said, like, they're just catching them lying left and right. Um, so we get that in. They now know we have that. She goes to them and says he wants to see the Secret Service agent, these two agents, these Secret Service agent, this Secret Service agent, this FBI agent, this FBI agent. He wants to subpoena the U.S. attorney um, I'm from the Southern District of, of South Carolina. Middle District? Uh, whatever, South Carolina. And so the, US attorney, so the U.S. attorney in Atlanta comes back and they say three levels. We'll give them three levels. So I, I call up. Leanne, I said, hey, what's up? She goes, they said three levels. They'll give you three levels. And she goes, so I'm going to go ahead and put the motion in and schedule the the evidentiary hearing. And I went, no, 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 I'll take the three levels. She goes, what? why? She goes, you said you would only accept four levels. I said, no, 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 Frank said to tell you I'd only accept four levels. We always, we never wanted more than three. Three's fine. And she goes, um, okay, all right then. So she tells the U.S. attorney three levels is fine. They put in a motion. I did not go back to court that time because I didn't want to because there I could only hurt myself. At that point, they're saying three levels. We're saying three levels. I know the judge is going to give me three levels. Like if I went back to court, I could only hurt myself. So what happens is they give me three levels off. That three levels basically was five years off my sentence. So I got one sentence reduction for seven years. And I talked about that in another video. And I got another sentence for five, or another sentence reduction for five years. Now, here's what's funny about that is that keep in mind that Wilson, when he went back to South Carolina, he got his discovery. In his discovery, he got Um, a list of all of the emails that I'd sent. He got everything that showed that I had cooperated against him. So, you know, he was furious. He's furious. Initially, he's upset and he mailed a letter back to the prison to, um, to his old roommate and it all saying that you know, um, basically what had happened. And so I remember going to uh, people, then people start telling me about this letter that he, this guy's walking around showing it to everybody. So I end up going to his roommate and I tell his roommate, 
if one more fucking person tells me about this letter that you've got and you're showing everybody, I said, I'm going to go into the lieutenant's office and I'm going to tell them that I'm in danger that you're here. And I said, they're not going to ship me anywhere, but they're going to ship you to FDI or FCI Baghdad. You're never going to fucking see your family again because this guy's family lived in the area. They'd actually move there to be near him. And I said, don't, I said, if I have one more fucking person tell me about this letter. And he's like, and I said, now are you going to get rid of it? He goes, yeah. I said, anybody else going to come out? He goes, no. I said, okay. That was it. Second thing that happened was I was wait about two, three months after that, maybe six months after that, I'm standing there at count. And there was a new guy who just gotten there that day. And he actually happened to be in the, in the, in the cell across from me. So I'm waiting for count for the guards to come around and count everybody. I'm standing at my cell, just standing there. And there's this black guy who's standing there. We'll just stand there waiting for the guards to walk by. And, you know, they haven't started counting yet. So there's a little bit of chatter, but not a lot. And so the black guy looks at me and he goes, hey, man. I said, yeah, what's up? He said, how long you been here? I was like, oh, I don't know. I've been there like fucking, it's been like 10 years or something. I don't know. I said, why? What's up? He said, man. Now, keep in mind, this is a black guy and I'm a white guy. And there's not a lot of white guys. Like most of the white guys know each other. There's only 1,800 people in this prison. Most of them are black and Hispanic. So, you know, you want to find a white guy, you ask and, oh, another white guy. So he looks at me and he goes, yo, man, he said, uh, uh, you know, a guy named, named, uh, uh, Matt Cox. And I looked at him and I went, yeah, I know him. And he goes, okay. He said, I need to talk to him. I said, about what? He said, I just need to talk to him. And so I pull my ID out and I hold it up to him and I go, I'm Matt Cox. And he goes, oh man, oh shit. I said, what's up? He said, you know a guy? And he kind of looks around. You know a guy named Ronnie Wilson? I said, yeah, I know Ronnie Wilson. And he goes, uh, he told me to give you a message. And I go, what's that? And he goes, he told me to let you know that he understands what happened. He said to tell you that he hopes you get as much time off your sentence as you can and he'd have done the same thing to you now keep in mind by this point i've already been had my sentence reduced and i was like oh okay because see he was in south carolina with ron wilson and i looked at him and i went is this going to be an issue for you and i he goes nah man nah it ain't gonna be an issue he said listen bro he goes i got three or four years he goes but i tell you right now I'm going to be out of here in six months. He goes, you know what I'm saying? I said, yeah, I know what you're saying. He goes, all right, all right. And he goes, oh, yeah, one more thing Wilson said. I go, what's that? He goes, Wilson said to let you know he's at peace and he found Jesus. I said, okay, okay. Which was, you know, weird, a little weird. I don't know if he found Jesus. I don't know what happened. I don't know what that was about, but apparently he wanted me to know that he'd found Jesus. Now, here's another interesting thing before I wrap this whole thing. Um, Ron Wilson is not in prison anymore. When COVID came, Ron Wilson was released. Ron Wilson had 20 years. He did about six years. Ron Wilson is at home and he lives with his daughter in South Carolina. He did six years. That's all he did on a 20 year sentence. So he got out on COVID. He's at home. I thought about looking him up. I bet Ron Wilson would have no problem at all talking to me. Ron Wilson loved me. And Ron Wilson would have cut my throat without hesitation. That old man would have cut my head clean off my body with a nail file to get out of prison. So I'm not worried about it. I'd actually probably go have lunch with Lauren Wilson. I don't think he can have lunch because he's probably on an ankle monitor. But regardless, I like the old guy. So I ended up getting my sentence reduced. And uh, at that point, I really had very little time left. I had like a year or two years left. And I thought I was going to get halfway house. And at that point, the Bureau of Prison starts threatening to send me to a camp. So I'm at the low and now they want to send me to a camp, but I don't want to go to a camp because my mother comes to see me every two weeks. 
And I didn't, you know, my mom had had a stroke and I thought if they moved me, the closest camp was Miami. If they sent me to Miami, I mean, that's like a four hour drive. She can't go four hours like that. That'd kill her. So I was concerned and I didn't want to be moved. Uh, but before we get into that, let me go ahead and mention that I, I paint paintings. Uh, I also have a Patreon account. If you'd like to join the Patreon and support, you know, videos like this. The third thing I'd like to also mention is that YouTube has a new feature, which is the thank you button. And if you go to the bar where you see the little, um, the little like thumb, you know, thumbs up, thumbs down. If you scroll that bar sideways, you'll see a button that says thank you and allows you to actually thank me for making videos and actually donate to the, to the channel to support, you know, videos like this. And I think you can donate like a dollar 99 or two 99, four 99, that sort of thing. Uh, I, I, man, I, Appreciate anything you could donate. That's fine. All right. So here's where we're at. I was locked up in Coleman with Coleman, you know, the prison, the low security prison. And I'd gotten my sentence reduced twice. But my counselor came to me. So I had about two years left. Let's say two years. I forget exactly what the amount was. And and I, I felt pretty secure because I'd done so much time at this point. I'd done about... 11 years that I felt like I was for sure going to get a year worth of halfway house. Like I was like, Oh, I'm definitely getting a year worth of halfway house. Like I knew guys that had done three or four years and gotten like a year halfway house. So I felt confident about that. And I felt like I had a year left and my counselor comes to me one day and he says, no, it's not, it's not a, he, she says, she says, listen, there's a big push to move people to camps and your sentence was reduced. And as a result of it being reduced, we, I have to send you to a camp. And I was like, whoa, 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 you can't send me to a camp. I'm going into RDAP. Now, I didn't really want to go to RDAP. RDAP does give you the RDAP program. It's called the it's the residential uh, um, residential drug Anyway, it's the residential drug abuse program. And so residential, because what they do is they move you from whatever housing facility you're in, like in within the prison, you're at a you're being housed in, let's say, B unit or A unit or whatever. They move you into an actual unit that is just for uh, it, it's it's just for uh, for people that are in that program. So it's residential, meaning you have to live there, and it's a drug uh, abuse program. Well, you know, it's a drug program, but really they they don't really have it. It really has nothing to do with drugs. It's really about it's really about uh, criminal thinking and uh, um, just thinking errors in general. Honestly, we we almost never talked about drugs at all, and I don't have a drug problem. So all I what I did was. I had heard when I was locked up, initially, when I initially got locked up, just before you get sentenced, they send a probation officer to talk to you. And when the probation officer talks to you, one of the questions he asks you, because they prepare a doc, they prepare something to give to the judge to kind of tell them like who you are and about your background. So he can take those things into consideration when he's sentencing you, not that they do, but all of the guys in, in prison were telling me, Matt, listen, if you want to get a year off, you need to tell them that you had a drug problem. So I told, I told um, the probation officer I had a drug program that I was, that I had been, uh, I said I was hooked on uh, oxycodone. And that's what all the guys told me. And I told him that and he put it in there. So when I got sentenced, the judge told the Bureau of Prisons, this guy needs to be eligible to go into the RDAP program and get a year off the program. So if you pass the program, you get a year off. Now, here's the problem. By the time I was going to go in the program, it's a nine-month program. You have to do nine months in the program, and then you have to get four months halfway house. So I felt like, look, even if I go in the program and I finish it, I'm not going to have, I may have just enough time to get, let's say I get the four months of halfway house, but my fear was I would only get four months halfway house. And as a result of only getting four months halfway house, I wouldn't have enough time in the halfway house to save enough money to get my own apartment, my own car, that sort of thing. Because I, I really did feel like, like I had like no support from my family when I was locked up. 
Uh, my mom sent me money, but the bulk of the money that my mother was sending me was money that I had made while I was incarcerated writing guys' stories and selling optioning their life rights and the story life rights. So I was getting money for that. And I, you know, I, I, and my mother would send me a little bit of money too. So I wasn't getting a lot of money. And of course my mom was in uh you know, she was living in a retirement home. And so I didn't feel like I, it was just nowhere for me to go. So I really needed to stay in the halfway house as long as possible to save as much money so that I get myself back on my feet. I didn't know what I was going to be able to do for a living. I was very worried about that. Um, my brother is not in a position to help me. My, I had my one sibling, sis, my other sister, she's not in a position to help me. And my other sister, I didn't think would be willing to help me at all. And, and I wasn't willing to ask her. So, and my mother wasn't in a financial position to help me. Like nobody was in a position to help me. And I had really almost no money. You know, I, I was, had barely any money. And I keep in mind, my prison job pays me. At this point, maybe 15 to $20 a month. So that's no money. So when my counselor comes to me and says, look, Matt, we're going to send you to a camp. You have less than two years or you have roughly two years to go. We're sending you to a camp. I said, I, you can't send me to a camp. I'm going into RDAP. Well, RDAP, they don't have the RDAP program at all the camps. But they had it at the prison I was at. So I and they were like, oh, OK, well, when are you planning on going? And I said, look, I'm supposed to meet with Dr. Smith. Dr. Smith is the woman that runs the RDAP program in, in uh, the low at Coleman. And I said, I'm supposed to meet with Dr. Smith next week. And my counselor was like, oh, OK, well, that's cool. Let me know how that goes. So I'll hold off on putting you in for a camp. I immediately go to the computer, fill out a request to meet with Dr. Smith to be placed in the RDAP program explained to her that I it, the judge had recommended it and said I needed to meet with her as soon as possible. I didn't actually meet with her for probably a couple of weeks. So two, three weeks later, I, I'm i called into the office. I go in. She reads my pre-sentence report. She sees that the judge recommended that I go. She asked me, you know, if I if I was willing to sign in the program, I said, yes, I am willing to sign in the program. Now, the reason I wanted to sign in the program also, by the way, so here's the big thing. When you enter into a program like that, like the RDAP program, they also have something called, it was called the free program. If you enter into these kind of these programs that are offered by the Bureau of Prison, um, they put what's called a hold on you. And so you're, you're held at one institution where they don't move you until you're complete, until you complete the program. The thing is, each time they put a hold on you, it's for a year. So every year they have to refile to hold you there. So as soon as I knew, as soon as I went in the, in the RDAP program, I knew within a month or two, they put a hold on me. Well, I go to the program. I sign in the program. I go in there. Um, I'm, I'm, I move from, you know, the, I was in B, I think I was in B4, B3 or B4. I was in unit B4 and I moved to, I want to say it's called, it's A, A2. So I was in B4, they moved me to A2. A2 is the RDAP program. I get placed in a cell with a couple of guys. One of the guys' name was, uh, one of them was a guy named Ledford and one of the guys was, his name was, uh, Dave. Uh, Dave had one arm. Uh, Dave had lost his arm. He was on, I want to say it was acid or LSD or something when he was younger and he was driving like a truck. And so he's driving and he passes out with his arm hanging out the window and he, the truck drives off the road and it hits, it sucks, it goes, slides up against a tree. So it kind of, you know, slides along the, uh, a, a tree and his arm gets yanked off. It actually was hanging. He said, well, it didn't get really yanked off. He said it was kind of hanging by just like the tendons, but he couldn't move it or anything. So he kind of grabs his arm. He wakes up, grabs his arm. His girlfriend is beside him and she's flipped out, crying and screaming. He drives himself to the emergency room and gets out and then you know they go in there and the doctors look at it and they're like like there's nothing we can do and they just snip the cords and he lost his arm uh dave was in there for selling meth ledford i want to say ledford was in there for selling meth also 
I don't know for sure. He got a life sentence. He had done like 15 years or something like that, 10, 15 years. And he had a life sentence and the judge, no, I'm sorry. Um, he, his lawyer had put in for, um, to have his sentence commuted and Obama had commuted his sentence to like 20 years or 15 or 20 years. And so as a result, he went in, he was moved from the pen to the low. He went into the drug program. He had to complete the drug program before they let him out. So he was, those were my two sellies for the first part of RDAP. So I start going to RDAP and I, I, you have to understand, I, I, I didn't need to go through the program. Like everybody that was there, they were getting like the year off, but I didn't need the year off. Like I didn't want the year off because I wanted as much halfway house. And if you actually did the, did the math, me getting a year halfway house was better for me, even though I had to do a couple more months in prison, didn't really matter. Now, the reason I didn't want to get moved, like I said, I, I don't know if I mentioned this, the reason I didn't want to get moved to a camp was because my mother was coming to see me every two weeks. And I knew if I got moved to a camp, I would never see her again. Like she can't drive. The closest camp is four and a half, about four, four and a half hours away in Miami. And there's just no way I'm going to get moved there. And she's going to be able to come see me. And my sister and my brother basically said like my mom was in her 80s at the time, like 87, 88 years old. I think she's 88. Anyway, she was about 87, 88 years old at that time. And they were like, listen, the only, the reason she's hanging on is for you to get out of prison. So I felt like if like she lived to come see me every two weeks. So I thought if I get moved and she's not going to see me for a couple of years, like she's not going to make it. So I went into RDAP and I start taking the program. And I mean, it's, it honestly was not like, it wasn't difficult because there's different phases of the program. You graduate, you know, there's like a phase one, phase two, phase, I think there's four phases. So I sail through the phase one because phase one is you're just working in a book and you're answering questions. And you have to understand too that because I didn't care whether I graduated or not, unlike the other participants in the program who were very concerned and worried about saying the right thing, I wasn't worried about saying the right thing. So I'm saying I'm, I'm being a complete lunatic. I'm filling out paperwork. Uh, you have to do these things called, uh, they were like called, uh, RSAs, like, uh, um, rational self analysis, uh, little things. And, and, um, so there were these little things you had to write every single day. You had to do a, an RSA. You had to fill out multiple, there's just multiple pages in these books that are written at like a, a fifth grade level. You have to fill out the paperwork and they're, they're doing stuff like, I'll give you an example of some of my answers in these. A rational self-analysis would be someone is screaming in the middle of the hallway. And keep in mind, RDAP is a quiet unit. So you're never supposed to be screaming. There's no yelling or screaming. That, that's a big deal. So you're in RDAP and somebody's yelling down the hallway. And that was one of the things I loved about that unit. It was very quiet uh, as opposed to the other units, which were like living in hell. Uh, so guys are screaming down the hallway. Well, a rational, you would do a rational self analysis where you're pissed. And your first thought is I'd like to jump up and hit this guy in the head with a baseball bat. Like, I mean, you're the first thing you think is this piece of garbage is screaming in front of my cell. Like I'm trying to, I, I'm trying to read or something. And so your first thought is to say, you know, Hey motherfucker, why don't you shut your fucking mouth? You're, you're, that's your first analysis, right? Like that's what the other inmates do. Like their first thought is the first thing that pops in their mouth, they scream and holler and they, they get into a confrontation. Now, a normal person thinks to himself, I'd like to say that, but I'm not going to because he, he sees a typical person, like a person watching this video, most likely would think, I wish this guy would be quiet. I'd like to say something, but I'm not going to because if he mouths off to me, then I mouth off to him. The next thing you know, we're in a confrontation. If we get into a confrontation, then I end up having to go to the hole. Or we get into a fist fight. Maybe I get hurt. Maybe I don't get hurt, but the other inmates tell or somebody sees me on a camera that we got into a fight and I end up going to the hole. If I go to the hole, I have to drop out of the program. If I drop out of the program, I'll lose the one year that I'm benefiting from this. So the best thing for me to do 
is for me to not say anything and go about my business. He'll leave soon. And that's the right thing to do. So that's a, so you have to write down these little, they have like little things that you do. And my rational self analysis would be my first thought. You have to put your first thought is to scream at this guy. My second thought is what are the consequences of that? My third thought is what's the best thing to do, how to respond to this, which is like to say nothing or to politely ask the person to move along or politely ask the person who they're looking for. Maybe you can help them, that sort of thing. And then what are the benefits to behaving that way? So my, in that same scenario, I would say, I'd like to jump up and hit this. Why is this guy screaming in front of myself? I'd like to hit him with, in the head with a baseball bat, which is not the thing to say. Um, and then the second thing is I would then come back and say, no, if I do that, I'm going to end up getting another charge and I'll never have to, I'll never be able to get out of prison and I'll have to deal with these idiots for my entire life. So then I say, no, the best thing to do is to simply ask, say nothing and hope that this moron finds this guy without my help. And then the benefit to that is I will be able to leave this place and I will never have to deal with morons like this again. Now, keep in mind, the way I wrote that is not the way to answer a rational self-analysis. Like the last two things I said are, you one, you should help. And two, you should say, this is the, and I'm saying, if I ignore him, he'll go away and I don't ever, ha and I get to go out of prison and I never have to deal with an idiot like this again. That's not what you're supposed to say. You're supposed to say a good thing, like I should ask to help him. And then if I help him, I'll have learned a valuable lesson about how to help people. And I will be able to go on and enter society and be a successful citizen. Like, that's what I'm supposed to say. I don't say those things. So I say this ridiculous thing. And then, of course, when they read it later, when your teacher reads it later, she's like, Mr. Cox, this is not, you You really should have said this. And I'm like, really? But that guy's an idiot. So I would have these arguments and guys in class would laugh. And I got to be a real clown because the truth is, I don't care if I pass the first phase, if they, what they call rephase me and make me start over it again. I don't care because I never want to leave this room. I never want to leave this unit. I want to stay here so I can see my mom every two weeks. Plus, I was writing other guys' stories. I'm still writing other stories. I want to stay at Coleman also because I want to continue to write these stories and finish the stories that I'm writing. So I'm writing ridiculous RSAs. I'm answering questions in the book where one of the questions I remember, it's like one of the questions is my life in 10 years without drugs. You know, my life, my family life in 10 years, if I continue to not use drugs and make rational decisions. And so I was, I remember I said, my life in 10 years, my family life in 10 years without drugs will be, I will not have a family because I'll be getting out of prison in my late forties and I don't plan on having any children so, or any additional children. So my family, there will really be no family, family life. It'll just be me and whoever I'm dating. So then it says, the next question was your relationship in 10 years without drugs. And I said, I'm hoping to, to find a young, hot ex stripper that's super hot that is with me only because of my vast fortune. She and I have an arrangement. She's super hot and I get to sleep with her because we have an arrangement. Next one is what will your, your, like your professional life look like? And I said, I plan on, on going back into real estate and having a vast real estate fortune renting out rooming houses to low income people that have no real option other than to pay me. So I say this. Then it says, what will your overall life look like? In oh no, then it was your political, like what's your, your community life? And I said, there is no community life. I'm a pariah. I'll be getting out as a pariah. And I have no, no, I have no intention of doing anything but remaining a pariah for the rest of my life. I'm good with it. So then it says, your overall life, what will it be like in 10 years? I said, in 10 years, 
My overall life is I'll be dating my hot ex stripper girlfriend. We'll be traveling the world, living off of my vast fortune, real estate fortune. And I plan on doing this. And I hope to go out in 20 or 30 years while having sex with her. And I have a massive, massive heart attack. Boom. That's, that's what I turned into the teacher. This is not how you answer these questions, by the way. The funny thing is, is each teacher has two or three of these classes, right? With like 20. So they're, they're basically each teacher has about, there's 150 people. So they, they, each teacher has maybe 50 people underneath them. They have to read your work every single week. There's just no way for them to do it because I, in, in, maybe not in normal society, but, but in, in art app or in prison, I come off like, like a fucking genius. Like you have to understand that if the average IQ in the real world is roughly a hundred, the average IQ in prison has to be about 90. So if you have an above average IQ in the real world, you're a super bright guy. If you're fairly smart amongst normal society and you go to prison, you're, you're a damn genius. I mean, you are way above genius. So in prison, I was like a rocket scientist. And I, what happened is my, the teachers in the classes, I realized very quickly they would, you would hand in your book, they would review the book and they'd give it back. Now, once or twice, I would be given a book and they would say, Cox, redo this. Quit being funny. This isn't funny. Redo it. And I do redo a page or two. But eventually, they stopped checking my work at all. They would hand me my book back and say, you're doing amazing work, Mr. Cox. Knowing damn well, I had written stuff about dating strippers and I mean, just, you know, robbing banks and I mean, just like start like I had one like starting my own bank so that I could rob money from the Federal Reserve. I mean, it was just like outrageous, like going on the run and changing my appearance and taking over a small country. And, you know, I mean, just it was insanity to some of the stuff. And I'm waiting for them to say something because I don't care. But they're not even looking at it. They're not reading my RSAs. They used to randomly pick people in the morning meeting. The morning meeting has 150 guys in it. And they would randomly pick people to read their RSAs. So guys would stand up and they'd say, uh, yesterday I was in the chow hall line and they didn't have chicken. And are the menu said they were going to have chicken. And I thought, this is ridiculous. I really wanted chicken. It makes me so mad. But then I thought, I'm lucky that I'm being given a decent meal. And that, you know, they would read their thing and I would just be like, I want to shoot myself. And I thought, and I used to think, if they ask me to read my RSA, what did I say yesterday? And I'd flip it open and I'd be like, oh, what? God, I can't read this. Like I'm talking about a, a teacher that one of the teachers there, one of the, they called him a drug treatment specialist, DTSs. And I'm talking about one of the DTSs. I'm talking about how she uses, how she can't even speak proper English, but she tells everybody she's got a master's degree, but she didn't have a master's. Like she was constantly lying about traveling and about doing like all of these amazing things. But the truth is, is that she didn't, it turns out later that I, and I knew it. Listen, I knew it the moment she started talking. I, we later found out that she had been, this is a T by the way, this is, this is someone who's a, a drug treatment specialist. She's ahead of all these uh, over all these inmates. She's basically like a, a pathological liar. And she's lying about having a master's degree and how the Bureau of Prisons had come to her and asked her to run the whole program. But she didn't want the responsibility. She gave it gave it to Dr. Smith. Now, that's not true. Because later it comes out that Dr. Smith ends up, one of the inmates mentions all this to Dr. Smith and Dr. Smith starts laughing and says she doesn't have a master's degree. They never offered this job to her. I don't know why she keeps saying that. I've mentioned it to her several times. She says she always kind of denies it and she, I don't know why she keeps saying that. Like you've got one of your, one of the people you work with who's like blatantly lying 
And everybody knows it. So I mentioned this in my RSA. It would have been hilarious if I had stood up and had to read it. I didn't. Anyway, it's just that the program was so ridiculous. And the hardest thing for me during the program was staying awake. Like really having to stay awake. But it was a great unit. And I stayed in it. And I participated to a degree. And I had many, many times where I was taken aside and told that I wasn't taking the curriculum seriously and that I needed to step it up and I needed to help my fellow inmates and I needed to do this. And I was just like, right, right, right. Yeah, I'm going to work on that. And and then I wouldn't do anything. Well, after about five months of this, my counselor, one day I go to my counselor and I said, hey, this was another counselor. This was the RDAP counselor. So I go to him and I said, hey, have they put the management variable on me yet? And I asked him that several times, like every few weeks, I would say, hey, have they done that yet? He'd say, I put it in. They haven't put it on you yet, though. So one day I, I'm walking by and I see him. And I go, hey, I said, whatever. He was like, Cox, I know what you're going to ask me. He said, they put it on. As I checked yesterday, they put it on you yesterday. He said, you have a management variable on you. It went on a few days ago. He said, you are locked into this facility for the next year. And I went, Nice. I immediately went and filled out a cop out and went and slid it under Dr. Smith's door, which said that I wanted it out of the unit. I wanted to drop out of the program. I was done with the whole thing. Nice knowing you. Appreciate you later. About it took her two or three weeks before she finally moved me. Normally, when someone tries to sign out of the RDAP, unit, Dr. Smith would call them in there and convince them to stay. She didn't even try and keep me. She didn't even try and keep me to ask me to stay or anything along those lines. Why? I have no idea. Uh, I'm not sure. I, I definitely know that she did not realize that I wanted I only was in the unit to get the management variable because I'd never told anyone that. Like the only person that knew that in the whole compound was probably my buddy Nico and a friend of mine named um, uh, Pierre Rossini, Pete. So anyway, uh, so like two, three weeks later, she signs me out of the unit. I go back to my old unit and I go into the old unit and they put me in the fishbowl. I remember they put me in the fishbowl. So... You know what was what's funny about this whole thing is that a month before about I'm sorry about okay so let, let me put it this way about two months into being an art app I got called to my the unit no wait my case manager wait my no 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 the unit manager unit manager called me in and he said Cox. I just got an email from Grand Prairie. Now, Grand Prairie is the where like the head of the BOP is. Like they do all the stuff for they move people around and they cut. They're the ones that are in charge of like basically it's like the records office. So he said, I got an email from them and they sent me a file on you. And it says that you owe six million dollars in restitution. And I was like, right, right. Now, keep in mind, if you've been watching the video, you you know that. When I first got into the Bureau of Prisons, I convinced my my case manager, my unit manager, um, uh, and the um, what did they they call it? Oh, and my counselor. I convinced them in the medium when I first got there that I didn't owe rest, I didn't have to pay my restitution while I was incarcerated, which is unheard of. I convinced four or five different counselors after that of the same thing. It's just. Complete bullshit. Like there's nothing to prove it. I just can talk to them and explain it in such a way that they believe me. Finally, this case, this counselor, no, I think it was a case manager. This case manager, this guy, whatever, this guy, he says, I got this thing from Grand Prairie. You owe $6 million. You've never made a payment. And I was like, right, right. And I remember thinking, is there any way for me to convince him and I just the look on his face and he actually had my file in front of him and it's opened and you can see the judgment commitment you can see clearly like I've been telling these people that 
if you just open the file and look at my judgment and commitment, you'll see that I don't owe the money and you'll see. And, and they never did. Like they were like, oh, yeah, yeah, we'll take a look at it. We'll take a look at it. And they just never did. And he had it right there. And I, there's nothing I can say. And I was like, right, right. And he said, so, you, but you're not on FRP refusal, which means you're on, it's like the federal restitution program that governs you to pay the, the money back. He's like, like, if you don't pay, they can put you on refusal and then you don't get a job or you only pay $2 a month or you don't get like to get into a, a two man cell. Like they, they, they put you through hell. Like, like all kinds of, they do all kinds of stuff. Like they're not, you're not allowed to go to commissary. Like there's all kinds of stuff. And yet somehow or another, I wasn't paying, but I wasn't on FRP refusal. And he goes, but you're not on FRP re- refusal. And I looked at him, I went, right. He said, why is that? And I went, I don't know. And he goes, but you know you owe six million. I went, right. He goes, you know you owe restitution. I went, right. And he said, but you're not paying. I said, right. He goes, why not? I said, nobody's ever mentioned it to me. He goes, nobody's ever asked you to pay. I said, no. He said, but you know you owe it. I said, I know I owe it, but I've never brought it up and they've never brought it up. He goes, man, it's been almost 10 years. You know, you know it's been over 10 years. He goes, it's been over 10 years. You know you owe that money. I said, yeah, granted, I owe the money. I get it, but nobody brought it up, and I'm not going to be able to pay off $6 million anyway. So he says, listen, based on the calculation of how much money you get in every month, that money that's been sent to your account, he starts doing the calculation, right? Pulls out a calculator, and he comes back, and he says, you have to pay $200 a month. And I go, you're out of your mind said, I'm not paying $200 a month. I don't have it. He said, well, you get in two to $300 a month. I said, yeah, listen, I said, I, I, I'm not paying that amount of money. And by the way, if you didn't pay, you got kicked out of RDAP. Like if you don't pay, if you refuse to pay, you cannot go to, into RDAP. So now I'm not in a position to even not pay to say, no, I, I won't sign. I won't let you take the money out of my account. I can't say that. Because I need to say an RDAP because they hadn't played the man, placed the management variable on me yet. So I sat there and I went, we went back and forth, back and forth, arguing back and forth. And finally, we get down to it to the point where he says like 150 bucks, 150 bucks where I'm kicking you out of RDAP. And I went and I thought, how long will it take them to put the management variable on me? And I thought a few months, take a few months. So I went, I'll do 150. But I need you to give me a few months to arrange it on the outside so that people will send me money in. And you have to understand that I, when he told me, I told him, I said, look, man, I'm making like $17 a month at my job here. And I said, the person sending money into me is my mother out of her social security stipend. I go, you're telling me you want my mother to pay $200 a month? And he goes, yeah, I do. Tell mom she's got to pay. And that's just what assholes they are. Like my mother's sending me in money. You want to take my mother's money? Yes, I do. Like yeah, they don't give a shit. So we argued back and forth, got it down to 150. And I said, I have to figure out how to arrange it so that I get some friends and family to send me in enough money in order for me to pay this every month. And he goes, I said, so can you give me like four or five months? He goes, I can give you a month. I go, no, 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 no. I said, in that case, sign me out of RDAP. He goes, how much time do you know? I go, I need at least four months. He goes, three. I'll give you three months. And I go, okay. So three months later, my counselor tells me, another counselor, not the same jerk off. Another counselor is the one that tells me, guess what? You got a management variable placed on you. And then I sign myself out of RDAP. Dr. Smith signs me out. So at the same time, I go to the new unit I remove all the money out of my my uh, inmate account and I place it on the phone. So there's no money. It's all on my phone. So there's no money in my account when the $150 hits and boom, I'm on our FRP refusal. So they took out 17 or able, like it just so happened that I took out almost all the money and I got like $17, my, my paycheck. And, the, and then they took out like the 17 bucks. So that I, they take out whatever it is, 20 bucks. They take out like $20 or so out of the account. And then I get called in my 
the, I, I'm now at the old unit, my old unit, they get called in from the new counselor that I now have, which is this woman, the same one that told me about I, that I, she was going to send me, send me to a camp. And she, they call me in and they say, listen, you, you missed your FRP refusal. I said, well, I wouldn't say I missed it. Who is, you know, he hit me for 20 bucks. And she said, yeah, but you removed all your money just beforehand. Didn't you know that it was coming? Out? I said, of course I knew it was coming out. I don't want to pay it. And she was like, oh, well, then I'm going to stick you in. She says, I'm sticking you in the fishbowl, which is where there's, they've got like 12 guys living in one room. But I had all, I was already in the fishbowl. So she goes, I'm going to put you in the fishbowl. And I go, I'm already in the fishbowl. I've been here like a week or like a couple of days. And she says, well, you can't get a two-man room. I said, like, I care about a two-man room. She said, well, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what you're going to do. Uh, I'm going to put you on refusal and you're not going to be able to make any money uh, at work. I said, I, I, I work like the job I have pays $17. So what are you going to do? You're going to drop me to two or three bucks a month? Like that's not going to change anything. It's still a better deal than paying 150 And she sat there and she said, well, you know, you need to figure this out. And I said, I will. I'll work on it. So I leave. And keep in mind, at this point, I'm teaching the real estate class. So the bulk of the money that I'm getting to pay for my pay for coffee and creamer and things like that are from guys and paying in real my real estate class. They're paying me to give them certificates. So anyway, I go back to the unit. So I'm at the unit. Everything's fine. Two or three months go by. And my counselor comes to me one day and she goes, Cox. And I said, yeah, what's up? It's been three months. I said, yeah, what's going on? And she says, uh. Um, I'm going to put you in to have you move to the camp in Miami. And I went, what? She says, yeah, I'm going to have you move to Miami. I said, no, 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 no. I said, I have a management variable on me. She goes, I know, I saw that. She said, I'm going to ask Graham, I'm going to have to ask Graham Prairie to remove it. And I went, why? I said, it's good for a year. She said, well, yeah, but under cer certain circumstances, you could ask them to be removed, for them to be removed. I didn't know that. Nobody ever told me that. And she said, they're pushing really hard for us to get people to be moved to a camp. She said, the truth is, Cox, you came into the system almost a, like 10, 10, over 10 years ago. You should have never gone to the medium or gone to a camp or gone to the low. You really should have been in a camp the whole time. If it weren't for the amount of time you had, she goes, you would have never been ended up here. So I was like, wow, um, that sucks. I said, Man, I said, that, that's messed up. And I went, sure. I said, but truth is, I said, I don't think you can, can you move me when I'm in RDAP? And she goes, she looked at me, she was like, well, no, but you're not in RDAP. I said, no, no, but I'm going back to RDAP next week. She says, you are? I said, yeah, yeah, I've already met with Dr. Smith. She's going to put me in the next pro, in the next, uh, the next class. And she goes, oh, I didn't know that. I said, yeah. And she said, oh, okay, well, I'm sorry. In that case, yeah, I won't do any of that. I didn't realize you were going back to RDAP. I said, yeah, I have a problem. I have a real problem. I have a drug problem and I need to, I can't go back on the street like this. I said, I'll be back on drugs and I, I really feel very apprehensive and I'm, I'm nervous. And she goes, no, I totally understand. I understand. It makes sense completely. I said, okay, thanks. So I immediately go to the computer and I send a, uh, an email to Dr. Smith. Dr. Smith, uh, I changed my mind. Uh, I got a real issue here. I need you to, I need to go back to RDAP. So she sent, she signs me up to come back and meet with her. So I walk in and went into her office and it's just supposed to be like a preliminary. I thought it's like a preliminary. What's going on? Are you sure you want to come back? Like that's what she typically does. But this time when I go back, I walk in, I sit down. There's like the three DTSs are there. So there's three DTSs and Dr. Smith. And I walk in, I sit down. I'm like, hey, what's going on? She said, well, I think we need to talk to you. And I said, what's that? Well, about what? She goes, she goes, why should I let you back into RDAP? She said, you, when you were here last time, you, you never took it seriously. And, and, and she goes, why would I let you back in? And I remember thinking, oh my God, like she might not let me back in. Like that wasn't even, to me, that wasn't even a consideration. Like, of course you're gonna let me back in. Every crackhead that drops out of the program gets to come back right away. And she said, I mean, Matt, you're, she goes, Mr. Cox, she goes, you're not taking it seriously at all. And I went, well, and she said, I mean, give me one, give me a, one good reason why I would let you in. And she, keep in mind, this chick is super smart and I'm terrified. I now think, oh my God, she's not going to let me in. And they're all looking at me like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Why would we let you in? And I went, I said, um, I remember thinking, bro, you better dig deep. You better come up with some shit. 
Like, you better come up with something to tell this woman. She's not going to let you back in. You're never going to see your mother alive again. You're in the middle of writing multiple stories. Your mom's, your mom is never going to be able to come see you. You're going to get moved. Like you fucked up. And I went, you better dig deep. And I, so I went, I said, honestly, you wrote, want the truth? And she goes, yeah, yeah. I'd like, I'd like to know. And she's irritated. And I went, the truth is, Dr. Smith, I said, I don't know that I've got much of a drug problem. I go, but I definitely know I have a criminal thinking problem. And I said, do you know? I said, I just did over 10 years. I go, over 10 years. I'm about to get out of prison. I, I said, and when I, I lay in bed at night and I can't sleep and I think what's going to become of me? What am I going to do? How am I going to survive? I said, I, I, you know what, what gives me comfort? And she goes, what? And I go, fraud. Fraud gives me comfort. When I can't sleep at night and I worry about what's going to happen, you know what, how I go to sleep? I said, I lay in bed and I start thinking to myself, you can commit a crime. You can commit fraud. And I start planning my a scam in my head and i think okay first thing where are you going to get the stolen identities how are you going to steal them where are you going to have the credit cards mailed to how are you going to find the address to get the cards mailed once you get the cards how are you going to go about getting i said do you understand i start formulating a scam where i can steal Hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars. It's so comforting to me. I don't even get to the point where I'm removing the money from the ATMs. And I go straight to sleep. It's that comforting to me. I said, now, I don't know if that's normal behavior or if that's things that think people think about. But I know that I can't leave this institution, go back on the street with no money, thinking the way I'm thinking. And if I have to come back into this program and take shit from all of you guys for the next nine months to try and correct that behavior, I said, then that's what I have to do because I can't get out like this. And she looked at me and she went, Okay, listen, I think we can get you in the next class. Um, where are you located right now? Okay, well, the next class starts in three weeks, and I we have an opening. I think that we're going to move so-and-so. Uh, how much time before you get out? And I was like, and listen, I literally, when she, she bought it so well, I almost started laughing. I literally, when she, when she goes, Okay, I think we can get you into the next class. I, I literally put my hand over my mouth. Because I, I couldn't stop smiling. I almost burst into tears laughing. And everybody, it's all three DTSs were sitting there staring at me like, oh my God, this guy has some real problems. And so I was like, I had to sit there for a minute and be like, get a hold of yourself, motherfucker. You were going to fuck this up by laughing. And she just bought it like just. Just, just complete headlining singer. She just over the top just bought it. I, I couldn't have, it couldn't have asked for a, a better result. And I sat there and I went, uh, yeah, I'm in, I'm in a uh, unit B4 and, uh, I've, I've, I'm, I've got about 18 months to go, uh, before I'm released. And she said, listen, no, not 18 months. I had, I had, a matter of fact, I know exactly how much time I had. I had, oh shoot, I had that, da, 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 da. It wasn't 18 months. It was about 15 months. I had about 15 months to go. So it was just enough time for me to like complete the program and get a five or six, you know, four or five months, which you had to spend four months in, in, uh, in the halfway house. Now I only had enough, to, I would have only ended up getting two or three months off my sentence. And she said to me, she said, you're only going to be able to get, because you're so close to the door, you'll only be able to get a few months off of your, your sentence. And I said, you know what? I said that if that's what it takes, that's what it takes. I don't care. 
I don't care about the year off. What I care about is getting my head right. And she said, no, I understand. I understand. <laughs> Stop judging me. <laughs> so it within two weeks, she's moved me back into art app and I'm going through it again. I'm writing ridiculous stuff in the books. Um, I'm, Oh, I didn't even explain the morning meeting. In the morning meeting, one of the things in RDAP is you have to do what they call holding your your peers accountable. So what happens is in the morning meeting, there's 150 guys. There's 75 guys on one, one side and 75 on the other. And all your chairs are facing each other. And they have like, it's like an hour and a half long uh, morning meeting. And one, of, and so they have different phases. Like, hey, uh, they they pick random people to read from their RSAs. They they pick random people to talk about certain things. They pick random people. They have something called the word of the day. So you have to stand up and talk about like the word of the day. And the word of the day might be like success. And you stand up and you go and you look at you success. What success means to me is getting out of RDAP and being a successful person and reintegrating into society and be, and being a good person and not being on drugs or having criminal thinking errors anymore and being a good father to my family and being a good citizen. That is what success means to me. And then you sit down and everybody goes <laughs> and they all clap. And maybe somebody stands up and says, they, they do corrections. Oh, I noticed when you said success, you didn't mention that you should also do this. Or I noticed that you didn't mention this, or you did say this, but you said it like this, like it was a bad thing. And so guys stand up and they correct, listen, it's, I can't even talk about it without, it's, it's, it's childish, but so is prison. So, um, so you do this thing. Well, one of the things that they did was they had a they had something called a um, pull ups. You had to do pull ups, and guys that weren't in the program would say that pulling someone up is snitching on them. And by the most purest definition, it is. But the way RDAP explained it was it wasn't snitching. You were holding your peers accountable. So. And all, by the way, everybody did them. So all the gangsters that I ain't snitching on nobody. I ain't, I ain't this, I ain't that. I ain't doing this. Fuck that shit. Fuck that. They all did pull-ups. You have to stand up and you pull someone up. And every day there would be, sometimes there'd be 10 pull-ups. Sometimes there'd be two, but there was always pull-ups. So the way a pull-up went was you would stand up and you'd say, (laughs) I gave you one. You would go, uh, you know, the guy would stand up and he'd say, uh, my, my name is John Smith. Uh, I'm in, uh, uh, I'm in phase two. I'm in green group. Cause you have different groups in different phases. Yeah. I'm in phase two green group. I'd like to pull up, uh, Mr. Johnson. And then Mr. Johnson would, he'd be sitting five rows away and all of a sudden he would, he, they always did this. They always looked around like me. <laughs> He's pulling me up. Is, does he mean me, Mr. Johnson? Yeah, you're the only Mr. Johnson here. Yeah. And he'd stand, they always stand up real. What's happening? And then, of course, the other guy would say, huh, Mr. Johnson, yesterday we were in the chow hall and I was walking out of the chow hall and I noticed that, that you, you had come. I saw you take a piece of chicken and put it in a plastic bag. And then I saw you put it, like, tuck it in your pants. And then you walked out of the chow hall and you walked by the guard. And he was, he was, uh, he was patting somebody else down and you just kept walking and, and you brought, I saw, I watched you walk bring it all the way back to to the the unit and i know that you you cooked it up the last night and you ate the chicken and you you that's stealing you're suffering from and then he would tell you the thinking errors that you were suffering from and the thinking errors there's like eight nine different thinking errors and like and he would say you're suffering from super optimism which would be you, you're, you're just overly optimistic that you believe you can't get caught and you're suffering from, and he would name these different thinking errors that you have. Like you're suffering from this and this. <clears throat> and then he would say, uh, the, the way I want you to work on it is I want you to work on it by, I want you to do, uh, five RSAs and I want you to come to the morning meeting tomorrow and read those RSAs. Uh, and, and, you know, and that's all. 
and then he'd sit down, and then two other people had to stand up and comment. So they'd already, and do we have any comments? And then every everybody people would raise their hand. <laughs> And they'd raise their hand and they would comment and then they would stand up and they'd go, oh, yes, Mr. Johnson, uh, um, uh, I, I, I believe that you, you weren't taking into consideration. And then they give you things and then they give you things to do. I believe that you should have to go and, uh, volunteer five hours and help sweep the, and then they'd give you five, you know, something to do. And then the next guy would give. So now you got, th- now you're sitting there and you're like, I got, like, I got like three things I have there. I have three different, like, punishments because I took some chicken out of the chow hall because I was hungry, you know, and, and I get it. Like that's stealing technically, even in prison, it's stealing. Like they, they, you have, you're supposed to go into the chow hall, you eat your food, you leave. So I get it. Um, but these pull-ups became a major, major issue for people. And you have to do it in a way that, you, you know, there was a, there was a, there was a standard kind of a, a curriculum or a, a like a process uh, that you had to go through, say certain things, and you couldn't get angry or upset. And then, of course, Mr. Johnson has to stand up and he has to basically apologize for the whole thing, you know. Uh, and and then he has to re- he has to re say all of the things that he's what he did wrong and all the things he's supposed to do. The problem is some of these pull-ups are so minor, like guys would pull someone up because I noticed last night when you were brushing your teeth, you didn't shut off the water. And that's wasteful. And you're not taking, you know, and you're suffering from, and then there was something where you're supposed to be looking out for your fellow man. And by not shutting off the water, you're not looking out for your fellow man, your fellow inmates, and you're not and so then next thing you know it's like i didn't shut off the water i let the water run for 30 seconds while i was brushing my teeth and now i just ha- now i have to go sweep the compound for the next three days i have to do all of these different things that they have you doing it's like jesus christ like are you serious like this is outrageous like, what are you talking about and guys are doing this left and right so this is happening every single day anyway um this 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 whole thing this time the problem with me going in art at this time is it it wasn't like i was in there for like f- 3 or 4 months like this time like it went on and on and on like they did not put the management variable on me for a long time and so the longer i'm going and and by the way things are like like you would get, you would have assignments that you had to do. So there, there were certain things. Let me give you an example. You're supposed to go to AA every, every day. Every day you're supposed to go to like an AA meeting. You were also supposed to take these workshops. So I took one of each workshop with a different person. And I then got a hold of the sign, sh- sign out sheet with the different workshops. And I just copied the guy's signature over and over and over again. Now, they're supposed to compare the two for a master roster and this roster. But I figured, fuck it. They're probably got a good chance they won't do that. And so they never did. So I went, took one or two workshops and never went, took another work- workshop. I never went to AA because if you didn't go to the first AA, I figured out pretty quickly that they make the master roster based on who shows up the very first day. So I didn't show up ever. I never went to AA. Um Half the times I was in a different, yeah, listen, it was, it was, it was ridiculous. Like, I mean, I, I didn't take the whole thing seriously. I think I got pulled up one time or twice. I got pulled up twice. I never did my assignment. Um, that I was told that you have to do this, you have to do this, you have to do this. I don't think I ever did any of those. Uh, the next time I got pulled up, Dr. Smith shut it down. Because she could see how pissed I was because the guy pulled me up for something I didn't even do. It was like completely bullshit. It was complete bullshit. Like I like he started an argument with me. I get into an argument with this guy in line and the guy completely just lies. He lies about the whole thing. And so when he pulls me up, he only pulled me up to it, it's called uh, basically it's um 
it's like uh, uh, there he's he's trying he's doing a preemptive pull up because he wants to pull me up because he's afraid I'm going to pull him up. And so he pulls me up and just blatantly says that I started an argument with him in line and that I said this and I said this and I said this and the whole thing falls apart very, very quickly. Um, so listen, I wrote a whole book about RDAP and how hilarious the experience was. Um, so I'm not, I'm not going to get into all the stuff. There was, there was at one point, there was a huge ordeal with Dr. Smith and I, um, in the middle of the morning meeting and it was outrageous. Like we get into a, a we get into a, a, a full blown argument and I've got guys pulling on me, telling me to sit down and stop. And I, I don't stop. I just have this full blown argument with Dr. Smith in the middle of uh, the morning meeting. Um, the other thing was that Dr. Smith was constantly calling me in her office and having talks with me about my son, about my ex-wife, about my mother, my father, my being, my upbringing, my crime, like everything. It was, it was horrible. Like she, the problem is the second time I went in, she actually took interest in me. And that was a mistake. Like letting, having this woman take interest in you was, it was emotionally, it was a roller coaster because she has a PhD. She's extremely smart. And I've known people with PhDs that still come off kind of like idiots. Like they're clinically, they're, they're sharp. The problem with her was she's not just clinically intelligent. She's not book smart. She's just in general, a very, very intelligent person. And as a result of that, she very quickly categorized me and who I was and what my issues were. And she was constantly calling me in the office and running me through the ringer to the point where I was in tears almost every time I walked into her office. I despised having to go in that office. It was so bad. If anybody knows Pablo's, uh, Pablo's dog, you know, when the dog, when it hears the bell, it just starts, it just starts sal saliva, you know, it just starts creating saliva. Like it immediately starts drooling because of the, it hears the bell. So it knows it's going to be fed. It got so bad that when I heard Dr. Smith say my name, my eyes would start to water up because it was that emotionally draining to go in there i was in tears every time like she would say my name and immediately i would start to well up before i didn't even get to the door so anyway it was it was it was a, it was a rough it was a rough um six six months like i did like almost a year in art app never graduated because finally my counselor said cox guess what your management variable was just placed on you. Oh my God. Thank God. I immediately went and grabbed on to grabbed a, a cop out, wrote up. I want to be left out, put it under the door. And, um, I'd say two days later, Dr. Smith called me in her office and I walked in and I sat down and she goes, Cox, why are you, why are you leaving? I said, you know, I just, just can't, I don't want to do it anymore. I'm done. I've learned everything I have. I, I, I'm good. And she went, you're doing really well. The truth is I wasn't doing well. I wasn't doing any of the work. I wasn't filling out the paperwork. I was so, it was like, I was not barely participating, but you have to think the first and second phase, really first, second. And I think it's the, I think it's three phases or four, like the first and second phase. They're basically trying to get you to not be just a Neanderthal, like to say things like, thank you. And I appreciate it. And, and to be a decent person is basically, if you can use silverware by the second phase, you're passing art at. So, you know, you have to memorize the material and stuff, but that wasn't difficult for me to do. Like, I know guys that that spent the whole a whole two months trying to memorize the phase two material, and I sat down in two days and memorized all the cards, everything across the board. Um, passing the tests weren't what weren't an issue. It was it was it was like, you know, like don't lie, don't cheat, don't steal. Hey, you pass. But these guys, <laughs> they, they couldn't seem to get it. So it wasn't that difficult. But I, I just told her, look, I, I just can't do it. And she said, yeah, but, you know, I said, look, the bottom line is, I said, let's face it. I said, I want to drop out before I complete the program because I, I don't want to get the two. She goes, you're going to get three months off your sentence. I said, I don't want three months off my sentence. I said, because if I if I fuck up and I come back to prison, I'm going to need the whole year. 
And if I take the three months, you can't get three months. You can only get it once. So if I were to come back to prison and try and do RDAP again, I couldn't do it again. I couldn't get a year off. I said, so I'm going to take three months instead of a year. And she goes, assuming you come back to prison. I said, look, we both know I'm coming back to prison. We both know that. And she goes, Cox, don't say that. And I said, I'm just saying, we both know there's a good chance I'm coming back. I said, so the truth is, I said, let's just let me go. Just let me go. And she was upset and irritated about it. And she signed the thing and said, it's fine. You can go. And I actually had a couple of the other DTSs try and talk me out of it. But, you know, I'm done. And I told them, too. I said, I'd rather not get the three months and just get more time in the halfway house. And that's what happened. They put me in for the halfway house. And I got seven, seven and a half months halfway house. And... It, it took a month or so for me to get the halfway house and for me to basically, um, you know, be, pay, be, be in a position where I was going to be leaving. Let me go ahead and give you some background information. Now, I think on my last video, I talked about, I was talking about RDAP, the um, residential drug, uh, residential drug abuse program or something like that probably. Um, and how I, um, was kind of trying to delay being moved to a camp and I wanted to stay in Tampa. I was writing stories. I was, I was, it, there were multiple things. It was my mother. Um, there were multiple factors that I, why I wanted to stay in the prison I was at. And I all, there's a bunch of different things that I did to stay there. So, but th this is it, but in order to tell this part of the story, I have to jump way back to 2011. Is it 2011? I don't know. Whatever. I think it was 2000. Was it 2011? Man, this is insane. Um. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I want to say it was like 2000, probably 2011, 2012-ish. I don't know the exact dates. Yeah, I want to say it was late 2011. So in late 2011, uh, I, I, I had just finished my memoir. So I had just finished my own personal memoir. I had been writing my, I started my memoir in, let's say 2009, because I had gotten to prison in 2000, you know, I was arrested late 2006, 2007. I was kept in a uh, U.S. Marshals holdover while I was um, uh, while I was um, waiting to be sentenced. Then I got sentenced in 2007, late 2007. I got to prison. By 2009 or 10, I was in the low security prison, and I started writing my story. So. I wrote my, I was in the middle of writing my story and multiple things had happened or were happening. Uh, I'll give you, uh, I'll give you a, it's, it's like super complicated. So if I'm, if I'm st stammering or seems a little sketchy, you know, cut me some slack, bro. There was a bunch of factors going on here. And I'm also wondering how much I, how far back I go for context. So I started writing my memoir because once I, if you've been watching this, you understand that I was interviewed by a bunch of programs. Uh, I, I had been on the run. I got caught. I was interviewed by American Greed, Dateline, those types of programs. They came out. I, I had, was trying to get my sentence reduced. I was doing a bunch of stuff. But one of the things that continually happened was people kept saying, hey, you need to write a memoir. So what I did was I ordered... A bunch of books, a bunch, whatever, two or three books. And, and to be honest, like out of whatever, two or three books that I ordered, the best book I read was a book by this woman who'd written like three or four memoirs about herself. And it, it was a book called, about how to write memoirs. And it was just this little tiny book. It was probably maybe uh, maybe 50 or 100 pages. And I read it and it probably had the, the most profound impact on me as far as writing. So what I did was I started writing, started writing my, my, my memoir. And I had just finished or was finished. I had just finished my book, which is, is sh shark in the housing pool right here. Shark in the housing 
Shark in the housing pool. That's a good one too. That's a good, that's right. Shark, shark in the housing pool. So I just finished this book. It's a very good read. And I called it shark in the housing pool, by the way, because one of the articles about me and my co-defendant was in Bloomberg business week and they called it sharks in the housing pool. So I went with shark in the housing pool. And I did this, by the way, before I'd ever heard of the Wolf of Wall Street. Because then, it's funny because when I named it that and people were reading it, they were like, oh, shark in the housing pool, like with the Wolf of Wall Street. And I was like, "Like, what's what's that? And then eventually the book got on the compound and I read, I saw the book. And I was like, oh, yeah, okay, I get it. Yeah, that's, that's cool. But actually, I just stole it off from, uh, I stole it from uh, Bloomberg Business Week. Anyway, I digress. Here's, so here's what happened. There was a guy named Ephraim, scrap, scrap that, I'll get to that in a minute. So I had just finished my memoir. I finished my memoir and I wanted to try and get it published. Well, traditional publishing is done, like if you want to have your book in books, Barnes and Nobles, let's say you want to be, you want someone like Doubleday or Simon and Schuster to rep to represent you and to be your publisher, right? Like you want a big name publisher then you can't really go directly to, unless you're somebody major, like a, a huge politician or something, you can't really go to Doubleday or, or Simon & Schuster or Penguin or whoever. You can't really go to them directly. You typically have to go to a literary agent. So what I did was I started writing letters to literary agents. You're not gonna believe this, but there's a lot of literary agents out there and none of them really wanna deal with some guy who's in prison. So what happened was, I'm writing letters, I'm getting denials. I end up calling my sister and my sister tells me, I, you know, I, I called my sister and I said, hey, listen, um, I, I, would, I need to find a literary agent. And I don't, I don't know if you know anybody or maybe if you could look me up some addresses or whatever. I ended up getting a book and I was mailing out from the book. It's called A Literary Agent's Guide. But I asked her and she goes, you know, it's funny that you say this to me. I said, okay, why is that? She was because a few years ago, Jack, which is my sister's husband, was representing a guy by the name of Ross Reback. Ross Reback is an entertainment agent. He's also kind of like a literary agent, um, producer. He's kind of like a jack of all, all fields. Uh, he represented some guys named Ron and Ron in the morning. Um, they, uh, they were a huge, they were you know, they're like Howard Stern or um, Bubba the Love Sponge, those guys, like he'd represented them. Like Ross was, he, represent, he represented a bunch of people. Well, my brother-in-law had represented him in a lawsuit and they were flying to Los Angeles to settle the lawsuit. And as they're flying to Los Angeles, Ross, or well, my brother-in-law says to Ross, he says, so what are you going to do after this? He says, um, he goes, you know, I don't know. He said, I'm not sure. He said, I, you know what, I, I really, what I want to do. Now, of course, Ross is a multimillionaire. Ross says, you know, what I'd really like to do is I would like to, I'd like to produce a movie. Like I'd like to be involved in actually getting a, a movie made. And Ross uh, basically had purchased the, a book that was called um, Mob Lawyer. It was a book that had been written by a lawyer who'd represented a bunch of mobsters. And he was in the process of trying to get that movie made. Well, he says, uh, I, I, I'd like to be a part of that. And he said, you know, he was, but I, it just doesn't seem like the movie, that, the book that he was representing was going to be able to it turn into anything, right? So it had a bunch of big name actors um, that were interested. But, you know, you have to write a screenplay. It's called pay to play. You have to pay somebody. Like, you know, you give some screenplay writer Listen, it's a very clicky business. The point is, he had some issues with it, and he said to my brother-in-law, he goes, you know what would be, he said, I'd really like to make some kind of a crime movie or something like, you know, Catch Me If You Can or something like that. He goes, you know, he goes, there's a guy right now from Tampa that is on the run, and the authorities are looking for him, and I've read a bunch of articles on this guy, and he is super interesting, and he had just got caught in like a bank, and he talked his way out of it, and they let him go. This guy is, he's, I think he's like at the top of the Secret Service most wanted list or something, and my brother-in-law looks at him and says, yeah, I know who you're talking about. He goes, his name's Matt Cox. He goes, 
he's my brother-in-law. And he goes, are you serious? And he goes, yeah. He said, uh, he's my brother-in-law. He goes, don't worry. He said, they'll catch him eventually. He'll go to prison. He goes, and I'll introduce you. So, you know, my brother-in-law had no confidence in me. Um, it just, just coincidence that he was right. So anyway, uh, so my sister tells me this, this whole, you know, tells me that Ross has always wanted to meet me and possibly represent me. And I'm like, oh, wow, I just finished my memoir. And she goes, send it to me. So I make copies of it and I send it to her. She sends it to Ross. Ross reads it. They, Ross and my brother-in-law schedule a time to come see me. Now, Ross, because he came with my brother-in-law, my brother-in-law was a lawyer, he, was a, he ended up getting approved to come see me, even though I didn't know him prior to prison. See, typically to go see an, a federal prisoner in Coleman, you have to have a pre-existing, a, a pre-existing relationship with them. But I didn't have one with Ross, but they approved him anyway. And I'm pretty sure I even went to my probation officer, I went to my um, counselor and begged and pleaded him. And he said, well, if he's coming in with your with your brother-in-law, then, you know, I'll consider him like, you know, a, a legal associate or something like that. I forget what he said, but he, he ended up approving him, which was like a miracle. So they come in. I meet with Ross. Ross says, I've read the book. And he said, you you need to rewrite. He said, he said, you need to rewrite the book. This actually takes place over two meetings, but he goes, you need to rewrite the book. He goes, because I read the whole book and it, it just, it was, it's, a, it's an amazing story. He said, but you didn't put not enough about you in there. So at that point, I was in the middle of reading these books that I had ordered. What is this is going on and on? Is this too much? Is it too much? Too much back? Is it too much? Oh, tell me. Listen, you can always fast forward. So... Um, I, I was in the middle of, you know, I, I read these books and everything and I, I, I was trying to, anyway, I, I kind of, so I was like, well, what do you, what should I do? So Ross was like, I hey, need to rewrite some parts of it. So I rewrite a few parts of it. Um, and it comes back and, or Ross reads it again. He comes back and he says, bro, it, he goes, it was amazing. You know, you did an amazing job. You know, you talked about your father because I had left out some stuff about my father, about, you know, his alcoholism, about being raised by him, having a learning disability. Like there's a lot of little things I had left out and I went and put those things back in there, beefed up the book a bit, little bit more, made me more of a, gave, gave the reader more of a background on me. Anyway, the point is I met Ross. Ross said, I'm going to represent you on the book on your book. I said, great. While that's going on, it just so happened. This is now, this is late. Now at this point, we're talking about it's late 2000 or probably mid, mid to late 2011. A guy by the name of Ephraim Devaroli came on the compound. And I'll tell you who Ephraim Devaroli is. Ephraim Devaroli is the guy or the character played by Jonah Hill in the movie War Dogs. If you've seen War Dogs, you know what the movie's about. And I'll get into that in, in a little bit. But the the background for that is there's a guy named David Packhaus and a guy named Ephraim Devaroli. Ephraim Devaroli owned and was running a company called AEY. AEY, what he, he it was just him. When I say running, he had a corporation. He had a corporation and his corporation basically had gotten, he'd managed to get himself approved on the government a government website that allowed you to bid on contracts and he was bidding on contracts well he brings in this guy David Packhouse to help him he's a childhood friend and they're bidding on arms deals and we're talking about like providing like 10,000 AK47s to the Iraqi security forces and if you don't know what that is the Iraqi security forces are like when we went into Iraq we set up their security forces right like their police and their armed forces and we set them up and we also funded them and we also gave them all their their uh their weapons well there was a ton of weapons that were hanging that were sitting around which were from the old from the Soviet Union so a lot of countries had just stockpiles of AK47 7.62 rounds um Dragno sniper rifles, um, you know, just mortar rounds, like all this stuff from the Soviet air. Well, Devaroli was buying that stuff and and then sending it to Afghanistan or, or, or Iraq. Packhouse comes in. They end up getting this huge contract. Now, here's the thing. Devaroli had already gotten like a $50 million contract for 
to supply weapons. Like these are little things that you don't know that they don't talk about in the movie, but he was already doing massive deals. And one of them was like a 50, he had like a $5 million contract, like a $2 million one and a 12 million, a 15 and a $50 million contract that he had basically almost completely fulfilled. He then gets a $300 million contract with this guy named David Packhouse, who was a childhood friend. So they source all the, where they can get the, the, the ammunition. The bulk of this was just ammunition. So this is an AK-47. This is just ammunition for the Afghani security forces. Because by this point, the United States had invaded Afghanistan and needed um, needed to supply them with, uh, you know, with um, weapons. Now, this is back in 2000 and you know, 2000, what, 2002, 2003? Anyway, so he's been doing this. He's, he's doing, so... So these guys get this contract, and this is where it goes wrong. It ends up going wrong where they get this contract, and keep in mind too, they're, they're going to places to buy this this ammunition that the government knows is old. They know it's twenty and thirty years old. He ends up going to Albania, and they go to Albania, and they buy a. Out, the Albanians have a ton of seven point six two rounds, and so they go in. They 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 get. A contract with the Albanians to buy 7.62 rounds. The initial, initially, the rounds that were sent to Afghanistan were 7.62 rounds. Because you have to understand, let's say it's, I don't know, a hundred million dollars worth of just 7.62 rounds. Well, even if it's that much, that many rounds, they don't ship it all at once. You can't like load that up on one plane, right? Like this is this is 50 or 100, 200 trips. So the the initial block of or task order, they call them task orders. The initial task order of 7.62 rounds was Albanian made 7.62 rounds. Well, then the Albanians run out of their stuff. They start giving them Chinese 7.62 rounds and they ship it. They actually ship several ship it several times before they realize that it's Chinese because they didn't actually have anybody really on site to to figure that out, not, not initially. Well, when they figure it out, they decide, you know what we're going to do? Well, let's just repackage it. Now, they don't actually repackage it. it, it they don't, they're not initially, this is just according to Devaroli, initially they weren't repackaging it to hide that it was Chinese. Now you have to understand there was during Tiananmen Square in 1989 or 91. Anyway, during Tiananmen Square in China, there were in Tiananmen Square there were protests. Chinese fired on their own people. They these were Chinese students that wanted to overturn China. This was after the Soviet Union fell. They were protesting and they were trying to overturn the the CCP and and make it a, a a democracy. Well, the CCP wasn't having it, and they ordered the military to fire on the crowd, and they fired on the crowd, and they killed, I don't know, maybe a thousand of their own people. And as a result of that, the United States and a bunch of countries put uh, embargoed any Chinese ammunition or I think, uh, I don't think it's just ammunition. I think it's a combination of ammunition and uh, weapons in general. So they put a ban. They said, look, well, you know, you guys are shooting people. We're not going to buy any more weapons. Like, you know, they could have said we're going to ban all goods from you because of what you just did. But, of course, we wouldn't. <laughs> we love our, our phones. So, you know, let's just go with let's just go with ammunition. It makes it seem like we're doing something. So they said, hey, no more, no more weapons from China. Well, so Devaroli knew and Packhouse knew, hey, we're not allowed to ship this stuff. Um, but they were already at the point where they were repackaging a lot of the, a lot of the munitions they were sending because fuel prices had shot up and Devaroli hadn't accounted for that. And also the crates that everything was being shipped in were very heavy. So like 20 to 30% of the, of the weight or 20% of the weight of some of these things was just the wood and you know the lumber that these things were crated in. So what they did was they would pull them out of the crates, pull them out of the, um, they call them sardine cans, these big cans that you peel off so they're hermetically sealed. They would dump all the all the AK-47 rounds, or 7.62 rounds, the, the AK rounds, into plastic bags and just pile them up and wrap them up in visqueen. 
and put them on the uh, on these planes to be flown into Afghanistan. Well, at the same time that was happening, they also found out, hey, my God, these are this is Chinese. So as a result of that, it, it definitely appeared that they were repackaging the AK-47 rounds to hide them. Now, listen, it was really, according to Deverold, it was two-pronged. You know, it, it happened to meet both those standards, but we were already repackaging anyway when we found out. So it just worked to to our advantage. Well, they weren't allowed to send the, the that, even though it was all pre-embargo. So prior to the embargo, this all this ammunition had been made, which make, means it's it's not illegal to buy and sell it, but it was against their contract. Their contract said you cannot ship Chinese ammunition or sell us Chinese or use Chinese ammunition. They were using it anyway. Ultimately, what happens is the, and I want to say DCIS or something. I, I, don't, I don't know exactly the name of the, it's a military uh, company. It's a military, part of the military. They, they get several complaints saying that that Devaroli and Pacows are shipping AK-47s that are being made in China and re-stamped in Hungary. This wasn't true. And that's what caused them to get raided. So their offices get raided because they think they're buying Chinese AK-47s and they're not. And this was just a, a, a complaint that was filed by one of their competitors. Because you have to understand that they were, if you read the book, you'd realize like they were beating out their competitors all the time. And the $300 million contract, a lot like in the movie, uh, they were, I think, 50 or, 60, 50 or $60 million below the lowest bid. So think about it. You're $50, $60 million below the, 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 low, the, the closest bid. You may be $100 million below some of the bids. I know this doesn't seem exciting, but it's getting there. All right. With that said, Devereux, their offices get raided, and they end up finding out that they end up finding out that um, that they're shipping Chinese ammunition. So, hey, guess what? We th we raided you because of this reason, but turns out when we were searching your paperwork, some stuff came to light. Uh, they ended up talking to Pack Owls. Pack Owls says, hey, look, yeah, we're shipping Chinese ammunition. And they indict Pack Owls. They indict um, another guy named uh, Ralph. And they indict Devaroli. Pack Owls and Ralph come in and they cooperate and say, hey, look, this is, yeah, this is what happened. This is what we were doing. Sorry, my bad. They get probation. Devaroli, on the other hand, ends up doing a deal on probation. He's going to get probation too. But while on probation, or sorry, while waiting to be sentenced, he ends up doing a deal with a guy, the guy that owns uh, Knight Armaments, which is in Central Central Florida, and they make uh, Knight sniper rifles for the military. Well, I mean, I guess for, for anybody, really, I guess. Anyway, he's doing a deal with with uh, them, and he leave he leaves the jurisdiction. He can't leave the southern jurisdiction of Florida because he's gone like a he's on a. Um, I don't know if he was on an ankle monitor at the time, but he ends up leaving the jurisdiction. When he leaves the jurisdiction, he ends up, uh, there's a, an ATF agent, and the ATF agent ends up handing him like a 9 millimeter, telling him they're going to go shooting. And uh, because because he actually grabbed the 9 millimeter and held it, they arrested him immediately for being a felon in possession of a firearm. Just because he held it. And he handed it to him. He brought he brought the gun. Like, listen, Deverolli totally got screwed on this, by the way. I mean, he shows up. He had told the guy, I can't go shooting with you. Um, you'd have to read the book to really see what happened. And 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 there's there's multiple versions of this story, by the way. There's my version, which is you know, Deverolli's memoir, which actually you can't even be able to read it. But And then there's also a book called uh, by Guy Lawson. I should have brought that book down, too. I could have shown that one. I have that one upstairs. By Guy Lawson called the uh, Arms and the Dudes. Same thing. Like Devaroli is doing this deal. He has to go to a meeting. They beg him to go to go to the meeting. They know it's outside the jurisdiction. He finally says, "Okay, fine. It's only like twenty minutes outside the jurisdiction." They say, "Bring some weapons. We're going to go shooting." He says, "No, I can't do that." He shows up without a weapon. 
the DEA or the ATF agent hands him a gun. Just like hands it to him and Deverly grabs it and goes, he's like, fuck. And he looks at it, he goes, yeah, it's a nice piece, bro. Hands it back to him. Hands him another gun. He's like, yeah, it's a nice piece. Hands it back to him. Boom, they arrest him. Felon in possession of a firearm. So as opposed to Pacals and Ralph who abided by their, um, you know, the terms of, of their probation or supervision or whatever you want to call it, uh, Deveroli didn't. And as a result of that, Deveroli ended up getting six years. I want to say six years. Yeah, yeah. I think he ended up getting six years. Or was it four? Might have been six or four. I'm not sure. Doesn't matter. It's ridiculous. Anyway. Using a homeless man's identity, he once borrowed nearly $1.5 million just to see if he could. He is the most interesting man in the world. I don't typically commit crime, but when I do, it's bank fraud. Stay greedy, my friends. Support the channel. Join Matthew Cox's Patreon. Deveroli shows up on the compound in late 2011. I'm on the compound in, in uh, Coleman, Florida. I'm in the low security prison. I've just finished my book. Deveroli shows up. I read, I had a, a guy by the name, uh, uh, I had a, a guy I used to hang out with, we called him Slow Motion. Slow Motion, because he had a hernia and, the, and Coleman, they wouldn't fix it, so he walked around like this real slow. Anyway, so we called him Slow Motion. So Slow Motion, I'm standing in line with Slow Motion, and he says, hey man, you know that Rolling Stone article I gave you the other day? And I go, yeah. He said, you know the guy in the Rolling Stone article, he was the, the kid? The, I go, the arms kid. And he goes, yeah, yeah. He goes, he's sitting right over there. And I go, get the fuck out of there. Sure enough, there was Deveroli. Now, Deveroli, in most of the photos that I've ever seen, is actually thin. But he was overweight in prison. And he was overweight before he got to prison, just before he got to prison, because he had been on an ankle monitor and wasn't allowed to leave his house. So he'd just eaten and eaten. So all these pictures you see of Deveroli being like a fat guy and he's played by Jonah Hill, which is, you know, a guy that's clearly overweight also. He um, um, he typically is not a fat guy. He's typically thin. The, the other thing about that article is if you read the Rolling Stone article, which was written by Guy Lawson about Pacals and Deveroli, is that, you know, he conv- he basically makes them sound like, you know, stoners. And the truth is, Deveroli is more of a cokehead, he told me. He said, I'm not really a stoner. I'm more of a cokehead. So... He basically was not super overweight, but he was when I saw him, he was overweight, but he was working out. He was trying to lose the weight. So I see him and I'm like, oh, wow. Okay, cool. And then my uh, motion says, yeah, bro, he's, he works out every single day. He's on, he's on the yard. He's been here for like a week or two. So I go, okay. So like the next day I go out to the rec yard and I'm walking around the track and I look over and there's Deveroli. And I walk up to him and I go, hey man, uh, what's your name? And he's like, Deveroli, why? What's up? And I said, yeah. I said, listen, my name's Matt Cox. Um, I write books. Uh, I just finished my own memoir. I was wondering if you were, if you were trying to, if you were doing anything with your story. He's like, "What do you mean?" I said, "Like, are you trying to write a story?" And he goes, "No, I'm not. No, why? I'm not really because I could. I don't think I could write one." And I go, "Why?" He goes, "Ah, man. He's I'm bipolar. He said I'm 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 up and down all the time. I don't think I could focus long enough." I said, "Bro, you. I read that Rolling Stone article. Like, what you did was incredible. Like." You got to be pretty bright. You should be able to focus long enough to write a story. I said, at the very least, you could write an outline and have a, a ghost writer on the street write it. Because here's what people don't realize about Deveroli is that Deveroli's crime, what he ended up defraud, what they, they call it, it basically was a fraud. It was, he was defrauding the United States government by selling them Chinese ammunition. So they, they hit him with a fraud charge. His fraud charge, he defrauded the United States government by $43,000. That's what his fraud charge is. He, and he paid it. He paid the 43000 before he even showed up for, you know, he just cut him a check. So Deveroli had made millions and millions of dollars. So this guy's got four or five, had four or five million dollars just sitting around, right? So I was like, bro, you clearly have enough money. Why wouldn't you get a ghostwriter to write your story for you? And he goes... Well, I don't even think I could write an outline. I don't even know how to. I said, bro, I just finished my book. I can help you write an outline. 
And he was like, yeah, I'll think about it. And I go, oh, okay. And he was really very arrogant. So I keep walking the track. And maybe a couple of days later, I saw him. I said, hey, man, so what do you, you want to do? If you need my help, I'll help you out. And he's like, well, why would you do that? I said, bro, I just do it just to help you out. I got nothing else to do. I said, I've al- I'd already decided I wanted to start writing other inmate stories. I'm just looking for one. And yours would be great. I can help you hone my skills, help you out, see how the process works. Like, that's all I'm thinking. Well, he goes, oh, let me think. I'll think about it, bro. I'll think about it. So we see each other. Listen, I swear to you, we continued back and forth but for like a month or two. It starts coming up on, I want to, let's say, November or December. And he, every time I'd see him on the compound, we'd be walking by each other. And he'd go, bro, still thinking about it. And I'd be like, <laughs> like, you douchebag. So... You know, I could get like at this point, it's like, okay, like I'm trying to help you out. So then one day he sees me, he goes, hey, bro, what's up? What's up? Hey, what's your, what's your name? Matt, Matt. I go, yeah. He goes, hey, um, Matt, listen, man. He said, did you hear that they, that Guy Lawson, the guy who wrote the story on in Rolling Stone about my case? And I went, right. He goes, he just optioned the life rights of or, or, or the film rights to the story. He just optioned the film rights to the story. I go, okay. He said, yeah, yeah, bro. Um, he goes, he said, he, I go, who bought it? And he goes, oh, uh, Warner Brothers bought it. Um, he said, yeah, yeah, Rat Pack uh, Entertainment, I think they call it. He goes, you know, the guys that do the Hangover movies. And I went, I was like, like, like that's like Bradley Cooper and like Todd Phillips. Like Todd Phillips, like who? And he goes, yeah, man. He goes, he goes they hangover movies. They're, they're going to make, a, the guys that do the hangover movies, they're going to make a movie about my life. And I went, wow. And he's like, right, cool, right? And I went, wow, bro. I said, <laughs> I said, you seem like a pretty smart guy. And he goes, right? And I went, you're telling me that the guys that made the hangover movies are going to make your movie. Yeah. And I went, do you, have you ever seen the Hangover movies? I said, the guys in the Hangover movies are clowns. These guys are going to make a movie about you and you're going to be a clown. I said, you're going to have to leave. Like, I know you. this seems like you're in here forever, but the truth is you'll be out of here in a few years. I said, in a couple of years, you're going to walk out of here. You're going to walk through the front gates. You're going to leave and you're going to have to go back to being a businessman. And let's face it, you're going to be a laughing stock. If they make a movie about you, I said, you're going to be synonymous with, with Jeff Spicoli from Fast Times at Ridgemont High. Like, you're going to be a joke, bro. And he was just like, like, wow. Wow. He goes, and I, I said, wow, I just thought you were smarter than that. And I turn around, I kind of walk away, and he, and, and he goes, wait a minute, wait a minute. He goes, when can we do it? When can we do it? So I go, well, I mean, you know, we can, we can work on it. Uh, and anyway, we, it's, we still didn't meet for like a month. Uh, you know, he's just, he was such a nut, nut job. So we end up meeting like a month later. And I'm sure I've gone over some of this before, right? So I've gone over some of this before. It's a little repetitive, but you're getting more detail now. And I'll explain how it ends up, how I, when I end up suing him. So what happens is, so that happens. And I end up writing working with him to write an outline well once i write the outline of the book i'm I'm just finishing the outline he says hey can i read your book and i go sure so i bring him a copy of my book and a few days later he hands it back and he goes bro that's amazing that's an amazing book that is that's the best thing i've ever read and look to be honest look to be he i later found out he's read three or four books his entire life like most of what he reads is newspaper articles and stuff so who knows Not that it's not a good book, but still. Um, He read my book. Shark in the housing pool. So he read the book and he loved it. And he said, hey, I want you to write my book. And I said, wow, you could get a professional writer. He's not, bro. He's your professional writer. I want you to write write my book. And I was like, "Um, okay. He said, yeah, yeah. He said, "Uh, uh, do you have somebody that can represent us? And I went, I mean, you could try and find somebody. I said, to be honest, I said, I I have a guy that's representing me. Like he's just now kind of putting everything together. Like all of this is happening at the same time. Like, so we can, we can, you know, uh, we can talk to him. 
Well, I start writing the book right away. And I'm writing the book. And Deborah Rowley, as I'm writing the book, he ends up getting like an entertainment agent to come see him to write up a contract. Um, and this was an entertain some entertainment agent from like Orlando or something. She drives uh, out there and meets with Deborah Rowley. At the same time, I have Deborah Rowley schedule a meeting with his with his mother or sister, his mom and sister, and his brothers come to see him. And I end up having Ross Reback come see me at the same exact time, so Ross can meet Deborah Rowley. So Ross ends up. We, all, we both end up going to visitation at the same time and we get there and they end up meeting um, Ross. We all end up sitting together. And so Ross basically, and I remember his sister was there and his sister was furious. All right, I mean, his mom was furious and everything like you scheduled a business meeting. Like we just drove four hours from Miami to be here four or five hours really to be here. And you're going to, and he's like, hey, it'll take 30 minutes. Or, so we, t- we all sat down. We talked for like an hour or so. And Ross kind of gives him his pitch and says he can, what he can, he thinks he can do. And, you know, he thinks he can monetize the whole thing. And that's fine. So that ends up, it, meeting ends up ending. And then there's another meeting where his sister, Deveroli's sister comes. So now it's Deveroli and his sister and me and Ross. And we all end up going to visitation at the same time. Bam. We have to be there at the same time because Ross is unable to get on Deborah Rowley's visitation by himself. So I have to be there. So we're both there at the same time. And I'm at this point I'm I'm writing his story. And the great thing about Deborah Rowley was, you know, you know, as much as I, I may have issues with the guy, he's brilliant. He has um, his mind works like a, a steel drum. I mean, nothing escapes it. And and on top of that, he could recall details and dates like nobody I've ever met. Like I can't recall. I'm, I've been off. Listen, when I was writing my story and I was getting in all my Freedom of Information Act and putting everything together, like there were sometimes I was thinking, okay, well that was two thousand and one. Nope, that was two thousand two. Like I'd be off by six months or a year on some of the things that I had to track down. Deveroli was like, yeah, that was uh, that was uh, that was March. Uh, March. I want to say it was March sixth. Yeah, March 6, 2000, March 6 of 2000. That's when that happened. It was like, and then I get a document in, sure enough, March 6. Like everything, he was spot on on almost every single date and the names of the people. I'm horrible with names. Matter of fact, I think when I talked, told this story last time, instead of saying Jeff Spicoli, I said David Spicoli. People crucified me. I must have had 30 people say, nah, bro, it's, David, not, it, I mean, it's Jeff, not David. So, um, Deveroli was, is he, and, and look, he, his, he was just super, a super sharp guy. Okay. Despicable human being, but as a, a sharp guy and very smart, um, anyway, work ethic. Like you can't believe like all he wants to do is work. Well, he ends up one day I'm writing well, what what happens? Sorry, what happens is one day we're all in the visitation, we're talking, and Ross Reback and Deverolli are going back and forth, back and forth, and I remember Ross kind of lays out all of the things that he'd done over his life and all of his successes, and Deverolli's sister says, "Well, maybe you're just get, maybe you just get lucky." And he goes, well, if I get lucky, I get lucky a lot. And I remember, and, and I said, I go, well, I'd rather be lucky than good. And and so it was just like boom, boom like we hit her, bam, bam. And she just shook her head, and Deveroli starts laughing. And he's and he's like, yeah, I, I definitely think we we need to, we can work together. Well, while we're saying that, Ross says the most important thing is getting the book finished as quickly as possible. And he, they, you know, they kind of look at me and I'm like, well, I mean, I'm writing, I have the outline and I'm writing, but you know, it's going to take time. Well, the problem was that Deveroli was getting moved to the Miami camp very soon. As a result of being moved to the Miami camp, I only had another few weeks or a month with him. 
and I did have the outline, but it was it was it was like a mad dash. You're trying to write a 300 page book within a month or two. Like that's difficult. So luckily, I mean, Deveroli did have a ton of his documentation. So we're going back and forth, back and forth, and we're talking. And Ross was like, we have to get the book done and published before the movie. Or keep in mind, at this point, they haven't even made a movie yet. They had optioned the film rights to the movie, and they were and Warner Brothers was writing a having a script written. But the script, it turns out, the script when they when they went to Jonah Hill, Jonah Hill wasn't happy with the script. Supposedly, and this is what I was told later, was that because it didn't have enough in there about Jonah Hill or about Deveroli's character. Now, so this is they don't even know that. The, listen, uh, movies are optioned all the time. Let's say Hollywood options a thousand movies a year, right? The the various studios they make three. So they pay for a, a thousand different options. They end up making th- three. So the average studio makes about three movies, three major motion pictures a year. I mean, you know, the likelihood this was going to get made was slim to none. It was possible, but there's lots and lots of movies that I'm sure you can, stories I'm sure you can think of that you're like, that was amazing. That was it. Like, oh my gosh. Oh, that's great. That's wonderful. And that's going to be a movie. That's got to be a movie. But it wasn't. They just don't happen. Like, there's just too many great stories for there to be, for there to be that many movies. Not that there's not a ton of content. It's just, that's just, especially back at this time. Um, with Deverell, uh, so Reback keeps saying, we got to get a book out. We got to get a book out. And I keep telling him it's going to take time. It takes time. It takes time. And he's like, look, it's important we get a book out. And, and and I'm like, well, what is the rush? He says, one, I want to get a book out because that way we can we can try and get a publishing deal and get our book out before um, before Guy Lawson puts out his book. Guy Lawson had written an article in Rolling Stone and he was turning it into a book. So we, we one, we wanted our book out first. Two, Ross said, if I can get our book out first, I can try and get a a series made or a, our, our own movie made. And if we can get our movie greenlit before Warner Brothers movie, most likely they will not do a movie and our version will come out. Okay, that makes sense to me too. They weren't that far ahead of us. Um, the third thing was he said, because uh, basically uh, Devaroli goes, yeah, well, what if that doesn't work out? He goes, if that doesn't work out, he or he says, he goes, if that doesn't work out and Warner Brothers makes the movie, and Deborah Oli goes, yeah. Reback said, then we'll sue them for theft of intellectual property. And we're all sitting there, and I remember being like, right, right, going, that doesn't make sense. How can you, theft of what? He was theft of, of his story. And I went, yeah, but the movie isn't being made based on Deborah Oli's story. It's being made based on David Packhouse's version of the story. Now, a lot of people don't understand this, but so I, I have a girlfriend, Jess. If Jess were to tell her version of she and I's story and say, Hey, I met this guy in the halfway house and we, we had this on again, off again, you know, romance. And then we ended up getting married and we had three kids and it was wonderful. And it's, it's a love story. Okay. I can't sue Jess. Like I can sue her, but it's not going to go anywhere because they're going to say, why are you suing? Well, she told my story. No, no. She told her version of our story, which she's allowed to do. Now, the, 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 other, the other exclusion of that is that, of course, I'm also allowed to tell our story. On top of that, because Devaroli and Packhouse's story was, was in the public um, forum, right? So if there were multiple newspaper articles about their story, about being arrested, about them selling all of these, all this munitions to uh, Afghanistan security forces and getting a contract with the government. There's all these articles about it. That also excludes any right to privacy that they have. So for example, you have a right to privacy. For example, let's say my neighbor and I, me and, uh, me and Ted, 
think everybody knows who Ted is if they've ever watched uh, Big Herc and I's uh, interview. My neighbor, my neighbor's named Ted. So Ted and I, do you know what I'm talking about? It's, you have to watch the Big Herc. Big Herc uses the example of Ted, Ted. Oh, Ted. So Ted, you and Ted go to barbecues together? So Ted and I, me and my neighbor Ted go to barbecues together. Um, well, if Ted's telling me stuff about he and his wife's relationship and him and how he hates his job at Walmart. Well, let's say I'm a writer and I turn around and I write a book about Ted. Ted can sue me because the truth is Ted has an expectation of privacy. He was just telling a neighbor, you know, like he, he, he didn't expect any of that to be public. He didn't tell me for it to be public. He has an expectation. Now, if Ted were arrested for robbing banks and I wrote an article about Ted because I'd read all the newspaper articles on Ted and said he happens to be my next door neighbor, that's different. Now he's in the public, he's in the public light, he's in the public forum. He loses that expectation. And if Ted is a public figure, for instance, there's probably 50 books written on President uh, Barack Obama. He can't sue. Barack Obama cannot sue. Why? Because you're a public figure. So you lost your expectation of privacy. Secondly, if you're found guilty of a crime, and I, even if it's not in the newspaper and I were to go to public records and look up all of your indictment and, and all of the motions and read and, and read your transcripts and write a whole story based on that. Once again, you're a criminal and your information is in the public is in public records. I'm allowed to use that and write a book. You've lost your expectation of privacy. So Deborah Rowley had no prayer on expectation of privacy. So I sat there and I said, I don't uh, to Ross back in the we're back in the uh, visitation room. I was like, I don't understand. Like, he doesn't have an expectation of privacy. They didn't steal his intellectual property because I haven't even created his unique intellectual property. Because some intellectual property is still unique, if that makes sense. So, for instance, let me give you an example. Let's say there you're you were arrested for robbing banks, and it tells all about the bank robberies. Well, that doesn't mean that you still have an expectation of privacy as far as your family is concerned and your private life. Like how if I were to write a whole article about you ro- or a whole book about you robbing banks and then I were to turn around and start telling you things that I knew about your family because your wife had confided in me or your friends had confided in me or something along those lines, like personal stories. Well, then those were stories that unless we had some kind of an agreement, you you told me these stories not expecting a book to be written. Unless I told you, hey, I'm an author, I'm a writer, and I'm going to write a book, then you lose your expectation. But if I just told you because we were friends, now you have, you own, or you have an expectation. So I was like, I don't know. And that doesn't, I don't think that works the way you think, Ross. And he goes, no, no. He said, I can, trust me, we can sue them for theft of intellectual property. And then Ross said, we just have to get the book out there and we just have to be in a, we have to have the book available for consumption in some manner. And we just have to allude to the fact that Warner Brothers obtained the book and used Devaroli's book to write the movie War Dogs. Or to write the screenplay using Devaroli's book. So we need So, Matt, I need you to write the book as quickly as possible so that we can get it published first or at the very least have a manuscript to circulate so that if they make a movie, we can accuse them of having stolen his intellectual property. And Deborah really loved it. He loved the idea of it. Deveroli goes, oh my God. He goes, you know what? He goes, I have a cousin that lives in LA and he he says he's in the entertainment industry. And he goes, and and Ross goes, is he? And he goes, well, he's kind of a schmuck. He said, uh, said, I don't think he's much of, he's kind of a douchebag. But he said, regardless, he goes, regardless, he, um, he said, regardless, he goes, he thinks he is and he knows a bunch of players. He goes, so we could probably get him the book and get him to end up connecting us somehow. Like, I don't know, but we can use them somehow. 
And Ross was like, okay, well, you know, we'll think about it. He goes, the first thing is we have to get the book made. And I was like, and I go, I don't, I don't even know why you're talking about suing Warner Brothers. He goes, no, Matt, he goes, that's just a fallback. I'm just saying, he goes, Ross goes, look, if we're going to dump a bunch of time in this and you're going to write the book, he said, we need to be able to monetize it in some way. He goes, my first course of action is for you to write a book, publish the book, and we're going to have a bestseller and we're going to get ourselves a series or a movie made. He goes, that's the first course of action. And I was like, um, okay, okay. Because like I, I don't have any intentions of suing anybody. I'm locked up in prison. I just want to become a writer. I still had at this point in my life, man, I still had, I still had, Jesus, bro. I probably still had almost 20 years to go. Like I still, I'm still expecting to be getting out. If I don't lose any good time, if I'm a good boy, if I'm a good boy, I get out in 2030. This is, this is probably 2011, maybe 2012, maybe 2000, early January, February, maybe of 2012 at this point. So I start writing the book. Deveroli comes to me one day. And he says, hey, here's our contract. And he slides a contract across to me. And he says, here, here it is. He's sign here, sign here. And he's like already signed. And I went, um, well, I don't understand. And he, I said, well, what does it say? He goes, bro, he goes, it just, it says we're partners. And on the top of the contract, I want to say it said something like partnership agreement, work for hire, which I didn't know what work for hire meant. He says, it just means that like, like, I don't, I, you know, it's like, basically we're partners, but you know, I'm hiring you as my, as a partner. Like he kind of briefly explains it. And to be honest, like I was so excited, excited to be a part of the project. Like I just signed it because I, I trusted what he was saying. Like I didn't realize what a scoundrel the guy was. And I thought it doesn't really matter. Ross is involved. He's not going to screw me over. So I'm good. So I sign a contract, sign the contract. I keep writing the book as I'm writing the book more and more red flags are showing up. Like there's more and more things that I'm realizing like, wow, this guy's a scoundrel. Like he's telling me more and more stories that are just horrific about him. Basically like bait and switch. He's doing what's called a bait and switch. He's, he's doing things like he would go in. And what's so funny is like, this is like one of the reasons he probably doesn't even want the book out is <laughs> because he's doing stuff like he would go in and let's say for like helmets, he would go in and order, he, he'd have an, an order for like 10,000 helmets. And he would go into a manufacturer and say, look, I need these helmets for, let's say the helmets are going for $200. He'd say, I need them for $100. And they'd go, that's crazy. And they'd argue with him. And he'd say, I have a contract for 100,000 helmets. I have a 100,000 helmet order from the US government but I need the best deal possible. So they come down to, let's say $110 a helmet. And he goes, okay, he goes, the first task order is for 10,000. And they give him 10,000 at that price, that reduced, that super reduced price. Cause they think they're going to sell a hundred thousand and he pays them. And then he, when they say, Hey, um, we're, we're doing the next order. Now he calls them a week or two weeks before they're due. And he says, Hey, listen, you're not going to believe this. They canceled the order. But he got the ten thousand at one hundred and ten dollars. Should have paid a hundred or two hundred, but he got a reduced a reduced price because they thought they were selling hundred thousand. Like these are the kinds of things that he's doing, you know. Or he would go and he basically said like it was a legal bait and switch where he would go in and he would. Yeah, you really have to. <laughs> he, he would go in and he would say, um, he would he would he would bid on a contract for let's say sniper rifles for let's say night night sniper rifles he would bid on a contract for sniper rifles at they cost two thousand dollars let's say really honestly they cost like 3500 bucks he 3500 but maybe if you bought a bunch of them you get them for like 2500 he would go in and say i can get them for two thousand dollars a piece and he's going to get two thousand of them let's say it's two million dollars a $2 million order or something. I don't know the exact numbers, but the point is, is that the government says, okay, fine. We're, you won the bid because a lot of people are bidding on it. He wins the bid. Great. He then turns around weeks later and goes to the government and says, listen, I want to fulfill this order for you. But it turns out that night armaments cannot, they cannot fulfill the contract 
in time. But I can, I can provide you with an equivalent pro, um, uh, product. And that's allowed in the contracts. In those contracts, you're allowed to give them an equivalent. So he would say, here's the specs for the night, for the night sniper rifle. Here is the specs for the Panther sniper rifle. The night sniper rifle is made in the United States. The Panther sniper rifle is made in South Korea. And they go for 1500 bucks. And he would then, so, so now the government comes in and the U.S. government says, well, can you get them there to us on time? He says, yes, I can. He says, okay, we'll, they go, we'll go with that. Keep in mind, this is some purchasing officer in, in, um, in uh, Iraq. This is a purchasing officer in Iraq who's probably a 22-year-old kid who doesn't care. They meet the specs, fine, we'll take those. Then he turns around and goes to Panther, and he argues with them to, where, to the point where he can get the snipe, that Panther sniper, sniper rifle for 1100 bucks. So imagine he underbid the he never he never was gonna gonna give you the 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 night the night sniper rifle you were never gonna get those like that two thousand dollars that he said he was gonna get them for or twenty five hundred dollars he was never gonna give them to you for that so he he got him he's now selling Panther sniper rifles for double what you could buy them brand new off the fucking shelf. And he sends them to the government and they get them and they pay him and he's made a ton of money and he's thrilled. And, you know, so he's telling me these types of things and he's laughing and joking about it. And I'm just like, Jesus, bro, like this is this is rough. Like I and I remember thinking, what did I sign with this guy? So what ends up happening is Ross comes to see me. One day he comes to see me. And I'm still writing the book. And he says to me, hey, Matt, he says, how, how are you doing? I said, listen, I said, this guy, by the way, is despicable. And I said, the more I look at him and write his stuff, I said, the more, like, it's just, he, he's just, he's, he's just, I said, he's just like, not like a good guy. And I'm not saying I'm a great guy, but He's, I was like, I'm, I'm like, this is not good. Like, there's just no redeemable qualities about him. And he goes, look, he said, like, write it in such a way, write it. In, we need him to be a sympathetic character. And I said, the best you're going to get with him is maybe you can, we can get him being like a, um, like a, a Jack Sparrow type character from Pirates of the Caribbean, like a lovable rogue. You know, like he's he's a bad guy, but you kind of love him because he's funny and comical. He goes, well, then do that. Make him funny. Make him comical. Make him thinking funny things in his head. Make him. And he does say funny stuff. So I was like, OK, I can try and do that. I was like, I can try and do that. I said, but to be honest, I, don't, I just don't know that I'm going to be able to. You know, by this point, Deveroli is like he's he's like leaving. And I'm and and I th actually Deveroli, actually, I want to say Deveroli was at this meeting. was he talking to his sister? Anyway, I'm talking to Ross and I'm like, listen, man, like, I, I just don't know. And I had written a book called Stranger Danger. So months earlier, I had written a, a, a like a kind of like a, a social satire about sex offenders um, and just about housing sex offenders. And it was like this satirical, it was, it was just this, this super kind of devious, sick, sadistic, funny kind of book, right? About this guy that ends up housing sex offenders and, and turning him into like, um, you know, modern day, um, like slave labor force. And so, and so it's, it's, it's like a comedy, but a dark, dark, dark comedy. Anyway, and Ross had read it and said, look, it's it's funny. He said, I don't know if there's a market for it. He goes, but it is comical. And I remember saying, listen, Deveroli is, is I said, the guy, the, the lead character in Stranger Danger has more, has better qualities in him than, than this, I said, than Deveroli does. Like he's a more sympathetic character than Deveroli is. 
And he, and I said, plus I said, there's just, and, and he goes, well, I don't know. I read that book. He said like, he's like, and there were funny parts about that guy. And there were, there are parts of it where you kind of like him. And I said, you know, he has a lot in common with Dev Rowley. Like he has a mother that is constantly, you know, uh, bugging him. And, and, and there's all, there's a lot of similarities. And he goes, well, listen, he said, I need you to finish the book as quick as possible. He goes, pull scenes out of that book and put them into Dev Rowley's book. He said, to, just to, to get it done as quickly as possible. Now, keep in mind, I'm a work for hire. So I'm not writing this as a journalist. I'm someone that you hired to write your book the way you want it written. And so I was like, geez, bro. And I said, I don't know. And he goes, he goes, no, he's, look, it doesn't matter. It's based on his story. It's based on his story. Kind of like Frank Abagnale's book is based on Frank Abagnale's story. The truth is a lot of that stuff is exaggerated and inflated. And in some of Frank Abagnale's um, case, it's completely fictionalized. So uh, there's another book called um, da A Dangerous Mind. I think it's called A Dangerous Mind. Anyway. There's several books that were written based on, they're based on the guy's life. So Ross is going, look, we're going to do it. It's based on his life anyway. I just need the intellectual property created so that we can try and get a book deal and we can try and get a movie deal or something. And I went, okay, that's fine. I said, I'll finish it. So I pull a bunch of scenes from Stranger Danger and I throw them into Devaroli's book. Now, that book ends up when I'm finished with the book and I send it to Reback, I remember Reback telling me he he had it, he got it like whatever on let's say a, a Tuesday. And like Thursday I called him and I said, Hey, what's up? He said, I just finished it. I said, Oh, what did you think? And I'm expecting a whole bunch of rewrites. Like he kind of did a bunch of rewrites on my book, like edits. And he came back and he said, Man, you knocked it out of the park. He was just amazing. You did an amazing job. He said, my only problem is you made Coleman, the prison, he's, you made it sound like a, a, a summer camp, like a rough high school summer camp. You made it sound like it was a joke. And I go, it is kind of a joke. It's not like a real prison. I said, like, I've been to real prisons. I go, this isn't a real prison. They're, not that people aren't getting stabbed and it's not violent. I said, but, you know, look, half the fucking guys here are sex offenders. And I said, and to be honest with you, I said, the other half are soft as cotton. Not, not that you don't get guys that are tough guys and stabbing each other and fist fights and stuff. But I said, it's not as bad as the medium. And he goes, it doesn't matter. It's still prison. I need you to rewrite it and make it sound like hell. And I went, okay. So I rewrote the very last page and made it sound like the prison was, you know, just this this really brutal, rough spot that's just a horrible, horrible place to be. N not that prison's not horrible, but in general, it wasn't as bad as I made it out. As, made, as bad as I made it out to be. Well, now I've got the book. It's done. And Ross ends up telling me one day I'm calling. Because now what Ross has done is he's kind of connected my book with Devaroli's book. He, he was holding off the whole time on pitching my book to Simon and Schuster and all these to act. He's acting as my as literary agent for me, but he didn't want to do it. He kept saying, well, I want to hold off so I can pitch both of the projects because he was saying getting yourself in the meeting is the hardest part. Once you're in the meeting, you want to be able to have multiple projects. So if you tell if I pitch them stranger, if I pitch them uh, Dev Rowley's book. He said then, and they say, no, I want to say, well, I've got this other book. He said, or if they say, we love Dev Rowley's book, I can also say, you love that one. You're going to love this one too. And I was like, okay, I get it. So he's holding me off. He's holding me off on him pitching my book. But now he's got two books. So I was like, okay, cool, cool. Uh, so by this point, keep in mind, Dev Rowley's been moved. Dev Rowley's now in the medium security prison. In, in I'm medium Devaroli is now in the camp in Miami. He's now in, in Miami. In, uh, I think he's in the RDAP program in Miami. Um, I have to drink this. Hold on. Like the, the, when I have less coffee in me, I start making mistakes. Well, 
So I basically wrote literally about half of that book without Devaroli even being there. Now, Ross sent the book to Devaroli, and Devaroli reads the whole book, and he comes back and tells Ross, it's amazing. It's a great book, which is funny because, you know, portions of the book are fictionalized or completely they either they're fictionalized or they're they're embellished in such such a way that you know Devaroli obviously he knows like part like that never happened like that never happened that never happened he also knows like oh yeah that did happen but not like that like that's not what happened that wasn't the guy that wasn't for instance there's a part in the book <laughs> there's a part in the book where Devaroli and his buddies sneak up on this guy there's a like a security guard that kicks them off of a they were playing like basketball and they were like 14 or 15 years old and i remember devaroli had told me that the guy was he was like a a cuban guy that come over and like that was just trying to like make a living like he was a nice guy and devaroli and his buddy is like mouth off to him the guy's like come on you guys can't be here and, you know, you have to leave. He's like, so we leave. He's like, the guy was just doing his job. He, but, you know, we were pissed. He said, so we went home and we got our paint belt ball guns. And they waited until the lights went out. And they shot him. Four or five guys shoot him up with their paintball guns. And the guy's screaming and hollering and yelling. And they shoot him up with the paintball guns. He calls the police. The police come and they, they end up, you know, running back to uh, running back home. Well, of course, I end up having to rewrite that whole scene. Devaroli, when he read it, was like, because Ross told me, well, you know, um, Devaroli said that, you know, he's, he was laughing about how you changed some of the scenes where, like, like I, I, he's like, he said that guy was just a hardworking guy. And I ended up saying, like, he was, he had a mullet. He was a white guy. He was had a mullet. He was, uh, uh, you could tell he was a former football uh, former uh, football champion in high school. He had a pop belly. He was, you know, like I, I have him say all these things. He's dipping, like, uh, like I make him a very unsympathetic character. He's mouthing off to the got kids. He's telling them like, uh, he's calling them names and and pushing them around, and like they're just little kids. And then they run home and get their stuff. So you, when they shoot him, you feel like, oh, good, he has it coming. But the truth is, he didn't have it coming at all. He's just doing his job. Like you can't be on the on you cannot be on the courts this late. They, they're closed. You have to leave. Well, so you re, I rewrote that whole thing because they wanted him to be a sympathetic character. I can't have you running around with a paintball gun shooting security guards who are just doing their job. Like you know, like especially an immigrant who's you know he's Hispanic. Like okay, now you look like you're a racist or something. Like I can yeah, but you can shoot a white guy. So I get I have him shoot a white guy with a mullet who's a. Uh, and Ross, of course, loved it and laughed and said that was a great, oh, that's great, I love it. And But I did that throughout the whole book. I'm altering things to make Devaroli look as good as possible because you can't make him look the way he truly is. Like Jonah Hill made Devaroli look soft and cuddly in that movie compared to the real Devaroli. So back to the story. What ends up happening is I got the book. They love the book. They're all into the book. And Ross calls me up one day and tells me, I said, hey, so how's it? Oh, he didn't call me up. I'm in prison. He doesn't call me. Nobody calls me. I'm in prison. So I call him up one day and I say, listen, Ross, um, hey, what's going on? And he goes, oh, it's going great, man. Like I just had a meeting with Simon and Schuster. Uh, I said, okay. He said, um, I've been talking to, he'd been talking to screenwriters. He's talking to, uh, he, had, he had a contact at Simon and Schuster. They had read the book. They loved it. They read my book. The guy loved it. He said he was getting a deal with Simon & Schuster for both Devaroli's book and my book. That's huge. Like, that's huge. So, I'm excited. And the other thing he tells me is he's got the manuscript and Devaroli's cousin, who is in L.A., had put him in contact with another kid who was a producer. His mom is the producer. His mother, there was a movie called Blackfish about orcas. You ever heard of that? Like 20 years ago. Anyway, his mother owned a production company that did documentaries and she had done a super successful documentary called Blackfish. Blackfish. 
well, her son, I forget his name, was partners with another kid. And they, they, the Devaroli's cousin had talked to them and said, look, my cousin's Ephraim Devaroli. He just finished his memoir. Would you guys like to see it? Yeah, I have a man, I have the manuscript. And they said, we would love to see it. And so I'm, I'm like, oh, that's great. And Ross says, what's even better is that one of the two partners, a guy by the name of Shimmy, this is, I'm sure it's a nickname, right? Shimmy's father is, I forget his name. I have it written down. Somebody, Spira, uh, who is one of the, not CEO, one of the presidents. He's a president, not the president. There's They have multiple presidents. He's one of the presidents of Warner Brothers. And I was like, oh, okay. I said, so you want Shimmy to give the manuscript to his dad? And Ross says, no, 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 you don't understand. He said, Jonah Hill and Miles Teller have signed on to play Devaroli and Packhouse. They're probably going to get the movie made. It's too late for us to get the movie made. He said, but these guys are signing on and they're rewriting the script right now. And I went, um, okay. And I said, so I don't understand. He said, well, I'm wait. He, I think he had, was waiting for those two guys, Shimmy and the other guy, to get them NDAs, non-disclosure agreements. He had sent them non-disclosure agreements saying, I'll send you the manuscript, but you can't give it to anybody. They were like, okay. So they signed them and send them back. He goes, once I get them back, I'll send them the manuscript. And I was like, okay, I don't understand. He goes, well, the fact that his father is the head of the studio, uh, one of the one of Warner Brothers Studios, he's a friend of the president's. He goes, it just it just works to our advantage. That's all. It just it just helps us. And I'm like, oh, okay. And I didn't really understand. You have to understand by this point, I'm already writing other people's books. Like at this point, I was writing a book called Bailout. Oh, sorry, Bailout. Let's go this one. I like this one. This one's better for the book. Mm-hmm. This angle, I think, is better for the book. So Bailout, which was a guy by the name of Mark Shrinker. So at this point, I've got guys lining up saying, bro, I want to you to write my book. So I wrote the book Bailout. Putting that one there. So I remember being like, oh, okay, cool, cool, cool to Ross like okay cool like I, I this is just a phone call where I'm telling him what I'm doing because he would send me we would send emails back and forth he'd be like bro he'd be like call me tonight uh tell me uh so we can talk I'd call it he'd say hey here's what's going on with Deveroli I'd go okay he'd go what's going on with Shrinker and I'd tell him what's going on with Shrinker and he was ordering documents for me for Shrinker and mailing me stuff or like he's helping me with Shrinker and I'm like okay even though he didn't want to represent me on Shrinker's book he's like no I absolutely don't want to represent you because Shrinker's a scoundrel more so than most people yeah, definitely. More so than, de- than most people. So I'm like, okay, cool. So we're talking, and he tells me the thing about Shimmy. And I'm like, all right, cool. No big deal. I end up getting off the phone. I'm writing Shrinker's book. I end up finishing Shrinker's book. And I, I end up, uh, I finish Shrinker's book, and I end up working on, um, I start working on another book by this kid, uh, for this guy, uh, Douglas Dodd. So Doug Dodd ends up, um, following me around, really, to be honest. Doug Dodd is following me around and um, begging me to write his book. It was called, uh, um, the book at the time I was calling it, um, I called it, oh God, I called it, oh, I called it um, Oxy Rush. We were calling it Oxy Rush. So, uh, and and Doug, I remember Doug Dodd comes up to me. It was just a, it was a, it was a story about a bunch of kids who were selling pills in uh, um, in um, Hudson, Florida, and they were doing doctor shopping. Uh, they were selling uh, uh, oxycodone. So I remember Dodd follows me one day. He's like, "Bro, can you? I need you. Got to write my book. You got to write my story." And I was like, "You don't even have a story." And and we're going back and forth. And he goes, "Bro," I remember he said, "He goes, I'll give you fucking half of anything. I'll uh, uh, anything I make, I'll give you half." And I said, "Of course you're gonna give me half." 
So you think I was going to write it for less than half? Like, are you insane? Not only are you, you know, by this point, I already realize like, like I should be getting these guys to attach their life right store, the, everything across the board to these stories because they can't write their own stories. So anyway, I end up writing Doug Dodd's story. He built some of the nation's largest banks out of an estimated $55 million because $50 million wasn't enough and $60 million seemed excessive. He is the most interesting man in the world. I don't typically commit crimes, but when I do, it's bank fraud. Stay greedy, my friends. Support the channel. Join Matthew Cox's Patreon. I tell Dodd, you don't even have a fucking story. I said, here's what, what I'll do, bro. I was like, here's what I'm going to do. I'll write your story. I'll write a synopsis of your story. It'll be six or 7,000 words. I think it was six or seven. It was like seven or 8,000, something like that. I'll write them. And that's basically like a really large article. I said, I'll write the story. I'm going to send that synopsis off to a bunch of different um, reporters. And I'll try and get you into like Rolling Stone or Esquire or... Vanity Fair, something. I'll try and get you into one of these, one of these, you know, one of these magazines. If I can get you into a magazine, I said, then I'll write your book. But right now, I'm just going to write a synopsis because I don't think you have a. I don't think there's much of a story here. And I didn't know much of the story to be honest with you. I just didn't like Dodd. So he was, he was like pleading with me to do this. So I said, okay. So I write a story. I write his synopsis. I write the whole synopsis. I send it to seven or eight different art, uh, reporters. A couple of them write back, say, wow, it's amazing. You're an amazing storyteller. I don't have time to do it. I'm sorry. Or they said, hey, it's an amazing story. If you could just give me six months to a year, I'd be willing to take on this project. I get one guy that writes me back, and it's Guy Lawson, the same guy that wrote Devarole, or wrote Ephraim Devaroli and Pacquiao's story in Rolling Stone. And Guy Lawson says, I could get to this right away. I said, okay, cool. Guy Lawson comes back. I'm not going to get into the issues I had with Guy Lawson, but we go back and forth, back and forth. And I'm like, listen, man, like I want, he said, I can get, I can write Dodd's story and get it into uh, Media Magazine, which, and I was like, I've never heard of Media Magazine. He goes, oh, it's an online magazine. You have to understand I, I'm in prison, so I don't have access to the internet. So I was like, I don't want it on an online magazine. I want it in, back there. Back then there was a magazine also called Maxim. Is there still Maxim? Anyway, I was like, I want it in Maxim. Or I want it in Rolling Stone magazine. Or I want it in Esquire. I want it in GQ. Like I want it in a real magazine. I want to be able to hold it. Because I can't. He's like, well, I can print it off online and send you a copy. No, I want a magazine article. That's what I want. So he goes, we're going back and forth. He goes, well, this is not how it works. And, and it's way I can get it in here and I can do this. And I go, listen, you know what? Here, Here's what bothers me about this conversation. He goes, what? I said, I've sent you all the research. I wrote the entire article for you. I've done every, all the work for you. I said, you haven't even tried to get it into Rolling Stone. I said, now, if you'd already tried and you sent it to your editor and he read it and didn't want it, well, that's okay. We can talk about an online magazine. But I said, I mean, you're not even willing to try. I said, if you're not willing to try, then I, I, I'll just wait till somebody for somebody that can try. Somebody will try. Like, I, I don't mind failure. I mind not trying. And he went, all right, well, I, I, I'll, I'll see what I can do. So he calls his editor. His editor's name was, uh, fuck, I forget his first name. His last name's Wood. Anyway, goes to lunch with him, gives him the article. He reads it. He says, I want to put it in the magazine. So a few months later, the, I, I, I immediately, by the way, as soon as I hear it's going to be the magazine, I start writing Dodd's book. Um, and, but really, to be honest, by the time I had finished the, um, 
writing the synopsis of his story. I liked the story. Like I had sat down with him for a couple, for several hours, you know, probably spent 10 hours just writing the synopsis. And I heard all the ins and outs of the story. And it was a good story. Like I liked it. And the, the characters were likable, right? So, and it was unique. There was a lot of cutesy, unique things about the story, which were interesting. And, and it wasn't just a regular bunch of scumbag kids um, doctor shopping. It was more than that, right? So it was, it was like, it was a good story. So, okay, so um, Guy Lawson says he's going to write the story. And Guy Lawson said, I'll write the story. And he said, the story's going to be, he said, I'm going to use parts of the manuscript. Now, by this point, Doug Dodd has left prison. He left prison and went to the halfway house. And he has the manuscript. He sends the manuscript to... He sends a manuscript to Guy Lawson. Guy Lawson comes back and says, Matt, do you mind if I use some of the, some of the manuscript that you wrote and some of the, um, the, the, you know, the article that you wrote, the synopsis? And I was like, well, I don't know. He goes, he goes it's okay. He said, I'm going to do that, but I'm going to give you credit. So I, it, the article will be from Guy Lawson and Doug Dodd and Matt Cox. And I went, oh wow! He goes, you'll have been, you'll you'll be a writer for Rolling Stone magazine. I was like, holy shit! Like, yeah, definitely, I want to do that. Let's do that. So, a few weeks before the article comes out, Guy Lawson emails me and tells me that, oh, the guy's name is Sean Sean Wood, the editor of Rolling Stone magazine. He was Sean Wood. Said I talked to Sean Wood. And he doesn't want you and Doug to be the authors of the article. He said, he said, it'd be better if I gave you credit in the body of the work. And I go, no, 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 no. We agreed. We agreed. He said, no, no, Matt, it's okay. I'm going to give you credit in the body of the work. It's it's still your art. It's still your stuff. Like, I'm still going to talk, say that you did the story. You wrote the story. Like... He tells me all this bullshit and I'm like, no, absolutely not. Absolutely not. He's like, well, there's no other way. Like, this is it. That's the only way it's going to work. And I'm sorry. It's just just the way it is. And I was furious, but there's nothing I can do. I'm locked up in prison. There's nothing I can do. So the article comes out. So the article comes out in Rolling Stone magazine. Here it is. Let's go. Let's go that one. Look, that's the front cover. Okay. Now I'll switch here. Huh? That's the article. Right? That's the article. He calls it The Dukes of Oxy by Guy Lawson. Guy Lawson didn't write any of this article. Guy Lawson pulled 95% of the of what's in here out of my synopsis that I sent him. He barely changed anything he did however mention um he did however mention right here um that a while back doug dodd and his writing partner matthew cox sent me a document titled oxy rush from high school wrestling wrestlers to oxycodone kingpin asking if i might be interested in writing about the story more more pictures. Let's look. More pictures. There's more pictures of Don and and his bu- high school buddies. They've got Don. More pictures of Don. More pictures. There's more pictures. Oh, more pictures. So more. So it's a good side. It's a good article. It's good. It, it was. It was a good article. Like it wasn't great, but it was good. You know, anything that Guy Lawson touched on the article that altered my story at all made it bad. I hated it. So, um, anyway, no, it was, it was a decent article. It was a decent article. And, you know, because Dodd and I had an agreement, you know, in writing that, that I was going to get a portion of the, you know, we were splitting up the, um, his, his, uh, his rights. Um, Guy Lawson ended up optioning the 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 Rolling Stone article, so he optioned it to New Line Cinema, and 
an option is you know you that you give them 18 months they give you some money um and you get they get 18 months to turn it into a movie and then in 18 months if they haven't turned it into a movie then they give you another they get, they pay you again and they can extend it several times this has been extended i want to say four times so he ends up they end up optioning and of course Doug gets some, well of course Guy Lawson gets the lining share line share of it um, Doug Dog gets some money and I get some money which is great because I'm in prison I have no money um, and I what the great the best thing about that whole thing was that I was able to take this article and send it out to literary agents and get a book deal now the reason I didn't go to Ross Reback and get a book deal is because at this point, I, Ross had not pitched my book yet. He hadn't pitched. He was pitching Deveroli's book. He'd pitched Deveroli's book and my book, but he they didn't have a book deal. Like Simon and Schuster is trying to get them to sign. Deveroli isn't returning any letters. Like I've written him letters. I've tried to call him. Nothing. I've got nothing from this guy. Ross is telling me, well, Deveroli doesn't really feel like he should be talking to you. You know, like he just got out. He's concerned. He's on probation. He, he, he doesn't want to get in trouble for talking to a felon. Like it's, it's all bullshit. And it's it just, it, I just was becoming more and more distrustful of everything Reback was saying. Also by this point, Deveroli was being asked to be interviewed by um, the New York Times. We're talking about the New York Times, the LA Times. CNN wanted to do a documentary on Deveroli and his memoir and the writing of the memoir from inside of a federal prison with me. So you're supposed to be promoting your memoir and you're not doing it. You're not returning calls. You're not doing any. You're not doing anything. And at this point, I ended up, ended up writing an. I, I end up writing. Well, that, that, uh, look, look. What ends up happening is Ross and I like we're we're having issues. Like I'm I'm pissed because what's happening is he he isn't focusing on getting a book deal. All he seems to be focusing on at this point, because at this point they're now making the movie. War Dogs. They're making the movie War Dogs and all Reback seems to be concerned with is suing Warner Brothers. So now he's talking about suing Warner Brothers. At the same time, when this article and everything's coming out and I'm excited, I call Ross one day and Ross says to me, Hey, what's going on? He's like, hey, how's it going? I go, oh, it's going okay. It's good. He's like, you're not going to believe this. And I go, what? He said, I sent the I sent the manuscript that you wrote. And by the way, it's called Once a Gunrunner. The, the, the name of the manuscript is Once a Gunrunner. Deborah Rowley's memoir. So he goes, I sent Once a Gunrunner to these two producers. One of them's name is Shimmy. And this is months after he'd originally told me this. And I was like, right, okay. He goes, well, I was talking to Shimmy and, and his partner on the phone. I go, okay. And I was asking him how they were doing on trying to get funding to do a documentary about the manuscript. Okay, because that's what they had said they wanted to do. And I said, right. And he goes, and while I was talking to them and they were telling me that the movie had been greenlit, that there was no way to get a a movie made at this point because Warner Brothers had greenlit the movie War Dogs and they were now going to start filming it and Jonah Hill had signed on and Miles Teller had signed on and they were going to be shooting within months. Todd Phillips is involved, obviously. Bradley Cooper is signed up to direct and he's going to be in the movie. So there's just no way to get a film made. So that now we're just looking at doc, doing a documentary. And we're going to, and, and so he said, we're trying to figure out how to get the funding for the documentary. And I say to him, I'm like, okay. And, and Ross goes, so while I'm talking to them, I say to Shimmy, Shimmy, 
how do you know all this information? And Shimmy tells me his father is the president of Warner Brothers. And I go, uh, okay. Now, Ross told me that months ago, before he ever sent him anything, when he asked him to sign the NDA. He hadn't even sent him anything yet. And, and I was like, um, okay. And Ross says, and I told him, are you fucking serious? If I had known your father was the, was the president of Warner Brothers, I never would have sent you the manuscript. For all I know, you gave it to your father. And he tells me, he goes, I mean, for all I know, they used it to write the screenplay. And I was like, okay, right, right. And all I could think of was, why is he saying this? Like, why are you telling me this? When I, you've, like, it was like, I guess he forgot that he told me that Shimmy's father was the president of Warner Brothers. Like, why are you telling me this? I know that's bullshit. Like, that's a, that's total bullshit. You knew all this prior to sending him that. So he says he gets super offended with Shimmy. And he says, I can't believe that you guys did this. And he hangs up the phone. He said, so we're interviewing lawyers right now. We, we've got the one, this one lawyer right now that I'm, I'm talking to. And um, he this and he that and he and I'm going. Like this is all he's focusing on at all. He's, and I'm like, what's going on with Simon and Schuster? Oh, well, you know, I'm still kind of working with them. And I just don't know if I'm, I'm not sure about, I'm not sure if that's going to work out. Like it'll take them a while to publish the book. And, and you know, I, I don't, you know, it's, it's like, what the fuck is going on? So I end up writing Ross a letter that says, Ross, like I I cannot believe that this is what's going on, that I worked, you know, three or four months on this project, that you guys have completely pissed away every opportunity. Like when I was like, well, he's got to do the CNN documentary. Like some woman from, from New York or I'm sorry, from like Atlanta flew down to Miami, met with Deveroli, met with Ross, negotiated um, a deal with CNN where CNN was going to allow them to run ads during the CNN, like a, a two hour CNN documentary on Devaroli. They were going to allow them to run ads about the memoir and produce and put the memoir out. How many ads, how many books do you think would have sold had they run ads on a two hour documentary about Devaroli and about their case? that case prior to or during the course when the movie comes out like i'm thinking a lot of books i'm thinking that that's probably turns it into a bestseller wouldn't do it same thing uh they both met with the guy who did um corbin what's his name michael corbin tim i don't know somebody tell me in the comment section corbin who also is a miami who, who wrote who did the the documentary um, Square Grouper and Cocaine Cowboys? Same thing. They met with him. He wanted to do a documentary. Didn't happen. Also, wouldn't be interviewed by the New York Times. So I write this letter saying, "Look, you you guys have completely fucked up this situation. Your only concern at this point is suing Warner Brothers. You're not even trying to publish the goddamn book. Like." Let's get the book out before Lawson gets his book out. They're, they're, they're not even remotely concerned about that because they've already set it up to sue Warner Brothers. So the idea of pushing to get this book, like I'm like, let's self-publish the book. You're wasting your time suing Warner Brothers. Warner Brothers hasn't done anything wrong. And so that's what I write in this letter. I send this letter to Ross. So I, I mail this letter to I, I send this letter to Ross, and um, I don't hear from Ross anymore. Like I sent this letter like blasting him and Deveroli because keep in mind Deveroli doesn't I don't hear from Deveroli. 
I don't hear from Deborah Rowley. I don't hear from Ross. They've completely fucked up all these opportunities. I'm like, self-publish the book and do the CNN documentary and be interviewed by the New York Times, the LA Times, the like. There's dozen. There's like a dozen magazines that, or a dozen are, um, newspaper newspapers that want to talk to him. He could be in any magazine he wanted. And there would have been a, a, a 6,000 word article on him. And it could have been about, and I re- just wrote my book. Like you would have sold a ton of books. None of that happens. So I'm pissed. I mail this letter and I don't even talk to Ross anymore. I haven't even heard from Ross at this point. Um, so I'm look, I'm going to, I'm going to, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and, uh, so I'm going to keep going for a second just so I can explain one thing. So, at this point, like I don't, I haven't heard from Ross in weeks or months. He's not returning emails. I don't, talk, you know, that's it. Like, like I'm like, okay, this guy's got my book. He's got Deveroli's book. Deveroli doesn't talk to me. Ross doesn't talk to me. I'm stuck in prison. Like, like what do they care? They don't care. Um, at this point, though, I basically go. I, I've now gone back to tr- uh, gone back to sentencing. I've managed. I had 26 years when I started. I managed to get it dropped down by seven years. I got seven years knocked off my sentence, and I explained that in one of the other videos. So I'm not going to get into all that. So I end up knocking get, it's getting at this point. It's seven years has been knocked off my sentence. Um, which keep in mind, Devaroli isn't doesn't know any of this. So. He still, th- he and Ross are like, this guy's locked up till 2030. Like, they don't have to deal with me. It's not hard. You just don't email me. You don't, you don't call, you don't email me and you don't pick up the phone. How hard is it to get rid of some guy in prison? Don't pick up the phone. You don't have to hear from this guy again. So I'm walking around the compound writing stories, still writing stories. Um, at this point, actually, at this point, I think I'm writing. Bent. By this point, I've written the book Bent. So I think everybody that's watching this probably knows who John Boziak is. John Boziak is um, a credit card, a a kid who grew up homeless on the streets of Miami and ended up uh, becoming a credit card counterfeiting, credit card counterfeiter. And he he sold like, is it like 2.5 million or 3.5 million dollars in counterfeit credit cards to the Russian mob? He's on multiple different indictments. Super cool story. Check it out. Pick it up. It's on Amazon. Um, anyway, so I've written that story. I'm writing that story. I'm walking around the compound one day. And this guy that I was also also writing a, another story about, this guy named um, Dennis Caroni. Dennis Caroni, I'm sitting at a table with Dennis Caroni. And my fr- I'm, I'm sitting at a table in an area that they called Stonehenge on the compound. It's late. It's, it, it's like 7 or 8 o'clock at night. I'm sitting there. And I'm talking to 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 um my buddy Pete, and we're talking. And this guy Dennis Caroni walks by, and he goes, "Hey, Cox," and I'm like, uh, "He actually calls me Matthew." He he's like, "Matthew, Matthew." And I'm like, "What? What's up?" And he goes, "He said you making any money off that book?" And I go, "What book?" And he goes, "The book, the book, um, you know, uh, that book." And I I thought he meant. Um, I remember initially I thought he meant because when I got the guys in Rolling Stone, the other guys that I, I had gotten, a, I ended up getting a book deal for a, that Doug Dodd. We ended up getting a book deal. I wrote his book I ended up writing his book and I got a literary, a, another, a second. So now I got another literary agent because I don't trust Ross anymore. So I've got another literary agent and I ended up writing this story, this book, which is basically the article that was in Rolling Stone about Doug Dodd, I end up getting a book deal. I get an advance. It's on the sh- shelves at Barnes and Nobles. It was published. It's called Generation Oxy. Like I liked my, 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 my title was Oxy Rush. Um, Guy Lawson named his generation. No, Guy Lawson named his version. His it's totally stolen version of my of my story in Rolling Stone. He called it uh, the Dukes of Oxy, and then I ended up writing the the whole book, and we got a book a deal with Skyhorse Publishing, and it's called Generation Oxy: From High School Wrestlers to Pain Pill Kingpins, which was a great subtitle. Anyway, so I ended up getting this book. So I remember, you know, 
Dennis Caroni says, hey, man, you making any money? I was like, um, and I actually, and I thought he meant this one, but I don't think this had come out yet or something, but I remember being, going like, what are you talking about? He's like, you know, Dev Rowley's book. Do you make any money on that? And I went, no. I said, there's, and I didn't want to get into it with him. So I was like, nah, they're still looking for publishers. And he goes, what are you talking about? I said, they're still looking for publishers. They haven't published it yet. And he goes, what are you talking about, bro? And he pulls out Ocean's Drive Magazine. Keep in mind, I have no way to check on anything. I'm locked up. I can't check on anything. I can't. There's no internet. Ross isn't answering the phone. Dev Rowley doesn't answer the phone. Nobody's answering nothing from me. So I don't know what's going on. He pulls out Ocean's Drive Magazine. Right there. And he shows me a picture of Ephraim Dev Rowley. Ephraim Dev Rowley's right here. Ephraim Devaroli is holding a copy of his manuscript, or sorry, copy of his book, his hardcover book. It says under the caption, Ephraim Devaroli at the 2016 Miami Book Fair in Miami. And he's got what looks like 50 or 100 books behind him. And he's holding up my book. Once a gun runner. Let's do this. Look right here. We're going to switch. We're going to switch. Once a gun runner. He's holding up once a gun runner. And look, my name's right there. Ephraim Dever, memoir, Ephraim Dever, with Matthew Cox. And you know what it doesn't say? It doesn't say based. It doesn't say based on his truth, on this story. It says, once a gun runner, the real story. It says that everything in the book is 100% accurate and correct, told by the very person that, that lived it. I remember being very concerned about that. Um, I immediately, immediately was just like, I, I just remember this, this wave of heat running over my whole body and Pete, I explain, Pete goes, what's going on? Because I just met Pete. And so I tell Pete what's happening. And Pete is like, oh, wow, that's crazy, bro. He, Pete goes to his mother, goes and gets on the phone, calls his mother. I end up going and calling my sister. And I end up, I end up getting, we end up getting several press releases sent in. And it turns out that they had just filed their lawsuit. And in their lawsuit, they explain, Ross explains that Shimmy had given the manuscript to his father, the president of Warner Brothers, and they had used the manuscript to rewrite the screenplay and they were shoot that the mo entire movie had been shot based off of Devaroli's book and not Packhaus, not not Packhaus's version, or not the Rolling Stone version of the story, which is based on Packhaus's uh, telling of the story. So it's it's really the whole movie is based on that book. So, I, 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 which by the way, I know is a lie. Like, I'd love to sit here and tell you, yeah, man, they used my book to write the movie and I got screwed. But that's a fucking lie. Like, that's not what happened. They set up Shimmy to, to possess the book so they could sue Warner Brothers. And let's face it, that's a great scam. Like, that in front of a jury would play out amazingly. So at this point, I, I'm, I'm, I'm like in shock at what happened. And if you watch the next video, I'll explain exactly what ends up happening. Because my buddy Pete comes in and Pete's like, you got to sue them. You have to sue them. What the fuck am I going to sue anybody? I'm in federal prison. You can't sue. Let me tell you why you can't sue anybody from federal prison. Because at some point, if you sue somebody in a civil lawsuit in federal prison, and at some point it goes to trial, even if you can manage to keep up with all of the back and forth with the court, state or federal court, 
You can go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Do you know what ultimately, ultimately ends up happening? You end up having to go to court and guess what? You can't go to court because you're in federal prison. And that's a problem. I had just found out that, I had just found out in this book right here that, uh, by that, somebody who showed me that magazine that Deborah Rowley and Reback had published Once a Gun Runner. So I end up calling, so I, I contact, I end up going and contacting Deborah Rowley. I meant Deborah Rowley, what am I saying? I contact uh, Ross Reback and Ross is like, you know, oh yeah, we, well, no, so I called him because I hadn't spoken with him. So I, I actually end up calling him like, I don't know how long ago how long it went by. It wasn't long, a couple of days, maybe a week or so. I'm not sure exactly, but I ended up calling him because I'd called him several times and he wasn't answering the phone or anything. And I, he's like, he answers it and just starts talking to me. Hey, well, hey, what's going on? How are you doing? Like nothing. And says, oh, you're not, oh, and this is what's funny too, is that, uh, is that Dev Rowley had actually disappeared on Reback for a while. So he hadn't spoken with Dev Rowley in a while. And he told me, you're not going to believe this. And I may have this slightly out of order, but he go, He was like, oh, hey, you know, who talked to me, who called, uh, who contacted me the other day? I was like, who? He's, he was uh, uh, Ephraim. And I went, really? He said, I said, oh, I thought he had kind of disappeared. He goes, well, he did. And he told me that, you know, he went, after he got out of prison, he kind of went nuts for a few months. And he, you know, he was just. He just went, you know, crazy and and put everything aside and had a bunch of personal issues he had to deal with and just kind of went on a drunken, you know, stoner binge and you know just went on and on and on. And and I was like, oh, okay. He goes, but you know, it it he goes, but it's really all bullshit. And I go, what do you mean it's bullshit? And he goes, well, yeah, it's bullshit. He said, he said, um, he said he was back back on had gotten you know back on track and wanted to get everything taken care of and get everything done. And I was like, okay. He said, but it, it, it turns out that that's not true. He said he had actually, he was actually trying to shop like the book and his, um, you know, getting a, like a movie made himself behind Ross's back. Cause he had sent him a, he had sent him an email like, Hey, look, cause that about self publishing and he sent him an email and he said on the email, was a whole chain of emails that showed that Devaroli had been working for months behind Ross's back trying to get his book published without Ross. He said, but then he realized, eventually he realized he couldn't do it without me. And that's when he recontacted him and, and was just like, hey man, look, you know, I just, I, I, I want to get this thing going. Like, I'm sorry. And gave him some bullshit excuse. And Ross said, no problem. He was, so we started, you know, we got together and we got the book published and, um, we filed a lawsuit against Warner and I was like, right, right. And at that moment they were actually, they had sued Warner and they, they had actually filed like judgment, like all kinds of things against Warner. And it were trying to get the movie f to stop the movie from coming out, from being released in theaters. Like it was ridiculous. It was, just, it was never going to happen, but they were trying to be like a thorn in Warner, so Warner brothers side. And, so at that moment, they were taking all of the trailers for the movie and they were going through and cutting up the trailers and trying to figure out how the trailer correlated with scenes out of the book. So that's what they were doing. They were cutting it up like, hey, this scene on page 122, 123, 124 is actually this scene. But a lot of the scenes had been altered so much that it was just difficult. It was, it, he, he's like, you know, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a problem. We're going to wait. He's like, I mean, these are little two-minute clips, 30 seconds, two minutes, a minute and a half. He said, uh, trailers. So I'm sure that once we get the movie, there'll be tons of scenes that overlap. I was like, oh, okay. So... When the movie did come out, eventually, weeks you know weeks later, and they saw the movie, I called Ross right away. Like I knew he was going to see it. Called him. I was like, "Hey, what's what's going on? What happened?" 
and he listen, you never heard anybody so disappointed. He was like, um, you know, there's, there's some problems. Like, uh, I was like, really? He's yeah, uh, we're gonna have to see, talk to our lawyer. I go, what's the problem? He goes, well, he goes, honestly, it's a, it's a vastly different story than what's in Ephraim's, what's in, you know, what's in Once a Gun Runner. He said, and what's in Lawson's book or the article. He has to be honest with you. He said, the only real similarities in this stories are the fact that, um, or the fact that, you know, these guys were two kids, two young guys in Miami, two Jewish kids in Miami that ended up getting this contract and how they were putting it together. He was, but honestly, like the stories are just, he's, I mean, it's just complete fiction. The whole movie. I go, well, how much of it? He goes, don't like the whole movie. He said like, that. I mean, there's like, and he just starts naming one scene after another. He's like, he's like, like, like Packhouse. He's like at the beginning of the movie, Packhouse gets David Packhouse gets kidnapped. You know, the character played by Miles Teller in in the movie War Dogs is is, uh, is David Packhouse. He's like in the very beginning of the movie, he gets kidnapped and they they drag him out in the middle of this lot and they're in Albania and they stick a gun to his head and they're about to blow his head off. And I'm like, when did that happen? That I don't ever remember. He goes, no, it didn't happen. I'm like, oh. He goes, and then there's a scene like where they're, they're driving, they're racing around in matching Porsches. There was no, Pacquiao's never had a Porsche. Deveroli never had a Porsche. Deveroli drove a 10-year-old Mercedes the whole time. The whole time they were doing the contract. He's like, they've got a scene where they smuggle cash through customs. That never happened. They've got, like, he must have listed off 12, 15 things. One, he goes, that's just what I can think of. He goes, and, and the whole thing is, is he has the bulk of it. He goes, although Deveroli's character is there, he said the bulk of it is really David Packhouse. He goes, I'm just, I just don't know what we're going to do. And I was like, oh, okay. Well, I mean, maybe, maybe you can still do the documentary. Like maybe you can still, you know, I'm still like trying to, salvage this book um anyway he's like i don't know we're gonna have to talk to our lawyer well at the same time this happens an article in i want to say it's new times new times comes out and it's the article is basically about war dogs and it's the article talks about how and and the guy obviously the the um because never really doesn't talk to anybody so all these horrible articles and things are coming out because Deveroli and Reback don't want to talk to anybody because they're so concerned about their lawsuit. They don't want to say anything wrong. And you can't really have Deveroli talk to anybody because you don't know what he's going to say. So, but this article comes out, David Packhouse, talk to the, the reporter. And it's basically, the guy says, Dever, Packhouse says, Deveroli's m- memoir is absolute fiction. Like he starts talking about how it's fictitious and this is fictitious and this didn't happen. And that, you know, just, it's just like, he's like, he, you can't trust anything this guy says. And he's going on and on. So he's going on and on about it. And I, I don't, you know, I don't know what to do. Um, they've got a lawsuit going. Well, d- um, they, they end up having this. Okay, so Dev- so Reback and Deveroli have a lawyer that's representing them that's suing Warner Brothers, and they end up going to the lawyer, and the lawyer ends up saying, hey, I don't want to represent you anymore. Like, everything you told me, because imagine what they told them. They told, they told this lawyer, Warner Brothers stole the book, and they have proof that really looks it's it's circumstantial but it looks pretty good this guy contacted me he wanted to see it get a copy of the manuscript i gave made him sign a non-disclosure i sent shimmy the the manuscript shimmy gave it to his father they rewrote the screenplay and they published the 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 movie the movie's based on deveroli's manuscript that's what they're telling their lawyer the truth of the matter is, once they see the movie, 
they know that the movie's nothing like Deveroli's uh, manuscript. It's been vastly altered and fictionalized. So, but keep in mind too, Warner Brothers is also publicizing this thing as being the true story. There's all these, like you've got, you've got, um, you have Jonah Hill coming out saying, you know, what's amazing about this story is that these are real guys. This really happened. Same thing. Miles Teller saying, well, the great thing about this is that, you know, these guys are, these are real guys that this really happened to. Um, same thing. Todd Phillips is saying the same thing. It's a great, what's great about it is, you know, we got it from this article in Rolling Stone about this, about these two guys that really did these things. Like they're, they're all saying true story, true story, true story. So, but it's, it's, it's never going to hold up in court at this point. So, so the lawyer for Reback says, we don't want to represent you. So he takes the loss and, and he says, you know, kick rocks. Okay. So Ross takes it. And then goes to a law firm. I want to say the law firm was in Tampa. So they go to this law this law firm. I think they 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 I think they drop the lawsuit. No, they don't drop it. They have it amended. The new lawyer amends the lawsuit, and he amends it to drop all of the theft of intellectual property claims. And he replaces them with something called Lanham, the Lanham Act. Using a homeless man's identity, he once borrowed nearly $1.5 million just to see if he could. He is the most interesting man in the world. I don't typically commit crime, but when I do, it's bank fraud. Stay greedy, my friends. Support the channel. Join Matthew Cox's Patreon. So these are Lanham Act claims. The Lanham Act claims or says under the Lanham Act, you cannot lie to the public. You cannot falsely advertise a product and then profit from it. So if I say that, you know, if I start selling a Mustang 5.0, or a, you know, a, a, a new Ford Mustang, and I say it's got 750 horsepower, and no matter what happens, if you hit the brakes, it will not skid or lose control. You know, completely like you like, it, and then you get the car, and you come come to find out it actually doesn't have 700 horsepower. It's got 650 horsepower, and if you hit the brakes in the rain hard enough on a grease on an oily surface, it will skid out of control. Like. Like, it's just like there's like little things you can't, you cannot lie, knowingly lie to the public and then profit, make a profit. So in the Lanham Act, it says you can't make any profit, which means that if in court they were to win the Lanham Act claim, that means that Warner Brothers could not profit at all from the movie. They would be stripped of all of their profits. And this is a movie that was made with forty million dollars, and it grossed well over a hundred, hundred and fifty, two hundred million dollars. Well, I don't know if it's two. It's probably two hundred fifty. Two, it's probably two hundred million now. It was a huge success. So they file a Lanham claim, a Lanham claim against Warner, and they say, "Look, these guys." They, they continue their whole theory of they stole the book. Now, so now it's actually brilliant what they say. They say they stole the manuscript. So that's still, they're still going with that. And the reason, and the reason they stole the manuscript is that they stole the manuscript specifically to use it so that they did not have any overlapping stories that would allow Deveroli to, to sue. And honestly, that's probably what happened. What's funny is in all of Warner Brothers' responses and motions, they never once deny that they got a hold of the manuscript. Because the truth is, they probably got a hold of the manuscript. Like what, what Ross set Shimmy up to do most likely actually happened. Now, he was going to say it happened no matter what, but it probably did happen. But Warner Brothers, and this is all speculation, Warner Brothers most likely got a hold of the manuscript in order to use it 
to circumvent Devaroli's potential claims, which they knew were coming. So they probably did use it to rewrite it and alter all of the scenes they could so that it didn't overlap the manuscript so that Devaroli wouldn't have a chance to sue. Unfortunately, while doing that, they ended up fictionalizing the movie. And in their response to Devaroli and Reback's lawsuit, Warner Brothers comes back and they say they have altered the movie to such a degree that it is essentially a fiction film. So in their response to the original lawsuit where they said it was theft of intellectual property, they said we fictionalized the film. That's why when they come back with the Lanham Act, they say, you've already admitted you fictionalized a film, yet you are advertising this film as being the true story. When you've already admitted you fictionalized it. Now, that put them in a bad position because obviously their lawyers were not thinking, holy shit. Like, like they were thinking, how do we avoid getting sued by this guy, Devaroli, which we know is going to sue. In the meantime, they ended up stepping into a Lanham Act claim. And that's, that's, that was an issue. Lanham, Lanham Act claims are almost never brought to trial because most, most production or product company, most, most manufacturers do not mislead the public to such a degree that they can have a claim, but they Warner brothers clearly did. And that was an issue. So they start going back and forth with Warner brothers, uh, lawyers and Warner brothers lawsuits are, are, are lawyers are like, um, Petrocelli. It's, I forget the guy's name, but basically it's like Trump's lawyers. Like these are like huge lawyers. Like if you're IBM and you're getting sued, these are the guys you hire. They're, you know they're 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 good lawyers. They're amazingly expensive. They probably get a, you know a thousand fifteen hundred bucks an hour. You know, so they're they're racking up bills, racking up, uh, and they're they're also filing motions back and forth. And these guys, and the thing is, is we're watching them go back and forth, back and forth. And I go to I end up uh, I end up going to Frank Amadeo, who I've mentioned in a prior video, who's a disbarred attorney, and I talk to him. And initially he says, don't enter the, don't enter the lawsuit. Like don't sue them because the first lawsuit was fictitious. Like I know that that's a lie. I'm not going to enter that lawsuit because I know it's a lie. So, you know, it could end up being because of my current charges were fraud. I could end up with a, a I could end up with a fraud charge. Because I'm now trying to enter into a lawsuit that I know is a fraud. Therefore, you're committing fraud. It's complicated, but because I already have a federal sentence, it's not hard for the FBI to come in and say, you're saying that this is a fraud and you want in on it. Anyway, my point is when they switch it to the Lanham Act, now I'm in a position to enter the lawsuit. So Pete's telling me, you've got to sue them. You have to sue them. You have to sue them. They are potentially could make, let's say Warner Brothers probably made 80 to 100 million dollars on this, on this thing. He's like these, and it was growing. Keep in mind, it had already, by the time we were even talking about it, it had already made over a hundred million dollars. Now that was it. The film had been out for three or four months. This is in 2016. You know, you have to think this whole thing that I've been talking about since 2011 has spread. What I'm telling you in the in the last video and this video, all of this is spread out over the course of years. So Pete's saying you've got to you got to sue him. So I end up going to Frank Amadeo. I we, we, Pete and I talk to Frank. Frank looks at the whole thing and Frank says, "Yeah, I agree. You've got to sue. You you, you should definitely enter this lawsuit." We talk to a judge, um, Judge uh, Michael Can uh, Conahan. Judge, this is also a judge that's locked up in federal prison with it. Judge Conahan. I'm not sure if anybody's ever seen heard of uh, Cash for Kids. Judge Conahan was locked up in prison because he and another judge were taking kickbacks from a um, from a juvenile facility, a private juvenile fa ju private juvenile facility was giving Conahan and another judge kickbacks every time they sentenced a juvenile offender to 
the juvenile facility. Can you imagine that? So you're, and they were talking about like, like some of the, the problem is it was called cat. The name of the case and the whole thing where there was a book written about, it, it was called cash for kids. And what's happening is you've got kids that should have gotten a year probation and they're giving them like 18 months in this fed, in this facility. And then they would cut them a check. You know, they would give them money and it ended up being, I'm going to say 2.5 or 2.8. I've heard different different numbers 2.8 or 2.5 million dollars that the two judges got now i'm not sure if they got that amount of money combined or if each one got roughly that amount of money um but either way they were they they called the whole case cash for kids and there was a book called cash for kids so we go to the judge and we show the judge and talk to the judge and we talk to frank and the judge is sitting there kind of listening and the judge is like yeah you should you should definitely consider um, entering the lawsuit. And when I say entering the lawsuit, there's already a lawsuit going in, uh, going on. So what happens is you're basically trying to join the lawsuit. Like, Hey, I'll represent myself, but I want to, I want to join this lawsuit. I want to, um, I forget the name of it. They call it, it's a motion where you say, basically, I want to connect my lawsuit with their lawsuit. And what's great about that is basically they're now, if, if I'm allowed to do that, then they're basically, running my lawsuit and I'm also suing Devaroli. So I'm suing all the people that they're suing and I'm suing them too. So now I'm in there with you guys and it doesn't take much work because you're basically copying their motions and just adding in Ross and, and, uh, um, De- Devaroli. So Pete ends up saying, so, um, Frank Amadeo is like, yeah, definitely. Uh, Pete can write everything up. Because Pete's, uh, because Amadeo is basically running a, a law firm from inside of the prison. He's helping other inmates. So Pete basically is going to do all the work and write the motions, and Frank's going to look it over and rewrite it and do whatever he needs to do to kind of shift and guide the whole lawsuit. No problem. Um, Pete says, look, I'm going to start typing all of this up. We need to file. We need to file. And I keep putting it off. So here's the reason I put it off. I continually put it off because I kept saying to Pete, I want to talk to Ross. Like, although I was irritated at Ross and I'm pissed off about it and I'm, I'm, I'm pissed off about the situation. I feel like I've really gotten the run around. Like this guy, basically he's got my book. He has my book. He's my literary agent. I've signed a contract with, like, I've, I've got an agreement with this guy. He's done nothing. He has not, he has not gotten me a book deal. He he held me off for over a year and change with Devaroli, and he attached me to Devaroli's project. And he's not trying to pitch my project at all, at all. They've done. You know, he he really really sidelined me. He built some of the nation's largest banks out of an estimated fifty-five million dollars, because fifty million wasn't enough, and sixty million seemed excessive he is the most interesting man in the world i don't typically commit crimes but when i do it's bank fraud stay greedy my friends support the channel join matthew cox's patreon but i wanted to talk to him and give him a chance so i send him an email i say i really need you to come see me I mentioned the lawsuit. I mentioned all the things that went have gone wrong. And I say, but I really need you to come see me. And he says, well, I'm, I'm busy. I'm super busy. Why can't we just talk on the phone? I said, I don't want to talk on the phone. and I don't want to talk on, on uh, True Links, which is the email system. I said, because I want to look you in the face. I want to have a serious conversation. And it's in your best interest that we do this as quickly as possible. He comes back and he's like, well, I'll try and get there on Wednesday or something like that. Well, Wednesday comes and he never shows up. I sent him something. I'm like, Ross, if I don't, if you don't show up in the next, you know, like 10 days, because there was basically, I said, I, I absolutely, um, it, it's, it's, it's going to be a problem. Now, the reason I say that is because in like 13 or 14 days, Warner Brothers, and Ross, Ross and Devaroli and Warner Brothers had a scheduled mediation. Warner Brothers was trying to settle with Devaroli and Ross. Because of the Lanham Act, they wanted to settle the case. 
They don't want it to go to trial. They don't want to. First of all, think about it like this. If Ross and Devaroli went to trial and won, that means that Warner Brothers can't market the film anymore. They can't not only just market the film. If they do market it, they can't market it being a true story. And if you listen to all the things that Todd Phillips and all of these guys say, they're continually saying, what's great about this film is it's a true story. It's a true story. It's a true story. Like that holds a lot. Matter of fact, I think there's a huge, there's a, a clip where Miles Teller says, you know, that he says, true story holds a lot of credibility with audiences. Like, and, and so you can't, now you can't, now you're done. So did you really want to dump? And if they win, they'll get stripped of all their profits. Now, maybe not all of them, but but the, that's what the Lanham Act says. If you're caught with a Lanham violation, you cannot profit from it. So that potentially means they get no profits. Anyway, they had a scheduled mediation on a certain day, let's say it was the, I don't know what day, but let's say it was the 20th. So basically I said, you have to like the 15th to show up. In the meantime, Pete, my buddy Pete is typing up like a hundred page. It's like a hundred page. I don't know if it's a hundred, maybe it's 80, but it's like a hundred page motion uh, or lawsuit to file. Oh, I don't, an intervention. I think it's called an intervention lawsuit. So he's filing our lawsuit. And I'm saying, Ross, come see me. Because I don't want to file it. But I do want to file it before they have their mediation. Because what if they end up having the mediation and they end up they end up getting a settlement that doesn't include me? So and Warner Brothers has no clue who I am. I've never been mentioned in any of this, in this whole thing. I've never been mentioned. Even though my name's clearly on the book, they've never mentioned me. So Ross ends up coming back and he says, just call me on the phone. I said, no, bro, you have to be here by this time. Now, Ross knows that's a few days before their mediation. Why he didn't show up, like literally if Ross had shown up, Ross could have shown up and said, look, We'll include you in the lawsuit. Or you know what? I'm going to give you 10 grand to go away. I'll give you 10, 20 grand, 10 or 20 grand just to go away. Matt, I promise you, you'll will this, will that, like I, anything. But the way it was working is that these two guys convinced me to write this book and they were walking away with all the benefit and they had, they had self-published the book and sold a few hundred copies. And by the way, never cut me a check. Like I didn't get it. It's not like I got a check. It's not like they sent me 200 bucks or 50 or five. They didn't send me any money for the book. So um, anyway, what, what ends up happening is um, Ross doesn't show up. So we file our motion. We file our motion like four or five days beforehand. It gets filed in the court the day before meet their mediation. And they get notified, so they get automatically get notified. The day of the mediation, of their settlement, their settlement mediation to, to try and work out a settlement, Warner Brothers cancels. Because in my, in my lawsuit, I say that I'm the true owner of the copyright. And not only am I the true owner of the copyright, that... They had set up Shimmy. I, I lay it all out. They set up Shimmy to get a hold of the manuscript to give it to Warner Brothers in order to sue them on the first lawsuit. It's a complete fraud. That is a 100% scam that Devaroli and Reback are running on Warner Brothers. And that they had been planning it since when I, since they'd been planning it since they asked me to write the book. And I had written a, the letter to Ross. Remember the letter I wrote to Ross? Way before they ever filed the lawsuit. And I'd written a letter to Devaroli. In the letter to Devaroli, I say, 
you and Ross are spending all of your time uh, um, scheming about a lawsuit to sue Warner Brothers and Simon Schuster and all these other people um, when they haven't done anything wrong. They haven't done anything wrong and you're th- you're trying to sue them instead of just trying to get the book published. That's what you should be focusing on. Stop stop talking to lawyers and stop planning on, stop trying to uh, or scheming to sue these guys. They haven't done anything wrong. Listen. That letter's dated like it's like a year it's like a year, year and a half or something like that, like an outrageous <laughs> amount of time. Before it's dated, way before the before the movie's being shot, like before anything that I'm talking about, them suing them for theft of intellectual property when they haven't done anything wrong, like it it blows their whole lawsuit. And we of course put a copy in. Um, then I explain that I, I mean we've got multiple letters that we we put in there that show that what I'm saying is correct, and that of course I wrote the book. Um, anyway. Warner Brothers cancels it. And Warner Brothers comes back and says says to the court, we would like to depose Mr. Cox because we believe Mr. Cox has pertinent information um, in this case. You know, that basically what they're saying, like Mr. Cox is alleging that he is the true, the true copyright owner. And let me tell you why I would be the true copyright owner because because you cannot use the the copyright a copyright in furtherance of a scheme you in the further for fraud you can't you cannot file a fraudulent copyright in order to sue and that's exactly what they had done like the copyright law says you cannot you can't use you can't use the court system in furtherance of a law of of any type of a fraud and if Devaroli and Reback are using the copyright laws for the purpose of a scam, then they lose the protection of the copyright law. And therefore, the intellectual property reverts to the person that wrote it. And I wrote it. So the only person left with the ownership is me. And I was saying they're using the copyright law in furtherance of a fraud. And I can prove it. So it doesn't look good. Anyway, what ends up happening is, is can you imagine? So I remember Pete and I were walking around the compound after we filed it. And when we got like two days later, uh, his mother sent him a copy of the uh, docket, the the civil docket in their, in their proceedings where it showed that Warner Brothers had canceled the mediation. And then two days later, she wanted to, wanted to, you know, whatever they, then they, then they like want to talk to me, um, want to depose me. And, uh, I just remember Pete and I walking around the compound, just laughing our asses off going, bro, like, what do you think that conversation was like? Can you imagine when Reback and Devaroli show up to their lawyer's office ready for the fucking deposition? And he's like, who's Matt Cox? Huh? What do you mean? <laughs> I mean, why? <laughs> Did you guys set Shimmy up to get a copy of the manuscript so you could sue Warner Brothers? I mean, they must have been. So here's what the really funny part is. You know that the lawyer believed me because the lawyer quits. Like the lawyer says, I'm done. And And so now they go out and they have to find another lawyer. They're on their third lawyer. So... They contact me and they want to, the lawyer ends up contacting me and he wants, they want to settle. But I'm like, settle with what? Like they, they want to give me, I forget what they offered. It was such a joke. It was like a thousand dollars. It was something so stupid, but it was like, they wanted to settle. I'm pretty sure that's when they offered it. I'm, I'm not positive. That's when they, they started emailing me and asking me to settle. I'm pretty sure that's when they off, off, started offering, talking about settlement. Uh, anyway, then they end up filing a motion saying that they wanted the court to drop my petition. Um, they go back and forth. And so the new lawyer 
I remember, I'm going to tell him this part. This is funny. I remember, so my, my brother works for my brother-in-law at a, at a law, at his law firm. So I remember I talked to the new lawyer, the new lawyer, they, they got a new law firm in downtown Tampa. My brother, I'm talking to him on the phone. I'm like, hey, what's going on? And I had to talk to my brother. I remember I called my brother because I, I was, I what was I was going to do? I was going to file. They were trying to get my, oh, I was trying to serve everybody. I was trying to get a, a, a process server to like serve everybody or something on, on another lawsuit. Um, and uh, for, for them, for them. And I ended up calling my brother and I talked to my brother and I said, Hey, what's going on? He goes, Hey, listen, man. He said, You know, this law firm that, that, that Ross and Deborah Rowley have. He goes, I was talking to, to Jack, my brother in law, and he goes, He, um, he said this, this law firm is known to be particularly treacherous. Like, like they are extremely, um, they're extremely tough. They are, they are, I forget the word he used. Um, uh, they're known to be just really just like, cutthroat vicious just vicious so you need he said you know matt needs to watch himself i go they're vicious huh and he goes yeah i said the two guys running my lawsuit one of them's in here for stealing 200 million dollars from the federal government and then plotting the takeover of a country and i go the second guy is in here for murdering two federal informants are they more treacherous than that and he was just like (laughs) well Maybe not, maybe not that treacherous. I was like, well, I'll stick with my guys. So I'm not worried about it. Uh, so we go, we're going back and forth. Like li- literally the, the lawsuits are going back and forth, back and forth. This goes on forever. And we're trying to not have me deposed because here's my, my, initially what my fear is like, I don't want to be deposed because during that deposition, one of the things I had said was that, I knew that they had, you know, that Deveroli had, I had proof that Deveroli had, that it was all a fraud and I could prove it, but I didn't give them all the evidence, right? Like I give them some evidence, but my, my, like my, my hold card is, hold on. I got to take some coffee. Hold on. Like the, my hold card is that what really destroys Deveroli's case is the fact that the book that you're saying, because what what Deveroli and Reback were saying was that you they that Warner Brothers had advertised their film as being the true story, and that that ruined the viability of Deveroli's story, because they spent ten million dollars on advertising that this is the true story, when in fact Deveroli was saying that his version is the true story. My holdback card, of course, is that. Deveroli, your whole crux of your whole case, of, of their whole case was that Warner Brothers ruined the marketability of Deveroli's true story by advertising theirs as true when in fact theirs is fake. And therefore they damaged Deveroli's ability to market his own book. Now, what I was, my trump card of course, is to come in and say the truth of the matter is your manuscript or your 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 memoir is also fiction. So you can't be saying I have the real story when and they have a fake story when in fact they have a fake story and you have a fake story. Or they have a fake story and I have a fake story. They ruin the credibility of my fake story with their credit with their fake story. Like what are you doing? No. So the point is that. That was my holdback card. And here was the funny thing was that my book that I'd pulled all of these, I'd pulled a bunch of scenes from this book I'd written called Stranger Danger. I'd pulled scenes from it and stuck it into Once a Gunrunner. I had copies with the date. I see so when you, when in, in prison, when you print something out, it puts a date. It dates when the printout on every sheet, it dates what machine, what printer, who you are, what your reg number is, and the date that you printed this at the top of it. It's all printed out. I don't have one here. Um, So it's all printed out. Shows the whole thing. So 
like years later or years prior to this, sorry, years prior to this, I had a copy of Stranger Danger with showing that before I even met Deborah Rowley, no, well, yeah, I think it might have been before I even, before I, yet. Yeah, was I finishing? No, it was before I met him. Before I even met Deveroli, I had printed out Stranger Danger. So a year or so, six months to a year or so before I even met Deveroli, I had a copy of this little shitty, not shitty, but it's actually kind of a funny story. So this little manuscript, little 60-page manuscript, 70-page manuscript that I had, showing I had the manuscript and I could pull pic- pull pages out of the manuscript and pull pages out of Deveroli's book and I could put them side by side and you could see this scene was taken from here. This scene is almost identical to this. This scene is, is altered, but it's the same scene. This scene is identical. Like the sentence structure, everything's the same. And I have, a, I have half a dozen uh, at least that are identical. So I can prove what I'm saying is true. Am I exaggerating the length of the fiction and, you know, and the, you know, ah, yeah, sure. I'm, I'm, I mean, it's not that, but you know, there's a, there's a portion that's, so, but Dev Rowley has no fucking clue. Like they don't know what I can prove and what I can't prove. And so what ends up happening is Pete and I are walking the compound one day and Pete goes, you know, you know what we ought to do? And I go, what's that? He goes, like, I mean, honestly, you know, we can't fight this lawsuit from in here. And I go, I know. He said, so he's like, what we ought to do is get his current lawyers, get them to quit. And he said, you know, then you can still file a lawsuit. It, it, you're you're going to be damaged. But he is going to get new lawyers. And I, well, how do we do that? He said, we we put stranger danger into the lawsuit like we tell them about stranger danger specifically and i go really and he goes yeah and i said ah, man this is that i don't know and he goes well here let's do this let's mail a package of just take some of the scenes seven, eight, six or seven of them, stick them, we'll, we'll put them together and then we'll mail it to their current lawyer. He goes, because you know that Deveroli and Ross went to the current lawyer and they they did not tell them that their version is fictionalized. He said, so he'll have to quit. And I was like, huh, okay, let's try that. So we make these copies and we mail it to the current lawyer who's who's going back and forth with me already. Like I'm I'm getting emails from him, you know, he's trying to convince me to take a plea deal or take a de- plea deal, take a deal, take a settlement. So we send him just a few of the examples of the documents from Stranger Danger, the correlation between the documents Stranger Danger and Once a Gunrunner. He gets them and to the so he gets them along let's say a monday let's say three days later i get an email from him saying mr cox i want to let you know that i am no longer representing ephraim deveroli and uh ross reback now here's what's funny about that <laughs> what's funny about that is that um can you imagine like that was another pete and i were walking around and pete and i are when we got that when i got that email we are dying we're like can you imagine they walk into the room and they say, did Matt Cox, did you ask Matt Cox to fictionalize this book, to get it out in time so that you could give it to Shimmy to set up Warner Brothers for a lawsuit? And you're now telling them, people, that it's a true story so that you can take advantage of the Lanham Act. What did they say to that lawyer? Because it doesn't matter what they said. They had to be like, no matter what they said, it wasn't enough to convince them it wasn't true because I'd sent them the documents. And so he immediately says, look, I can't be your lawyer anymore. They get another lawyer. They get another lawyer. And guess what? The new lawyer files the uh, um, file saying, hey, I'm the new lawyer. I'm representing this. So he obviously went to the new lawyer and said, 
okay, listen, here's what we got. There is an issue, but he's exaggerating it. It's only a few scenes. It's not a big deal. So the new lawyer who's just really, really um, a disturbing guy. Like th- this guy was just treacherous. I'm, I mean, he, this guy, I, I don't even know what to say about this guy. Anyway, this guy, it didn't matter what you told him, what you said, he didn't care. He could care less about the, about any of the ethical dilemmas that are going on. He could care less. So this guy, this lawyer comes in and he says, um, I want to come see you. I want to work out a deal. And it's like, eh, I don't know. Well, you know, I, we go back and forth, back and forth. In the meantime, they Ross and Devaroli schedule another mediation. So Warner Brothers, they go back to Warner Brothers and say, we want to mediate. So now they're just desperate to get anything they can get. So they go back. Keep in mind, too, Warner is desperately fighting us in court to um, – to, to to depose me. Like they want to come to the prison and depose me. Now, keep in mind, I was never going to be deposed by them. Like if they had shown up, I could there's a there's a number of things I could have done to keep from being deposed by Warner Brothers. And there's just tons of things you could do to just not show up and be deposed. I mean, you could get into a fight, you could have someone say you got into a fight, you could you could say you were sick. You felt on, you, 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 oh, I have chest pains, chest pains. Boom, I would have gotten a trip to the fucking hospital. I could have, like, there's any, like, and think about this. They would have had to, have, their, their lawyers are all, like, in California. They would have flown from California all the way in and then shown up and said, I'm sorry, but Mr. Cox is in the shoe right now. Uh, he's under suspicion of being in a fight. Now, of course, two days later, they'd say, well, there was no fight. Like, you can write a cop out on somebody and say there was a fight. And go to the shoe for a, co- a week, and get right back out. Yeah, we looked into it. We we there, you, we were wrong. It was just a cop out. There's no fight. Now the worst that happens to me is I might lose my lose my room. But guess what? They don't get to depose me. They got to start over again. So I I could have just dragged that out forever, but I didn't. What I did instead, what what we did instead was well, what happened instead was Ross Reback and Devaroli were going to a mediation. Um, with Warner Brothers. They show up the day of the mediation. They have the mediation. Pete and I don't know what happened. What I do know happened is the next morning, I get an email from my niece who also works for my sister or worked for my sister uh, or and my brother-in-law at their law firm, at the law firm. She sends me an email that says, Uncle Matt, my dad wanted to let you know that Ross Reback died last night. Rat Ross, um, apparently, after the mediation, went home that night and died. So about a week later, in the civil, in the civil suit. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. On the on the uh, the docket for the civil suit, on the docket, Warner Brothers lawyer and Devaroli's lawyer file something saying that both of them are dropping their lawsuits. Um, they're both dropping their lawsuits, and they're paying for their own legal fees. Everything. Boom. We're dropping our lawsuit. It's over. Boom. We're done. Now. In my opinion, it was like, okay, well, then Ross was the driving force. And without Ross, the whole thing fell apart. Like, okay, it's over. It's over. There's no lawsuit anymore. It's over. Now, of course, Pete is saying, hey, we can still sue. And and it's like, I don't know. Um, like, I'm still stuck in prison. Now, by this point, I had met a guy named Ron Wilson. Now, I, I talk about Ron Wilson in, the, in, in another one, in another previous uh episode or or podcast and ron wilson is a guy that was a ponzi schemer that was in prison with me that i ended up finding out that he was hiding ponzi scheme money and i cooperated with the government and the government indicted him 
and two other people, and they were charged. Ron Wilson ended up getting like six more months added onto his sentence, but I get five years knocked off my sentence. Keep in mind, Dev Rowley doesn't know this. He doesn't know that I'm walk, about to walk out of prison in, in, fairly shortly. He's still thinking 2030. His lawyer's writing me emails saying, hey, I, wanna, I want to... Well, no, no. His lawyer actually... His lawyer isn't saying anything. What they've done is they've put, they've basically, Warner and Devaroli have both said, hey, guess what? Lawsuit's over. We're done. Now, I can still sue, but it's harder without being attached to their lawsuit. So, no big deal. We, we, um, Pete and I end up going to Frank Amadeo, and we go to the judge, and we see them in the library, and we say, hey, this is what just happened. And we explain what happened. And I remember Amadeo sitting there and he goes, he's shaking his head, right, 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 right. And he goes, yeah, they settled. And I'm like, no, 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 they didn't settle. They dropped the suit. He goes, no, no, they settled out of court. Well, that doesn't happen. It does happen. But not um, normally they say there's a, a lawsuit. I mean, there's a settlement. They settled out of court. So we're like, why? And they go, they settled out of court because they want you to believe that Ross died and the whole thing went away. They don't want to let you know there's a lawsuit because you'll keep suing. And I thought, I remember thinking, eh, I don't know. That doesn't sound right. Like, and Pete's like, no, no, it's, it's probably true. It's probably true. Like Pete, but Pete doesn't have any real experience in civil, civil matters. And, you know, I didn't know whether to believe Frank or not. I mean, he, he's, he's, that's a huge, that's a huge leap that that's what happened. Well, maybe a few days later, go a few days go by, maybe a week, and I call my sister. Keep in mind, remember that Ross and my brother-in-law were friends. Well, clients, friends, whatever. So my brother-in-law and my sister went to the went to Ross's funeral. So I call my sister and I said, Hey, what's going on? I think I had to call her because we were still gonna file a lawsuit and we needed someone to I needed to get get somebody that could um, could serve. Uh, I needed a process server, well, uh, like a national process server. So I call her, really call my brother and my sister answered, and I'm talking to her. I'm like, hey, what's up? I need a process server. She goes, okay, I'll get it to you. I'll e have Mark email it to you, which is my brother. And we're like, oh, okay, no problem. And as we're sitting there, I uh, I said, uh, she said, oh, you, you know, we went to Ross's funeral. And I said, oh, really? What happened? And she goes, you know, we talked to his, his, you know, his widow and this and that. It was a very nice service. People said nice things. It was nice. I said, oh, okay, what ended up happening? She said he had a heart attack. Uh, that night he like went to bed and had a heart attack. And, and I was like, oh, okay. Now keep in mind, my, my sister knows that I'm suing him. But, you know, like we don't talk about it. And I really hardly ever talk to my sister anyway, especially from prison. So I was like, oh, okay. And she goes, yeah, I, we talked to his, uh, his widow. And, you know, the really nice thing about it is, she told us, was that he died. He had a really great last day. And I go, oh, okay. She said, yeah, you know, he'd, he, he'd had a meeting, like a, a settlement meeting with some, with a, a company out in, in, law, in, in LA and he'd, he'd gotten a, a, a really big settlement with them. And, uh, so he was really happy, he was really happy. He had a, he had a great last day. He got a big settlement and he was happy. And so he died that, and he died that night and that they did have a, so it right now I, so then I knew. Oh my God, they settled that day. He had the settlement uh, agreement or that's the settlement mediation and they settled. So Frank was right. So we immediately filed another lawsuit. We, we send the lawsuit out. We file the lawsuit. Devaroli's lawyer responds and Devaroli's lawyer immediately contacts me and says, listen, we just want to settle. But by this point, I'm, I'm going to be put in for a halfway house soon. So we drag it out until I'm put in for a halfway house and I'm sent to the halfway house. So now I'm in a halfway. Keep in mind, I just got, I got 12 years knocked off my sentence. So I get sent to a halfway house. I'm now in the halfway house fighting these guys from the halfway house in court. And keep in mind, Devaroli's lawyer keeps 
coming back to me saying he wants to come meet me. He wants to offer me a settlement. He's willing to offer me the same amount of money that's been put aside in order to um, in order to fight this lawsuit. It's like, okay, well, well, how much is it? Tell me how much it is. No, I can't tell you. I need to come see you. I don't want you to come see me. So we end up going back and forth, back and forth. I'm in, eventually I go to, a, I end up going to, uh, I end up going to the Tampa halfway house. I'm in the Tampa halfway house and I start calling intellectual property lawyers. So unlike, unlike a personal injury attorney who represents you, let's say if you get hurt in a car accident, an intellectual property attorney or an entertainment attorney needs to be paid up front because the problem is that like a, a, um, a personal injury attorney who like you get, you get hit in a car accident and you broke your leg. Most of those lawsuits are settled within 12 to 18 months. So if a lawyer says, look, I'll put up all the money to represent you and I get a third of whatever you collect, that's typically what happens. So they file all the motions, they put up all the money, they fight it, and then eventually you you get a, a $200,000 payout and they get $66,000. So it's worth it to them. But it it's worth it to them because on average it settles within a year to 18 months. Intellectual property uh, intellectual property lawsuits uh, I think on average are, are like six years. So and, and the motions are, are exhausting. Like they're not 10, 20, 30 page motions. These things are hundreds and hundreds of pages long. It takes a ton of research and there's not a lot of intellectual property attorneys out there. So it, when I get, when I'm headed to the halfway house, like Pete's like, you understand that like, I can't, like I can do some stuff, but I can't continue to fight it while you're outside. Like I can, but I can't. And I certainly at no point can I ever go to trial. And the other problem is Warner Brothers wants to depose me. So they're like, he's like, you cannot go to a deposition without an attorney. You cannot go to a deposition without an attorney because they'll tear you apart. Doesn't matter how smart you are, you're going to have a hard time. So I'm like, okay, okay. And, and he's like, and you certainly can't represent yourself. Like I, I didn't do, I didn't file the lawsuit myself. Like I didn't do the research myself. Like there's just no way I'm not as smart as Pete. I don't have Pete. I don't have Frank. You know, I'm a pretty smart guy. But these guys, these guys dwarf me. So I can't go to trial. And they can't represent me because they're in prison. So I get to the halfway house and Pete says, you, you have to start calling. And it's going to take a lot of calls. So I want to tell you that I called 20 lawyers. Minimum of 20 the first couple of days. I spoke with six or eight of them on the phone. Most of the ones I called were in Miami and Tampa. Let's say I talked to eight of them in the first week because you have to schedule a time. Like you can't just call them. Hey, what's going on? You got to call. You can tell the secretary what's going on. She goes, okay. You got a lawsuit against Warner Brothers. This there's already, and, and keep in mind too, I get to also, what well, the great thing is I get to tell them, look, there's already a settlement. I'm suing two parties. They've already settled. I just want them to settle with me now. So now I'm just looking for a settlement from one of these two guys. So um, what ends up happening is I talked to maybe eight or eight, eight of these guys in the first week and all of them tell me they can't represent me because they've already spoken with Ephraim Devaroli. Devaroli has already called all of the attorney, the IP attorneys in, in Miami and Tampa area. Where he now knows I am, by the way. They now know I'm in, in the halfway house. So he is now saying, oh my God, I've got to figure out a way to shut this guy down. So now they're calling all the IP attorneys. So I well, here's here's the problem. If Ephraim Devaroli calls an IP attorney, an intellectual property attorney, and talks to him and explains the, basically the case, even if he just schedules a time to meet with the guy and he doesn't show up, Guess what? That intellectual property attorney cannot represent me anymore. 
Do you know that? Fucking guy, right? He called. So the first week I talked to whatever, seven or eight of them. The next week I talked to another five or six of them. Some of them are just not like some of them. You get them on the phone right away and I'd explain the situation and they would say, okay, well, I need, I, 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 I'm going to need $40,000. What? I have $40,000. Like I can't represent you for on contingency. Like I can't take a piece of this because it probably won't settle for, it probably won't end up settling for, or going to court for five or six years. And I'm like, Jesus. So I'm calling around, like I, I'm desperate to get somebody before I get deposed. Well, what ends up happening is I end up talking to an old friend of mine, just happened to be talking to her, and I tell her the case, that what's going on, and she goes, well, you should talk to my attorney. My attorney is a criminal defense attorney, but he might know somebody. And I go, okay. So I talk to him. I explain the situation. Like, I, And I'm basically trying to convince him, like, bro, just represent me for the, for the deposition. You've been in depositions before. And he's like, yeah, I really can't do that. I can't sign on to the case um, because I might get stuck with the case. And I was, I was like, okay. And he said, I, I, I don't know enough. Like it would be malpractice for me to even try and, try and uh, pretend that I can represent you. So he's like, I can't do that. And I said, okay. So I end up hanging up the phone. He calls me like two days later. He goes, you're not going to believe this. He goes, I just read an article in the, in the Philadelphia magazine. Like a Philadelphia magazine? He goes, yeah. He goes, yeah. And it's, it talks about this lawyer, this insane lawyer that has sued like every so sued like Jay-Z. He sued like, like, he starts naming off all these big celebrities and rappers and people that he's sued. He goes, he's suing Led Zeppelin right now. Like it's, it, he sounds like a maniac. And I go, okay. He goes, he may be the kind of guy, he goes, and he's not in this area. I went, all right. He said, this may be a guy that's crazy enough to take take this case. And I go, really? So I look it up. And I, I look up in Philadelphia Magazine. That's, uh, wait, wait, wait. Uh, that's it. So that's Philadelphia Magazine. I look it up. Here, look. And there's my look. There's, there's, this is, uh, this is um, Francis Mullafee. And I look up Francis. Hold on, we got more pictures. Here's a picture of Francis Ping in an alleyway. Here's a picture of Francis smashing his guitar. What else? Do you have any other pictures? Yeah, there's some more pictures here. There's some more pictures in the back. Well, there's other pictures of him doing it's insane. It's just he's just he's he's anyway, the name of the article in the Philadelphia is called The Devil's Advocate. So and I was like, okay, so can you call him? He goes, Well, I, I've got his he goes, I think I have his cell number. And I go, Really? And he goes, Yeah. He said, I looked him up and this is a cell number. Like I think I've got his cell number. I think you could call him. Tell him what you told me. And I went, um, okay. Gives me the phone number. And this is, it's like 10 or 11 o'clock in the morning, like a Monday or something. I go, okay. So I call him and the phone rings, rings like two or three times. And like on the third ring, the guy answers and says, who's this? Now I go, well, um, my, my, is, is this a law firm? He was like, he goes, who are you looking for? And I go, I'm looking for uh, for for Francis. I think it's Mollify or Mollify or Mollify or or. And he goes, he goes, yeah, yeah. He goes, uh, uh, what do you want with Francis? And I listen. I immediately think I've got the wrong number. Like this isn't the guy. This isn't a lawyer. He sounds like a, a like he's insane. And I go, well, is this a is this a law firm? I go, are you a lawyer? And he goes, I'm the best. I'm the best, bro. I'm the best lawyer. Yeah, I'm a lawyer. He's like, I'm walking out of federal court right now. He goes, I just got my client off of, off of a, 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 I just want a motion right now. I'm the best, bro. No, what, what, what do you need Francis for? And I go, who, is this Francis? He goes, yeah, this is Francis. And I go, okay. he's talking about, he's talking about himself in the third person. And I'm like, I, um, my name's Matt Cox. I have a lawsuit against Warner Brothers. I'm filing, I'm suing Warner Brothers and I, I'm incarcerated entertainment, which is Devaroli and Reebok's company, 
Rebax company. And I go, I'm suing, you know, you've heard of the movie War Dogs. He's like, yeah. And I go, okay, well, I'm suing over War Dogs. He's like, why? And I, I go, I'm, I wrote the manuscript, Deveroli's manuscript. And I, so I basically start to explain the whole thing. He's all right, listen. He goes, um, email me all this stuff. Here's my email. He rambles it off a couple of times, two, three times. I finally get it. And he goes, send me an email with all the stuff in it. And I'll look at it. And I'll get back with you. So I send it. I call him two or three times. And eventually he comes back and listen, this drags out for months, months. And literally I'm supposed to be deposed soon. Like I've been pushing it off. We've we've pushed it off. We've given about a thousand excuses to the court, but it's coming up. And finally, Francis says, "Listen, when you filed that motion, um, saying that when you filed that motion saying that part of Deveroli's manuscript or his his book was fictionalized, like you just fucked yourself. You're done. He's like, there's just not much you can do at this point." And he said, but there is obviously a settlement and we need to figure out how to get you a piece because you're still owed money. And if you, you know, I, I explained about the copyright and that I really own all, the, I really own all of that. And he goes, it may or may not be possible or, or true. He said, I don't know. We'll see. And we need to find out how much money they settled for. And eventually we end up finding out we've, sign some papers and stuff and we find out how much they settled for. So I cannot say how much they settled for. I cannot say what was in the agreement. What I will say in a broad way is that Warner brothers was concerned about me being a problem. And that's obvious in the settlement agreement that they signed. So Devaroli and I have to work out something at this point. I think that's general. I, I, I don't have to get any more specific than that. That's about as specific as I can, can get. So um, Francis is a bit of a lunatic and had some issues with the, uh, with the Bar Association. Um, and as a result of that, um, AJ, AJ was really the guy who was reading all, like I ended up, AJ is his, his, uh, an is, is his Francis's associate. So AJ ends up doing a ton of the work. And then eventually, uh, Francis says, look, I can't represent you. Like I can't sign up and represent you, but AJ can, and I'll work with AJ. Like he'll, you know, he's an associate. So, and the truth is, and I hate to say this because I like Fran, Francis Fran. I like Fran a lot. And he's and a, according to AJ, he's a brilliant attorney. Um, AJ was extremely professional. Like you felt confident with AJ. Fran scared the hell out of me. Like Fran not he was brilliant, but he's brilliant in a way that is terrifying. Um, you know, and he's extremely brass, you know, uh, uh, just very in your face, uh, ready to rumble, ready to fight. Like, he's just like, he's not like any lawyer you've ever met. AJ is exactly what you think a lawyer is. Conservative, um, well-groomed, uh, his suits all fit. Like, a, a, like Fran looks like you always rolled out, just rolled out of bed. Um, hair's just insane, like just spiked up. And like, you can imagine this guy going into a courtroom. He's just a maniac. Um, anyway, he did love to argue, though. Like he could argue you. He could argue you. He could convince you of anything. He was just a great. He was. A, I'm sure he's a great lawyer. But so AJ represents me. So AJ and Fran are working with Deveroli's lawyer, and eventually we have a mediation in Miami. So we they fly into Miami. I drive to Miami. Now, by this point, I'm, I had just left the halfway house. Like I'd been out of the halfway house two months. I was staying with a, fr with, with, I was staying in a, in a rooming house. So I have a friend um, named Stacy and Stacy was renting out rooms in her, in her house. And like, like one of the people being running out of the room was, is a, is a police officer. So there's a police officer living in a room. I'm living in a room. 
And so I'm living in this room. I have to get permission from my probation officer in order to go to Miami. I'm, my car is such a piece of crap that I I cannot even I cannot even drive to Miami. I, I remember like my probation officer. It was, she was a nightmare. Um, my first probation officer. I'm, I'm like probation officer like three now. Um, my first probation officer was just a nightmare. She handles like the hard cases, like the guys with like the highest security level. And I remember um, one of the things she said was like, I had to take uh, like, I had to take like a criminal thinking class, like a, a, a behavioral um, behavior class. Right. So I end up, I end up going to this, she says, well, you got to go to this, this, uh, it's like a court appointed, um, psychiatrist or psychologist, forget what she is. So I go there to meet, I, I, I'm like, oh, okay. So you, so you once a week, you have to go to, you have to go to like a group meeting with her. I go, okay. But the first thing you have to do is go there and fill out some paperwork. So I remember I go there to fill out the paperwork and she says, okay. Um, I go there, I fill out the paperwork and I sit there, I go, okay, I'm ready to go. I'm ready. And she goes, uh, you know, when would you like to show, uh, be here? The, the meetings are on like Tuesdays and Thursday. I'm like, okay, well, Thursday, what time? 10 o'clock, whatever. Fine. So there, she, there's like, there's like 12, let's say there's 10 people in, in a group. You're there for one hour, which means you have to, you have to t- basically, that means divide, you know, divide that. So you basically get five minutes for each person. Right, you really just have to sit there and listen. So it's not going to be a big deal. I'm not happy about it. Like I'm bitching and moaning. They tell me I have to pay for the classes. I said I'm not paying. And then she's like, "Oh well, you have to pay." It's of course I, I don't see anything that says I have to pay. And I like I'm, I'm arguing about anything. I'm like, look, and I don't see that you're going to be able to violate me because I'm not going to pay. So I'm not going to pay. So if you don't want me to go because I can't pay, I'm good with that. And they're like, "No, no, no, it's fine. We'll we'll figure that out. We'll pay." So probation is now going to pay. Um, and I'm just doing anything to get out of this. So I talked to the, to the, um, the psychiatrist and she goes, we, so she's, I'm about to leave. And she goes, no, 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 wait, we still have to have a, a, an initial meeting. I'm like, about what? And she's like, well, we still have to have a meeting, you know, before I'm like, I'm going to do the classes. And she goes, yeah, I know, but we have to have the meeting. I go, okay, fine. So keep in mind too, that the, the classes are only go on as long as it takes you to to um, finish this book that they have. They have like a behavior modification book you have to get through. And it's basically would take about six months. No big deal. Okay, fine. Uh, well, anyway, I sit down, I have the talk with her. And as we're talking, we're talking and going on and on, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. I end up saying the same thing that I ended up saying to Dr. Smith. And I said to my probation officer the same thing. And she said, look, at some point, um, it, it, she she was talking about cr- criminal thinking and this and that and you know and I she said do you ever have criminal thinking and I said of course I do and she was yeah but I mean that's not is that something you think could could happen uh, at this point and I was like look I said if if in six months to a year from now if I'm riding the bus and I can barely pay my bills I said yeah yeah I am going to commit a massive massive fraud and I'm going to leave the United States I said. Yeah. So yeah, is it a possibility? Yeah, it's a pretty good possibility. And she's just like, okay, all right. Like I'm being just complete kind of a jerk to her the whole time because I don't want to do this. Like I don't want to do this class. I'm trying to rebuild my life. I don't have time to take. What am I? Like one hour? I had to drive from, I had to drive from, from North Tampa all the way to Brandon, which is a 45 minute drive in a piece of shit fucking car that is breaking down left and right. So. I tell the shrink that, and when I, the next morning, I get an email from my probation officer, and I included the email here. I include the email. Here, Here it is. It says, subject, treatment plan, August, oh yeah, so this is August 20th, uh, 2019, and it says, it says, it says, good morning. Your treatment plan has been changed as we, my probation officer and the psychiatrist, uh, feel you would benefit most from individual sessions. You will be meeting with Allison. That's the psychiatrist. You will be meeting with, 
with Allison once per week for the individual sessions. Please give her a call to get your next appointment if she hasn't already provided you with one. This means you will not be attending the weekly groups. Sent from her iPhone. I responded with Jesus H. Christ. How screwed up am I? Weekly shrink visits? Unbelievable. She didn't respond to that. Um, so I ended up calling Allison and said, what's, what's going on? And she said, look, it's just after your last, your, your, your initial meeting with me, like you need individual help. Like you need, you need some serious help. Like apparently I have some issues. So that's what I'm saying. It's like, there's some major problems. Like these people don't like me at all. Like I'm, I, it's an issue. So I end up having to go. So you know, I think I want to say it was in a bite. So this is in August. So by October, I have to go by October. I have to go to Miami. I have to borrow my mother's car to get to Miami because there's no way my Jeep, I had a piece of junk Jeep. My Jeep was by no means possibly going to make it to Miami. It's a four and a half hour drive from Tampa, right? About four and a half hours, four, four, four or five hour drive, five from where I am. So five hour drive from where I was living to Miami. So I go down there. I meet, uh, I meet, AJ and Francis. So AJ, me and Fran, we go to the mediation in uh, Brickell, uh, the area of Brickell. It's um, it's in Miami. You know where that is? Mm-hmm. Nice, right? Like amazing. Air, like it's like every third car is a Ferrari. Like I'm driving. You know, my mom's got like a an Infinity. No, not Infinity. She was like a. It was like a Lexus. It was like a nice, nice Lexus, and it. It was like a piece of garbage. It was like a like a twenty year old Nova with rust on it or something. Like it, was, it was horrible. Like at least everything is is Mer- everything is Mercedes, BMW, Porsche, Lamborghinis. Like I'd never seen so many Lamborghinis. Anyway, I end up parking my car. I go to the mediation. I meet Fran and AJ. We go into the mediation. Deveroli shows up an hour late. Typical. He shows up. We shake hands. We ha- We sit there. We tell our version of the of what's of what's happening. They tell their version, and their version doesn't. He, they've never once say like every anything I say isn't true. Everything I'm saying, they're just their whole point is, hey, go fuck yourself. So. We go, you know, what happens in a mediation is first you guys sit at the table with the mediator and you go back and forth, back and forth a little bit. And then you they separate everybody into different rooms. And then the mediator goes and explains, talks to them, comes back and explains the point, goes back and explains this, comes back and tries to come to a resolution. And essentially they were offering like next to nothing. Like, oh, we think you owe, we owe you five or 10,000. That's it. Like in, in book sales. And that's the most we're going to give you. And so we go back and forth, back and forth. It doesn't go anywhere. Like I, I wish I could. Like one, there's, you know, it's 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 um, you're you're not allowed to, you're not allowed to say what happens in the mediation. But the truth is, there's just nothing to say because it just doesn't go anywhere. There was no amazing revelations, nothing. Like they offered me, I don't even remember the num- the amount was, but it was next to nothing. The point is, we uh, Fran and I go, uh, me AJ and Fran, we go. The whole thing, it'll last, whatever, a few hours, and then it's over. Then we end up going to South Beach. We go to South Beach. We have lunch. We meet one of Fran's, one of Fran's um, clients down there. He's a rapper named um, Havana Fly. And uh, he's Fran was representing him in a, in a lawsuit. Nice guy. Um, so we meet. We all eat. And then, you know, we leave. Well, I leave. Fran and AJ stayed a couple of days. So I leave, I'm in my car or my mom's car and I'm driving. And as I'm driving, I get a phone call from Fran and he says, turn around. He says, I go, what? He says, turn around, come back. He is worth the pink pony. He said, Deveroli called and Deveroli wants to meet and uh, he wants us all to, to uh, come to a settlement. He says, willing to be willing to make us an offer that, you know, we can't refuse a good offer. Okay. So I'm like, this motherfucker, like, it's late. It's like eight or nine o'clock, right? So I turn around and drive back, go to the Pink Pony. The Pink Pony, by the way, is a strip club. This is where Devil, this is where Fran is hanging out. 
and Devor wants to, and Devaroli goes down there and they we meet. By the time I get there, I talk to Fran. By the time Devaroli shows up, which is like an hour later, Fran's drunk. He can't mediate nothing. Like AJ says, listen, we're just leaving. I'm putting Fran in a in a car. So he takes Fran. They pick up Fran. They bring him to a taxi. And as they're walking out, Devaroli and his lawyer are walking in. And and it's it's outrageous. So I get up to go, and Dev Rolly's like, whoa, 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 just talk to me for a minute. Talk to me for a minute. I'm like, I'm not talking in front of your lawyer. And so, and keep in mind, AJ and Fran told me, don't talk to him. But they're gone. So I sit down with uh Dev Rolly and I go, what do you want? He goes, Bro, listen, listen, let me let's let's work this out. And I go, uh, work what out? I, I said, you're, you're, you're a piece of shit. You've got a massive fucking settlement. Cut me off my piece. You didn't write any of that book. You didn't do any of these things. You never, you know, you were never going to publish this book. This was all a scam. It was all a scam. And so we start going back and forth, back and forth. And I remember it's funny too, because he's like, by the way, this discussion right now, it, it, I feel this is an extension of our mediation. So it's covered uh, under confidentiality, and I go, fuck you, it's not covered under shit. We're in a fucking strip club. And I said, so I'm not covering it under nothing. You don't want to talk? I said, I'll leave. And he goes, no, no, just, just listen to me. So he, he goes, look, let, let's just settle this, bro. Like, let's settle this, and you know, like, we can be friends again, bro. We can be friends. And I was like, what? Like, you don't, you don't really believe that. Like, you don't believe that I believe you give a fuck about my friendship. Like, that's ridiculous. When he said that, I remember just thinking, are you serious? Like, this is a guy that when he left Coleman with the, with the manuscript, he gave me this big bear hug. And tears filled up in his eyes. And he told me, bro, you're, you know me better than anybody has ever known me in my life. He goes, I'm not going to forget you. I'm going to be here when those gates, when you walk out those gates. I'll never forget you, bro. I'm going to put money on your books and I'm going to be here for you. I was like, okay, I hope so. I hope so. He's like, I never heard from that dude again. So now I'm sitting in the pink pony with him and he's telling me we can still be friends. Like he values my friendship. So I was just like, are you out of your fucking mind? Like that? I'm not stupid. That's not going to work. And he goes, well, I, I just think that like, you know, like I miss talking to you. I go, give me a fucking break, bro. What would you have an offer? And he goes, look, man, you understand this whole thing. Like it's, it's just business. Like it's, this isn't personal. It's not that I don't like you, but you know, this is just business. I remember Deborah Rowley told me one time. He had told me we were talking about somebody that, and I forget the numbers, but it was somebody that like he owed like 300,000. He basically screwed this guy out of 300,000. And the guy was complaining and he said, but I, I said, why didn't you pay him? And he goes, well, he didn't have anything in writing. And I went, yeah, I understand he didn't have anything in writing, but you owed him the money. And he went, yeah, bro. He said, I don't like... What do you mean? I go, you owed him. Like, what? Does it matter? You told him you'd pay him and you owed him. He goes, yeah, but he didn't have nothing that said that. I went, it's not the point. The point is, is that you owed him the 300,000. He goes, I said, I mean, he goes, yeah, but he couldn't do nothing. I go, well, he could sue you. He goes, yeah, that's the whole thing though. Let's say I had to get a lawyer and pay a lawyer $200,000 to go all the way to trial and beat him because he doesn't have anything in writing. He goes, I still make 100,000. He goes, why would I give him 300000 when I could still make a hundred? He goes, and the truth is he probably can't even afford to fucking sue me. Fuck him. And I looked at him and I went, bro, you can't go through life burning bridges. And he goes, nah, bro. He goes, there's a lot of bridges. It's a lot of bridges. And I'm like, this is who I'm So, you know, that's the kind of thing he told me that I thought, holy shit. So we're sitting there in Pink Pony and I go, make me an offer. And he goes, man, it's just, is it, you, you understand this isn't, personal it's just business i go you know you keep saying that that it's business he goes well, you understand business i said i understand business making business decisions i go but this isn't business for me this is personal like i 
want to be a true crime writer. Like I want to, to, I want to write people's stories and I want to get them made into films and documentaries. And you took what I wrote and you perverted it. You didn't try and get it published. You told everybody it was true. You, you, you completely fucked me over. You didn't help me at all. And I said, so it's personal for me because I can't go back to doing what I did before. This is going to be my, I wanted this to be my career and you are fucking me out of my career. And, and I said, so it is personal to me. I said, let me explain. To, and he goes, he said, bro. And then he makes me an offer. He goes, that's, that's a lot of money. That could change a lot for you. I said, it, that doesn't change anything for me. I go, whatever you offer me is just going to go to Fran. Like I pr- promised Fran pretty much everything to take the case on. So, you know, the percentage I, you know, after he pays his bills and everything else, like there's not a lot left over. So I, that's what I tell Deborah. I, I said at that, at that amount, that's really, there's just not much. So we start going back and forth, back and forth. And, and I said, you know, the money doesn't mean that much to me. You understand that? He's like, what are you talking about? I said, let me explain something. I said, I'm living in someone's spare room right now. I said, I had to borrow my mother's car to drive down here because my car would never make it at such a piece of shit. And I said, and I'm, and I'm staying in someone's room. I said, but you know what I do? I said, I get to write when I want to write and I get, I'm selling books and I'm doing the things that I love doing. I said, so the money wouldn't change anything for me. Maybe a little bit more money. I'd get a nicer place. I'd get a nicer car. Like it wouldn't change that much. I said, I, I owe restitution. Fran's going to take a chunk. Fran and, and AJ are ta- his law firm's taking a chunk of it. And I said, and, and, and I, I, it's just not going to make that much of a difference for me. I said, what he said, why are you doing this? I said, because I want to make sure that you get as little money as possible. That's what I want to make sure of. The more money you give me, the less you end up getting. And that's what I care about. And it, you know, the look on his face, I said, because the money won't change anything to, for me. And see, because what I learned in prison, what I learned in prison that, that Devaroli didn't was that I was with, I had millions of dollars prior to going to prison and I was miserable. I went to prison, I lost everything and I just wrote stories and I found, I found a purpose and something I enjoyed and I was happier living in that spare room than I'd ever been in my life. And I said, and that's the truth. I'm happy and the money won't change a fucking thing for me. I'm happy in my piece of shit Jeep. I'm happy in my spare room. So I said, I don't care about the money. I care that you'll get as little as possible. And I said, and I said, and I'm willing to spend every fucking dime of Fran's money to make sure that doesn't happen. And the look on his face was just like, holy shit. And I said, now, are you going to make me an offer? And he's like, well, I think it's a good offer. I said, man, I said, we're done. And I get, went to stand up and he goes, oh, okay. And he blurts out another offer. And I said, I'll call Fran. I'll let him know. I said, I'll, I'll talk to AJ and Fran and see what, see what they think. And I walk off. So it wasn't the next day. It was like the, I drove home that night. I mean, I didn't get home till like two or three in the morning. I was like falling asleep and. Um, I get home, go to bed, wake up, don't talk to Fran. The next day, I think I talked to Fran and AJ and they were in, I think they just gotten back. I think they might've just gotten back or maybe they called me from Miami, but they called me and put me on speaker phone. And I remember saying, they go, what happened to the pink pony? Did you talk to him? And I said, yeah. And so, cause they said that his, I think his attorney had called them several times to try and talk about uh, a settlement. So I tell Fran, this is what's going on. And I tell him what happened. Boom, boom, boom. And then I get to the part about how I'm willing to spend every dime of Fran's money to make sure you get as little as possible. And they burst out laughing. They were like, that's fucking perfect. 
So he says, okay, let me let me see if I can work something out. So they end up calling Deveroli's lawyer, and they go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And eventually we end up with a settlement. And like the most I can say about the settlement is that I have I am I feel I deserve way more. But and I am absolutely one hundred percent positive that Deveroli is miserable that he had to part with the money he parted with. So at this point, I'm going to go back. I just, the last video uh, or the last two videos, I explained about my lawsuit with um, Ephraim uh, uh, Deveroli and Warner Brothers over the movie War Dogs. So uh, let me go back to me when I first got to the halfway house. because so I kind of explained how part of that what, how that went through while I was in the halfway house or while that was happening during prison and the halfway house. But let me explain about the halfway house. I'm sure people have heard about halfway houses before. So, so what happens is just as you know, you're coming up on your last whatever year of, of incarceration, you know, typically if you're lucky, you, they, your counselor will put you in for a halfway house. And you know the reason you need halfway house is you know it's it's important. I may have said this in the last video or two, but it's important. You you need it. So you need it because one, obviously, you know it helps you reacclimate to just society in general. And there are little things that it, it seems silly, but like after like 12, 13 years of in prison, it, there are little tiny things that you stop or that I stopped doing just because it's frowned upon in prison. You know, like saying please and thank you. Like guys don't say please and thank you. In prison, it's it's a, yo, let, let me get some sugar. Or yo, let, you got some coffee? Yeah, let me get some. And that's just, everybody talks like that. If you don't talk like that, then essentially you, you end up getting pegged to someone who's super soft. So you have to walk around all the time acting like, I don't, know, I don't want to say like a tough guy or like a, you know, but... You just lose all of the, the the you know the social graces or your you know the grease that helps people not kill each other, I guess, in society, which is you know pleasantries and things. Well, initially it, it was I don't know. Did I tell the the sandwich story? Have you heard me talk about the chicken at the gym with the sandwich? Listen, it was so bad. It was so bad that, you know, this is, and this just really is kind of like, a, it's, it's a very much a prison mentality, which bothers me because I, I really didn't realize how bad it was for me. And I'll, I'll go into the halfway house in a second, but I'll just give you an example of how, just how mentally disturbed you become or, or, or you know, altered as a result of being in prison for so long. And, and honestly, like I wasn't in, in a super tough prison. I mean, I'm not saying people weren't getting, there weren't lots of fights and people weren't getting stabbed, but you know, I started at a medium, which was, you know, is a rough place, but there are rougher mediums, obviously. And there are, there are non rougher mediums, right? Like I was in an average medium, like it wasn't super soft, but it, it wasn't hard. Like you didn't have to run with the gang, but if you didn't, run with a gang, like you better not get yourself in trouble because ain't nobody backing you up. Now I'm lucky because I didn't get in trouble a lot, you know, or, or very much or mo nothing I couldn't get myself out of, you know, like I didn't, I didn't gamble. So I didn't run up debts. I didn't borrow from anybody. Um, and I didn't allow myself to be, you know, beholden to anyone. So I, I, so I'll give you an example. Like when I got out of prison, I ended up getting a job. I'll explain. I got a job with my buddy and, and I'm not like a, an aggressive person by nature. Uh, I, I consider myself, maybe I'm assertive. Like I, I want to, I go after what I want, but I don't, I don't think I'm aggressive in, in any way. And my assertiveness had very much turned to aggression where People were constantly like friends of mine would tell me like, bro, you're like super aggressive. Like you don't realize how aggressive you are. And I'm like, what are you talking about? They're like, well, even that, like that, what are you talking about? Like it's, 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 oh, you're just overtly aggressive about everything. So I had to really tone it back. 
And and I, where I was like, no, man, I'm just assertive. And they were like, yeah, you're 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 overboard. It's, it's not assertiveness. It's it's aggression. But in prison, that's normal. Like in prison, I'm soft as cotton, and I'm ex- and, and and I was acting like, not I'm, you know, I'm saying, hey, man, can I get some of that? You know, uh, what uh, what's going on with so and so? Yeah. Well, how come? Well, what, why why do you do that, bro? Like I mean, it's just super like aggressive, and it was just. So I, I had really, it took, takes you a while to kind of tone it down. It was, and I, I still had that mentality. Like I went to, so I'll tell you one of the things at the halfway house, they give you a, when you go to work every day, you get, you get breakfast for free, right? Like they give you breakfast. You can pay for extra stuff, but they give you breakfast. Um, and then when you leave for the day, they'll give you a bag lunch, so when you go to work, the reason they do this is they don't want you to leave work. They're like, we're giving you a bag lunch because you don't have permission to leave and go to, you know, you can't, you can't go to a restaurant and come back. You have to, here's your bag lunch, stay at work and eat. And they're going to call several times during the day. So you better be there or you may have an ankle monitor on. So they give you a bag lunch. Well, I remember one time this, this, this uh, woman was leaving the gym where I worked, she was going to get, um, she was going to get lunch and I'd been there for like two months and she was going to get lunch. And she said to me, she was mad. I'm, I'm getting, I'm going to get lunch. She goes, she goes, you want something? And I went, um, no, I'm good. I'm good. I've, I've got my bag. I've got a, I've got a, uh, you know, like I had like a bologna sandwich. I go, I've, I got a sandwich. I got a bag of lunch. I'm good. And she goes, no, come on. She goes, you eat that every day she was she was going where was she going she was going to um jimmy john's she was let me get you a sandwich from jimmy john's and i went no i'm good i i i've got a back lunch i'm good and she said she was come on she said you're always eating that you're you she was it's got you've got to be tired of bologna sandwiches well sometimes we got peanut butter so you you know, so you know you got to be tired of those sandwiches and i went and, and she i said well i don't really have money to be buying to be going to lunch, like, you know, it's like 10 bucks to go to lunch, right? So I said, I don't really have money to do that. So I'm good with the bag lunch. And she goes, no, it's okay. She, she goes, I got it. I've, I've, I've got it. I'll pay for it. And I, and I went, you know, I, like, I didn't understand. I didn't, you, you know, for clarity's sake, I said to her, listen, let me, let me be very clear about this. And I remember my, my buddy with Trion was there and, and a couple and, and like one of the other employees is there and they're looking at me. I go, let me be very clear. I said, if you are saying that you want to buy me a sandwich at Jimmy John's with your own money and that you do not expect that at any time in the future, I'm going to pay you back or that I'm going to reciprocate by buying you something in the future. If you are simply buying me a sandwich out of the goodness of your heart and do not expect me to ever pay you back in any way, yes, I will take a sandwich from Jimmy John's. If you are thinking that at some point in the future, this will come back to you or I will be beholden to you in any way, please do not buy me anything. I have a bag of lunch. I'm fine. And I remember my buddy Trion looked at me just like, what the fuck is wrong with you? And she looked at me and she just kind of smiled and she goes, let me buy you a sandwich at Jimmy John's. You don't ever have to pay me back. And I went, I mean, okay, I don't know. I'll I'll take whatever, whatever you want to get me. That's fine. You know, like that's how clear you kind of have to be in prison because someone will give you something in prison and you think maybe you've just been there maybe six months or a year maybe someone's putting money on your books you know or i'm sorry on your your account so you can buy stuff so you're not realizing how desperate people's situations are and the prison economy uh, and 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 what taking something from someone means so maybe one day you're in prison and you run out of uh you run out of coffee and you turn to your your Selly or the guy in the cube next to you, which you've talked to all of 10 times in the last two months or six months. And you go, Hey man, you got any coffee? And they go, yeah, I got, yeah, I got some hit. You go, bro, can I get some coffee? They go, sure. They give you some coffee. No big deal. 
You get a little bag of instant coffee, Keefy coffee, and they give you a scoop of coffee and you go, okay. And you know, you drink your coffee, you know, well, what does that cost? 15, 20 cents for a scoop of coffee. The, the bag's like $3 and 50 cents, right? So you get maybe 20, 30 bags. That's what, you know, what does that break down to? 20 cents, 25 cents. So he gives you a scoop, no big deal. You know, you don't care. It's not a big deal. Um, you don't think anything of it. You certainly do the same for him. And come commissary, a couple days later, he comes to you and he says, yo, bro, bro uh, uh, I need to uh, give me a bag of coffee. And you go, oh, okay, for, all right, well, why am I getting you a bag of coffee? Yo, man, you borrowed coffee from me the other day. You got some coffee from me the other day. So give me a bag of coffee. It's like, you gave me a scoop of coffee out of your bag. Like that's 25 cents. A bag of coffee is 350. So, or maybe you just say, you shrug it off and you go, yeah, man, man sure. Oh yeah, yeah good. no problem. And you get him the $3.50 because maybe it doesn't matter to you. The problem with that mentality is you're like, oh, it doesn't matter. I got people put three, I got, I got my, my wife or my kids or my buddy, Jimmy, who's putting 300 bucks a month on my books or something. So maybe you don't care. The problem is that that guy ends up kind of joking about it or telling people about it. And now people think they can ask you for stuff. You kind of get that, this guy's a sucker mentality, you know, or a, a sucker reputation. So what ends up happening is if you borrow something from someone, you got to be super clear. Hey, bro, let me borrow a thing of coffee and I'll give you one back, a cup of coffee back or a scoop of coffee, whatever you want to say, you know, when I get my commissary. So I'll get you a scoop back, but that's it. And they're like, yeah, yeah, that's cool, bro. Or they say, hey, man, you know what? Don't even worry about it. I don't even want anything. You sure? Yeah, I don't want to. No, no, man. It's a scoop of coffee. It's nothing. Okay, cool. We got an agreement. We have an understanding. If you don't have that understanding very clearly, it can go bad for you. And if you're not some super jacked up fucking guy, then you've got a real problem. Because you've got to be super clear all the time. So, you know, because it could go bad and there's not much you can do about it. And if you're not running with some gang, then you've got a real problem because there's nobody backing you up. Well, you know, like I'm super, super clear on everything. Like the one great thing is I have great communication skills. So anyway, so but like I said, that was my I was very clear about everything and very, very semi, I'd say, aggressive. So when I got to the halfway house. Listen, when I got to the halfway house, I weighed 150 pounds because the last six months of, of prison, so I was 185. The last six months of prison, I weighed 185 pounds in prison. Last six months, I thought, you know what? Like, I'm going to gain some weight probably when I get out. Right? Everybody's, you've heard of the freshman 15, right? Like, you go to college, you either lose 15 or you, or you gain 15 pounds. So... Same thing with prison. You get out, you either gain 15 or 20 pounds, you either lose 15 or 20 pounds. Well, I thought, you know what, I'm, I, I know, like I don't eat a lot, so, but I am probably going to be out there. And I probably will gain some weight. So I better go ahead and start losing some weight. So I went from 185 pounds, I was probably closer to 190, all the way down to 150 pounds. I weighed 148 or 149 pounds. I think like the morning I left, the morning I left prison. I remember, so when you leave prison, if nobody, so right, let me jump back. I'm all over the fucking place. Anyway, there's a lot of things to cover. So what, what happens is the last, whatever, year, a year before you're scheduled to get released, your counselor will put you in for a halfway house. Now, I'd been locked up so long, I should have gotten a year. But there were a lot of things happening with Trump and with a lot of, there were a lot of laws. Trump had signed it, signed some stuff where he'd signed a, a um, I don't know if it was a, I don't know if it was a bill or I don't know if it was an, I think it was an executive order where the Bureau of Prisons used to, it says you're supposed to do 85% of your time, right? But the Bureau of 
prisons for some reason had calculated it where it was people were doing on average 87 and a half percent of their time. And so you were supposed to get 54 days a year and you were actually getting like 46, 47, 45 days a year or something. Good time. So off of your sentence, if you're good, if you behave well, they knock some some time off. Like it's supposed to be 15 percent. It wasn't. It was like 12 and a half. So and they supposedly, you know, Obama was going to correct it. He never did. You know, everybody was always going to correct it. Right. Well, I'm going to fix that. Now, well, they never did. Uh, Trump got in there and he signed it. He said, yeah, that's ridiculous. It says 85. Why aren't they calculating it? So it's 85 from now on. Well, what ended up happening was because of that, there were people that had six months, a year, years of, of good time that had to come to them. And so if you did 15 or 20 years, then suddenly, bam, you get a year off or X amount of time off. So guys were being thrust into the halfway house. And initially I was given I wanted 12 months, but this was going on at that time. And I knew it was probably going to get less than that. And I remember I got like nine, I want to say nine and a half or 10 months halfway house. And I was like, oh, that's not quite what I expected, but that's fine. So <laughs> like a few months, like probably, you know, it was really messed up about this. I called my mother and told her I was coming home on a certain date. So at that point, I was writing, talking to my brother on the phone and telling him like, hey man, I, I need clothes sent in. Because if you, if you leave, you're gonna leave half, you're gonna leave the halfway house, I mean, sorry, you're gonna leave prison with just what you have. Like you're gonna be able to walk out with like sweatpants, if you might have some sweatpants and a t-shirt. So I'm going to the halfway house and sweatpants and a t-shirt and probably, like there are guys like or tennis shoes. I guess you could probably and, and tennis shoes. Like you, you can buy stuff like that on commissary. So and I did have some of that stuff. Stuff that was okay to wear in prison. But if you saw me walking around in the sweatpants that they give you, they're like sweatpants from like the nineteen eighties. Like they're like real sweatpants. They're not like the cool sweatpants we have now. And the sweatshirts are like sweatshirts. Like the t shirts are like eh, they're pretty much fruit of the loom or hands or something. They're all right. Uh and then the tennis shoes are just really, you know, kind of just basic tennis shoes, which I had crappy basic tennis shoes. So I would have been leaving in that. And if you don't have anything like that, which some people do, some people have nothing. So those people end up leaving with, you know, they'll actually, Bureau of Prisons will give you a pair of blue jeans, which are blue jeans that I, I swear to God, they're like something that a poor peasant in uh, some peasant in, you know, Guatemala would be wearing like, I mean, like they're just straight leg, you know, like cut out, like stitched through. I mean, they really, they're that bad. And they'll give you like a, a, a brown t-shirt that is probably 10 years old and 60 um, inmates have worn it because they recycle the clothes. So you, when you get there, you don't get a brand new uniform. You get a uniform that somebody else wore for four years. And then when he left, it went back in the pile and they wash it and they fold it and here's your uniform. So you've got, I always love it when you watch, you ever see like a Orange is the New Black or any prison TV show, they come out and their orange jumpsuits are bright color. Like they're like a bright orange. I ain't ever seen a bright orange uh, jumpsuit in my life. Like I've never, you know, <laughs> I, it's, it's always, you're like, okay, so they order that off the internet. And they had this guy put it on. Like if they want to make it look right, they got to wash it about 600 times, lay it in the sun for about five or six weeks, beat it up really bad, cut some stuff off because you'll get a jumpsuit and the legs will be too long. So guys will cut off six or eight, six or eight inches of, of, you know, or you'll get, the nice thing is when you get to prison, you get, you get regular, like, like a uniform. Um, I tell you what though, what you don't realize is the sizes are all fucked up. So I remember when I got there, I ordered like I, I was at that point, I was heavy when I first came into prison. I had already lost some weight. Um, and when I first got there and I ordered, I got, I ordered like a, like a size, like a waist, like a 32 inch waist. Cause I was, you know, maybe 33. And I said, yeah, 33. And the guy looked at me and he goes, he goes, man, they, like the sizes run small. I went, okay. And he said, you sure you want a 33? And I went, 
yeah, man, I, I wear 33. I, I'll be all right. I've lost some weight. That's what I was wearing, 33, 34s. And he goes, all right. So he gave them to me. Listen, those pants were like a size 30. I mean, I was sporting a camel toe for about two weeks. I got three pairs of these pants, and I'm walking around with like a camel toe for three weeks. The first three weeks I'm in prison, not a good look for a soft looking for a soft white guy in a medium security prison. Like I was very popular. You know, everybody wanted to be my friend. You know what I'm saying? They all want to, I'm getting guys offering me tennis shoes and stuff. It's not a good thing. It's not good. It's like, you need anything? No, no, I don't need it. I'm fine. What, look, I got the pants are too tight. It's not what it looks like. So it took me about two weeks to get new pants. So I'm wearing like a size 38. And they're okay. They're like slightly loose. You know, it's um, it's not funny. It's, it's bad. It's a bad situation, bro. So what what happened is I, so I remember when I left prison, I, I, I started, I, I called my brother and I said, hey, can you send me in some blue jeans? And, you know, I got a t-shirt, like I'll wear a white, I need some blue jeans or and a tennis shoes, something. And he goes, yeah, yeah, that's fine. He goes, what size do you wear? And I went, fuck, man, I don't know. I mean, I've lost so much weight. I went from 185 down to like 150. And I was like, I don't know, Mark, I don't know. And he goes, yeah, you know what? He goes, it's okay. He said, I know your measure. I, I know how tall you are and what you weigh. I'll ask, tell uh, my, you know, his daughter, my niece. He goes, she'll, she'll grab you some. He goes, we'll go to Walmart. We'll grab you some pants. I said, okay, no problem. So he sent in a size 30 or 20, I want to say 28 or 20, maybe it was a size 30. It's probably a size, let's say a size 30. And I remember when I got them, and I saw that they were size 30 when I, and this was when I got them in the, I went, I was in the, um, where was I? I went to art, what's called R and D receiving and departure. So when I went to R and D and I saw the pants and they were size 30, I thought, fuck, I'm going to have to wear my sweatpants. I put on the size 30. I shit you not. I could all put on a size 28 waist. I was that small. I had no, I put them on. I was like, oh my God, I'm going to need a belt. Like, this is ridiculous how thick, like, it wasn't that bad, but they were, they were loose. Uh, and I remember thinking, ah, I'm going to gain some weight. It's okay. It'll be fine. So, but what happens is you have to pack up all your stuff and go to R&D. You get a, you, so, and let, let me jump, let me jump back. So I told my mother I was leaving on a certain date, which was going to be like sometime in, it was like in, in October. I was supposed to leave in October. So, when I wrote, I, I I got the form and I sent it off to my. You have to continually contact, talk to your your um, counselor about doing stuff like, hey, I need to get money sent in, or hey, I need to arrange for a ride, or hey, you know. So I ended up going to my counselor and the coordinator that releases you. And at some point, I went there and I said, hey, listen. I need to get my ride approved. They, they have to approve the people that come to see you because like, I guess they just, I don't know why. I don't know why it doesn't matter. It's so stupid because like you could basically have anybody pick you up and then drive down the street and all your buddies could jump in the car and which people do. But my, my brother was coming to get me and my brother and my, my brother, my sister-in-law and my mom were coming and but I think my sister-in-law wasn't approved. So I was trying to get her approved. So I kept going to the counsel, going to the counselor and going to the coordinator and saying, Hey, look, my sister-in-law, I need to know because I don't want her to show up and me not be able to get in the car with her. And she was like, yeah, yeah, well, there's plenty of time. I was like, no, there's not like I'm, I'm leaving on, you know, on Tuesday. And the, the coordinator looked and she goes, you're not leaving for a couple more months. And I went, What? And she goes, yeah. She said, I went, no, I'm leaving October, whatever it was, you know, October 12th or whatever. And she went, no, no, wait a second. She pulled it up. She goes, no, you're not leaving until uh, January 9th. And I was like, what? She said, yeah, you're leaving January 9th. And I went, no, I, I, and I explained it to her and I said, I, I go, I can show you the paper. And she goes, hold on. She goes, oh yeah, it got changed. Well, nobody told me that. 
My mother thinks she's coming to see me next week. And and she's like, no, oh, no, no, she's, no, she's not. Because trust me, that's that's not, yeah. So, yeah, oh, well, sorry. I mean, listen, you know, not I didn't give a shit, really. I didn't care about staying in a few more months. Like, that that didn't mean anything to me. But, you know, the fact that, that you know, I told my, my 90-year-old mother at that time, I think she was 90 or 91, told my 90-year-old mother that, I was, you know, and every time I talked to her, when are you coming? When are we coming to pick you up? When are you? Know, it'd been like that for over a month. So now I got to tell her, hey, look, at, I'm sorry. This is what happened. You know, there's so many people at the halfway house. They pushed a bunch of people's dates back. And so a few more months go by. At least by that point, I did have some clothes sent in, which was great. Um, you know, I, I pack up all my stuff. I go to R&D. The, you know, you go early in the morning. You know, I go to R and D. I had to drag all my stuff to R and D, which was I had so much legal work and just you know legal work, books, just tons of stuff that I wanted to bring. And I had mailed a bunch of stuff home already, so I'm dragging it there. And I remember I got to R and D, and you know the COs in R and D can't work with inmates. Like that's how you end up in R and D because you've had so many problems dealing with with inmates or just people in general that uh, that 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 you end up working in a place where all you do is paperwork so i get there and i say hey i'm here what you cox and i was like yeah i'm I'm cox and they all right yeah uh, cox go over there you're like all right so you go over there you stand here you wait you wait they strip search you because they don't want you to sneak anything out of the prison because apparently we've got great stuff in the prison. We want to sneak out of the prison. Then they go through all of my stuff. Now, I've got tons of stuff. It took me two trips to get to R&D. Well, I had to drag stuff across the compound. So if you want to know how large a compound is, imagine like a city block. Like, I mean, it's like a large park in the middle of the compound. So I have to drag all my stuff. Then I have to drag it back, another load. Um, and so I finally get to R&D. And so they look through all my stuff. And I go, okay. And then I'm sitting there and they're like, all right. And then they wait and they wait. And then they come back and then they, 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 they fingerprint you again. They give you another DNA. Um, I <laughs> remember the guy in front of me. They, they make you, they make you, this is funny. They make you tell your chart, like what your charge is. They're like, uh, Cox, uh, uh, what's your reg number? <laughs> you know, uh, 40171 dash 018. And they're like, all right. Uh, what are your charges? And I go, it's, you know, fucking bank fraud, wire fraud, money laundering, passport fraud, identity theft. I said, I, yeah, there's a bunch of other ones. Um, financial institution fraud, uh, government document fraud. And, and I go, social security fraud. He goes, all right, Jesus Christ. He goes, all right. Um, so I remember you you do all that and you're waiting and then the, I remember there was a guy another guy with me and they go okay what's this and so they name they uh, they talk to him a little bit and he re- gives them their reg number and then he goes what's your charges he goes man you know what my charges are man and he goes now nah, what are your charges <laughs> the guy ends up saying and you know this is a guy who I'm sure the entire time he was in Coleman had been telling everybody he was there for something else. And he was like, man, child, child pornography. And he goes, speak up, speak up. <laughs> and he has to tell him, like, child, I'm not going to say it because I don't want the algorithm, but child, whatever. And he tells him what it was. You know, he had some bad stuff on his computer. And um, and I just remember thinking, like, I'd never really talked to the guy, but I just remember thinking, wow, like, I never, I wouldn't have guessed it. Like I thought you were here for, for, for I thought he was here I thought he was there for like drugs or something. You know, he didn't look the type. So and the guy was like, yeah, all right. And so he stands there. So then I it, he go I remember he went, his family showed up first, so he left or whatever. He was going to a bus station or wherever and they took him. And then like thirty minutes later, then then I go. Like they were like, Hey Cox, your your uh, your family's here. And then they were like, you know, who's coming to get you? What what are their names? It's like man, cut the shit. Like, let me go. So I tell him and then they go, okay, well, R&D is a detached building from the front of the prison. Like there's multiple layers of security. And so I have to go from R&D, I have to go like, it's like 400 feet 
to the next building. And I went, all right. And I grabbed some of my stuff. I said, I'll have to come back for that. And he goes, he goes, no, you ain't coming back. I said, yeah, bro, that's my legal work. I have to come back for it. And I said, I can't carry it. He goes, you got to carry it all at once. And I go, like, I mean, we're talking about like, like four, we have like four duffel bags. Like I can't, I can't drag these. Like, and the duffel bags, they're not even duffel bags. Like there's like a duffel bag. And then I ended up having, I ended up having like a, a, a couple laundry bags. Like you can't drag them. They'll tear. They're shitty laundry bags. And I went, no, I can't. I said, well, then I need to borrow one of these dollies. And they have those big bins, you know, where you can throw clothes, you know, that are like a big square made of canvas with wheels. I'm like, well, I'll have to borrow one of these. They go, you ain't, you ain't taking that. And I went, what am I supposed to do with my legal work? And he goes, well, we can chuck it. We can throw it away. And I went, I'm not throwing it away. It's my legal work. I'm still fighting a lawsuit. I'm not, I'm not doing that. And he goes, well, then you're not leaving. I said, well, then I won't leave. I said, tell my family to leave. I'll stay. And he goes, well, you're going to stay in the shoe. I said, well, like, I ain't never fucking been to the shoe. I said, I've been to the shoe like three or four times. I said, I'll go to some shoe time. I don't care. I'm not leaving away without my shit. And he sat there. And he was like, all right, we'll grab that bin. Load it up. I ain't helping you load it in the bin. It's like, you know, there's such pricks. So you got you throw it in the fucking bin, and I throw it in the in the bin, and then we wheel it out, wheel it out to the car. You know, you got to go through multiple layers. Like there's a sally port, they buzz you in one door, they buzz you out the other. You know, they check you, they look at your ID again, they ask you who you are again, what's your reg number. It's just like, oh my god, like I'm with two guys here. So get all the way to the front. My brother's there. Hey, what's up? And, um, you know, obviously I hug my brother. We grab my stuff. They won't let me take the bin outside the front. So my brother and I have to take my bags. <laughs> what the hell? So, um, I end up going, my mom's in the car and, uh, it's, you know, uh, she's by this point, she had had a stroke. And so she couldn't walk. And the last probably year she was, probably the last year to two years she was coming to see me. She was coming to see me in a wheelchair. And so obviously I see her, I hug her, I get in the back of the car and pack all my stuff in and we're driving. Um, and I remember... This happens to me every fucking time I tell this fucking story. I remember being in the back of the car and driving and the prison was, you know, it's getting small and I can see it for the first time. Well, not for the first time. Like, I think I'd seen it from a bus before and, you know, I'd seen it, but like it's, it's getting further and further away and uh, I can see it. And you're, you know, and there's like multiple layers of the prison. There's, you're, you're, as you're, you drive down a long street and there's signs and there's this and there's this prison. You can see the girl's prison and you can see the other prisons. You can see the pen. And so you're driving, you get all the way out of the complex and you pass the thing and you're driving and you can kind of tell where you're passing, where the prison is, where they're, where they're, the, the, whatever the lands that they own. And I remember my brother saying, um, because I remember I was, it was so quiet in the car. Like, I don't think anybody knew what to say. But I was sitting in the back seat with my mom. And my brother was in the front seat. And my sister-in-law was in the, is in the other seat. And we were driving. And it was just real quiet. I was kind of looking at the prison. And uh, I started tearing up. And I remember my brother, I, I guess he was looking at me in the rearview mirror. And he said, well, I get your, I guess, uh. He goes, you're glad to be, see that place, or you're glad to be leaving that place, huh? And I was like, yeah. I, I just think I shook my head, but I remember thinking, it seems weird to be saying this, but it's not like I was like relieved to be leaving as much as I was sad because there were so many people that I liked there. It's like all the friends that I had were in that prison. You know, I have a, a friend named Pete. God, you know, there's, there's, you know, there's a guy named Donovan Davis. There's, um, 
you know, there's tons of guys. Uh, Jesus, there's a guy named uh, Dennis Caroni, uh, which I can't stand. But, you know, I'm, I, I, I saw him every day and we hung out and God, he was irritating. And, uh, but, you know, I, I, I knew I was going to miss all those guys. And I felt horrible that I was leaving and I knew they were still there. And, you know, it's survivor's guilt, I think, that, you know, you, I don't know. Anyway, I, uh, I just felt bad. Hold on. So it's, it's just survivor's guilt, I think, from, you know, you make it through something and you feel bad for the people that you have to leave behind. Um, yeah, so we drove and I remember my brother said, you know, are you hungry? It was probably 10 or 11 o'clock. And I think they give you like, it's funny, they give you like an hour and a half, like Coleman's an hour and a half from Tampa. And they give you an hour and a half to get to, to the halfway house. And I've known guys that have taken like two or three hours to get there when they had like an hour and a half and they showed up, you know, three hours later, they stopped and ate and they're like, oh, what are they going to do? You know, I'm just going to show up. I'll be there today. They get there and they violate them immediately and send them back to prison. So, well, they don't send them back to prison. They actually put them in like a, a, a holding facility in the county. The county has a holding facility for people that violate for the feds. They'll hold them there for two or three months go in front of the judge and the judge will send them back to prison. And then they'll do some more time in prison to go back to the halfway house. They'll be back in six months because they were late. Uh, so I knew I had like an hour and a half. I might've had two hours. Anyway, I remember driving and I, we drew our, my brother drove me there and we drove and we, we were going and my brother said, uh, what do you want? You know, what do you want to eat? You want to stop and get something to eat? And I was like, yeah, I want to, and I, I remember I'd been thinking about this because people ask you a lot when you're leaving, like, what do you want to eat? What do you, what's your first meal going to be? And, you know, guys are always like, oh, I'm going to go and I'm going to get a steak and I'm going to get this. And, and I, I just wanted a, 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 a cheeseburger from McDonald's. So like a cheeseburger, and I don't mean a big cheese, like a little, little kid's cheeseburger and French fries and a Coke. A fountain Coke, because I hadn't had fountain Coke in like forever. So anyway, we went to McDonald's and they were still serving lunch. I mean, it's still serving breakfast. They were still serving breakfast, so I couldn't get that. So then we pulled over and we went to like a, a CVS or something. And I think, or something like that, like a, a drugstore, maybe Walgreens or something. And I, we pulled into a Walgreens and I got a Ben and Jerry's uh, pistachio ice cream and so I ate the pistachio ice cream on my way to the halfway house we got to the halfway house went in the halfway house dragged all my stuff in the halfway house left some of it in my car in my brother's car went in the halfway house they then searched all my stuff now that, that I get because they want to make sure that you they want to make sure that you're not sneaking in drugs into the halfway house and the halfway house is just like a prison. There's not as many layers of security, but they still, the people that they run it worse than a prison in, in, a, in a very real way because they're searching you constantly. The great thing about prison is in federal prison, you don't really have to have any inter interaction with any staff members or guards, you know, correctional officers or anything. Like you can go months and months without ever talking to them. You're basically on your own. You know, they, they announce it's time to eat and the door is open. You go to eat. You know, you go through the whole thing, you eat, you put your plate up, you leave. You know, they might search you when you leave randomly. But if you walk out and you're in a t-shirt and a, and a pair of, you know, pair, you're, you're in your uniform, slacks and a t-shirt and you don't even look like you could possibly, they're not going to search you. They search guys that are walking out with like two jackets on who are, you know, and look like they got something like, oh, I'm going to search this guy. So I, I almost never got searched. Um... You, know, you just have very, there's no real need to, for interaction. So anyway, I leave and I go to the halfway house. These people search my bags. They give me a piss test immediately. And I know tons of guys that have on the way to the halfway house, got stoned, got to the halfway house, failed a piss test. They immediately violate them, send them to the county, 
they sit there for three months, get in front of a judge, judge them back to jail for six months. Then six months later, they come back to the halfway house for a month or something. Inmates are idiots. Like, I mean, they really are stupid. He built some of the nation's largest banks out of an estimated $55 million because 50 million wasn't enough and 60 million seemed excessive. He is the most interesting man in the world. I don't typically commit crimes, but when I do, it's bank fraud. Stay greedy, my friends. Support the channel. Join Matthew Cox's Patreon. But like, so I, I'm in the halfway house. The halfway house is set up. There's probably maybe a hundred people in the halfway house. It was, I went to the one on Hillsborough Avenue in Tampa, Florida, and it was, it's run by the Goodwill. So the Goodwill runs, they have a contract with the federal government to run a halfway house. Maybe six months to a year prior to me getting there, you were, they allowed you to have a cell phone. Wasn't allowed a computer, you're allowed a cell phone. So, and they have to check your cell phone on a regular basis. They'll check it, they'll check it randomly throughout the week. You, they have a list and suddenly they call you, you bring your cell phone here, you bring your cell phone, they pop it open, they check it, and they check it every time you come in and leave the facility. It's outrageous. They, and they, they scroll through your stuff. Like they'll go through all your pictures. Like there will be people that will take pictures in the halfway house. They'll give them a shot. If they do it again, they'll, they'll violate them. They don't want pictures in, inside the halfway house. There were guys that guys would take a selfie in like the bathroom of themselves and they would find that and that's it. Oh, that's it. It's like, bro, I'm, I'm in the bathroom. It's like me and you can see the mirror. Like you can't see any, doesn't matter. So search my stuff. Give me a piss test. I'm fine. Um, they put me in a room with, it's got eight beds in it. Most of the rooms have about eight beds. And eight to, I think some of them, some have like 12, 10 or 12. Anyway, so they're like 100 people. So I go into one of the rooms and they have men and women there too. That's another thing you'll get violated for. A lot of guys will hook up with the girls. You can't really hook up with them because you're, you're just being watched all the time. But they'll, maybe they'll go on a, like a, they'll both leave to go to, I'll explain it. And they'll, they'll hook up outside or something. Somebody, they'll find out, bam, violated. Um, so I go in, I end up getting, get into a room. It's an eight man room. It's me and seven black guys. And I had actually been in prison with a couple of the black guys, right? Cause guys are coming from all over. Like you might be in California, but your release date or your release area or um, district is, is in Florida. And you end up at a halfway house in Tampa, even though you did all your time in California or Oregon or wherever you end up in uh, in there, but I happened to be I was with a couple of the guys that were there. So I walk in, they're like, "What's up, Cox? How's it going?" I'm like, "What's up?" Um, so that was cool. I have my 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 bunk, which was not a great bed, but compared to a prison bed, it was great. Uh, you get you get one you get one locker. You have to put all your stuff in the locker. What a pain that was uh, to try and just literally half my locker was completely filled up with just like paperwork, books. Um, so I remember I got to the halfway house and as soon as I walked in the front door, so like I was still waiting like to wait for them to bring me back to do the, the urinalysis thing. I was waiting and I remember I looked probably up, maybe it's probably 75 feet, maybe a hundred feet away. Cause it's a big room. They call it the day room. It's this really just big open bay room and all the women's, the women's rooms are on one side. And I want to say there's probably four women's rooms with eight beds a piece in those rooms. And then the rest are on the, are the guys rooms on the other side. So, so maybe there's, 35 maybe 30 women and 70 guys something like that maybe less women but i remember i looked across and i saw this chick sitting with another woman and some somebody else some guy there's a bunch of tables there 
Like there's a bunch of couches. As soon as you walk in, there's a bunch of couches and TV and a TV. Just past that, there's a bunch of little circular tables with maybe four chairs around them. There's probably 10 of those, maybe 12. And there's also a TV there. And then to the left of that is a hallway that leads to where they dispense um, medication and the kitchen. And then on the right side is an area where they have a class, like it's like a, it's like a, a very a miniature version of art app, of like a drug treatment class. So I get there to the halfway house. I look over and I see Jess, which is the chick I'm I'm currently I'm currently because you know just currently, um, she'd love that. So uh, th- um, my girlfriend that I I uh, live with. I saw her in the halfway house. So I saw her with this other woman and somebody else, some other guy. And I saw her and I, I remember looking at her and thinking just like, like I got to get me one of them. Um, so, but I remember sitting there in the halfway house and thinking while I was sitting there, I was like, there are three things I need to work on. One is I've got to get a vehicle Two. I go, well, I got to get a job first. Then I got to get a vehicle. And at some point in the future, I got to get one. I got to get a girlfriend. Um, and I had no, I have no phone. Like you have no idea. You just have nothing. You have all these things you need to do and you need to acquire. And I had nothing. I did have a few hundred dollars. Like I think I had like $300. I actually had, was had prided myself that I was going to get out of prison with no money, none. Like I expected to walk out with like 12 cents on my books. Like I was telling everybody, they were like, where are you going to work? I would go, well, I'm going to try and get a job. But I mean, if I, if I don't get a job and you know, I'll apply it some places, but I'm going to have a job within a few days or a week, then I'll go work at McDonald's. And everybody was like, man, you ain't going to work at McDonald's. And I'm like, yeah, I am. So I, I, I want to work at my, I wanted to work at McDonald's because I remember thinking I want to work at McDonald's so that for the rest of my life, people could, you know, and I heard somebody complaining. I could say, listen, bro, I got out of prison and worked at McDonald's for six months. And then I did this and then I did this and then I did this. So I don't want to hear how hard your life is or how you're not happy with your, you know, your current job or whatever. You don't like it, change it. You know, like I've, I started at the bottom, nothing, a pair of blue jeans, some sweatpants, 300 bucks in my bank or my, well, I wanted like no money in my bank account working at McDonald's and McDonald's gives you a uniform, right? So like you can go there and get a uniform. Like I didn't need anything. You don't need anything. McDonald's is geared toward you starting with nothing. So I was excited about it. Uh, like I, I looked at the whole thing as like an adventure, right? Like it's like this is all an adventure. Like it's it's fun. Like the worst that happens is I go back to prison. Um, and I remember thinking I was going to bust my I was I have no problem busting my ass for a year straight. Like I'll do nothing but work and and save my money and make it a game make a game out of it. Well, it ends up what ends up happening is I pick up the phone. I thought, but you know, obviously I'm going to try and get a regular job first. I'm going to make a, that attempt, but who's going to hire me? So. I go to, they have pay phones in the halfway. You don't even have, you don't have cell phones. They got pay phones, right? You know, I don't have a cell phone. So I go to the pay phone, pick up the phone. And I had the phone, I, I look up or I get the phone number to Calta's gym, which was funny because it was one major road away from where I was. I was on Hillsborough Avenue and one major road over is Waters Avenue. So I knew that the gym was about, about two miles from the halfway house, which just just a fluke. And I had grown up with some guys, a guy named uh, Trent Calta, Treon Calta, and Troy Calta. And their father owned a bunch of gyms, the gyms that I worked out as a teenager. And into my 20s, when I was in college, I worked out there all the time. And I grew up with these guys and we were friends. Like I was best friends with Trent Calta. But Trent, I knew wasn't really, he was like a personal trainer now. Treon was running the gyms. So I called the gym and said, hey, my name is Matt Cox. And, and it's funny because the, 
the woman that I that answered the phone, she's like, oh, Matt, yeah, I know who you are. Yeah, you're Fred Atreon's. What's going on? I said, well, look, can you tell him I'm in the halfway house? And, you know, obviously she knew. She must have known something. I could hear it in her voice like, oh, wow. Oh, I'm okay. Hey, Matt. So I could tell. Uh, and I was like, hey, can you tell Treon I'm in the halfway house? And and she goes, you know what? She said, let me. Um, she said, yeah, I will. Do you have a phone number? I said, yeah, you can call the phones back, like the, the pay phones you could actually call back. So I gave her the number. And she said, I'll call him on his cell phone, let him know. And I'd say maybe 20 minutes later, the phone rang. I picked it up. Um, or maybe somebody else got it. Somehow or another, I picked. I ended up on the phone with him. I was like, hey, what's up? And he said, what's going on? What are you doing? Where are you? Where are you? I said, I'm at the halfway house on Hillsborough Avenue. And he goes, I said, you know, at the uh, at Goodwill. And he goes, whoa, bro. He said, um, "What? do you need anything? And I went, I actually, you know, I hate to say this, but I, I do. I, I need a job. I said, I need to save up some money to get a car. And he went, um... I said, I don't have a vehicle. I don't really have a way to get there. I could probably take the bus. He goes, no, nah, bro. He said, um, he said, I'll give you a job. Of course, he said, I can't pay you much. Like, we don't, we don't pay anything. Like, they pay, like, minimum wage. And he said, I, but, but I can run interference for you or with the halfway house. And I said, that sounds good. And what he meant by that was, you know, I can help you move around. Like, I'll work with you in the halfway house. And so what ended up happening was, I was scheduled to work 80 hours a week at the gym. So he picked me up every morning, almost always late, picked me up in the morning and dropped me. And then he would drop me off at night or someone would drop me off at night. And somebody picked me up. Like sometimes his wife would pick me up. Trion would pick me up. Um, other people at the gym would pick me up. You know, it's literally a mile or two away. So, so he picked me up. A couple days later, he, well, first I got, I had to get him approved, right? Like you got to see your counselor and do all this stuff. And I have to pay while I'm in the halfway house. And you have to understand too, that the halfway house takes like 30% of every of your gross. So if I make a thousand dollars, they take 300 a, a week, they take $300 plus your, and then, then you, of course you also have your taxes of 200, 300 bucks. So if you make a thousand dollars, you're lucky if you're, if it, if you're making Four hundred dollars a week. If you make a thousand, which I didn't make a thousand, but what Trion did was he paid me minimum wage. He gave them my schedule, saying I worked eighty hours a week, and he paid me minimum wage. But he only paid me for maybe forty hours, forty maybe fifty hours. And for some reason, the halfway house never put it together that I was gone. 80 hours, plus they give you, they gave me like an hour, well, they gave me 30 minutes to get there and get back. So I was scheduled for, I got an, another hour every day. So I'm getting, I'm out of the halfway house. I think it was like 86 hours because I didn't work every day. Sunday I got off. So 86 hours a week is roughly what I was working with the obviously the six hours is travel time when it doesn't take that long but so i got 80 i was able to get out of the halfway house 86 hours a week and they would call when i get there you pick up the phone you call and when you're leaving you call and then they call randomly throughout the day every once in a while they would call initially the first month or two they call like almost every day then it starts to trail off and so but he would pay me for like 40 hours maybe 50 hours a week but i was gone 80 they never quite put it together that this guy is supposed to be working, but he's not, he's not getting the money. There's just nobody to really make that, you know, they don't, that what they do is they, you get your, you get in your, you know, you get in your, your, your paycheck. They they want to see your paycheck and then they want to, you okay, we'll go cash it and give, bring us a cashier's check for the difference for the 30%. They, okay, you got to make a copy, you fill out a form, the whole thing. Anyway, so a couple, a few days later, maybe a week later, Trion picks me up and he picked me up. And I remember, you know, we went, obviously the first day I remember was nothing but me just telling stories, nothing but guys showing up like friends. It's funny too, how many friends I suddenly had, like guys are showing up like, bro, what's up, man? It's me, Mike, man. What's going on? I'm like, I have no idea who this guy is, but apparently when you talk to him, we were best buddies growing up in high school and we were friends in college and, and 
I don't, I don't have any clue really who this person is. Like I, I, as he talked, I was like, I kind of think I remember meeting this guy, you know, and, and that happened quite a bit. Uh, I Trent uh, Trent well Trion's dad was there, so I talked to him and his girlfriend. Um, eventually, Troy shows up. Um, Trion showed up. No, I'm Trion. I'm sorry. Trent showed up. Troy showed up. Trent was there. Like everybody shows up. So the first day or two is nothing but stories. And I was trying to set. I remember saying I got to save up some money for a, a, a car, a vehicle, and literally within maybe a week. My ex-wife called me and told me that one of the stories for these guys that I'd gotten into Rolling Stone magazine, it was a story, it was a book, it was called, uh, the the short story I wrote was called, um, I called it uh, um, Orange, was it Oxy, Oxy Rush, Oxy Rush was the first one I wrote, and then I expanded it into a book. And uh, it was called uh, Generation Oxy, and I had this. Uh, the, I had worked with a a reporter that got it into Rolling Stone magazine. Wrote an article on Rolling Stone magazine, and the truth is, I wrote the article. And then at the last minute, the guy basically put his name on the article, and really fucked me over. But ended up optioning it, and I so I got a piece of that option. Um, you know which never really seemed fair to me but i was in prison and and i don't there wasn't much i could do it was i wasn't given like much of a of an option so uh, i got i got would get a check right but i got a check and i got to get a check for like it was like a little over six thousand dollars like maybe six thousand dollars sixty two hundred something like that and then so my ex-wife calls or ends up calling me and saying hey listen by this point, by the way, the second day of I was at the halfway house, I was allowed to leave. So I, I left. I want to say I had four hundred dollars because I went to I went to Walmart. My brother was allowed to pick me up, drive me to Walmart, and drive me back. And I bought three hundred dollars worth of clothes at Walmart. And I got like two pair of blue jeans, which I still have today. Size thirty waist. And I, I got some black t-shirts and some white t-shirts. Um, and I got a pair of rubber boots and oh, what else? Socks, underwear, some hair care products. That's important. Still had my, my brush. I still have the, my brush from prison, from the medium from the medium, I still have my brush from prison, from the medium right now in my thing. I need a new brush though, because some of the, you know, it's got the long bristles things, the long ones, and a couple of them have broken off. It's it's time for a new, but still have it. I'm very frugal. Um, anyway, I got a bunch of stuff, deodorant, whatever, went to Walmart, so came back and had, I remember I had about a hundred bucks I do remember that. I do remember after I went to Walmart, I had about a hundred bucks left. So anyway, probably a week or so later after going to the gym, my ex-wife calls me on my cell phone and said, you've got a check here. And I went, really? And she went, yeah, you got a check here. Cause she had been getting the checks from the other, th from the other uh, options. And I go, how much is it? And she goes, um, hold on. And she looked at it and she's like, oh, it's you know, $6,300 or 62, whatever it was. And I was like, are you fucking serious? They optioned, they optioned the movie again, or the, 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 the rights to this, the life rights to uh, this kid's story again. And I went, I was just like, whoa. I was able to take that money. I was able to go open up a bank account at Wells Fargo Bank, deposited the check, put my hundred dollars in there, and applied for a secured credit card. So I got a secured credit card for like three hundred bucks from Wells Fargo because I had to build up. My, I wanted to build up my credit, and I did that. And um, and I took the money and I went and I want to say it was like 24, 2,500 bucks, 2,600 bucks. I bought a Jeep Liberty, a Jeep, like, right? It's like a chick Jeep. So I bought this chick Jeep and I was able to drive 
back and forth to work. Oh, and I got a year's worth of insurance. So I got a year's worth of insurance. And when I was in prison, I had gotten my driver's license while I was in prison because they have something, they call it the flow bus, right? The, it's the Florida Department of Motor Vehicles, you know, transportation, but whatever, where they go to prisons and you can get a driver's license. So I had to take a test, had to go, I took the test, not the driving test, obviously you're in prison, they don't like to let me drive. So, but I took the test, got my picture taken and I had a driver's license and the picture on my driver's license that I have to this day is the picture that I took in prison. Still same picture, same thing. So, um, yeah, so I had a driver's license. I, had, I, I, got, um, I got insurance, got a car, super thrilled, able to drive to work and back, and uh, started flirting with Jess. You know, she was helping me with my, uh, with my phone. I start going and I start sitting down at the table with her. So in the morning, I wake up, you know, in the morning, I wake up, I wake up, I go get my food, my, my, my free meal, my free, you get several free meals. You get free meals and then you got meals you can pay for. And Aaron wasn't thrilled at the idea of paying for a meal because they take 30% of everything you make and that includes your meals. But if you want extra stuff, like you're like, yeah, hey, here's your, we're giving serving sort of meatloaf for, for dinner tonight, but you can also, if you want, you can buy a hamburger. Or you can buy this or buy that. And so guys start spending their money on that. And that just seemed ridiculous. Like I'm already paying 30%. Which to be honest, for three meals and a roof over your head, 30% of your salary is not really a bad deal. Even though everybody complained about it, it's not a bad deal. The problem was they felt like, hey, I'm still in prison. Because what people don't understand about the halfway house is, at least the one in Tampa, you'll talk to other guys who'll say, that's not what a halfway house is like. Listen, bro. I don't know what your halfway house is like on your state crime with your state halfway house in your nice, plush, liberal state. But this was a federal halfway house in a very conservative district. And I can tell you right now, you are allowed to go to work and back. You're not going to dinner with your family. My family wanted to visit me. They had to come to the facility. I, you're allowed if you have to go buy something you're allowed you where are you going? What's the address? You have to fill out a form. They have to OK it and they'll tell you who's picking you up. Okay, we're giving you 15 minutes to be there. You have one hour and 15 minutes. You have, you'll have to be back here in an hour and a half. 15 minutes there, an hour to st spend in the store, so it better not be crowded, and 15 minutes to get back or we violate you. And they love to violate people. Love it. Like it, it and you're being counted three, four times a day. It, it's, it's really ridiculous. Really what bothered me when they would count us in the middle of the night. They, they, could just, they would shine the light in your face and wake you up at two in the morning. You're like, are you serious? Like, this is a halfway house. And there's only one way in and one way out. Like, nobody snuck out. Nobody's escaping from the halfway house. Do you know why? Because if I got up and walked out the front door, they don't have permission to physically stop me. So I don't have to... I don't have to climb up in the rafters and and saw my way through through the roof and sneak out so that I have an extra two hours of time and jump the fence and get by the guard tower. Like I can walk out the front fucking door. You're not gonna stop me. You're not even allowed to stop me. So why are you counting me us at one in the morning? Anyway. Okay. So I end up buying the car, I get the thing, get the whole thing, see Jess, start flirting with Jess. Because every once in a while, you know, I'm sitting there and the first time I, I ate, there was this this woman that was there. Her name was uh, Tina. Uh, Tina is, you know, like, she's insane. I mean, she really is insane. Like, um, not sure what to believe. Any, not, no, that's not true. I know not to believe pretty much anything she says. Like she, when I asked her, so we sat down, we were sitting there and Tina's massive. She's a, she's gotta be six, over six foot tall. And so I see my girlfriend, Jess, Jess has got like one arms tatted out, um, brown hair, weighed a buck. I'm gonna say she weighed a buck 55, right? And she's like five, six, she's my height. I think I'm taller than her, but whatever. That's, you know, it's also probably partially a mental condition that I have. I feel I'm about half an inch to an inch taller than her, but whatever. So she's about, she's, we're both about five, six. She's 150, probably believe my weight at that point. By that point, 
I was starting to gain some weight. Like I've been eating. Um, in the halfway house, I got up to like one. When I left the halfway house, it was probably one sixty-five. So Jess is probably one fifty, one fifty-five, and you know we're sitting there. Tina sees me, and this is by the way, this is like the white table. So everybody else is either Hispanic or black, and then you have like one table of the whites. Because even though it's a halfway house, it's still much, like I said, it's really a prison. And so guys are still clicking up. So, and there were, there would be like a black guy would sit at our table or a Hispanic guy or something like that. No big deal. Like nobody cares. But for the most part, I'm sitting at like the white table. So I sit there with, um, with Tina and Jess. And there were these two other guys. Uh, one of the guys I called Snowden because he looked just like uh, Snowden. Um, and he was super good with computers too. Like he would help you with your phone and stuff. He didn't want to help me, by the way. He hated me. He hated me. There were a couple other white guys that were there. They hated my guts. Um, because as soon as I got there, somebody obviously had said, this guy cooperated. Like this guy got 26 years. He just got out of prison. He cooperated. Like, you know, and I knew that rumor was going around. And the other thing that happened was as soon as I got there, the COs or COs, whatever they call them, they, they knew me and so they started watching. It slowly went around where everybody was watching American Greed. I had been on a program called American Greed. So they're watching American Greed. And so I remember walking by this one counselor. It was a counselor and he walked by and he looked at me and I go, what's up? And he goes, saw you last night. And I went, what? He said, yeah, watch your show. And I go, what show? And he goes, American Greed. And I said, man, I said, who else? Who else has anybody else seen that? He goes, oh, everybody's seen it. Everybody's seen it. He said, we all, we all start, we've all seen it by now. And I was like, okay. And so then one day, a couple days later, I remember walking where the couch area was and I'm walking by and there's a guy sitting there watching the American Greed on his phone. So, and keep in mind, I got a phone, I got a, like an $80 cheap, real cheap Android phone for like 80, 90 bucks. So I get the phone and I downloaded some app that lets you get free, uh, you, you got to watch free movies, but I, I must have gotten a virus or something on it. Like everybody's like, oh, you were watching a porn site. I wasn't going, I wasn't watching a porn site. It was, it was, I think it was this one app. So I downloaded the app and it kept my phone kept freezing up and just doing weird stuff. And it was a cheap phone too. So I would I would ask Jess or I'd be like, hey man, my phone's messed up. And I remember I would always ask this guy Snowden. Now the reason I asked Snowden was one, he was good with phones and two, I knew he hated my guts. But there were multiple guys that hated my guts and I would sit at the table and Jess always laughs to this day. She's like, you knew that Carl and Snowden hated your guts. And you would walk out with your tray. She says, I, I would watch you look at them, grin, and sit down at the table. Boom. What's going on, guys? And I just start eating. And you could just see it that they would just, they were just disgust. They, would, they didn't want to sit with me like, oh, this fucking guy. And I'd go, what's up? How's it going? And I'd stare at them. They'd be like, what's up, man? Like, they, you didn't even, like, you didn't have the courage to go, to not say anything, to not to say, man, fuck you, or man, don't talk to me, or nothing. Like they talk around behind your back, but they don't even have the courage to say something to, to my face. So as a result, I constantly sat with them and tried to talk to them. I would talk to them. I talked to Je and Jess would sit there and grin because she knew she's like she's like I I was thinking to myself like does he know these guys don't like him? He's got to know. Like you can feel the tension, right? And I, I always joke, because I always say, yeah, look, this, look, I'm a con man. I've, I've got great intuition. And so I can feel when something's not right. Very intuitive. And so I would ask Jess to help me. Like, my phone kept freezing up. Like, it would freeze up, like, every day or two. And if Snowden was there, I had to ask somebody. So I asked Jess. And I remember Tina had invite, had, had said, you know, hey, oh, Tina talks with real, a real thick accent. My head? My head? I do a great Tina, too. I hope she doesn't see this. Um, it'd kill her because she because in her mind she has me fooled. Like I remember with the story she told me why she was arrested. Tina said she was arrested because my aunt, I was running a, a a a large construction a development company and we we needed money 
And so we asked some of the employees if they wanted to invest, and they invested some of their, they would empty out their 401k and give it to me. And because I didn't fill out the proper forms, I ended up getting charged with, with fraud, with wire fraud, and they gave me 10 years. Can you believe they gave me 10 years for that? No. No, I can't believe that a few guys gave you their their retirement and you simply didn't fill out the correct form and you got 10 years because the newspaper said you were running a fucking Ponzi scheme and that you were a pathological liar and that you continually lied and they couldn't believe anything that came out of your mouth and you spun them and spun them and spun them and you stole from your employees and your friends and family and lost a bunch of money. And then when the government came to introduce to talk to you, you lied to them too. And you lied and lied and lied. And as a result, you ended up getting 10 years. Roughly 10 years. It might have been 8, might have been 11. Whatever. I don't know. I don't know this what this the deal with this chick is but she did she did prison she definitely went to prison for like a a significant amount of time like it wasn't like two years which some people would say two years is significant but this was like it was like she ended up doing like like eight years seven and a half eight years so she had to have gotten like 10 years um and she got like a year's worth of halfway house uh, a year worth of halfway house so anyway um we're sitting there and I'm joking with Jess, and I remember joking with saying to Jess one time, like, my phone's fucked up. And then she goes, okay. She goes, give me your phone. We looked at it, and she went. And Jess was, by the way, at this point, Jess was 32 years old. Yeah, she was 31 or 32. And... And she looked at the phone and she goes, what's your password? And I told her what my password was. And my password ended with 69. It's like blah, blah, like whatever, you know, dog 69. And she goes, oh, 69, huh? She goes, you're one of those guys. And I went, no. I said, I don't even know what that means. But I said, no, but that's the year of my birth, 69. And she sat there and she froze and I could see the wheels moving, the calculations. And she looked at me and she went, well, she goes, you're 50? I went, well, I'm 49. I'll be 50 in a few months. And she goes, you're 50? And I went, I'm 49. And she goes, I go, why? And I remember I had said, like, the guys in my room, right? Like, the guys in my room were always like, bro, that chick likes you. I was like, no, she didn't like me. She was just, she, they go, you eat, you eat all your meals with her. She's always coming up to you. You guys are always talking and laughing. She thinks you're funny. She, she likes you, bro. And I'm like, no, she don't like me. We're just, we're just white. So we're clicking up together because we're, we're both, we're, there's very few whites here. And, and, you know, these are a bunch of black guys. They go, nah, Cox. You don't understand. You've been locked up too long. You don't see the signs. You don't understand. That girl likes you. And I went, nah, nah, she don't like me. And so when Jess is looking at my phone, she goes, she looked at my phone and she went, so you're 50? I went, oh, I'm 49. She goes, and she went, I go, why? Does it matter? And she went, well, no, it's just my 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 dad's like 50, 50, 53, 54. And I went and I remember thinking and keep in mind that I'm 18 years older than Jess. So I remember thinking to myself I was like like to me I was like, "Oh, okay, well what's the big deal?" And I thought, oh, "Wow. Like that's like she does like me because if you were friends what does it matter if I'm 18 years older than you? What does it matter if I'm 50? We're just friends. But as somebody you're prospectively thinking, this is someone I, I, I may like or want to hook up with or I'm interested in, now your age makes a difference. And so, and she was like, no, I, it, it's just my dad's like 50, 53, some 54 or something. And I was like, okay. And she goes, I go, you know, she was like, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. It's nothing. So we, she helps me and everything. But at that point, I remember thinking, this chick likes me. 
She likes me for sure. So I remember I went back to those guys in my room. I was like, listen, what just happened? And I told them, they're like, Cox, I told you, man. I told you that girl likes you. He built some of the nation's largest banks out of an estimated $55 million because $50 million wasn't enough and $60 million seemed excessive. He is the most interesting man in the world. I don't typically commit crimes, but when I do, it's bank fraud. Stay greedy, my friends. Support the channel. Join Matthew Cox's Patreon. So then... Uh, yeah, so then I start text. Oh, now this is the other thing. Jess was texting me a couple times a day, three, four, five times a day. For the next day, no texts. The next day, I text her like twice, got one response. And I didn't get the long five or six email, five or six sentences response. I got the, I'm like, hey, what's going on? How's your day going? How's everything going? Fine. Like an hour later, I got the one, the one word response. Fine. <laughs> Listen, no, no. You don't go from us going back and forth all day. I was like, oh, wow, okay. The 50, the 49, the 50 year old thing that bothers her. So then over the next week or two, she slowly started, you know, and, and then I started realizing like she has been flirting with me. And then at one point, she, I remember I was at the gym and she texted me and she said, hey, and, but I didn't text her back right away because um, I was doing something and I didn't realize my phone had gone off. So by the time I was like 20 minutes later, by the time I checked it and she, and I, she had said, hey, are you at the gym? Is it the one the gym on Waters Avenue? And I texted her back and I said, why? And she said, she's like, well, I was going to come by because she was coming back from her job. She worked as a, she worked as a, a, a maid at a, um, at a, at like a, 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 a motel. And so she took the bus back and forth. And so she was like, well, I, I got off work early and my bus stop isn't far from there. And I thought I might come by. And I was like, well, come by. And she's like, no, I can't because it's too late now. And I've got to catch the bus. If I don't miss this, this bus, and then whatever, I have to walk here, I have to do this, or whatever. It's a whole thing where she had like a 30-minute window that where she could have come by and seen me. And all I could think about was like, why are you coming by to see me? Why are you risking coming by and seeing me? And when I was like, what that night, like when I saw her, I was like, why, you know, why would you, why were you going to come by and see me? She's like, no, 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 I just, I was thinking about you. And I was like, you were, I said, well, like what? And she goes, I was just, I go, you think about me a lot? And she was like, I think about you sometimes during the day. I think about, you know, I was just going to stop. I wanted to see the gym. I wanted to see the gym. And I just was like, no, 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 there's something else is going on here. And she was like, no, nothing else. I go, yeah, yeah. You like me. You like me. And she's like, no, I don't like you. I don't think of you like that. I'm like, nah, I'm, listen, I'm, I'm a con man. I have very good intuition. I'm telling you right now, you dig me, you dig me. And she's like, I, I don't know what you're thinking. I don't dig you, not interested. She goes, I make fun of guys like you. Like I don't date, girls like me don't date guys like you. You have to think Jess was raised in, she was raised, her whole family has worked for like the dairy industry. So they they work, you know, they work on these dairy farms and dairy farms are, are listen, it's backbreaking work. Most of the dairy workers are, are Mexicans, are like illegal Mexicans. And, so her family, she's not Mexican, but you know, her family works like her sister like raises calves. Her father um breeds uh breeds cows, you know. Uh, Jess works in the factory. Um you, you know, her brother works maintenance. Um her mother was a milker. You know what I'm saying? Like they work, they work these factories. Now they don't all work there now, but they come and go. Her father still works there. And they come and go. Um but basically they she grew up in the and in on the on these large farms they have houses for the employees so you'll you can rent a house and so she grew up in these dairy houses so this is this is this is these are not soft nice well manicured um areas where these places are these are are you know dirt roads it's a rough area like she grew up very poor and 
Um, so she was like, you know, listen, we, I, she's like, girls like me make fun of guys like you. She's like, you don't hunt, you don't fish, you don't, you don't own, you don't own a truck, you don't like. She's like a cowgirl, you know. She's like a a, a, a farm, you know, a farm girl. Um, she's like a redneck, and so. Anyway, she she was like, and I was like, no, no. But I told her, I said, no. I said, you, you, you like you some city boy. That's what it is. You like, you like me. Anyway, um, she ended up leaving. Oh, this was funny too. This was funny. This is classic. You'll like this. This is so sad. I remember she said, we were sitting at the table one day and, and, one of the guys was talking about hooking up with some girl how they had met like some girl was you know whatever they he'd met her and they met in the parking lot or something he's like yeah man like, like i we were we've been meeting like for lunch and this and that and she works near me and and so it was like oh okay that's great that's great and i think it was a bobby anyway so we were talking and i remember um tina said to said well uh, Matt, have you are you are you looking for anybody? You thinking about dating anybody? And of course, you know I'm in the halfway house. Like, who's gonna date me in the halfway house? Like, I'm like, no, not really. I said, and she goes, well, what kind of girl do you like? And she goes, I work in an office. Like, I might know somebody. And I went, I mean, what kind of girl do I like? I said, I'll be honest with you. I said, I I like I, the kind of girls that I like. And or I said, honestly, it's not what you expected. She goes, what's that? I said. You know, like I, I like a chick with tattoos, you know, like maybe she's got some tattoos. She's a little rough around the edges. She's like a tomboy or, you know, maybe a stripper. Maybe she's a stripper. Maybe she's been married a couple times, got some kids. I don't know. Like I just, that's my, I kind of like that rough around the edges kind of. And so as I'm talking, Jess glances up at me and a couple of guys, everybody starts to glance over at Jess and Tina goes, well, what about Jess? And I went, Je- and she goes, what about Jess? And Jess looks at me and I went, I'll be honest with you. I said, Jess is about, I said, Jess is about 20 pounds away from being dateable. And she went, and and Jess goes, you think I need to lose 20 pounds? I said, no, I think you need to lose 30 pounds. But if you lost 20, you're dateable and we'll talk about the other 10. And she goes, well, I think I'm fine the way I am. I said, right, so that's fine. It's no big deal. I get it. You like me. It's not going to happen. She says, I don't like you. I go, whatever, whatever. So so anyway, not long after that, and she was so irritated by that. She brings that up to this day. So what's so funny about that, anyway, is that literally, you have to understand, she left. So she le- she gets on an ankle monitor. She goes home. And she was like, hey, I'm leaving tomorrow. Like, you know, like that's the kind of stuff she would do. She'd go, you know, I'm I'm supposed to be leaving tomorrow, right? And I'm like, yeah, I mean that's good, that's good. You get to go home and stuff. She's like, yeah, and she's giving me the girly, glancy eyes, you know, the whole thing, the whole little flirtatious, like you know, she's sad and you know, and then what do you think about? That? I'm gonna miss you. She didn't want to say it though. Anyway, she leaves. We keep texting. She gets home. Eventually, I leave. I end up leaving. So just before I leave the halfway house, I'm looking for a place to stay. So what I realized very quickly is that as a result of having a felony, nobody wants to rent to me. And I'm I'm being honest with people. When I call them, I'm like, hey, I'd like to rent a place, blah, blah, blah. Yes. And then they say, are you, well, okay, so are you a felon? I am a felon. I'm in a halfway house. I, yeah, okay, well, that's no, not going to happen. Click. Like that happened over and over again. So I'm having a real hard time. Tina ends up telling me she has a friend of her. No, she just built, She she because she was working for like a, a company that does um, engineering. And she said that they had just put on like a, a mother-in-law's quarters in these people's house that lived on Bayshore uh, Boulevard. So Bayshore Avenue, Bayshore, whatever. 
it's a, it's a it's a nice it's a really nice area. So in Tampa, so she tells me that hey, these people travel like nine months out of the year, and they need someone to house sit, and they will let you rent uh, stay for free in the back if you'll just make sure you watch their house. You'll, they'll have your cell number. You can call them, let them know what's going on. Everything's okay. Make sure the sprinklers are running. Nothing breaks. Whatever. I'm like, like that's a, that's a sweet deal. So I'm like super excited. So I basically stop looking, and I tell Tina, but I can feel something's not right about Tina. Like I know something's not normal with this woman. Like her story doesn't make sense. You got 10 years because you filled out a form. You didn't fill out the right form. Like, stop it. That's not what I've been to prison. I know what's going on. You're a fucking con artist. So you bilked a bunch of people. You ran a little Ponzi scheme just like what you pled guilty to in federal court. And you went to prison. So she said, So she's saying all this stuff. And I keep telling her, I want to go meet these people. Like, I'd like to come by and meet. Oh, of course, of course. So she schedules a time where we're going to go meet. And I, I, at this point, I can leave work. Like I've got it set up where where Treon, we've got it set up with a halfway house where I have to go pick up gym equipment and pick up things for the gym. And I have to go to Sam's Club and pick up stuff for the gym for Cokes or not Cokes, but whatever, you know, energy drinks and towels and cleaning equipment. So I'm allowed, I can, I can leave for a couple hours here, a couple hours there. And I started being able to go to see my mother like twice a week. I would go see my mom twice a week, like on Tuesdays and Thursdays in the morning, I would go in, sign into the gym, leave for two or three hours and then come back. So, which was great. I mean, I appreciate Treon for, for arranging that for me. Um, of course, the, the, they have no idea that the halfway house had no idea where I was going. They think I'm going to driving, you know, I'm driving to go drop off equipment or get equipment welded. Like we had all kinds of excuses. And then I'd come back and Treon, if they called, they, he'd say, yeah, yeah, he's not here. He had to go do this. And you have to call in and tell him, hey, I'm leaving. Here's where I'm going. And then you call, hey, I'm, I'm back now. So I would see my mom. Anyway, so I had it arranged where I was like, hey, I can go see these people. Let's set up a thing. And she rescheduled several times. She was like, oh, man, they can't do it today. Uh, they extended their trip, but they're going to be back on Wednesday. Can you do it Wednesday? Yeah, I can do it Thursday. Yeah, yeah, we'll do it Thursday. Yeah, Thursday or Wednesday or Thursday or Friday, whatever. It kept getting pushed back. And I was at the point where I was like, Tina, you don't seem to understand. Like, I'm leaving in, in a week. Like, I have to meet these people. And so it comes down to it where at the last minute I go to Tina and I say, the fuck is going on? And she goes, oh, man, I didn't want to tell you. I just found this out this morning. They don't want you to be. They want you to. They know me and we're friends and they want you to be there. But they talked to their son about it and their son looked you up and they said they don't want he doesn't want you at his parents house. I'm so sorry, Matt. And she tears up like she's going to she's going to start crying. And I'm like, are you out of your fucking mind? The other reason I knew it was fucked up was because Tina would send me stuff that I was like, hey, Tina, what are you working on? And she would send me stuff like she would send me uh, she sent me one time a little like a little one bedroom, one bath schematic oh, this is what I'm working on right now. And she sends it to me. Well, then a month later, when it, she was telling me she had these people's little, this little house thing in the back, mother-in-law's quarters in the back near the pool that I could stay in, she sent me the same schematic that she'd sent me a month or two before. Oh, well, yeah, we designed their whole, the mother-in-law's quarters, it just got finished, it's brand new. Here's a picture of it. Boom, and she sent it to me. And I thought, boy, that looks familiar. And I checked back a month or two. Sure enough, it's the same one she sent me before. Where she wasn't working on that one. This was another one she was working on in a development. So it was like, I, I know she's like, I already know she's lying. Because she also said that she was one of the girl, one of the one of the models in in uh, John Palmer's. Is it John Palmer? The guy who sings um, um, Addicted to Love. It was a big song, and they had a bunch of models that were dressed in black with slick black hair playing guitars. She said she was one of the models. So I went and looked up who all the models were. She's not one of the models. Anyway, 
And when I asked her, I said, hey, you know, it's funny, Tina. I said, I looked up those models. Like, you're not one of them. She's, oh, well, see, I was like 15 years old, so they couldn't use my name. My aunt, they couldn't use my name. I was underage, so they just left me off. Listen, I've seen those models. I stopped that video. She ain't one of the models. I don't care, 15 or not, she ain't one of them. Anyway, the point is, now at the very last minute in the halfway house, I have nowhere to go. Just so happened that I had a friend, or I had a girl that I dated. I had a girl that I dated when when I was, I was uh, 19. Was I 19? Yeah, I dated for about a year. I dated from the age of 19 to 20. We lived together. Her name was Stacy. Stacy and I had always remained friends. In fact, I went to Stacy's wedding um, and uh, actually ended up meeting a girl at Stacy's wedding and then took her like a week later, I took her to, uh, I want to say um, Acapulco uh, in Mexico, or was it Cozumel? Or, I don't know. I took her to Mexico for like uh, a week. Uh, her name was Christy. She was nice. She was a nice girl. Um, anyway, so I took, she's too tall. She was like 5'7", five, 5'8". Five, like it's, it was never going to work. But the point is, is I took her, like I meet her at Stacy's wedding. I remember too, Stacy sat me at the, she goes, look, I'm sitting you at a table with some of the bridesmaids. There's this one girl there. Her name her name is Christy. And I'm not gonna say her last name. Her name is Christy. And Christy is a very nice girl, Matt. Don't get any ideas. Do you understand? I was like, of course I'm not gonna get any ideas. I wouldn't do that. Did I ever tell you this story? Listen to this. So I remember <laughs> I go, so I go with Chris, I go and I meet Christy and I flirt with Christy all night. We end up, I end up, we end up going for like after the wedding towards the end, I go, hey, I go, let's get out of here. Let's go get some coffee. So we go to Starbucks and we get some coffee. She's in my car, right? I had, a, I had an Audi TT Quattro when they first came out, right? They were like 50, 60 grand. So it's like a hundred thousand dollar vehicle now. Anyways, super cool car. So shoot, now it's probably even more because cars are fucking outrageous. $40,000 vehicles now are going for $70,000. It's fucking crazy. So it's probably a $200,000 sports car now. Anyway, point is we go to, I remember we went to Starbucks. This is what, a, this is so, you're gonna love this. We go to Starbucks. We eat at Starbucks. I mean, not we eat, you know, whatever. We have some coffee and whatever, a scone or something. We, I flirt, you know, really seriously with her. We end up going back. We get in my car. Um, I drive her back to her car so she can get her car and go home. We start making out. And I remember, and so she goes to get out of her car and she goes, oh my God, I can't find my keys. And I, she goes, oh my God. She goes, I put them in the, in the chair at Starbucks. I go, shit, jump in the car, turn around, drive back to Starbucks, walk up. She's in the car. I walk up to Starbucks, knock on the door. There just so happens. They're just like leaving. Everybody's just walking out the door and they're like, yeah, what, what's going on? And, and I go, Did, I was here. There was a girl and she goes, car keys. And I went, Yes. And she goes and she gives me the car keys and hands them to me. And I go, thank you very much. And I walk, I put them in my pocket. I get in the fucking car. I start the car and she goes, did they have them? And I go, listen, here's what we can do. You can come back to my place. Or I said, if you feel uncomfortable with that, I said, I can, I, I can, I can rent you a hotel room or something. And she goes, I'm not going to let you rent me a hotel room. Cause she had like an hour drive or something. I said, and what we do is we'll come back here tomorrow morning. So I said, or you can come to my place, stay at my place. I'll sleep on the couch. And I said, and we'll come back here early in the morning and, and when they open and get the keys. And she goes, oh God. She sat there and she goes, I can't believe I can't go home with you. She goes, I can't. And I go, well, I'll sleep on the couch. She goes, you're not going to sleep on the couch. And she goes, oh my God. And she went, okay, look. She says, let's just go back to your place. And I go, I reached in my pocket and I pulled out the keys. I said, now listen, if I was a real scoundrel, <laughs> I said, I wouldn't, I said, I would have waited till we came back here the, tomorrow morning. I said, and I'd have said they gave me the keys. I said, one of, I want brownie points for giving you these keys right now. <laughs> Because I said, you don't know how much I want to find. I was hoping, I was, listen, I was this close to being like, damn, that was easy. Like, I'm just going to take this chick home. Like, what? it's, it would be stupid to give her the keys now. But I thought, nah, you know what? You get some brownie port. So I gave her the keys and she was like, oh my God. She's like, Stacy told me you were just a, a scoundrel. Like, you were a horrible person. Like, I gave you the keys. And then like a week later, I took her to, to, to fucking Mexico. For like a week. 
And then maybe two, three weeks later, we broke up. Um, you know, but this wasn't gonna last. She's too tall. She was a giant. She was like five seven, five eight. She's she, that's she's that's huge to me. So um, anyway, I so then back to Jess. So let me tell you how I ended up with Jess. Listen to this. This is good. So go back to Jess. I'm not so. Oh, it's the la- I'm at the halfway house. I'm at the halfway house. So the last minute, I call Stacy, my ex girlfriend Stacy. I call her and I go. And Stacy had already told me if you need a place to stay, I have a spare room. And I went, oh my god. So I call Stacy and I go, hey, um, God, you're not gonna believe this. She goes, I have the room all waiting for you. Not gonna be a problem. I said. Are you serious? And she goes, I said, Stacy, it's so weird. Like, I feel really weird. You're there with your husband and your kids, and it's just so uncomfortable. And she goes, it's not going to be uncomfortable. It's not a big deal. She said, she actually, she listen, she, she, she was actually a nice place. And she, she said, I'm renting another room to a friend of mine who's going through a divorce who's a police officer. So there's a cop living in one spare room, and I'm living in the other spare room. And then her kids live in a couple. And listen, it's a, for for I, well, I'm going to call it a rooming house. For a rooming house, it was a nice rooming house. Like this place is massive. She lives on two acres on a lake. The house is probably worth seven, eight hundred thousand dollars. Pool. So, um, I go there. I meet her, her husband and kids. A couple days later, I move all my stuff. I move, get, walk out of the halfway house. Move all my stuff out of the halfway house. And, um, yeah, so then I, I end up in the halfway house. I, mean, I end up in the halfway house. I, I move into the, her, her, I'm going to say, I would say rooming house, you know, because I did, I rented a room. So, I'm you know, I end up moving into the rooming house to Stacy's spare room. And, you know, and so about, so at the, the same time period, I had been, I had called a guy named Danny Jones. Um, Danny runs a, a YouTube channel called Concrete with a K. I think most people probably know this. Concrete with a K. So at the time, you know, it was doing pretty well. It had like three, I want to say it had 300,000 subscribers. He had about 300,000 subscribers. Might have been under 300 or maybe it was like a little, right at 300, let's say. So about, about 300,000 subscribers. And I had called him in the halfway house. I'd sent him an email and then we spoke on the phone. I told him who I was, but I also told him that I'd written a bunch of, of true crime stories. And I was wondering, thinking about starting a podcast. I was wondering if he could answer some questions. So he, of course, being Danny, takes that and turns it into, he says, look, I can answer your questions. I can, I don't mind helping you out, but he says, you really want to know if, if you're any good speaking in front of a camera or if anybody's going to be interested in you or your story. He said, you should come on my show and tell your story. I was like, I don't know. I said, I know I have an amazing story. So my fear is I tell my story and people start focusing on me and not really focusing on these amazing true crime stories that I've written. And he's like, bro, I mean, honestly, man, you know, you really should come on and you can always come back and talk about your stories, these other stories. I was like, all right, all right. So I put him off because I was in the halfway house. I'm like, yeah, bro, I can't, I can't, I can't. So finally what happens is I'd been in Stacy's a, probably a month or so, and Danny calls me up one day, and he's like, "Listen, you're not in the halfway house. You're living in someone's spare room. You have a vehicle. I've answered all your questions regarding YouTube and how to start a podcast and the whole thing. You said you'd come on the show. I haven't posted anything in almost two weeks. I need you to come and do a fucking interview with me." He's a, I mean, I was like, fuck, I mean, he, like, it's like, he's right. Like he did. I did say I'd do it. He has been really cool with me. Um, I was like, all right, bro. When he's like tonight, I was like, oh shit. So I throw on a shirt. I drive to St. Petersburg. Um, or he always says Seminole. No, it was whatever. Uh, which is really, I think Seminole is in St. Pete, but is it, would you say next to St. Whatever. Doesn't matter. I drive there, uh, go there. I remember I walked in and it, he was there and I think some other guy was there. Uh, it wasn't Hat Rack. No, no, Hat Rack was there. Hat Rack was there. Real name is Shane. 
Um, so Shane was there, but, um, so he was there and we sit down and he goes, how long does your story take? And I just said, shit, man, I can tell it in five minutes. I got a five minute version. I got a 15 minute version. I got an hour version. I got a two hour version. He goes, give me the two hour version. I said, all right. So I talked for like two hours and 15 minutes. And I think that video has like 1.8 million views right now within the first three months. I think it got like a million views and he was, you know, ecstatic. So I did really well. That was doing really well. Well, at some point, after it had been up for like a month or so, Jess saw the story. She saw the podcast. So people in the halfway house are passing it around. And then people are still friends from being in the halfway house together. So she ends up getting it. She watches it. She texts me one day and says, hey, listen, I'm supposed to be coming into Tampa would you like to, um, she said, I've been thinking about you lately. Um, and I was wondering if you wanted to, um, you know, ha get lunch or dinner or something. And I went, um, yeah, yeah. I said, yeah. So I texted her back. I said, yeah, of course I'd love to. Um, I said, she goes, okay, well, you know, and I said, yeah, when? And she told me, you know, oh, we came up with a time and I said, yeah, yeah. I said, okay, well it's a date. And she goes, no, it's not a date. I'm just saying it's friends. Because she actually was dating a chick that she had met in prison. That girl lived in Tennessee. And I, and she, I remember she used to always say, well, you know, I'm gonna, we're going to end up together. And I was like, you're not going to end up together. And I'm like, I can tell you right now you're not going to end up together because this girl's been on probation for over a year and a half. And she's, she, if you were going to end up together, she would have come down here. She can easily get her, her um, probation transferred. And she had nothing but excuses. I was like, look, that's over. You don't know it's over. You're still holding out hope. But I promise you, she's dating somebody else. Like, I'm doing everything I can to undermine that relationship. You know what I'm saying? And I'm saying it in such a way that I wasn't that bra brass about it. I was very, well, you know, this is probably what happened. Well, you know, it's not a big deal. Like, a relationship in prison is probably different. And, you know, I'm trying to be understanding. But I also want to get into her pants. So, um, where I'm presuming to be understanding when my real goal is to get in her pants. So anyway, we're on, so she's like, okay, so let's go to dinner. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. And she goes, yeah, we'll do it as friends. And I was like, no, no, not as friends. It's a date. And she goes, no, no, I just, I have a girlfriend. I just want it to be friends. And I went, no, I don't, I don't want to want to go. I don't want to go on a, to dinner with you as friends. And she was like, well, I want it to be friends. I said, well, that's really irrelevant. I'm not going as friends. And she goes, well, then we're not going to go. I said, well, then we're not going to go. And she goes, why can't we go as friends? And I go, let me, let me, look, let, let's just, let me just be honest with you. I said, there is nothing more useless in the world than having a female friend that you're attracted to. Like that is the most useless friendship out there. Like the whole time she thinks she's building a friendship. All I'm doing is waiting for an opportunity to nail her. Like I'll, it's not that hard to maintain a relationship, right? Like with a, a chick, you can, you can text once or twice a day, say some flirty cutie stuff. And then at some point there's a weakening, there's a chink in the armor of the relationship that she's currently in and boom, you're in there. So, you know, you're just hell, you know, so, and that's, not because I'm living in a half, I'm living in somebody's spare room. Like, I mean, you know, I don't know, it's not like I got women falling out of this guy and every woman that I dated, that I tried to date, like I got on some of these apps, catastrophes. I mean, every time they would look me up, it was over. It was done. So, so yeah. So she, Jess says, yeah, she doesn't want to go on a date with me. She says, well, then forget it then. We're not going to then forget it. I said, okay, fine. And she's like, you're serious? I go, yeah, I'm serious. So maybe a week later, we were supposed to go again. She schedules and we schedule. And she calls back. She's like, you were serious? I go, yeah, I'm serious. She goes, I said, look, well, we can go, we'll go. I said, you can call it what you want. I'll call it a date. So we schedule another time. She was supposed to call me and she stood me up. Then a couple days later, you know, she, like she was like, "I'll text you when I get off work." Well, she worked late; she didn't text me, you know, which was bullshit. But a couple days later, she texted me, "I'm sorry, I was working late. I know that was a shitty thing, but I still want to see you Can, next week. Next week, same type of thing happens. Next week, or maybe two weeks go by. Nothing. Uh, she texts me, "Look, I, I'm coming. I'm gonna be off work at this time. I can meet you. Can we go out?" And I went, "Yes, as a date." And she goes, not as a date. And I said, let me explain to you something. I said, this is a date in my mind. If you don't want to call it a date, that's fine. But it's, it's, it's a date in my mind. She says, okay, whatever. So then I head to the restaurant. And I remember 
my ex-wife called me and she's like, why are you going to dinner with this girl that has a girlfriend that says she does not like you? She's not interested in you. And she's telling you it's not a date. And why are you going? I said, let me explain something. I said, I'm going to go on the date. I'm going to be charming. I'm going to be funny. I'm going to buy her dinner. We're going to laugh. We're going to go to the movies. We're going to hang out. I'm going to be just amazing. And I said, at the end of the date, I'm going to try and kiss her. Now, if she doesn't kiss me, we're good. I know. This was your chance. I know. I get it. It's, it didn't work. You're not interested. But if she does kiss me, then I know the whole fucking time it was bullshit. And I, my intuition was right. And she was interested. What happens is I go to the, I end up going to um, meet her. And she, when she shows up, she's wearing a long sleeve. I remember too, it was burgundy. It was a burgundy long sleeve shirt. She had makeup on, hair's done, blue jeans. She looked amazing. Cowboy boots. She always wears cowboy boots. And I just was like, and I, when I, I was like, hey, what's up? She walks up and she gives me this huge hug. And like, I let go. Like I hugged her for a second and then let go. And she just kept holding me. And so kind of hugged her back, rubbed her back a little bit. And then she kind of let go and she smiled at me. And listen, I knew right then, you didn't dress up like this for your friend. So we go, we eat. She laughs at every single joke I tell. Every single, grins, smiles, and I'm not that funny. Like it was overboard. The flirtation was outrageous. Then we end up going we get in my car, we leave, we get in my car, my little Jeep, get in my Jeep, go to the movies. When we go to the movies, it's packed. Like we can't, you know, you can't even get into the movies because it was opening night of Star Wars, the new Star Wars. And so we couldn't get in. So we get back in, we get in my truck and my little Jeep and I get in and she gets in and she goes, well, we're not going to the movie. She's, well, what do you, what do you want to do now? And I go, well, I want to make out in the car. What do you want to do? And she goes, and she looks at me and she kind of kind of rocks her head and kind of shrugs. And I thought, oh, hell no. Boom. I mean, listen, I, I, there was like a gap like this. Like I'm in my seat. Like, like, and I mean, I went, I went, whoo, I was right there in her fucking seat right next to her. I mean, she'll, to this day, she'll say, I was so nervous. Like she's like, you jumped forward and nose to nose looking at her like i'm i'm waiting for her to be like okay good enough forget it like i'm i'm assuming it's not going anywhere like i I, even though i knew i felt it i thought this is our chance like like i i'm no i have very little the i have very little embarrassment in me right like like it's hard to shame me or make me feel embarrassed at this point in my life so if i got right up to her she's like no what are you doing forget it it's not gonna happen i told you I would, I'd be like, yeah, all right, now I know. And I'd have dropped her off. But that's not what happened. We start making out. We made out so much for like probably for hours. So much my lips were, were um, uh, what is it? We chapped. My lips, her lips were chapped. We had to stop multiple times. We were like, look, we got to stop kissing. We have to stop kissing. Like it, my lips are killing me. They're chapped. They're this. And then boom, we'd start making out again. So anyway, a couple of days later, so we nothing. We, we end up. I end up taking her back. We end up making out in the back of the AMC theaters. We drove around back in the back of the, like all class, right? All class in the back of the AMC theaters. We end up making out. By the way, and by this time I'm not 49. I am 50, so I'm 18 years older than her. Like, not a bad comeback, right? So fresh out of prison, making out with some chick. Um, it wasn't like, I don't think it was right next to the dumpsters, but we could have, should have added right next to the, should throw in, next time I'll say right next to the dumpsters. No, but anyway, we made out for hours and hours and then I ended up having, I ended up dropping her off and she leaves. And then, you know, we went to, we got back together a couple days later and, um, you know, I think we rented a hotel. It's nice, right? Mm-hmm. And we're not messing around. Like I'm straight for, the same thing. We went to the movies that time, mm-hmm. got out. She's, well, what do you want to do? I said, I want to go rent a motel room. What do you want to do? And she was like, Oh my god! I can't believe this. I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I'm not, I'm not pussyfooting around here. I, I'm down to. I, we need to handle business here, okay? I got a lot of pent up sexual tension here. So anyway, yeah. So uh, we've been dating since then. 
We did break up a couple times, crushing to me. And uh, yet that's a whole video. She should be here for that. We could drag, I could drag that fucker out for two hours right then. And we'd argue too, because it's one of the few things we argue about. One, how many times she broke up with me. Why we broke up. Getting back together. So, you know, but that could be a whole thing. That could be a whole thing. Yeah. Um, all right. I think that's the end of my story because at this point, you know, it was, I, I mean, there are some other things like I, I, I had a deal with a Blumhouse Productions on a thing. Oh, I didn't even talk about, I was uh, interviewed by a couple magazines. I was interviewed by Forbes magazine. I was interviewed by, what else was I interviewed by? Uh, the Atlantic did an uh, interview about me getting out of prison. They were basically like, he's a true crime writer. Um, and I've optioned several, since I've been out of prison, I've optioned several books, several of my true crime books. Should I have focused on that? Ah, I don't know. Whatever. whatever. I've optioned several of my stories. Um, you know, it, it just takes a lot. Like I could get do a whole hour on how many things have gone wrong. But the problem is, is that, and this is the, the thing that I know about this just having talked to guys that are in the industry and other reporters is that, you know, there are guys that do nothing but write articles in magazines and option those articles and those articles and those options never end up getting made into movies. And they'll, they'll, my, I remember my literary agent, um, he told me, this is the guy who got me the the deal on uh, Generation Oxy. He told me that he said he has authors that do nothing but write books that get optioned three or four times. He was and they've sold 30, 40 options. And they're constantly being re-optioned because you option in something for like 18 months and then it gets re-optioned. So you said they'll have, they'll have like 30 of them. He is they've never been made into a movie or, or, or a series. Nothing's ever happened. They just re-option them and re-option them and re-option them. And they make good livings writing books that are optioned. And he's like, they make a decent living, you know? And so I, I was always, he told me this when I was in prison. And so I always remember thinking, so if I could get it to the point where, this is before I started doing, you know, the podcasting or painting, and I'm still in prison kind of thinking about what I was going to do. And I remember thinking, like, I could just, it's just option shit for the rest of my life. Like, I, how hard is it to just write stories? And uh, I don't even try and get the stories into, into, I don't even try and get them into magazines, which is really something I should be doing. Um, but if I just optioned these art or these stories that I'm writing on these guys and option them, like you could live your whole life just on those options. So, so even though I've optioned a bunch of stuff, bunch of stories that I have, like I've my buddy Rossini's story, I optioned, um, uh, Boziacs, I've optioned uh, Generation Oxy, that one. Um, God, I mean, there's a, uh, anyway, the point is, is that, you know, I would love for those stories to be made into movies or f some kind of like a, a series or something. Uh, and, and actually, I'm getting a couple of them right now are being turned into documentaries. And that gives you the ability to to say, hey, to be able to point it at a, a, a longer version of the story that you can then option into or parlay into a series of some kind or maybe a, a full-length you know, feature film or something. But the point is, is that, you know, if that never happens, it never happens. I mean, obviously, it's what I want to happen, but we'll see. So um, I don't know where else to go with this. I appreciate you guys checking out the uh, – or listening or watching or whatever. And – um, if you like the story, you know, do me a favor, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell. Also, there's a thank you button now that YouTube has where you go. It's, it's on the, the same, same bar that you ha where the likes are, where it's like like and share and all those. You can swivel it over and there's a little dollar sign and you hit that and it's a thank you button. You can leave me like five bucks, three, two bucks, five bucks. 10 or, or 50 bucks, something like that. I don't know. You can leave different amounts. So that would be great if you're interested. If you're interested in, in kind of some helping support the channel and letting me, you know, make, you know, different content and do these interviews and continue to do them. Obviously, I have a Patreon. You can join for like $10 a month. 
You can join for 50 bucks a month. You can join for $125 a month. Um, also, all my books are available on Amazon. Between Amazon and Borders Books, uh, I think all my books are available. So, yeah, and I'm going to try and continue this series. I'm probably going to talk about some of the other books. I might take the Frank Amadeo story and kind of tell the whole story of uh, Frank Amadeo, which is basically my, my book. Maybe do a multi-part series on that possibly let me know in the comment section if that's something you guys are interested in um also i could probably do a bailout which is another one i have there's a bunch of books that i have uh and they're all almost all of them are available on audible so i appreciate you guys watching thank you very much and i really do appreciate it so see ya